What's up guys, it's your host Spartanic Arts DxD back with another high school DxD related video and today we have what if Issei left the movie. And can we hit 500 to 600 likes or even possibly a thousand because this movie is quite the long one ladies and gentlemen. And yes, if any other parts do come out during the series, I will continue to uh, update the chapters, etc. You get the point, so don't even worry about that. And if you guys want to know exactly when I upload, slash my upload schedule, click the little blue button right next to the subscribe button. Once again, celebration for 40,000 subscribers. This whole entire movie is coming out. And I uh, recently announced, once again, I know you guys know from last video, but the Juggernaut Drive. Member tier is officially here if you want to join. That'd be absolutely amazing. Along with my Patreon members, you guys are killing it over there, man. Your boy's posting too, so hopefully you guys have been enjoying that. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and thank my balance breakers. Ant Lewis, Lachlan Yates, Jordan Patchow, Night Ammo, Refeek135, Unsainted Tiger, Ryan Monk, Keep Saying 21, Undefined Truth, VR Whoop, Dark Phoenix, EK2000, Shen Bion, Chaotic Raven, Mazaku, Dr. Underscore MLG Underscore is the Bomb, Grim Fireshot Gamer, Jerry Vive, Sorresponder, Rob the King, Zero Fusion, and Noda Tracks. Thank you so much for becoming a balance breaker. Seriously, can't thank you guys enough. Also, on my Patreon, High School, there's three episodes of High School DxD where I fully reacted to already out over on my Patreon, and just Jutsu Kaisen episode 1 is also out as of right now, so that's absolutely amazing. Let's go ahead and thank my Patreon members. Justin Branovich, Ryuga, Lachlan Yates, The Black Dragon Emperor, Brendan Dossett, Stripalanger, Mark Bacon, Sharklock, Jay Dawson, Kefir Windsor. I'm pretty sure that's how you say it this time. Hopefully I got it right. But thank you so much for the support on my Patreon as well. And ladies and gentlemen, without any other further ado, let's go ahead and get into What If He Say Laugh, the movie video. Chapter 1. It was a very beautiful day. The sun passed through the window of the brunette, which little by little he opened his eyes, looking to the side of the enormous bed that he laid in, to see that it was completely alone. The brunette is our protagonist, Issei Hyoto. Good morning, Dreg, speaking mentally to his dragon companion. Dreg's kind of tired. Alone again in this huge bed, with a sad expression. This has happened since I woke up from being in a coma for two weeks, Issei says. Don't worry, partner. Surely it's because your females are busy, Drake says. Well, I guess everyone is busy, with a small smile, but it's lonely in this bed, bowing his head. Calm down, partner. You should be happy, because the battle with the Trixa, the Seraph, Nekomata, the Katre, the Magician, and Orphus confess to you, right? Trying to lift Issei's sub spirits just a little bit. Yeah, that really took me by surprise. With a smile, he says, says, Yes, the goddess of infinity confessed to you, Drake says. I agree, she was supposed to have no feelings, so I was surprised that she confessed to me before fighting against the Trixa, with a good smile on his face. But I haven't seen her since I fell into a coma. Sadness returning to his voice. Yes, you only spent two weeks in a coma. It wasn't that long. You spent a longer time training with Tanin. When you first went to the underworld, well, second time since the first time was to fight a fried chicken. Ha, <laughs> yeah, but I don't remember very well how I fell into a coma with a confu when he was confused. I thought I was not supposed to be able to use the boosted gear for a while before I fell into a coma, with his finger on his forehead trying to remember what had happened in those moments. That happened because while facing the Trixa, the beast launched an attack on the barrier of Albion that he could not dodge because he was distracted and tired. So, and due to the magnitude of the attack, he could not divide it in time. You got in the way to divide the power of the attack with the stolen power of Albion so as not to die, but you were able not to divide it in time and receive the full force of the attack plus the stretch of using so much power at it as a factor. So you fell in to a coma. Drake says. I guess that makes sense, but even after waking up, the girls weren't there for me, Issei says. Yes, partner, you are right about that. His tone changed to one of amusement, but I recommend you go prepare for the academy because look at the time, Drake says. Issei, seeing the time, runs out of his bed to go bathe and get dressed. When leaving the room, he talks about he takes his suitcase and quickly eats the breakfast left by his parents and runs out of his house to the academy. Now, Inco Academy. 
Issa entered the classroom. When he entered, he saw that the girls were looking at him with disgust for being one of their members of the perverted trio. But what the girls did not know was that Issa's perversion has decreased his m after waking up. Being in a war can change one's attitude after the things happening around him. Issa went and sat on his seat. After a few minutes, two boys approached him. Hey, good morning, Issei, Matsuda slash Motohama said at the same time. What's up, guys? What's going on? Issei says, Issei, we wanted to know if you wanted to come with us during the break to spy on the Kendo group. Hearing this, all the girls looked at them badly. Sorry, guys, but I'm not in the mood to spy. From Issei's words, everyone was surprised because the perverted beast of Ko was not in the mood to spy. Surely it's a lie, a random boy said. Yeah, surely a lie, the random girl also added. How can it be? You are not Issei. You are an imposter. Where's our friend? Matsuda slash Motohama said. Guys, it's me. I just don't have the interest to do that, Issei says. The boys were going to continue talking, but their teacher entered, and they all sat in their seats. Now, time after, at the school exit. So scene change at the school exit. The day was normal for Issei. Only that everyone did not believe that the perverted beast of Ko did not want to spy. But leaving that aside, Issei walked quietly through the streets until his partner called to him. Partner. I can feel Orphis approaching, Drake says. Seriously? Where? It's close. Uh, but I also feel a bearer of Albion. The Redhead, the Sadomasist, the Magician, and the Nekomatas, Drake said. Oh, then I'm going to say hello to orphus chan Fade-chan, and Kuroko-chan. Happy to see all the girls who I had spoken to for weeks. And I'll take the opportunity to discuss something with Volley, putting his hand on his briefcase and taking out with a bottle, which he sprayed himself a little. What is that, partner? Drake says. It's a way for me to smell... It's a way for my smell not to be noticed. Now, Drake, I want you to fully suppress my aura. I want to give the girls a big surprise. Okay, partner. Suppressing Issei's aura of that of a normal human. I hope you surprise them with a smile, happy for his partner. Yeah, so where are they? Issei says, In the park, Drake replied. Okay. I hope to give them a surprise. Walking to the park surprised Rius, Akano, Konako, Kuroko, Orphis, Lefei, and Volley, but he didn't know that he was the one who would be surprised. Now, in the park. Issei walked, following Drake's instructions, before seeing on a bench people who had been sitting on sitting as outcasts, but the people who recognized by their hair. He walked towards them slowly to surprise for his good luck. There was about to be a tree about two meters away from the bench. He approached the tree to see the bench, but saw a dimensional crack open up ahead. Now Issei's POV. I was behind the tree when I saw the crack open. Looking towards that place, I saw the figure of Dark Haired Lily that I knew very well. But what happened next left a great pain in my chest. Hi, honey. When I heard those words, I was paralyzed, thinking that she was talking to me. And when I was going to go out and talk to her, hello, my little dragon, what I thought, and then saw how Orphis went over to Volley. When Orphis arrives with Volley, she kisses him on the lip. I can't, Issei thought. But he heard something that surprised him even more. No fair, Orphis. She was reaching the bench and then jumping in Volley and Orphis part ways. Lefei gave Volley a little kiss, causing Orphis to pout. Rias, Akino, Konako, and Kuroka. It's true. It's not fair. After Lefei finished kissing Volley, they kissed him one by one. Now, in normal POV. Issei is incredulous that before his eyes, he saw his so-called friend, slash rival, slash brother, kissing the girls, who had told him they loved him and swore internal love to him. Calm down, girls. I'll give you a little love. Let's go to my apartment, Volley says. <sighs> Proceeding to follow Volley without noticing the brunette behind the tree. Chapter 2 The girls followed Volley and then got lost on the horizon. Behind a tree, near the bench, where the aforementioned were, you could see a brunette standing there with his hair covering his eyes. But from the one moment to the next, tears began to come out of his eyes and he fell to his knees. That can't be true. No. Issei repeated no, no, over again while crying. Partner, I. He could not finish because Issei spoke. Drake, it can't be true, can it? Issei says. Partner, I don't think it's what you think, Drake says. Drake said, as means to encourage Issei, but he knew that the chances of it not being what they heard was almost nil. Drake, with a tone of not much confidence, said, and if it were true, you still have the others. Do not worry, Drake says. Thank you, mate, but I'm not feeling very good. I'm going to take a little rest here.
As he sat on the grass behind him, the tree began to close his eyes. Now, in the mind of Issei, I hope that this bad resentment that I have is not fulfilled, gritting his teeth, Drake says. Because those damn whores were with damn bearer of Albion, that ungrateful. Issei was in a coma for a damn attack that was meant for him. But Issei went to protect him because he knew that he would die from such an attack. But before continuing, Think he thought of something. He noticed Issei moving in an erratic way. What's happening? Going off to see what Issei is dreaming of. Now, we enter the dream of Issei. You could see Issei on the ground, beaten while Rias, Akino, and Konako were around him, kicking him. He was kicked again, as Issei screamed helplessly. Please stop! He could not finish because they kicked him in the mouth, making his head turn to the ground. He looked up and saw the other who kicked him, and this time it was Orphis with Kuroka and Lefei next to her. Orphis, in a voice full of hatred, Shut up, damn useless! I should have never given you my power! It would have been better to let you die, Orphis says! I agree with Orvisama, Lefei continues. It was all a waste of power, Naya, giving Issei a kick of her own. A useless slave, who can't give me strong offspring, Kuroka said. It's true, you're a pathetic slave. Did you think that an upper-class demon like me would fall in love with a low-class shit like you, Rhea says? By this time, Issei was crying silently from the girls. It's words. I agree, Bocho. This pervert does not deserve to be with us, with her face expressionless, but her eyes showed contempt. Instead... Valisama is a man, not like you, who is a waste. Ara, I agree with Konako-chan. Valisan is a real man, more so in bed, with a blush on her face. Akino continues with these words, they all blushed. Now, with Drake. What? Drake, looking at the dream in disbelief. It cannot be the f alarm, but it should not be the effect. He still has his females who have not betrayed him, right? Drake says. It will be better to wake him up, Drake says, proceeding to wake up his car carrier. Now, outside of Issei's mind, Issei woke up with tears on his face, which he quickly cleaned. He didn't remember what it was that he was not able to leave him in that state, but it felt a hole in his heart. Drake, are you awake? Issei says. Issei speaks with Drake mentally. I'm awake, partner. With concern in his voice, because after Issei woke up, he had some big dark circles, as if he hadn't slept in weeks. Did you know... What I was streaming of, Issei says. No, partner. Let me see. While thinking, I can't tell you you don't remember it because of me. I don't want you to feel that pain again, Drake says to himself. It's nothing important. Just memories of that fallen angel, Drake said. Oh, I see. Thanks, partner. Thinking back to his first love, Rainer. Partner, it is best you get home. It's getting cloudy, Drake says. I agree. It'll be better as it's getting cloudy. Stan, <laughs> I feel as weak as if I did not have strength, Issei says. Issei got up with a little difficulty. Start walking home. On the way, it started to rain completely soaking Issei. As he walked, he thought about what he heard in the park. I don't think it's true what they said, with his eyes covered but his hair. Partner, I don't think it's true, but if they had relationships with the Albion bear, you would know of it, Drake says. How would I know? Issei replied. Well... Even if they use spells to cover their essence, the smell would be still detected, but this would be dangerous for you, Drake said. How dangerous, raising his gaze to the sky while Issei's eyes closed, feeling the rain fall on his face. Well, you feel the love for a female, and they give off the smell of another male. You will feel like vomiting, get headaches, and even obtain a fever just by approaching them, Drake says. I understand. Then how do I not feel this? It cannot be that they are deceiving me, lowering his head, being close to home. Partner, remember that you have not spent time with the girls because you were in a coma. You have not even gone to the club, Drake says. It's true that I have not spent time with the girls and have not gone to the club. Reaching the door of his house, putting the key. When he opened the door, he felt the auras of Rias, Akino, Konoko, Azia, Zenovia, Irina, and Ravel inside the living room. Issei took off his shoes and took a towel that was nearby and went to the living room, where Irina and Zenovia were talking about something and the others were in the kitchen. Issei passed near the two who did not 
take importance to him and continue talking. Issa continued on his way, and when he was about to arrive at the kitchen, he felt his stomach begin to turn and made him want to vomit. Ignoring this, he entered the kitchen where, where Rias, Akino, Konoko, Ozzy, and Ravel were. Feeling that someone entered the kitchen, they turned to the entrance where Issei was. Ozzy, realizing that was Issei, went to greet him as usual, but for Issei, when entering the kitchen, felt as if his stomach was about to erupt. When Ozzy approached him, he could feel a disgusting smell. So disgusting that he ran out of the to the bathroom. Azia, seeing that Issei ran out, was worried that he knew of the new experience that she had today as Rias and the others who were in the kitchen. For a moment, she was worried but remembered that she had a spell that prevented him from feeling the essence of the boy she had inside her and took away any importance in return with the others who spoke of her her new experience was. Issei ran to the bathroom and closed the door, approaching the toilet. <clears throat> Issei started puking. He got up and then finally wiped his mouth, Issei with tears in his eyes. Drake, it can't be. And that is the end of chapter two. Chapter three, Drake. No, it, it can't. Ugh. He couldn't finish speaking because he vomited again. Drake with sadness, partner. I'm sorry, but it's true. No, no, no. He said over and over again like a mantra. Partner, it... It's true. The... Drake couldn't finish because Issei started crying. Drake, Drake, why? Why? Issei, don't worry about it right now. But in a frustrated tone, Sorry, but you need to get close to the nun and the phoenix, Drake said. So that... Wait. Ozzy was not with Volley in the park, but she has the smell of a dragon proceeding to get up, Issei says. Drake in a sure tone, Yes, it is not the smell of the target. I am a hundred percent sure, Drake says. But then that would mean a name came to him, and he fell back to the ground dumbfatted. Vitra. Drake angrily says, Vitra, he is the only other known dragon that is in Ko. But Saji is my friend. While still crying, Issei continued. Partner, I will try to suppress your vomiting and gray hair, but I need you to approach the nun in the phoenix with a firm tone. It is necessary to confirm it, Drake says. Okay, partner, while well, wiping the tears and getting up from the ground. When he finished standing up, he looked in the mirror and what he saw surprised him. He was a little player, slightly graying hair with large dark circles. Drake, why do I look like this, he says. says. After I verify who it is and smell of those two, I will tell you. But if I told you in advance, you won't like it, Drake finished. Okay, partner, proceeding to get out of the bathroom. He began to walk, but after a few steps, he felt a puncture of pain throughout his body that almost made him fall, but he leaned against the wall to stay upright. He began to go to the table where all the girls were eating and laughing, but to Issei, he felt nothing but disgust being near them. Believing what he lived through the past year was a lie, his stomach began to ache again, but resisted and continued on. Oh, Issei, the food's in the kitchen is ready for you, Rhea said. Never meeting their Issei, never meeting their eyes. Okay. He entered the kitchen when no one could see him. He went back to focusing on the ground. Issei in an ep empty tone. Drake. Drake with hatred in his voice. It is Vitra. Oh, I see. Falling to a knee, beginning to cry again. However, the crying left as quickly as it began. Issei with hatred in his tone. That damn bastard! Drake was going to say something, but Issei stood up from the floor and began to leave the kitchen with his hair covering his eyes. Issei-san, she was... began, but was interrupted. I'm not hungry. I'm going to my room, proceeding to head for the stairs. But he heightened his hearing to pick up their conversation. The girls were surprised by Issei's behavior, but downplayed it. So Azia... How was Sanji? Rhea said, Azia blushing the question. It was incredible, while showing a dreamy smile. I see, and thanks to your sacred gear, we can walk as if nothing happened, Rhea said. It's true. Volley was a bit rough for the first time, but your sacred gear helped with that blushing from her own experience, Akino said. What they did not know is that Issei heard all from the stairs. Did you get all that? Issei says, drag with venom in his voice. I did. 
very much disgusted by what the girls, knowing all that his partner has done, saving that wretched nun from that fallen angel, saving a spoiled brat from a womanizer. But that proved to be a mistake, since she's nothing more than a whore, along with that ungrateful hybrid street cat. Let's go. Issei says, carrying on to his room, he opened the door and closed it, locking it for a safe measure. He began coughing furiously. He covered his mouth with his hands to muffle the sound. Once he finished coughing, he removed his hand to see the blood on it. Partner, Drake says, Issei emotionless. Drake, have you finished yet? Partner, I, he was interrupted. Yes or no, Issei said. Drake, knowing there was no going back. It is not 100% complete. But for the moment, you can use it at 70% capacity, Drake says. Issei, with a slight smile, okay. And Drake, thank you. Grabbing a pair of headphones from his desk, he proceeded to leave his room. He headed towards the elevator that was installed in the mansion and pressed the button for the training room. The room was a white room, which could be modified, but Issei didn't care about that. He walked to the center of the room, covered his leg in crimson energy, and stomped it on the ground. This produced a magic circle that looked like a pentagram and expanded 40 meters around Issei. Seeing this for the first time in a while, Issei smiled a little bit, putting on his headphones. His dragon energy reduced as the gravity increased. This did not alarm Issei, smiling superiorly as two figures made of crimson energy emerged from the ground. The first one seemed to have mechanical wings, while the others seemed to have a gauntlet that looked like a chameleon and some leg greaves on it, both figures resembling Volley Lucifer and Genshiro Saji. With the smile still on his face, he thanks his partner again and hits play on his headphones. Running at the copy of Volley, he kicked him in the stomach, forcing it backwards. From behind, he dodged a blow from Sanji Kapi, grabbing the arm he was used against him. Issei gave Sanji Kapi a knee to the face, followed the roundhouse kick, sending it back. Looking back at his original target, he grabbed the leg of Volley, Kapi, and dragged it towards him, stamping a knee on his chest, and proceeded to beat its face in. If it was made of flesh and blood, it would have been bloodied and mess, practically unrecognizable. Bastard of Lucifer. Hearing footsteps, he looked over to see Saji Kapi running at him. The Kapi jumped and tried to kick Issei in the head, only for Issei to move on the beaten volley Kapi and roll away from his kick. This only fueled Issei's thrill of fight and laugh to himself. <sighs> Treacherous scum. I'm going to massacre you, with that smile of superiority still plastered on his face. The beaten volley copy got back up, but repaired from the damage that it received, and Saji copy ran at Issei. Issei's burned a brilliant amber once again, dodging both fists that came at him. He grabbed their heads and slammed both copies to the ground. Pathetic, only good for sleeping with women of others. Dishonorable excuses for dragons. But the smile turned from superior to ruthless. His eyes began to well up in tears. The tears evaporated from the fire that burned his eyes as well. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy ripping you apart. Issei made good on that promise. Considering that the copies were made of energy, they would regenerate to the good condition. Every time, Issei pulverized, dismembered, excreviated, and beat down the copies throughout the night. Without the use of his dragon powers, as far as the girls, they were none the wiser. Not knowing the one they proclaimed to love was slowly turning against them, he would never be there for them. They can enjoy their fun times now, but those times would be start of their reckoning. The end of chapter 3. Chapter 4. Ah, my partner is always surprising me. I can't believe he came up with this spell. <laughs> Truly is a prodigy. Watching Issei mutilating the chrism copsy of Volley, but he is a bit in the state of madness. Hmm. This has to be the fall of a dragon. But why is it going so fast? Drake pondered why the fall was accelerating, while Issei continued with his psychopathic smile, killing the two copies again and again. It can't be! Discovering, while he, the fall was so accelerated, it's those damn pawn pieces, and the power of infinity, having a connection with that red-haired whore and Orphis. It is making it degrade faster, and the curse is amplified thanks to the other bitches. The process of corruption is too fast. With concern in his voice, but after seeing how Issei split the face of Sanji and stepping on his groin again and again until he got tired, oh my god, that had to hurt, covering his crotch. Drake, well, thoughtfully, but angrily, 
However, it is good that Issa constructed the spell, otherwise he could not release his stress and would have killed those bitches, which would have caused us more problems, but after this, he will still be very tired. Should I stop him? Drake says to himself. Sees Issei now stomp Folly's copy head into the ground, he carefully decides, nah, he'll be fine for now. After several hours, it was four in the morning. <laughs> Trying to catch his breath, lying face on the ground, Issei is. Drake mockingly, Good morning, partner. How did you sleep? Drake says. Issei with a marked vein on his forehead. Ah, well, your mother was fantastic, Issei says. Drake with a marked vein on his own forehead. What did you say, you virgin? How dare you insult my mother, Drake says. Issei with a mocking smile. Oh, did the red iguana get angry, Issei says. Who are you calling iguana, you cursed virgin, Drake says. Issei in a serious tone, first off, I am not a virgin. I lost it with your sister and second. You are a red iguana. Issei slash Drake's face, ha, <laughs> laughing crazily at their own banter. Ha, <laughs> then partner, how do you feel after spending m almost all of your power, Drake says. Quiet, Drake, proceeds to sit on the floor. I'm fine, although I was weak at using the spell. He looks up at the ceiling, deciding to ask his partner for another question. Issei, with a bit of fear. Drake, could you tell me why yesterday I thought I wanted to kill everyone? Issei, that was because of your emotions that you were suppressing. But there is also something more, with a little fear of losing the best bear and friend he has ever had. Drake, is it any type of disease? Issei calmly asked. Yes, it is some form of disease, but at the time, same time, it is not. Ugh, vomiting some blood. Issei starts vomiting blood. Drake, worriedly, partner! Issei glimmingly, ugh, I was just a toy... Vomiting more blood. Damn it, partner, Drake says. Issei proceeding to lie on the floor, but with difficulty. Uh, Dr Drake. Partner, calm down. This happened because you spent a lot of energy with the fall, so your body reacted to that. While thinking, I hope it is that, Drake says to himself. I need you to rest a little, and then get to your room, Drake says. Okay, I will sleep a little. Closing his eyes and began to sleep, Issei does. Drake would quickly interfere with Issei's dream, so that he doesn't have similar dream like the other time. Ah. Uh, Rest, Issei, I will heal your body, as he proceeds to start healing Issei. Thirty minutes later, Issei would gradually open his eyes to find himself in the middle of a magical circle. When he looked down, he could see at his feet a pool of dried blood. Drake, are you there? Issei says. Yes, I am here. How do you feel? Drake says, very tired, as if I've been run over, beginning to stand up with difficulty. That's good, Drake said. Drake, you were explaining to me how I got sick. Now... Yes, Issei. As I explained to you, this is not a disease, and at the same time it is. It a curse of dragons. When a dragon discovers that he is betrayed, or his love is unrequited, his power begins to kill them little by little, Drake says. Issei didn't know why, but he imagined Drake in his teacher's suit explaining to the subject to him. Wait, really? Still imagining Drake in teacher's clothes. Drake, annoyed... Well, a female can betray us many times, but nothing will happen until we discover it, Drake says. Then, the girls didn't- Issei immediately starts crying. Maybe I was not good enough. Maybe I didn't give them anything. I didn't love them enough. Why? Why? He started coughing up more blood. Quiet, partner. You did nothing wrong. You gave them everything. Your arm to save the Gremory. You reconciled the fallen angel and the Nekamata. You took care of the nun. You've done too much for them. You even lost your life and came back just to help those damn whores. I don't want to hear that. You are my bearer. The one who fought against the Triaxa. You are a man. No, a dragon in every sense of the word. I do not want to hear your cry for a wretched twat that does not value you. Is that understood? Drake says. Thank you, partner, wiping his tears, giving him a smile, Issa continues. Drag with a bit of mockery. After all, you are the rarest sick of you in history and the Opie Dragon, Drake says. <laughs> it's true, though. I think that name has to change with a smile. But I have a question. Does this curse have a cure, timid about the prospect that may die from this curse for wrong people? 
There is, but you need some things. There are some things that are a bit difficult to find, but I think I know where to find them. But first, go to your room, Drake says. Why? Confused, because he had to go to his room. Do you remember what Tanin gave you, Drake said. What Tanin Ojisan gave me? Hmm... Oh, you mean that, remembering that Tanin had given a little bottle when he woke up from training one day. That can help you eliminate the pains for a while, but it is not forever. I will try to remember where things that are missing to heal you are, Drake says. Okay, Issei says. Issei, grabbing his headphones, walked to the elevator, then took it to the floor that his room was on. After reaching his floor, he could see that everything was silent. Everyone was still sleeping, or he thought, which was good for him. Not wanting to deal with their bullshit, he went and entered his room, but as always it was empty, which he was glad, not wanting to deal with that stench again. I don't know how I forgot about this. Getting to his closet, opening, and looking it for the forbidden box and taking it out. Inside the box were seven bottles with golden liquid. Golden apple liquor, the only thing that can make a dragon drunk. A drink that will help you eliminate the discomforts by at least three hours, Strike said. Okay, having a drink of the liquor, ah, uh, much better. Seeing the discomfort was leaving, Issei says. Well, sleep a little. It's five in the morning. You have school at 7.30, so get some sleep. I wake you up in 30 minutes, Drake said. Yeah, okay, I will sleep for a minute as he proceeds to lie in his bed. 30 minutes later, Drake mischievously, ha, huh, this will be fun. Ah, uh, what the f***, Drake, not fully awake from the scare caused by the dragon, he says, says, ha, huh, it's the best way to wake you up, Drake says. Damn it, Guana. Uh, it'll be better for me to get ready and go to school. Getting out of bed and not going to get ready. Okay, partner, but don't forget the liquor. Reminding Issei of the liquor. Okay, I will take it in the thermos. Going to the bathroom when entering the seeing the mirror, he saw that there were no longer dark circles but his eyes, while Bright still had a little sad resentment. Ah, well to remember the saying. The pain you feel today will be the strength you feel tomorrow. The pain will end you and will emerge stronger on the other side. Well said, partner. Appreciating the maturity that Issei is showing. Well, it's true, Jake. I'm going to show that they won't break me after all that I've endured. I will come out of this on top. This is just the beginning. Smiling once again and finishing getting ready. Now, the time after. Issei left his house and quietly he walked to school when he arrived. He would not see Azia, Irina, or Zenovia. He couldn't help but scoff at the so-called followers of heaven carelessly choosing to commit sin. Even so-called, who was meant to be an angel, he thought with anger, but at the same time it's their education and their problem, not his. Isi proceeded to sit in the next window. Drake, why do I feel great anger when thinking about them? Well, that's part of your curse. You will take the hatred to those involved in the betrayal, but I do not think that is all your fault of the curse. It is also your feelings for loneliness that you are taking anger to those that left you, Drake said. Huh. So I hate girls. Who would have thought that the perverted beast is capable of hating a girl? Huh. Issei says, huh. you're right, but now I remember. Where is the Valkyrie, Drake says. You mean Ross Visa? I believe she went to the Grigar to study and help you mean with Azazel. Why? No reason. Just curious, Drake said. Issei nods his head. Okay. Well, I'll leave you to think about where those items for the cure are. The teacher has arrived, seeing the teacher enter the classroom. This gives me a bad feeling. And that is the end of Chapter 4. Chapter 5. Well... While Issei's in class, I will see what to do with to help him, Drake says. Now, with Issei. Issei was going about his classes, but every one hour he drank the liquor as precaution. Now it was recess. Hey Issei, you want to go this time? With a perverted smile etched on his face, that's what Matsuda said. Guys, we need to talk, Issei says. What's the matter? Seeing an empty classroom, hey... This room's empty. We can talk here, Motohama said. The trio entered the classroom and closed the door. The preferred duo curious about what their friend had to say. Guys, you and I have been friends for a long time. That's why I ask as your friend. I ask you to leave those perversions behind. They won't help you at all, Issei says. After saying that, everything was silent for a few minutes. So that, what did you say, pussy? Matsuda slash Motohama said. You are not one to talk, very annoyed by what Issei heard, rather the perverted beast told him. Stop being perverted, how stupid is that? Matsuda said, yeah, right. He's also annoyed. That's all, Mahana also followed up. 
Guys, I'm not saying it with bad intentions, it's to help. He couldn't finish because Matsuda interrupted him. Matsuda, still annoyed, Oh yeah, sure, help. But for you, it worked to be a pervert, Matsuda says. Exactly. You have the top two Onisamas of the school, the mascot of the school, and more. And you have the audacity to say, leave those perversions behind? That's fucking bullshit. He grabs Issei by the shirt. You damn bastard! Do you know how I envy that for you? Matsuda, with a smile, if you were going to tell us to leave our perversions so you could take all the women, then you can drop the charade, Matsuda says. That's not true. Motohama, please let go, grabbing Mahato's hand so that Mahatama would let go of his shirt. They don't understand. Being a pervert won't get you a girlfriend, and that reputation will harm you in the future. I am speaking from experience, remembering not only their reputation, but the deceit of the girls that claim to love him. Yeah, sure. And what happens to your perversion, Matsuda said? Things happened only to be interrupted by Motohama. Yeah, thing. Surely he did things with the girls that must be bitten out looking at Matsuda. Let's leave his friend and go see his girls, Motohama said. Matsuda and Motohama were beginning to leave until Issei with concern. Guys, for everything that we've been through, think about it. Not caring what they wanted to do with the girls, as they weren't his anyway, not anymore. Sure, we'll think about it, getting out of the classroom with Motohama, leaving Issei alone in the classroom. Issei sat in the chair and sighed. I don't understand. Why didn't you break that damn boy's hand, Drake said. Issei discouraged. Oh, Drake, you were listening? Yes, I was hearing some things and decided to see what you were talking about, which seemed important, but then remembered what task he was doing. Ah, sorry, something calls to my attention, cutting off communication. Ha, huh. who would have thought Drake working and not sleeping, Issei says. In the hallways now... That bastard Issei, out of everyone in the school, that damn pervert with his luck, tell us would you, would you stop being perverted? <sighs> Annoyed. But then look over to see Motohama standing quietly. What's up, Motohama? Issei had a reason. But he must be up to something. Our reputation is pessimistic. But I came up with an idea with a twisted smile on his face, Motohama said. And what would that be, Matsuda said. Motohama malicious maliciously... Easy, our reputation is bad, but Issei has it worse. He thinks he's cleaned up, but nothing wrong with dirtying up his reputation a little more, Motohama said. Ha, <laughs> that's a good idea. He already has girls. A little bad reputation shouldn't hurt him, thinking after his plan he could have a girlfriend, Matsuda said. Now, back with Issei. Issei was walking but remembered that he saw some new headphones that he liked in the store and went to go buy them, but the store was block away from some hotels. Issei left the store and turned left the store and turned slightly to the light of the slightly hotels but he seemed to see a familiar head of hair so he approached the exit of hotel every step he took towards the door his body began to hurt he felt and he lost appetite it made him want to vomit but without caring about the feeling he continued on and saw five known silhouettes a blonde girl with a perfect body gabriel a girl with pigtails irina a girl with blue hair and a green tuft and zenovia an elegant effeminate blonde kiba and blonde transvestite gasper well, with Drake, no, damn it, this damn power of Orphis, shit. I have to see how to do the ritual properly, because thanks to the power of Orphis, the curse is going faster and becoming more painful, making it more difficult to cure. Damn, if this continues, how can I cure it? While watching the situation and finding a way to heal Issei. I can't get the power of Orphis out so easy, because it is in balance with the body made of great red. If I take it out, one or the other could get out of control and destroy Issei's body. Hmm... Maybe I could return to Issei back to human. It could work or replace the power with something else. And how? And with what? Thinking it came until, ah, I hope it doesn't go to get that I don't want to remove myself from my partner. No, my little brother. Well, I know where things are for the ritual. We only have to be a little more patient, Drake, seeing what he has to do. Now, back with Issei, Issei saw, hidden from view, as two of his friends and three of his lovers leave a hotel. Gasper looked beat and was being held by Kiba, who looked forlorn. While the girls had a smile, he saw that they began to talk, so refined his senses to listen while his partner recorded it. Ah, to think that they are not only good with the sword, but also in bed with a blush and a perverted smile, Zenovia says. I agree. If it weren't for the fact that the system was modified to be able to do so, I wouldn't be able to feel that experience, Irina said. Issei could not believe it. Each word was a needle that stuck deeper. He remembered that Michael told him that they modified the system to be able to have children, but since it was very new and had failures, they only applied it to the high officials of heaven, the four great seraphs, and those belonged to their decks. This was a test in the system, but since it was abused, you can see Michael would change it, by the way. 
you are right. This dealing is very good, and we were able to experience it, but I must say, Gasper, to dress like a transvite, you have a great sword. The girls laughed as they walked off towards what considered home, never noticing that the one they claim to love had been seen drunk in lust. Issei, not caring about the expression of his so-called friends, <laughs> what good friends, and girlfriends falling to the ground. Hey, are you all right? As the boy came running, concerned since he saw Issei fall, what's your name? Issei looking up, how about you introduce yourself and then I'll go, with sadness in his eyes, but eyes small sh showed on his face, embarrassed. Oh, sorry, my name is Holloway2005, with a smile on his face. Issei in disbelief, that's a weird name. Ha, <laughs> that's what my mother always called me, laughing his tone, then changing one of concern. Are you fine? The hollow said. I'm fine. Thanks for worrying, smiling, false, smiling falsely, as to not cause any more worries to the stranger. Okay, take care, while walking away, leaving Issei to his thoughts. What a good guy. Turning to where he last saw the group. <laughs> they left. Ugh, Drake, connecting with the dragon. Wait a moment, I'm going to do something important, Drake says, but he heard something that left him paralyzed. What would you do if I committed suicide? And that is the end of chapter 5. Chapter 6, continuing where we left off. Issei, an empty look and emotionless tone, tell me, Drake, what would you do if I offed myself? Uh, he tried to find something to say, but those simple words left his mind in a mess. Tell me, you think I should? Without changing his look and tone, he said to his partner. Oh, partner, why do you think you should? Coming out of his superb, having fear of what Issei could do. <laughs> Drake, think about it. Issei looking at the sky. How terrible do you have to be so that your friend from childhood, whom you waited ten years to see you, sleeps with your best friend, who helped you overcome his past whenever he needed me? I would help him, and the most pure angel in heaven changes you for the transvice type friend, who you can help to be more manly. <laughs> in the end, it seems Gasper is better man than me, with every word his eyes and tone seem to lose emotion and brightness. So how terrible am I, lowering his head. Drake was perplexed. He knew that if he told Issei not to think about it, he would guard and suppress his feelings, his negative feelings, and in the end, he would explode or not to cry for some wretched. Ugh. I cannot say that he is suppressing his feelings, but he is taking the worst path. I should tell him not to cry for Gremory Seraph Phoenix and reincarnated Andrew. Ugh. What do I do? What do I do? If only I could get out of this dang seal! My partner needs me. Someone with him. Not mentally, but physically to support him. I hope this will not get worse than it already is. Angry at the state of his partner is in. Quiet, partner. You still have the Valkyrie and the Catre, Drake finishes. Trying to lift the mood of Issei. Just wait a... But was interrupted by Issei. <laughs> Tell me, Drake. You think Ross and Pyramin will still be faithful? A dead tone in his voice without any emotions on his face partner i i don't know and worries in his mind regrets as well but they're with but was interrupted again because they're with azazel the one who i consider a second father and he considers me like a son with a little happiness coming back to his voice drake do you think I should go and see what happens in the Gregar? The emotionless tone returning, but with little worry about what could happen and what he could find. Yes, let's go to the Gregar. I do not think that those two are unfaithful. They are the most mature mentally. I do not think they would do that. And they are with Azazel. That should be no problem, but in his mind, I hope that those two have done nothing as well. I don't know what could happen with Issei. His mind is already breaking and his feelings are turning negative. I pray that nothing bad will happen, Drake says. Okay. With a little more emotion and his eyes returning to normal, Issei says. Let me help you, Drake finishes, harnessing his energy through the boosted gear to make the magic circle. Issei confused. Because I can't do it alone, Issei says. Well, since you are suffering from the fall of the dragon, your power is unstable. If you used a lot, the pains and bleeding would get worse. This was said seriously, but with concern as to not trouble his partner even more. 
Oh, I understand. Seeing the implications that if he used too much of his power, the symptoms would get worse, Issei says to himself. Okay, we're leaving. As the young Red Dragon Emperor was teleported now, and the Gregor near Azazel's laboratory. So scene change. The guards were alarmed to see a magic circle, but were reassured to see the Red Dragon Emperor. Oh, Sekiru sama what brings you around here? One of the five guards asked. Guard one said, Oh, sorry for scaring them. I just came to see Ross and Pyomin scratching the back of his necks. Miss Ross, Vice, and Pyomin have been locked in the laboratory with Azazel for three days. Gilding Issei to the laboratory of Azazel, guard two does. Issei, upon hearing that, lost all brightness in his eyes, so much so that they frightened the guards. Dang, Crow, if you did something for all my pride as a dragon, I will not forgive you. Dear God, I know that I was one of the reasons you died, but please don't let anything happen. Please, Issei cannot bear seeing another one of his partners like that, with someone that he trusted, while with Kiba, Gasper, Irina Zinovi, and Gabriel, so scene change, we're with all of them now. Okay, guys, I have to go. Goodbye. Leaving in a magic circle to return to heaven, Gabriel does. Okay, let's go home. Quietly walking home, Irina says. Kiba in a low voice, but laced with a concern. How do you feel, Gasper? Uh, I feel dry, Gasper says. Okay, as both boys laminate on what they did, both will forlorn looks, sad by their actions and fearing the consequences they may come. After they kept walking, they didn't want to use a magic circle because they were nearby. Upon arrival, they found Volley sitting on the sofa of the living room, being kissed by Rias, Akino, Konako, Kuroka, Lefei, Orphis, and Saji kissing Ravel and Azia. Well, look who arrived, Kiba. Do you want to join? As he stopped kissing Azia with a smug look plastered on his face. Kiba, stealing himself. I don't think so. Issei could come and I, but he could not finish as he was kissed by Irina, who was knocked to the ground. Don't worry. Isekun is in the lower floors training. Besides, it will be quick. Preparing to kiss Kiba again, who just came to his senses and was struggling to remove himself from the self-proclaimed angel. Gasper, seeing this, tried to escape, but was caught and kissed by Zenovia, who carried him towards the others. Ha! <laughs> well, let's move from this place. It's very small, touching Marvel's and proceeding to remove her bra. You're right, let's go to the main bedroom. Taking off her shirt, says Rias. Okay, all agreed at the same time. Now, we're back with Issei. And by the way, just as a note, the main bedroom is Issei's room, yeah. Which is crazy. So, now we're back with Issei. The guards escorted Issei to the laboratory. On the way, nobody said anything because they were frightened by the look that Issei had. No emotion showed on his face or in his eyes. To them, it was as if his eyes were two black holes. When they arrived to say goodbye and left Issei in front of the door of the laboratory, Issei, being in front of the door, tried to open it but realized that it had spells to open the door. An anti-sound seal. Seeing these two type of spells, Issei leaned back against the wall looking at the ground. Partner, surely they are doing an experiment. Very nervous and wishing that Issei would get out of here because he felt that what was behind that door was not good at all. Issei still emotionless. Drake, I have a question. Could I use to penetrate on my eyes and ears? There was silence a minute until, partner, I think. He couldn't finish because Issei yelled at him mentally. Drake, can I or can I not? With small tears coming out of his eyes. Yes. With great fear, but much greater anger at what would happen next. Issei getting off the wall to stand in front of the door, then use it. Okay. As he activated the penetrate ability in Issei's eyes and ears, Issei's eyes became reptilian and some scales came out of his framed ears, focusing on his side ears on the door until they bled. He could see and hear what was happening inside the laboratory. What he saw on the ground was Ross and Pounin giving a BJ to Azazel, but seeing a little around the room, there were traces in all over the sides. Issei was on the ground from the scene in front of him. Seeing that Azazel finished in mouths of Ross and Perman, he put Ross on the back and began to thrust into her. Issei could hear her moans, moans and moans and moans until he and Drake heard something that broke all of the appreciation they had for that dang crow. Ha! I cannot believe that idiot Issei has not made them his own. Guess he is an idiot. Well, he continued to thrust into Ross and then pulled out and continued to have fun with Pyoman, who bent over. Issei turned off his magic in his eyes and ears and did not move. It seemed that he had died, 
or had wanted to at least. He felt every cell in his body exploded. Every bone in the body exploded as a mental and emotional pain came bursting through. His mind had reached its limit as he started crying on the floor. Drake, seeing everything, was upset. Irritated, just downright pissed off, he wanted to go out and kill that damn crow and destroy those whores. Damn that Valkyrie! That Catri claims that she doesn't be treated like a... but acts like one behind his partner's back. He wanted to, but could not. No matter how much he roared, how much his power increased, that damn seal kept him trapped, preventing him from committing a genocide. But notice the state of Issei and comes down to help him. Partner, Drake says. Issei, hearing the voice of his dragon partner, returned to his soulless stance and cleared the tears and blood from his eyes. He slowly rose from the ground. Let's go from here, Drake says, making a magic circle and transporting his partner back home. It arrived in the front of his bedroom door. Issei saw that there were clothes on the floor. The clothes he saw lying on the ground was a school uniform, just like the one he was wearing. There were female shirts, pants, panties, bras, and men's clothes. He knew who they were. His gaze did not gain any shine. He was about to explode and he wanted to enter the room, but he could not. He felt weak. So what did he go downstairs, seeing more clothes? along the way and lie on the sofa. Drake was silent, thinking to himself, He found all of this in just one day? I cannot believe it, but they hear the front door of the house would open. Mickey, Issei's mom, were home entering with her husband. Issei was lying on the chair, which his parents could not see him. He was about to get up and greet them, but he heard something that stopped him completely. Goro, Issei's dad, lower your voice. Look, pointing to the woman's shirt on the ground. Looked like the girls are having fun with a proud smile. <laughs> I told them that if we were to do this here, they would have to warn us, Mickey said. <laughs> this is true. Those were three that fill me with pride. They are true men, like a proud dad. Not Issei, who is only a pervert, ending with disgust, Goro says. It's true, but they have to be more careful. What would happen if Issei discovers them having leaning down to the pick up the shirt ah surely he would not realize it thanks to our help because they should be careful mickey said yeah we better cook they may work up an appetite taking his wife to the kitchen girl said Issei, still in the armchair, did the only thing he could do, and that was to get up and leave the house. As his parents were spoiling themselves in the kitchen, they did not notice him when leaving. Issei kept walking monotonously, while those words kept repeating over and over in his heads. <laughs> so that's what they thought of me. Those were the questions that haunted his heads. He was lost in his thoughts until he saw that he was near a pharmacy. Making a quick decision, he went inside. And the employee says, Good evening, what can I help you with? With a polite smile. Issa used one of the only spells that he knew for the situations like this. He never thought he would have to use it to buy what he wanted and use the spell on the pharmacist. I would like 20 bottles of antidepressants. Try to zone. Back in his emotionless state, Issa says. That would be 1,080 yen. The price, or 1,080 dollars, saying the price with a blank eye. Issa's eyes with a dead look. Thank you, producing a card that had the money paid for the bills and took the bottles. Issei left the pharmacy and opened a bottle and took out five pills and took them with a drink of golden apple liquor and continued walking until he reached a park that was very known to him. He saw that it was empty and on his way to the fountain, while approaching he could see a semi-transparent female figure and upon arriving, he sat next to that figure. Hello, Issei-kun. Hello, Rainer. And that is the end of chapter six. Chapter 7 Hello, Rainer, Issei says. How have you been? Rainer says, looking to the sky with a smile on her face. Seeing as how you are, a product of my mind, you should know. Taking out five pills and putting them in his mouth and swallowing them. Issei-kun, do you see what you are doing to yourself? Her gaze, never leaving the view of the sky. Thanks to everything that is happening to you, your mentality has changed. But what are you doing? Wrong is that you are keeping the feelings inside, the anger, the hate. You have so much of these emotions that I am surprised that you have not exploded yet. Finally turning her sights onto Issei. And what should I do? Turning his face to the sky. Let everything out and start killing and destroying, Issei says. Ah, I wouldn't say that. But if this continues, when you explode, you will finish changing. Also, looking at the sky. Think about it. Issei, you're better than this. You're better than them. Don't hold back and let it out. 
I hate that I was right about them, but I do know that I was wrong about what I said as a tear had rolled down her eye. Well, I guess whatever happens has to happen, looking back to Rainer, only to see that she was gone and he was alone. Huh, <laughs> I'm turning into a madman already, getting up from the fountainside to walk to a bench nearby and lie on it. Drake, are you there? Issei says. Yes, Drake says. What do you think? Issei says, closing his eyes. Drake, with a bit of sadness, but also serious. I don't know what to think, but it is true that when you expel those feelings, you will change. You are better than this. I know that, Drake says. Issei, with a calm sense of mind. Hmm, I hope I don't explode anytime soon, but I have a question for you, Issei says. Drake, intrigued. What is it? The items needed to heal me. You know where to find them? Drake says. Issei says, Yes, Drake replies, Well, tomorrow, after school, we go for those things. And by the way, we have the weekend because tomorrow was Friday. A little happy and portraying some emotions, Issei said. Okay, it's already late. You better go to sleep, Drake says. Okay, good night. About to fall asleep, but not before thinking to himself, Thanks, Drake. And thank you, right there, Issei says. Well, it will be better to keep an eye on your dreams, preparing to see the dreams of Issei, Drake says. Now, in Issei's dream, Issei was in a dark place. There was no light, only darkness. Suddenly, he began to see images of the girls, everything he did for them. He felt a lot of sadness, and the only thing that went through his head was because I was not enough. Those words repeated again and again until Issei began to scream and cry. He wanted everything to stop. He did not want to see nor listen to anything. He just wanted it to be silent, but that did not happen. All of the sadness was changed to anger, from anger to indifference, until everything was silent and everything became white. He tried to move, but some white chains came and they held him in place. In front of him, he saw the scene of Azazel with those two. The words of his parents, but he did not feel anything. He felt empty, not anger, not hatred, not sadness, nothing, just empty. He did not produce a sound. He remained still. No matter what he saw, it seemed that he lost his life. His eyes were empty. They did not reflect life, emotion. But out of nowhere, the words of his partner and ex-girlfriend were heard. You are better than this. You are better than them. Don't hold back and let it out. Do not fall into the void. Go ahead, partner. Release everything, Drake says. The eyes of Issei illuminated with light and determination. Drake was right. It was time to be free. Free of all his hatred, anger, sadness, shouting at the top of his lungs. The white room started to show cracks as fire poured through those cracks. The eyes of Issei changed color from... Brown to burning amber, they were like two pools of golden infernos. While screaming, everything passed through his mind, his life until this moment. Then a snap was heard and the white room broke, engulfed in flames. The change buried away, releasing Issei within the fire. Issei got up from the ground and began to laugh. It sounded normal but carried on until it sounded psychopathic. He laughed everything, pain, anger, hatred, sadness, and everything. He was releasing all the negative feelings. He didn't stop laughing at no time. Until the fire engulfed him and he woke up because for once he finally felt free. Issei woke up, getting up from the bench and back to the mountain. He looked at his face, the reflection of the water light from the moon. He had a look that seemed arrogant and he laughed until he calmed down and his face gaining a neutral look. He saw the time was 5 a.m., so he went back to the bench and sat down and leaned back, looking up to the sky. After a moment, he got up and looked for his school briefcase and the bag with the 19 boxes of antidepressants that were unopened. After taking everything, he went to an empty washroom to use the cleaning spell. Drake was perplexed. He entered Issei's dream to help him, but what emerged from was something he did not expect. Issei broke a little, letting out of his repressed emotions. After that, his anger was monumental as he took it from the flames that surrounded Issei. Everything that happened to his partner was the fault of those ungrateful... dominated him that was... Not anger, but fear. Fear of what would happen to Issei if he broke completely. He wished that nothing bad would happen, but decided to leave everything aside to talk to Issei. 
Good morning, partner, Drake says. Oh, Drake, good morning. His face seemed to show tranquility while leaving the park, and he kept the bag of pills in the boosted gear while walking to find something to eat. How do you feel? Drake says, intrigued of how he felt. What happened in the dream? Weird. But a good weird, he say, says. Weird. Drake questioned, not understanding what his partner was saying. Yeah, I feel as if I've activated the juggernaut drive and destroyed the whole city, burned it to the ground. I would not feel any remorse, Issei says. He is losing his vision and value of life. If this continues, until he will become a person who could kill without any remorse, or is it something else? I hope it's the latter, Drake says. Well, that shouldn't be anything to worry about, but nervous of what could happen, Drake says. Yeah, it should be nothing, as he calmly ate his breakfast burrito that he bought from the convenience store. He went to the academy that was open, but there was no student at this hour, so Issei just entered his classroom and sat in his seat. Now, some time later, outside of school... So that's the plan, Sanji. You in? With a malicious smile, Matsuda said. Yeah, I'm in, sharing the same evil smile. Good, we just need a girl to help us and we're all set, Motohama said. I could take care of that, Sanji replied. Okay, as they entered the academy... <laughs> Time after recess. We are currently at recess. The day passed normally. Nobody took importance of Issei, so no one noticed that he was pale and had dark circles on his eyes, and that every hour so often, he would take a swig from the th his thermos. When it was time for recess, everyone left the classroom except Issei. It was quiet until Matsuda entered the room and went to Issei. Issei, can we talk, Matsuda said. About, Issei said in an emotionless tone. Quick, follow me, it'll be fast. Issei got up and was going to take his briefcase but Matsuda interfered oh leave that it'll be quick I promise with a smile Matsuda said Issei wanted to finish this quickly so he could sit down he felt tired and it didn't matter that he drank the liquor he remained the same so he did what Matsuda said and left the briefcase following him outside the room turned a corner where they were in a corridor that was quiet without noise from anyone I wanted to ask you for your forgiveness and thank you for the other day your words were inspiring Matsuda said Issei still emotionless oh that don't worry, but why couldn't you have told me in the classroom, Issei said. Oh, well, I wanted you to see if you could give me advice on how to get a girlfriend and get you to leave that room. It didn't look like you would move from the classroom. I wanted to get you up and walking, Matsuda said. Well, it doesn't matter. And on the advice, I'm not the right person to ask. Walking away to return to the classroom, when he was going to open the door, it opened, allowing him to see Motohama as if he was leaving. Oh, Issei, have you seen Matsuda, Motohama said. Yeah, he's in the hallway, pointing to where Matsuda was. Thanks. Thanks, goodbye, leaving to go with his partner's perversion, Motohama said. Issei just entered and sat back down in his seat. After about five minutes, he started to hear a lot of fuss outside the classroom, but he did not take it seriously. Suddenly, the door opened and he saw the girls and boys out of the classroom and others. But that had been at recess. But the strangest thing was that everyone saw him with a disgusted face and repulsion. It was Issei. I saw him. He probably has the clothes in his briefcase, said an angry and disgusted girl says. We'll be sure to see if it was him. Everyone got in the classroom. Some watched from what was happening from outside, the boy said. Yeah, we'll see. Getting closer to Issei, girl one said, What's happening? He stood up from the... A boy bush put him down to the ground. Shut up, you damn pervert, boy one said. Issei didn't understand what was going on, but a scream caught his attention. Look, here they are, taking woman's sports clothes from the briefcase, girl two says. I was changing in the woman's locker room, but I heard something and I saw a pervert come out with those clothes, disgusted by the scene. Everyone saw Issei with disgust and contempt. Issei did not understand, because... There were those clothes in his briefcase, but he went to speak to defend himself, but heard something that he didn't expect. How disgusting. Eh, not even we would go to that level, as everyone was looking at him, Matsuda said. Yeah, how disgusting, Monohama said. Issei, in a few seconds, connected the dots. He knew those two had something to do with this. This is, he could not finish because he was hit in the face with a book. Shut up, pervert. Always trying to atone now this. You disgust me. She was from another classroom, since Issei did not really recognize her, girl three said. I don't understand. How could one of Omisama's Academy spend time with garbage like you, Girl 2 says. It's true. What are they doing with a piece of like you throwing another book at Issei that hit him in the face again? After that, everyone continued to insult him, especially the woman, talking about how trash like him was the most beautiful with the most beautiful girls of the Academy. Issei was perplexed because this happened, but the boys did not 
stop with the insults. Some threw books, pencils, and rulers until someone threw a drink that fell on his head, wetting him. Everyone laughed at him and saying it was better that they expel him. That should not be imprisoned. And even that he was better off dead. Every person insulted him until a boy from the boxing club left the crowd and without saying anything hit Issei. Others joining and beating, either kicking or spinning. After a few minutes, Issei was thrown against the desk. When he looked up, he saw Matsuda and Motohama, laughing as everyone saw him as scum. Someone worthless, saying how... The good Onisamas were better off with some garbage like him. Issei felt the fire inside of him beginning to build up when the crowd spit he saw Sanji. How unfortunate, Issei. I don't understand how Ozzy is with a piece of like you, looking as if he was superior. It's true, appearing with an angry face of her own, Kiryu says, and instead of helping, they only joined in. Everything started up again. Issei had to contain himself. The dead look still remained on his face as he endured this, trying not to explode by anger if all deceived him. Those so-called lovers, parents, friends, and everyone. As he was being beaten by his classmate, being kicked on, spit on, all that because he was close to that gremory. Nobody stopped to help him, but they calmed down when Sona appeared. What happened here, Sona said. A girl began to begin when was telling was happening. Issei had hoped that Sona would believe him, but she said next changed. Ah, Hyoto, this is too much. Come to the council room and receive your punishment, Sona said. Everyone began to laugh. They thought that at last they would expel him. Some laughed, others insulted him. Sanji was laughing. Everything was shit. Issei was seeing and listening to everything well. Everything be damned because he did. His mind was chaos. Everything was anger and it was inferno. <laughs> you can be expelled since the girls were the real men with a mocking smile looking at Issei. Sona did not understand why he said that, but she could not say anything when she heard something breaking. The sound of the crystal or glass. Nobody took care of it. They kept laughing. Sona at this point was going for Issei, but the fire raged. He was already tired of everything. Everyone against him. Nobody helped him. Nobody supported him. Furious at it all, these days passed through his mind. He burned those who say that to him. He was not a real man. He could give a little credit because it was more than a man. He was more. He was a dragon. All saying he was shit to do with Gremory. No, that whore didn't deserve him. She deserved to be married off and live unhappily ever after. He was fed up. Fed up up. Everyone considers him to be shit. They deceive him, they use him, and when they have no more use for him, they discard him. It was enough. It was already too much. Everything. It was too damn much. Crack. Everyone was shit. Nobody had value. Crack. Friends, parents, lovers. Crack. Everything was filth. Crack. They all abandoned me. Crack. They changed me. Crack. Well, they can all burn in hell. Crack. And in the end, he broke and swallowed by his inferno. Eastwood Clicky put his hands on his face trying to stop him. But that person came out. The Opai dragon burned and the Red Dragon Emperor emerged. Everyone laughed. He say, <laughs> A standing up from off the ground with a hand on his face, eye burning of amber. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't stop laughing. Everyone had a look of fear. <laughs> what? Shit. Oh, they're quiet. Or what happened to all that bravado? With a smile that showed arrogance, but mostly important dominance. And you, you damn cheap blonde slut. I suggest you shut up, pointing to Sanji. Hiyoto, she cried, tried to speak, but Issei saw how Issei spat blood. Everyone alarmed everyone that could not move because of the pressure emitted by the brunette. Ugh! <laughs> You all know. You all don't know shit about a damn thing annoyed at the situation until a girl that first blamed him spoke up. Have you already gone crazy trembling from a figure in front of her? You, quickly grabbing her face and putting it against the wall. Tell me, who put those damn clothes in my briefcase with a murderous look, eyes burning with an amber blaze? Let me go, you bet she could not finish up because she received a knee in her stomach, which made him spit blood. That's the wrong answer. His smile grew as he looked at her with arrogance. Hey, let go. Throwing himself at Issei, Saji said. Issei released the girl and caught Saji's fist. Saji tried to separate his fist, but he could not, and he looked at the expression on Issei. It was that of superiority, much more than he looked that gave Issei when he was on the ground, but it also looked the look of a killer. Issei gave a knee to Saji's stomach never letting go of his fist, and then delivered a backhand to the fist of the side of Saji's face. The force of the blow shot him out of the classroom, past Sona, and into the wall in the hallway. Sona, aiming to put a stop, started to walk towards. Hiyoto, what's wrong with you? Sona said. Issei didn't say anything, only gave her a blow to the stomach that sent her out of the way she came in towards the girls. They all were shocked and scared for themselves. 
Who do y'all think you're talking to? There is no Hyoto here. His expression showing signs of disgust, as if he was touched by a lesser being. You damn, getting up from the ground, but he couldn't finish as Issei ran to him, grabbed his head, and kneed him in the face. Ugh! Sanji started parfing out blood. Issei, throwing back to the ground, began to kick and stomp him in the head, breaking his nose and making him lose some teeth, staining his shoes with blood. After that, he turned his head, and his face was stoic. His eyes did not reflect sympathy. They were empty. Matsuda. Motohama. His tone showed authority as if calling them like peasants to show them and kneel before their king. Matsuda and Motohama could not move. They were afraid the emperor who walked towards them. No one could do anything as they received a look and said, You'll get in and I kill you. It was enough to silence them. Issei walked towards the two, who were still in the classroom, and grabbed them by their faces. Tell me, did you do this? With a smirk emerging on his face, but with a tone of death. The two were about to cry. They couldn't move or talk. They just stood there, helplessless to the being before them. Issei just closed his eyes, sighed, then slammed their heads into the two desks behind them. The sound echoed throughout the room. Tell me, did Saji help you? Issei says. They only pissed themselves out of fear, but they only could not speak because of the pain. Issei released them and calmly walked to Saji in the hallway. What's the matter, Issei? Are you upset by the joke? <laughs> Saji trying to sound confident, but he was a little scared, with one hand on his nose trying to stop the bleeding. Tell me, was Azia any good? Without emotions, everyone did not understand what was happening by they saw how Saji began to laugh like crazy. <laughs> so you knew, she was good. Even got to smash Rias as well, he said mockingly. Everyone was surprised by what Saji said, but Sona was shocked the most. Yeah, I'm sure they had fun in my bed. A dead look still on his face as he looked at the lesser dragon before him. <laughs> that was the best. They deceived you. <laughs> to think that I took the virginity of Azia. Still mocking Issei. Everyone could not believe it. They were all unfaithful. They felt bad for Issei, but nobody could do anything because the situation was very tense. <laughs> his damn look of superiority came back. Ha! <laughs> Who gives a shit about those damn whores? Enjoy them like the pieces of shit they were. Going back to his emotionless, he turned back to his things and tried to leave. Who's going to believe you, huh? Tell me. They all changed. The people who are better than shit. He didn't even get to finish as Issei appeared back in front of him and slammed him into the wall and elbowed him in the jaw, pinning him against the wall with his left arm pressed into Saji's neck and leaned closely into Saji to see his eyes. He smirked present again and told him the truth that he only could hear. You? Better than me? Ha! <laughs> Please. It took you how long to unlock your balance breaker, huh? Even so, you based it off my armor. How low is that? You didn't even win a fight. Saruorg had to save your ass. You see, Genjishiro, shock came to Sanji's face as he called his fist and name. You envy me. You're not a dragon, just a reincarnated demon like the blonde princess, who without a sword in his hand is just as useless as that blonde who you're smashing. That little vampire can't even use his properly power without my damn blood. And don't get me started on that Rezavine Jr. and his foster daddy interesting. How they're not at school, probably smashing away at their education. No matter what, or if they did, they could roll around and then force me to share my achievements. Don't make me laugh. Oh, the Yetaroki, I will probably kick your ass for smashing his sister. Or did you forget who I beat for that red-headed whore? But you're not better than me, huh? You're an off-brand. You're just a hand-down version of me, and you will never be on my level. So if I'm a piece of shit, what does that make you, huh? After he finished speaking, Issei kneed him in the groin three times and punched him in the ribs, likely breaking one. Saji was thrown into the ground before he could process what happened. Issei was on top of him with a knee in his chest and proceeded to hammer his blows to his face. Blood gushing from the ground alongside the pieces of his teeth and spraddle again. This caused Saji to roll over in agony, leaving the back of his head open, which Issei also stomped into the ground with such force that his crack was heard, likely fracturing a part of Saji's skull as well as leaving an indent of his forehead into the floor. To finish him off, Issei gave a swift kick to his temple, knocking him out of the school hallway for it all to see, wiping the blood of his shoes on a crumbled form below him. Issei fixed himself back up and address the crowd. Well, there's one truth of their Onisamas, the great whores, if you will. 
But I will say this to everyone. Karma's a bitch. And after what they did to me, well, if something happens, I hope they all fall into the depths of hell and burn. With that, Issei went back into the classroom, grabbed his briefcase, whacked his perverted duo, causing further damage to the head injuries that they disdained from slammed into the desk and knocking them out as well, walked into the classroom, and walked out of the academy as the crowd split, afraid of receiving the same treatment, the brunette, whose eyes seemed to still be resembling burning ember. And that is the end of chapter 7. Chapter 8 Issei was leaving the academy under the gaze of several, but he didn't care and kept walking. So you became a psychopath or something, Drake says. <laughs> no, Drake. Uh, that was just really stress. With a smile on his face and a weight lifted off his shoulders, Issei said. Ah. Oh, well. I was ready to divide your energy in case you took it too far, Drake says. <laughs> well, I think they know not to mess with me now. Anyway, let's leave this place and start looking for things for the ritual, Issei said. Indeed, you are right. Let's go, Drake says. After leaving the school exit, Issei went to the alley and teleported the area. Now, back in the classroom, everyone was silent. They did still not know how to process everything that happened. First, Issei is accused of stealing someone's clothes, and then mocked, insulted, and beat him. And then Issei did a 180 and beat the sh out of Saji, Matsuda, Motohama, and a girl. Then Saji said that all the girls that Issei was with were unfaithful. No one fully understood what happened in the room and hallway. Everyone back to their classroom, Sona said with an emotionless tone, standing in pain from the blow of Issei gave her. No one was moving from what Sona said. I said, everyone get back to the classroom! Sona shouted, fed up with the whole situation. After screaming, they all went back to their classroom, Sona sighed as the halls were clearing up, and looked to see the state of the two perverts, but also saw a boy with his cell phone out. You were courting, Sona said. Uh, yes, afraid he would get punished as well, the boy said. Give me your phone, in a tone that she wasn't taking no for an answer, and the boy gave her his phone and went to sit in his seat in silence. I need someone to take those these two to the infirmary, pointing out to Matsuda and Monohama, as they were unconscious and bleeding from the head by the blow, and their pants wet pissed from the fright. Nobody had got up to help until the two boys carried them by their upper bodies to avoid getting piss on themselves and took them away. Sona looked at Saji, who was still unconscious from being he received. She ordered her parage members that were around to take him to the council room. Now, in the student council room, Sanji was stirring. He tried to open his eyes as his whole face was hurting. When he finally got to open his eyes, he saw that he was in the student council, and in front of him as all of his Paraj teammates. Even Loop was there, Saji, in a cold tone that meant she was not to be lied to. Yes, Kyoju? Nervous about what happening. Tell me everything you said in Miyoto's classroom true. Her tone not changing and she was asking. She wanted him to admit it himself despite knowing the answer. What do you mean, Saji said, still nervous as she knows that it was, it was heading, forgetting that he'd ratted himself out. It appears that the blows from Issei have melted your brain. So tell me, is it true or is it not? Her tone becoming colder before, Sona said. No, what happened was he proceeded to lie but was interrupted by his dragon tenant. Yes, it's true, Vitra says, anger and sorrow in the dragon's voice. Well, no need to say more. We will discuss this with Onisama and Sir Zek-sama, Sona said. Uh, but I... Look at the parage. But the look of the parage silenced him. Sona made a magic circle for communication. Hello, Onisama, nervous what was, could happen, but kept her composure. Hi, so what's going on? The cheerful voice of the Mal rang throughout the tone. Sarah Fall contacted. Onisama, I am sending you a phone, and I would like you to look at the most recent video and discuss it with Sir Zek-sama, teleporting the phone to her sister. A video? Seraphal said, confused about what her sister wanted to see. This. And the phone appeared in her office. Yes, Sona said. Let's see. As she began to watch the video at first, it was as blurry as the static. Then she saw how they insulted Issei, kicked him while he was on the ground. She saw Saji appear when he came. So did Sona. And then she saw Issei change, and his eyes seemed to burn. Then he saw the blows that he dealt to Saji and the two perverts, but most importantly, she heard what Saji said. I'll talk to Sir Sex for now. Keep an eye on that piece of shit. Her tone was so cold that Sona was surprised, as she had never heard that type of tone from her sister. Okay, goodbye, Onisama, as she came out of her stupper, Sona said. After cutting off communication, everyone looked back at Saji, who was silent. Tell me, was Kiba involved in all this? Her tone was as cold as it matched her expression, Tsubaki said. Saji did nothing but nod his head. Okay, 
depressed and upset by what Kiba did, and left with Rhea going to check up her, who was also sad by Kiba's action. Momo and Ryoko, you bastard, as tears spilled from their eyes, but hatred still showed on their faces. Sona, not wanting to deal with the tense environment, decided to have Saji knocked back out as to tie him up and seal his powers, so he didn't try to warn Rias, and her have to some lie to get Zex on her side, knowing that the Demon King would listen to his sister, since she was experienced with her own sister through a higher degree, but she was appreciated that she was not spoiled like Rias. Garo. Looking to her rook. Who knew what to do, Sona said. Saji looked back up to see a werewolf hybrid walk towards him. Lo, unable to finish the blow as the werewolf rendered him unconscious once again. They just knock Saji out. Place magic seals in him and tie him up. We will make sure the seals allow Vitra to communicate with us. His words will be beneficial in deciding what to do with him. Ordering the parage as they proceeded to carry out the task given to them by their mitress. Now, we're with Issei. After teleporting, Issei appeared on a mountainside. Drake, where are we? Serious and curious about where we are. Oh, where he was. Ah, that's a failure of my calculations. Well, we are in the mountains in France near the Voices of Mountain Range. It is assumed that it was close to here, Drake says. And why are we here, Issei says. We are looking for one of my oldest caves, Drake said. A cave? Well, they are like my old houses, Drake said. And, Issei said, urging Drake to continue, we are looking for it because one of my old carriers felt it was the first thing we needed, Drake said. Drake, explain yourself better, a little annoyed for not understanding what his partner was saying. Alright, but for you to understand, I have to explain from the beginning. Now start walking to the right, as Issei started walking in the direction about his partner told him to go. Well, let's start with this. The fallen dragon is a curse and a disease which affects dragons. Since we are beings of pure power, the emotions of loneliness and sadness begin to reduce the power of the dragon by 20%. Though there are some cases that result in death. And this is just the first phase of the fall. The second phase, however, is more lethal. It happens when a dragon is deceived or discovers that he is deceived by one or more of his females. His hatred, anger, sadness, and loneliness can cause the power of a dragon to get out of control, killing him slowly. He feels worse and worse every day, and the state of the dragon usually puts a curse on the females that were unfaithful, making them incapable of having children. So I'm dying because of my feelings, his tone becoming emotionless, he says. Yes, even if you suppress them and show that it does not affect you, your emotions are killing you, Drake said. And what is this curse, Issei said. Well, that's something that we do for the hatred and anger we have for the female. You want to do it, Drake says. Hmm, no, at least not yet, Issei said. Can I know why, Drake says. Easy, they want a family. His face is neutral in a cold tone, but an arrogant smile begins to form on his features. But I will take that all away. When they are with their dream partner, I fought for their happiness. Now it's time for them to fight on their own. Though I don't think that is happening with Genshio anytime soon. Remembering the beatdown that he gave to the bearer of Vitra with the amusement in his voice, but also fury from that he sacrificed and remembering the reward he received in return. I know that it's hurting you, everything that is happening to you, breaking you, yet you continue to push on with that smile, suppressing your feelings, Drake said. Well, we better continue, Drake says. There's more. Surprised that there's still more of the curse than he has. Yes, you feel the desire to kill and destroy, Drake says. Hmm, okay, calm about it, but remember the beating given to the two perverts. The fallen dragon is also the longest and most painful way to becoming an evil dragon. For this to happen, the dragon must be, must let his desire to kill and his anger and hatred consume them. After a long process of transformation occurs, turning into an evil dragon, brought down by his emotions, Drake says. So I am becoming an evil dragon, a little scared of the prospect of becoming something that he is not, Issei says. Yes, at the moment you are 15% malevolent dragon, but thanks to the fact that you are suppressing all your negative emotions, the process is very slow, and I will explain how to save you. 
Since there are two phases of the fall, there are two ways to cure it. The first is the easiest. It involves an end sense and magic circle that will take the feelings of the dragon. The second way is similar to the first. But to make the magic circle, you will need gray rock flour and grind it with blood of the dragon to use the mixture to extract the feelings of love but also negative emotions. However, you are in the third phase. This has only been seen three times before. You would be the fourth. Through your situation is different because of your power of one of the females, which has caused things to be more accelerated and more difficult to extract. To extract these feelings, you will need crystallized heart of a dragon, and to get the power of the female out, you will need to replace it with another. Partner, you remember that I was sealed with everything other than my original body, right, Drake says. Yes, worried about whatever it, Drake is planning. Well, we will extract those feelings of love that you have for those wretched and negative emotions. And while it, that happens, I will remove the power of Orphis and subsume it with my own. It will allow you to use my powers to a greater extent, while I simply be the soul in the boosted gear like the previous bearers. In addition, you will have a better mastery of the boosted gear, as well it will become more than adapted to you. Then you will give me everything? Worried about losing his partner? Issei says, Hold the waterworks. I will not die. I will only become a soul. The power of the boosted gear will be yours, not mine anymore, Drake says. Drake, are you sure of this, Issei says? Of course. After all, I was the one who thought of everything, Drake says. But you will lose all your power. You sure you want to give it to me? Still uneasy about receiving all the power of the boosted gear. Yes. The power will no longer be mine. It will be yours. I also want to see how... Watch out! Stopping himself. When he saw Issei was about to fall into a hole... Issei, hearing Drake's warning, jumped back to see a big hole. Whoa, that was close. Breathing hard from almost falling into a hole. Wait, this hole, partner. It's here. Go place your hand on the wall, Drake said. Issei looked over and saw a wall made of black stone. He walked to the wall and put his hand on, which created and reacted to his power. And the wall had opened to show a giant tunnel. So this is your cave, Issei said, shocked and impressed when he saw the cave. Yes. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go in. I haven't been here for about 90 years, Drake said. Okay, and ring. Wondering what we will find inside of the dragon's cave. And that is the end. Now, continuing with Drake. Well, partner, we better enter quickly. Why the rush, Issei said. Did you forget about the Citri Harris, Drake says. Oh, that's true. She was there, wasn't she? Remembering that Sona was in the classroom. She is likely to have told her sister, who will tell about the Mao Lucifer, Drake says. Yeah, that's true, but Drake, which side do you think they'll believe if I tell them? I don't know, Issei. I do not know. That remains to be seen, Drake says. Issei just sighed, entered the cave while thinking that would happen if he told them in which side they would be on, but he stopped thinking about it and kept walking. Now, in the underworld in Sir Zack's office. So he transferred to the underworld in Sir Zack's office. The redhead is sitting at his desk, writing a piece of paper quietly until the door is opened abruptly. What? Unable to finish this, it, as he sees Sarah fall with an angry expression, but also confused, sad, along with other emotions. Before Sir Zek spoke, he saw how Grafia entered the room and closed the door behind her. What's going on, Sarah fall sama Curious about the behavior of the Malaviathan, who is usually cheerful, Grafia is wondering. Yeah, what's the problem? A little worried about Sarah fall, Sir Zek says. You have to see this, showing the cell phone with the video on the screen. What is this video? Confused. To see how this would affect the Mao. Just look at it, Sarah Fall says, giving the cell phone to Sir Zex, and then went to sit on a small sofa, trying to calm down, and her face was still an array of emotions. Sir Zex was confused about what happened to Sarah Fall, that she'd this video, but his thoughts were interrupted when he heard Grafia speak. Sarah Fall Sama, this better be, but stopped, seeing as Sarah Fall was rather stressed. Just watch the video, Seraphal says, her voice taking a cold manner, which neither the Mal Lucifer nor his wife had heard in a long while. Sir Zex saw whatever trouble Seraphal has to do with this video, so he played it while Grafia looked over his shoulder. Of everything they were expecting, they did not expect to see Issei in the video. This confused them, but the tension was only increasing every second that the video played. They could see how Issei was blamed for something. Now they began to insult him, and then they started to hit him, kick him, and at that moment he felt helpless. 
but also confused. Confusion and anger is what the Mao and his wife felt because who did this? The question went through their minds. They saw Sanji appear and they thought that he would help Issei, but their confusion increased more seeing what happened. They did not understand. Weren't Issei and Sanji supposed to be friends? They were still confused, but confusion turned into anger when they heard what Sanji said. They saw Sona appear as everyone began to laugh at Issei, but then they stopped as another laugh was heard. It was a bit psychotic, but rather arrogant. They saw Issei stand with his hand on his face, but even with that, they could see a smile of a ruler and a burning amber eye that filled them with doubts, and those doubts increased when they saw how Issei hit and beat Sanji in the perverted duo. However, what left them in a lot of fear of the words was, how does it feel to know that they all deceived you? They finished watching the video. The room was covered in uncomfortable silence, but that silence was broken by Seraphal. Uh, that video given to me by Sosan, her eyes closed, Seraphal says. Then it's real, Serzek says, his voice in a muted tone, putting the phone in his desk. This is real, but aren't Issei-sama and Sanya-sama supposed to be friends? In those words, Gravia's tone, confused but also afraid. But that reaction, looking at Seraphal, Serzek says... So you realized it, Seraphal said. Yes, w whatever he worry he had changed to a serious demeanor, Sir Zex does. That reaction is that of someone who explodes from a lot of stress or unstable state of mind, Gravia says. Yeah, this reaction only means bad news, Seraphal replied. No, 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 it can't be, Sir Zex holding his head. No, those words can't be true, right, Sir Zex said. It is, most likely, Seraphal replied, with great fear that they were true. Sir Zex sighs and calms down. I want you to tune and go for a look for him, worried about Issei. It's true. We have to go find him. In a state, it is very likely that he can commit something foolish, Gravia said, worried about her little brother. Right, let's go, Seraphal says. The two women got together and left in a magical circle, leaving Sir Zex alone in his office. Oh, I hope you're okay, Isekun. With many concerns about the young Red Dragon Emperor, what could do? So the Mao could only rub his head to seize the oncoming headache that he was receiving. Now, in Ko, the house of Hyoto. In the living room of the house, a magical circle appeared, which Seraphal and Griffia emerged from. Seeing that they arrived in the right area, they knew, they knew, they had an uncertain amount of time, because they knew the girls were at school, and if, if the video was any indication... Let me call Sosan, making communication circles, Seraphal says. Yes, Onisama, confused by the call, Sona says. Sosan, do you know where Isekun is, Seraphal says. No. After what happened in the classroom, he left the academy, Sona said. Okay, thank you. Cutting off the communication. You heard that, right? Looking towards Grafia. Yes, we better see his room and look for him around the city in her usual serious manner. Okay, just as serious as Gravia, Seraphal replied. The two went upstairs and went to Issei's room. When they reached the door, they slowly opened it. Upon entering, they saw the room was strangely clean and tidy, but there was a faint foul odor, which was something to worry about. I don't feel the energy of Isekun, but the others have been here. A little worried about the situation, Seraphal is. Yeah, it seems that he has not been here for a day or two, Gravia replies. The two looked at each other and nodded and went into the city to start looking for Issei. Three hours later... The two were looking for Issei all over the city, and every minute they spent looking at him, their fears and worries increased, wondering what he was doing, or where he was hiding, because they did not find him, were the questions that passed over and over again in their heads. It only got worse as time went on, but they tried to stay calm. Although it was very difficult, their worries and fears continued to take over little by little. It was time for school to end. When they passed by the academy, they could feel a small but almost impregnable trace of Issei's power, as they saw the students leaving, which was normal but then they felt a trace of teleportation magic in the alley where he teleported. They were already so nervous that they were about to go to talk to Rias, but they did not do it on the possibility that what Saji said may be true. They could not find Issei, and they kept looking around for about 20 more minutes until they found a known aura. They were glad as they went to the place where the aura was felt, with Issei three hours prior. Issei had been walking inside the cave for about 20 minutes. Drake told him not to worry, and he was close, seeing a golden ornament on an ornament on the floor. It was a surprise to Issei. 
We are here, Drake says. Issei looked up from the ornaments, saw the cave, which was much bigger than he imagined. It was greater than the catch hall, filled with gold, gems, and even ancient weapons. Everything was of great value, probably more than how much he had from the Opai Dragon Show. The whole place was adorned with things of gold, gems as big as his head. It was a beautiful sight to see. Ha <laughs> ha! What memories in this place, Drake says. Drake, is this yours? In shock of the treasures that were displayed all around. Yes, but it is ours. Well, what we enjoy can view later, Drake says. All right, wait. About to walk off, and then something caught his eye. Drake, what is that? Pointing towards it appears to be a black blade, but in the light of gold. It illuminated as a midnight blue or a purple, and there were chains wrapped around the guard of the blade. Hmm, ah, yes. That sword of Lancelot. The holy sword now turned demonic. That is Aragonite, Drake says. Arondite? Issei replied, wanting to learn more about the blade. Yes, it is the sister sword to the Excalibur and the Galatine. The process similar characteristics as the two. It became a demonic sword due to Lancelot's fall into madness because of the downfall of Camelot. Drake finished. Huh, how do you know so much and how do you obtain a holy sword anyway? Shouldn't it be in the hands of the church? Issei replied. Well, you know how Excalibur was broken into fragments. Our on site lost a fragment of itself. Don't know what happened to it. It may have been duplicated, but we haven't felt its power since the one who brought it here made sure to keep Arondite's power to a minimum. Otherwise, someone like Cocaville would have gone for it, Drake said. Well, that explains why it hasn't been brought to the church, though. I think it would be needed by them since you said it was a demonic, but that doesn't answer how you obtained it, noticing that his partner failed to answer the question. Well, isn't it obvious, my cave, that can only be found by my bearers, so of course. It was one of my former bearers, Drake said. Yeah, I figured as much. I meant, which bearer was it? Issei said, ha! It was Lancelot's son, Galadon. He was one of my strongest bearers, Drake says. Wait, one of the Knights of the Round Tables was your bearer? Shocked that Drake had such a bearer. Yes, Galahad was strong, indeed. He was devoid of his father's flaws, and strike to become the perfect knight. He succeeded in where his father failed by achieving the Holy Grail, Drake said. Wow, I wish I could have met him, Issei said, remembering how the former bears sacrificed themselves to Samuel's prison. Ha <laughs> ha, you did, Drake said. I did, but I only met Alicia and finally connecting the dots... Yes, Galadad was Bielzard, the one that considered as the strongest Red Dragon Emperor, Drake says. Amazing. Learning about how Bielzard Galadad then he knew, since the man only sang to him the Yopai Dragon song did a little bit of a dance of choreography. I'm definitely changing that show when I get the chance, he say says. Now, get a move on, there's more to see, Drake says. Right. Issei replies, Issei walked down a path that was full of valuable things on either side, until he reached some entrance, which looked like a glass door with sharp edges. Issei entered and saw something beautiful. It was a small green landscape, a small lake, and a little further down from that was a waterfall. It was one beautiful sight Issei had ever seen. Within the hidden oasis, there were flowers, but they were not normal ones. These flowers seemed to be made of crystals. They looked beautiful, and Issei was amazed by the scenery. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Drake says. Yeah, it does. Still fascinated by the view. Now go and take three flowers, Drake said. His tone gone back to being serious. Issei did what Drake asked him, but when he was trying to pluck the flowers, he noticed that it was not as easy as it looked. He had to use a lot of force to be able to take them out. Done, Issei said. Good. Now go back to the treasure room and look for something to grind them in, Drake says. Issei went back to the treasure room and searched among the luxuries for something to grind the flowers with, and something to grind them in. He returned back to the Oasis Valley with a bowl of gold and an ancient iron hammer. Now, let's begin. Start grinding the pearls, Drake said. Issei began to remove the crystal petals from the flowers and grind them into a bowl. This took long enough because the petals were very hard, but in 15 minutes, Issei finally grounded crystal petals. Now, you'll need to cut yourself and let the blood fall on the petals, he said with a little fear. Uh, okay. He brought forth his blade, Ascalon, and made a small cut along the palm of his right hand and let the blood flow from the cut onto the grounded crystal petals. 
The blood was absorbed and the pedal, and when they did, Issei felt an immense pain. It was as if he was being crushed, grounded, and cut up, but everything ended in three seconds. Though it felt a little longer to Issei, the blood stopped flowing and the pain subsided too. While recovering, Issei saw a shine from the mixture. The shine went from light, red, dark red, and then dark blue, and finally, black. All these changes perplexed Issei, as all those colors represented his power. The light red was the power of Drake. The dark red was the power of Great Red. The dark blue was the power of Orphis. But he was not sure what the black represented. Good, the process has ended, Drake said, a little glad the first step was over. What was that, Drake? It is a process that happens when one of these flowers absorbs the blood of a dragon. This flower creates some sort of anchor through the blood with the dragon, and that's why you feel pain. But the good thing is that the pain goes by fast, Drake says. Alright, but what about these colors? And more importantly, what does the black mean? Issei says, each color represents part of your power, but the one that matters the most is the black. As I told you before, you are becoming an evil dragon. At this time, you are already 18% evil dragon, Drake says. What? You said it was 15%. How did it go up so fast, Issei says. Because the corruption is increasing. This is due to the evil pieces and the power of infinity. But do not worry. It's all not that bad, Drake says. What do you mean it's all not that bad, Issei replies. After meeting with the others, I will tell you, Drake says. Hmm, alright, now what, Issei replied. You just need to wait for the mixture to stable. This will take a few hours. You get some rest. I will wake you up, Drake replies. All right, Isair says. I could use a little sleep, and the scenery is nice. Might as well enjoy it. Lying on the plush grass of the valley and closing his eyes within a few minutes, he then fell asleep. And that is the end of Chapter 9. Chapter 10. If I'm not mistaken, you are me. Looking at the figure in front of him, Isai is... Yes, and no, but that will be answered later. For now, sit down, my legs hurt. Out of nowhere, Issei and the figure were seated. Hmm, okay then. What am I doing here, and what do you want, leaning back in the chair? I hope you're not that thing in an anime of being a dark part of me, or something that you want to take control of my body, but then I find that you are good and want to help me, Issei says to himself. Ha! <laughs> Well, no. His appearance changed to an Issei that was half white and half black. You see, I am you, or better yet, was you. Ah, well, that's more confusing. We better start with your name, and then you can explain, Issei says. Well, you can call me Jiko. Or Jiko, if you want. Like a little smile on his face. By the way, Jiko means oneself. Is it because you're me, Issei replies? You could say that. His smile remains on his face. Now let's get to the main thing, Jaiko says. Bueno, Issei said calmly. I am you, or I was you, but I'm still part of your feelings, and I've always been here with you. When you needed to trust yourself, I helped you. When you went through something, I gave you strength. I am part of you, but... But something's happened, so it's not like we used to be, Issei says. Correct. You and I got separated when this fall started. Every day, hour, minute, or second, you and I are separated even more. This leads to your decrease in feelings, looking up to the sky of the mindscape. I understand, says Issei, because I felt that I was lacking strength, also looking in the sky, like when I entered this place, turning his gaze back to Jiko. Yeah, when you entered here, we temporarily separated, turning to Issei. And what is this place, Issei says, looking at the paranoma around him. That I cannot tell you. That is for later. I am here to tell you something important and repeat something I already told you, Jiko said. Issei says in reply, and that would be raising an eyebrow while paying more attention to what Jiko had to say. First and most importantly, is that when you are to leave here, you have to talk to Drake and ask him what he plans to do with the boosted gear. No matter what he tells you, you will tell him that everything will be fine and nothing bad will happen, Jiko says. Issei nodded his head. In second, I already told you once before, but if you keep suppressing your feelings, these will be harmful when you release them, so stop holding back. You're better than this, getting up from his chair, Jiko says. Uh, you said that. That would mean that Issei looked at Jiko only to see Rainer. I took this form for a few minutes to talk to you and turn you from the path you were heading, Jiko says. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm crazy, putting a hand on his head. No, you aren't. Only that when people go through difficult situations or even break their minds and feelings, they tend to act differently. Only that you were separated and two already in. Oh, you better wake up, stopping himself from continuing and looking back to the sky. Ugh, as he began to disappear, Issei finishes. Quiet. Drake will send you to do something and you and I will talk again. Just wait and I will answer all of your questions and do not forget what I told you. As, well, as he watched Issei disappear, leaving Jiko alone in that place. Ah, it is better that everything goes faster. But that can't be as he looked towards the ground. As the cracks with flames appeared throughout the place and these cracks became larger, the second consuming everything that was in its way within the flames. Well, looking at the cracks... It's better prepare me for my long sleep, as he faded away too. Now, outside of Issei's dreamscape, Partner! Partner! Par Until Issei abruptly woke up. Who? What? What? As he jumped off the ground into a standing position. On guard. It's good that you're awake. Happy that Issei woke up, but he couldn't help but think. I couldn't see that dream. That's strange, Drake thought to himself. Ah, Drake. Stopping himself and sitting on the ground, he remembered what Jiko told him. Drake, a great serious admitted from his tone. Yes, a little confused by Issei's tone. Tell me what you plan to do with the boosted gear, Issei says. Uh, oh, Issei, you already know I already finished modifying your training. You see time passes three times faster here, so if a day passes out there, it would be three days within here, and you can modify it so that it also works with magic power. Internally, he was very nervous. Damn, I must change the subject quickly, Drake says. Drake, Issei replied. Oh, look at the flowers. They have finished adapting. We need only to talk to the maid. And then the Mao, go find the one the thing that is missing, Drake says. Drake, Issei says, le looking at his left hand and with a glare. Speak, Issei says. I, uh, fine. Feeling defeated, he decided to explain his plan again. I will explain it to you in the easiest way for you to understand. The plan was that while the ritual was happening, I would be changing the power of Orphis with my own. While I'm doing that, the boosted gear would be going through sort of metamorphosis, like reconstruction. While in this state, it will absorb the powers of Albion that you took as well as the power of Ascalon, uniting them with the abilities of the boosted gear. However, this phase, your blood and dragon powers will be sealed until the boosted gear is finished with the process, Drake says. And the bad news, detecting some sadness in Drake's tone, which caused him to be worried. Well, there is a high possibility that my soul will be permanently sealed or dead, Drake says. You'll die. But he was worried, but he remembered what Jiku told him. Relax, Drake. Everything will be fine. There is no need to worry. Calming down. Though he was confused by what Jiko would do to ensure that nothing bad happens, but decided that they will talk later. It'll be okay, partner, Drake says. But don't you think that I will explode because of the whole process? Although he was worried, but it didn't show up on his face. Good. As you know, the boosted gear cannot use the powers of the white dragon without any cost because they are two different skills and can only have one. This process will combine the skills and other things such as Ascalon. Imagine it, a dragon-type Longinus that is also a Dragon Slayer Longinus, excited to see what happened at the end of the process. But the downside is that all your power due to having the blood and flesh of two dragons will be sealed to adapt and improve as a whole with the boosted gear. Drake finishes. And what would that leave me as? Issei says. You would be a human with a low power. It would be as if you did not enter the supernatural world, Drake said. Oh, discouraged by the fact that he would have to be human again. Yes, although we still need to do this to heal you. But on the bright side, you can train here to build up your prowess as the process goes, Drake said. And when will that be? Issei replies. We will do it after talking to the others, Drake said. Alright, that's fine. Still discouraged, but hope the process to go by quickly so he can have his reassurance. Issei got up from the ground and began to stretch. Alright, Drake, how long did I sleep? Issei says. Two and a half hours, Drake replied. Well, we better get back to Ko and wait for Annie. 
Anne is another way to say his big sister or with the title that Graffia wants to say to call by her. You know what I'm saying? So older or big sister, by the way, just for reference. Okay, take the flower mixture and leave it in the place where nothing will happen to it. Issei took the bowl of the flower mixture and left it on top of what looked like a bench made of silver, then began to walk a little stretch his legs. As he was going through a lot of treasures bigger than him, he moved something that made half the box fall on his head. Ugh, what is holding his head, rubbing the spot where the box hit him? Issei opened the box and opened it and found two blood red gloves with some flame design with a small magic circle or jewel with it. Beware of that, Drake says. What's the matter? Drake, confused by his partner's reaction. Those gloves are special, so be careful. I'll tell you what they do later, Drake says. Okay, let's go. Creating a magic circle to be a quiet place and wait for Grafia. Now, in the park, Issei appeared in the park and looked for a tree. After finding, he decided to lay down and wait. About 20 minutes passed when he felt something people walking towards him. Hello, Hiyoto-san. Issei, adjainted by what he was called, opened his eyes to see two girls whom he knew. How are you? The other girl replied as she sat next to Issei while the other sat down in front of him. Ah, hello, Katsuri and Murayama. His tone emotionless once again. God, it's true. You look horrible. Getting a better look at Issei, now she is facing it. Issei was very pale with large dark circles under his eyes. His hair was rowdy. He looked like a disaster, but the strangest thing was his face. It did not express feeling. Just like his eyes, they were empty without shine. What do you want? If it's to ridicule me, you'll end up worse than that bastard Sanji. His tone was very intimidating, like it was when he beat the perverted duo in Sanji earlier that day. The kendo club was more surprised. This perverted beast, it couldn't be true. He did not look at them in a lewd way, but with indifference. What happened to the energetic and cheerful pervert that no matter how many times you beat him with the kendo club, he did not give up on spying. It was very sad to see a person in this way. hyoto san aren't we good friends? Miriama says, slightly nervous about this confrontation. <laughs> Yeah, we're good friends. If you consider hitting me with a stick almost any time you see me or talk about how it was better for me to be expelled or that I was the worst piece of shit in this world, then we're inseparable friends, with sarcasm rolling off his tongue. I know. We were wrong speaking that way and we regret it. As Maria moved from his side to stand next to her best friend, they bowed their heads. That doesn't matter. So talk and go away. I want to sleep, Issei says. We were not in the classroom when it happened. They told us that two perverts along with Saji and a girl, they had almost expelled you. And when you sent them to the infirmary and you hit Sonokicho, starting it off calm, but ended up reapproaching Issei. And what? You want to know why? I'm already tired of listening to you, Issei says. We would like to know because why did this happen and why did Saji say they betrayed you? She put her hand in her skirt and then quickly pulled it out. Issei was about to tell them that he, that he would not tell them anything, but he felt that the people he was waiting for had already arrived and he knew he'd have to explain everything to them. So he decided to tell the kendo duo that the people would listen, thus kill two birds with one shot. All right. Leaning back against the tree, Issei says, or starts to say, Katase and Moriyama paid close attention, along with the other guests. I discovered three days ago that I have a disease that is killing me. This impacted all who were listening. The disease makes me spit blood, feel weak, and every day I get closer to my death. Looking at the sky, Issei finishes. What? But she remembered... That she was told that Issei had spit blood in the classroom. That's why you look like this. It makes sense, Mariyama says. Yeah, but the other thing you asked is a bit complicated, closing his eyes, Issei said. And what would it be? Still confused, Katase said. I had a relationship with the girls of the ORC, and with the other girls as well. They shocked both kendo girls. But did not only did we have a relationship, but we lived together, and we were committed to marriage, his tone becoming cold. Then the rumors were true, only to see Issei nod his head. But why aren't you together, Katase says. That's what I'm getting to. A few days ago, they ignored me. They did not pay attention to me. Some greeted me. But that was it. Before, they slept in the same bed as me, but that ended, as they discarded me as if I was nothing to them, his tone changing from emotionless to one of fury. Uh, and what happened? Why did they discard you, feeling sorrow for Issei, Mariyama is? 
A short period of time ago, I fell into a coma. It only lasted two weeks, but apparently that was more than enough for them to lose all feelings they had for me, or die or were placed, lowering his head, his hair to cover up his eyes. They thought that I would die, that I would never wake up. I don't know. All that I know, those two weeks were enough so that they would no longer love me, but maybe from the beginning they never loved me or I was just a toy, or they got tired of me of my perversion, but that doesn't matter. They changed and deceived me, his tone dead and empty, no sadness or anger within it. And who did they change you for? With some tears coming out of their eyes, kind of, ah, easy, my so-called friend and rival who I considered a brother, my so-called best friend who I help overcome his past, my other rival who shared my perversion, and my so-called friend who I believe to be my younger brother, and the one that I once considered to be a second father, his tone growing darker. <laughs> who would have thought, but it's the truth, Issei says. Kadase and Moriyama could not believe it. Everything that was happening to Issei from being in a coma, to your girlfriends who betrayed you, to your best friends that considered you family, and awaiting for death, this was unreal. For the person to endure that, they would cry, hugging someone close to them or become suicidal. When these words passed through their heads, they were a little afraid that Issei would take the second option. It was true that they were not close to him and they had several horrible things to the brunette, but that did not mean they hated him to death. Sure, he spied on them, but all men have some perversion and even woman, and that was reason for this to happen to him? This answer was that he did not deserve this, but they could not do anything but to try to comfort him because he could do more damage to himself than they had, so they just sat sobbing while Issei was watching. And seeing Issei, they could see someone who is on the verge of breaking, someone who carries a weight on his back, someone good but was silent in disgrace. But he was not one to go behind the backs of those who hurt him to take revenge, as many people would do. He is sitting here, suffering in silence. And why aren't you at home with your parents, still sobbing from the ordeal that he says, Gurnit Murama says. <laughs> My parents, huh? His voice taking on an even darker tone. The Kendo duo felt that the answer meant that everything was worse than they thought. My parents were aware that they deceived me, and they agreed to it. <laughs> Those good parents had the audacity to say that I should be like them. <laughs> what pathetic bitches and pieces of shit, his voice dead again. So do me a favor and call me Hiyoto. Thanks, Issei says. So do me a favor and never call me Hiyoto again, Issei says. They could no longer believe it. He was enduring all this alone, without help. It was him against the world. This was very bad. He needed help, but from who? His parents were going on this along with his friends, and his girlfriends too. Even his perverted friends did something terrible. Who was someone who was already going through all of this? They, what were they thinking? Ah, it's better you two go. I want to be alone. Looking at the two girls, Issei says. They looked back at Issei in silence for a few seconds until Issei spoke again. Also, who are you going to deliver that recording to? Pointing to Kadase's shirt, Issei says. You, you knew, stuttering, afraid of what Issei's reaction would be. Yes, Issei replied. And you're not angry, Muriyama replied. I'm also afraid what Issei could do. No, just tell me who you told to record me, his... No, just tell me who told you to record me, Issei said. His tongue is still empty. It was Akira Kiryu, Kadase says. Are you friends or something? Issei replied, yes, we're friends, standing her ground, Rayama says. Then you can leave. His voice became intimidating. Uh, right, as both girls began to turn and leave, but in a quick movement they embraced Issei. What the f- are you doing? His tone promising death, Issei says. We're sorry for asking you those questions, for recording you, and everything that we did to you in the past. We can only ask for your forgiveness, as she and Kadase separated from Issei. <laughs> I already said that it doesn't matter. It's in the past, but I want to know, what will you do with the recording? Raising an eyebrow, Issei says. After showing it to Akia, we plan to show it to those of the Academy, so that they see the true face of their two great Onisamas, with venom in her tone, and Muriyama nodding in agreement to the test of their former idols. Kadase finishes. Well, you better get going, Issei says, moving from leaning onto the tree to lying on the ground. We're really sorry. As she leaves and Kadase left at the same time. After three minutes, 
Seriously, they won't come out, Issei says. When saying the two figures came from behind the tree that Issei was previously leaning on, these figures were immobile. All good, it's alright, standing up from turning to the face of the figures. Am I glad, Drake says, surprising Issei because he said it in a lively tone. Are you serious, Drake? Issei replied, It was to cheer you up. Don't take it personal, Drake says. Well, whatever, cutting off the communication with the dragon looking at the figures. Hello, Sarichan and Inichan, said in an empty tone, Issei says. The two women did not move but kept sobbing. Oh, okay. Bring it in. Opening his arms, Issei does. Seraphal was the first to throw herself at Issei and embrace him tightly. Seraphal was fearing many emotions, but the joy that came in at her when she found him, that feeling of despair and fear calmed down. He was in front of her, but on the other hand, there was confusion, anger, and incompetence she felt useless, as she was the one that she considered a little brother to suffer this in being left alone. It did not matter that she had so much work because of the Triaxa. She would have been with him, but she wasn't, and that was feeling was consuming her. She was putting more and more force into the embrace as she did not want to let go. She felt that if she did not, she would fall into darkness, that no one could take him out, and she would not allow that. Issei caressed the head of Seraphal carefully, allowing he was expressing affection he did not show on his face. He then looked to Graithia, who was in the same place, and like Seraphal, tears fell through her eyes. You too, sis? Opening his other arm a little more, Issei does. After a few seconds, she also jumped into his arm to hug him. Graphia strongly embraced Issei. At this time, there was no label of respect. She just wanted to confirm that he was here and that he would not leave. The two were sobbing for five minutes until they calmed down and remained holding him. After they calmed down, they sat with Issei on the floor. Graphia starts. I'm glad to see you are well, Roboto, a little sorry for her earlier behavior, but rubbing his head, glad that he was at least safe. I'm okay, Issei replies. The two noticed that Issei was not the one they knew. He did not look at them with bright eyes. He did not express feelings on his face. His tone was flat and empty, and his appearance was bad. Issei-chan, is what you said true? Seraphal said, looking towards the ground. For the most part, yes, Issei replied. So... Pushing herself to clear her mouth, they did, watching Issei with concern. Yes, Issei replied to Graphia. After those words, a great silence was formed, which lasted a few minutes until it was broken. No, no, it can't be. Hearing from her gaze from the ground to look back at Issei, Seraphal does. It's the truth, looking back at Seraphal. How... Could they? Graphia says. Her tone was quiet, still trying to process what she heard. Suddenly, the atmosphere became cold as the temperature was dropping. Tell me, the disease, it's real with a palpable fear in her voice, Seraphal says. Yeah, it's true. I'm dying, Issei says, looking towards the sky. The whole atmosphere froze. The cold was too much, so Issei had to use magic so it's not to freeze. Girls, please calm down. I can't be using magic. Ugh! Ended up spitting out blood, Issei started to. The two became even worried and stopped using their magic, making the environment return to normal. Issei cleans his mouth, where he drains some of the blood out. Drake. Yes, the amount of magic you can use has gone down, Drake says. Shit, Issei replies. Odo, are you alright? Becoming very worried, Graphia says. Are you okay, Issei? John just as worried as Graphia. Yeah, although you almost killed me, but I'm fine. Issei says, we better take you to Sir Zaxama, Graphia says. You're right, the more time passes it gets worse standing up from the ground, Seraphal replies. Hey, why the rush, Issei says, you're spitting blood, and you're not as nervous as worried? And chops us about Issei's behavior, Seraphal says. Yeah, Seraphal saw is correct, we better hurry, also getting up from the ground. Graphia says, calm down, this is nothing. As he got up from the ground, Seraphal and Graphia said, Like hell, it's nothing! All right, just breathe and calm down with this calm expression present. They both took heavy breaths and calmed down. Well, now this is what we will do, putting his hands on the shoulders of the two. What will we do, Seraphal says. The best thing would to do is to go to Sir Zek Sama, proceeding to make a teleportation server, but Issei spoke first. No. I won't go yet, but you will, Issei says. Seraphal says Graphia said, uh, confused. You will go and tell Sir Zex to make a meeting that I would only have to explain everything once, removing his hands. From the shoulders of the two, Issei says. 
that's a good idea, thinking about the benefits of doing so, Grafia thought in her head. And who would go to this meeting, intrigued by Issei with selects? Sir Zex, you, Anne, Zectodius' son, Venana's son, Syro Orc, Lord Phoenix, Lady Phoenix, Odin, Gondal, Barkil, Shamazil, Sona, her parage, all of them, Lord Seatree, Lady Seatree, Yakasa, Arthur, Bioko, Michael, Yurel, Valerie, if she can, Tanin, Ajuka's son, and Falbim's son. That would be all, Issei said. Okay, both said, remembering the given names. All right, we'll go inform Sir Zexam about this, making a magic circle for the woman to leave. I will come and find you and everything is ready, preparing to enter the circle, Seraphal says. Okay, he says, says, lying back on the ground. Are you sure that you'll be fine? Worried about his condition. Yeah, calm down and don't worry. Just resting. Raises his hand to his sick that he's okay. With a nod of their heads, both left Issei to go speak with Sir Zex. In the underworld, in Sir Zex's office now, it's a scene change. The redhead with a serious look on his face was watching the door, waiting. He already seen the video about 50 times. and could not get that feeling that his sister and her parage and the others did such foolish move of committing indefinitely. And they lost a noble and honest man. While thinking, a magic circle appeared to show Seraphal and Griffia. The two upon arrival were stunned at the gaze of Sir Sex, which said, Talk now! Which frightened them a little. Well, his voice with a heavy tone, Sir Sex said, We found him, Seraphal said, going to summon the couch that was in the office. And where is he? Looking at his wife, his tone never changing. He did not want to come. At least not yet. I figured it would be better to schedule a meeting so he can explain everything at once, Griffia said. How was he? Nothing was wrong with him, right? Running a hand... Hand through his hair, Sir Zex says. He's not well, Griffith, Sarah Falls says. It would be better to make preparations as soon as possible, Griffith says. You're right, and who will attend this meeting, Sir Zex says. Well, both say at the same time. Now, back with Issei. Issei was lying on the grass with his eyes closed in a common relaxing silence, but he broke the silence. Hey, Drake, his eyes never moving nor opening. What's wrong? Drake says, a green circle glowing on his Issei's hand as the dragon spoke. When the process begins, how long will I be human? Opening his eyes, looking at the sky. I don't know for sure. It could be a month, ten years. I'm not sure, Drake says, concerned about this. Who knows? If another threat would appear, Issei wouldn't be as strong. Certainly not strong enough to put a target in his place as lesser dragon for his crimes. Well... I can take advantage of it getting up from the ground. How? What's the benefit? Drake said. Well, I have a mediocre base of all my powers. I'm a physical attacker and only know how to fight melee well. I can use magic, but I hardly know how to use any. I have three swords and I hardly know how to use them. I am someone who has power, but doesn't know how to use it efficiently, beginning to walk. Well, I guess you're right. You can train when you don't have it, and when they return, apart from being stronger, you would know how to use them perfectly and even approve on them, Drake says. Exactly, Issa replies. I'm going to buy some things to prepare that oasis will help. Since you said the magic around it won't take much, go slower, which will give you more time to train, leaving the park. Issei was walking around the city in the library. He went to look for certain books. He found what he was looking for, a self-defense book, a boxing book, a kendo book, a book that was based on a variety of sword styles, a book that was based on different striking styles, and a medicine book. These were for beginners. He got even more complicated ones, a math book just like medicine ones from the beginner to intermediate levels. Based on school levels, they could be considered from college and beyond. S physics books, chemistry books, knowing that he would most likely miss school, he could only hope Sona would cover for him so we could take a back for finals, pass, and move on to the next level. Being pleased with what he found, he took them. In addition, he got a backpack to carry them. He brought this item and left, putting all the books, and kept walking. Why all that, Drake says, referring to the books speaking in his partner's mind, as well as he was in public at the moment. It's to learn to do when I cannot do in my current state. Plus, I intend to continue my education. I want to have a degree. I missed a bit because I was in a coma and barely caught up. I may be gone for longer while, so I want to stay caught up on my education. Unlike those bitches who were too busy f***ing around, they probably were expecting me to catch them up to speed or Sona to do so maybe a little Sanji since he was only one in school. Ha! 
Indeed, it is why to stay up to date on your schoolwork, but why the fighting books, Drake said. Uh, about that, I decided to fend for myself, because I would do everything my way. I would learn to be independent, to fight my way to use magic. Nobody would know how I fight, making it more difficult to beat me, since they don't know of what I've learned, and it will help me mature. How interesting. If this is the path you choose to walk, I can support you. Drake says, but to himself he thought, for as long as I can, Drake said to himself. I have to ask Ajuka to see if he gives me more books on magic. His formulation of spells are so intricate. I want to be able to utilize my magic to the fullest. I'll have to see if Shami and Barkyul can get me everything about the sacred gears. Hmm. I also want to ask if there is something like magical mathematics or magical psychics thinking about it. It would be better to understand everything. I would have to ask for a type of dictionary or something. Ah, I'm hungry. Starting to walk to the small cafe, it was like 5 o'clock nearing the evening and he went to qu eat quite early. After eating, Ise came out of the calf, feeling a little more refreshed, but then he turned his head. He met two people he did not want to see, unfortunately. It seems that those two people saw him. Drake growls. Great. Just what we needed. We don't have time for this shit, Drake says. Indeed. A glare, and out present on his face, his eyes giving a slight amber glow. Oh, look, it's Issei, Mickey says, pointing in his direction. Hey, Issei, Garo says, and she began to approach him. Issei only sighed, began to walk in the opposite direction, ignoring those two. He listened as they called him, but he ignored them. Son, son Issei, trying to get Issei's attention, Garo was. Mickey ran until she reached Issei's side. Son, where have you been? You had us worried, looking sideways at Issei's while scolding him. Issa did not care. She was there and kept walking onto the tune of his own beat. Issa Hiyoto, stop walking this instant, Mickey says, grabbing Issa by the shoulder. Shut up and let go of me, you bitch, removing Mickey's hand from his shoulder. Oh, wait, forgive me. Calling you a bitch would be an insult to them. With venom in his tone, he turned and keep walking, Issa says. Mickey, Mickey was rattled that her son would say such a word. Before she could say anything, Goro interrupted. How dare you talk to your mother like that? First, you don't return home and then insult your mother? You are going to receive some punishment for your insolence. Stop. Stopping Issei by grabbing his shoulder. Ah, uh, it seems I cannot be at peace, Issei says. I think it's time to put them in their place, Drake says. You're right, Issei replied. Ah, uh, what do we have here? I believe I told you to leave me alone, Issei says, grabbing Goro's hand off his shoulder and turning towards the man. What happened to you, son? Oh, are you sad that you're not able to spend touch mine with the girls? Don't worry. They were in the house, placing his hand back on Issei's shoulder, stopping him again. <sighs> Alright, look, you piece of shit. I already told you to let me go and leave me alone, with a growl in his tone, once again grabbing the hand off his shoulder. Son, why are you talking to us like this, Mickey says, trying to prevent the situation from escalating. Leave me alone, or you will regret it. Letting go of the hand and preparing to go on his way, Issei does. What the fuck is wrong with you, Gro said before turning to his wife, lowering his voice. <clears throat> you see, dear, this is why I told you that they were better than him. But the response he got in return was not from his wife. Then why don't you adopt them and raise them? You know what they shit raises shit. His glare slightly intensified. Both adults were shocked. They did not expect him to hear them. W what are you talking about, son? Nervous about what they may transpire. Don't call me that. I am not your son of a piece of shit like you. So I suggest you reconsider what you call me. His tone is empty and indifferent. Look, you spoiled child. It's best that you apologize for all these idiocies what you're saying, grabbing Issei again, girl, it does. Partner. I know, Issei replies. This time, Issei did not remove Goro's hand, but raised his hand and snapped his fingers, creating a barrier. When making the barrier, he felt a puncture of pain in his heart, but he did not show it. All right, you piece of shit, I've gotten tired of this. So this is my last warning that I'll give you, his voice taking a much darker tone. Son, calm down and let's go home. I'm going to grab Issei's hand, but couldn't help but think. I have to know if he knows about the girls, Mickey says to herself. Issei lowered his head, making the adults think that he had calmed down and bring him home. <laughs> son, this and son, that. You sound like a broken record. You don't even know what the meaning of that word is. Looking into Miki's eyes, she could see the inferno within them. That amber glow. She felt like it could burn her. She was frightened by the look and stepped back a little. But Goro came and became angry and squeezed his grip on Issei. Look, I've already had it. When you get home, you will see the punishment that I will give you. Trying to drag Issei, but he didn't move. 
Are you deaf? I'm not going to any fucking place with you, the venom in his voice returning. Who do you think you're talking to? I'm your father, looking into Issei's eyes. You poor soul, you don't even know, Drake says. Ha! <laughs> My father. You? No, you are just a Chinese imitation of a man, a smirk adorning his face, swatting Guru's hand off his shoulder with force. Look, brat, you shut up and obey or else, waving his hand to shake off the pain from Issei's blow. Oh, and if not, what are you going to do? Don't make me laugh. You know what it is in front of you? It's becoming a bit arrogant, but empty, and I start to glow amber as if they were on fire. I don't care that you are a lower class demon. I am your father, and you will listen to me, Gross says. Lower class? Just as I thought, they told him about the supernatural, but it seems that not everything. Wow, are they far? How far will they go to keep with their lies? And they think they can take my achievements? Issei says. I'm done with this charity, Drake says. So am I, Issei replies. You are not my father. Is that clear to you? Issei says, becoming more threatening in his tone. Miki, why do you have to act this way towards us? Miki says, hoping for a different answer than she wants to believe. Why can't humans keep their mouths shut, Drake said. Even worse, that I have become one of them. While the process goes through, hopefully it's short phase, Issei says. Do you think I don't know damn thing about anything increasing his power no matter how much pain he felt? What are you talking about? Feeding ignorance, Gross said. And you still have to ask. I'll remember how about talking behind my back that I deserve to be deceived. His tone portrayed disgust if he was speaking to lesser beings. Both were frightened. He knew. But how? How do you know, Mickey says. That doesn't matter to you. Look, boy, you are going to tell me how you know, and you will go home and be with the girls. Is that clear to you? Trying to assert himself to Issei. No. You don't order me around. Is that clear? Grum grow by his neck in a quick movement. Apparently, you and that bitch help those damn whores. Tightening the grip. If only they told the truth. You, you are going to respect us. You perverted brat. You should not even be with them. You should be grateful embracing Issei. Making him release Goro. Issei just is silent. It's true. It's best if you shut up and answer my questions. Grabbing Issei by the color of his shirt. How do you even know about that? Looking into Issei's eyes. You don't care about that. With an emotionless tone. Yes, we do. Knowing that if you say anything, you will ruin the reputation of our girls, Mickey said. Issei kept silent, listening to his parents. It breaks him more. No matter how much he hated them, there was still some affection towards them. But it seems that they did not have any cursing the girls for ruining his family. He never should have let them in his life. Now he's kicking them out. It's over. And when the truth comes to light, they can only blame themselves. These fools will know who Issei really was and curse themselves for listening to some wretched whores. And they'll know that he wasn't their son anymore. He's a dragon. He could have been considered a descendant of Great Red, not these greedy humans who use his money for lavish vacations. I will not let that perverted shit ruin the image of the girls, tightening his gap, Gross says. Issei was connecting the dots, because they didn't care about having sex in the house, because they didn't care about when they saw them with his friends, and the reason why these two helped and supported them. This ended destroyed, and killing the little affection he felt for the people in front of him. You guys are shit, Issei says. What did you say, Mickey said, not hearing Issei the first time. Issei took Gross' hand, and just by putting some force in his grip, he broke it, and he bent his wrist backwards. <laughs> Snap! That was the sound that was heard from Gro's hand and wrist. Ah! Screaming in pain and falling to his knees. Dear! Going to her husband in the rescue. You better listen to me and well. And a completely dead and grave look in his eyes. Both adults were paralyzed in fear by Issei's tone when they heard it. The next time you touch me, I will kill them. As for your girl's reputation, don't worry, I won't do anything. They already damaged it themselves. And when the truth comes to light, never look for me, never talk to me, and I am no longer his son. And you will know who to blame, Issei says. Both adults only felt anger, but it was because they could not get the information from Issei. But they did not think about the consequences of this confrontation. They lost their son, but they believed that he would come back and apologize, and they would give him away. That's why girl left.
left a few words come out of his mouth, not knowing that in the future he would regret those words. Ha, <laughs> yeah, of course you are nothing without us, nothing without them. You are just some perverted who had a little power that nobody takes seriously. You are garbage, nothing more. Looking at Issei, it's back as he walked away. I hope you never regret those words, but you will, and I won't care. <laughs> With a tone that showed his superiority over his opponent, knowing that they will continue to cling on to their false truth. What the hell was that tone? That wasn't Issei's voice. What happened? Seems he's not afraid of anymore what life throws at him. It's time to break those chains and be reborn, Drake said. Issei canceled the barrier and got lost in the crowd. Mickey helped up Gara home as they were walking. She thought if it was okay. From Issei's words, it didn't seem that way. But what would a pervert know? Nothing. He just got excited about his name and that of the girls. Who cares? He was a low-class devil. He was not important. Kiba, Gasper, Saji, and Bali, they were real men. And they were worthy of the girls, right? These thoughts repeated over and over in her head until girls spoke. We won't say anything to the girls. He was serious, but scared that Issei might be right. Okay, following her husband home with the same thoughts as him because if Issei was right, she doesn't know what she would do. Issei walked in total silence through the streets towards the park until he heard Drake's voice. They weren't under any kind of magic. They said everything on their own, Drake said, very annoyed at the family his partner was born into. Drake, I don't care. The truth will come to light and they will wallow in despair. Issei Hiyoda was no more. They can blame those whores for killing him. What becomes is none of my concern. They are nothing. Entering the park, going to lie down the same place where he talked to the kendo doer, then later, Seraphal and Grafia. And now we wait, closing his eyes to feel the wind on his face. In his eyes, everything was white. That white was infinite. No matter what he sees, everything was white. He was alone in that white. This gave him a feeling of tranquility and peace. But for a moment, all of the space changed. All of it went white, and a floor of white ceramic tails appeared. White walls and blue line and a smell of alcohol. Seeing all this, he looked in the sitting of an old chair. He was in a hospital, but he did, but he died in a hospital. He just waited. What happened? So, he was there. Or just there. But from the wall on the left, something began to illuminate. The sound. He saw the direction of the projector of the cinema. Then images began to appear in the front. Issei did not pay attention until I heard a voice calling. What? Issei's questioning. No running, said the voice that Issei knew. Issei left his sight. The images that received him were a man chasing a baby who was running around. The man was no one but his father. This was his memory. But he could not remember anything of when he was a baby, because that was impossible. But there was his little self running around being followed by his father. Ah, uh, yes, that's Guru, with a sad tone, Issei says. Issei knew it did not matter that his appreciation, the feelings that he had towards his parents disappeared. There was still the feeling of betrayal, sad, and it does not matter when he got angry, the sadness did not disappear, but grew uncontrollably. That was what he felt. He was trying to suppress all the sadness, anger, and more, but he did not signify that it did not hurt. It did. He felt like his heart died. He did not let it come out, but he already failed, once with Sanji, another with his parents. This was bad. He was like a bag with water. Once he has a hole, all the water came out, something that he tried to avoid every second. Issei, well, he felt many things, but he kept watching the movie or memory, past all of his years as he grew up when he met Irina, but everything began to darken when Irina left. That was a blow for the boy, for the movie, but for Issei, when he saw that his parents hardly cared about his condition of their son, they just said that everything is fine and just to go play. Why was that? Because they did not pay attention to him, because they did not console him, because they did not play with him. All they did was to be with him superficially. They barely supported him. They barely paid any attention to him. As Issei saw this, his blood began to boil. What happened with them? Because he never realized this. They hardly imposed something of what they did when he was young. But the movie came to the moment that Issei changed his whole life. And that was the meat, that old pervert. Issei saw his young self become a pervert, but nobody stopped him. It didn't matter that he bought magazines, games, that his face was perverted almost all day, but nobody corrected him. Nobody stopped him. Because of that, Issei of the present is 
hurting, and it makes him angry to see himself. He knew what was going on through his younger mind, and what was maybe he could get the attention of others. He knew he started all of this with perversion. He was just sad. He was looking for attention. He was looking for someone to fill Irina's place. That was all. But everything was changing, and he was forgetting. Issei was repressing all of his anger. All this happens, everything happened, because they didn't give him attention. He fell into this hole of perversion, betrayal, anger, sadness, everything because they didn't stop him. Nobody gave him a stop. It was difficult. Difficult to sit with him and talk. It wasn't Better to tell him just to leave it behind. It was easy to punish him. It was easier to let him do what he wanted. But it was too difficult to give him attention. It was difficult. These were the words that they repeated over and over again. Hundreds, if not thousands, or millions, or billions of sometimes it was all the same. It was all the fault of something that happened when I was a child. Everything happened because of his sadness. Everything happened because of his stupidity. Those were Issei's thoughts. Until he heard something that broke him again. Issei, stop being a pervert, you are a disgrace, Goro says, becoming annoyed. Issei are growing directly. Was really, it was all his fault. Well, no. Shut up. Not everything is my fault. Everything is because they could not do their damn job as parents. As they should. Everything was that pervert's fault. Everything, everything, I am not to blame, Issei says, getting up from his chair. A fire started. Everything was quickly burning. Because they didn't pay any attention to me. Because they weren't here. Because they didn't stop me. Because nobody helped me. Because, because, as the flame spread through the room. Because you sided with those bitches and your son. Because they hate me. Because they disgust me. Because I'm not enough for you. Because you brought me into this world. You raised me. You didn't help me. You betrayed me. You screaming uncontrollably. But the image changed to another. The image was him of girls on his shoulders. Then it changed again. It was one of Mickey feeding him. And then it changed again. Now it was him smiling at the two of them. Issei sat down again and took a deep breath. Then all the fire was cooling down. And at the end it disappeared. Issei saw those images. Those were moments from his early years then he spent all of his best moments and he just sighed ah i can't handle this i can't keep hating my past since it's the one that made me who i what i am it's the one that helped me to be sad difficult funny since situations of all kinds thanks to that i met people who hurt me and people who support me raising his hand forward all of the liquid on the floor went to the screen and projector and they froze Issei got up and walked over to the ice and kicked it you know what they say what happened yesterday marks you today. What happened today marks tomorrow. Issei just sat down again in silence. Time passed quietly in that place, but from one moment to another, a beep was heard, consecutively from his right and when he was, was surprised. Issei seeing himself laying on the bed, surrounded by all the girls. Issei noticed what was making the noise was the machine to see his heart rate. Issei saw the window where the light was coming from. That means it was daytime. But from one moment to another, it was night. And he turned back to the girls, but realized that Gabriel was missing. Pyomin then he did it again, during the day, and again at night. But now they were missing. Lefei, Ravel, Zenovia, and it was repeated day and night. And only a week had passed. And Issei was in bed alone with no one. He was only accompanied by the sound of machines around you. Issei just smiled and walked towards himself. Huh, only a week, who would say, being next to the bed, but he started to disappear. Oh, it's time to go, Issei finishes. But before he disappeared, he heard a voice well known to him, and when he saw it, it was Rias next to Volley. I hope that someday you will wake up, but meanwhile, I'll do this, but I don't regret it since you would do the same. Proceeding to kiss Volley, Rias does, and then seeing that, Issei disappeared. In reality, Issei opened his eyes and he could hear a voice, Issei-chan, Issei-chan, please wake up, a girl with black hair, blue eyes, and a long sleeve dark green blouse, a long navy blue skirt, and a dark brown boots was calling to him. I'm awake now, Sarah-chan, sitting up from the ground. Issei saw the sky and noticed that it was already night. How long was he asleep for, for it to be night? But he just sighed. Issei, are you okay? Seraphal said, touching his cheeks. Yeah, calm down. I was sleeping, putting his hand on Seraphal's hand, holding it against his cheek, caressing it. That's good, but everything is ready. With a serious face, Seraphal says. Ah, well... Issei finishes, but I have to tell you that Riser is coming. It seems that he found out and wanted to come, Seraphal said. Oh, I made that Yachiriti go. Well, there's no problem. R remaining calm but serious at the same time, Issei finishes. Well, it's better we go. Seraphal makes a magic circle. Yeah, it is. Okay, time to get it 
and get out, Issei says, as he disappeared in the magic circle with Seraphal. And that is the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12. Issei and Seraphal appeared in a luxurious hallway of rooms. Issei saw the rooms and asked, What are we doing here? Issei said, Well, it's time for you to take a bath. You freshen up, looking at Issei. Okay, Issei said, when you finish, just signal to the maid who will be here, preparing to leave, Seraphal does. Okay, goodbye, Issei replied. Issei, upon entering, found a very luxurious room, and he went to take a shower. Now, with Seraphal. So, scene change with Seraphal. Seraphal. When leaving, Issei began to go to the room of the meeting, and when entering, he heard a conversation. Shemazo sang, Sir Zex, you along with Issei-san called us. You know that all the leaders are very busy. Just a month after the Triexa, with a sigh of tiredness. I know we are very busy, but this is very important. His tone is serious, meaning business. Sir Zack says, Well, I hope it's not another war, or a beast that could destroy the world. With a hint of diversion, Michael finishes. Barkil starts, Oh, Sirachan, and where is Issei? Turning his attention to Seraphal, who sat in his chair. Zectius says, Yes, yeah, Seraphal, where is Issei? Growing slightly impatient from waiting. Seraphal replies, Quiet, he will come. Sarah says, Ah... And I was training. Calm yourself, boy. Have patience, a middle-aged man with black hair and violet eyes standing next to BL. Sorry, Lord Zerkum, Sarawurg says. And why would they call us, looking towards his teammates? Arthur said to Bioko. I don't know, but it's strange that they called us, his eyes closed, Bioko said to Arthur. Arthur replies, true, being alert of whatever transpired in the meeting. Valena starts, well, I already wanted to see Issei. I haven't seen him for a long time, smiling at the prospect of seeing the one she considers his son. Yakuza says, yeah, it's been a while. Seraphar replies, he's Sonachan. Do you see anything? Pointing to a blonde. Ah, he hasn't said a word since, Sona said. I see. Glaring at the blonde with Sona, it seemed that the sea trees heard the same sentiment as the Mal Leviathan. What's happening, daughters? Lord Seatree said, seeing the strange exchange between his daughters. Indeed, what is going on? Why is Sanji-san involved? Looking at the now-named Genshirum Sanji, Lady Seatree says, It's nothing, Sona says. Yeah, it's nothing, Seraphor replies. Ajuka starts. Sir Zex, can you give me some information about what's going on? Looking at his friend. Issei will tell you that, Sir Zex replied. Everyone talked to each other, but there were two people who didn't say anything. These were Tanin and Odin, each for their reasons, but it was if they were worried about something. Gondol noticed this, but didn't say anything. The entire room was quieted down, hearing a knock on the door. Enter, Sir Zex says. A maid came in quickly and bowed. The maid says, Lucifer summon, your guest is ready, pointing to the door. Let them through, Sir Zex says. With your permission, proceeding to leave and making way for the someone to come in. Someone entered the room, which remained in a great silence. The person was brunette with pale skin as if he were sick. A black shirt, black pants, a black jacket, with red details on the sides, and black dress shoes. His hair was drooping, so he did not see his eyes, and he transmitted a vibe of coldness. No one in the room knew who he was. They were waiting for the Opie Dragon, a cheerful person, perverted, who dresses with bright colors, who transmitted an aura of joy and perversion. But who was the person in front of them, only recognizable by Sir Zek, Saraval, Sona, and her parage, Tanin, Onin, Yakuza, and Syraord? They knew who was the person in front of them. Some were speechless, and Sir Zex was in shock. Hey, who are you? We were waiting for someone. Better leave. Increasing as Zora rather said, Oh, the shitty chicken doesn't remember me. The person who put up his pride in his ass, Issei says, sitting in the chair that was in front of him. What you did? About to give up, his father stopped him. Hello, everyone. For whom this does not recognize me, I am Issei. His tone was cold. Many in the room were surprised. Many up from their seats. What? A shock scream surrounded throughout the room. Hello? How are you doing? His tone is now calm, Issei said. I I Issei, what, what happened to you? Are, are you okay with great concern, Valena says. Issa replies, hello, Vinshan. And to answer your question, yes, more or less. Zectodia starts, Issei. Are you sure you're fine? You look horrible. His expression is similar to his wife. I'm okay. Speaking calmly. Everyone had many questions, but someone spoke seriously, interrupting them. Issei, I want you to tell, please tell us everything, looking at him very seriously. Issei says, okay, Ajuka, could you use a spell so that everyone can see my memories? Hmm? What for? Ajuka replied, confused by the request. Well, it's better that you see it than to explain it. 
Oh, and another thing, record this meeting. Still calm, but his tone is cold. For what reason must be recorded, Sir Zek says. I'll explain later, Issa replies, turning his attention back towards Ajuka. Ajuka was not sure, but seeing Sir Zek's nod, he did what he asked, and the room turned quiet. Alright, just think about the memory and it will reproduce, Ajuka says. Okay, Issa says, closing his eyes and focusing. Valena, hmm, what's going on, Issa? You're so serious that we have to see it. Yaka says, yeah, that's true. Issa replies, you will see. The room change of color, starting with everything from the beginning. Those in the room were confused. When Issa's room appeared, they saw how he went to school, and when leaving, Drake informing him that he felt Orphis, and that so everything began as Issa sees as a part of his harem with Vali. All of his feelings were transmitted. Many could not believe it. Others would not believe it. All the sadness was immense. That broke the hearts of many who appreciated Issei. They saw how he went to the house, hearing the conversation of the girls. When they thought he left, the Gremory clan began to feel more and more shame from Rias' actions. They saw how he trained, being the visuals of Sanji and Vali. How he discovered the others and saw two of his best friends with so-called fiancés. Though they noticed something about those friends of his, they felt a feeling of darkness. Nothing good began to appear, such as seeing the one he considered his other father was with two of his women. How it broke every time, more as he thinks about suicide. They saw as he saw the people having sex in his own room. How he talked to Rainer, how he suffered from the acid, how his mind was corrupted more and more. Everything that happened in school, how his perverted fans did the unforgivable act to him. How he broke and released his wrath, how he humiliated Sanji and spoke his truce. How he talked with Kadase and Murayama and talked to Grafia and Seraphal. They could see how he met his parents and what they told him this flared up the material instincts of the woman who had children finally they saw the ending starting from his dream showing his past his body experience hearing rius words made zictodius and valena see a tramp portraying as their daughter as and how he arrived with seraphal everything ended in less than 30 minutes Everyone was silent, but they released their auras as if there was tomorrow. The worst were the parents of the girls, Zectodius and Valena, Lord and Lady Phoenix, and even Michael and Uriel. So much anger in their thoughts, their wings flickered, despite that was implemented into the system, and they could see a flaw. Sir Zex was expelling much of his power as well as Grafia. Even those who were likely like Shimizim and Zerkham were no exception. Barkil was grinding his teeth, but everyone calmed down to hear a roar. Ah! I'm going to kill those bitches! How dare they do that to a dragon! They will regret everything they were born! Tanin says, releasing an insane amount of killer intent. Calm down, Oji-san, looking at his master that he trained him. When he came to the underworld months ago, Tanin froze up, seeing the eyes of his students. They were empty, no emotions, almost lifeless. That's why he calmed down. I had a bad feeling when you sent me the call, but this, you already looked for things to do the ritual, Tanin said. Yeah, I almost have everything prepared, Issa replied. Many were reassured to hear the exchange between the two dragons, but someone spoke. Ha, huh, you don't seem affected. Calm, not understanding the scope of the situation, Sanji says out loud. Everyone, when they heard those words, turned to the bastard. They felt a murderous instinct that only lasted a second, but it was so much that it gave Sir Zex gave him chills. Oh, I forgot you existed. His tone was very cold, he said. Ha, huh, but everything is done. You lost and I won, Sanji said, trying to be mocking, but he was about to find out that he never won. Oh, you won. I guess I should refresh your memory and begin act two of what happened in school earlier today, appearing next to Sanji. Uh, becoming a little scared, but he was grabbed by the face and lifted up. Oh, congratulations. You took away the virginity of some fucks, bitches, whores, whatever you want to call them. But you have once proven yourself useless. And thanks to your shortcomings, it looks like Kao and Gengo won't be getting in a nice nephew from you. Increasing the strength in his hand when he released his murderous instinct. You know... To why I did not exclude you from this meeting, it's because I want to ask you something. Vitra, increasing his strength more, the pressure around the blonde's head made his scream in pain, so don't test your luck, releasing the inferior dragon. Hey Vitra, Albion and you, either one of you in agreement with this, sitting in his chair? Me? No, but Albion seems to have something planned, Vitra said. I see. Well, I don't care. Your stupid carrier made things that much easier, Issei said. Yes, 
He's not even worthy of being called a dragon anymore, just a low-class demon, Fitra says, taunting the blonde that he was trapped inside, knowing the consequences of what will happen to whatever dragon's females that he mated with, and losing to said dragon, dishonoring himself. He was about to continue talking, but felt two people looking at him with sorrow. Those were Valena and Yakasa. I, I'm sorry, Valena says, crying from seeing feeling what he's been through. She couldn't take it and hugged her son. Yakasa didn't say anything, but she hugged him, trying to keep the composure at this moment, everyone in the room found something to say, all said at the same time. Sorry. Issei replied, quiet. I don't do pity, Issei says, but, but you're dying because of my daughter's fault. His hand shaking for what his daughter has caused, Ectodius says. You don't have to worry about that, Issei says, letting go of the two women. Barkil says, how can you be so calm? Squeezing his fist so much that it was bleeding. Well, simple. Why bother? Everything is over. I won't do anything because I don't need to, Issei says. Zectodius says. That damn child! Speaking through gritted teeth. Sir Zek starts. Issei. What do you want to do with them? What punishments do you want me to impose on them? Serious about Issei may say. After all, he is the pillar. And this would be considered treason, Sir Zek said. Issei replies. Listen, Sir Zek's knee. Surprising him with that nickname. I am not their husband. I am not their fiance. I am not their boyfriend, nor their friend. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not part of their family. His tone was very cold. So they will fight their own battles. I am not helping them anymore. If they want happiness, they have to fight for it themselves. But if they put their faith in that pathetic blonde, pointing towards the blonde that's still on the ground, huh, well then good luck that to them. All were silent, but Ajuka spoke. Ajuka says, tell me two things first. Why do you want me to record this meeting? And second, what will you do now? Closing his eyes in concentration. First, it's to show it to the other factions if they ask about me. And second, I'm leaving, Issei said. Those words surprised everyone, but also confused them. And how long will you be going, Sarorg said. Issei replies, well, I could be gone for a few months, maybe a year. I don't know how long, but I'll be gone. Though I would need to finish school, education is important. I would like to get my degree, Issei says. Many wanted him to tell many wanted to tell him something, but they knew all the feelings he had, so they didn't say anything. Do you need help? Tanin says. Issei replies, No thanks. Also, have a recording for old Red and Lilichan, Issei said. What? For Great Red, Sama and Lilichan? Seraphal said. Doesn't it seem strange that he hasn't appeared yet, Issei says. Everyone upon hearing that realized what those words meant. That if Great Red found out what Orphus did, he was capable of killing her, and not just her. Issei says, A few days after waking up, he called me in a dream. He told me that he would go to sleep for a long time, and that he would take Lilichan. His words in quote, I am taking her, so that there is not another semi-nude Gologlothly that can create another terrorist organization, Issei said, end quote. Sir Zex replies, Issei, would you like to tell us to call them so that we can give them a punishment, Sir Zex says. Issei replies, Ah, I don't want to see them, as I told you. You can impose your own punishments, but I don't want to tell them. I don't want you to tell them anything now. Issei says. Valena says, and we shouldn't tell them anything because annoyed and confused by Issei's decision. Issei replies, "What do you think they'll do if they are told something? They will look for me, acting like pathetic wretches trying to save their own skin, like the cowardous people that they are. Well, except for Lesser Lucifer, he's likely to be an arrogant to the whores that he slept with." They probably don't even know that I saved that wretched one's life by taking an attack from the Triexa. Hence why I was in a coma, Issei said. Drake says, It's true. The damned white one would have died had it not been for my partner, Drake says, making himself known for the first time, knowing Issei can handle the situation. Yakuza replied, But they must be punished. Issei says, Yes. But they will be the ones who look for me, and I don't want to be disturbed. You can do what you want, but at this moment, you need time to think and reflect on what you will do. Right now, you're letting your anger get the best of you, Issei says. Everyone was silent. Zerkum finishes, or starts. You have matured, young Sekiri. I look forward to your return, and you may prosper on your journey, definitely worthy of a higher rank. I bid you farewell. Zectodius, Valena, Sir Zex, have a good evening. Getting up from his seat and leaving to head back to the BL territory, if one could see his face, they would see a smirk, as he was very impressed by the maturity of Issei by calming the situation and telling the leaders to think rationally before they make a decision rather than seek revenge. He left their judgment in the hands of the factions, not wanting to deal with such traitors himself, as he wanted no ties to them. But question, one question did come to his mind. I wonder what your clan will be called. 
knowing that Issei seemed content with leaving the Hyoto Surame behind as he was no longer with them, or at least not anymore. Well, that's it. I better leave, Issei says, getting up from his own seat. He was about to leave, but Sictodius would speak. Sictodius says, when do you leave, with his head down? I don't know, but I think that after doing the ritual, Issei said, well... You can stay in the mansion tonight, serious about his suggestion. He wanted to spend time with the boy. From what he saw in his visions, it's clear that he did not have much parental love like they gave Rias. But despite that, Issei turned out better due to the turmoils he's gone through. No, I don't want to be a bother. Initially declining the proposal, but upon looking at Zictodius and Valena, something made him inclined to agree. Uh, fine. Okay, let's go, Issei said. The meeting ended in only 40 minutes. Everyone felt angry, sad, and there were emotions. But many went and apologized to Issei and said they would punish those that hurt him before leaving to their own destinations with a recorded copy of the meeting while Issei, Zictodius, and Valena went to the Grimbury Mansion. And that is the end of Chapter 12. Chapter 13 Issei, Zictodius, and Valena left the meeting room, leaving Sir Zex, Grafia, Seraphon, and Sona, and her entourage. Heoni-sama, can I castrate Sanji? Sona said with a calm smile, but her eyes looked dead, similar to Issei's emotionless face. Sona! Seraphal said, fearing that she would freeze her sister in place before she did something out of character. Now? In the Gremory Mansion? When the parachutes and Issei appeared, a servant girl greeted them went curiously. Valena starts, Issei, you better go to sleep. It's late. I'm sure you must be very tired, looking at the brunette. I'm going to take care of the engagement, proceeding to leave, as she did. A tear fell from her eye, which didn't go unnoticed by Issei. Zictodius says, Okay, good night, Issei. Unable to look Issei in the eye, as he also walked away from the brunette. Okay, Issei replied. His tone was calm and quiet, knowing the parents were hurting. They wanted to look strong, but they couldn't deny it. The actions of their daughter hurt them tremendously. Issei followed a maid to his room. When Issei arrived, he took the coat off and sat on the edge of the bed. Ah, really, it's good that I'm here. Issei says, closing his eyes and basking in the moment. I guess you could say that, Drake says, his tone just as quiet as his partner's. Well, I better try to get some sleep, Issei says, lying down on the bed without a care in the world. As he laid down, he didn't move. He wrapped himself up. He was just laid there in silence with his eyes closed. He did for minutes, but he couldn't sleep at all. No matter how hard he tried, he began to move from one side to another, but nothing was bothering him. But nothing in that was bothering him. Issei got up from the bed and looked at the clock. Huh? It's already been an hour? Surprised by how much time has elapsed. Issei felt thirsty. He got up from the bed and put on his shoes and went out to look for the maid. But there was no one. Whenever he looked out, there was no butler or maid. Nobody for a second he was worried. But it was the Gremory Mansion, so he didn't have nothing bad to worry about. He went down to the living room and saw he saw something, or rather someone. It was Ictodius sitting on the couch. But on the table, there were boxes of beer and wine, and he was drinking some of them. Zictodius, son, what are you doing? Issei says as he approaches, is trying not to scare the man, depending on how much alcohol was in the system. Zictodius replies, oh, I'm not doing anything. His tone was soft-spoken. Well, drink a glass. I'm just here, sitting. He turns his attention to Issei, but what are you doing? Zictodius says. Issei replies, I just can't sleep, as if he sits on the couch in front of Zictodius. Huh, you're not mad at me. Don't you find it funny to see me like this, Zictodius says, taking his glass for another drink. Why would I be happy? Issei replied, confused by the man's question. Well, you're in front of the father of one of the girls who betrayed you. Please don't hate me. Please don't hate me, lowering his head in a bit of sorrow, Zictodius says. Ah, Issei replies, now understanding the man's question. Can I have one? Pointing at a beer. Uh, of course, they are special beers and wines for demons, confused by Issei's want for the drink, Zictodius says. Okay, Issa replies, taking a beer and drinking it. Ah, this flavor, making a sour face. Ha! <laughs> Look at your face, Sictodius, laughing hard at Issa's face made. Don't make fun of me, Issa says, frowning while he took another drink. Ah, now that's better. Yes, well, it's delicious, taking a beer from the table and drinking it as well. But then he stopped. Issa. Issa starts, Sictodius, son, don't ruin the moment. Issei replies, taking another swig of his beer, you and I are here, calmly drinking, there's nothing else. His tone and Bashi Parma were calm. Zictodius starts, but, but, clenching his teeth and a tear came out of his eyes, I, I can't, I can't be in front of you calmly, it makes me angry with myself, it hurts me, it makes me angry, frustrated by what has transpired, Zictodius says. Look, you, collecting himself to say the right words to calm the man down, 
You shouldn't be worrying. I'm calm. I don't need you or anything. Drinking another beer. But if you want to get it out, I won't stop you smiling at the man. Letting know that it's going to be okay, he says. says. Victodius has so many regrets. Felt as if the stress he had was gone because of those words and he could only smile. <laughs> Laughing bittersweetly and drinking a whole beer in one gulp. Thanks, looking at Issei, said Zictodius. You don't have to thank me, Issei replied, drinking his beer like Zictodius just did. Well... This is very depressing, Zictodius starts. Getting up from the chair, I'll put on some music for the environment, taking out of control where he started typing. Ha, huh, well I guess you're right, Issei says, drinking another beer. I think this'll do, Zictodius says, after typing what he wanted. Oh, I know this one, Issei says, putting the beer aside. Well, it's one of those ones that I like the most, starting to hum the rhythm of the song, Zictodius starts. Ugh. <sighs> Issei, verse 1, I've been locked in a locker, I was picked in the last soccer, and that was all fun, but they're fun, it ain't fun, man, I'm done, and I know we're all different, our beliefs and religions, but I don't see the difference in me, you, your two, or most vows. Issei and Zictodius pre-chorus, so if you've had enough then, Zictodius and Issei just start constantly singing, yeah. Ha! <laughs> You sing well, Issei said, relaxing the sofa, feeling as if the weight was lifted. Well, you're not so bad yourself, Zictodius said, relaxing as well in his own chair. Zictodius and Issei are just silent, and then they start blaffing for no reason. Do you want to continue? Issei says, grabbing another two hours. Oh, you can keep up with me, son? You think you can keep up with me? Zictodius says, laughing, not noticing what he called Issei. Ha, we'll see about that, old man, Issei says, smiling at the banter between the two. The two of them continue to drink and sing for about two hours. Ha, it's funny. I read about this in a manga. One was taken with a father as he kept singing, but remembering what Zictodius called him. Drink by drink, bottle by bottle, the two formed a bond, although through silly but refreshing action. Now, after two hours... The two finished singing a song and were tired. Standing up, Zictodius walked towards Issei, who also stood up, and placed his hand on Issei's shoulder. Really, thank you for not hating me, Zictodius, his head down in gratitude. How could I have had such a... How could I hate such a pitiful old man, Issei says, smiling and patting Zictodius' hand in reassurance. I'm not pitiful, Zictodius says, patting Issei's shoulder in return. Issei says Zictodius at the same time. Cheers, raising the bottles and drinking to their own drinks in one gulp. Ah, sitting down on the couch. It's been a long time since I drank and had fun, Zictodius said, looking at the ceiling. Issei replied, this is the first time that I had fun in a long time as well, sitting on the couch, remembering years ago, when he first went fishing with the girl or played with Irina. Only those good times, not had it transpired in the last couple of days. Zictodius replies, well... It will not be the last, looking at Issei. Maybe when you return, we can go there to a party with Lord Seatree and Lord Phoenix. But, thought to himself, or better yet, when you are promoted, you deserve it after all, after you've done. You've definitely proven to be more of a high class than Rius was, Zictodius says. Well, that doesn't sound like a bad idea, old man. A small smile forming on his face, Issei says. All can is wait for when come back, Zictodius said, falling asleep on the couch. Uh huh. With a drop of sweat in his head, uh, I better let him sleep. Getting from from the couch and putting away for a few years' case before going to the yard. Issei does. Now in the courtyard, he sits on the bench, looking at the sky of the underworld. I don't understand two things, Drake said, making his presence known. What are those things? His gaze ringing on the sky. Well, first. Because you don't hate them, Drake says. Easy. I hate their daughter, not them. They are not to blame for their what their daughter did. And the fault is on her and her alone. It goes to all of them, once again, showing the maturity, not blaming on the others, who were aware of the infidelity and pulling out a beer and opened it. S the second... You did not get out of touch with him, Drake says, imagining the answer as he sees how Issei has grown. Ah, well, having a drink of beer, he was already in that state, just knowing what his daughter is to me. Imagine what I would do if I started to take out all of my sadness and anger with him, looking back at the sky. They don't deserve that, Drake, Issei says. You know you are going down a long path, right? Drake says, knowing his partner is not seeking revenge and will never forget what has happened, but he knows how to move on. He did what the fallen angel, he'll do it again. After all, as the saying goes, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Yeah, I guess I am, he says, says drinking more of his beer. You know that it has no effect on you, so why do you keep taking it, Drake says. Oh, I like its taste, Issei says, taking out his phone and headphones. You want to accompany me to a song? Huh! 
I prefer to listen to you, Drake says, relaxing back in Issei's mind and waiting for his partner to sing as he comps both of them. <laughs> All right, he proceeds to start singing the song and tapping the bench of the rhythm of the song. Issei just starts singing and finding answers for getting all the questions we called home. So basically, he's just singing the whole entire time. And then we stop. Issei breathed out a sigh. The song ended, looking to the sky, envisioning the sunlight as the, song, as the song depicted. You sing well, a feminine voice called out to him. When did you come back, Valena son, seeing Valena walking towards him? Not too long ago, Valena says, sitting next to Issei. And, Issei replied, well, you are more or less not committed to her. But finishing everything will take at least two days, turning to her gaze to the sky, Valena does. Issa replies, but that's not what brought you here, Issei says, looking at the sky. Well, I found my husband asleep in the living room. No servants around, I heard someone talking and realized that you were there. And I just came to see you. Her voice was calm and motherly as always. I see. Thank you, Okasan, calling her by her title, that she always wanted to call him. Even if it was no longer committed to her daughter, she took care of him, teaching him how to be sophisticated in the devil society and teaching him business strategies while Mickey paid more attention to the girls. Valena was ensuring Issei's future like a parent who would do for their child. Issei was grabbed into embrace, an embrace that he has missed for so long, a mother's warmth. You, you finally called me uh, Okasan, Valena says, sobbing like Latodius before her. She broke down. This boy, her boy, acknowledged her. Though, it wasn't the circumstances that she wanted, but in the end, she got her wish. From the conversation that she heard, he showed no hate towards them. He did not blame them for their daughter's action, the maturity that he's shown in just a year. Although others failed to see it, she had paid attention and her efforts came through judging from his memories. He still needs that mother figure in his life. As the saying goes, when one door closes, another one opens. He shut that door on Miki and has given the opportunity to fill that void. Issei says, you don't have to cry, you know, knowing the parents were hurting, so we wanted to reassure them not to worry about him. He'll be fine. Valena says, I know. I just wonder how you call me that. I'm so happy. A smile on her face, holding him closer, kissing him on the head. Valena does. Issa replies, it's okay. Feeling better that the woman will be alright when he leaves, and the two stayed like this for a few more moments. Ah, it's getting late. I better go to sleep, Issa says, removing himself from the woman's embrace and getting up from the bench. This night made him feel a little bit more refreshed, able to appease the two parents so they could sleep calm in a sense of mind tonight before dealing with the repercussions of their daughter's actions and how it will affect the clan and also the alliance. Valena replies, Issei, there is someone waiting for you at the door of your room. Her tears now dried up and her features back to looking sincere and calm. Hmm? Issei says, confused by what he heard, but he felt he left with a departing message. Good night, Okasan. He was focused on finding out who was at the door. He never heard the woman's response. Valena says, Good night, my Sochi, letting her words be carried by the night wind watching him. He was out of sight. She remained silent as Zictodius appeared and sat down next to her. If you're unfamiliar with... Sochi means sun, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with Japanese. I can't believe he doesn't hate us, Zictodius says, calmly looking in the direction that his wife, Sully, say go. Valena replies, Neither can I. You really are a stupid child, daughter, leaving a good man who knows what other troubles your fun has caused. Looking to the sky, frustrated by the actions her daughter did, Rias did not deserve her Sochi. Sojo says, ah, you are right, my dear, frustrated like his wife, but then he remembered something. Hey, who is Issei's visitor, Sictodius says. Nobody special. I only tell you that we may not see him early tomorrow. Laughing to herself, she hopes what happens to Issei tonight ease from the pain he has been holding on to, Valena says. Hmm, that worries me, Zictodius says, uneasy about what could happen as he was making progress with Issei. Valena replies, no need to worry. I will only say that Issei will not be coming out as a virgin. <laughs> Laughing louder as to see what Issei has in store for tonight, Zictodius replies, oh, and now coming to an understatement, his face was priceless. And that is the chapter 14. In a dark and silent place, a blue magic circle would appear. From the circle, three people would appear after a few seconds. Tsubaki-san turns on the light. This place is very dark. Yes, yeah, Sona-san. Where was it? Using her ability as a demon to see in the dark. Here we are, activating the light switch. Thank you, Tsubaki-san. This place is not too big. Looking around, the other place, Tsubaki turned on the light. Sona does. The room had two arm chains, and in the middle, a small table. This whole room was a little decorated, but in the room, there was a window, but it was buried. 
There was also magical seals in a place to keep whoever was inside, restricting them from power. Hmm, you're right, a blonde smoke as he sat down in one of the chairs. The two girls looked at him. He had a calm look, as if nothing happened, but that was not the case. Who gave you permission to sit down, annoyed by what the blonde believed? Sanji, I suggest you listen. Looking at the blonde, Tsubaki says, Girls, pl he was unable to finish speaking as Tsubaki took him by the neck and lifted him up in one fell swoop. I told you to listen, you have no right to speak, Tsubaki says, breaking her calm, stoic exterior, letting go of Sanji. Su once again not able to talk as he received a punch from Tsubaki. You have no right to call me by my first or last name. Removing her fist from Sanji's face, to you, I am vice president, Tsubaki said. Sanji fell to the ground with his hand on his face. Tsubaki hit him so hard that he broke his nose already. Seriously, you act as if nothing happened, approaching San Sanji, Sona starts. You know the situation that you are in. If my sister did not have me detained, you would no longer be a man. To prove her point, she kicked him in the groin. That was more than likely bruised from all the damage it received, but he wouldn't get a chance to soothe the pain as Sona bent down and lifted Sanji by his collar. After all this, that you and them... Did not think anything would happen, pinning Sanji against the pillar. You have the brands in this to behave as if nothing happened, as if we didn't know anything. Her hair and glasses covered her eyes. Sanji tried to get some leverage. It seemed that Sona was putting all of her power into her grip since he could not be free, so he attempted to increase his aura. God, but stop speaking when he felt a tremendous blow to his stomach. <laughs> First you trick Momo's feelings and Rurikos, hits him in the ribs. Then you endanger everything I work to fulfill my dream, hits him again in the stomach. You endanger the pride in the name of the Citri family, hitting him in the face. You spit on my trust, backhanding him in the face. On Issei's confession, kneeing him in the groin. On the damn trust we all had in you, kneeing him again. <laughs> punching him in the stomach again and causing Hanji to cough up a little blood. You, another punch to the stomach. You dare hitting him into the ribs to try another hit to the ribs. Raise my hand. She hits him so hard in the stomach that the whole room trembled as the pillar was indented by his body and he puked more blood. Where was the man who supported me? Pfft, another hit to the head. The man who I trusted. The one who said he loves Momo and Ruriko. Issei's friend. And the one who said he loved me. Hitting him with an uppercut. Clapping his jaw and cracking some teeth. You threw everything away. Another knee to the groin. For a moment of satisfaction with a spoiled bitch in her useless band of whores. Hitting him again in the head. Putting me in this situation. Putting them in this situation. Putting your damn friend in a situation where he's dying. Hitting him again in the rib. Where he's on the verge of madness. You. She knees him. One last time in the groin and then makes him look in her eyes through his swollen bloody eyes seeing her ice cold expression. You're a piece of shit hitting his head against the pillar. A crack was heard, indicating both the pillar and fracture in Sanji's skull. She released from her hold and let him fall to the ground. Sanji was back on the ground, but this time spitting blood. The front of his school shirt was soaked in blood, and each blow from Sona was as if it was hit by a wrecking ball. He felt that his stomach was destroyed, that each of his ribs were broken, his groin was sure to have stopped working, his head was spinning and wet from blood, his jaw ached, and he could make out nothing. But he listened as someone turned on the sink for a little while before it was turned off and then hearing someone sit down in the armchair. Sona sat in the armchair under the sight of Tsubaki who had not moved in all this time. Sona sat down slowly looking at her hands, cleansed of the blood that once stained them. They were trembling, but it was not out of repentance, but rather she wanted to continue. The person that laid on the ground almost destroyed everything. Everything that she had worked so hard for. The peace of alliance because he only thought with his dick. Because what would happen if Issei got out of control? Thanks to the fact that a pawn foolishly betrayed the pillar of the factions, the hero of the underworld, the hero of the children and many more. This destroyed all empathy she had for him. These thoughts went through Sona's head. She was full of anger and fear. She clenched her fist to control the impulse to jump and finish off Sanji to kill him, but calmed down when she felt a hand on his shoulder. She raised her face and saw Zubaki with a worried look. It was then realized that she was crying. Her purple eyes released tears of anger. She wiped them away and quickly they didn't stop because those tears weren't just anger, they were fear. Fear because of how close she was to losing everything. Her pride, her dream, because of her so-called friend opening her legs to other men. And she knew it because she didn't want to say it. While this happened, Tsubaki hugged her, which finally calmed her down. Little by little, she returned to her normal stature.
Sonasama, are you feeling better? Subaki said, concerned with her best friend and president. Yes, blushing from the contact. Thanks to you, you didn't have to hug me. Looking away, embarrassed, Sona said. Nothing to worry about, smiling that her friend is feeling better. Okay. Taking a deep breath, you, turning her attention to Sanji, who remained on the ground. By order of the four miles, you will stay in this guarded apartment. You will be watched 24-7. If you try to say something to the girls, Vitra will inform us and you will be killed instantly. All the measures will be fulfilled until the factions meet with the advisors and people of High Mantle to decide your punishment. Sona-sama, I'm going to tell the guards to come heal him, Tsubaki says, leaving the room. Sorry, vitra son. I let myself get carried away, nervous for how she acted. It's not a problem for me, Vitra said, but he thought to himself, Damn, she almost killed him. No matter, I can use my curses to torment this disgrace even more, Vitra said, inside of his head. Good. Now to wait for one of them to come and heal him. Getting up from the couch, and before I forget, I'm sure you understand that Kahu and Jenna will no longer receive financial assistance nor protection from the Citri clan based on their reaction. Don't expect the assistance from the Gremory clan just because you their daughter. Leaving to go in a room looked like a kitchen. If she stayed to see if she got a reaction, she would have seen the blonde crying, laminating on his actions that he caused and how his siblings would be affected. Now, in the underworld, in the Gremory Mansion. Seriously, he won't come out a virgin, Zectus said. <laughs> you should have seen his vase, but maybe yes or maybe not. I don't know. I'm a fortune. I'm not a fortune teller, but I hope... So, getting up from the bench, Valena says, That's good. I would like the virgin tag to be removed, Zectodius said. Hopefully, it's someone that loves him, not a random demoness looking for action. With the hero of factions also getting up from the bench, the couple left slowly under the moonlight. Now, we're with Issei. Issei walked down the slow corridor and treed, who was waiting for him. He couldn't think of a person who he wanted to see him now. But that wasn't the only thing he thought. Since the little by little moment he had Zectodius in calling Valena his mother, that little moment was something he considered very special to him. When he was nearing his room, thanks to his dragon's features, he got the smell of a female. Along with the shampoo and soap, it was an incredible smell according to him. He believed he had an idea whose smell it was, and that he saw from somewhat similar silhouette. It was Sarah Fall. She was giving off a scent that he had felt a few seconds ago. She wore jeans that reached her calves and some red heels, a white blouse with a couple of buttons undone to show some of her cleavage. Her hairstyle was changed, and now that she had it down, it looked smoother than normal. She had a hand on her cheek looking at the wall of the hallway. So basically, she looks like Boa from uh, One Piece. She wasn't paying attention to him, but Issei was stunned and couldn't help but stare. She looked beautiful. As he thought of that, there was a fleeting moment where he began to process. He stopped moving and tried to decipher that fleeting thought. It's true, she does look beautiful, Trigg says, smiling. But there was a hint of mockery that didn't go unnoticed. Drake, shut up. Understood, Issei said. In these moments, Sarah Fall noticed him and turned to see him. Issei finished talking with Drake and returned to reality. The gazes of the two collided with each other. Sarah Fall noticed and smiled at him in a common and childish way. Hello, how are you doing? Sarah Fall says, getting up from the door. Hello, what's going on here? His tone was calm and his face was stoic. Issei was Sarah Fall, I saw Sarah Fall more closely, who tilted her head before returning to the gaze of Issei. What is he seeing? Sarah Fall says. Then... You were the one that came to see me, Issei replied. Seraphal put a finger on her chin, and after a few seconds, she smiled happily, giggling in an energetic way. Seeing that, Issei just sighed to see her in the normal way of acting. Huh. It seems that you have already returned to your normal way of acting, huh? With a smirk at her childish behavior, Issei starts laughing. Seraphal looked at Issei. And her gaze went from childish to a serious one in a matter of seconds, and realized this. It's not that, Issei son, it is just something I have to see. Her tone is serious, no longer childish, Seraphal says. Or Seraphal finished talking. Oh, I see. Taking out a beer that he had stored in the boosted gear. Well, taking a drink of the beer, it's ready to talk inside, approaching the door and giving the way to Seraphal after opening the door. Well, enter. Seraphal remained static, watching Issei just drink the beer as if it was nothing. She wondered, since when did Issei drink, but he had to come back to her senses when Issei called to her to enter his room. With your permission, entering the room and looking around, there are no chairs. So, where should I sit? Seraphal says. 
Hmm, you can get on the bed, it's no problem, Issei says. Sarah falls surprised. Issei said as if it was nothing. What was going on through his head at the moment? A woman asks you where to sit because there are no chairs and you tell her to get on your bed? She was speechless, but she saw Issei, he took some beers and wines, and put them on a little table that was near the bed and sat on the bed by himself. Well, turning to Sarah fall, eh? Because you don't want to sit, Issei says. Uh, no, it's not that. Sitting down with a somewhat noticeable blush on her face because of her closeness of the two. So, Issei says, downplaying as it returned to the table. Seraphil saw how Issei left the beer that he had started drinking before entering the room, already empty, on the one side of the table, and he was going to take another, but when he touched it, he did not take but his head shook and then spoke. Ugh, they're disgustingly hot. Mm, pouting like a child, before turning to Seraphal with a mischievous smile on his face. But here I have a magical little ice girl. Hey, Sarah Chai, could you give me some ice? Uh, of course, it's no problem for me, Seraphal returned to her childish attitude. Seraphal created a block of ice and gave it to Issei, who took it and put it on the table, then took a bowl out and started to break it. Seraphal stared at Issei's back as he broke the ice. She knew that he was suffering from multiple things, but he turned away and acted as if nothing was wrong, and it seemed that he resolved or overcame something worse as it looked. She left her thoughts and reflections when she felt him shift next to her. Seraphil turned and saw Issei with a glass filled with an amber-colored liquid and ice. He only stared at her for a few seconds, but to her it felt like years, because she felt a different aura in Issei. He looked like a beast looking at prey, looking at what she thought of how we'd act in the future. She felt... All of that in just a few seconds, which made her environment very tense for her. Hey, Sarachan, why did you come? Issei said, taking a drink of his beer. Seraphal swallowed hard to shake off her nerves. Nothing, just wanted to talk to you, Sarah said. Turning to look at the bed, I hope you don't mind, her voice sounded in a low and defeated tone. After those words, the room fell silent, but Seraphal looked up at Issei's face and saw him smile with a calm and affectionate look. Oh, Sarah Chan, I would never mind talking to you, Issei said, looking at her with some affection. After saying he took another drink and then he realized that he did not offer one to Seraphil. All oh, right, Sarah Chan, do you want one? Issei said, offering her a glass. Seraphil had a little brush, but noticing what he called her, she only nodded in confirmation. Hold on, give me a second, getting up to start making Seraphil drink. Seraphil looked at Issei again. She was surprised by his behavior, and more so how he treated her and looked at her. She looked at him like a little brother a few days ago, a perverted and very cute boy, energetic, reliable, and more. However, that boy was in front of her did not seem like a child, nor a teenager, but rather an adult. He is no longer that aura of perversion, but seriousness and tranquility. She only smiled when she saw him. He was not the same as she knew, but at the same time, he was himself. It was something very strange. She felt good to see him behave like that, and she noticed it. Her heart beat fast for a second, and she left confused at the same time and worried. Was she falling in love with Issei without anything in between? Was that happening to her? Those were some of the thousands of questions that went through her head. Issei, when he finished making Seraphal's drink, turned around and saw Seraphal lost in her thoughts. He just went and stared at her. She really looked beautiful to him. That was the thought that went through his head. Noticing it, he was surprised, but decided to play it down for a moment. Serachan? Moving the drink near Seraphal, Issei says, Oh, ye, what, uh, yes. Haha, <laughs> she started to laugh embarrassed. Sorry, I kept thinking about something, looking away to avoid eye contact. Doesn't matter. Bringing the drink closer to her, here, making Seraphal turn towards him to take the drink. Seraphal grabbing the glass took a little taste of it. She knew that it was a beer mixed with a little wine, though she would have preferred juice or another sweet drink, but this was fine. Mmm, taking another sip of the drink and savoring the taste. It's good, Seraphal says, complimenting Issei's drink mixture. I'm glad, Issei replied, also drinking his own glass. They remained silent. That silence was one of tranquility. Seraphal would look at Issei with a sideways glance ever so often. Hey, since when did you drink, Seraphal said, frowning as she looked at him. Hmm, since I was five. Saying it as if it were nothing as he returned her gaze. Seraphal's eyes widened and her expression took a dark tone. When she was going to say something to Issei, she saw him with a somewhat big smile and then realized that he was only joking. Ha! <laughs> you should have seen the look on your face, Issei said, taking another sip of his drink. And to answer your question, I started today. His tone returned to its nonchalant state. That was very bad, Seraphal said, generating her own pout as if she were a child. But you really started drinking today, Seraphal said? Yeah, Zictodius and I had a drink not too long ago, Issei said. Oh, I see. Seraphal said, The two were in the back in a quiet environment, but this time both of them were stealing quick looks at each other from time to time. The atmosphere continued to remain quiet till they ran out of drinks, so Issa decided to go make more, leaving Seraphal to think on the bed. Good. 
All is good to be done. I don't want to ruin this good atmosphere with the news, but I have to, Seraphal says. Issei came back with Seraphal and was still in thought. When he saw her, he could see that she was thinking, and when she saw his drink, he thought of doing something. He knew that if they kept drinking, he would not get drunk. So he decided to take out a golden apple liquor and mix a little in his drink. After doing so, he sat down, and seeing that Seraphal was still thinking, he wanted to know why she was thinking so intently. Sarah John, just tell me. What is it? Issei says, watching as she comes out of her thoughts. Sarah Fall looked at Issei, who looked at her calmly, and she took a sip of her drink and spoke. Well, the thing is, is that we put Sanji on surveillance for 24 7 until all of us decide his punishment in theirs, looking at her drink. But for that to happen, we need a little more time to arrange several things. It's only been almost three weeks since the Triaxa fight. We are not 100%, and we don't want to raise their suspicions. So the meeting is planned to take place in three weeks, with her head down, Seraphos finishes. Seraphos is waiting for Issei to get angry, get up and yell at her or something, but she only felt a hand on her shoulder, so she raised her face towards Issei. Sarachan, I don't care about that. What worries me is your behavior. You behave have less childish than normal. Why? His hand began to rub her shoulder and ease her. I can't act like that in this situation. Beginning to cry. I cannot act like that in front of you. You're going you're going through no no, I can't act like a girl in front of you, but because you, you know, I don't, it doesn't hurt to me, I can't see, it. and she just starts continuously stuttering. She wanted to continue but was unable to look Issei in the eyes, and she felt a hug and became silent. Issei continued to hold Seraphon and began to generate anger, but that anger was at himself for seeing Seraphon cry. Ser Seraphon, he clears himself of it and sees it in the eyes. Of course I'm upset, I'm sad, I'm angry. But that is not directed towards you, nor Sir Zex, nor Sona, nor Valena, or Zictodius. I feel in many ways, but you do not have to worry about me finishing off with a smile. Those were the true feelings of Issei, or so he thought. He didn't want to show his feelings, or even get even with anyone, but he felt a very strong slap. No, don't tell me that. If you trust me, just tell me. I want to know how you feel. I want to be here for you. You are an important person to me. I do not want to see you hurt. Seeing you hurt bothers me a lot. I want to know more or less how you feel. I want to help you, so please, crying into Issei's chest, Seraphon continues. <laughs> Serachan, I don't want to do, and I can't. Look at you. I don't want to get you involved with my feelings. It's not because you wouldn't understand it, but because you could get or we would get worse, and I would feel worse for getting you involved. His hair covered his face. I want to help, please. I want to, I want to be, I want you to be open with me, as she kept crying, extremely upset. No, I can't do that. His tone became serious. Please, looking into Issei's eyes. Issei, seeing her cry, made him feel that he was the worst shit, and that he could exist, but he did not want to. He could not. He was making one of the most beautiful women and the strongest woman in the underworld cry before his indecision came with the words of his partner that would happen to make him open up to Seraphal and his future wife or wives. Do it, partner. Even if you remove the feelings of love, there will be many things that you will have to vent. It is better that you do it now, Drake says. The dragon was serious, but held concern for Issei. Issei remained silent after hearing those words. He was under the gaze of Seraphal, and the look of concern of his best friend and partner, then simply forcefully began to speak. I, removing his smile, I am not strong. I am not feeling calm. I have many mixed feelings. Everything is not fine. I want to tell you everything, but I don't want to show you all my anger. My sadness and more. That's why I... His voice became a very sad tone. He thought that his heart was strong as if it came to take it all out. He would, but it seems that he could not do as he thought. He was afraid. Afraid that he would be mocked. Fear that the woman that he has in front of him would not understand. But before those fears, he felt his hand on his face. A delicate hand of one of the most important new people in his life. Someone who t went to look for him, cared about him, and is here. Asking to help him. Asking to see him in his worst form. That small gesture made his almost dead heart beat with emotion and affection. He decided to put this aside and focus on what he was about to say. You can trust me. Say it to your own, son, Seraphal said with some tears in her eyes, but a smile on her face to assure him that she would be there. Go for it. You can do this, Drake said in a calm tone and added reassurance. Well, he had a smile, but a defeated one. 
with a defeated tone. I am afraid. I'm scared. To what I feel. And if I can do it. Issei says. Like what do you fear? Look Sarah. I have an amount of immense sadness and anger. It's what scares me. I'm afraid of what I did to Sanji. Issei says. What? You did nothing wrong. He deserved it. Serious and annoyed of hearing that about the blonde kept in captivity. No. It is not that he deserved it, but rather that I liked it. I loved it. I wanted to continue doing it. I gave him to my anger. I feel so much anger towards Rias that I want to go eradicate her while I still she breathes. I want to go to all and beat Asia scentless until I get tired. Take Akano and dissect her. You do not understand. I'm changing. I do not want to involve you with this change. I'm afraid of what will happen, for better or worse. Some tears came out, and at times his eyes gave off a slight amber glow. Seraphal could not say anything but only listen to Issei. I'm dying. I am dying. And it is because of them, for which I gave my sweat, flesh, and blood for. But I don't want to. I am afraid of dying. I do not want to feel in pain. I want it to end, but I am afraid of dying in the ritual. That ritual will change me. I am, afraid, I am afraid to change to be something that can harm whatever little I have left. I am afraid to see and kill them, and that changes me. I am afraid to be empty. I want to be like before, but now I know how I behaved. But I want as if nothing happened to me. He hugged Seraphal and started crying. Seraphal felt his pain, his anger. These feelings were so dark. It was incredible that he say kept himself under control. I want to go back because this happens to me. After everything, I gave everything for them. But that was not enough. His eyes glowed amber because they didn't tell me their feelings were no longer the same. They just wanted to abandon me and not tell me at all because, because they just didn't tell me. More tears went down his cheeks, but his eyes still held the amber glow. They... They thought it was much better to do this to me than tell me something. They were supposed to be my girlfriends, my friends, my brothers. But it seems that only I was the one who believed that. He began to laugh sadly. I did so much that Konoko would stop complaining about my attitude. But in the end, they do this to the pervert. Kuroka wanted kittens. I just went out for a moment and she went to the one that continuously rejected her before. All of them, they forgot me. They changed me. I gave everything for them. I fought for them, bled for them, but they wanted something more. What did they want? Orphis, Lefei, Ross Vaisa, Gabriel, Palmain, was I just a toy for them? They have the audacity to tell me they love me and then don't feel anything for me as they toss me aside with an emotionless tone. Seraphil let out tears as the strength in her embrace increased, holding him tighter. That damn blonde. A shoddy excuse of a gentleman. Thought you didn't sleep with committed woman. Maybe if it was some stranger, no. But with your friend, yes? Of course, yes, right? There is no problem. And that damn transvestite filth. An idiot without balls. Weren't you supposed to consider me a friend? Someone you look up to. He began to let loose at an immense murderous instinct. Let's not forget that so-called rival. Who is the reason I was in a coma for? Taking and attacking the tri the Traxa because his dumbass would have died. Some shit. You sleep with the woman of your adversary? Funny how you wanted to kill them at this peace summit. Maybe I should have let you kill them. And those excuses that call themselves parents. Each of them are scum. Increasing his bloodlust. Because of them. I'm dying. I'm going. I'm going to. I don't want to go through this. I don't want to see it happen when I do the ritual, hugging Seraphon more peacefully. I don't want to feel that pain. I'm afraid of what it will do to me. I don't want to change, growing silent and feeling numb. Seraphon raised his head to look into his eyes. Seraphon saw it. He was really afraid of the ritual. He wanted to stay as was, but at the same time be different. This reminded her of some of her things that happened to her in her past. So thanks to her experiences, she decided to speak. Issei-san, you are afraid of change. No matter how much you change, you will always be you. You may behave cold, rabid, but that does not matter. You are you. 
You will always be you. You decide how to do things. Be childish, cheerful, or courageous. That's for you to decide, giving a smile that enhances her beauty. When Seraphal said this, she remembered many things from her past and how she faced it. Issei, hearing those words, stared at Seraphal, looking directly into her eyes. He more or less understood and followed her words. It was at that moment the two opened up to one another. He told her much of what he felt. She looked into those feelings and she did not leave, but she did help him rid those fears. In exchange, both were lost in the eyes of each other. It was blue, full of infantilism, tranquility, happiness, and a little seriousness. In the depths of that blue transmitted maturity, a maturity of acceptance itself. On the other hand, they were amber eyes, which were full of pain, sadness, anger, fear, of future, and the past. To Seraphal, those eyes showed his maturity was just appearing. It was small but it was enough to size himself. Each one is lost in the immensity of eyes of one another. Unknowingly, the distance was cut centimeter by centimeter until they felt the warmth of their lips. Little by little, they were corresponding to kiss. At first, it was a calm one, but each second passed, the kiss increased in intensity until it became a battle of you-know-what. They continued until they ran out of air, and for instance, they separated returned to their senses. They both opened their eyes as they realized what they had just done. Seraphal appeared to have a massive blush and got up from the bed. Breaking the embrace, Issei appeared to only have a slight blush, but he was so surprised at what he just did. There he noticed how Seraphal was leaving trying to run away. I'm sorry, Seraphal says, trying to run with some tears coming down her face. I shouldn't have done, but was quickly stopped by Issei. I shouldn't have done this. This is my fault trying to escape from Issei's scrap, but he continued to hug her and hold her. Calm down, Sarah-chan. That was my fault, and, and I regret it, with a little blush. No, it was my fault, Sarah said. Sarah, it's better as if we sit down. A little nervous of what to do next, Issei is really confused. They both moved, never letting go of the hug, and sat on the bed. Seraphal did not speak, she only looked away, and Isu was looking for the reason for his action, but nothing came to mind. No matter how much he looked, he only got an idea that he liked Seraphal, his self-proclaimed older sister, one of the most beautiful women in the underworld, someone who can be an adorable girl, acting cute but at the same time be serious in every aspect which made her beautiful. He noticed this and his heart beats quickly when he thought of her. <laughs> It seems I can still fall in love, but because of her, I feel attraction for her. Almost always something happened for me to fall in love with those girls. A feeling of disgust, remembering that those betrayed him, but this time is only a feeling of tranquility and some happiness. But how am I noticing this, and why so suddenly confused? But answer came. Easy, partner. No matter how broken or crushed your heart is, you will continue to feel love. Remember your trauma with Rainair, and if I'm being honest, if you don't fall in love with her, you will forever be an idiot. Look at her and tell me what comes to your mind. Issei looked at Farifal, and many things came to his head. I feel calm, a sense of attraction. Before I thought she was very cute, but seeing her maturity and her down like that, wow, she really is beautiful. I told her part of horrible things that I would happen to those wretched, and she just hugged me instead of take control of what I am, and that does not matter to me as long as that I am me. Honestly, I'm surprised that you feel attraction after all that's happened. But just by hearing you, you're starting to feel something more for her, partner. His tone changed to a bit of mocking one. To think you'd go down the path of incest, Drake says. Issei just kept thinking about what Drake was saying. For Seraphal, it was a bundle of reprimanding thoughts towards herself. How could she think of doing that? How could she reciprocate? How could she do it to her self-proclaimed younger brother? Because she liked doing it. Seraphal liked kissing her younger brother. And there was replanted finishes, but she liked the feelings of kissing him. Just FYI, guys, they're not actually related. Oh my god. And it was her first kiss. Seraphal tried to bury those thoughts, but everything came to an end when Issei spoke. I'm looking at Seraphal, sorry, lowering his head and hiding his face from Seraphal with his hair. Seraphal came to her senses. Looking back at Issei, she spoke. I'm the one who has to apologize. Also lowering her head, I shouldn't have let myself get carried away, Seraphal says. <laughs> Well, raising his head a little, it was done instinctively. You kiss very well. Let's not get so worked up. Getting up from the bed, Issei says. Seraphal blushed at Issei's word, but she also got up from the bed and looked at Issei, who also had a blush. Both remained silent, but because of nowhere, they started laughing. <laughs> well, you also kiss very well, Issei's son, which was said so consistently. But after saying it, she realized how she said it. But before she could do anything, Issei spoke. Oh. 
Then since we both do kiss well, Sarah Chan, Issei said, they both looked at each other again, sitting back on the bed, and began to close the distance, but this time Sarah Paul noticed it and stopped. No, getting up from the bed, this isn't right. I shouldn't have done it. I'm taking advantage of you, looking at Issei. Issei looked back at her. He got up and realized a few things. The first was how different Seraphal was acting. Since before, they would have continued kissing. The second was how much she cares about him, not caring about her feelings and thoughts and putting him first, which would be in her moment of weakness. Since the third was his dragon instincts were coming into effect, telling him to claim her. He got up and took her by the shoulders, and without hesitation or thinking, he kissed her. The action surprised Sarah for all the time, but she remained static. Eventually, she reciprocated. Issa was surprised with himself because it took an incredible amount of courage and effort, but adding in his dragging instance, he wanted it. Nothing was stopping him. Both were alone, fighting for control, which Seraphal won this time, but they had to separate due to the lack of air. Seraphal breathing deeply, said so we sudden a tone of guilt, taking advantage of Issei, but she was silenced with another. You know what? Uh... Uh, Sarah Paul's heart was beating like crazy. She didn't want to continue. Well, no, she did, but she was stopping it because she wanted to know something before, something else that she may or may not regret. Why? Keeping away from Issei Kisner, she wasn't going to give in just yet. Huh? Confused by her question, her stopping his advancing, Issei was. Why are you doing this? Sarah Paul said. She became even more serious, but unintentionally attracted Issei even more. <laughs> Well, it seems that you, pointing at Seraphon, my beautiful big sister, you're starting to attract me. His burning amber gaze was her, seeing how serious he was behind that seriousness. If Seraphon looked closely, a little less. What? How is that possible? Seraphon said, surprised that he found her attractive, but not as an, just as an older sister. <laughs> well, it seems that even after all this, I feel attracted to you, wanting you. A small blush appearing on his face when he mentioned wanting her. B but don't you consider me your sister? Seraphal said, nervous, because her heart was racing. <laughs> Laughing again. Well, yeah, capturing her inner gaze. So, lowering her head, you kissed me because you felt attracted to me, Seraphal says. I kissed you because I wanted to. And of course I feel attracted to you, approaching her on the bed. But in this world, there is a red-headed Siskon, a green-headed social misfit, a sleepy head, and an ultra-perverted god who is the father of all, and an angel who is taking on more than his plate can handle. I feel attracted to you. I don't think it's raising Sarah Fall's face to look at him bad, right? Finishing a smile, captivating the Leviathan. Sarah Fall looked at him, seeing his smile, and she was beginning to feel that her feelings were for Issa were changing. Do you want to continue? Issa said. I don't want you to come out crying when you lose, Sarah Fall said, stealing Issa's lips for dominance. They began out again and again until Sarah Fall pushed Issa down the bed with her on top, Issa beneath her. Noticing this, could, you know, they separated. Um, well, let's just, uh, Say they, um, you know, smashed. He claimed the Mal Leviathan, and that is basically what was going on in that chapter. So, that was the end of chapter 14. Chapter 15. In the underworld, on a very high mountain that was illuminated by the light of moon, in the mountain there was a person sitting on the ground. Thanks to the moonlight, it could be distinguished. That said person possessed a purple suit. That person was a man about 30 to 35 years old, with light and dark purple hair, yellow eyes. This person looked more normal, but something was strange when he had yellow horns. When will he arrive? It's been a few minutes since I called him. He took out a glass with amber liquid and began to drink the set bottle. Out of nowhere, he felt an immense pressure in the sky as a huge ray of light appeared. From this light, a huge figure emerged to scale, shined by the light of the moon, and a figure began to speak. Looking at the purple-haired man, look who it is. <laughs> it's been hundreds of thousands of years since I've seen you in that form, Tanin. Watching Tanin in human form while smiling. Hello, Fafnir. Looking at the golden dragon that was in the sky. How are you doing? Fafnir said, looking his head to lower the ground near where Tanin stood. All right, more or less. Looking at his drink, but first of all, turning his attention to Fafnir. Change your form. You're attracting a lot of attention before taking a sip to his drink. I don't like that form. Apart from that, I'm very busy dragon, so I shall say my goodbyes, Fafnir said, preparing to leave until he heard a dark growl directed at him. Fafnir! Tanin said. His tone was dark, almost like a snarl. Fafnir stopped in his tracks. If it was rare for Tanin to speak like this, usually his tone is almost spoken calm, but proud, boring, or a little angry tone, but that was tone was something else. What's going on, Tanin? Fafnir said, a little nervous as he directed his attention back to Tanin. 
Are you deaf? I told you to change forms, Tanin said. Fafnir, sighing in defeat, since I have no other choice left, Fafnir said. A shine covered Fafnir completely. When the shine went away, a man of about 25 years appeared with golden hair, eyes of the same color, and wearing a gold-colored suit with silver details. I didn't remember how you looked that way, Tanin said. Yeah, yeah. Now what do you want? Because you know I don't like to be in this form, Fafnir said. First, sit down, pointing to the stump next to him. Okay, sitting next to Tanin, but having an eerily feeling. Now you want some? Showing the glass bottle that he held, ambered liquid. Oh, gimme, gimme, a little excited, momentarily fitting about the bad feeling he had. Tanin took out another bottle and gave it to Fafnir. <sighs> Opens up the bottle, begins to drink. Golden apple liquor, how delicious, Fafnir said. Yeah, you're right. Drinking wine from his own bottle, Tanin says. Both drink as if it were water. They drink about four bottles. So, looking at Tanin, why'd you want to talk to me? His dragon tones changed, but from playful to serious. <sighs> Tanin song. It's complicated. You're not going to believe me, Tanin said. The former Dragon Kings was very wary, but still maintained serious suspect this of situation. Ah, we'll see. Fafnir said, yeah, we'll see, sang again, but here we go. Tanin started talking about everything that was happening to Issei with some sentences. Tanin expelled a large amount of ore off. Fafnir remained silent, but this was stupid and unreal, but every word was killing him, as the people that he had made contracts with could do that. It was had to be a lie that he wouldn't thought. When Tanin was finished, Fafnir grabbed Tanin by the collar of his suit as he got up. While standing, he lifted Tanin up into the air. Tanin looked unfazed by the action as he expected this to happen and maintained a serious demeanor on Fafnir, whose his hair covered his gaze. You have to be, increasing his strength in his grip, lying to me with a murderous intent in his eyes as he turned the gaze at former Dragger King. Look at me, breaking Fafnir's grip and grabbing him by the neck. Do I look like I'm lying, you idiot, Tanyan said. Both of them had veins popping out of their necks and faces. Each one looked at each other with hopes of killing each other. She wouldn't do something like this, the crow. Maybe, but not her, you liar, Fafnir said, grabbing Tanyan again and increasing his grip strength. Ha, <laughs> you think, very annoyed with Fafnir not seeing the truth. Of course I believed in her, very annoyed by the accusation against his partner, Fafnir said. <laughs> well, then let's go and see his tone. Was it dead of emotions? Fine by me, letting go of Tanin, but the change of the tone in Tanin's voice brought an airy feeling. Shall we? Releasing Fafnir, but his tone remained dead. They both adjusted their suits and formed a magic circle. Lower your aura to the maximum, Tanin said. We don't want to be detected. All right, Fafnir replied, doing what Tanin told him, and they both disappeared in the mountain. Now, at the Hyoto Mansion, the room of Asia in the human world, two magical circles appeared, one purple, one golden, and two figures emerged in the room after a few seconds. When Fafnir arrived, he fell to the ground, covering his nose tightly. Tanin looked around the room. His owner was not here, and it was not likely that they went on the mission. Since he attended Issei's secret meeting, and the reactions from biblical leaders were an indication of trust was no longer in the Gremory Parage, nor the reincarnated angel or parts of them team of the White Dragon. So, where she was, he did not know, but what she did know, that this was the room of reeked of a dragon, and not of the Sekiyuti. Who was it? Fafnir said, his voice in an emotionless tone. Tanin sighed, I won't tell you. Knowing Fafnir's temper, which could cause him to go into outrage mode. Fafnir gets up and hits Tanin in the face. I demand to know what piece of shit Azia did this with. You told me of the situation of Issei, Fafnir said, annoyed by what he has learned. No. With Fafnir's fist in his face, I'm not going to tell you, Tanin replied. Fafnir was about to hit Tanin again, but he received a blow to his stomach that dropped him to the ground. If you plan to fight, it will not be here, creating a magic circle. I cannot risk you leaving evidence, grabbing Fafnir, and then both of them left the room. Now, Underworld, Mountain of Tanin's territory. Upon arrival, Fafnir got up and hit Tanin in the face so hard that it sent him to another mountain. You cursed dragon, tell me, Fafnir said. Fafnir was about to go to Tanin, but at of nowhere in his dragon form, Tanin appeared on top of him. He hit Fafnir with a hammer blow that dropped him to the ground below, creating a massive crater. Fafnir tried to get up, but Tanin followed with his initial blow with the stop that slammed Fafnir with his colossal force, forcing him to further into the ground, creating another crater within the initial crater. Calm down, Tanin said. Fafnir stopped moving, but Tanin waited a few minutes to remove his foot from Fafnir's body. Why? Why didn't you tell me? Fafnir said, his voice in a very low tone as he was demoralized. 
Look at how you reacted. If I have told you, you would have gone berserk, alerting them of our presence, shrinking down. But still in his dragon form, and sitting next to Fafnir, who was still nailed to the earth. And you? Aren't you upset? Fafnir said he was your student, never taking his head off the ground. Tani, looking at the sky. Of course I am. If it were up to me, I would have already killed them all. I would have dissected those traitors. But Issei left everything in the hands of the factions, not surprising, since he wants peace and doesn't want the hassle of dealing with them, Tanian said. And how was he? Fafnir said, sticking his head out of the earth and slowly removing himself from the crater. Well, he has a third degree phase of the fall. I was surprised he hadn't gone crazy. A little proud of Issei for not failing completely. I see. Sitting down next to Tani. Fafnir says, I'm sorry, looking at the sky. <laughs> no worries, I've seen worse, remembering the brutal beatdown that Issei gave to Sanji from the memories. To Tanin, he fought like a dragon despite the fall affecting him. And what will you do now, Tanin said, looking at Fafnir. Fafnir remained silent for a few seconds before talking. Can I ask you a favor, Fafnir said, a calm tone in his voice as he made the decision. It depends, Tanin says. Can I stay in your territory for a while? With a sad tone, Fafnir finishes. Tanyan was surprised by the quick, uh, quickly he spoke. Sure, but no nonsense. Getting up from the ground, Tanyan says. Who do you think I am? Fafnir replied, getting up as well, but becoming a little normal with a playful tone. Yeah, yeah, but I warn you. Try something stupid and I will kick you out, Tanyan says, trying to walk out. Ha, <laughs> come on. Can I take a time to see your hatchlings? Walking with Tanyan, transferring back to his own dragon form, but he remained human size. Whatever, Tanin said. Let's enjoy the night, Fafnir said, becoming his playful self, but secretly sorry, Azia. But you're on your own now. Hmm, guess I'll have to find a new partner, since Odin revived me, maybe a Valkyrie. Hmm, maybe we just have to wait and see, Fafnir says. Both went about talking about mundane things until they reached the house of Tanin, where they both entered. Underworld, the room of Issei. Now we're at his bathroom. Issei vomiting in the toilet. Ugh, guess it's about time already, getting up to wash his hands. Well, you're better than I thought you'd be. A dragon in your situation can only have dirt about 10 to 15 times. But you went at it at 35 times and without counting oral. Ha, <laughs> I must say you're a monster in the bed, partner. While there was some mockery in his tone, there was also pride as well. No wonder you're going to need a harem. You might have broken the strongest woman in the underworld, Drake finishes. So you're proud, aren't you? He says, brushing his teeth to get out the taste of blood. Of course, before you were a supreme virgin. But at last, this little title has been revoked, Drake said. Ha, <laughs> very funny. That's not the only little title I will get rid of as he finished brushing. Hmm? Drake confused by what his partner was referring to. Leaving that aside, how do you feel after the match with your big sister? Or mating with her? One of the most beautiful girls in the underworld. Still teasing him, partner. He say blush at what Drake said. Drake, let's leave that alone. Little annoyed, he say was. Ha! <laughs> it was to be expected. You are a dragon and you only seek strong mates, while adding to himself. Unlike those whores who can't wait to open their legs for another. But at least they showed their true selves, turning his attention back to Issei. Before you loved... That she called you her Oto. More and more, right? But to think that you have left the perversion you had, but it's good. Though you can do those perverse things with her now. Hmm. Well, one thing I learned that is one to be perverted and another to do perversions. Diverting the subject of Seraphal, one got me stabbed in the back, but that won't happen again. Of chapter 15. So, let's continue. Well... Go to sleep. Tomorrow will be a busy day, Drake said, yawning, preparing himself for what's to come. You're right. Good night, partner, Issei said, cutting off his mental communication. Issei came out of the bathroom and went to bed where Seraphal was dressed in only a white t-shirt. When he seizes, he smiles, embracing the beauty of the Leviathan and tries to lie down, but she pulls him on the bed on top of her. Basically, they smash and have a lover's talk, so I'm just going to cut to the next thing. The next morning, in the room of Zictodius and Valena, they were both changing out of their sleepwear and putting on normal clothes. Zictodius starts. 
and gives you the idea of what you think they did, Zictodius says, Valena smiling as she turned to her husband. My instinct says so, so such you became a man. And tell me, what would you have done if you didn't do the deed? Zictodius said, intrigued, but having a scared feeling of the response. Oh, I would have caught him. And tell all the maids to... Him. He is not leaving here a virgin. She was nonchalant in the matter, waving her hand dismissively. You would what? Zictodius said, uneasy from the response and hoping that he misheard his wife. I would have him raped. Nothing more, showing a determined look in her eyes that she meant what she said and proceeded to leave the room. Zictodius was left alone in the room and was sweating a bit out of fear, for he did not know the side of his wife and he was thankful that the side did not address to him. Although at the same time, he asked that Issei did the deed because otherwise he could not help him. Issei, my boy, I hope that you were able to get the job done because I wouldn't want to see you being more than 150 women. Still, sweating at the prospect of his wife carrying out her deed, after a few minutes, he left the room to join his wife. Now, in Issei's room. The light flittered through the window, which reached the eyes of the brunette and caused him to frown and open his eyes little by little. When his vision cleared up, he was about to move, but he felt the weight on his chest prevented him from doing so. Looking down, he saw the black hair, only the wore a button-down shirt that barely held her large breasts. However, that didn't take away from the beauty she possessed. Issei, yawning, it's already daytime. Moving the woman gently, we have to get up. His voice had a calm and renewed tone. Issei, a little surprised, felt completely refreshed and revitalized. He slept without a worry, no nightmares, as if sleeping near Seraphal reassured and comforted him. Last night was a night he would never forget. Seraphal frowned for a moment and covered herself with a blanket. Tch, let me sleep, slightly annoyed by being woken up, but still held slightly toned to it. It was slightly seductive. No need to wake up, Issei said, trying to remove the blanket. Mm, I want to sleep, Seraphal said, increasing the strength of her grip on the blanket. You leave me no choice, Issei said, lifting the blanket little by little to get closer to Seraphal. Once inside the blanket, he looked at Seraphal's face upon it, he began to kiss her passionately. Seraphal, noticing this, began to reciprocate. Oh my god, stop with this lovey-dovey crap. I'm, I'm kidding. Um... They both stared at a couple of gourmet kisses as they kissed. Seraphal tried to talk. So, you wanted to wake me up, Seraphal said? She said in between kisses with a smirk on her face, not mine, on the wake-up call. Well, giving her a little kiss. It's already daytime. Hmm, I guess you're right, Seraphal said. A little surprised to see it was already daytime. Yeah, it's better that we get up and take a bath, Issei said, getting out of his bed. Seeing this, Seraphal opened her arms to Issei with anticipation of being carried. What do you need? Issei said, confused by Seraphal's actions. I don't know. It's just that a guy and I had mind-blowing and that I can't move my legs in an annoyed but also embarrassed tone at her predicament. Ah, I see, with a little brush about his performance, but internally he had some smugness that he performed better than his former rivals, if that conversation from the dining room that he heard was any indication. Issei would get Seraphal up and carry her to the bathroom. All right, leave me in the water and I can do the rest alone while in the arms of Issei. However, Issei did not lower him from his arms. Huh? What's wrong, Issei? Confused by what he was not moving. Well, I don't plan to leave a helpless girl who can't move in alone in a bathroom. How about I help you with a malevolent smile? But didn't bold well for Seraphal. Seraphal was a little scared because she leaned and experienced the last night that smile met. Issei, we can't, trying to negotiate... Issei replied, oh, he said in a sad tone. Seraphal seeing this felt bad and decided to trim up with the kiss passionately. Issei during the kiss brought to the sink and Seraphal on the counter, his hands roaming while still kissing her. Oh my god. He spread his legs and ripped her shirt open because it, bro, no way. Oh my god. Skip. All the way to the kitchen and dining room. A gentleman with white hair and beard wearing a suit in the corridor that led to the kitchen seeing the couple who owned the mansion greeted them. Good morning, Zictodia Sama and Villana Sama bowing respectively. Hello, Rinaldo. Good morning, Villana says in a cheerful tone in her voice. Ah, Rinaldo, I already told you that you can call us by our name without honorifics, Zictodia said. None of that, sir. Even though it's true, today Lord Z Sir Zex and Ajuka Sama have come to visit, maintaining a calm tone despite Zictodius' protest. Oh, Sir Zex is here, Villana said, slightly confused by her elder son's visit. Yes, Villana Sama, he came not too long ago about taking out a pocket with five to seven minutes storing the watch back in his coat pocket. And where is he? Zictodius said. He is in the dining room with Ajuka Sama, Ronaldo said. Oh, Rinaldo, has Issei woken up yet? Curious about the answer. Hmm, Issei Sama is not awake, but if you want, I can send a maid to wake him up. Remembering that Issei was staying over, but Zictodius told him that it was a secret, so only he knew this among the servants. 
You may send one every if he's not awake, but if not, leave him. My Sochi needs his rest, Felana said. The smile remained present on her face. Right away, Ronaldo said, calling a maid and telling her to go to room 386 to see if the resident was awake. What are you plotting, Zectodia said, looking towards his wife. Me? Valena says, well, nothing, speaking in this tone, almost too innocent. Yeah, of course, Zectodia said, speaking sarcastically before seeing Ronaldo, who came taking the maid. I have sent a maid for him. Thank you. Well, if anything... You warned me, Zectodia says, starting to walk to the dining room by Ronaldo, bidding her farewells to the servant walking with her husband. Farewell, Valena sama Zectodia sama leaving to go to the other side of the mansion, Ronaldo does. Now, in the dining room, Sir Zex, Ajuka, and Grapethea talking about worldly things until they notice Valena and Zectodia enter the dining room. Hello, Valena says, waving a cheerful manner. Hello, Valena sama How are you? Grapethea says in her usual serious tone. Oh, come here, grabbing Grafia's hand and taking her to the corner. I have something to tell you. The mischievous smile adoring her face. Again, Zectodius, Ajuka, and Sir Zex looked on with conflicted and confused face at seeing this. What is going on with mother, Sir Zex says, looking towards his father for an answer. I don't know, in a defeated tone, Zectodius replies, looking towards the ceiling. Zectodius, son, are you okay? Ajuka says, a little worried about the attitude of the Grimmery leader. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, without a taking his gaze off the ceiling. Hello, father. Where is Issei, Sir Zex said, looking back and forth, seeing no signs of the brunette. Yes, and also Seraphal. She must have arrived before us, but she is not here either, Ajuka said. Well, Zictodius, but I was turning to the two mouths. I don't think I should say it. It'll be better for them to wait. It was said in a strange tone that the two mouths were confused because they could see he was sad. But in the sadness, there was pride, Zictodius Okay, Ajuka replied a little surprised, but in his thoughts, I do not believe that something happened with Issei and Seraphal, but the behavior of Valena-sama and Zectodia said say otherwise. Well, my boy Issei got the goods. Anyway, Lord Seatree, Sir Zex says, Lady Seatree, Lord Phoenix, and Lady Phoenix, and they say will come after breakfast in Odin... He would be coming in a while. I see. Well, I'll go cook to prepare a few more portions, leaving to handle the task, Todia says. The mouths remained silent as the Grammarly leader left, but out of nowhere, they heard Grafia scream. What? Grafia said, covering her mouth, embarrassed by how loud she was, then speaking in a softer tone. It can't be true, feeling dismayed by what she was informed. Oh, but it is, so the playful smile Valena replied. They both looked at women, very confused, but decided not to pay attention to them. Sir Zex, where's Milikis? Ajuka said. He came with Grafia and I went to play for a while. He should come back before the meal, Sir Zex said. Oh, I see, Ajuka replied, maintaining his calm demeanor. And out of nowhere, the little boy appeared through the door. Ha! You can't catch me, running to the chair, Milikus said. The maid panting, Milikus, please don't run, trying to keep up with the boy. Milikus, appearing behind a son who was behind a chair, Sir Zex does. The little boy turned around, seeing his father behind him. Uh, I can explain scared of his father's presence oh really well then explain with a smile that promised punishment uh well spotting his mother and valena grandmother running to valena so good to see you becoming cheerful feeling saved sir zex watched him go and just sighed and turned his attention towards the maid i apologize sir zex says don't worry it's all right lucifer saw him catching her breath and retreating from the room sir zex looked at milikis was <laughs> he thinks he was safe, Sir Zex says, smiling a little in the villain seat and sitting next to Ajuka. Having a hard time, Ajuka says, with a little mockery in his voice after seeing such a scene. Haha, <laughs> when you have a child, you will not laugh. By the way, what happened with Ladia? Sir Zex said, curious about the new Astaroth Harris. Hmm, oh, she is training with Servia, downplaying her importance. Hmm, that makes sense, knowing of the relationship between the two Harrises, but there's something I'd like to know. How did you feel with condemning Dodoria, Sir Zex said. Ajuka looked at Sir Zex, understanding what this was about, since he had been through it and he knew much about his friend Love's family, so he answered as he best as he could. I felt anger with myself and disappointment for not seeing him to be raised properly. He was a smart young man despite his fetish for nuns, but at the same time, I am a leader and I had to do that was best for the Alliance, Ajuka said i see 
Sirs X says, staring off into space. Sorry, Rias, but Ajuka's right. I am a leader. I wish things could have been handled differently, but if you didn't want to be with Issei, why didn't you tell him? What were you thinking? But no matter, you claim to be mature. So I guess it's time to leave you on your own, Sirs X says in his head. Now, in Issei's room, Serval was sitting on the bed while combing her hair calmly until the door opened. Um, excuse me, are you awake? The maid said, respectively entering the room to check if the occupant is awake. Yes, you may enter, Serval said. As the maid entered, hearing and seeing in the mound in the room, and then noticed some of the clothes that were on the floor, which left her a bit confused. When she saw Sarah fall, her instincts as a woman told her to be afraid just by sitting. The mound did not emit an aura of child's play, but a one of kindness and maturity. The maid covered her mouth, knowing the reason for this was confirmed by seeing a shirtless man with no pants and no shoes, and a towel on his head that came out of the bathroom. Who was it? Issei said, coming out of the bathroom while drying his hair. Oh, so you finished with an arrogant smile. Seraphal said. Yes, and remove your ice from my hair, Issei said, slightly annoyed. Maid starts. If I may interrupt, but Valena summons Zictodia Sama wait for them in the dining room, along with Lucifer and Beelzebub, being respectful, but she tried to know who was the man who could took the virginity of the Mao. Okay, could you bring us a wheelchair? Issei said, a little embarrassed. Uh, what? The maid said. Surprised by the request and confused, since she believed both were capable of walking on their own. Um, it's for me, Seraphal said with a big blush on her face. Upon hearing those words, the maid understood what she meant. I understand. I shall bring you what you request, leaving the room with a blush while thinking, damn, he must have been a beast in bed. He put Leviathan Sama in a wheelchair. I have to tell the others, the maid said. The boy watches the maid left quickly. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's all your fault. If you haven't delayed us, we wouldn't be in this mess, annoyed by having to ask for a wheelchair, Farrowfall says. None of that miss coming close to Seraphal taking her to the chin. I wasn't the one who wanted to go for it for ten more times, giving her a kiss on the forehead. Issei said, huh, but you didn't say no, Seraphal said. Why would I say no to a beautiful woman, giving her another kiss on the cheek this time? Where did you get these phrases from, Seraphal said, slightly timid from the role play. Easy, giving her a kiss on the cheek from Paul. <laughs> You can get all kinds of things from in this situation. I think it helps, smirking because of the proudness in the bedroom. Wait, what? Seraphal, being interrupted as he kissed her lips. Issei, smirking from the kiss. Weren't you the one who wanted to hurry? Smirking once again. You're right, so go ahead and get dressed. Becoming serious, narrowing her eyes, indicating she was not playing around. Wow, you look so hot when you get serious, trying to go in front of her. However, Seraphal was having none of it as she raised her hand, stopping Issei. Go and get dressed, Seraphal said. All right, all right, backing off a bit. But he had to jump back, dodge, and he was almost on the small pillar of ice. As she threatened to attack him again with another pillar of ice, Seraphal did. I'll be back, Ice Queen. A little mockery in the tone, going back into the bathroom, dodging another piece of the ice thrown at him. Seraphal lowered her head and firing the last piece of ice, sighing after he stayed closed in the bathroom. She continued to comb her hair, but she would into her pigtails she stopped. Remembering the promise she made with Issei, she preferred to leave her hair down and loose. With Issei was in the bathroom, putting on a black shirt with a red dragon on the back ha <laughs> ha aren't you gallant drake says making his presence known as the grim gem appeared on the left east his left hand quiet he completely forgot if drake was there yes yes you better hurry because otherwise you will earn a blow from the pillar of ice drake said Shh, you're right he said coming out of the bathroom when Issei saw Sarah fall, he was stunned by the chance of the wardrobe. She had on a blue skirt with light blue and green snake details, a dark blue shirt with light blue details and feather tips on the sleeves and split down her cleavage. It was short enough to show her navel. She wore a white type crip on her shoulders that signified her leadership, which the seat tree symbol had on the back, and finished off with some dark blue heels. Her hair was down in bangs that framed the side of her face and head. She was sitting near the foot of the bed, where Issei could see that the skirt had slid on the left side, showing off her leg. It raised sex appeal as the whole did the outfit, which incriminated her curves. She was simply beautiful in the eyes of Issei, looking more of a woman than a busty loli. She literally looks like Boa Hancock's outfit. Drake whistling. You hit the jackpot. The Dread Dragon was impressed by Seraphal's appearance. Seraphal was in lost thought, but noticed that Issei was staring at her, and so she smiled at him. Issei felt a sword pierce down it when Seraphal smiled at him. So how do I look? Seraphal said. Her tone was flirtatious. She puts her arms under her breast to highlight them as exposure of his cleavage. Do you like it? Before she knew it, Issei was on top of her. You know, doing all his normal Issei things.
Yeah, I like, but please tell me, are you sure you don't want to be able to walk permanently, he says. Serifo blushed at the prospect, but also kissed him affectionately. Before last night, she was inexperienced, but after 35 times, she was able to gain some experience to please a lover. Both got lost on each other's lips, blah, blah, whatever. Before you rip off each other's clothes, may I remind me that you both have meetings to attend to, Drake said. He did not want to hear the two having again in the morning. They already did it in the bathroom. He knew that Issa was suppressed from his coma, that he once didn't cared for didn't help either. Both separated just in time, and the maid entered, making her entrance to inform that she completed the task she was asked to do. Miss Seraphal. The chair is located next to the door, the maid said, leaving the room once again. Thank you, Seraphel says. Issei, watching her adjustment and outfit, I don't know if I understand I didn't fall in love with you before. Getting out of the bed, then helping Seraphel. Well, I'm glad that I've also been willing to fall in love with you. Her eyes softened as she looked at Issei as he helped her off the bed. If you continue like that, we won't leave this room, he says, says, turning his face away from Seraphon and not wanting to be hypnotized under the gaze of this woman. She was so seductive. No wonder how she considered one of the most beautiful women in the underworld. Well, when you come back, we can go on some dates. Though I wouldn't be surprised if you fought for another woman that is acquainted with the supernatural while on your journey. But remember, turning his face towards her, I am the Alpha. Are we clear? Her eyes hardened, showing that she was serious about her place in his healing heart. Ise blushing at Seraphon's took control. Clear. Seraphon's smiling at the response. It's time we change for the better. Promise? Yeah, promise, Issa said, smiling back, remembering his words from last night. I will get stronger, and I will be better than before, Issa said to himself. Couldn't have said it better myself, partner, Drake said, enjoying Issa's determination and striving for greatness. Well, we better look at the chair. They must be waiting a long time for us. But in relation, she thought, I think my legs may be out for weeks, rather than a few months. I almost feel bad for the other future woman that spent a night with Issei, but I'm, in the indication, definitely worth it, Seraphos said. Oh, right. Hang on a sec, walking up the door before opening it the hallway of the wheelchair. For the wheelchair. Upon seeing it, he took it and brought it into the room. Suddenly, a thought occurred to him. Do you know what you can take a phoenix to your right? Issei says. Bring him chair to Seraphal, perhaps, but because of my pride, I will overcome this pain naturally. But if this happens again in the future, gesturing to her immobile legs, I will not, t I will not take a tear every time, and now help me opening her arms to Issei. Okay, taking her arms to help carry her and set a chair and set her in the chair. It's a shame for this pain, Seraphel says, before looking towards Issei with a sly smile. Perhaps he may bring a new person to this world one day. Issei, blushing at her words, Seraphon, look away, embarrassed. Oh, so, it's Seraphon now. Before you were moaning, Sarah Chan, we... <laughs> okay, please don't arouse me like that, or we won't be leaving this room again, Issei said. Perhaps you're right. You better contain yourself, Seraphon says. Well, let's go. I'm already getting hungry, Issei said, pushing his chair and leaving the room. But do you know how to get there, Sarah Paul says? Yeah, Issei replied. Well, then we go. Leaning back in the chair, allowing Issei to take control of the wheelchair. Off we go, Issei said, repeating the words, and began to the wheel the chair towards the dining room. As they were walking, they didn't know there were a group of 15 maids watching them, gossiping about them. I can't believe it, maid one said. I know, I didn't believe it seems to be true, maid two said. Who is he? He looks familiar, referring to Issei, since he was pale from the disease. Well, to be able to stay here means to know the lady and the lord, Maid Aid said. They kept gossiping until they when Ronaldo was walking by, so they scattered to get the word, promising to talk again about the new couple. Now, in the dining room. So, his body disappeared, Sectodius said. So it seems, but that's the weird thing, he should be dead, Serzek said. For what it's worth, it's impossible for him to be alive, pondering upon a discovery, Ajuka replied. It's true, appearing in the next chair to Ajuka, Odin says. Ajuka, Serzak, slash Sectodius. Ah! Fighting by the sudden appearance of the all-seeing father. What? You look like you've seen a ghost, Odin said. His to moan talking, his tone was mocking them, but the hint of amusement at seeing such grown men look frightened. Sectodius, calming down. Hello, Odin son. Odin replies, hello, Sectodius. And how are you doing, Odin Dono, Serzak said. All right. It was said nonchalant as if he was downplaying it. It looks like the food is ready, but where is Issei? Ajuka said, seeing now the maids begin to bring up the dishes set them next to the table. Ah, you're right, Sectodius replied. I guess Seraphal still hasn't woken up, Sir Zek says. 
but out of nowhere they heard some noise coming from the door. See, we didn't get lost, Issei said, proud of getting here, while the red dragon inside of him could only shake his head. Oh yes, but after seven minutes of going down a hallway to hallway, her eyes were closed, but it seems that she was annoyed by the tick near her eyebrows, Arfal said. Uh, I don't be like that, Issei said, trying to speak in a sad tone. That tone will no longer work with me, Sarah Falls said. Are you sure, Issei says, getting in her face, teasing her for something to happen. Yes, her gaze never faltering. Your mouth says one thing, but your eyes say something else, smiling at her shittingly. And what do my eyes say, Issei, Sarah Falls said. This. Going in for a quick kiss, however, Sarah Falls had other plans. As Issei leaned for the kiss, Sarah Falls hand grabbed him by his face, stopping his advances. Issei, I told you not to do that, and it seems like my eyes and mouth are speaking the same. Annoyed by what Issei tried to do. Yes, yes, I understand, Issei replied, opening the door of the dining room. Upon entering the room, they were met with the immense silence, and everyone looked at them in a strange way. The woman, one had an insurgentless expression, and looked other excited and proud. The men, two, were confused, and had a face of relief, and the last one was incredulous of what he was seeing. Why are you looking at us like that, Issei said. Seraphal, when did you arrive, Sir Zek said. And why the chair, a joker replied, though he had an idea for the reason... If Latonia falls for Issei, oh dear. Both newcomers and remain silent, until Valena approached them with some tremendous speed. I don't believe it, Valena says, her eyes gleaming with pride and her happiness. She quickly hugs Issei tightly and whispers in his ear, Well done. And then goes to hug Seraphal. What's going on, Vinny Chun? Seraphal says she was being embraced by the Machris. <laughs> well, how should I tell you this? Look at your appearances, showing a little more skin, referring to Seraphal's new outfit. So tell me, how many times did you do it with my son? She via side coming out. Both of them blush at the question, but out of nowhere a scream was heard. I can't believe it, running to Issei. My perverted companion has ceased to be a virgin, Odin says. What? Sir Zex replied. Hmm, my guess is just what I thought, Ajika said. Well, thinking to himself, I really hope you'd survive if you fall for him, Latia. Ha, <laughs> well, it looks like that. Well, look at that, Sectodia said, getting up and hugs Issei, and the kid became a man. While well, he looked proud on the outside, on the inside, he was disappointed even more in his daughter. If only you didn't do what you did, Rhea, Sectodia said. To think this would happen, Grafia said, shaking her head and rubbing her temples. What the hell is going on here, Sir Zex replied, still incredulous about the whole situation. Well, clapping Issei on the back, this dragon has ceased to be a virgin, smiled giggledly Odin said. Issei, is that true? Sir Zek said, turning his attention towards the young Sekiru. Issei only nodded his head. <laughs> well, getting up and giving Issei a hug, I'm happy for you, separating the hug and patting Issei on the shoulder. But like his father, he talked to himself, why did you have to do what you did? Rius, Sir Zek said to himself. Ah, thanks. It's better that we sit down, he said. Oh, yes, I want all the details, Valena said. Excited to hear about the night the two lovebirds had. Valena, control yourself, Zectodia said, whispering in the ear of his wife. No, Valena said, sending a glare to her husband's way. Ah, damn it, Zectodius replied, feeling defeated by his wife's stubbornness. Each one sat down back at the table, and Issei directed Sarah Fall's wheelchair to the table attended to her knees, treating her like the empress that she was in front of everyone. Issei secured a spot for Seraphal at the dining table and sat into her the wheelchair before taking a seat next to her. They're so cute, Valena said. A teasing smile sent the couple's way. Seraphal, while not minding Issei's action, was not going to be teased by Valena's comment. She made a promise, and she was going to stick by it. Fanny Chun, Seraphal said, upset by the grammar of Marcho's comments and released a little of her aura towards the brunette woman. I didn't do anything, Valena said with a playful tone, but to herself, you know, at least not yet. Well, Issei, looking on his expression unnerved, my boy, you really did do some work on her, leaving her without being able to move her legs. I'm impressed, Odin said. His tone was a mix of mockery, amusement, and astonishment. Father, what's she talking about, Milicus says, not understanding the situation. <gasps> nothing, nothing, Sir Zek says. We're just uh, interrogating the criminal, Sir Zek replies, looking towards Issei with a smile that gives with a brunette and eerie feeling. Since when did I become a criminal, Issei says, becoming annoyed at the cotch raid. We're the ones asking the questions, not you. The only man overly calm despite the situation, Ajuka is. Ah, uh, yes. You're right, Ajuka Dona, Anoda says. You better answer truthfully, Issei Ni, seeing his father smile, knowing that he saved himself from it earlier, Milika said. Issei went from annoyed to a bit nervous, so he looked at his last hope. Hey, old man. But he saw him disinterested because his son's attitude was similar to his wife. 
You're on your own, kid, Zectodius said. Ugh, Issei replied, seeing how Zectodius wasn't putting up a fight. The woman saw Issei question as if he was a criminal. Should you help him, Seraphal said, watching as she was confined to the wheelchair from her and Issei's activities of last night and this morning. None of that, Missy. Going to playful serious in her serious tone, Valana does. You owe us an explanation, Grafia said. She was curious at how this transpired between the Mao and her little brother. Seraphal knew that she was quite for talking. And seeing how Issei was now tied to a chair that he was sitting in, she knew that he would be no help. Damn, Seraphel says when she felt a hand on her shoulder. Now what happened with you and my Soji, Valena said, getting a little payback by releasing her own aura back on Seraphel. Uh, Seraphel is scared of what to go. You can scream all you want. No one will help you and we're going to get the answers that we're looking for, Grafia said, turning Leviathan's head in her direction. And so now the couple, the Leviathan and the Red Dragon, were interrogated by their peers, as Milikis watched on, feeling sorry for his big brother figure, but not too sorry. Better than better man than me better them than me, Milikis says, looking on the better interrogations and secretly hoping he was saved from his parents' wrath due to the trouble that caused by her maids today. Fifteen minutes later, how beautiful, Valena says, crying a little from the information that she received from the new couple and how their relationship began. I agree, Gravia said with her usual serious tone, but couldn't help the compare that she felt for Sir Zex to how the new couple fell for another. So, that's how he went from a boy to a man. Gives a thumbs up and he sees a compliment. Odin does. Ajuka says, It looks like we'll be getting Sarah fall of the old. Smiling, remembering how she could strike fear into anyone, gaining the position of Leviathan. I agree, Sarah Bex said. As she spoke, as they spoke, Issei and Seraphal, they were hugging in a corner. Room, or rather, Issei was hugging Seraphal, scared for his life. That, Seraphal said, she was scaringly calm, despite the interrogation she went through. That was horrible, Issei said, clearly more scared than Seraphal was. Both remain in the corner, with Seraphal having to calm her lover down. Clearly, he went through his interrogation much worse than she did. Initially, she was scared, but she remembered who she was in her position and didn't back down from the questions asked of her. My lord, Phoenix and Sea Tree Parchets have arrived, appearing at the door of the dining room, and all that does. <laughs> I want to see the face of Zavar, Lord Sea Tree. When he sees his daughter in his current state, very happy. From the watching the interrogation, Issei endured it was likely to get a repeat performance, Sectodius said. Shit, Issei said, scared of what's to come, whereas Sarah Falls steeled herself in this confrontation, wavered to reveal her true self once again. And that is the end of chapter 15. Chapter 16. Shit, and I wanted a quiet day, Issei said, getting up from the corner of the room. Issei, you need to relax, it's just... My mother and father try not to be nervous, okay, Seraphal said, leaning back in the chair, preparing to deal with her parents. I guess you're right. The truth is that they were going to find out at some point, Issei said, sitting in the chair next to Seraphal, but it will be problematic. Xavier, or Lord Sea Tree, starts talking. Hello, Zictodius, entering the room. Lady Sea Tree, or Sophia. Hello, Valena, greeting from the March Wretch in a friendly tone, following her husband into the room. Greeting, Xavier, get up from the seat to offer a handshake to his fellow Parkriac. Richard, or Lord Phoenix, how are you all? As he says, entering the sea tree parchments. We're fine. All is well. Not much has happened accompanying her husbands to greet the fellow clan leaders. Of course, with all that's happened since last night, the Gremory Marchrach was feeling on a different level. Oh, hello, he said, Lady Phoenix said, greeting the teenager kindly, but there was a slight tint of sadness. At the moment, the other three visitors noticed Issei, who looked on and waved. While he seemed calm on the outside, he was mentally freaking out inside. Calm down, partner, Drake said. You're not the one who has to deal with your mate's parents, Issei said. And who are you partnered with, Drake said. What? Issei replied. Who are you partnered with? Whom do you share your titles with, Drake said. The Opai Dragon? Issei said, a little confused. Our other title, Drake says, a little angry at the mention to be soon former nickname. The Red Dragon of Domination, Issei says. Good, good, so stop your bitching and dominate the situation, Drake said, sitting back and letting Issei handle the situation. So with the quick pep talk and confidence that his partner instilled in him, Issei responded back to his greetings. Hello, Lord Phoenix, Lady Phoenix, turning his attention to the sea tree patriots. My in-laws, smiling confidently, and from the corner of his eye, he sees Seraphal raise her eyebrow at him. He's got some balls, Seraphal says, but then she remembered last night. Yeah, he does, a smirk on her forming on her face. I think I'll handle that pretty well, Issei said. I knew you were reckless, but I must say, that was bold, Drake said. The Sutri Partrats were surprised at what they were just called. 
When they turned to Seraphon, they could see a change. Aurora did not seem to have a childlike quality as before. Now it's mature and serious, along with the power that it held. What do you mean, your in-laws? Richard said. Turning to Issei, surprised and confused. Issei, you ruined the surprise, Valena said, annoyed because Issei took the thunder. Well, someone had to say it. Might as well be me. If he looked at his mother's direction, he would have possibly experienced the death stare she was sending his way. Well, that was direct, Seraphal said, fright, fiending annoyance, but keeping it to herself from laughing. Well, I had to dominate the situation, Issei said. I guess you did then got right to the point, rubbing his cheek affectionately before giving him a tender kiss. Savior in disbelief. Zictodius. Perplexed at the scene before him, Sophia, did, I can't believe it, covering her mouth in shock. Ha! <laughs> it seems that they forgot what we were here, nodding to the couple that was still kissing, Odin said. Could you explain to me what's going on? Richard said. Yes, but before that, pointing to the couple still kissing, we should probably separate them, don't you think? Diana replied. Yes, you're correct, Sir Zek says, clearing his throat. Issei! Uh, yes? From Seraphal, who glazed at Sir Zex for ruining her time. At the Mount Lucifer, did a slight shiver go down his spine. You forgot that we're still here, Ajuka said. It's true, Issei Ni, nodding in agreement with the Mal Beelzebub. Malikus said. Ah, forgive me, Seraphal replied, giving a bow as she could from within her wheelchair, embarrassed that she had still repressed to begin to take over. Well, you have a lot to explain, Lady Citri said, coming out of her shock. Uh, I guess so, Issei replied, a little nervous about the explanation to come. You damn dragon, how dare you do that to my daughter, Xavier said, going after Issei with great thirst for blood, while the Aphrodite ran for his life. Oh, Xavier, keep him alive for me. He still needs to be punished, Valena said, despite the smile on her face, they could tell that she was serious. But Oak is shocked by his mother's betrayal. <laughs> you ruined your mother's surprise, so you must pay the price, Valena said. Damn, Issei replied, dodging the water spell aimed at him. Try to survive, dear, Valena said, amused by her son's predicament. Now, 15 minutes later. I see. Well, Issei, I give you permission to be with my daughter, proud of having his daughter's back, Xavier says. Or, lady, or, my bad. <laughs> the sea tree guy. You know, her father. Lady Citri says, I say the same, crying a little for his new union and seeing the maturity that her daughter new possesses. Well, they didn't waste time with a little mockery, but glad that Issa was moving on to people that appreciate him and value him. Richard was pretty happy. Honey, Diana said, giving him a nudge to the ribs. Yes, I heard the news two times it's incredible, excited about how Issa and Sarah fall bonded, Valena said. Yes, and now that we're finished talking about it, there are three things that I want to talk about with those present. His voice was serious, and despite his sickly appearance, he demanded attention. Hmm? You didn't tell me you wanted to say something confused by what he said to say. Sarah was pretty confused. He says starts. Because I wanted everyone to listen. I do not want to repeat myself. His tone was still and serious, which made the others see something new in Issei. Sir Zex replies. We're ready to listen, and we will be supportive of what you have to say, thinking to himself, his tone is similar to mine. You really have grown, Issei. Maybe my plan will still come to fruition after all. I agree, Odin says, calm but curious of what the boy had to say. You had kind of my support as well, Ajuka says. The clan leaders nodded and sat down, seeing that Issei was very serious. Well, first, as you know, I will be gone for a few months to a year. I want the High Council to know why I left, and you can make it known to the public and the other factions as well, Issei said. That is fine, but why such a time length, Ajuka said. You know my reasons, but I'd also like to move on to the third year of my school and finish my education, Issei said. I understand, Ajuka replied. Anything else, Felina said? Secondly, I want the Opai Dragon money that has been collected to split up 65% can be distributed among the girls, the Hyoto, and Azazel, 0.25% if possible. I'd like to invest it into rebuilding of Sona's schools. Oros Academy and the last 10% I'd like to give in to the younger Saji siblings. Those children shouldn't suffer for their brother's actions. I'd also like the Opai Dragon show to be cancelled within a year from today, Issei said. What? Seraphal said. She was confused, perplexed, astonished at what Issei wanted to do with the money. Boy, the money is yours, Odin says. I know, but a large part is theirs. After all, they had characters on the show, and the crow was a producer, so they can have their share. Something tells me they're going to need it, Issei says. Lastly, I want any punishment they give to give them to be effect when they try to seek me, Issei says. 
Shouldn't you want it to be done as quickly as possible? Richard, confused by why it should be prolonged. Easy. If they find out that they're exposed, they will look for me and I haven't prepared myself, Issei said. But you just have to deny them, nothing more, Serzek says, and they would begin to bother you, a Juka, a Seraphal, and I think you've enough of your sister's pathetic tantrums, Issei said. It's true, and this is my fault for spoiling her. Forgive me, Serzek says. What's done is done. Don't apologize for another's careless actions, Issei replied. Since the money will go to them, all economic help from the Grembury family would be cancelled indefinitely, Sectodius said. I'd say the same. The Phoenix family will cease to offer them support, Richard said. From today, every economic reprimation of all aid contact to them will be confiscated. Confiscated. All titles will be reindisced, and they will have be with that money and nothing else, speaking in agreement of the clan leaders, Sir Zax finishes. Everyone nodded in their heads in agreement, but also the thought that Issei was too good for them, except Seraphal, who saw while pondering what Issei was planning, until she noticed the slight smirk on his lips. So it's a smokescreen, Seraphal said. He only gave them the money, so he continues to fulfill what he intends to do in peace. While we decide the punishment, he's using their impulsive nature against them, which will help lead them to the punishment. When they do realize what the money came from, Seraphal says to herself, This came out better than I thought, Issei says. I'd say, using the Opai dragon money as a smokescreen for you to train in peace. Impressive, Drake said. Well, that is all. Is there anything you want to know? Issei says. Yes, Issei. When do you leave? Sir Zex replied. After this meeting, waving it off as if it was nothing. I see, Odin said, being left in thought. Why? Issei replied. Did you forget what you wanted to ask me? Ajuka said, talking about the seven mountains of books on the seven magical circles. Oh, I did forget, Issei said, remembering the books that he planned to ask before his encounter with the Hiyoto. Ajuka starts chuckling. It's good that I saw your memories, so I could retrieve everything you wanted to ask. And while Shamazi could not get Azazel's notes about Sacred Gears, since it was lab where he was doing that, he and Barkil got something better. These are notes by the Sanatil, a former cat's raid. You may also learn about the artificial Sacred Gears that he distributed long ago. He called them Tagus. According to those two, Sanatil was more proficient than Azazel in knowledge of Sacred Gears. Their only copy of the notes. They didn't want to make Azazel suspicious. If you want to learn more about the Sonatil, I suggest you visit Tobio. He and his team may know more, since they faced him. Also, Sourorg's Rook, Landa Boon, provided a book from his clan. It should be more of use when you recover your draconic powers, Ajuka says. I see. Thank you, Issei says, getting up and putting the books away. I also have some things for you and a gift from Tani. Sir Zek says, taking out a box as big as Issei's head. Oji-san? What is it? Issei says. Well, it's not as much, but in case you get into trouble. Here's ten bottles of Phoenix Tears and from Tanin. These daggers that he had forged from a chipped scale and cloth from Great Red when he challenged him years ago, but was ignored and infused with Tanin's own power, pulling forth two daggers with two blades that were blood red and made the dragon bones. They also admitted immense draconic energy. My other gift will be given when you return, Sir Zek says. Those blades look sick, by the way. Thank you, Issei says, taking the box and storing the materials in his storage space. These daggers would bode well for a simulation, Drake said, extracting a bit of power from the daggers to unite with the boosted gear. Valena and I also have something for you, Zictodia says. Ronaldo, calling for the servant, Ronaldo entered the room with a box in his hands and gave it to Issei. What is this? Issei said, opening the box to see several clothes, along with a wine red coat, or rather, crimson coat that was folded. It reminded him of Drake's scales, and that had black padding on where the shoulders would be positioned. In addition to some clothes, Zictodius says, we named the coat the Shroud of the Conqueror. It seemed befitting, since, with how you've been able to best all of our enemies and how you fought on the battlefield, it seemed like the right name. When you put magic power in, it can be hardens, 
can be equal to that of scales of a high class dragon. We had a little assistance from Tanin and the other dragons to determine its durability. Proud of the accomplishment that he and his wife developed, originally it was supposed to be given to Issei when he married Rias, but due to the events that have transpired, that won't happen, and they didn't want to mention it either. Today was the day of celebration of sorts, Sictodius said to himself. It's incredible, Issei said, in awe as he felt the coat in the box. It was something that was befitting of a high class devil, or even an ultimate class devil. It sounded like it would make one look powerful, making a mental note to wear it for presentation when he returns. He went amazing, Issei says, astonished by what was before him, but inside he was thinking, I'm so getting someone intelligent. If I form a team, I am by no means a doctor, but it wouldn't hurt to study more things, Issei says. Don't forget me, Odin says, giving Issei a giant book. This book was written by me. It's a copy that contains all my knowledge of demonic, holy, human, and god magic in each of the runes that are there. Also, proud of himself and what he's accomplished. This, this is incredible, Issei says, going through the book of what he could possibly learn from it. I'm going to have to visit Tobio and Levadia. After all, she's the best mage that I know of. Unless, Issei says, Drake starts, Partner, we don't know. If they know what the Bastard of Lucifer or the Crow has done, and the only way to find out is to visit them, Drake said. You're right, but this gives me an opportunity as well, now that I think about it, Issei said. And what's that, Drake replies. I'm going to form a team. While I'm out there, we'll talk more about it later, Issei says, returning back to reality. <laughs> it's nothing. Only the best for all that you've done. Boy, noticing Issei was talking to Drake, but leaned in and whispered to Issei, I'll find you another woman as well, Odin says, with a perverted giggle. Seraphal could only raise an eyebrow as what Odin was telling her beloved, but considering Issei's laugh at the god's antics, it shouldn't be something for her to worry about. Suzek starts, Michael said he will give you some things when you come back, as he has some issues to attend to in heaven, Suzek says. Issei Ni, Milica says, you should store that bottle before you break it, watching Issei store the gifts. After storing everything in space with the boosted gear, Issei stayed to talk about casual things for about two hours, until the time he had to leave to come. Well, it was a good talk with you, Issei says, getting up from his chair. It's time, right? Odin says, yeah, honestly, it was, a it was a mistake to be reincarnated again after Great Red made this body. I wanted to help her achieve her dream, but I will not die for them again. Not anymore. They once again didn't care about my feelings, so there's no need for me to care about theirs, Issei said. Drag son said, if you took the pawn pieces out, they would kill you instantly because your power would be unbalanced, Ajuka said. That's true, but this is one, my one shot, and I will take it, Issei said, showing no nervousness. He wasn't going to back down now. Everyone got up and hugged Issei one by one, until Seraphal was the last one. How do we know if you survive the ritual? Seraphal says, her eyebrows showing the sadness that she kept possibly losing Issei as she held onto his shoulder to keep him in place. Easy. I will send you the pieces when I finish. So don't worry. Remember my promise. I will get stronger and I will survive. Looking at back with her determination, Issei does. Very well. But I will miss you, Seraphal says, bringing him back to her embrace. I will miss you as well. Stay beautiful, Issei says. Good luck, Zictodius said, smiling at the Sargon son. Take care of yourself, Sachi, Valena says, crying a little since she spent such a short time with him. Be mindful of your surroundings, Sirzek said in a kind tone. Be sure to study a lot, Ajuka said, smiling. Also train your body. Be sure to rest and not overdo it. In a serious tone, but if one looked closely, she had a small smile on her face, Grafia had. Goodbye, Yisei Ni, Milika says, hugging Grafia, but with some tears in his eyes. Don't you dare die, Xavier said. I don't want my daughter to be left alone, just as serious as the headmate of the Gremory clan. Sophita says, or Lady Citri, try to come back soon, smiling softly at her new son-in-law. Don't use those tears sloppily, Phoenix said. Diana replies, I hope everything goes well for you, hugging her husband's side. I hope you don't leave your perversion, Odin says with a smile. <laughs> you know, Odin-sama. Sometimes I feel like that perversion is what put me in this mess. But it's not up to me. Whether I have it or not, if I do, it will be for those that appreciate for me. And I actually value me as a person, not as a toy, with a smile. But discreetly was looking at Seraphal. By the way, someone's going to have to tell Sona that I will be absent from my studies, which means she's going to have to come up with a small lie. Since, unfortunately, Ra's vice is my harmony teacher and if possible can someone remove the Hyoto surname as well since they're so ashamed of me 
Best to cut ties with them. I'll come up with a new one when I return, rubbing his back of his head, chuckling nervously at the things he almost forgot. I will look into it, Seraphal says. Farewell, my sweetheart, looking at him with a small smile that he kept act in his mind until he sees her again. <laughs> of course, Issei says. He almost forgot that Sona was her sister. But seeing her serious side, it made sense that she would inform the student council president of his absence. Well, goodbye, Odin-sama, Lord Citri-sama, Lady Citri-sama, Lord Phoenix, Lady Phoenix, Beelzebub, speaking respectfully to the Partriots and leaders before addressing the rest of them. Goodbye, Odoboto, Sir Zexni, Ani-chan, goodbye, Sarah-chan, with a smile, before looking to the last of the people in the room. Goodbye, Odo-sama, Okasama, as he disappeared into the magic circle, with a smile on his face. For Zictodius and Valena, tears rolled down their eyes, as well as Zictodius as we called an old man, but never by the title of the father from Issei, but Valena, despite being called mother, before it still causes her to tear up a little. Goodbye, my son, Valena says, smiling with happiness, remembering his face as he left for his journey, a smile she will never forget, and a smile she hopes she will see again. Now, somewhere in the human world. Issei appeared in a rather beautiful place, but when he arrived, a shill sound pierced his ears, along with the sound of rushing water. Hey, Trey, where are we? Issei says, taking Sir Zek's advice and being mindful of his surroundings, looked around the environment, covering his ears from the sound. We are at the Angel Falls in Vesaluna, Drake says. Issei turned and saw a large waterfall that was straining around the sound. It's beautiful, Issei says, removing his hands from his ears, embracing the sound of rushing water as he watched the waterfall from the cliffs. Yes, it is, Drake says, in agreement with Issei. And what are we doing in Vesaluza, Issei says, never taking his eye off the waterfall. Here is where we'll find the crystallized dragon heart, Treg says. I see, Issei replies, getting serious, knowing that they will end his suffering was here. Walk towards the waterfall. You should find a lake, Treg says. Okay, Issei replied, walking to where he was instructed. And Issei walked quietly, each step towards the falls. The sound of water rushing increased, but instead of disturbing him, it gave him peace. Issei, after walking a few minutes, got to where the falls ended and it looked like a lake. The light was retracting off the water, giving it a divine atmosphere. So what now? Issei says, looking at the lake as it glistened. You have to enter, Drake says. Really? Issei replied. You'll see. Just get in, Drake says. Okay. Starting to take off his shirt, Issei starts. After removing almost all of his clothes, he prepared to enter the water. Now, coat your body with a little of your magical power, Drake says. All right, Issei replied. Surrounding Issei's body was an aura that was blood red with black parts, but there was also some aspects of amber as well. This amber, what is it? Is there a dormant power within you, partner? And why does it appear now, Drake says. There were the thoughts going through Dragon's head as he was trying to understand this new presence. Here we go. Issei said, throwing himself into the water. When Issei landed in the water, his whole body began to relax. It felt incredible, and he felt more at ease. He began to notice how his energy was being pulled to the bottom, so he began to swim there. In order to prevent him from drowning, he quickly applied a small spell as not to die from the lack of oxygen. He also amplified his sight, allowing Issei to see everything. The lake was full of fish, rocks, something that looked like coral. It was a beautiful sight. He continued further down. The route seemed infinite until he fell into a pool and change of his direction to his left. So he followed it. As he swam in that direction, he noticed a feeling of entering a barrier. As he followed the pull, he entered a cave with large sharp rocks. There were still fish in the cave, but they slam out of his way. As he swam deeper into the cave, he once again felt the change in direction. This time it was upwards, so he changed course to begin to swim upwards. As he was going up, he saw what looked like an air pocket out of a dome. He reached to the surface and arrived at a giant dome, of what looked like quartz, opal, and other rocks of many colors. Seeing as how he could breathe air, he disabled his water breathing spell and looked around while waddling in water, seeing the form of pillars in each direction. Wow, Issei says, amazed by what he was seeing. I present to you the cave of the fallen dragon, Issei says, I mean, Drake says, though his tone was somber rather than prideful. Why? Why is it called that, Issei says? This place is the abdomen of the corpse of the first dragon that fell, Drake said. Issei replies, seriously, for such a name, this place is incredible, seeing the beauty of the cave. Follow your aura. It will take you to the heart suitable for you, Drake says. Now, following Drake's instructions, Issei began to swim towards. 
the direction where Azora took him. He reached a dirt road, so he got out of the water and began to walk to the depths of the cave. In every part of the walls, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of inimitable gems. There were colorful gems, but his aura did not guide him to any of the stones, so he continued to advance deeper. While walking, he was... He saw how there was an open field, so he increased his speed towards it. When he reached the field, he gasped in surprise, because in the center of the field there was a large, if not gigantic dragon. The dragon seemed to be made of kind of diamond around it. There were still gems of all kinds. I introduce you to Sazen, the second dragon king, the diamond dragon, Trey says. The second dragon king, impressed and a little confused, he says. Yes, the first dragon that was deceived, and that the dragon sacrificed himself so that dragons that suffer the same as he did could not advance and will not die, Drake says, with a respectful tone to the dragon that suffered for others to prevail. The first dragon to be deceived. He must have had a hard time. His tone was slightly sad, saying, knowing that this dragon had given himself so that others could survive if they were deceived, he said thanks in his own head. Yes, Drake says. Myara pulls me toward him. As he starts to walk towards the copse of Sanin, Ize approached the claws of Sanin and looking closer, he noticed how there was a gem under it. And about to touch the red gem. It was a red gem with many silver lines. By the way, we're in the middle of chapter uh, 16. It was a red gem with many silver lines. It seemed that it had a smaller one under it. Ise brought his hand closer to the gem and in touching it with his hand, felt as his turbulent feelings calmed down. It was as if a hole was being calmed. When he tried to get the gem out, it came off as if nothing bad happened. The gem was in Issei's hand as he looked at it incuriously. It's incredible, Issei says, impressed in awe of the gem. It's normal, because there is a special heart gem for each dragon that enters this cave, Drake says. Issei turned his gaze towards Sazen directly, and he gave the corpse a bow in form of respect. Thank you very much, Issei says, paying his respects to the dragon. As he was beginning to turn and leave, something responded. You are welcome, whispered the corpse. Issei looked back at the corpse, seeing that it didn't change. He let out a sigh and proceeded to walk to the exit with the gem in hand. A few minutes later, Issei gradually left the lake with the sound of the waterfall in the background. Returning to the spot where he decides his clothes and sat down with his legs crossed and the gem between his legs. So now what? Issei says without moving from his position and gaze onto the gem. You needed to do two things. The second would be to go to my cave and make the magic circle of the ritual, Drake said. And the first, Issei said... Well, you know, that each dragon, when it reaches a point of its existence, can combine in a skill of an element of their own, of a, or another type, Drake says. And what does that have to do with me, Say says. As I told you, after the ritual, your dragon powers will be dormant, but I want to see if you already are ready to get your own ability, Drake says. You think I'm ready for that, Say replies. Yes, I believe in you. His tone showing pride in his partner. So what do I have to do? Issei says, gaining a little confidence. You have to go to your subconscious, or you can call it your inner world. When you arrive, you have to look for the name of a skill and how to use it. In my case, it was diving in a volcano until my body was sheltered by the heat and lava. I had to take my mind away from the heat. When doing so, I arrived at a white plain where there was a plaque that explained everything about my boost ability, Drake says, remembering his own test. And what does the volcano have to do with your ability, Issei says? The pressure of the lava symbolizes the pressure on the body that is subjected by increasing its power. And heat is the heat that generates erratic energy by increasing its amount, Drake says. And how do you think my test would be, Issei says, looking at the lake. I don't know. It's different for every dragon, Drake says. Oh, what do I do, Tender, in my inner world, Issei says, a little excited to obtain his own aura. First, close your eyes. Issei does so. Next, breathe and empty your mind completely. Just focus on my voice. Issei follows Drake's instructions. Now concentrate on that void. Look at the end of it while listening to my voice. Issei concentrated on the void. The road will be difficult. You will discover things about yourself that you did not know. But remember that I am here for support. It was the last thing Issei heard from his partner. Drake? Issei says, opening his eyes and seeing that he was in a city of black and gray and white. 
I'm where I talked to Jiko, looking at the surroundings, but what happened to this place? Issei says it was burning before, but now it's changed. In the inner world, the houses in the park that Issei had seen last time he had been here, there were millions of skyscrapers, parts of earth were leafing through the air. But the most disconcerting thing was that everywhere there were cracks on the ground, the houses even on the sky, among those cracks were scratch marks. So this is my inner world. That means my aura to be, he was interrupted by a similar voice. <laughs> it was time, huh? Jiko says. It was heard all over the world. Jiko, where are you? Issei says, looking around for his self. No, no, no. It won't be that easy. You have to look for me, little dragon, speaking mockingly as his whole voice rumbled all over the world. Are you serious? You think I can fucking find you in this world? Issei says, clearly livid at the task at hand. Easy. Follow my voice, Jiko says. So are you want to test something then? Issei says, more or less, but if you don't hurry, you'll miss the party. Jiko says, all right then, Issei replied, gritting his teeth, both annoyed but determined. Issei ran forward to where the park was. When he arrived, he saw someone from the other side but did not see anything strange. Jiko, Issei said, what? Jiko replied, now what do I do, huh? Issei said, looking back and forth for something or anything. <laughs> do you see something that was not there last time you came? Jiko says, returning to a mocking tone. Something that was not trailing off until he looked towards the front. That's it, seeing a statue of somewhat far away. Issei approached and opened his eyes when he saw the statue was. This is Sarachan? Issei says, upon getting a closer look at the statue. Beautiful, isn't it? What you have to do is go down the stairs. I'm waiting for you, Jiko says, his tone becoming malicious. What's seeing the one side of the statue, there's a staircase down. Those stairs are headed to the stairs. The only sounds heard were the steps that Issei went down them. After a few steps, the light outside where he came disappeared. The place was completely black. The steps, once ceiling, and everything was black. He continued to head down the stairs, and lower he got, the heavier the tension became. Eventually, his sight became to see where the steps of another color the lower he got. These steps were gray, and when stepping on the top one, the place changed because now he was in a gray corridor, and out of nowhere he began to hear something. Now, in the depths of the inner world. Everything was dark until a light appeared, which under it was a black and white Issei. This Issei was dark and had a white suit. Well, it's time, Jiko said, walking up these steps to get what looked like a microphone. Out of nowhere, several lights appeared, and under them was a copy of Sir Zek, Sectodius, and Michael. They wore dark suits, and each of them had different musical instruments. Now let the show begin, Jiko says, smiling malevolently. Now, in the hallway with Issei, in the corridor... Many images appeared on the walls from the ceiling. A melody began to be heard. Issei just kept walking forward as the melody accompanied him. Issei walked and came to the first image. It was him crying on the ground in the rain. The second was of him hitting the ground again and again. The next one is him running to the house. The next one after that is Rias in front. The next image is him shouting at Rias loudly. The next one is being him slapped by Rias. The final image of this sequence was him hitting her in the stomach and backhanding her to the ground. Perhaps it was better you have left you with Riser. I think I saved Riser from you, and not only the other way around. Actually, maybe I should have let Volley kill you that night at the faction's meeting. I remember those words you said. You said you won't have regrets. You better hope so, because I'm not saving you from this mess. I'm not your toy, and you're on your own. I hope you can own up to the lives you destroyed, Princess of Ruin, Issei says. The next set of images. Came this was one when he was in front of his room. The next one was from entering his room. The one that follows is him seeing them having sex with Volley, Casper, and Kiba, and Sanji. The next one is him running with Ascalon, activated, and stabbing Sanji, Kiba, Volley, and Gasper as they were stunned by his presence and rendered uselessness. The next one is one of him screaming at all of the girls with tears in his eyes. The one that follows them is getting up and confronting him. The final image of this series that follows him is of him activating the boosted gear and hitting Konako who wanted to hit him. You used to call me the worst, Konako. But I never did what you did. I never betrayed anyone. I was once a pervert, but none of you ever paid attention. It seems I accepted all of your flaws, but yet none of you had the decency to say you didn't love me. You had the audacity to do it in my room, but then again, that house was never my house. 
I'll get my own and live freely. You all made your choices. So live with your sins and maybe some of you will become better. If you own up to them, I own up to my sin of being a pervert. Can you do the same? Issei finishes. The next image set came. It started off with an image of him, a chair of his house. The next one was of his parents entering behind him. The image that follows is him beating Goro to the ground. Next image was Miki screaming to see Issei hear Goro again and again, until his face looked like raw meat. The next image that is as follows of the girls and the idiots appearing to try to control them. The image after that was Issei shoving Lafay and Kuroka aside, creating holes in the wall as they try to get off from Goro. The one that follows in him being hit by a lightning ray from Akino, but he gets up and slices her fallen angel wings off. Next image showed Volley being stabbed in the stomach by Issei as the energy of Ascalon rendered him useless. The image that follows was taking Kiba's sword and stabbing him with his own blade. Next image was Gaspar trying to stop Issei, but quickly stabbed in the eyes, making him useless. The final image was Rias throwing a sphere of destruction, aiming for his left arm, but he dodges it and swiftly decapitates her. A stunning outcome to all of those in the image, except him. Did they really think I wouldn't have killed them? I learned my lesson with Rainer on that front. This time I confronted my problems head on. It's what I always did. I guess this is what I was feeling when I said I could activate the Juggernaut Drive and did not care what happens. Kind of feels good to get all the anger out. Well, I guess I did when I broke Goro's wrist, but I did warn him to get his hand off my shoulder. They thought they could control me when they replaced me. Well, joke's on them. I got better parents now, with a small smile remembering those that cared about him. The Grey Corridor ended and Issei's expression was of serenity and peace. It had not changed since he entered this corridor. He wasn't phased by the image as an expression never changed. When he reached the end of the corridor, he moved on. Both with these wings and images, this corridor, and within 20 steps, he reached another corridor and only this one was black. In the depths of the inner world, oh, he passed the first test. Well, on to the second one, Chico says as he started to sing another song. In the hallway with Issei. Issei walked down the hall again and new images began to appear. Issei saw an image of him, side of the street seeing Kiba and Gasper with Irina, Zenovia and Gabriel. The next image was Issei hitting Gasper so hard that his fist went through Gasper from the back. The image to follow is Kiba turning the res receives a blow in the face that sends him flying and landing sickening crunch. The next image is Issei looking at Irina, Zenovi, and Gabriel in an emotionless way as they remain in shock at the two deaths they witnessed. The next image was Issei hitting Zenovi in the face with a point-blank dragon shot, making her head explode. The image after that was Gabriel opening her wings preparing to take the sky, but Issei appeared behind her with malicious intent. The next image showed the aftermath of that confrontation with Issei holding the wings of Gabriel as she laid on the ground with a bleeding back, and the boosted gear, and Hans stomped, smashing his foot through her chest, ending her life. The next image showed Issei with a devilish smile, appearing in front of the shocked Irina. After that was the image of Issei embracing her, with the final one showing him squeezing her as Issei tried to separate as Irina tried to separate them before she stopped moving as a crunch was heard from her ribcage, caving in and piercing her heart and lungs. The Issei in the image dropped the body and smiled sadistically, looking at the corpses around him. You said you'd be my guardian angel, but where were you to protect me from this pain? Though, I will take some of the blame for the surrounding us with the wrong people. You were my first friend and nothing will ever change that. Maybe in another life, we could be together. Now, I don't think that's possible, but I hope for the better future than this. Not everyone deserves death, Issei says. The new set of images showed Issei in front of a door, then kicking the door so hard that it clears it. The image that follows is Issei being Pyomin and Ross having sex with Azazel. Then Azazel is trying to talk, but Issei appears on top of him and crushes his head, splashing Pyumin and Ross with Azazel's blood. The next image is Issei, watching them smiling malevolently and crying at the same time. The next image was Pyumin trying to use magic, but Issei stabs her through the chest with Ascalon. The final image showed Ross, seeming to sober up and try to process what happened, scrambling away, but Issei would just grab her by the hair and cut her head off. This was another saddening set of images for Issei to see. I feel bad for killing Ross Vaisa like that. Seems like she was under the influence of alcohol, as she noticed the bottles of liquor around that he missed the first time around. I'm sorry for letting my anger take over, unfortunately. Our relationship can no longer. Maybe we'll be acquaintances again. I know you'll take action from this and own up to it. You were always the mature one of the Parage. I wish you the best of luck, Issei says in his head.
The next set of images showed Issei grabbing Volley by the head and slamming it against the ground. The next one showed Volley trying to do something, but Issei uses 10 divides to render him defeated. The next image was Issei kicking Volley again and again before reaching down and snapping his neck to kill him. The next one showed Issei entering the Juggernaut Drive, grabbing the carcass of Volley and starting to fly. Next one was Issei in front of his house, throwing the carcass through the door and launching through hundreds of attacks, destroying the house with everyone inside of it. Hmm... Am I always meant to destroy, a being of destruction, feeling empty inside and feeling only hate, anger, and rage? I will admit, Volley had it coming. Seems like I won, but it seems like this is the darkness in me that I must face. Very well, then. I will take that darkness, Issei says. The images ended, and Issei's expression changed, but not one with of sadness, fear, or even anger. He had a smile, not from seeing all of the images. Well, it seemed that he had no remorse for what he did in the images, but he was actually looking forward to the challenge ahead. Issei continued walking with nothing else to see. He continued on until he reached the end of the corridor. Now in front of him was an immense staircase of gray and black color. Oh. I'm getting to the end, Issei says, the smile at the still present. It's time to end this. Now in the depths of the inner world. <laughs> Laughing uncontrollably, I did not expect that, while smiling manically compared to Issei, who was anticipating the challenge. It seems that this test was not as difficult at all. Looking towards a corner of the room, isn't that right, Issei? Chico said, speaking almost teasingly. Some parts of it were funny, I won't deny that, still calm and smiling. And what were you looking for today, Issei, Jiko says. You know what I've come for, dropping his smile to a smirk and spreading out his aura that was itching to kill and burning with a silent fury. Oh, it seems that the image has awakened something in you, Jiko says. I wonder what it will be, putting a finger on his chin. Hmm, it did not wake up. It has always been a parvisus, a malice-valevolent instinct, an instinct to kill, a great evil. Is it not true, Jiko says? <laughs> I don't know what idiocy of great evil that you're talking about, but I will own it, Issei says, still smiling. You don't see it. This test was to see a reaction to your own evil, Chico says. Yeah, I realize, but someone who had very childish and wise told me to be as I am. So if I got some evil inside me, it does not affect me, because I know who I am, and this will not change, Issei says. <laughs> You know, if this was a shonen based on your actions in those images, you would be branded the villain, Jiko says. <laughs> so, I was branded a pervert for almost all my life. To be branded as a villain would be no different, Issei says. Wow, it seems that this test helped you understand yourself better. Not bad, Jiko says. Yeah, could you stop with the games? Unleash his killer insect towards Juko. So tell me what I have to do to get my ability, Issei says. Okay, guys, I'll hand her this, Jiko says, informing the clones who dissipated out of existence. And you show to be prepared, approaching Issei. To get skill, I could just tell you, since the answer was following you. However, you have the blood and flesh of great lead, so the rules change, smiling like a kid in a candy store. And, Issei says, a bit confused about the rules change. Easy. Getting closer to Issei and putting his finger on Issei's forehead, you have to prove to me that you deserve it, applying strength on his finger and seeing Issei flying back into the wall. Ugh! Damn! Not only for damage, but remembering when Volley did the same thing of placing his finger on Issei's forehead when they first met face to face. Tuh. What would have happened? Yeah, not again. I'm taking what's mine. I gotta destroy whatever obstacle to do it, Issei says, getting up from the wall, moving towards Jiko. Huh, this'll be fun, Jiko says, smiling like a psychopath. Hmm, you versus me, with his eyes glowing amber. Bingo, Jiko says as he ran towards Issei. Jiko appeared in front of Issei and threw a strike towards Issei's face, who barely put up his arms to deflect some of the blow, but still flew back because of the force. Before Issei could crash into the wall again, Jiko appeared from above and gave him a hammer blow, sending him into the crashing into the ground. Here, there is no boosted gear, but I can use the skills you the power of Great Red from the flesh that he bestowed upon you, Chico says. I see, smiling at the prospect of the challenge, so it makes sense those images were dreams of destruction that he conjured up. Hmm, and if he can use the power, I'll just have to use my own besides this in my inner world. As his fist gained a slight amber glow around them, though he didn't notice. Issa got up from the ground and... Flash to appear beside Jiko, who was a bit surprised. He said and threw a wild blow with his hand with his fist towards 
Jiko's head, who was participating in the block it. However, he saved one chance and hit Jiko in the stomach, sending him crashing into the ceiling. Damn, he doesn't know he subconsciously used it, Jiko said, grimacing at the burns at his stomach that he didn't seem to heal as he began to fall from the ceiling. Easy put his in his leg, put strength in his legs, developing a similar amber glow, and jumped towards the falling Jiko and gave him an axe kick that Jiko took the brunt of and blow with his left his shoulder and sent him crashing to the ground. Jigo grimes to Epic once again, crashing twice. He quickly got up and caught Issei's right hand in his left, giving a slight wince from the pain of using a left shoulder so quickly. Luckily, the glow wasn't Issei's fist. It was still on his legs, leaving scorch marks where he stood. Ha! Huh, you won't hit me again, Jiko says with a smile, trying not to laugh off the pain. And who decided that? Issei says, hitting Jiko in the stomach again, but with his left fist. Jiko flew back into the walls, grimacing once again at the pain in his stomach, knowing it was becoming a weak point for him. He was not able to get up fast enough as Issei took him and threw him in the air. Shit, he's learning, Jiko said, seeing as now he's in the air, he was effectively defenseless as he received a kick to the chest, throwing back into the ground. Issei took a few seconds to catch his breath, but seeing Jiko get up again, he ran towards him, trying not to leave Jiko any breathing room. For old time's sake, remembering his partner, BOOST! Issei's speed increased as he arrived in front of Jiko, transferring that amber aura to his fist. Jiko decided to counter with crimson aura to his fist, and both fists collided with each other, generating a huge gust of wind from the collision. Jiko took advantage of Issei's distraction from the collision and gave him a knee to the stomach, causing him to kneel over and then hitting a blow to his back, Issei's head, sending him to the ground. Jiko then looked to stop Issei's leg while he was on the ground. Issei shifted his body to prevent a stomp and kicked Jiko in the face. Unfortunately for Jiko, that leg had a smaller aura around it, causing small birds to the left side of his face, causing him to jump backwards, taking the distance from Issei, who quickly got up to prepare for another attack. Hey Issei, don't you want to fight me with any other than fist, Jiko says, like what? Being cautious in case of another attack. Hmm, I don't know, but I will use this, Jiko says, putting his hand on the ground and drawing a sword. Oh well, I will just use this. The aura seemed to form spiked brass knuckles. How boring. Why don't you use something else, Jiko says. Nah, I'm good with a smirk. Since he's like me, then his sword skills will be similar to mine. But I will have to get better with a sword, Issei says. Big words for a brat, Jiko says. Issei began to jump towards Jiko, who prepared with his sword as Issei's aura's brass knuckles in the sword. Jiko jumped back from the strike and went for another head slash. Issei blocked the sword strike with his aura and knuckles on his left hand, who swung away with his right to the trail of Jiko, who quickly retreated and jumped back to avoid the hit. Jiko quickly glanced at the sword and saw how there was two burn marks of Issei who made contact with the sword. So he can destroy metal as well, huh? And by sheer contact, you definitely will leave a wake of complete destruction. Looking back at Issei, who was smiling and ran towards Jiko, who prepared to swing, which Issei dove through the handstand and went in for a kick, which Jiko was initially dodged the leg, but as the leg passed by his face, he used a backhand slash with the sword to give Issei left calf a cut. Issei winced at the cut and spun on his hands and jumped back, landing on his feet with another wince due to the cut of at his back of his leg. Both looked at each other before charging in. Jiko went for another slash at Issei's head, who crashed down to avoid the swing and got into a position where he could land a hit to Jiko's rib with his right hand, but when connecting the blow, Jiko reversed the grip of his sword and then slashed upward, giving Issei a cut from Issei's left hip to his right shoulder. Jiko felt the blow to his ribs and began to bleed from his mouth. Both backed away from each other at once as one had a cut on his chest and leg while the other had slight burns on his left of the side of his face his left hand had hand had slight burns but he had a major burn underneath his arm with a wound that he had centralized from the heat of an aura knuckles Issei taking advantages of the damage then enduring his pain in his leg and chest charged forward with the intent to end this fight with the aura from his right hand to his left to enforce it Jiko saw this and quickly crossed the sword in front of his chest surrounded it with crimson energy as Issei's fist struck the blade there was shattering sound as both weapons broke the opponents fell to the ground Jiko from the force of the blow and Issei from his momentum. Issei on the ground taking deep breaths. Damn it! Upset with the outcome. <laughs> you did well, Jiko says. Then do I deserve my ability now? Annoyed as he turned towards Jiko. Oh, that's right. Here, Jiko says, putting his finger from his burned left hand on Issei's forehead. In doing so, Issei felt a rush of information come to him. Whoa, shocked by what he could do and the power he possessed. It's incredible, isn't it? Jiko says, looking back at the ceiling as both are still laying on the ground. Yeah. 
but I can't let it consume me, he says. <laughs> You'll be fine. Just surround yourself with the right people and use it for the right reasons. You'll be all right. Well, it's time for you to go, touching Issei's forehead again, causing him to be to disappear. Goodbye, Issei says. Not a chica. Yeah, goodbye. With a small smile on his face as he looked towards the ceiling again. Yeah, you'll be alright. And closing his eyes to rest from the battle. Now, back to the real world at Angel's Falls. Issei opened his eyes and slowly registered his surroundings. He was back to the falls. And how did you do? Drake said. I think it's better to show you. Getting up from a spot after feeling the ghost scar that he cut he received from Chico in his head their fight, he walked towards the tree and put his hand on it and heard a whisper in his mind that told him to say the following while focusing on the inside of the tree. Tamatsuru, Issei says. Out of nowhere, the tree combusted in flames for a few seconds, but the flames died down. But the tree did not look like it was burned, but it did look shriveled, as it looked like a dead tree, not a burnt tree. What the? Drake says he stopped speaking as he noticed Issei fall to the ground spitting blood. Are you an idiot? What do you think you're doing using your ability in your state? Drake says. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my body is weaker than it was in my inner world. But you want me to explain it to you, trying to change the subject, but notice that his skin looks slightly less pale. Very well, explain, Drake says. My ability is called desolation. I can burn away one's vitality and spiritually wait and take it for myself. But offensively, he placed his hand and back to a dead tree. Tamatsu. The tree combusted again, but when the flames dissipated, there was nothing left but ashes, which flew off in the- Hmm. It's incredible. Depending on how you use it, Drake said, thoughtful on the ability. But that's not all. We would collect some twigs and he dried leaves and placed them in a small pie. Now rather his whole hand, he pointed a finger at the pile and concentrated the power of desolation. Tamatsu. The pile slowly lit on fire, burning the small pile of twigs and leaves. Issei quickly went to the lake and cuffed his hands in water and got back to the pile before it became splashed in. However, the fire remained burning. What? Water is meant to extinguish fire, so there's more to this ability, huh? Drake says. Yeah, with the fire coated the door of desolation, it destroys what comes against it. As the fire turned a pile of ashes, Issei concentrated on the aura to remove it from the fire and stamped out to the flames. Impressive. I'm sure you realized it, but your power is similar to that of one you call your mother. But it seems like you can take it to new heights. Seems like she was a good influence on you, Drake said. <laughs> You're right. Before he sat down a bit tired. Before we leave, how about you recover a little, Drake says. Yeah, seems like a good idea, Issa replies, lacking, lying back to Aziza's body. One hour later, in the cave of Belzard. In the cave, a magic circle appeared which tired Issa came out. Damn, an hour has already passed and I have not recovered. That's easy to explain. You never use this ability, so you do not know how to adjust to it, Drake says. How long did it take you to use your ability at full power? Issa says, staring into the, of the cave. Hmm... It was about three to four years, Drake says, remembering his own training. Well, entering the first dome of the cave, which was the treasure room. I don't think I got that amount of time, Issei says. I would agree, considering that you have other aspects you wish to train to continue the ritual, Drake says. It will be better to get it over with. A little scared but determined, Issei says. Well, go to the golden chalice with the mixer, Drake says. Issei went for the chalice, but when he saw it, the mixture was not white and had a texture that was similar to chalk. Now go to the room where you got the flower, Drake says. Issei walked among the treasures with the chalice, and he entered through the door when he saw the oasis inside. Oasis inside. He felt the magic around the place, remembering the time was slower than in the outside world. But he noticed something different. There was now a gigantic stone door past the flowers. Was this here before, Issei says, not remembering it, when he was searching for the flowers. This was my place to sleep. You could call it my old room. It was hidden for me by Beelzard, as the others would not to scare where I lived, Drake said. So he brought it here. I mean, you are the Welch Dragon, so you would be more associated with Wales. We are in France, Issei said. You would be correct. It took some time, space magic, to bring it here. After he established this cave, so the others would be looking in Wales for my cave. But it's actually here, Drake said. Smart, so what now? Issa replied, looking at the chalice. 
Well, you have to take out a little of the mixture to be able to draw the circle. As Issei entered the room through the stone door as Drake's old room, Issei felt a finger with chalk mixture and then broke it into several pieces. And what is the circle? Issei said, taking out a piece of chalk. It will appear in your mind, Drake says, speaking now into his partner's mind. Hmm, concentrating until an image appeared. What is this, Drake? You think I can write this? Incredulous about the magic circle that he would have to draw. Calm down, I'll help you, as he proceeds to instruct Issei about where to start. Alright, here we go, Issei says, listening to Drake's instructions. 90 minutes later, Issei wiped a sweat while lying on the floor. 90 minutes of crouching and turning back and forth made him even more tired than he was before. Well, at least it's finished, Drake said, seeing the finished product of the magic circle that was drawn. This thing was the torture to do, so am I missing anything, Issei said. No, you have to enter but put the heart in the center and apply of your power for it to be able to start. His tone changed to a very serious tone. But Issei, this one is not compared to anything you experienced. Best thing to compare it would be from where you were from Samuel's poison. Shit, it's going to be extremely painful, huh? Issei said, looking at the roof of the cave. Very much. I am afraid. Confirming Issei's suspicion, this process will first stabilize your energy and then begin to give you immense pain. Then you will feel your soul break away from your body, and each cell is twisted by pain. Then you will take out your feelings one by one, and in the end it will be much more worse because you have to disconnect the power of Orphis and then take it out from your core. This is not a game, because once you enter you will never be the same, Drake says. You think I'll change, nervously looking at the single? Issei says, No, I don't know. The only one who decides that is you. The answer you want is your in your validation, not mine, Drake says. I guess that's true. Taking out his heart and gem and starting to walk towards the circle. Well, the moment of truth, let's do this. Entering the circle, almost reaching the center. No matter what happens, I'm here, Drake says. Thank you. It's time, Issei replies, putting his heart in the gem in the center. Good luck, Drake replies, proud of his friend and bearer for nervous of what's about to happen. Issei sighed. Only thing that was missing was to start the process was applying his power. He was afraid that he could not hide it, but he gritted his teeth and then smiled for the reason why he was doing this, that he was prepared for this test and coated himself with power, which the circle absorbed and began the greatest of hells for Issei. When the power was absorbed, each line of blood, white blood, became red with some particles of black and amber, and out of nowhere, the hard gem rose in the air. So did Issei, but only a few inches from the ground. The outer circle began to glow and became a lit of flame. Every second, Issei felt that worse was coming out of the outer circle and started to spin, increasing its speed. Each of the eight small magic circles began to activate one by one. An inner circle, it lit a flame, began to rotate. The only thing that was missing was the diagram that looked like a star, which began to glow. Issei saw that the points of each star had red and amber particles that came to turn into something with needles. Then the star twitched. At that moment, the needles went and pierced Issei. Ah! Issei screamed in immense pain that came to him. When he pierced through his legs, arms, torso, chest, neck, and head, the star moved a few centimeters away. At that moment, the pain went through Issei. It was all of his bones were breaking, but also disintegrating, and then repairing itself. And repeating the process over and over again, he tried to scream, but his throat could not make a noise because another needle had pierced it. The star moved again. Even with the immense pain in his body, he felt as if his skin was burned with lava. As the needles entered his body, after that, he felt like his legs exploded. Then his arms, then his chest, his brain is breaking part. He felt his consciousness could not go on, but he could never leave, nor did have the will to pass out as the pain continued. From a small circle came a bolt of lightning that pierced Issei, then a spear of darkness, another spear of light, a sword, blades of different elements came through and each blow broke Issei's body or that what he felt. Nothing but pain ran through his veins. It was as if acid entered his veins. He tried to twist and every vein in his body was murdered. He tried to scream but he couldn't. And then came the muscles, the blood, every part of it was torture on his body as he felt like dying, his mind was broken, his spirit broken, every muscle was broken, every blood too, his veins hurt like hell, his blood burned like lava, but then came the pain from his tendons and brain. Ah! The scream was a respiration of how his soul broke, his sense disappeared, his body died, he wanted it to end, but there was still a long way to go, and he... 
When he thought it was the end, a giant needle pierced his chest where his heart was. The needle connected with the heart gem. He say vomited a large amount of blood. His eyes cried. His ears dripped blood. His fingernails bled as well. But under all of that came the extraction of his feelings. Ugh! Issei screamed when he felt how his soul was broken. His feelings came out. Rather, they felt like they were torn by a hot iron. His body trembled. His soul twisted. His feelings were disappearing, but one that disappeared hurt more, one by one. The pain was indescribable. Issei no longer screamed because he couldn't. His throat was ruptured. His body didn't respond to him, but it hurt. Everything hurt. That was the only thought that was in Issei's already fragile mind. His own personality was no longer there. He felt alone, feeling the pain that no one could else could feel. His eyes lost their light. His skin lost color. Lights of many colors passed through the needle that was through his heart. Red, light, purple, yellow, white, silver, gold, orange, blue, black, brown, purple, dark yellow, blue ones with pink slashes. Most colors turned gray and disappeared. A few became faded and one stayed lit and the rest returned to Issei's heart. Issei fell out of the needle and his heart receded, but out of nowhere, one of his biggest entire chest tore through him and his mind, spirit, personality disappeared. Now, somewhere in the boosted gear, Issei's eyes slowly opened. They are no longer half traced of life. They were even worse than ones than he had before, but this time, they were like an abyss, showing nothing, no feelings, just nothing. He slowly raised his eyes and looked forward as he noticed he was in some type of white room. It was where he spoke into his former bearers, but this was not a bearer, but a person just like him. Him. Look at that, Chico says, walking towards Issei so empty. I must say this was too much. Tell me, can you talk? No response. Should have expected that. It's normal after going through that pain. Look now, you will go to Treg, but first, I will have to explain what happened. His tone was serious, but did not receive an answer from Issei, who only saw him with that dead look. Well, as Drake told you, the boosted gear will reset to assimilate and normally the dragon will be sealed with it but i am a part of you but at the same time i am not and knowing or rather seeing you in this state leaving you alone would be the worst thing i could do so i will do the one and who will go with you so i will be the one who will be the one to go he still did not receive if you wonder how i do this easy this the requirement is someone that is attached to the boosted gear. It is necessary that it should be Trey, but I am also attached. Also, I am part of your feelings or like a backup of your feelings, so I will return them to you. I can't stand this robot look you're giving me. However, your feelings will be reduced because I will take part of them with me, and Dreg knows nothing of this. This is the last time we'll see each other. It's time to awaken the power bestowed upon you by your ancestors. As he began to burn up and be set in flames, he still got no answers. <laughs> Well, it's time to go, Drake. Goodbye, Issei, and control your emotions. As Issei disappeared, he retur He then turned to a being that was made of fire, that had the shape of a dragon but was bigger than Drake, but with phoenix wings. He could have fallen to the hate and used your power of desolation to destroy all, but didn't. He seemed to analyze the portrayals around him as well. Looks like he had a better understanding of things. I don't know about forgiveness, but I do know he won't use your power in an ill matter. I can see why you were passed on to him. Hey, Raiju Kinjaka, as Jiko burned away completely. Now with Issei. Issei reappeared sitting in the void. And in front of him was a red dragon. Partner, Drake says, trying to call to his attention. Issei saw him but said nothing. Shit. He reached out and grabbed Issei within his claws and nudged, gently nudged him. Issei, Issei, partner, come on, respond, Drake says, worried about the only thing that he received was a dead look. No, it can't be. Tears begin to form his hive. I knew this could happen. But no, I... Thought breaking down as beginning to cry. He seemingly continued to stare without speech or expressing trait of life. Don't worry, the ritual's already finished, Drake says, wiping his tears and embracing Issei as he could, seeing as how he was a dragon. Just hold on. A little you'll be back to normal, separating from Issei. Still receiving the answer, Drake sat down and prepared to do what he had to do. I, Drake Oaks, the Red Dragon Emperor, the one who took the principles of domination from the biblical god. The one who took the principles of domination from the biblical god. A spear of color between a red and green became out of nowhere in Drake's chest. I, the one that gods fear, I give everything to my carrier, my blood, my power, my ability, my principles, everything. As the spear fully came out of his body, his body was slowly disappearing. Drake grabbed the spear and slowly approached Issei each step, his body disappearing the closer he got. When he arrived at Issei, he just crouched down and spoke. 
This, raising the sphere as emphasis, I do not give my bearer nor my friend, his whole body almost disappearing, but to my brother, to the one who does not treat me as a weapon but as family. You are deserving of this, Issei. In order to continue living, I give you this, Drake says as he began to insert the sphere into Issei, and Len embraced him. Issei didn't speak, but tears did fall from his eyes. Thank you for everything. Little brother, but it's about time, isn't it? Drake says, turning into an emerald colored esper. Issei saw how the cracks opened on the floor, and chains came through those cracks and caught Drake. Well, we won't see each other for a while, at least until you have trained to unlock the boosted gear again, Drake says. Issei begins to disappear from the void, watching as Drake was being dragged by the chains to the ground, <laughs> appearing in a form of equal to Drake and grabbing him and then throwing him towards Issei and entering his body. It will be better that you live and help him train and mature, as the chains took Jiko and began to drag him instead. <coughs> What? Drake says. He was in shock after happening seeing another Issei. Take care of him because I can't. After all, a pervert can't help another. <laughs> Smiling before the consumed by the crack, Jiko is. And throughout the space, there was a crack sound, and Issei gained some sense of meaning. Outside in the cave, Issei came back to himself. As something came out of his body, he slowly fell to the ground while his heart gem began to break. Now, in the Hyoto mansion, crack. Rias felt a major pain in her chest, falling over. Crack. Akino felt the same. Crack, crack. Each of the girls felt pain in their hearts. The pain did not differ amongst them as they passed throughout the pain, but they were the ones that greatly affected, being in their own rooms. One would just assume they fell asleep as the girls would not know they lost something as they never never get back. Now, with Issei. Issei was on the ground, sousing them from the corner of his eye, and he looked over where there were nine pond pieces. Eight were opaque, red, and one was blue with black spots. He then heard a cracking sound and looked towards them again and the gem was broken little by little. The pieces fell into the ground. Issei looked at the pieces as memories. With them, lost color. Others faded, but were not as dull, but had a little more feeling or value to them. One of pieces' gem disappeared and almost made if not all of the feelings, them in Issei's heart also fade away. Issei just watched the pieces disappear little by little, like whispers in the end. He felt like going to sleep, but he wanted to urgently know something. J Drake, are you still there? Issei said, tired from the ordeal and worried. Yes. Something came and substituted for me, Drake says, still weak as he felt his power core merge with something else when he re-entered Issei. Ooh, well, let's take a break. Issei says, closing his eyes and falling asleep. And that is the end of chapter 16. Chapter 17. Human World, the Hyoto House, now in the room of Azia. It was very early. The sun filtered through a small opening in the room. The owner of the room was still asleep, but it seemed that she was not dreaming of something very good. Because she moved from one side to another, she gasped. It seemed like she had a horrible nightmare. Now, in the dream of Azia. Everything was dark. There was no place that was covered with the darkness. Ozzy was in the middle of that darkness. She had her eyes open, staying alert in case something happened, but nothing happened. Suddenly, a guard came down from out of nowhere, hands, and then covered her mouth and dragged her back. She tried to fight and scream, but his hand prevented her from making much noise, and he was too strong for her. She tries to use her demonic powers, but nothing comes out. Not her sacred gear, not Fafnir, just nothing. She then realized that she was in what looked like an alley. Everything was covered in darkness, despite her being a demon. She could not see anything. In the air, she could feel the charismatic smell. The smell of rain. Azia stopped caring about the environment as she felt a breath on the back of her neck that scared her. Her body did not react, neither did her powers. Another band appeared, but this was not on her mouth, but her chest. This head began to touch one of her breasts, as a male voice that sounded like a doll in his 30s to 40s was behind her. Now, starts looking at his cheek. Look what we have here, a nice lady. You have to take advantage and play with her, right, guys? As the man behind her increased the speed of his hand and was fondling her breast. Ozzy's whole body trembled when she felt the tug of the man, but what caught her attention was the most of the word play. She knew its meaning, so with all of her strength, she tried to do something. Of course, her first instinct was to use her powers again. Forgetting that it didn't work the first time, once again, nothing happened. Just nothing at all. Nothing worked. So she started to struggle again, hoping to break free, but her efforts began to fade as she heard steps that caught her attention in another voice that didn't sound friendly. 
don't struggle. You're going to enjoy it. <laughs> it's done for a long time, so today I'm going to have fun, another voice said. But unlike the other two, this voice seems so much younger. He sounded to be around 20 to 25. You have to do it quickly. Before the girl's armor knights come and the second guy's come forward and grabs Ozzy's by her chin, making her look at him. But his features remain unclear. Tell me, do you have a knight? He leans closer to her face. The first guy who was holding her loosened his hand to her mouth. Tell me, the second guy asked in a sadistic tone. Fear took over Ozzy as her tears began to flow and a great impotence began to corrode her. As fear and the naked feelings there formed the gaze of a man. She could not say a word. Oh, smiling as if he knew the answer. It seems not that you have to fun. Well, the guy behind her took her hand from her, and the guy in front of her kissed her. Asya, feeling the man's disgusting lips, tried to get away, but then she felt how the man ripped off her shirt. It was then that Asya broke away from the man holding her, tried to scream, but was tackled by the man that was kissing her. Landing her on the front, she was forcefully turned around to face the man. Seriously, after what you did, you should be grateful that someone would want to have fun with this body of yours. As he pinned her down, but I'll put a treacherous would which like you in her place. Ozia then received a slap from the man with incredible strength and force of the slap he put her into. Ozia then woke up from her dream. Now in the real world. No, no, no! Screaming, jolting up from the bed. Ozia looked back and forth, frightened. She saw that she was the only one inside her room, but the fear did not go away. She was afraid and without moving from the bed, she scanned every centimeter of her room that she could see, since it was dark out, but being a demon gave her the ability to see in the dark. But the contrary to what expected, nothing happened. Everything was kept silent. A silence that instead of calming her, made her alert and scared more. Calm down grabbing her hand. Calm down. It was a dream. Just a dream. Tears began to come out of her eyes. A horrible dream. She started crying into a nightmare. Her crying increased. Nothing is real. Nothing is real. Nothing. She continued to cry. Quiet. It's okay. You're safe. I'm safe. There is no one that can hurt you. Nothing. But something told her that was a lie too. No. It was real. No. That was, was real. Sobbing once again as her fate has been sealed. Sometimes a small... Uh, sometimes dreams are a small glimpse into the future. Ozzy has stayed in her bed for a long time, trying to calm down. Now, a while later, Ozzy had calmed down enough not to cry, but part of her still had a great fear to so try to calm down. She tries to call to Sanji, or at least talk to someone, but... To her bad luck, no one answered. She remembered that she had not spoken to Sanji since Friday. Today was already Sunday. So basically, no, the past ten chapters have happened in the span of two days. Friday was when Issei entered the prank, or, or endured the pink, beat up his former perverts, former parents, and Sanji, and held the meeting Saturday was all of the chapter 16, the rituals, and gaining his ability, there were time skips to progress the story along with a little quicker, just FYI. Ozzy was confused because Sanji had not contacted her in two weeks ago. He contacted her in the afternoons after school. Ozzy left with many feelings among them with doubt, so she would try to relax. She decided to go for a bath. Ozzy came out with a shirt that covered a large part of her body and went to the bathroom. The corridor was silent. There was was no one. That was strange, because usually Rias, Akino, and Ravel should have been awake, but Ozzy decided to downplay it. Wandering the bathroom, she looked in the mirror. Her reflection seemed normal, but for a second, the reflection seemed her cr crying with some bruises from her skin, especially one of her left cheek, and her hair was tangled with a smiling shadow standing behind her. Ah! Letting out a scream, seeing that reflection and taking a few steps back. But when she looked in the mirror again, there was nothing. It was only her. Suddenly, Azia felt someone put their hand on her shoulder, and she turned around quickly only to see Konako. However, she had some big dark circles under her eyes. Azia senpai is there something happening? Konako said in her monotones, but this time, she seemed very tired. No, Konako-chan, I'm fine, but you? Are you okay? Asya said, worried for her kohai. Yeah, I only couldn't sleep well. Tired from the lack of sleep, Konako said. And why is that? Confused, but thinking, did she have certainly dream as me? Nothing in particular. But for the past two days, my appetite is not the best. Seeming calm, but on the inside, I feel afraid to use my neck amount of powers again. But why? And this chest pain doesn't either, Konako said. I see, but still thinking, I guess that's true. But I can't get this sickening feeling out of my chest, Asya says. Both took off the little clothes they had and went to the bath. Now, 20 minutes later. Both sat quietly in the bathtub and no one said any words. Their body relaxed, but in silence they began to hear some noises from the door. Eh? What is that? Azia said in a low tone, as to not be discovered by whatever was outside. She noticed that the sounds were coming closer to the door. Konako, Azia said, turning towards her, only to find her dozed off. She's asleep. I guess she didn't really sleep that well at all. So she moved to awaken her at Koko chan Wake up! Eh? I'm already awake, Konako said as she rubbed her eyes. 
It seems that something is happening in the hallway, Atia said, looking at the door. Let me see. Feeling a sense of dread as she used her yokai traits, but overcame it as she listened outside. Hmm, it's only Byuchu Senpai and Akino Senpai, Nanako said. Eh? Huh? Are they arguing? Azia said. No, they were just talking about volley and their talk escalated quickly, Konako said. I see, I see, Azia said, but I don't really come to think of it, volley son hasn't come by either. She turned to Konako. It would be better to leave. I'm already getting hungry. If she came out of the water. I'm also hungry, Konako said, coming out of the water. Both came out of the tub and dried up into the door to the bathroom, opened, and the front of them was Ria Sanakano talking. He said that? Oh... Seeing Azia and Konako, good morning, her frown turning to a smile. Hmm, all right, good morning, her tone becoming happy to see the Kohai. Azia slash Konako at the same time, good morning, returning the greeting in unison. And why are you up so early, Ria said. Eh, what time is it, Azia replied. It's 5.58 in the morning, Ria said, looking at a clock that was on the wall. Guess it is early. Konako said back in her normal tone. That's true. Usually you wake up on Sundays at 6.30. It seems today you got up early, Akino said with a smile. I'm going to get dressed, Konako said, preparing to leave. Me too, Ozzy replied, following Konako and leaving as well. Ozzy was approaching her room, but saw Ravel come out of her room. Oh, hello, Ozzy's son. Good morning. Her tone was also tired. Hello, Ravel Chun. Why are you so tired? Ozzy said, confused as usually Ravel wakes up early and never seems to be so tired. <sighs> Yesterday I tried to communicate with my mother, but she didn't answer me. She ended up answering at dawn, so I will go to the underworld next weekend to see if something happened, Ravel said. Why did she answer you so late, Ozzy replied, confused and had a worried feeling. It seems that she was very busy, or at least that's what she said, finally able to see Ozzy clearly and realize that she's in the towel. Oh, sorry. You're going to your room, Ravel says, feeling embarrassed for interrupting Azia. Oh, don't worry. Besides, there's nothing better than a bath in the morning. It makes you feel relaxed, Azia said, trying to deduce Ravel from any negative feelings and being cheerful. No thanks. I'll take a shower. I have to be quick, Ravel said. Okay, bye, Azia replied. Azia closed the door to her room and sat in her bed, because something seemed strange today, as if she may not see Ravel for a while, but after much tonight, she came to the conclusion that it was nothing and just clan issues, Azia thought in her own head. Six hours later, Underworld, the Leviathan Mansion. In the mansion, the four mouths were in the office of the owner of the mansion. In the office, there were four large sofas in the center, a table with tea, food, each Mao was on the sofa except Seraphal who was in her wheelchair. Still nothing. It's already twelve, Sir Zek said, worried and suppressing a yawn. Seraphal sat in silence and very uncharacteristic for those that didn't truly know the Matt Leviathan. Her eyes closed as she remained in thought. Stay calm, Sir Zek. I'm sure he's fine, though he wouldn't be the one to be worried about. His tone was serious while taking a sip of his tea and stealing a glance at the Leviathan, Najuka says. Seraphal said nothing. She looked like she was asleep by how deep in thought she was, but she knew she could hear them. Falbum, on the other hand, was indeed asleep on the couch. Yes, I know he is fine, but I cannot help but worry, Serzak said, serious, and turning his gaze to the ceiling. Grafia starts. Serzak Sama, calling his attention to give him a cup of tea. Thank you, Serzak replied. Ajuka and Serzak, there are still many things to do. What steps have you done? Taking another sip of tea, Ajuka finishes. I already communicated with the Olympians, the Hindus, the Asgards, and the Egyptians that there will be an important meeting within a few weeks, Sir Zex says. And I have taken care of informing Yakuza of the meeting, Grafia replied. Well, I have told Serika, Latita, Iruka, Sara, Oregon, Riser about the meeting, Ajuka says. I will inform Sotan about the meeting, making her presence known, but keeping her eyes still shut, Seraphal says. Well, I expected Siravika to accept the meeting. I am surprised about Latia and Ryuka, though I am not sure if Cyrorg or Riser will remain cool-headed, Sir Zex says. Cyrorg only wants to challenge Rias again, and show her how inferior she is without Issei, Ajuka says. That was to be expected, but I recommend that he waits until after the meeting to set the challenge and let the Alliance decide their punishment first, Grafia says, filling up the cup for Sir Zex. I agree. Though we may not use the challenge as a cover-up... I agree. Though we may use the challenge as a cover-up, I'll have to see what the other factions think about Riser. Wants to keep as far away from Rias. It seems that he hates her so much that he does not want to even tell them anything, Sir Zek says. It's to be expected. While well, he would want to kill her for what she did to his self-proclaimed rival, and it seems that the Phoenix Clan will be he handling an issue, as I have informed that Ravel will be visiting the next weekend, Ajuka says. I'm sure they can handle it and provide a suitable punishment. Until the meeting, which reminds me, Sirikivisan, 
Latia Sun and Aruka Sun are unaware of what happened to Issei. When they do, I know that Sarika Sen will be upset, as she has a good friendship with Issei. I'm not sure how Lucida Sen and Ryuka Sun will feel, Grafia says. That is true, but I see Sarika to keep her emotions in check, but that will be for the future, Sir Zek says. Moving on, nothing new yet, Ajuka replies, deciding to change the topics. No, nothing. No one knows where his body went, nor if he's still alive, Sir Zek says. The best thing is to find him if he is alive. I don't think he can do much, but we have to be cautious, Ajuka says, taking a sip of his tea. Yes, I don't think we can do much more of that. We have to know what happened, Sir Zek says. Ajuka looked at the silent Seraphal, who seemed to be waiting for something, and she sat at her desk. So Zex, are you sure that Issei will send them here? Ajuka says. Yes, I'm sure. Drinking some of his tea as well. After a sparring, after sparing a glance at the silent Mao at her desk, despite being in a wheelchair, which she sat as if it were her throne, that Mao sat at her desk, switching from having her arms crossed to leaning towards the desk. Her elbows rested on the desk surface, popping up her arms and resting her head on the intra crossed hands. She was now wearing a sleeveless dark purple dress that had to slip up her right leg. The dress had the sea tree emblem and the light pink color all over the dress and hem of the dress that had cotton fluff on it. Sarah Chun, are you sure you gave him the right coordinates? Sajuka says. Of course I did. I am not one to lie like Sir Zex's sister. Sorry if I have offended you, Sir Zex, opening her eyes and turning the aforementioned. It's not a problem, Sir Zex says, as the two men sweated a little, hoping not to feel the Leviathan's wrath. The three other people in the room, not counting Falboom, who was still sleeping, figured that she would be worried the most out of all of them. She is handling this better than I expected, but looking over to the side of the desk to see some candy wrappers that's not healthy, with a small and a drop of sweat at the Leviathan's eating happens. Sarah John, you seem calm about this situation, Ajuka says. That's true, Reserve Sex replied. Hmm, did you not expect me? Did you expect me to throw a childish tantrum, Seraphal says, as she began to expel her aura. They are so stupid that they didn't know to her potential sugar rush from the candy wrappers, Grafia said. Well, Seraphal said, releasing more of her order and dropping to the room temperature significantly as they could see their own breaths. Would you like to answer the question? She had a tone of death as she released some murderous instinct as well. No, no, forget it. We said anything, as Juka and Sir Zek said, trembling while Falbium still remained asleep. Sir Zek sama, Juka sama, could you leave me alone with Seraphal sama? Grafia said. Uh, yes, of course, dear. Come, Ajuka. Let's go look for something to eat, Sir Zek says, getting up from the couch and dragging Ajuka. I don't want anything to eat, Ajuka says, snapping out of his stupor to fend off Sir Zek's. Ajuka, if we do not leave, it is possible they will kill us, Sir Zek says, speaking in a low voice, though it didn't matter, since the two women had devil hearing, so they could hear what he said. Well, I am feeling a little famished. Come on, Sir Zek, let's go find something to eat. Good to you, day to you, ladies, Ajuka says, giving a quick bow, and now dragging Sir Zek instead, who was stunned by what happened since he was dragging Sir Juka earlier as the two left the obvious. Fa Gravia said she didn't get to finish when she saw Falbium wasn't there anymore. When did he leave? Gravia said. You shouldn't worry about him. He mostly looked for another place to sleep, watching the only occupant that remained in the room besides her. Gravia couldn't help, but let out a small chuckle in which Stubbysville Seraphal's gaze turned cold. What's so funny, Seraphal said with a dark tone while watching the silver-haired queen. Forgive me. Just makes me laugh to see you in this dilemma, taking a seat in one of the chairs that was in front of Sir Zex's desk. What dilemma? Seraphal says, raising an eyebrow but still keeping her cold look on the woman in front of her. You think I didn't go through the same thing as you, Grafia said with a small smile. Ah, uh, yes, how could I forget, Seraphal said, softening her gaze and toning down her power, which warmed back up a bit. The Devil's Civil War. I know, and I understand you, Grafia says. Do you think you can help me, Seraphal says, leaning back in the wheelchair and placing her arms on the armrest of the chair. I don't think so, but I'm not the best to explain and advise you. Placing a finger on her chin to think. If not you, then who? Seraphal said. Sophita sama would be the best option, Grafia says. My mother? Wait. Was it Valena san that helped you? Since you went through the same thing, was it your mother? I cannot really ask my so called in law for advice. Saying the word in disdain as she remembered what Issei's mother said and didn't in choosing some girls that she only knew for almost a year, in the exception being Irina, since they knew in her and Issei's childhood over her own child. Oh, it was Valena Sama. She was the one who helped me, and technically she would be your mother in law, not Miki Hyoto, Grafia said. 
I see. And that's right, Isekun basically traded off his birth parents like they traded him. Well, it's like the Hyoto's loss. I wouldn't be surprised if she was walking to remove the Hyoto name from Issei, so they can never claim anything from him. Hmm. Hmm. Would I be Seraphal Grammarie or Seraphal Biel? Gravia. Seraphal finished. Already looking for to follow forward to marriage, I see. Well, you may be stronger, but if you hurt him any more than he already has been hurt, I will come for you, Gravia says. No worries. I believe the fallen angel Rainer and Rias has given me enough examples of what not to do. When it comes to Isekun and as for marriage, well, he better have a harem by then, because I would like to feel my legs for the consuming of the marriage. I'd like to feel my legs in the morning after. I am beginning to get a tangle in my legs, so I won't be stuck in this for two months like I originally thought. What a relief. Breathing out of a sigh of relief that she may get her legs back sooner rather than later. <laughs> In time, it will get better, Gravius said, laughing at Sarah Fall's predicament. Breaking out of her serious composure, I suppose we shall wait for Sir Sex and Uchuka Sama to come back with a smile. Gravia says, Oh, that's right. I'll have to apologize to them, Seraphal said, face filming herself at the previous actions. Well, I'm sure they'll apologize first. Yes, you have to apologize, Gravia said, running back to her serious mode. I liked you better when you weren't not so serious, Seraphal said, frowning at Grafia's change in attitude. Just take care of my little brother, Grafia says. Don't worry, I will. And all the women that fall for him, I will make sure they do the same. I don't want to see him like that ever again, Seraphal says. I feel the same, but I do feel better know that he is in good hands this time, Grafia says. You didn't trust Rias, Seraphal says, a bit confused by Grafia's statement. To be honest, I felt her spoiled nature would cause her to make a mistake, and it seems... This was the mistake, Grafia says. Not only that, I expected more from Gabriel, Seraphal says. I have a feeling that it had to do with Irina, since she was an angel, Grafia said. That so-called childhood friend of Issei, Seraphal says? Yes, I think something led astray from her faith, which she convinced Gabriel to do what they did, Grafia said. Hmm, regardless, it all leads back to Riest. Isn't she not... Close with the blue haired knight, Seraphal said. Zenovia Corda, they were partners. She's quite dense, from what I've heard, Gravia said. I think that density just cost her a real man. They also ruined another relationship. Since I know my sister's queen and bishop liked blonde pretty boy, Seraphal said. It seems Otototo is rubbing off you, smirking the nickname that Seraphal gave to Kiba. In more ways than one, Seraphal said, smirking right back at Grafia. I do not need the image in my head, Seraphal Sama. Returning back to serious mode, Grafia said. Seraphal laughed as the two continued to talk about tribal things. Moving away from what Rias had done, but but both women did wonder where the two super devils went. Now, somewhere in the mansion. Mmm, this is good, Sir Zek says, while eating a piece of cake. Mmm, indeed, such an exquisite flavor, Ajuka replies, eating his own piece of cake. The two were in the bakery of the mansion, eating cake and talking amongst themselves without any fear of angry woman coming upon them. In the house of Pyaman clan of the underworld, Father, I have a very interesting rumor. A handsome young man with a pair of red eyes came into the sturdy of his part, Lord Pyman. And what was that, Claus? Lord Pyman says. It seems that Seraphal is no longer a virgin. Looking a bit annoyed, Claus said. That damn girl! First, she did not want to marry you, and then she did something like this? Lord Pyman said, very upset about the actions that were done. So what do we do? Claus said. Looking towards his father. <clears throat> In a while, we go to the Leviathan Mansion to see if it is true. But do you know who she had sex with? Lord Primman said. I'm not entirely sure, but the rumor said that he was a brown-haired man with very pale skin. So he looked like the you sick, and his eyes were very dull, Klaus said. I see. For a minute, I thought it was the hero, the Opi Dragon. But it is not possible. If he were here in the underworld, we would already know. He never goes without any of his harem, Lord Primman says. It's true. He already had the harem that most demons would cry if it was him. I would not mind. She deserves her happiness with a smile on his face, Klaus says. That is true. He is a worthy partner for them out to be with, so I do not understand how Seraphal Sama would have sex with someone. Apart from the childish behavior, the only thing that she has is his body and her status, nothing more. And that she has gone back to who she was in the war, Lord Primman says. Yes, I heard she was dangerous, having elevated her water magic to the ice magic. She was truly a force to be reckoned with. Then she became that childish magical girl. But you're right, her body is incredible, so I will kill the bastard that defiled her, Claus says. Don't worry, son, we will get to the bottom of this. She will be yours, Lord Primman says. Now... In Tanin's territory. 
So what do we do with the plan for now, Fafnir? In his dragon form, but human size eating a golden apple. I don't know. I'll wait for the meeting, I'll see. Maybe temporarily join with the faction. I don't know. While eating his own apple, Fafnir finishes. So are you willing to leave your title, Tanin says. No, none of that. I would only help out, but I don't know which one. He seemed absent-minded, pondering about something, Fafnir is. Hmm, how about the angel faction, Tanin says. Uh, why there, Fafnir replied. I'm sure they'll need to get an inside loss of Gabriel. The news that the Dragon King joins is up to them. It would help beneficial to Michael, Tanin says. And why not the Underworld, Fafnir says. Easy, I'm already here, Tanin says. Well, it's good that I got a backup plan then, Fafnir says, shrugging his shoulders. What did you do, Tanin says, knowing of Fafnir's mischievous side? Nothing. Just hid the downfall Dragon Spear in your gift box, still not caring about what he just said. You did what, Tanin says? He was increasingly about what Fafnir just fed. When we went to her room, after feeling that stench, I knew that she could not be my partner again. So I took the spear as we were leaving. I left a copy so that she would not notice. You put your trust in Issei so I will do the same. He will find me a new partner. Whether he or she is a demon, angel, fallen angel, yokai, valkyrie, god, dragon, or whatever, I trust his judgment. He looked seriously at Tani. I was going to be by his side anyway. If she had not done what she did, I would have by his side. But unlike her, I will stick to my honor and promise, Fafnir said. <laughs> Guess he grew on you, Tanin says. Seeing Fafnir not in response, well, let's hope he's alright, as the two finished their apples in silence. Dreg's Cave, the human world. Darkness was dominated in the cave. That darkness was accompanied by an aroma of silence. With that silence was Issei, who had awakened a few minutes ago, but he didn't move or even make any sound. He was just enjoying that silence, the peace that came to him in these moments. Mm, I feel weird, in a faint tone, Issei says. That sounded like a whisper. He tried to move, but his body did not respond to him. He was injured, but when trying to do something, he felt a strange pain. Ugh, I better stay this way, he says, in a tone of devoid of emotions, as he felt defeated by not being able to move. He gave up on doing something, sank back into the silence, and darkness of the cave in his mind was the only one that was active. Many ideas, questions passed from one place to another, but there was three that were constant. The first was the feeling of immeasurable emptiness that he felt. It was as if in indifference. He did not know that it was empty. The second was his body. He remembered that in the ritual he had been wounded, but he did not feel any wound in his body, but he did feel the dried blood that ran through his whole body from his feet to his head. The third was the boosted gear. He didn't feel it anywhere in your body. Nothing. He tried to sense Drake, but he could not. Rather, neither his presence nor his power and aura. It was as if nothing was there. It made him feel if he were alone again. But all thoughts stopped when he felt a small pulse in his head after a well-known voice. Shit, that... That hurts, Drake said. He sounded weak and tired. It was the voice of Drake, but this was not a normal tone of voice. Despite being in a tired state, it sounded deeper, like a rumble, but he did not think much about it, so he quickly attempted to communicate with Drake. Drake, are you there? Issei said with some worry. When he finished thinking about those words, Issei noticed his tone and transmitted concern, but strangely, he did not feel it. This worried him. If he changed to an emotionless husk... Uh, yes, I am partner. Now, how are you? Drake says. He may sound tired, but there was some worry in his tone. I don't know. My body is acting strange, Issei said. Well, that worked, Drake said, with a little more energy. So it seems, Issei replied. I can hardly stay awake anymore. So you have to be fast. Stretch your left hand, Drake says. But I can't, Issei says. You can. The pain you have is phantom pain from the ritual. Moving a little should be enough for you, Drake says. Issei listened to Drake and tried to move. It was difficult, but not impossible. Little by little, his stiff arm was moving until he stretched it out completely, along with his hand. He began to do the same with his right hand, while taking deep breaths but remembering the pain that was only in his mind, beginning to do the same with the rest of his body, finally turning over his body. So he was lying on his stomach. Damn, I still can't stand, Issei says, annoyed that his body still did not fully cooperate. He dragged himself little by little towards the small fire to set over near the magic circle. When he arrived, he noticed that his suitcase from the academy was open. He looked at it briefly and began to take his note books out and throw them into the fire and in the end ended up throwing his whole suitcase into the flames i'll get a new one when i return if i can use the area where this is faster maybe i can progress my training how much faster is it he says that will save you some time it would three times as fast as the outside world 
So one week is three weeks in there. But it seems we are in luck for once. It has been amplified for five times faster. I also want you to explain what happened during the ritual, Drake says. Well, what happened was, beginning to start to explain, after the explanation from Issei, I see. It must have been very difficult. You have a noble heart. I'm very impressed. You really matured, Drake says. The dragon was becoming sleepy, trying to stay awake. Drake, can you explain what happened to you? Quietly watching as the fire he felt come from from his warth. That can be for later. But first, what you have to do is send the pieces to Seraphal, Drake says. You're right, Issa replied. Issa began to look around him, a small smoke glow that attracted him, and he looked closely to see the pod pieces were located there. Issa crawled towards the pieces, and when he took them, he noticed that there were not eight pod pieces, but nine, and that Rias's pieces were a little different. Drake, what is this? Issa said. That ninth piece is all compressed power of Orphrus, but I don't know what happens to the others. Drake said. Issei began to play with the pieces by looking at them carefully, trying to discover what happened to him in the pieces of Rias. They're plain red, not crimson like, but, but out of nowhere, the information went to his head, making him let out of pieces. Ugh! Feeling a headache, emerges received uh, Partner, what happened? Drake said. Issei remained silent as he processed everything that came to his mind. Not much, just felt like Jiko left me some things. Such as... Drake said, We can worry about that later. I have to look for the book that Odin gave me, Issei says. That will be difficult, because as you can see all of those things that are around here, they are things that you had stored in the boosted gear. They were expelled. Now that the gear is assimilating its new power, maybe the expulsion of the power caused the increase of time to go faster, Drake says. I see. Well, the only thing that I have left is to search. After a short search, here it is. Here she is, Issei says, lifting the heavy book that Odin gave him. What do you need the book for, Drake says, according to the information that Jiko left in my head. At the moment, I do not have enough power to send the magic pieces normally. What I have to do is draw a specific transfer circle which may not consume as much power. But after I send the pieces, it seems that this thing is a great possibility that I may be faint. Well, do it fast, because I don't know how long I can stay awake, Drake says with a very tired stone tone. Okay. As he starts looking for the page that should have the magic transfer circle, after finding it, he quickly began to draw it on the ground with some of the heart of a pencil. After finding it, Alright, I finished, Issei said, but he received no reply. Guess he couldn't stay awake. Well, I'll just have to send them and everything should be good on my end. At least they'll know I survived. He put his hand into the circle to activate, but his body began to shake uncontrollably. Is that... is this fear, Issei says? Issei stopped and sighed and put his hands back into the circle. Not anymore. I don't have to be afraid of anything, Issei says, with the determination and seriousness in his tone, willing himself to activate the magic circle. By pouring what was left of his magical power into the circle, the circle glowed a bit, but out of nowhere it began to blink with a flash. Issei lost consciousness and fainted. However, the pieces has now been transferred. The Mansion Leviathan, and now the Underworld. So now we're in her mansion. In the office, Seraphon and Greyfield were still talking. On the snack table, a transfer circle that was dark red appeared. The circle flickered several times as both women turned their attention to it. From the flickering circle, some objects flew out and some landed in the cup of tea that Seraphon had left on the table, causing it to splash out. What the? Seraphon said, moving her wheelchair towards the table. Seraphon saw me here. Giving her a towel, Seraphal took the towel and cleaned the mess to help Grafia, who sat in the chair and picked up the cup. Well, what was that? Seraphal said. Grafia looked up in the cup in usual stoic expression and turned to a surprise. What is it? Seraphal said, seeing Grafia's expression change. Look, getting up from the chair and walking to Seraphal's position, showing the cup with three pond pieces, two red and one blue. The, they're the pieces, Seraphal said, surprised as well. As well. Yes, I'm going to look for Ajuka and Serzek Sama. I'll be back, leaving the room. Seraphal went to check in the area for other pieces and took around the cup where the two more pieces. A small smile formed her face. It was a smile of happiness, but some had some sadness. I will wait for your return from now on, Seraphal says, my dear, in a melodic tone. At this time, Seraphal heard a noise and saw how Falunin was sitting in front of her. How you know that... I don't, I don't want to know, Seraphal said, continuing her search for the remaining pieces. In some corridor in the mansion, Sir Zex and Ajuka were wandering the halls, taking in the design of how Seraphal decorated her mansion. Who knew Seraphal had a knack for interior design? These paintings are magnificent, 
Sir, 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 Sir says. I agree. She definitely pays tribute to the Leviathan with these sea serpent paintings. I wonder what it would be like if we were on our own side. It's a pity. They are extinct. Remember when he faced Sufume, Tariqa Leviathan, the daughter of the original Leviathan in the Devil Civil War? If she didn't choose her position, honor, and pride over her life, maybe things could have been different for the Leviathan clan. And Juka said, yes. If there are any descendants of the old Mao out there, I hope that they are significantly different from their ancestors. Unfortunately, we've been stuck with nothing but arrogant bastards. Gazing at the painting, marveled by the creatures. Out of nowhere, a door in the hallway opened and Graefia stepped out. She turned the direction and she walked towards them. Sir Zexama, Ajuka-sama, the pieces were sent, Graefia said. That's good. All well that ends well, Ajuka says, continuing to stare at the paintings, both mounds were enhanced by the paintings around them. Ajuka-sama, there is something weird with the pawn pieces. They... She could not finish her sentence as a green blur passed her doors as she came from. Why didn't you say so? We must hurry, Ajuka says. Let's go, dear. Walking past his wife as he got out of the trance as well as put something wrong with the pawn pieces. Right away, Graefia says, following her husband and the green-haired Mao. Mao in the office of Seraphal. The three entered the office, each went to Sarah Falls' desk as she now had all nine pawn pieces in front of her. What happened, Sir Zek says. The pieces arrived by a very unstable magic circle. It was due to the lack of magical power. He said must have lost consciousness after sending them, Sarah Falls said. Hmm, what is so weird about the pieces, Ajuka said. As he said at the pawn pieces at first glance, it didn't look like much. Look for yourself. Gesturing to the pieces in front of her, Ajuka walked closer and took upon one further speculation. He noticed something. Amazing. The pieces changed color. I still feel and see the original demonic power, looking at all the sides of the pawn pieces in his hand. So what is weird thing that happened to them? He pondered a bit before he came up with the hypothesis. What is it, Ajuka? I have a hypothesis of why they changed color, but I have to investigate more thoroughly, Ajuka says. Apart from that, it is not only a weird thing. Look at this blue piece, giving him a blue pawn piece, Grafia says. That is not an evil piece. It is the power that has been compressed from the form of said piece, Ojuka said. The only thing that it could be is the power of Orphis, as he knew that she involved in Issei's betrayal, Sir Zek said. Indeed. She remained serious because of the Dragon of Infinity turned her back on the one that saved her. I'd say... This is a good sign that even Orphus herself would have problems to tranquilate his whereabouts unless Issei is close to his peace, Ajuka says. Mm. But her clone, on the other hand, Seraphal says, leaving the statement open-ended. Yes, based on Is what Issei said is with Great Red. Though she was found of Issei and based on Dragon Instinct, she may become more protective of Issei since Orphus's power is her power. The same would apply to her. Regarding this piece, we should hold on to it, in case she wants it, but I will study it, Ajuka says. Well, this confirms the wellness of Issei, which just leaves us with one thing left. Sir Zek says, you mean those human girls, Seraphal replied. You would be correct. What do we do? We must tell them not to expose the girls, at least until we do something. It could be disastrous for us, which watching Issei's encounter with his birth parents, it is clear that girls lie about Issei's achievements in order to gain their trust. It would not surprise me if they do the same to the other leaders just to protect their infidelity, Ajuka says. I'll speak to so-and-so about the matter, Seraphal says. That could work. But remember, they have a recording of Issei speaking on the matter. They could release it at any given moment. Plus the incident that occurred in Issei's classroom, Sir Zek says. I agree. Since the carrier of Beatro opened his mouth about it, they know that the girls were unfaithful, as the people in the classroom know. And through his word of mouth, it can spread the reach of ears in the girls. And recording they have of Issei will confirm it, Ajuka says. You're right. I will speak with Sotan about the matter, and I will handle it without exposing the supernatural world. On the plus side, I looked into those girls. They're quite popular themselves, so if Sotan can convince them to wade the storm, they can get the others to keep quiet as well, so the girls will never know, although they may experience some resentment, but that's natural, Seraphal says. Everyone in the room was surprised by Seraphal's analysis, but thinking about it would say keep Seraphal busy until she was reunited with Issei again, and they knew that she was already had resentments towards the girls, so systematically, waiting for their suffering would distract Seraphal for the time being. It's a good suggestion, since we cannot erase their memory nor take away the recording. We did not leak the video off the student's phone, Ajuka said. We did delete the video off that student's phone, Ajuka continued. Which Sona took a copy of and explained the situation to the student of why she did it. She told them how that she did not want the incident to spread, but she would resent it, resend it back to them in a matter of time. Apparently, the students wasn't much of a fan of Genshiro Soji, saying 
the name and disdain. So seeing him get his ass handed to him from Issei was satisfying. So Sutan had requested videos from Tobio-san when he knew and Dulio trained the two gave a confirmation of Issei kicking his ass. Of course, rendered and edited to not show anything of the supernatural. Now the student is a fan of Issei's and promised to keep quiet for Issei's sake. Seraphal says, that's good news. Sir Zex replies with a smile, guess we will have fans in the school upon his return. Falbium remains snoring on the couch again, so it is decided. I will speak with so-and-so, and we will hold the meeting to discuss the absence of the pillar, to which everyone who was awake agreed. Once they came to an agreement, discussed a few things in the time, and regards the preparations for the meeting, each one of them left Seraphal alone. I suppose it's time to call Mother, Seraphal says, creating a communication circle. Hello, Okasan, do you have time to talk, Seraphal says? Hello, daughter. Yes, I have time. Is there anything you need? Safita says. Could you please come to my castle? I want to talk to you about something, Seraphal says. Very well. Give me about five minutes and I will get there. Okay, I will wait for you, Seraphal says, as she canceled the communication circle, ending the call. Seraphal let out a sigh, but she called one of her maids. Carla, Seraphal says. Yes, Seraphal Sama? Appearing in front of Seraphal says, Could you please have the garden prepared? My mother is coming and I would like to speak with her there. Understood, Seraphal Sama, leaving to carry out to her task. Never thought I would be back to this, twirling some ice magic around her fingers, but Issei son asked this of me, so I will honor his request, Seraphal said. After a while, Seraphal thought of many things, such as her magic girl program and her rise to the Mount Leviathan, when her mother appeared in front of the desk. Hello, dear. How's your day going? It's been well, Okasan, letting out a sigh. And what do you want to talk about? It's better if we went to the garden. Hmm, you want me to help you, Sophia says? That'd be much appreciated with a little blush for needing help. Both women went to the garden. Sophia helped Sarah fall be seated at the table, and she sat to the opposite of her. I have some things I need help with, Seraphal says, and that would be... I feel weird, Seraphal says. How so? For one, I cannot put my magic girl clothes on without feeling that I look bad. I cannot act as I did before without feeling that I should not act in it anymore. I just feel weird. It's like I cannot see myself as the old and new me. Seraphal says, I knew it, Sophita says. You know what's happening to me. Yes, don't worry, it's very normal. So what is it, honey? You were a girl just had to experience that an essence transformer into a woman, smiling at her eldest daughter. I don't understand, Seraphal says. My dear, at this moment, what do you want? What do I want? I don't know. What is it? Raising her hand to her chin to think, until she raised her head in realization. I want to see Issei-san, Seraphal said, looking away shyly. What else? I want him to see me as I am. That he tells me that he thinks of my clothes and that he hugs me. She paused. A big blush came over her face. Go on, Sophita says, egging her daughter to speak her mind. I want to, I want to kiss him again. I want to feel him again. I want to take to a bed and do it again with him. Confronting him that I will be there and confirming that I will shield his heart from those who wish to harm him, looking in defiance at her mother, creating an ice shell to emphasize her point. <laughs> well, look at you. Your feelings towards Issei. Your mind and body want to feel him. Be with him. That's something normal. You want to see him as you two had sex. You let yourself go and both of your feelings took over. It caused your relationship to take a huge leap. Explain a little more, Sarah Fall said. Of course. As I said, it is normal something similar happened to me, as it does any woman, because hormonal and mental, it happens after having our first time. We feel more like an adult. We worry about how we look, how we express ourselves. We begin to change towards maturity. The exception is this world of the gremory of your own form rival. She claims she loved herself, but yet opened her legs to his rival, and I bet she is clinging to the thinking of he is the one. But yet, she opened her legs to another, your sister's pawn. If what he claims is true, they think that they know what they want, but it's only lust, and sure, sex may feel good, but they have something that's longing. They may never have, but you do, Sophita says. What do I do? Seraphal says. What do I have to do? Seraphal replies. Easy, just be yourself. Change as you want, do what you want, look at you now. These past days you're showing a little more skin in your clothing, nothing wrong with that. But you also have a defiant look. Something that I haven't seen since I saw your training. Your water magic to involve to ice magic. So I can say, you are doing a good job at being yourself. You were hiding behind that childish personality, but you took more out of the pigtails, and I must say I'm very proud of the woman sitting before me, and always have been. Sophita says, really? Seraphal replies, yes. I know you've always wanted to change, and you wanted to revert back to the woman or her position as the Malaviathan, your true self. You found someone to accept you as you are, smiling.
I see. You're not telling me everything, are you? Haven't you felt anger? One question, Safita said. You are correct, Okasan, letting out a sigh. Today I happened to be incorrectly upset when they questioned me if I was worried about Isis and if they expected me to throw a tantrum rather than remain calm and have faith in them. It is to be expected. Little by little, you've changed. So while they have used to your true self before, they are also used to your former personality. So it will take time for them to get accumulated with your real self in actions. Ah, I see. I forgot to apologize for them for the outburst, Seraphal said. Out of no where a scream was heard in the distance. Sir, Miss Seraphal Sama is busy and cannot be interrupted. She is very upset by the intrusion of follow two people. Older man and young man that look to be about 20 and 25 years old. Gentlemen, you cannot enter. If you have an appointment, please wait in the lobby. Damn maid, you don't know who I am. Lord Permanente, you dare to get in my way? Clearly annoyed. Sir, I know who you are, but I can't let you pass. I would like to talk to Seraphal, please, Claus said, hoping to use his charm to persuade her. Sir, she was interrupted by Sophita. It's all right, Carla, let them pass. What are you doing, Okasan? Looking at her mother. And we're going to stop there for now. Now, hopefully you guys did some of it, so let's go ahead and continue. Preparing for potential trouble, did you forget about how many admirers you had, Sophita says. As you wish, Sophita sama Clara says, standing off to the side for the two men to pass. Hmm, Lord Primine says, as he strode past the maid. The two men approached the two women at the table in the garden. Hello, Julius. Claude, Sophita says. Julius starts. Hello, Sophia. You look beautiful today, trying to re be respectful, even though he was fuming inside. Sophia only frowned at his tone, since he could tell that the respect was being forced. What brings you here, Sophia says, swirling her spoon in tea. Nothing to do with you. We've come to talk to Seraphal, Julius says. Oh, well, she's right here, Sophia says, pointing to Seraphal. Hello, Julius. Her tone was serious, wanting to know why Pim and Clan was here. Well... Look what we have here. Look who we have here. The one who is no longer a virgin speaking with mockery, Julius says. What are you talking about? Seraphal replies. Oh, nothing. Only that you dare to decline my son's offer of commitment and then you are going to wallow with somebody nobody. How low have you fallen? Julius says. Seraphal released an immense amount of rage at Julius. It was so great that it surprised Seraphal herself, but she didn't show it. Sophia was also surprised and looked at the interest of what Seraphal was going to do. Tell me who was the cockroach that you chose when he doesn't even reach my heels, Claus says. That does not concern them, Seraphal says, becoming very annoyed. Please tell me. I would like to know what he has that made you choose him over me, Claus says, stepping forward and losing his arrogance, figuring that it was the best way to get the way of answer out of her. Seraphal looked at Claus. She could see that he toned down his arrogance, probably because she released more of her aura, but she calmed down as she didn't want to cause a tantrum, but if she wanted to, she could freeze them. First of all, he doesn't have your arrogance and his name is Issei, omitting the last name because she didn't want to associate Issei to them, but you may know him as the Opai Dragon or the Sekiyuti. So you joined his harem, ha, huh? Julius says. Father, Claus replied, turning to the man and giving him a glare and told him to shut up. Julius saw his son's glare and kept quiet. He knew of his son's power. I find it hard to believe, but if what you say is true, why is he so pale? Claus says, I heard the man that you were with was someone that was sickly pale. The appearance does not match the Sikirud's appearance. He has lightly tanned skin, so what happened to him? Claus says, Seraphil could see that Claus was now being genuine and seemed wanted to know about Issei, so she calmed down and spoke. He was sick and dying because of a curse for your information. No, I did not join his harem. He doesn't have one anymore, Seraphil replies. Claus and Julius' eyes widened at that statement and didn't want to believe it. That's preposterous, Julius says. If he had split, everyone would have heard about it. He's the damn pillar of the factions, Julius says. Sophita could see in her daughter's eyes that he turned to the two men. I think you should sit down, Sophita replied, moving over to sit closer to her daughter. The two men did as Sophita asked and wasn't willing to know what happened. Since this is going to go public soon, might as well tell you, but Rias Grimry, her parash, Ravel Phoenix, the reincarnated angel Irina Shioto, and Katri Piomian, the Seraph Gabriel, and any other fiancé he cheated on with him as their so-called rival. The male members of her parash, my sister's pawn, and Katri is Zazel, Seraphal says. Now the jaws of the two men dropped. They could not believe it. The hero was betrayed by the ones that he claimed to love him, but Claus remembered something that Seraphal said earlier. 
Sir Falsan, you admitted from saying the Sekiru surname. Why? Claus said, because the Hyodo knew at the infidelity against their son, and said nothing. Adding on, the girls lied about his achievements to make it seem as if he was a low-class demon, Seraphal said. Low-class? As if he was low-class, Julia says. Have you seen her Parage members? That none of hers is low-class. She could never do anything like she did, nothing in their fight against Saraorg. They had the audacity to claim him as a low class. He exploded as he stood up. He had respect for Issei, and to learn that he was betrayed made him furious, Julius was. Sit down, Julius, Seraphal says, glaring at him. Now let me explain everything from the top. As she began to explain what she saw in Issei's memories, when she showed them in the meeting of how Issei had left to perform a ritual to alleviate himself from his curse, Julius and Klaus were stunned to hear that Issei went through, how he wanted to kill himself but seemed to overcome it, since he left to remove his curse. Stupid humans, Julius says. I am actually glad Great Red made him a new body. Now he has nothing to tie himself to them. Angry at the Hyoto, before he turned to Seraphal and stood up and took a bow. Seraphal summoned Sophie to say, I am sorry for my attitude. I had no right to accuse you from not understanding the situation. I accuse the Sekiru. I hope to meet him and sorry for judging your relationship, Julius says. You had no knowledge of the situation, which is understandable, but don't do it again, or there will be consequences. Her eyes seemed to glow light blue, as she released an icy aura, which caused them both men to sweat. I understand, Julia says, gulping in fear of his life. I suppose the Gremory and Phoenix clans are aware of this, to which the two women nodded. Then, we shall cut ties with them, Claus said. I advise you not to do that, Seraphal replied. Why not? Claus says they should be accused of treason for betraying the pillar. That damn Mal Lucifer should lose his position because of the whore of a sister, Claus says. The Gremory and the Phoenix clans only knew of this because Issei told them. They had no knowledge of the infidelities. Since we have been dealing with the losses from the war, none of us knew that they did this to him. Issei also does not hold grudges against the two clans for what their daughters did. He even sees the Gremory portraits as his parents and called them his mother and father before he left, Seraphal says. Were they screwed up with one child? They made it up for the better one. Since it may upset him, we will not cut ties to Gremory and Phoenix clans. And to add on, for my negligence, I would like to assist in sponsoring your sister's school. I know we also looked down on the low-class demons, but the sacred provided otherwise. So if there's a new, so if there's a need, we will vouch for the approval of your school. Thank you for the time, and sorry for disturbing you. Standing up and leaving the garden, not hearing if they told him goodbye or not. He was already embarrassed by his actions, and just wanted to leave. Still full of hot air, I see, watching Julius walk away. I'm afraid so, and so am I, turning his gaze back to women. You're right, he certainly has no arrogance compared to me. I am still upset by what the Red Dragon Emperor went through, and frankly, I believe that the Hirakako is no better than his grandfather. It seems the Lucifer lineage is only meant to cause problems for everyone. My father thinks the same. He just didn't want to say it. I could tell he's fuming right now. It's so you to earn a respect. We hope to be on good terms with him, and our actions today backtracked that. I asked for your forgiveness for disturbing your time. When the Seeker Rooter returns, I would like to apologize to him as well. I would have no I should have known better than to go after a dragon's woman. Claus finishes. It's alright, Claus, Seraphal says. She was hoping that her other admirers didn't pull a stunt like this. But they do hope they are understanding as Claus, Seraphal says. I am really happy for you, though, Claus says. I hope the man that would have made you have been me. He put a sad smile on his face. It just hurt to let you go. But you found someone better. I hope that Grammary understands this. She is known to be quite spoiled, Claus says. She will, whether she wants to or not, Seraphal says. Her eyes giving off a slight glow, Safita smirked at her daughter's reaction. Well, I'll do my best to snuff these rumors. I wouldn't want the Grammary Harris to hear about this and accuse you for something you did no wrong in, Claus said. Thank you, Claus. As I said, we will be letting the public know about this, and we will have a meeting to handle any punishment that we may see fit, Seraphal says. If I may ask, may I come to this meeting? Claus says, I'd like to see the Red Dragon Emperor's memories myself. It's not that I don't trust you, but I would like to experience what's transpiring through his own eyes, Claus said. I understand, Seraphal replies. Thank you for your time. I am sorry for my intrusions, Miss Clara. Sorry to you as well for addressing more stress than you needed. Apologizing to the maiden well, Claus said. It's all right, Clara said, with a slight blush because the man was charming. Take care of yourself, Claus, Seraphal says. Claus gave a nod to the mouth and walked out of the garden to leave the mansion as well. You handled that quite well, Sophia says, impressed by how Seraphal took care of the situation. This is going to be difficult. 
<sighs> Sarah Falls says, <laughs> nobody said maturity will be easy. Sophie just says, now in an unknown location. Scene change. In a dark lair, there were footsteps of a person walking until they reached a metal door and opened it quickly and entered the room, where there was someone seated in a chair. My lord, it has been confirmed that the Mao's met. Hmm, so they have gathered together, the man sitting in the chair responded. Yes, my lord and the Mao Leviathan seem to have met with the Paimon clan and they intruded on her castle. Nothing more came after that. I see. That doesn't seem important, but the Mao's have not even thought about what's happening, smiled wickingly, my lord. What is going? How's it going? How is that going? Still nothing. More, still nothing. My damn father caused the faction to eliminate all of the parts of the organization. He lost Keo Keo and his team. The descendants of the ancient Maos are either dead or deserted, and the evil dragons died in battle. The exception being Krom Crunch. Seriously, almost everything was destroyed for a plan that did not go anywhere. Even used his soul to try to achieve his goal. But that didn't work. He rose from his chair. But he is still my father. Even if he believed he killed me, but I have some remorse for his near death. As he walked towards a large glass... Tube with green liquid, but I never said that I would help you if you failed, right, Tosun? Looking at was inside the tube. <laughs> yes, my lord, you have no reason to help him, Moro says, becoming cheerful and psychotic. Inside the tube was a dark green liquid, but inside it looked like a human body, but it was missing its right arm, left leg, and large parts of meat all over the torso. This piece of meat was none other than Rizavim Liav and Lucifer. For I, Rizavim Lucifer, will take charge and do everything in my own way, and you will be one of my guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing evilly alongside Moro, who laughed with him. And that is the end of chapter 17. Chapter 18. Same day, Sunday, with Issei. So, scene change, now we're with Issei again. Ugh, complaining as he woke up from a long sleep. This sucks! Issei says, trying to get up without success. Issei was in complete darkness once again. There was no noise except his breathing or attempts to do something. Issei gave up and decided to wait for his body, to wake up completely to try to do something. While time passed, Issei just reflected, lying on the ground. <laughs> Going from the hero's factions. One of the strongest existence to a person who can't even stand up. Man, I'm pathetic. I'm even worse than I started. Wait, I feel sad. My feelings are coming back. Yes, Issei says. After waiting about 20 minutes, Issei began to struggle to get up, making a lot of effort to sit up. Come on, I can't stay down all day, Issei says, putting more strength and standing up completely. Then he took his first step and fell to the ground again, and when he did, he ended up bruising his jaw and busting his nose, Ugh! groaning as he returned over his back and his ground while squeezing his bleeding nose. Issei writhed until the pain subsided, but the bleeding didn't stop. How pathetic, Issei says, sitting up from the ground, ugh, removing one of his hands from his nose and feeling that it had a lot of blood in it, dying from a nosebleed. How poetic and ironic. Sarcasm was laced into his voice. Issei sighed, seeing the darkness, while his nose did not stop bleeding. Then Issei heard a noise, and from his right, when he turned, and he found someone. Huh? Have I gone crazy? What are you doing here, Sarah Chan, seeing that his betrothed was there with him? What are you doing on the ground, Sarah Falls says, tilting her head in confusion. Sarah Fall means astral Sarah Fall, just for a note. I can't get up. Can't you see, Say says? Hmm. That's why you don't do anything. Do you want to go back to where you were? As she bent down to his level, remaining on her heels, wearing the outfit that he say last saw on her. You do not know that I can see your panties, right? Issei says, looking up at her legs, considering the sl slit on her skirt, allowed to see what was underneath from what was laying. You've already seen me naked, and we've gone over 50 rounds of sex. But if showing them to you will make you stand up or do something, I'll show them to you. Shrugging off his comment, not having much care for her modesty. <laughs> I mean, I didn't like that. Uh, sitting up with difficulty, standing up from the ground, it's just that others could see him giving her a small smile. Hmm... Well, now you can't see them referring to his standing position, so what are you doing? Getting up and looking into Issei's eyes. I don't know, but we'll figure it out, Issei says. Well, good luck, as she began to disappear. His eyes showed a flash of sadness. Bye. Hmm, why are you sad? You know I'm in your imagination, so what's wrong? Seraphel says, catching that last flash of sadness in his eyes before she was still fading. Well, putting his hand on Seraphal's cheek because I won't be able to see you for a long time, real or imaginary. I won't be able to do it, putting on a sad smile. 
Then hurry up, finish your training and come back to me as she continues to fade. Oh, and find some trustworthy people. I don't like that you're alone out there, Seraphal says. I'll try, Issei says, as Seraphal disappeared. His face held a sad look. Issei was once again alone in that darkness. Now she was gone, and Drake was asleep from the ritual, and assimilating the new power to combine with the boosted gear. Issei was not going to let the sadness consume him with determination in his eyes. He began to take a few steps very carefully and get a slight of his legs. Okay, Issei says. He began to walk little by little, and stretched his arms to feel if there were an obstacle in his way. Little by little, Issei walked towards what he thought was the door to the oasis, and Strake's cave was within an oasis where time was different. However, time was normal within the cave. Damn, I wish I could meet the mage that helped build all this. Definitely wish I could take him with me. Issei says. Now, in the human world, apartment of Sona and Tsubaki. So, scene change. Sona opened her eyes to see the ceiling, but she also felt the weight on her side. Curious, she turned to see what was there, and it turned out to be Sabaki, who seemed to have a nightmare because her eyes shed tears. Oh, that's right. Yesterday, she came to my room and talked me and ended up crying most of the night, until we fell asleep. She whispered to herself, What a pain. Hmm, it's 7.30, a bit later than what I'm used to. Oh well, I better wake her up and get her out of the nightmare, Sona says. Sona nudged Tsubaki's shoulder a little until she started to wake up. W what happened? Tsubaki says, confused as she saw Sono. Good morning, Tsubaki, Sona said. Sona-sama. Why are you in my bed? Tsubaki replied. Tsubaki, look around you. With a small smile, amused by Tsubaki's reaction, Tsubaki looked around the whole room, and from the moment to where she next, she blushed and covered herself with sheets, which confused Sona. Tsubaki? Sona said. Sona-sama, what did I do to you? It can't be that I have kind of perverted side, Tsubaki said, stuttering rapidly. Sona tilted her head in confusion, but then the realization of what Tsubaki said caused a small blush to appear on her face. Oh my god. Tsubaki, nothing happened, so don't think about those things. As she tried to make... Take off the sheet off Tsubaki. Seriously, we're not even naked. How could she even think that? A small sweat drop appearing on the side of her head. Sona-sama, I'm sorry. You were saving your purity, but you no longer have it. It's all my fault, Tsubaki said. She screamed back in front for the control as she went with Sona. Tsubaki, listen to me. Nothing happened, so relax. We're not even naked, Sona says, putting more strength to remove the sheet from Tsubaki. What, Tsubaki says, becoming confused as a result. She lost strength in her pull and her arms becoming slack. However, due to the force exerted by Sona in her pull, the loss of the strength by Tsubaki, Sona pulled not only the sheet but also Tsubaki, causing both to end up falling on the ground as Tsubaki landed on Sona. Ouch, what? She rubbed her hand from hitting the ground, flung backwards before looking up to see Tsubaki's face very close to hers. Uh, she had caught herself but didn't know what to do as she could see Sona's face up close. Both remained silent as they looked at each other, each with a blush on their faces, and they held each other's gaze, but were interrupted by a person who had appeared in a room by a magical circle. I knew th your sister wanted to be close to you, but guess she was not the woman you envisioned being with. There was a small amusement in her tone as this scene of Sona and Tsubaki on the floor wrapped in a sheet and staring at her. gravia -san, it's not what it seems, Sona says. She was extremely nervous as she saw Gravia in the room. Yes, you're quite mistaken, Tsubaki says, just as nervous as the two to untangle themselves and quickly stand up. Well, it seems I interrupted something. Proceeding to walk to the door. When they finish, don't forget to take a bath, leaving room in Sona and Tsubaki looking like tomatoes. Calling after her, but they were could reach her. They tripped over the sheet in the fall to the ground again as Gravia closed the door to give them privacy. Minutes later, I see. It seems I understood the situation in many ways. While drinking tea, after Sona and Zubaki gave her an explanation of why they were in the position that she found them in. Yes. What brings you here? Sona says. Sarasam wants to see you, Gravia replies. You mean Seraphal Sama? It's not like you called by her full name. A bit confused by the nickname that she was given. Well, it's difficult to explain. It's better that you see it for yourselves, Gravia says, a little uncomfortable of how Sona would take it. And why, and when does she want to see me, Sona says. Right now, she's a bit upset that she wants to talk to you as quickly as possible, Grapia says. Upset? Sona slash Tsubaki say at the same time. You'll see, standing up from the chair, making a magic circle to transport them, Grapia does. 
I guess so, Sona says, a little nervous about her sister's attitude. Underworld in the Leviathan Mansion. Sona and Tsubaki and Grafia appear in front of the door of the Sarah Falls office, but they quickly notice what was just getting a little closer. They felt an incredible chill. It was as if they were in a freezer. W what is going on here? Trembling from the cold, Tsubaki says, Onisama is more than just, just a little upset, trembling uh, uh, like Tsubaki Sona was. It appears so, Grafia says. She spoke unaffected by the cold. Sona and Tsubaki looked at her in disbelief, but remembered that she also trained in ice magic as well as she was able to use these temperatures. They just watched as she strode forward and knocked on the door. Who is it? Sarah Falls says. I said today I didn't want any guests, hearing the knock, clearly annoyed by reviewing some papers. Sarasama, it's me. I brought Sona and Tsubaki as you requested. Oh, it's you, Grafia. You may pass, but hurry, I have work to do in her eyes. As she sheets out in front of paper in front of her. The three of them cautiously entered the office and saw Sarah fall focused on her work in a mountain of papers. Oh, Onisami, what, what is that you wanted to speak with me about? Sona said. She was still trembling from freezing temperatures and could see that they were coming from her sister. She was a bit stunned by her appearance, but didn't focus on much because of the cold. Mm, oh, sorry. I let a little out of my freezing aura, Seraphal said, looking up, when he heard her sister's chattering teeth and decreased her aura, which thawed the room and warmed it back up. Much better, Tsubaki says. She said quietly, enjoying the warmth coming back into the room. So what is it you wish to speak with me about, Onisama? Still a bit confused as her summons, but also her sister's new look. First, have a seat, gesturing to the couches in the office, Seraphal did. Sona and Tsubaki noticed the rare behavior of Seraphal because he did not narrow herself. Sona, nor she was speaking cheerfully. She spoke with sense of calmness, but also seriousness, but not to endure her aura again. Both that they were told without question and sat on the couch. Grafia saw, help me. Seraphal says, understood, Grafia says as she walked around the desk behind Seraphal. Onisama, what do you need help with? Sona says she began to speak until she saw how Seraphal was in a wheelchair being pushed by Grafia. Onisama slash Seraphal, Sona standing up from the couches. Quiet, this will also be explained, Seraphal says with a wave of her hand, not caring about their yelling. What happened, Onisama? Who did that to you with a tone of death? Was it an enemy? Subaki says. Seraphal blinked at their reactions and then proceeded to laugh, as did Grafia, which caused the two younger women to be between to understand what was going on. Once she got out of her system, Seraphal popped an arm in at her armrest, while wheelchair and placed on her head and popped up in her arm, leaning forward with a small smile on her face. Oh, so you're going to kill your brother-in-law, Seraphal says, amused by her sister's action. B -b -b brother in law Sona says, as her dropped. As her jaw dropped and her glass became a little crooked on her face. That can't be, Tsubaki says, covering her mouth in shock. There's no other way to say it, Grafia says, amused by Seraphal's response. Well, yes, but this was the fastest. How is it possible, Sona says. It's possible. But that is not the reason I called you here, you see. Dear sister, there's something you have to do. Turning a sharp towards, look to Sona. Sona swelled nervously about what she was about to be tasked to do. After the explanation... I refuse. I do not intend to help her, Sona says, standing up and glaring back at her sister, who stared calmly back. It's true. Wouldn't it be better to let them spread it, Tsubaki says, in agreement with her king. Hmm. Oh, so, so it seems that you are wrong on something. She held her sister's gaze as she began to eat a cookie, Seraphal did. Huh? And what's that, Sona replied. It's not a petition. It's an order, looking at Sona with emotionless eyes. Sona, Tsubaki, and even Grafia were stunned by Seraphal's gaze. Sorry. I'm still getting used to this. <sighs> Letting out a little sigh, giving an apologetic look to those in the room. Bonisama, why should this be done? Sona said, recovering from her shock and returning to the with a serious tone. Because it is somewhat of a request from Issei, but it is the best for the Alliance. As you know, Issei cannot be treated as a normal person because apart from being the pillar of the factions, he is the hero of the supernatural world. And if other factions found out what happened prematurely, it could be catastrophic. As you saw from Issei's memories, the Hyoto kept calling him a low-class demon, which is clearly a lie. Considering that he was promoted to mid-class demon after the raiding game against Saraorg, it's no surprise that the girls lied to them about his status to make them more susceptible to their infidelity. Unfortunately, Michael is testing something for the angels, which is probably what allowed that reincarnated angel and Gabriel to commit a sin. We know... That the ring leader is obviously Rhea, since Issei loved her the most, so it is fairly unlikely she convinced them. Not surprising as both of them were quite naive, Seraphal finishes.
Suna listened to the deduction of her sister and allowed her to continue on what the girl's lying had to do with it. So think, if they were to find out that they have been caught, they would use those same lies to save themselves, possibly claiming that they that we are lying. Since the other factions don't know what has happened, they could possibly side with them. So that you have to deal with this issue until the meeting. Don't let them be suspicious, of course. You can let out a few rumors mill around and try to contain them, and considering that your own pawn is one of her lovers, she will try to ask about him, possibly use excuses for his whereabouts. Don't let them be reminded of Issei. Not yet. At least, Seraphal says. You're right. Rias is quite deceptive, and she uses her body as a weapon. It would not be surprising of how Hyota would fall for her charms, and not listen to their morals. From Issei's gossip with my soon-to-be former pawn, Goro Hyoto is a pervert himself, and Miki Hyoto helped create naked aprons for Rias and Azia. They're so hypocritical, but I think that I can keep this a secret for at least a month. After that, it cannot be avoided, becoming serious about the ordeal, and at least she would not admit it out loud. Out. She was enjoying this analytic side of her. <laughs> it seems that so unusual so so has returned with a smile confident in her sister's ability to run the school and keep the girls at bay for the time being. Hmm, Onisama, since we ended with this topic, can we talk about the other? With a little blush, but still kept her focus on her sister. Oh, and what would that be, Seraphal says, raising an eyebrow in confusion. Is it has to do with you're in a wheelchair and his brother-in-law, Subaki says, exactly, readjusting your glasses, Seraphal said. I mean, Sona said. Seraphal looked at his surprise, and he didn't think they would ask about it. Oh, I see, Seraphal says, so who is it? It was Issei, and a nonchalant answering about that, and looked with a wave of her hand, shrugging her shoulders. Oh, uh, Sona and Tsubaki eyes widening in surprise. Serifa looked at back at the only to see Sona and Tsubaki completely frozen in shock. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have said anything with a drop of sweat beside her head, Serifa is. I agree with a drop of sweat of her own, Gravia says. Currently, now we're in heaven near Michael's office. There was a blonde who walked to Michael's office. His name was Dulio, the strongest exorcist, the captain of the team of DXD. He was a little confused because Michael called him without reason. So, he went without asking anything, but he turned the corner so was surprised to find Grishaletta Corda, the queen of Gabriel's deck and the guardian of the Duandal wielder Zenovia. Oh, hello, Grosta. How, how are you going? Dulio says, speaking in a kind tone. The church's most gentle child. Hello, Dulio son. I'm doing well. She smelled kindly in return, but then turned serious. It seems that you were also called. Dulio says, Yes. Why do you think they called us? Do you know why? Well, no, Grisholda says. Then let's find out, shall we? Dulio enters. As he reached as the office, you what? As she felt a pause that seemed to reduce her energy level, causing to stop lean on the wall. Grishola said, what happened? You seem tired, looking back at her. Nothing, it, it was nothing, Grishola said, though she spoke with a tired voice. Hmm, not convinced, but decided to push not to push the subject. Come on, it is not good to make Michael Summit wait, as we begin to knock on the door. You're right, straightening herself up, a little more energized than before, Grishilda was. Who is it? Michael said, speaking from the other side of the door. Michael Sama, it is Dulio and Grishilda. You called for use changing the more respectful tone. Enter, speaking in a serious tone, Michael says. Both looked at each other a bit surprised by Michael's tone of voice. Enter the room where they saw Michael with a serious look directed towards them while seated from his desk. Michael-sama, what's the matter? Slightly sweating from the situation. Please have a seat, Michael said. They both swallowed nervously at the immense aura that Michael was expelling. Neither of them said anything and just sat down. Do you know why you're here, Michael says? No, Michael-sama. Still nervous, both of them said. Well, I have some questions, and you will answer yes or no. Understood, Michael said? Yes, Dulio and Grishilla replied. Michael says and continues. First, Dulio, have you been seeing the damage done to heaven and earth from the war? Michael says. Yes, Michael Sama, quickly answering him. Second, Grishilda, is it true that these past few weeks you have not left heaven? Yes, Michael Sama, she was nervous as she was supposed to have doing something but was not formed. Grishilda, in these weeks, have you noticed something strange in Gabriel? Michael says. He turned to her with a deadly look. Grishilda remained silent, not knowing how to respond. Michael Sama, what's happening? Why do you ask these things? Dulia said. Dulia, wait your turn to respond, releasing tremendous pressure but maintaining his guise on Grishilda. Dulia remained silent upon feeling the pressure that Michael was emitting. Grishilda, answer your question, Michael said. Yes, lowering her head in resignation. What are these weird things? Michael said. Well, about 11 days ago, she went to see Irina, and after that, she began to disappear without a trace. And when she returned, she did not say much, only that Irina is fine, though she had a weird look on her face as if it was bumping about. 
And why hadn't you informed me about this, Michael said. She told me not to say anything and not to worry. When I asked if I could accompany her, since she was only seeing Ariana and the girls, she did not need protection, Griselda said. I see, Michael says, as he stopped expelling Aura. So both of you know what the fallen dragon is, correct? Isn't a fallen dr isn't that a dragon if it betrayed and that can die from this with a finger on his chin, Dulia said. Uh, why do you ask this? Griselda said. She became completely white. No, it can't be, Griselda says, fast as always. What do you think happened, Michael says. What, but, but it's not possible, and cruelly as of what she's hearing, Griselda says. Well, it's possible. I didn't believe it, but it's true, Michael says. I'm missing out on something, Dulia replied, looking at both of them without understanding their actions. Well, what I'm about to show you and tell you cannot get out of here, okay, Michael says, as he took a crystal from the door of his desk and given to him by Ajuka. Understood. Dooley and Grishilda says, becoming serious that Grishilda was nervous and was about to see it. Well, prepare yourself because it's going to be long and complicated, Michael says, activating the crystal. After the explanation and review of the memories, and that's what happened, Michael said, with an emotionless tone. No, no. Grishilda says as tears came out of her eyes. Dulio was speechless from what he just witnessed. As I said, this cannot be known to anyone. You will have a mission. Maintaining his serious composure, Michael starts. What is it? Dulio says. He was serious about the task he was going to receive and steeled himself to prevent negative emotions from spilling out. Even though Michael tinkered with the system, a little test for the seraphs in the desk to not form sin. You were to watch Gabriel 24-7. And report any of her activities. I'm afraid she has been corrupted by the words of the devil. It is likely that Irina was too, Michael says. I understand, Dulia replied. And you, Grishilda. He paused momentarily as Grishilda just cried silently. Michael Sama, I will take my leave, Dulia said, understanding the situation and letting Grishilda have her time as she witnessed her mistress war and apprentice to go to her faith. Standing up from his chair, Dulia left the room to carry out his mission and sense for Gabriel's energy signature. Michael watched Dulio leave before he stood up from his desk and walked Neil down to next to Grishilda. You know it's not your fault, right? Michael said, speaking kindly to soothe the woman. But, but if I informed him, maybe, just maybe, as her sadness overcame her silencing as the tears rolled over her eyes, Grishilda starts. You do not have to worry about that, Michael says, putting his hand on her head and confirming surgery. I would like to apologize to Issei, Grishilda said, feeling a bit better. That will not be possible because he has left, because he has left, and neither I nor the leaders know where he went. But for your apology, behold your apology when he returns. There will be a meeting to discuss his absence. I understand, Grishilda says. Thank you, Michael-sama, as her tears stopped rolling down her face, feeling better than she was a few minutes ago. No need to thank me. That's what I'm hoping for, showing her a gentle smile. Michael-sama, I have a question. What do you plan to do? Of the meeting of the factions, Grishilda says. I'll be honest with you. <sighs> I don't know. I do know that I have to expel Gabriel and Irina. But that, surely, it hurts me more than them. In a defeated tone, Michael is. I have an idea, Grishilda, turning serious, possibly giving the two a chance to redeem themselves. And what would that be, Michael says. Restart the system, Grishilda says. What would that do? Michael replies. You put in a feature that would test the capabilities of what an angel can do and can't do. Seraphs look on their decks. Grishilda says, yes, that is correct. By restarting the system, we would not have the ca capability anymore, but it would prevent Gabriel and Irina from committing a sin because they could become fallen angels if they continued to indulge in those activities, which I don't think they would want, Grishilda says. Yes, but I would have to speak with Raphael and Uriel, though Gabriel would be wondering what has happened, Michael says. It's simple. If she or Irina asks, you can say that there is a bug in the system, which is true and not a lie, because the feature is a bug. If it allows angels to commit sin of adultery, then there is an issue, Grishilda says. That could work, but I feel like there is more to this, Michael says. Yes, watching what we saw... Yes, watching what Issei saw, I saw that there was alcohol involved with Azazel. I know that Valkyrie is a lightweight. She is likely to repent for drunken affairs, and that action may cause Gabriel and Irina to do the same and admit their sins to us themselves, Gershilda says. So you are giving them the last chance of redemption. You are very kind, Michael says, giving her a smile. It will be the last service as an angel to Lady Gabriel, Gershilda says. In what of your ward, she and Azia will be affected by the restart as well, Michael says. They have been led astray. I believe their mistress is the cause of this. If 
that out of experience has proven to be true. She is the culprit, and Zenobia and Azia listened to her words. She spoke coldly of Rias before letting out a sigh and speaking again in a calm tone. I know Irina, and looked up to Zenobia during their training because she was better swordsman and Azia is a kind soul. So if the two convinced Irina to commit these acts, it would not be a surprise to her mistress use them to use Irina to convince Gabriel to join them as well because we, angels, trust one another... More than any other faction, unfortunately, during my tenure with both of them, Irina and Lady Gabriel can be quite naive, Crisilda says. Yes, that is true. I shall propose your idea to the other seraphs as we'll speak with Toji as well regarding his daughter, Michael says. It is likely that he will take Irina away from that house filled with devils. I hope he takes Lady Gabriel with him as well. Maybe that Shudo can restore their faith and lead them on the right path again. Though, their time as angels is over. Better there, better there than with Azazel, Grishilda says. I do hope you're right about that, Michael says, looking solemnly in a distance. Now, in the Gregor in Shimazin's office. During the time that Dooley and Grishilda were called, Shimazin called for armor, Shamaniel, and Tamil, while Barkil called in a slash dog who just finished a mission of investigating an abandoned Chaos Brigade base. What have you called us for, Shamazi? He was in the back of the researcher moon for the Gregor, the Katri. Sharhal, he had black and white hair com combed back, and he wore thick glasses and gold eyes in black business. Suit underneath a lab coat. Underneath the... He had bandages around his torso from his injuries in the Evil Dragon War. Yes, and is a Zazel. Pyomin and Barkyal coming. He was a muscular man, his physique similar to after Demo did mention Barkyal with a white beard. He had black hair and violet eyes and wore armor helm and an eye patch over his left eye. The armor had a motif and an eagle hawk and he kept at an ox and shield holstered on his back. He was also a researcher of anti magic. Tamil stood off to the side, pondering what he could do the issue that kept the Katris had been called in. He had blonde hair, green eyes, and wore a robe that had many ornaments. He was at the head of the business of the department of Gregor, business were going to be fine, so he believed that they called because of that. Wait a moment, Barkyul. Should be here shortly with our other guests, Shimazan said. The other three noticed that he only mentioned Barkyul, but not Azazel nor Pyamain, but they remained silent. A moment later, the door opened and Vice Governor General Barkyul walked in with young four adults. Sorry for the late arrival. I had to catch them before they got to relax, Barkyul said, gesturing to the four people that came with him. Sorry we couldn't look more presentable, but Barkyul said it was urgent. He was a man that had short black hair. It was Tobio. Wore three sheep piece and just a vest. They were slightly ragged since they had to come close to a mission. He was a wielder of the Longinus, Canis Lacton, which was a small black dog that was of his legs. He was only Longinus wielder to fully master his top. Yes, Leviathan says, but I assume we get to report findings. Is that correct? Shimizu and Sama, she was beautiful blonde that had large breasts that were confined with the wretched outfits that she could wear with a witch hat. She was the wielder of a Longinus, absolute demise. Yes and no. But I guess you could start off with that nonchalant to hear the report, so he could move on to the task at hand. Koei starts. Tch, we found nothing. He was brash, young man with brown hair, who wore a similar suit to Tobio's with black jacket, but there is a vest. Lucy untucked with a few buttons were undone and showed a little of his chest. On his shoulder was a small white cat. It was his independent sacred gear that was one of his four fiends. It was held spiritual of Toe, feared of ignorance that could relate to a large amount of electricity. However, the cat was named Byashacha by Koki. Now, not to me. Must he be so brash about it? What he means is that his base was empty. Either remnants of the chaos brigade came back for it, or someone beat us and cleaned the place. She was in Sama, another beauty like Leviathan, but she was brunette. She was also a busty with large breasts, but she could not tell because if her clothing was more constricting, it made her breasts look smaller than they appear to be. She wore what to be considered a school uniform. That consisted of a black skirt that reached mid-thigh with matching black top with white highlights and design. The top had blue sleeves that were full sleeved and wore black thigh socks. On her shoulder was a hawk. This was her independent sacred gear like Kowaki's. Like Koki's, my bad. It was the other four friends. It held spirit of Ornagami, the field of deviousness that had the power to manipulate wind. The hawk named Griffith by Natsumi holstered her hip was light last gun that was similar to ones used by the exorcists of church, but this one was castrified by the fallen angels of the Gagar. I see. And where is 
the rest of your team, Shimizu, since he noticed the two members were not here. Oh, Sesson and Shogunin stayed at the bar to look after in our absence. Did you need them to be here? Tobio says, no, that's fine. You can update them after the briefing, and to answer your question, Armos, this meeting has to do with the Zazel and Pyramid. It made Barkil grimace when hearing those names, and the action didn't go unnoticed by the others, but only Shimizu knew why Barkil acted like that. What did they do? Tamiel said with a serious tone. It was loving like Shimizu to accuse Azazel and Arpiamin of something. I'll show you, Shimizu said, as he produced a hologram cam that he had snuck into Azazel's lab after he had this meeting with Issei. On a holographic screen, the others saw Azazel, but he was naked and passed out. But also a woman with long purple hair and large breasts. It was Pyramid, and she was half naked as well. She was near Azazel. There was another naked woman with long silver hair and large breasts, but not as big as Pyramid's breasts. That was Ross Visa. The Rook of the Grimry's Parage. She was a little off to the side. The others could see that there was some white substance around the lab and on Pyramid and Ross's bodies. What the hell is this? Armos says, turning towards Shamazun, who remained calm. That is the betrayal of our former governor general against the pillar of the factions, Shemazun said. So he used alcohol to seduce them, Tamil says as he gestured bottles of alcohol that were in the room. I wouldn't say so. In regards to Piamen, I noticed her getting closer to Azazel, and he was amping up his flirtations towards her. I guess she wanted comfort with someone since Issei was in a coma, but... Did she inform him of this relationship? As for the Valkyrie, she is known to be a lightweight. Odin Dona would be a joke about it with Azazel. I knew she came to the upgrades to her some wand, and Azazel seemed adamant about working with her, Shamazu says. Shariel says. So they must have gotten those upgrades and to celebrate Azazel bought in alcohol using her weakness that Odin Dono indirectly gave him, Tamiel says. No. Shariel says, Azazel witnessed it. When they were in Kyoto, he laughed about it, so he was aware, but I guess Odin Dono probably gave more information than attended. When they were at those titty bars, and Azazel told him about how she acted when she was drunk, Sharhil says. No matter. The Sekiyuti has the other woman, right? Tamil says. I mean, Barkil, your daughter is with him, Tamil says again, turning to the aforementioned, but they saw a downcast look on his face. I think I should show you what we witnessed. You see, a couple days ago, Barkil and I were called by Sir Zex that Issei wanted to meet with us, so we went over. However, Issei Kun's condition didn't look so good. It was as if he was dying, he looked so pale, Shamazi said. The woman in the room let out a gasp as they thought of Issei dying. One because she saw him like a brother, as she did this with his rival. The other was a super fan of his show, developing a bit of a crush on him. What enemy could... Put the Red Dragon Emperor in a dying state, Koki said, with his brash nature, not believing that Issei could have been defeated so easily. The only one who could match him was Volley, since they're rivals. Oh, he has something to do with it, Shemaza said, as he produced crystals similar to Michael. Let me show you. <clears throat> Tobiel and Leviathan had a sense of dread. When they heard that Volley had something to do with his condition, it caused Levina to grab Tobio's hand and squeeze it. Tobio looked down and rubbed her hand to soothe her, but the also comfort herself. Natsumi's eyes widened and Koki actually shut up for once. The other Katris narrowed their eyes as they wanted to know what caused this. Shemizen activated the crystal and all in the office began to watch Issei's memories that showed that he felt he experienced the betrayal of those who he thought loved him. By the end of it, Levinathan and Natsumi were brought to tears. Tobia was in shock. Grigga gritted his teeth and clenched his fish. Armos was seething in rage. Shahil felt a headache coming from as did Tamil, but Tamil did go over to Barkil and place a hand on his shoulder. I'm going to kill that bastard, Armos says, preparing to go and rip apart Azazel. He deserves to pay, Koki said, smashing his fist on Shima's desk, who was still calm. None of you will do anything, Shamazi says, as the other's eyes wide in shock except Barkul's. What? You expect us to do nothing? Koki says. Have you gone mad, Shamazi? Armos says. Koki, you should calm down, Natsumi says. Her tone was low, but he still heard her, even though she was facing the floor. Calm down? You'd be pissed too, bird brain. I thought you liked the guy. You're going to let those bitches get away with this? This only caused more tears to run her face on the drip of the floor. Normally, she would argue back, but she couldn't. Her heart was aching as she felt like it would jump out of her chest. She began to shake and then it began to hyperventilate and she collapsed and Griffin flew on the floor onto the perch and was in the office. 
Natsumi, Tobio says, he was holding on to Leviatha, who was trembling Natsumi's collapse, and Tobio's yell caused Armos and Koki to lose their anger. Shariel went to check on her, although he did gingerly because of his own injuries. She seems alright, though it seems she fainted from emotional distress, Sabriel says. Here's what's going to happen, Shamsa said as he stood up from the desk. We're not going to do anything from now. Let me explain, as he saw how Koki and Armos were going to speak out again. Now, there is going to be a meeting with all the faction to discuss what we're going to do about them, but also to discuss another issue, as you see. Rizavine's body has gone missing, Shimahazi said, causing everyone's eyes to widen. You gotta be kidding me. You think he could be alive, Tamil says? I also thought Fafnir killed him and used his soul to release the beast. We all did. But his body is missing. There's a possibility of him being alive. Unless someone took the body, we would have to check with Hades to find his soul. Now back to the matter. I propose exile for those that betrayed the Pillar of the Alliance. According to Sir Zex, he had dispersed his Opai dragon money among them. I guess it's the last act of kindness to them. However, the reason for exile is because of their exploits in the war, which wouldn't warrant death. So exile is the next option. In addition, Armos, you are researching anti-magic, so begin developing what Will render them useless. Sharheel, you helped construct a device that helped insert remaining sacred geared pieces that constrained Vatra's soul. I will need you to reverse engineer that device. Don't let Azazel nor Prami know about them. From the meeting with Issei, Vitra was quite displeased with his carrier. So if you were able to reverse the device function to extract the sacred gear, we'll propose this idea to Vitra. The reason for this is because his carrier has been captured and will be on trial during the meeting that is coming up in a few weeks. I'll make sure that those seals are up to par, almost says. I'll get right on it, Sarhill says. It's a good thing that I kept the blueprints for that device. Who knows if Zavel would have tried to extract the sacred gear from Issei. I knew that he was envious of Issei having Gabriel's love. So I can see that this is his revenge, Sarhill says. Yes, well, I also stole the notes that were made by Sanatel, our former brother. I made a copy and gave it to Issei before he departed. I believe it may help him if he were to counter and other sacred gear users, Samasi said. Departed? To where? Tamil replies. I is Issei kind of okay? I'd like to apologize for what Vikan did to him. I thought he was happy with Genbu, Leviath says. Shazaku and Genbu was Vali yesterday at their clan meeting, Tobio said. Don't comfort her. We do not know. We do not want to raise any of their suspicions. And by the way, Tamil, get those two guards that escorted Issei to Azazel's laboratory. I don't want them to tell that Issei came by. Let them think that we do not know of their affair, so try to act normal. Also, they will be informed of the meeting. They will also be not be informed of the meeting. As for Issei's whereabouts, I do not know where he is, but I was informed that he was performed a ritual that would prevent him from dying. I know he survived the ritual because I was told he extracted the pawn pieces from his body and transported them back to the mouse. I do not know when he will return, but he is training. Toby will inform the rest of your team, and you can let her know that Issei is alright. When she wakes up, gesturing the unconscious Natsumi, if Azazel or Vali visits, try to act normal, and do not blame Bioko or Arthur Pentadragon. They did not know of their team's actions, so be civil with them, Shamazi says. Alright, Shamazi says, well listen... To your plan, calming his anger, you get the trash off the screen, referring to the camera that was showing Azazel's laboratory. Tell me, does Isekun hate us for what they did? Tamiel says he asked this because if they it, Isay did hate them, it would make their business plummet. Because if Isay was influential in the supernatural world, so he did worried about what could happen. No, after the meeting, he stayed with the Gremory clan. In fact, I heard also considered them his partners, so he holds no ill will towards them for their actions. As Tamiel let out a sigh of relief. We'll take our lead, Kyoko. You have to carry her. It's partially your fault as she fainted when she wakes up. Apologize, she gestured towards Natsumi. Who was in Sarhil's arms at the moment, garring the brash young man to follow his forder apologizing to their teammate. Yeah, I know, Koki said, watching over to pick up his drought teammate from Sahil. Well, I shall take my leaf, Shamus has said. I will update you on the progress on the device that you have made to distract Azazel, so it does not disturb me or to find out what I'm working on. Sarhill says, I understand, Shamaz says, and that is where we're going to stop for now. So, picking back up where we left off, right almost at the end of chapter 18. So let's go ahead and continue. I understand, Shamazadi says. With this confirmation, Sarhill gave a nod and leapt to the office. 
The same goes for me. I don't want them snooping around my work, Armos says. Yes, I'll be sure to keep them away, but remember, you'll have to act normal until a decision has been made by the rest of the factions, Shamazai said. Armos just huffed and stomped his way past the team slash dog and out the office. Tobio Kun, let me accompany you. I'm going to need a drink, Barkil says. You're always welcome, Barkil, Tobio says. With a small smile as he led the Leviathan out of the office with the Koiki. Carrying Natsumi and Barkil following behind, he knew that he and Barkil would have to speak with Shizaku about what Akano did. Akano did. They knew that she cared about her cousin ever since her aunt Shuri was outcasted by the Hajima clan. Sasaki kept in touch. Even with when Rias took in Akano as her queen, she remained in touch with Rias to see how Akano was doing. So they would have to explain the situation to prevent Sasaku from trying to contact Rias or Akano about the ordeal and raise their suspicions. I suppose I shall take my leave as well, Tamil said, seeing it was just him and Shamazi in the office now. Yes, continue on with your work, but don't forget to to bring those guards, Shamazu said, reminding his subordinate. Ah, uh, yes, I nearly forgot. I'll send them to your office right away, walking out of the office towards Azazel's laboratory, where the aforementioned guards had been stationed. Shizami sat down in his chair and closed his eyes, leaned back and exhaled. I wonder what you plan to do, Sir Zex, opening his eyes and staring at the ceiling, waited for those guards to come. Now, next Monday, at Co Academy. Three girls with cold looks in their eyes, as they stared at the academy, but unlike other Mondays, this was different because they planned to expose the so-called Onisamas of the school and the rest of their friends that they were nothing but skanks and that shouldn't be trusted. The girls got to the entrance gate and were stopped by a person with silver white hair. What do you want, Hanaki-san, Kadase says. Her voice was cold as she didn't want to be stopped. Kichu would like to see you. Then looked at the other two with Kadase. All of you. In the student council, she was surprisingly calm, considering that she spent this past weekend crying her eyes out since she discovered her now ex-boyfriend was cheating on her with people that she thought that were allies. Okay, take us, Moriyama says, as she walked the girl into defiance as she wanted to know what the student council president wanted, but she had a feeling about what it would be about. Momo gave her a nod, and they all started walking in the direction of the student council office. When they arrived, they found Sona sitting at her desk with a usual serious look. What do you need, Sonasama? With a frightened respect. She had now heard how Rias and Sona were childhood friends and remembered that Sona was there when Isen went berserk last Friday. You don't need to pretend. I think you know why I called you three here, right? Taking off her glasses to clean them back before putting it on her face. The question would be, do you know what we have? Kadase says. Who knows, Sona says, but yes. And the thing is what you do to plan with it, Sona says. Are you planning to silence us? Moriyama replies. She was shocking the student. She was mocking the student council president, which surprised the rest of her parage that was lounging around, except Garu, who was in the academy in Genshuru, who was in custody in an undisclosed location. What do you who do you think I am? A Yakuza? Sona says with an arched elbow but an emotionless look. The three girls slightly flinched, but held their composure. What do you think? That you're scary with that look, Akia says. I will admit, I am surprised. How did you not get scared, Sona said. Curious about their mental capability to not be scared. We've been preparing since Saturday to face you in those bitches, Kadase says. Hmm, interesting. But you don't know the weight of that recording returning back to her usual serious tone, Sona says. Oh, we know, and if we show it, it'll expose your friends and all of those that get what they deserve. Beginning to get upset, Mariama was. First... I don't want to stop you, but I can't let you spread it, at least not yet, Sona says. Why should we trust you, Akia says. After all, we know that you're friends with the tomato head, Rias. Well then, you know something, but the information is wrong now, Sona says. What's wrong? Kadase replied, a bit confused. I do not condone what they did. I've ended my friendship with Rias. I was friends with her, but not anymore, Sona says. Oh, is that so? Akia says. She didn't believe Sona and continued to hold mockery in her tone. Aren't you afraid of what I can do to you, Sona says with a challenging smile. She was beginning to like the brass of this girl. We know that you can expel us for making them look bad and probably for beating Issei, but I do not care if I get expelled as long as they get what they deserve, Mariana says, walking closer to the desk to challenge Sona. Oh, and now you help Issei, Sona says. How interesting before you would come asking if I would expel him or send him to prison for peeping on you, Sona says. That's true. He wasn't that bad, I guess. He didn't deserve hatred from us now that I think about it, Kadase says. How is that, Sona replied. 
Koichu. You'd think that the kendo club did not know that he and the other two would go peek at us. Some of the girls even waited for them, Kadase says. Why is that? Sona replied. She was curious about this revelation. While her gaze was on Kadase, she noticed Moriyama had a blush on her face and these and sniffered slightly. Some of our club are not saints as they seem, because they were the ones who made the holes for them to peek at us, yet some of them were hypocritical as they were the ones who wanted to hit them the most. The more I thought about it, we were the ones who deserved to be expelled with a sad look, but Mariyama also had a sad look on her face. So why are you telling me this now? Sona says. Because you didn't see him. Tears begin to go down her cheeks. You did not see how he was that day. He was completely broken. And even in that state, instead of yelling at Kadase or me, or telling us to die when we tried to talk to him, all he did was talk with a broken voice. Nothing like he was in the classroom from what I heard. He did not scream at us, insult us, or lash at us. He just sat there and let it out. So we recorded it, gesturing herself and her companions. In these moments, I understood what kind of a shitty person I am. Crying at Kadase walked up to cover her best friend. How so, Sona says, but she had a small smile as she was putting the pieces together. It's because she discovered something that day, something very funny. You want to know, Kadase says? She's in love with him. Damn. Her eyes widen as she remembered all the times that Mariyama complaining about Matsuda or Motohama looking at her, but never Issei with Kadase exposing the secret of the kendo club. It made sense. Mariyama wanted Issei to look at her, and she beat him for letting his friends see her. While hypocritical, she could see how Mariyama got jealous when Issei started dating Rias because if she wanted was straightforward with her feelings earlier, maybe she and Issei could have been a couple, and sure, she may have a chance now, but Issei has to forgive her first. She has a weird way of expressing her love. Who would have thought the captain of the Kendo Club was a pervert lusting for a perverted beast? Love is strange and works in many ways, Akia finishes. Is that funny to you? Sona couldn't help but chuckle. Kadase glaring at the student council president. <laughs> it's not. But that my sister was right about one of you being in love with that idiot because of your complaints. But I wasn't sure who. Now back to the main topic, the recording. Going from Muse to Sirius again, Sona did. The three were confused to see Sona's quick change of behavior as Mariyama rubbed her tears out. Now... There will be a school board meeting, and as you know, the Gremory's Rias' family will be there. And as you can see, if you release that recording now, Rias will likely lie to her family. As a result, they could possibly take funding money from the Kendo Club and the Journalism Club because they will think that you lied to defame her. And as you can see from her attitude, Rias is quite spoiled. Coming up with a story to delay the girls from releasing the recording. Can they really do that, Akia says? Wondering if they can't, they can take money from their clubs. Yes, Rias' family is a wealthy family, but I intend to expose what she did, as they are aware that she is, or was, dating Issei, and they are very prideful, believing that she grew up to be a faithful girlfriend. Akia-san, I am sure you remember the incident that happened on Friday, correct? Sona said. We weren't in class that day, but we heard about it, Kaise says. Yes. You asked a student for their phone. I'm assuming they had video evidence, Sakura said. You are correct. If you give me a copy of the recording so that I can show the Gremories on who their daughter really is at this school board meeting, she continued her lie as she knew that the Gremories already knew of Rias' infidelity, but she needed to convince the girls. When will the meeting take place, Mariana said. In a few weeks. Oh, I will need you to do me a favor, Sona said. Why should we, Kadase replied. Because when I expose Rias at school board meeting, I will convince the Gremory to take some funding from her club and give it to your respective club, Sona says. So what's the favor, Mariyama said. I need to act normal around the girls and try to quell any rumors. I don't want their suspicions to be raised and keep track of them, Sona said. Fine, but we'll only give you a copy of the day of the meeting, Kadase says. That is fine. So, standing up from the chair, do we have a deal? Sona said, holding out her hand. It's fine by me. I can easily manipulate Azia, Akia said, walking up and shaking Sona's hand. Mariyama and Kadase looked at each other and nodded before shaking Sona's hand as well. I hope you don't cross us, Kadase said, which Miriam had nodded in agreement. I don't plan on it, Sona replied. She held no lies in her eyes. When the two saw no fault in their words, they simply left for their class with Akia. So, what do you think of them, Sona said, turning to her Parage members. They seemed determined, Momo said. She was holding on to Ruko, who was still sad. I didn't mind them, Rhea said, shrugging her shoulders. Who would have thought that the Kendo Club was perverted? With a small smile on her face, Tsubasa said. Tomo starts. They were quite spirited. I like them. She was a little sad about Gaspar, but that wouldn't ruin her mood. 
I don't mind them either. When they sound like they could be fun to work with, Benia said, she had a feeling where this was going. Good. I plan to add them to our barrage after we release Sanji. Everyone's eyes widened except for Tsubaki and Benma's. But Kyocho, what about Kyako and Gengo coming out of her sad stupor? I know that what Giramusha did was wrong, but they won't have a place to go, Rukuro says. Not to worry about that. I figured you and Momo would object to this because of your connection to those kids, and you're right. They won't receive any support from the Sea Tree Clan after we release Sanji, but they have quite the benefactor for them, Sona says. Well, who's that, Kyocho? Momo said, wanting to know who would help the two young kids. It's Issei, Sona said. Shocking terms of them except Tsubaki, you see. I went to my sister yesterday and she told them how Issei is dispersing his Opai dragon money and some of that is going to Kasho and Gengo. She said that he said that they shouldn't have to suffer because of what Genshiro did. Since you two care so much, you will be in charge of them. Take care of them. Eventually, they will know what their brother did. But until then, look after them, Sona says. Hey, catch yo, Momo and Rukio says, feeling much better that the kids will be cared for. Good. Until we release Sanji, they will have to support... They will have the support with the Sea Tree Clan. After that, I will talk with my sister and assign the funds that are meant for them and to be shared account for the two you excess. And for them to access when they get older, Sea Tree Clans. I mean, Sona says... Rukio ran up to Sona and hugged her, crying happily into her chest. Thank you, Kyocho. Thank you. Snuggling into her president's chest. I may look like I'm heartless sometimes, but I'm not heartless. But I'm not that heartless. Smiling as she patted her subordinate's head. It caused the others to smile as well. Now we got a job to do. Until the meeting. So go be on the lookout. Get to class. They said, yes, of course. All of the Sichi Paraj at the set at the same time, grabbing their school briefaces and going off to the class, feeling a little bit better going into this week. Now we're in the Cave of Drake. And this is one of the author's notes. Drake's Cave, or Cave of Drake, is cave within a special room that Drake uses a bedroom or personal quarters. Beelzard's Cave is the cave that holds both special and room, treasure room to it, and it leads to the outside world. So Drake's Cave is a cave within a cave, if that makes sense. Now, picking back up. At the entrance of the cave, Issei sat in the front of the fire. He was studying. Despite burning his old school stuff, he still kept up with his studies. A week had passed since the ritual, but for Issei, it was five weeks. Thanks to that special space that Drake's cave was in, he had used the flowers from the ritual to illuminate the cave, giving it more feel more homey. He then set out a tracking the things and that came out of the boosted gear, since due to the ritual it sent everything out, including the pulse of energy that boosted. The time and space where he was located before it was three times as fast as the outside world, but now it was five times as fast. After locating and organizing everything, he realized a small thing that he had forgotten, which food as he thought to stay in the cave to train, but he needed food to sustain his growth. It was just like when he was training with Tani out in the wild, so he didn't. As a plus, he found a box full of beans and other canned goods, where all he had was to cook them, and they were ready to eat in about 18 bottles of water along with some Indian, which he could use on the waters in the streams of the forest he found a note that from his mother telling him how she figured that he would forget some necessities so she packed them for his journey this way Issei didn't have to leave the cave since he had clothes a few plates and spoons about 10 knives that his mother had shrunk down and packed into a box that contained the conqueror's coat so when they were released from his sacred gear they grew with regular size again he knew how to make a fire already so that he could cook the food that was provided for him and he began to rationalize it so that he would not run out either. In those five weeks, Issei began his training as he began to run, do push-ups, abdominal exercises such as sit-ups, and even try to punch trees and harden his skin. Of course, it led to his hands bleeding, but he went through. But had bandages wrapped around his hands, he was no longer pale anymore. He looked like when he finished training with Tani for the first time. He was not a humanoid dragonette, though. As, e as said before, Issei kept up with his studies as made promise to pass his finals. He knew that when he left, there was at least two months left of school, so he was trying to stay on point, which is why he got the books about mathematics, chemistry, history, and he remembered where he last left off, so he could continue his studies much easier. In between the workouts and reading books, Issei tried to stabilize his magic core. He did this, so when he felt like he could go outside of Beelzard's cave to go hunting and maybe to be able to store meat if he could use a little ice magic he wasn't very successful and would either freeze or burn his hands he was very thankful that his mother thought of everything he was shocked 
that she got ready of this less than a day too. He had some things that helped him with frostbite and burns. Another thing that he found was a note from Fafnir, along with the downfall dragon sphere. He was shocked by it, as he didn't think Fafnir would leave Azia, but he was entrusting Issei to find him a partner that was loyal, so Issei decided to honor that dragon's request. After all, Seraphal had told him to find people even though she was a figment of his imagination. Now he was reading away, until his stomach growled. Damn, I better go outside and see what I can grab to eat. Don't want to waste my resources, Issei said, so he packed up his book, grabbed some bags and a hunting knife, walked out of the special domain into the treasure of room of Bielsart's cave. Man, it's been so long I've spent in this place, Issei says, as he walked, he saw a box that held the gloves. Those could help me, but I'm not strong enough yet, as he continued walking until he saw the black blade of Agnite. Someday, Issei said. Finally, stepping out of Bielzard's cave, he noticed it was the evening and the sun was setting compared to the night sky of the artificial room in a short time. He saw his prey it was a rooster of some kind, a western caper sally, to be exact. Issei... <clears throat> Issei trailed carefully behind it and entered the forest. Following the rooster, unfortunately, he stopped on a twig. This alerted the rooster, causing it to run. Issei was surprised by its feet and tried running after it, but the hesitation was a mistake as he began to lose sight of it, until he couldn't find it anymore. Damn it, Issei said. I'm no match for the chicken. Drake would be laughing if he was me, if he was awake. Exhaling in defeat. Guess it's canned goods for me, Issei said. He was about to go until he heard some twigs snapping in the distance and decided to follow the sound. Curiosity got the better of him, but he was moving more carefully, getting his hunting knife at the ready as well. He heard a sound of a stream getting close, so he concluded that something might have come for a drink. <clears throat> He was right. As Issei walked quietly as possible, he stumbled upon a deer. Moving about of any possible vision that the deer may have to prevent from spotting him, he took note that this was probably male because of the antlers on its head. He watched as the deer approached the stream, and Issei decided to wait for the deer to start drinking water. As it did, Issei crept up behind it and prepared himself. He felt it was in range. He managed to throw himself towards the deer with a knife in hand. The deer rose and turned its head when he heard the sound of Issei's footstep as he was jumping, but what it saw was how a knife approached its face. Issei wound up stabbing the deer in the eye since it raised its head and Issei took advantage of its pain to wrestle it to the ground, kicking one of the legs and wrapping his free arm around its neck to keep the head steady. The deer was thrashing on the ground, tried turning its head towards Issei, hoping its antlers would do something. It nicked Issei on his left cheek, so Issei had to do something quickly. Damn it, Issei says, pulling the knife out of the deer's eye and began stabbing the knife wildly into the deer, head and neck. It only caused the deer to thrash more, but Issei held, receiving a few more scratches from the answer. Damn it, just die, Issei said, just repeatedly stabbing down into the deer as more blood slept onto those clothes, and finally, the deer became motionless. It definitely was not a clean kill by any means, but he did it. I did it, I won, Issei says, taking deep breaths as he relished in his victory. Now to claim his reward. Taking the bags out of his pockets, he began to cut up the deer, skimming it to take the meat and store it into the bags. He was a little away from the cave, and it was getting dark, so he worked quickly. This should do for now, Issei said, picking up three bags of meat and walking back to the cave to enjoy something new to eat. And that is the end of chapter 18. The Repentance of the Valkyrie and the Knight in Doubts of an Angel This is basically a continuation of chapter 17. Uh, so it's actually, yeah, so let's go ahead and do this. After Shimizu talked with the guards that were stationed at Azazel's lab inside the lab, Ross Vaisa began to wake up. Her head was groggy and hurting, and then she felt her body. She was naked and covered in vicious liquid. And she tried to remember what happened. She felt for a stale, salty taste in her mouth as her breath smelled like wood on her body. She was at the corner of a lab and quietly threw up. She shivered in disgust. She remembered going to the guard for upgrades, her wand, which Asagel insisted that he work on it. <clears throat> She entrusted him, and when the upgrades were complete, Azazel insisted again that they celebrated. She wasn't good with alcohol, but she caved in under peer pressure of Azazel and Pyramin. Next thing she knows, Pyramin is kissing her, and then Azazel. No, 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 Ross Vice says. Looking over, she saw Azazel and Pyramin cuddle up and also naked. Pyramin's body was covered like hers. Ross Vice's heart sank to her stomach as tears began to well up in her eyes. She used her vision as a demon to find her clothes in the dark and utilized a small water to 
spell to clean herself off. She was disgusted with herself. She betrayed Issei. She never got a chance to confess as he developed feelings for him when he promised to protect her from a lucid. But now her purity was taken away by another man, and she didn't have a chance to confess. She felt disgusted with herself. What would her grandmother think, or even Rias? She quietly made her way out of the lab, unsealing any alarms that Azazel may have placed. She got a glimpse of the bottle that Azazel insisted that they drink, and now that she could clearly see it without Azazel covering the bottle label, she could also see that it was red wine, and that it also acts as an astrophytic. She also noticed another bottle labeled Spanish Fly. She realized that Azazel must have mixed this with the wine or heighten her sexual desires and get her drunk. She wanted to cry as she could not believe someone she trusted would do something like this, and she didn't know why. As she exited, she heard a conversation by a couple of guards that were stationed outside the laboratory, carefully hid herself in the shadows not to be detected. Can't believe the Red Dragon Emperor saw something like that. You think he hates all of us fallen angels now, guard one says? Probably, I mean I would. Can't believe Azazel would do that, the second guard said. Raz Vice's eyes lost shine. Issei had seen her. She felt sick to her stomach. She figured that she would go to the mansion and explain herself. She would understand if he didn't want to be with her. She wouldn't either. When the guards had left, she transported herself to the Hyoto Mansion to apologize for her stupidity. Now, at the Hyoto Mansion, the girls enjoyed their lunch, of course, happy without a care of the consequences that would come their way, damage them emotionally, mentally, physically, physiologically, and possibly p physically. They were packed for a vacation to the mansion that they trained for their raiding game against Riser. A transport circle appeared, and Ross Vaisa appeared. They seemed happy to her, until Rhea said something that made her sick. Ross Vaisa, you have fun with Pyomin and Azazel? Rhea said. She had mischievous twinkle in her eye. How did she... Shouldn't she be mad? I betrayed Issei, Ross Faisa. She looked confused. Volley told us. When we had our fun with him. Don't worry, your secret is safe with us. Anyway, we're heading to the vacation home that my family owes. You know, way to get a little more relaxation. You want to come, Rhea said? No, thank you. I need to prepare for the school week, Ross Faisa says. We already talked with Sona. She gave us a week off, Akino said. Well, you are a student, I am a teacher, Akino. It's different for us, Ross Vice said, trying to contain her anger. It's okay. Unfortunately, Kiba cannot come with us. Said he missed too much school. Same with Gasper. You know, the keep up appearances, it's unfortunate. Maybe you try Volley or Sanji, Irina, since Kiba won't come. Sanji was not half bad. Did you get any word from him, Azio chan Rhea said. No, Onisama, I haven't. I guess he's still on a mission that Sona sent him on, Azio said. Raz Vaisa was appalled. They cheated on Issei with people that he considered to be his closest friends? And if the guards' words made any indication, he saw them, and that means if the guards knew, then it's a possibility that the factions knew. Raz Vaisa hung her head and proceeded to walk by them into her room. I'd like to be excused, please, Raz Vaisa says. Oh, sure, Rhea said. Matt? Mao, Ross Vice sensei doesn't seem well, Irina said. She'll be fine. Maybe Azazel gave it to her. Good. That's still that's still tired. I can see what you meant by Volley being a little rough, Zenovia said. Ara, ara, I guess he learned from Azazel. If he made Ross Vice a speech, Losakuna said. The girls laughed a little, although Kuroka and Konoko could detect sadness in Ross Vice's verse, but they weren't sure why. I'll go check on her. After all, it's my job as an angel to help others, Irina said. You definitely helped Kiba, as you wrote him in the hotel in the bedroom here, Arrow Angel, causing Irina to blush in embarrassment at the others to laugh. Shut up, Zenovia. Anyway, I'll be back. As she went to follow Rasvaisa, who heard everything and was disgusted, especially with Irina. Rasvaisa laid in her room. Her eyes were blank as she heard a soft knock on the door. May I come in? Irina said she waited a few seconds and opened the door to find Ross Vice staring at the ceiling. Ross Vice, are you okay? Zenovia said you were at the hotel with Kiba. Who else was there? Her tone was devoid of emotion, but Irina didn't seem to notice. Oh, it was me, Zenovia, Gabriel, Kiba, and Gasper. Then we joined the others in the main bedroom, but I only stuck with Kiba. Kun, sometimes Gasper Kun, if Kiba was taken, Sanji and Volley looked too rough, and I didn't want that. Irina said, let me guess. Kiba and Gasper just laid there, right? So, yeah, how did you know, Irina said. They didn't seem too much into it, but it was good. Rosessa looked disgusted at the so-called angel. So she did fall for someone who didn't love her? From what she said, Kiba and Gasper seemed like victims. And like her... And like her, were probably riddled with guilt from what they did to their former friend. D. 
didn't you say you wanted to be his guardian angel? Ross Vices said her tone became cold. Huh? Irina replied. Do you think Kiba loves you? Irina said. We slept together, doesn't that count? Irina replied. So you're saying Rias loves Vali and Sanji, two different men, because she slept with them? Ross Vices says. Uh, no, I guess not, Irina replied. She was beginning to become a little uncomfortable. Do you really think you deserve those wings on your back and the halo after what you did, Ross Faisa said. What, Irina replied. You're a smart girl, you're a smart girl, or you should be. Tell me what caused you to sleep with Kiba, Ross Faisa said. Well, Zenovia talked to me about gaining new experiences like Rias told her, and then told me to talk to Gabriel-san about it. We heard about their experiences with Volikon and Sanjikon, and so Zenovia suggested Kiba, which I guess Rias talked him and let us know that he and Gasper accepted. So we took him to a hotel, just in case, Irina says. Just in case what? She sharply countered, Rosfeta says. Uh, um, Irina didn't know how to answer that. You know what, Irina? You have fun on your trip. Tell the others I'm fine, but if I was ever your childhood friend, I'd wish I'd never met you. You can leave. Speaking so coldly as she turned her back towards the angel. When Rasvaisa said that Irina wanted to cry, that line just really hurt. It made her wonder if listening to Zenovia was a wise decision. She looked up for her during their time at church, and Rias usually makes the right decisions. But that line made her sad, almost made her wish she didn't meet herself either, because she listened to the wrong people. In doing so, she also ruined Gabriel. Seeing as Ross Vaisa didn't seem interested in talking any to her anymore, she left the room. She shielded herself off to hide her sadness, figuring that it was some cryptic message from Ross Vaisa to teach her, since she was a teacher and a teacher teaches their students. So, when she left, she felt a tear go down her face, just like last night. She felt his pain, this pain in her chest. She decided to go ask the girls if she could contact Gabriel to join them. Maybe she can provide some clarity about doubt that she was having. But she was a bit fearful of Volley trying to sleep with her. So she secretly played with the Harakaku wouldn't come as she feared that she had forsaken something. Which could cost her everything that she strived for to be an angel. Ross Vaisa made a mental note to talk to Kiva, but also needed to make sure that Rias did not follow her and keep track of her. She heard the girls leave and gave a sigh of relief. They were not in the house anymore, so she decided to play seals, as she did not want Azazel trying to come into her personal space. She wasn't sure how to approach the Hyoto about how the girls were doing until she heard how they were in on it. When she was about to come downstairs after taking a nap, so, no word from him, Mickey says. No, since the girls are gone, we can see my mother. Maybe he's hiding there, Kuro said. It seemed he blocked our numbers, Mickey said. Tch, he can pay for the phone bill himself. That perverted bat. Remember, he's just like a low class like Rhea said. I don't think he could get much income without us, Kuro says. Razvaisa was appalled. It was one thing to cheat, but lying about Issei's achievement. How far did Rias go to ruin his life? What did he ever do? That was so wrong. She began to hate Rias. She was truly a devil. A spoiled one at that, but then she she remembered that if the factions knew something, either they were in on it or they haven't done anything yet. But she decided that she could stay in his house. She contacted Kiba, asking for assistance as she moved in with him. Of course, she had to make sure that Rias and the others did not use their familiars to watch over her. Once she packed up her belongings, she transported herself to Kiba's apartment and she noticed Gasper was also there. It seemed that he had been crying and was being tended to by a 13-year-old haired girl. Hello, Kiba's son, Gasper's son, Rosvisa said. Oh, thanks for coming, Rosvisa. You said there was something you that you needed to discuss, Kiva said. He seemed riddled with guilt and hurting on the inside. Yes, but may I ask, who is this? Ross was really curious about the female in the room. Oh, my name is Tosca. My, I'm Isaiah's, or as you know him, Kiva's childhood friend. Changing your childhood friend for someone else's. Looking quizzically at Kiva, who gritted his teeth in frustration. Don't mention that delusion, Harpy, Kiba said, as he crushed the soda can in his hand. If she had any brain, she would be looking for Issei, not prancing around with the rest of them like a damn harlot. So why did you sleep with them, Rosvice said. It's my fault, looking at the former Valkyrie, Tokus, he says. He did it to protect me. Rias threatened to harm Tokus's chan. If I didn't comply with her orders, she claimed that was just a little side fun. She didn't even consider Issei Kun's feelings or care about him. She decided to conjure up this stupid plan of getting new experiences and having fun when he was in a coma. I heard she took Valerie there. So, to Isekun's room, she told him that the girls that she said that she hoped Isekun would wake up, but she was going to continue having fun. Isekun woke up and then continued with this bullshit. He growled and slammed his fist down on the table in frustration. It was rare to see Kiba so mad. It only ever happened a few times. It scared Gasper, Tokusa, and Rosvisa a little. 
I hate my mistress. She's a good-for-nothing, selfish, spoiled brat. I hope they all get punished. I already accepted my fate. As he walked over and slumped on the couch, their fun most likely ruined my happiness. They don't know what they have until they lose it, Kiva says. You both must have been grieving for a while, Rasvice said. Try the whole weekend. They dragged us to a hotel for more fun. It was already bad enough that we did it in Isekun's room. How sick is that? She didn't even have the courtesy to respect his space. None of them did. I hope Irina would see her mistake. I even asked what about Isekun and she told me, who cares? Who cares? I care. I'm supposed to be his best friend and I got roped into this bullshit because that damn blue-haired whore suggested me as a partner. Anger tears streamed out his eyes. Zenovia? Rosvisa said, Know any other blue-haired whores? His tone was dead. The bitch had sex with every guy there. She forced Gasper down. The so-called angel forced me down. Now the girl is delusional. I don't love her, and I never will. My happiness was supposed to be with Tsubaki-san, but I don't know. I thought Gabriel would see in our hearts that Gasper and I didn't want to do this, but Zenovi and Irina convinced her otherwise. Even worse is Rias lying about Issei's achievements. Just to get the Hyotos to support her. I can't believe such a violent and greedy people raise someone as horrible as as honorable as Isekan. I heard. It's why I moved out, and thanks for letting me stay here. While well, I look for a new apartment. Yeah, you can share the room with Toskashan. Then turning the girl. Is that okay with you, Toskashan? Kiba said. That's fine with me. It's nice to have another female in the house with a slight smile. How did you get involved in this, Gasper? Turning her attention towards the Daphne on the ground. They said they knew how I'd become a man and showed myself to Valerie how I ought to have grown. I didn't understand what they meant, but something felt off. But when they took Kiva Senpai and I to the hotel, his tears dripped on the floor, but I didn't become a man. I just became another bastard that hurt Issei Senpai. Toast got to soothe the deaf girl on the ground, bawling his eyes out for what he has done. It seems we've all accepted fate. I unfortunately had slept with Azazel and Piaomin. He had worked on upgrades to my wand and pressured me into celebrating with drinks. I should have just left. But then Piaomin joined and when I came, I was naked with his semen all over me. The other occupants were shocked by it because they knew Ross Faisa gets when she drinks. On my way out, I saw something. It was a bottle of an astronaut called Spanish Fly. I figured that he must have mixed it with my wine. I was in shock that someone that I trusted would drug me, so I left. Then I heard a couple of the guards mention that Issei came and visited, and they mentioned Azazel. It leads me to believe that the factions may know of this, and that Issei has probably seen me and has other girls with our supposed lovers. Well, I want to disagree. It seems plausible, honestly. I don't know how Rias and the others couldn't see that Volley and Sanji only want them for their bodies, but it's not worth listening to me. As I heard them talking about it, they just wanted to get one up over Isekun. Volley cares for his fight with Isekun, and Sanji just wanted to fuck around. And he didn't care about his own two girlfriends and how they would feel. And before you ask, he was bragging about it to Volley, though I don't know the bastard cared. I guess we were surrounded by selfish people. The best thing we can do is lay low and wait for the factions to take action or not. I guess you're right. I'm going to bed, Kiba said, trudging himself to the guest room in the apartment. Good night. Good night, they all replied. All go as well, getting up from the ground. Good night. He followed Kiba to the guest room. Since he had moved in with Kiba, he could not stay in the ORC. Good night. With the two boys gone, Tokusa looked towards Ross Faisa and asked her to do the same. Do you really accept your fate? Tokusa said, yes. We harmed a good man and strong warrior to possibly no extent, and he's the pillar of the faction. There's bound to be repercussions, Ross Faisa said. I see. Tell me, how did you fall for you, say? I mean, Tokusa says, well, I didn't have romantic feelings for him at first. I guess he sort of grew on me. We were in a battle against the Lucid Lufage. He's the younger brother of Gravia Lucid, who is Rias' brother, his sister-in-law. During the battle, Isakun told me that he would protect me, and he held that promise. At first, I had feelings of admiration for him, but those feelings turned into love, and the worst part about it is he'll never get to know, because he saw me with another man, as her eyes welled up. Note, Rosvice has yet to confess to Issei, by the way. Well, we better get some rest. Tomorrow is a school. 
day, after all, as she got up and headed to the bedroom and prepared to sleep, but she patted Ross Vice on the back when she passed her. Yes, indeed. As she wanted to shower the smell from her body physically, but emotionally, she knew she would never be clean. While in the shower, she slumped down against the wall and cried. Her grandmother would be ashamed of her. She knew if her suspicions were right, it's likely that they knew her grandmother and Odin. She only hoped that she could talk with her grandmother and explain the side of the story if given a chance and apologize to Issei. For the time being, she could only focus on herself. She couldn't trust the other girls now, but she did hope that her words got through to Irina. She did not understand why they acted like Issei did not exist. Feeling her shower begin to turn cold. She knew that she needed to get out and she washed enough time sitting on the floor. After getting out and drying herself, she changed into her sleepwear before joining Tosa saw in the bed. As tears rolled down her eyes, her sobs alerted to so that something was wrong, and Tokusa understood. She always had a bad feeling about Rias, and she could see why. Shh, it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. She robbed Ross Vice's back as she listened to the woman sob. She felt bad as if the three. She felt that she put Kiba in this situation since she was close to him, and she was being used to keep him in line. From what Kiba told her, Sir Zex, Rias' older brother, would listen to Rias because he was a Siskon. So she knew Kiba didn't have any many places to go, because if Rias could lie to the Hyoto, she could manipulate the others to get what she wanted. She did blame the Gremory clan a little for raising such a selfish person, but right now, she could only comfort these three people in the apartment with her. She wished that she wasn't stuck in this 13-year-old body either, or she could be more of use. So she made a mental note to train her sacred gear. It was a defensive one, but something is better than nothing. I'll be with you all night, Tokusa said, as she wrapped her little arms around Ross Vice and hugged her from behind, cooing her to sleep because falling asleep herself. Over the course of the week, Ross Vice noticed some Particular glances from the kendo duo in Akia, which made her a little nervous about something happening while she was away. She heard the murmurs of an incident that happened, but she couldn't pinpoint it. She noticed how Issei and his friends were not there and deduced that the incident was around them. Speaking with Kiba at home, they believe that Sanji and Vali joined the other girls on their vacation, but they are far from truth, as they know they didn't know Sanji was captured and Vali no longer had interest in the girls anymore. But it will only be a matter of time for the girls to understand that they're fun ruin more lives they could understand it will cost not only their happiness but others as well for tosa she trained herself and when she could she drained the one with the three she trained with one of the three as she wanted to help them she only resigned to the possible fates but she aimed to cheer them up she and be of use for them. For Kiba and Gaspar and Ross Vaisa, they accepted their fate and judgment, whatever punishment that will be given up on them. They will accept it and not look back, only moving forward, hoping they can better their lives all is said and done. Although being with Tokusa helped wash away the bad taste in their mouth for what they did, training her in either sword motion, magic, or helping with their sacred gear is simply hanging around the young girl. She was the momentary lapse of happiness. And that is the end of the OVA. So, we're going to stop right there for now. I'm not sure if this 40 minutes used their popularity to get things in order. Those three have impressed me. I'm amazed they were able to contain their incident, Tsubaki says. Yeah. And we also learned that Genshiro was more of a bastard than we thought, Sona said. I agree. Using his dragon from Minerals to seduce Ravel when she was in doubt and also that girl. Who gave him and those other two bastards her underworld to frame Issei, Tsubaki says. Yeah. At least she is lucky that Riser could not leave her alone, Sona says. Well, he does not hold a leadership position like Sir Zexama and Ajukasama, and her mind is too valuable to lose, Tsubaki says. Yeah, her intellect is almost on par with my own. He will most likely keep her away from Rias. It's why he is having his Paraj watch over her while Rukio delivers her schoolwork. But the deal benefits the Citri clan and its hospitals, Sona said. Flashback. So this is a flashback to what they're talking about right now. Ravel had finished her vacation with the other girls and returned to the Hyoto mansion. The Hyoto greeted them, but she could see that the smiles on their faces were fake. They were hiding something. She just didn't know what. Irina also looked conflicted throughout the vacation as well. She would usually talk with Gabriel for a few days that the Seraph was with them. Excuse me, Ria-sama, I'm going to check on my family. Said I would last weekend, so I will go see if there is an issue, Ravel said. Oh, that's fine. She was a bit annoyed because Volley did not show up and did not respond to any of their calls or texts. Son, did Volley ever come by? Now turning her attention back to Miki, Rias did. Uh, no, none of the boys came by, Miki said, a bit nervous but calming down. Oh, it seems like they're playing hard to get, Akana said. 
why are they nervous? Something is not right? Volley-sama didn't answer Ryo-sama or Akano-sama's calls. Neither nor Azia have heard from Genshiro, Kiba, and Gasper already don't want to be around us. If last Thursday was any indication, they just laid there. Don't know what Zenovian eeriness uh, saw on them, Ravel said. Russ Vaisa is not here, Konoko said, checking for any presences. Oh well, at least I proved that I was better lover than that mangy cat. With a slight smirk, remembering that Thursday of they got rubbed in her face during the vacation, Rival did. Yeah. Rosnaya doesn't seem to be here, Kuroka said, not sending the Valkyrie Zora. Maybe she went out, Lepe replied. The Hyoto looked a little surprised when they heard Ross Vice's name. That's right, we did not say that Ross Vice's sensei was not coming with us, Ravel said. Orphus remained silent before walking away to the rooftop where the shrine was built for her. But was her is. We'll take care, everyone, Ravel said, as she made a magic circle to take her to her family's territory. Take care, Ravel, son, Azia said. Goodbye, my Kohai, Akuna replied. See you soon, Ravel, with a smile to the phoenix, but for some reason, Ravel did not like that smile. The reason is because that smile is the same smile that made her continue with the worst mistake that she can ever do that will cost her greatly. Fortunately or unfortunately, it will be the last time that she ever sees that smile. Now in the Phoenix Territory. When Ravel was transported, she appeared outside of her family's mansion, something that confused her. Weird, I thought it would appear in my room, Ravel said, making a communication circle to let her mother know that she was here. Okasama, I've arrived. Oh, Ravel, you arrived? No maid informed me of your arrival, Diana said. That is because I appeared outside of the mansion, Ravel said. I see. There was a pause before she responded again. I'll let security know that you're free to enter, if they haven't. Thank you, Ravel said, cutting off the call. She waited a couple minutes until the gates opened for her. She walked in. She felt a little unsettled by the looks that the guards were giving her. Did something happen? Why are you all looking at me like that? They seem sad or rather disappointed. Did I do something wrong? They know something, Ravel said. She continued walking as she entered the mansion. She was shocked to see that there was not many servants around. But whatever she did, she received a look of sadness, disappointment, and even contempt from a few of the maids. When she arrived with her mother was, they world curtly reply, family room, and nothing else. Just those two words. It seemed a bit robotic from how they answered. She made her way to the family room. When she saw her mother, her brother, Riser, and surprisingly, Sona, her queen, and Pon, Tsubaki, and Rukuro, Riser's queen, Yebuluna, sat in his lap, while the rest of them were talking amongst themselves. When they saw her, their looks changed. Ni and Li, the cat twins, gave her sad smiles as they waved at her. Ili and Nell just looked at her with the expressions as if they were going to cry. The maid pawns, Marad and Boulette, each gave a snort just shook their heads. The last two pawns, Sherry and Mera, gave her a glance and then looked away. Her former fellow bishop, Mai, had tears coming down her eyes before she looked away from Ravel's gaze. The knight, Carlemine, just looked down in sadness as the other knight, Cirrus, gave her a glare, but she had a tear roll down her eye. The rooks, Isabella, and Zulon just looked neutral and they let out a sigh and they just looked away. Something must have happened, Ravel said. Ah, Ravel, you're here, Diana said as she finished taking a sip from her tea. Riser, bring her. Riser moved Ubaluna from his lap as the queen looked at Ravel in sadness, as her king stood up and walked to her. When Riser stood in front of her, he looked sad and disappointed. He placed his hands on his shoulders and gave her a quick hug before he let her go. Onisama? Ravel said, a bit surprised, confused by his actions. Come. His tone sounded almost emotionless as he placed his hand on her back and guided her to the chair next to her mother. Sit down, Ravel, Diana said. I, as she sat down, how are you, Okusama? Last we talked, you informed me that you were very busy. If I may ask, why is Koichi-sama here? And where is Odo-sama? Gesturing to Sona, who kept her eyes closed as she drank her tea. I'm quite fine, and your father is busy with other arrangements with Ruval. The reason why Sona is here to make a deal regarding the allocation of the Phoenix Tears to the Seatree Hospitals on behalf of Riser, since he is going to be the future head of the clan. I see... But don't we provide enough tears to the hospitals already, Ravel said? Yes, but Riser wished to double it. He was going to triple it, but I settled for double, Sona said. Ravel looked at Riser in shock. She did not see how it benefited the Phoenix Clan as it seemed to just benefit the Seatree Clan. She did not know what he was doing. If you are wondering how it benefits the Phoenix Clan well, they will get paid more to produce the tears of our hospitals, and then the clan, along with our doctors and scientists provided by Ajukasama, will work together in utilizing an alternative to the tears. This would reduce a great strain on the Phoenix Clan to producing tears, but they will still profit from the sales as our alternative solution as it will be based on the tears, Sona said. 
Ravel gave a nod, understanding. It is likely that part of a double amount of the tears would be used for research, while the rest would be used in hospitals to assist gravely injured. I understand. Is that all you wanted me here for, Ravel said? No. I decided to trade you back to Riser. He finds you too valuable to let go. Maybe due to your strategies, Diana said. I see. So you would like to begin the process now, Ravel said? No, no. Later, waving her hand. Tell me, how have you been handling your responsibilities, Diana said. I've been doing well, with a bit of pride, Ravel said. Is that so? Diana said before we're reaching an envelope on a small table next to her. I believe this would say otherwise. She handed the envelope to Ravel, who opened the envelope to see that it was from the Opi Dragon Studios. Read the letter out loud. Thank you for your services for assisting us with the creation of this series, but as it stands, you are no longer needed, and we wish you the best in your future endeavors. She was shocked and was perplexed. What does this mean? From how it looks, I would say that you're fired. Must mean that you were lying up to me about your responsibilities. How is your attendance at school? Diana said. It's perfect, I've never missed a day, Ravel said, forgetting that Sona and Tsubaki, who check attendance, were there. On the contrary, you have not been in school in the past two weeks. Rukuro here can attest to that as she is in the same grade as you, Sona said. Ravel looked over at the twin-tailed brunette. She seemed stoic like her mistress, but on the inside, Rukuro was seething at this, was one of the people that had slept with her now ex-boyfriend, Genshiro Sanji. Rukuro-chan, is that true? Diana said, turning to the brunette. That's correct, Phoenix-sama, maintaining her normal composure. But it was Kichiro-sama that gave me the week off, trying to explain her cast. That is true. This would be excused absence for this past week, but not the week before, Sona says. Oh, first you lied about your responsibilities, and now your attendance record. Tell me, what were you doing that week before? That Sona-san mentioned, Diana said. I... I, Ravel started. She didn't know what to say. I can make this right. This letter is a misunderstanding. I could speak with Ise-sama, but she was interrupted by her mother. That doesn't answer my question. But since you brought him up, how is your relationship with Ise-kun, Diana said. It's been going well, Ravel replied. Really? When was the last time you saw him, Diana said. I, uh, a couple weeks ago, she was trying to stay calm, but now she was getting worried. I see. Speaking of relationships, Rukuro said, I hear that you are dating the feature wielder Genshiro Sanji. Is that correct? Diana said. She noticed Ravel tense up at the name, but shock was written all over her face. No, ma'am. Not anymore, Rukio says. Oh, why is that? Diana replied. He cheated on me with different people. She did not look in Ravel's direction. She didn't need, as everyone already knew, she was guilty. That's a shame. Can you believe that, Ravel? To be cheated on, surely Isekam would never do that to you. But you would do that to him, turning to Ravel, who was looking down but they could see the trails of tears going down her face. I'm sorry, I I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she continued on a chant, as Sona and her Parage members looked on stoically. Riser and his Parage looked on in concern, while Diana looked at her daughter in sadness but remained neutral as this needed to be done. What are you sorry for, Ravel? Diana said, it's my fault that Sanji cheated on you, looking towards Rukio. It was me and Azia Senpai. We slept with him. I had caught him with Azia Senpai after I was thinking of how Konoko kept telling me that she was a better lover than me. I was thinking of ways to prove her wrong, and I stumbled upon him and Azia Senpai as they just vented my frustrations. I did not realize they were having... Then he started to talk to me how I can prove Konoko wrong. I started to feel an attraction towards him as he began talking. I did not know what its pull was, but I accepted his offer and joined them, Ravel said. So you got into bed with someone who was other, another, who was with another and someone who has also committed the same person that you were with, Diana said? Yes. I'm sorry, Ria-sama told me that it was okay, that Ise-sama didn't need to find out. I didn't know that he had a girlfriend. He never said anything about it. I talked with Azia-senpai on it, and she felt an attraction, and she told him that she offered to share the experience with him after her assurance. I felt that it was okay, and we did it again, but with the other girls, and, uh, but was interrupted again. They're lovers, correct, Diana said. Her hair shadowed her face. You let your pride over an incontemplant rivalry with a mangy cat whose older sister hoards herself to anyone for an excuse of repopulating her species. Thus, you cheated on your fiancé with a complete bastard. Is that correct, Diana said? Uh, oh, cause, but, it was, but she was interrupted again. That's Lady Phoenix-sama to you, Ravel. Tell me, where did you and the band of sl do to your Deed with lovers, hmm, Diana said. It was, she remembered they did it in Issei's room, but they cleaned it up. He couldn't have noticed, could he? Then he remembered that she hadn't seen him. 
but her mother was acting like she already knew. But how, Ravel said. It was an Issei cunt's room, correct, Diana said. Have you no shame? You threw everything that I taught you away for what? For a few hours of lust? As she angrily stood up, while throwing her empty teacup at the wall, why it shattered. When the cup shattered, Ravel jumped. She had never seen her mother so angry. How, how, she could not believe her mother knew. They did that, Ravel said. Oh, you're wondering how I know. Well, I'd say ask the bastard that you slept with. He ratted you all out. But he didn't need to because he said Kun already knew, Diana said. What? Ravel said, remember they performed a spell, so Issei wouldn't notice the essence of another male. But how did he know? Ravel said, Ravel, if you're thinking about that spell that you and the others used, I will tell you right now it is ineffective against dragons, speaking up for the first time since he greeted his sister, Riser did. What? Ravel said, she couldn't help but receive herself, eyes wide in shock. A dragon can always tell when a female is impregnated by another male, especially if that one is they are close to. As a result, they become sick. They feel as if their stomach is turning upside down and the urge to vomit sometimes they actually do, Riser said. How do you know this, Riser? Sona said. She was curious about Riser's knowledge about the dragon Sona was. I wanted to believe that your bastard of a pawn did something to my sister, so I went to see Tanya about the dragons and their mates. He explained to me that a dragon can release phenomena feral hormones to attract a female and what my sister just said about feeling a pull, I think he did. Gritting his teeth in anger, Riser did. Sona starts again. Seems you will have to speak with Vitra after this. Riser picked up the conversation again. I also was asked if there was a spell to block a dragon's senses, if there was a case of infidelity, to which Tani told me no. So the moment they did the act, it didn't matter the jig was up. The moment Issei got near them, and from what he saw from his memories, they decided to do it literally when he got out of a coma after risking his ass to save us, and that's what they do to him? Especially that do I let unfortunate pleasure of calling her my fiance? Now that I think about it, I feel like Issei saved me from her rather than the other way around, Riser said. Ravel could not only look down in defeat. It didn't matter what she said. They knew everything. She felt stupid for listening to Rias that everything would be fine, and they could have their fun and no one would need to know, but Issei already did from the moment she slept with Sanji. Rukuro was doing her best not to cry, because it was very clear that Sanji did not care about the relationship. She and Momo had to confess to him just after the war ended, and he accepted, a couple weeks later. He was distant, she found out why, the previous Friday after the incident that was caused trying to frame Issei. How intuitive of you. You've got yourself a lucky man, Yubaluna, impressed by Riser's knowledge, gathering about dragons and giving credit to his new fiancé who was his queen, Sona said. Thank you, Yubaluna says, giving Citri Harris a smile. Sona-san, did you look into what Issei saw in his dream, Riser said? Yes, I checked the footage, Sona replied. Rias did bring the Harakaku to Issei's room after a week while he was in a coma. That, <gasps> Riser said before he let out a sigh. Well, I'm done here, but before I go, I will tell you, Ravel, that don't think of letting these girls know. Not like you could do anything anyways. Riser, dear, you can tell her what her punishment is, since you were speaking on bottomly for a lesser sentence, which you should be grateful that you were such a caring brother. Seems your ex-fiance was a good influence on him. Getting up from the chair, Diana said. As she walked away... Her neutral facade cracked as she looked on with sadness at her daughter, who could only look around on the ground, tears dripping from her eyes. As a mother, it was tough to let a child go. She was not sure how Valena was going to handle letting go of Rias, but considering how she was the mastermind, or at least insulated this concept of cheating, it was going to be much tougher. Sonasan, Ryuko-san. I know that you may not like my daughter for what she did, but could you bring her the work that she will be missing in school and cover for her, at least until the others are punished as well? I am willing to compensate you, Diana said. Sona was a bit shocked at the request, but Rukuro was thinking about the compensation, and she thought of Gentru's siblings. Excuse me, Lady Phoenix, I have a request as well. As she got up and walked to the Phoenix Marsha, these are Gentula's siblings, showing a picture of the siblings. The little girl is named Kaiho, and the boy's name is Gengo. The little girl is aware of the supernatural. Kaiho Osama informed Momo in that Issei Senpai was donating some of his money to them, but I don't think it would be enough, Rukuro said. Oh. So you would like the Phoenix clan to help take care of them? It should not be a problem, Diana said. No. 
I mean, yes or no. What I mean is that the money would help them in some capacity, but not an emotional capacity. When Momo and I are handling schoolwork, I would like for you to look after them and be a mother figure in their lives, Rikuro said. Diana was shocked at her request, as the other occupants in the room to have a march or babysit some children was quite absurd. Diana pondered a bit, thinking of how her children were already grown up. It would be nice to have little youngsters, and Valena has with Milicus. I don't see why not. It would give me something to do. Well, Richard is training Riser to be the leader of the clan. May I? Asking for the picture. I'd like to show Richard of who I'd be taking care of, Diana said. Oh, of course. Thank you very much. Handing the picture over and bowing to the matri Rikyo did. Thank you, Diana said, turning around and walking out of the room. Well, I'm leaving as well, Sona said. I'll go see if you use Dragon's hormones on your sister and let you know, speaking to Razor, who nodded. Then she turned to those who were with her. Tsubaki, Rukio, shall we? Oh, coming, Kachio sama Running back to her mistress as she did, she looked towards Ravel, who did not move from her position, but this time she didn't feel any anger. She actually felt hopes that her girl would get over this and be able to move on with her life. Riser. Ravel, take care, creating a transportation circle, and she did her barrage, two members left. Once they did, Riser got up from the couch and walked over to Ravel and knelt down in front of her. Ravel, I hate to say this, but you are no longer a member of the Phoenix family. The deal that I made was more or less to protect you because I had a feeling that you wouldn't have done something like this without some influence. You can't use magic as I placed a seal on you. When I hugged you and took your phone as well, you will be confined to the Phoenix Mansion. Until the others are punished after that, you will have to leave. I will set up an apartment for you, and you will be with the girls of my parage because I cannot trust Rias after this and don't want you anywhere near her. I know you are smarter than this, Ravel. You should have come to us after you did it the first time, but that's where I failed you as a big brother. I could not do what Ajuku sama did with Dodoria. I thought I could, but I can't. I'm sorry, hugging the girl, who was in distraught upon learning that she was disowned by her family. The Thank you, Riser sama Ravel said. I'm still your big brother. You can still call me Onisama, even if you are expelled from the clan, Riser said. Oh, Onisama, crying into her brother's shoulder for her failures and her troubles she had caused her ex-clan. To Issei, to Sona, to Sanji's siblings, and Rukio and Momo. Even though she did not know, Momo was also dating Kinshiro. Riser just let her cry it all out. He decided that he did not want to tell her about the trial that Kinshiro had coming up. Girls, take her to the room and watch over her. Make sure she does not escape. As the girls came to lift Rabble and walked to her room, where she would be confined for the foreseeable future. They whispered apologies to Rabble. Oh, they did not like what she did. She was once their friend and teammate, and the impact of being expelled was taking its toll. They wanted to cheer her up, but did not know how, so they kept quiet and escorted her to the way. Riser let out a sigh as he watched most of Parage take his sister away, while Yubaluna came up to him. How are you feeling, dear? Yubaluna said. Like shit, Riser replied. At least you can protect her now, Yubaluna said, only for a little bit. But at least I can keep her away from them. Thanks to my deal with Sir Zex, I'm not sure how he will feel when all this is said and done. I could use that my mother was hurting, which is understandable because she had to let a child go. But maybe the two munchkins that they saw were perk up again. I can handle Ravel, Riser said. And your father, Yubaluna replied, he needs to calm down first. Ruval Nee is helping him with that. Eventually, he'll talk to her. Expelling her was one of the toughest decisions that he had to make, Riser said. I see, massaging his soldiers. Well, let's leave the girls to attend her. I think you need to release some of your stress. Taking his hand and walking to them in the bedroom for some time alone, Yubaluna did. Now in an unknown location, there was a building. It was guarded by demons that bore the sea tree symbol. In this building, there was a blonde that laid on the ground. His eyes were bloodshot, tears down his face as he trembled in the fatal position. His hair was disheveled and thinning. It didn't help that he was wet due to the guards throwing water on him as he began to stink. Since this place did not have a working shower, or at least they gave him a toilet, that was Genshiru Sanji, whimpering constantly telling someone, please stop. Inside Genshiro's mind. So this is inside of Sanji's mind. Sanji watched as the young blonde haired woman who was about nine years old kissing his former friend, Issei. What does that mean, Kahu? Dressing the woman. What does it mean, Nissan? Stopping her kisses and Issei kissed down her neck. You were the one that let us and Issei-sama take care of us while you were with them, Kahu said. 
what? I was only gone for a week. Ichiro said, no, Nissan, you were gone for 13 years. You might not realize it because of yours and Issei-sama's appearances. No, that's not true, Sanji said. Over the course of a week, Vitra had been playing tricks on Genshiro's mind, confusing his concept of time and insinuating false images of his siblings living in poverty. After being kicked out of their apartment because he was not there to pay rent, he was... He saw how Sona stayed true to her word, and Citri clan did not help. Seeing even though Momo and Rukio look at his siblings in contempt, he thought that they loved his younger siblings, but he saw how wrong he was. They were left alone starving, seeking shelter in the park. It was even worse as he saw how some people think of kidnapping the children. He tried to call out to them, but they couldn't hear him. He begged Vitra to help him. Excuse Gape, as Vitra told him that this was what was happening in the outside world as a courtesy of Sona. What he did not know is that Vitra was lying to him, letting the curse take over. Seeing his siblings get skinny and his younger brother fall ill, he got worried. When they called out for him, he replied back, but they didn't hear him. He then heard his younger sister, Kaho, cry and ask, Why did you want to be with them more than us? He did not know what she was talking about until Vitra showed them where he was. Gentro looked around as he was in a bed, surrounded Issei's exes. They were naked. He could tell the smell of the scent of was in the air. No, no, I need to get to my siblings, Sanji said, trying to get up and find his clothes, but ended up waking Rias. What's the matter, Genkun? Rias said. Hearing the nickname caused Gentry to freeze up. Only Momo and Rukio call him that. What did you call me? Sanji said. Genkun, you wanted me to scream your name, remember? Don't worry about the other guys. It's just us. After all, you did us the best, so we figured to reward you, Rias said. I don't care about that. I need to get my siblings, Gen said. They seem to be pretty fine to me, pointing over his shoulder to see the vision that he was seeing now of his grown-up sister kissing Issei. You see, Nissan, you stayed in bed with them, and we needed you. Genko Khan fell ill, and you decided to keep sleeping with them, spending money to buy them luxuries, Kaho said. That's a lie, Sanji said. It's true, Sanji. Don't you remember how you bragged about sleeping with Rias to the whole class, Issei said. And you assaulted me, you... Third Genshiro said. Did I? Issei said. Beecher showed an alternative of what happened, where he said how he slept with Rias. He saw Issei walk away, and some people jeered at him. Some dudes even congratulated Sanji. No, that didn't happen. You assaulted me, and Kachura integrated afterwards, Genshiro said. No, she wasn't there. You did make sure that no one found out. You then left to go to the RC to continue having sex with them. Pointed to the naked girls with him. This is all you've been doing. You didn't know us how I dropped out of Ko, Issei said. Then why am I being punished? Sanji said. I didn't know having sex was a punishment. Sona found out and removed you from her parade. Well, Rias tracked me down to take my pieces to give you, Issei says. Then how are you alive, Hiyoto? Genshiro says. It's not Hiyoto, remember? The girls you... The girls and you saw to that, Issei replied. It's true, of course. We didn't tell him that you were a pawn as well, Rias said. What? Then how are you with my siblings, Gintra said. Well, I found them in the park. I had fired Ravel, so she wouldn't take my money and put it towards them after I came back from training. I searched for you, but you were still banging them in my former room, Issei said. And I fell for Issei-sama in the process, Kaho said. See, as she moved her shirt a little down her cleavage, but also a mark on her breast. When Gitro saw the mark, he knew that what it means is Vitro informed him. You slept with my sister? You... B Sanji said... You slept with mine, remember? Issei replied. It stopped Saji for a second. He remembered how Azia came up to him and offered himself to accept it. He shouldn't be blamed for that. She made her choice. She made her choice. She offered herself to me because you probably had a shrimp between your legs and you could never satisfy her like I can or any of them. It's why they left you, Saji said. And I made my choice as well. I offered myself up to Issei-sama and Nissan. I don't need to be rude, but Issei-sama is bigger than you. Pointing to his exposed member, Kaho did. You should really be more aware of your surroundings, Issei replied. It was then. Sanji saw that despite the bed, he and the girls were caged in. Unlike Kaho and Issei that were standing naked in front of them in his emotionless flare that he wasn't aware of was going around him. Anyway, we figured we came to see you provide with a show. Issei said, what? Gentro said, well, you finished banging them in front of us. It's only fair that we return the favor. As she began to remove her clothes. No, no, Kaho, please stop. I'm sorry I left you. Please don't do this, Sanji said. If you want to blame anyone, you can blame them. Pointing to the girls, you chose them over us. And she grabbed 
by a naked Issei. Sanji could see that Issei clearly was bigger than him and he felt emasculated. Issei-sama, be gentle this, don't be gentle this time, Gaho said. Okay, as he thrust it into the young woman. No, listening to her sister's moan. Stop it, Sanji said. Uh, I'm not going to mock Gaho. She's just basically just getting banged here. Sanji could only watch. He didn't want this. When he slept with girls, he began to cry. He really left his siblings for all these women, all these years. He was having fun with his friends, girls, that he left his siblings alone. And Issei took his place. Issei replaced him in their lives like he replaced Issei in the girls' lives. But he wasn't happy about it. He wanted his siblings happening with him. This isn't what I wanted, Genshiro said. It's a consequence of your actions, Vitra said. Why are you showing me this? I thought we were partners. That I was your other self. Why are you doing this to me, Sanji said. When that nun approached you, you completely decided to forget about your two girlfriends. I told you to walk away. You wouldn't listen. When you got caught by that phoenix, you had the audacity to use your dragon hormones to lure her in the bed as well. Even worse, you agreed that with that redhead bitch that it was all fun and games. And nobody would get hurt as long as nobody found out. But you didn't care because of your demon side. You were filled with envy and lust because all he had it all, Vitra said. I'm sorry. Sorry, Gentro said as he slid his down his knees, still hearing Issei in his convert fornicate. Sorry, my ass. If you were sorry, you would have slapped that nun and went to tell Issei. But you didn't. You bragged to the school about how you slept with that tomato head. As well as look at what happened. You lost your girlfriends, your prestige, respect of others like your siblings and me. Which, by the way, you'll lose me too, Vitra said. But I could die, Sanji said, fearing the prospect of dying and not seeing his siblings. Did you care when Issei was dying? So n no. So why should I care if you die? I'm an evil dragon as well, remember? Vitra said. Please make it stop, please. He then felt a pair of breasts on his back. They felt sticky. What's wrong, Genkan? Come back to bed. Let me have their fun. It doesn't matter if Issei is bigger than you. Well, actually, all of you guys, you still have us, Rhea says. Sanji shivered, not only from the feeling of his own seat on his back, but how she emasculated him as well. If Issei was bigger than them, why did she have with them? Why did she have with any of them? He cursed his demon side for letting take over and ruin his life. His envy towards Issei was somewhat justified. Issei had girls and parents. Well, he had siblings, but he got his girls and threw them away within two weeks. He remembered how Hiyoto spoke of Issei. He could see that Issei didn't have parents. Issei did not have a happy family like he thought. Get off me, he whispered. Genkun? Get off me, he spoke a little louder. I still can't hear it as he pressed himself into the beginning of Rias did. I said, get off me, Sanji said, as he threw her away from him, back into the bed as the others who woke up from their days. What's wrong, Genkun? Get some pie, Konoko said. Are you okay, Ravel said. Are you hurt? Irina replied. We can change that, Kuruka said. Akano said, yeah, we, we can, Genkun. Come back to bed, Genkun, Rias said. No, no, make it stop. Suddenly, his body began to move forward towards the girls. No, Vitra, what's happening? Make it stop. It's what you wanted, Vitra said, forcing Sanji forward. Come to us, Genkan, the girl said. No, no, stop it, Vitra, stop it, I don't want this, please, I'm sorry, make it stop, as he kept hearing Genkan, his sister's moans, he says threats, stop, Sanji said. Now we're outside of Genshiro's mind. It really took him a week, damn, it was just a simple illusion, Vitra said. A magic circle with Sichu symbol appeared as Sona and Tsubaki came out after they dropped Rukuro off. What's this? Why is he on the floor like that, Vitra, seeing her pawn in a fetal position? Just utilizing one of my curses, showing him an illusion of Issei Bang, his grown-up sister. Even had his sister and the tomato had emasculated him that Issei was bigger than him, Vitra said. What did Rias have to do with it? Sona replied. Just for her to emphasize... That he ch cl chose slepping with his former friend's girls than worrying about his siblings' safety. So altered time in his head, making him watch how his siblings suffered. But what it was Issei who took care of them, and thus his sister fell for Issei, and he had marked her, Feature said. Hmm, I see. Well, we came from the Phoenix Mansion. They have taken in Ravel, but there's something she said that made me curious about Riser wanting to know. And what's that? Feature replied. Ravel mentioned how she felt the pull, and Riser talked with Tanin about dragons using their hormones to attract others. Tell me, did did he do that to Ravel? Ha! Huh. 
What a coincidence. I was reprimanding him about that. But yes, he did. And then agreed with the tomato head that, as long as nobody found out, nobody gets her. But not only to her. You remember that girl that accused Issei of having her underwear? Beatrice said. Yes. When he and the two perverts were playing their so-called harmless prank on Issei, what about her? To Tsubaki says. He tried it on first, before trying it on the Phoenix girl. That girl was another of his. He seduced her after a week. Being with those two that were in a barrage, he was envious of Issei, so he tr tried building his harem. Albeit forcefully, when that nun came to offer herself, he basically abandoned that girl, Vitra said. Ugh, I can't believe I helped that... And Sona said, moving forward to sit down in one of the chairs. Calm down, Sona. You did because of those kids, and they will have a better life, Subaki. What do you mean? Didn't you say you were abandoning them, Vitra said. Do you really think? Do you really see me as that cold-hearted, Sona said. Getting no response, she continued on. Well, Vitra son, your illusion is somewhat correct. As Issei is giving some of his Opai dragon money to the siblings in addition, Momo and Rukio will help out when they can, and somehow, Rukio has convinced Lady Phoenix to be a mother figure in their lives. Since they hadn't had one in a while, Sona said. Ha! Ah, that boy is something else. Drake is lucky he got someone with honor, but you said... Part of the money. What's he doing with the rest? Vitra said. According to my sister, he's giving the rest of it to them. And then the rest is going towards the rebuilding of our academy in Oros. Damn, despite all what they did, he's still looking out for them. They really don't deserve him, Vitra said. Not according to my sister. It's essentially a smokescreen. Keeps them occupied while the faction decide their punishment handed out to them, Sona said. Oh man, they really did underestimate his intelligence, Vitra said. And considering that he doesn't require any of it, it makes me think that he has something greater in compensation. I wonder how he's surviving, Subaki said. Remember, he trained with Tani, so we would have the survival instincts as the wild lands of the underworld are much worse than the human world. At least he doesn't have a former dragon king hunting him constantly, Sona said. I suppose, Subaki replied. Is that all you wanted to ask in regards of this pawn of yours? Vitra said, yes. Riser had a feeling that his sister was influenced, which is why he asked Tani about the dragon phenomenons. And you confirmed it for me. Everything after that, Ravel is smarter than that. And should have known better. Thank you for your time, Vitra saw No problem. You think I can get out of here? Vitra said, I'm not sure. Considering that your other pieces were implanted into him by scientists at the Gregor, maybe they can reserve, engineer, in reserve it, remove you from him. We'll ask about the meeting if need be. V Thanks, Vitra said. I'll leave you for your fun, Sona said. And he needs a proper bath. He smells. Throwing cold water on him does not nothing. We don't need him dying before his trial. Come, Subaki. Hi, Kachio, Subaki says, as left in the Tim Lamarck circle. Now let's see. What to do? Oh, how about showering your grown-up brother slept with a woman that you lied about loving? Since they took such good care of him. <laughs> Vitra said, ending the flashback. Hmm, but at least Vitra's son is having fun. It was more annoying having to deal with the parents of those two perverts. First, it was preventing them from contacting the Hyoto for Issei to pay for the injuries that their son sustained. Then it was preventing them from contacting the Hyoto to apologize credit for Issei trying to make them change their perverted ways. And that girl's parents as well, Tsubaki said. Yes, they apologized to Momo and Rukio for ruining their relationship, but she got lighter. Suspension because she was used by him as well, Sona said. I suppose you're right, Tsubaki replied. When I find Razvice's attitude, she seems down about something, Susana said. Maybe she's guilty about what she's done, Tsubaki replied. You may be right, but it feels like she is avoiding Rias and Azazel. She didn't go on that vacation with them, and neither did Kiba or Gasper, Sona said. You're right. Hopefully things would be said and done at the meeting, Tsubaki said. Yes, we needed to hold on for another week. After this one, she was interrupted by a knock on the door. Enter, Sona said. The door opened up and walked in the people as the least wanted to see. Rias Gremory and her queen, Akino Hajima. As the saying goes, speak of the devil and it shall appear, Sona says. Letting out a sigh, she acknowledged the people that walked in. What can I do for you, Rias? Sona said. Hello, Sona. It's been a while. Just coming to see you, Rias said. Well, now that you've seen me, I guess you can go, Sona said, turning her back to the paperwork at her desk. Oh, you're awfully busy. I guess with graduation coming up in a month and a half, it's be expected at least you'll have a legacy for Zenobia-san to follow. Akino said, 
Zenobia, Senator replied. Yes, she's strict in her faith. Thanks to her upbringing, I believe she would make a good student council president after you. Wouldn't you agree? Rhea said. With a leader like you, what faith? Sona Sasubaki said. That is to be determined, Sona said. Hey, Sona, have you read anything from Ravel? We haven't seen her since she left, and we haven't been able to contact her. Do you know anything? Rhea said. Not really. Only clan issues. I received a notice from Lady Phoenix to excuse her while she's away. It seemed personal, so I wouldn't interfere unless you want to damage your clan standing with them. Then thinking, more than you already have. I guess you're right. Have you heard Sanji? Have you heard from Sanji Kun? She was interrupted by Sony. One sama, Sona said. What was that? Rius replied. He's with One sama, Sona said. Do you know when he'll be done? Rius replied. Why are you worried about my pawn, Rius? As a matter of fact, why are you interjecting yourself into the Citri clan matter? Sona said, sending a glare towards Gremory Harris. No reason. Sorry for interfering. I didn't know. She was a bit nervous. She could not speak more about Sanji. Otherwise, Sona would look into it and be alert of what she's been doing, which she didn't want anyone to know, obviously. Unfortunately for her, everyone in the biblical faction knows, as Ise requested the leaders release the information to the public, but there was no media, as they did not want word getting out to the ones that betrayed the pillar. The parents of the girls did not receive any backlash, and it was recorded how Ise doesn't hate them. It made people respect Ise even more, and that he doesn't harbor any hate chose to carry on with his life. Of course, some wanted him to get his revenge, but leaders calmed those talks down, indicating that they were planning something. If that's all, you can go. There's much work needed to be done, shuffling her paperwork, Subaki. Here, handing over the stack of papers, I need these organized before the end of the week, Sona said. Yes, ma'am, Subaki said, taking papers and going to the desk. Nearly she acknowledged the two other devils, so she walked by them. Ria-san, Akano-san, have a good day. She, like Sona, kept her tone neutral to not give anything away. I guess I'll leave you to your work. Sorry for disturbing, Ria said, turning to leave. Don't stretch yourself out too much, giving a quick bow with a smile, following Ria out of the student council room. While Subaki and Zoe carried on their work, they also made sure they would not feel not feel neither Rias or Akino's energies nearby with an earshot. As they continued to work, Subaki decided to ask something what Rias had said. Are you really going to have Zenovia run this place after they graduate, Subaki says? Absolutely not, Sona responded almost as quickly as Subaki asked the question. They both laughed at Sona's response and continued to do their work with a smile on their face. Both of them felt a bit better, but they were curious about... This new Ross Vaisa issue. Sona was grateful that Shazami kept Azazel busy as well. If something else happened between Ross Vaisa and Azazel, then it would be a matter of time before they would know. Right now, she needed to figure how to contact Issei and how he could be aware of his finals that are coming up. And that is where we're going to stop for now. Almost, we're about 20 minutes away from the end of chapter 2019. And I know this is where stuff actually started to heat up because Issei comes back into the picture. But we're going to stop for now because you know I like leaving you guys on cliffhangers. I'm just kidding. I just am. Uh, I'm really tired. So I'm just going to stop reading for now. I think that was about 40 or 45 minutes. So that's pretty, that's pretty good for an episode. It's almost an hour. So thank you so much for the support, ladies and gentlemen. I really do appreciate it. Once again, let me know what kind of what ifs that you would like in the comment section down below. I'd love to do them on Goku, Naruto, My Hero, even though like I'm not the biggest fan. I really don't care though. I've watched the anime and I know the whole entire story, so it doesn't matter to me. I really, I'm watching One Piece currently, so I can't do a what if on it yet because I don't know much about it in the first place. So I'm on, and I'm only on like episode 80 currently so it's gonna take a while before i even do a what if on that thing i'm gonna need to get to like episode 300 to actually know what somewhat of what's going on correct so thank you so much for the support ladies and gentlemen like i don't even know what logias are yet all i know is about hockey so um i don't even know what hockey i know what hockey is but that's only because for other people anyway i'm not even gonna get into it so thank you so much for the support once again ladies and gentlemen if we could hit 300 of i mean 400 to 500 likes that'd be absolutely amazing without any further ado spartanic arts dxd out. So we're with, with Issei, so we're picking up at the end of chapter 19. He had grown stronger physically after another five weeks of constant training, and he was glad with that his magic core grew a little as well, thanks to that book that Ajuka gave him. Unfortunately, he could still not awaken Dreg, nor his innate power. He was a bit frustrated by this. He felt like he was getting nowhere. He decided to calm himself and focus on other aspects like the area that he was in. He read how Argaris clan had the power of time, which he remembered Sikavera, his fellow Mecha Ataku, demonstrating this, she had created a time bubble, and informed him that he could spend an hour in the bubble, but only a few minutes would pass in the outside world. He could not help 
but wonder if the person that helped Beelzard all those years ago was someone from the Argaris clan. However, this reminded him that he could not ask Drake for answers. Well, I better start my sword training, but at least I could practice with these daggers, as he spun one of the daggers that Tanin gave him. With the daggers, he felt a surge of power, but he didn't want to rely on those weapons to produce his power like he did before with the boosted gear. In addition, he also changed his wardrobe as the Koei Academy was stretching. Now he wore a white under short sleeve navy slash black jacket with black pants with gray and black leather gloves and black boots. His hair had grown longer, but because he was human, he, w he was starting to get of a stubble. For accessories, he had three straps around his left forearm and multiple belts. Maybe I can find something in Treasure Room to use, since Ascalon is not available. Damn, I wish I could get someone to talk to or train with, as he walked towards the exit room into the Treasure Room while strapping the daggers to the belts on his waist. When he entered, his face was blinded by all the gold, gems, and valuables. It was also the reason why he didn't need the Opie Dragon money at all, distancing himself from that name. Let's see what I can find here, he started to say as he began to rummage through the treasures. He found a short sword. It looked decent enough, so he tried a few swings of it and it felt like it would fly out of his hand. Too light, Issei said, needs something a little heavier than Ascalon. Since I am used to it more, Issei said, he got tossed the short sword away and continued looking. I can make you strong, the random person said. What was that? Issei said. Turning around, he looked around, seeing nothing but treasures. His hand went to one of his daggers and his eyes narrowed. But before he turned back to a, the door, another sword was to use. You want to prove that you're better? I can help you. Issei drew both daggers and was ready... Searching around, the voice was closer this time. Who's there? Issei said. His body was tensed up. He thought no one else could get into this cave. Turn around and see. Issei did as the voice said he did. All he saw was treasure, more treasure, and the black blade, Andorite. Is the blade talking to me? Issei said as he began to walk towards the blade, looking at the blade quizzically. You have a sense of justice, but you have some resentment, a balance of both light and dark inside of you. So you are talking to me, Issei said, placing his hands on the blade. He felt a sense of calmness, but also rage, two sides of the same coin. How can you help me? You want to be better to improve yourself, right? Andorite said. Why should I listen to you? After all, you are a demonic sword, Issei said. Yes, but did you forget that I became a demonic sword because my wielder fell into madness, thus causing me to fall as well? My former white blade stained black with darkness. Actually, I think it's pretty cool. You know, being a black blade, scratching his head embarrassingly, Issei said. Regardless, I have seen you. A pure heart. You nearly fell into madness, but pulled yourself out. I believe you are worthy, and I think I can help you in return. Draw out the power that lies dormant in you, Aron Light said. I should trust you because, Issei said, I have nothing else to lose. I've laid dormant for years, waiting for someone worthy. The word worthy... It was something that Issei always something that Issei wondered if he was. All right. I may not trust you, and honestly, I have questioned that word of being worthy. Some people would say I'm not, but it's time to start believing in myself, and I got nothing left to lose. I need to get stronger to protect my loved ones. So, grabbing the hilt of the sword, welcome to the team, and pulled the blade from its prison. When Issei did, he felt a surge of both holy magic and demonic magic fusing with his magic core, expanding it in a rondite. The blade glowed, remember, and then was set aflame. Issa was in shock. He had seen these flames. They were Drake's flames, but burned crimson and orange, but also flames of desolation, his innate power that burned amber, orange, and black. The flame subsided from the blade. Issa dropped to his knee, panting heavily. His magic core was better than before. Just as I thought. Worthy, a rondite said. What did you do? My magic core, did you do that? Issei said, no, that was you. You needed confidence booster. You have been holding yourself back. You forgot why you were training. I just made you realize it and ignited that fire in you, Arondite said. Thank you. I guess I was going with the motion with no drive, Issei said, and now you do. Now let's go train your swordsmanship before you use magic. Let your magic core stabilize itself. You have just reawakened it. I did apply some holy magic and demonic magic to give it a jolt. I just needed you to rest. 
He said he took a swing with Aronde. He swung with one hand like he did with Ascalon. What he did not expect was a slash of air to come out and cut to the cave as well. Ksh! Issei ducked for a cover in case anything was going to fall before him, looking at the cave before the wall and a gash in the wall. We need to work on your control. Head back and meditate. You need to calm down. That happened because you were excited. Don't let the power go to your head, Rondite said. Issei nodded and did as the blade asked. He didn't want power to get to his head. He has seen what has happened to the others that did. He asked back into his training oasis, as he would call it, headed to the lake, stabbed Rondite under the ground and sat down next to it to meditate. Pentadragon Manor. So we're at the Pentadragon's place. Walking down the halls were three people, two men and a woman. The first man wore glasses with blonde hair dressed in a business suit, was Arthur Pentadragon. The other man had short black hair and dressed in ancient Chinese armor while holding a bow staff over his right shoulder. He was the author's teammate. Arthur's teammate, Bioko. Finally, the woman had black hair and was dressed in a maid outfit. She was Elaine Westcott, the maid of the Pentadragon house, but also the teacher of the Fae Pentadragon and the girlfriend of Arthur Pentadragon. Before Arthur left home, his father, Uther, would not have allowed this relationship, and it was the reason why he left to protect Elaine from being banished if the relationship was discovered. Uther was also disappointed that Arthur and his sister joined the Chaos Brigade, but that disappointment changed to pride when seeing that they joined Team DXD. Uther allowed the relationship between his son and Elaine because he had brought the honor to the Pentadricken house. However, when he heard of Lefebvre's infidelity, he was distraught. He cared for his daughter deeply, but he lost his connection to Wales due to Issei being the Welch Dragon's carrier, as he had an annual the engagement between Issei and Lefei. In doing so, he lost respect for Volley for doing such a heinous thing, and warned Elaine that if she dared to do such a thing, banishment would be the least of her concerns. So he was with another before fornicating with my sister, Arthur said, and still is. She has his mark. I did reckon that he on the Hyoto place. Kuroka and your sister don't have marks. Neither do the Gremories, Bioku said. And he was playing with them just for a fight, Arthur said. It's what he told the girl. She knew the plan as he told him not to get hurt. It was only just to fight Issei, make him enraged and give Volley to fight that he wanted. Honestly, I'm down for fighting, but sleeping with another man's girl ain't the way to do it, Bioku said. Arthur kept quiet as he looked at the picture of his former leader with a beautiful girl with silver hair and purple eyes. Well, she had a bust, not as big as the Gremory. She made up with it for her lower half. That was what we could see as the yellow dress that she wore in the picture. Something that Arthur knew that Folly liked, which was the appearance of a woman, rather than her breasts like Issei did. Poor Lefei, Elaine said, yes, but remember she chose this path as did Kuroka, Arthur said, to which Bioko nodded in agreement, a bet sadly. Suddenly, they felt a surge of power deep within the castle. She's awakened after so many years, but why? Arthur said, come on, Elaine, running down the halls. Lead the way, Elaine said, following after him. Wait a minute. Ready to catch up to them. What's that that's about? Who is she? Bioko said. She is the secret of the Pencha Dragon family. Having been with them from the beginning, she locked herself away in dormant for a hundred years, Elaine said. Really now? Must be the old lady, Biyuku said. Elaine, get ready. As they ventured into the caverns that lie deep beneath the castle, Arthur said, they kept running until they reached a stone wall. Once there, Elaine began to in ignite an incinerate chant as multiple seals activated and began shifting around. She kept chanting and chanting. Seals rotated and finally they dispersed after 10 minutes of spell chanting to stone wall. The stone wall began to shift, causing dust to blow towards them as they covered their eyes. When the dust cleared, Arthur and Elaine stepped forward and bowed. Bioko could see some kind of cocoon in the background and silhouette and the smoke that was in the room and being released when the stone wall moved. It's an honor to be in your presence, Arthur said. You've been sleeping for so long. This world is not as you remembered. Welcome, Elaine said. Buku watched as a silhouette stepped out of the dust and smoke and blood dripped from his nose. It was a naked woman. She had a slim, voluptuous figure, black hair, gold eyes, a beauty mark under her right eye. The skin around her chin and mouth was in patches of pink in her normal skin tone. So this is today's world, and who are you? The mysterious person said. I am Arthur Pentadragon, heir of the Pentadragon house and descendant of Arthur Peregragon and Morgan Le Fay. Well done, Arthur, she whispered, remembering a young man from back on her day that she raised like a son and taught him what he needed to know about becoming a king of Camelot. 
I am Elaine Westcott, descendant of William Wynn Westcott, one of the founders of Golden Dawn. I see, and you, turning your attention at the gawking Buko. Hearing nothing but silence, Elaine and Arthur turned to their companion, who was stunned by the beauty of this woman, despite the scars around her chin and mouth. You have a vulgar look on your face, Elaine said. Buko, Arthur replied, going to his teammate and grabbing him by the back of his head, forcing him to bow while bowing himself. Sorry for my teammate, Lady Merlin. He just cannot concentrate between of your current state of dress. The now named Merlin had a smirk on her face. She did not really care for the modesty, so she did not really care about others seeing her body, given how she used to dress back in the day. No worries, as she snapped her fingers, but nothing happened. Rather than panicking, she thought my powers either they're gone or dormant. Seems I have been asleep longer than I thought. It damn near drained me. I'll need more immense power source to join myself back, but I don't think I'll be as powerful as before, Merlin said. If I may, Lady Merlin gesturing to the body. Go on, Merlin said. Elaine activated a magic circle underneath Merlin's feet. As it traveled upwards, it began to dress her. She was now wearing two dark purple sleeves that went up to her shoulders, a matching dark purple tube top that cut training a long purple skirt and had black heels to the cube at the top of the place she had a brown belt around her midsection <laughs> not bad merlin said as she admired the outfit elaine dressed her in thank you lady merlin bowing in grace you don't need to bow you two can stop bowing i am dressed properly merlin said at that statement bioko and arthur stood right up straight and looked at the woman bioko did look a little sad that she was dressed now and no longer naked but he had to admit for an old lady she was beautiful so it appears that i have been asleep longer than i thought from what i see a lot has changed arthur said i mean merlin son you would be correct lady merlin arthur replied well then as she walked away trying to get her legs to wake as she walked past the three of them i'd rather not be stuck in a stuffy cave would you merlin said looking back at them no i would not elaine replied as she turned her face to the Mage walking away. Then, get a move on. And you said that Arthur Pentadragon, that you're Arthur Pentadragon, correct? Merlin said. Yes, I am, Lady Merlin. As the three begin to walk towards the exit, good. Then you and your friends can tell all that I've missed and what has recently happened. Something caused me to wake up, and I would like to know you. I would like to know what it is. Besides, I'm curious about the adventures that you've been on. Excuse me, Miyuku said. He was confused. If she was asleep, how did she know if they'd been on adventures, but not just spontaneously meet? I can tell that you're strong, and that strength comes from experience. Experience that you can get from only journeying. Speaking as if she read his mind. Now, come on, we have much to discuss. And that is the end of chapter 19. Chapter 20. The Pentadragon Manor. So there are more fairies or giants, the gods that still exist? Merlin said, to an extent, different mythologies have those creatures, Arthur replied. Bu Arthur, Buco, and Elaine had been explaining what the world was like, or rather the supernatural world, as they ate dinner. They had met Arthur's father, Uther, who was blessed to be in the mage's presence and offered her meals to the statue of her hunger as she has been sealed for so long. He was amazed that she didn't age a day for what the scriptures of his ancestor depicted her as. I see, tell me. Uther, are there any more child children of yours besides Arthur, Merlin said, as she finished swallowing some of her food. Arthur placed his cultery down and had a somber expression on his face as he remembered about his daughter, Le Fay. But in remembering her, he remembered that the act that she did, but let out a sigh and responded, Yes, I do. A daughter. Her name is Le Fay. She was quite a fan of your work, Uther said. Oh, and where is she? Merlin said, intrigued to meet the fan of hers. Probably out with her demon lover, Uther said, grumbling at the actions of his as daughter did father arthur said it's true and you know it arthur uther said um not necessarily uther son it appears that he has no interest in your daughter and she was used for his own gain which took his son into a fight Bioko said i'd like to hear about this and who is isei merlin said i'll say it my daughter cheated on the red dragon emperor isei hiyoto with his rival volley lucifer the Red Dragon Emperor, as she pondered. I've heard of that title before, Merlin said. Father, I'd advise you not to call him Hyoto anymore. After all, they were involved in his betrayal, Arthur said. Ah, uh, yes, I forgot. If he wants, I would adopt him, and he can bear the Pentadragon name with you, Arthur. He still wanted that the connection to Wales, and possibly adopting Issei would be another course of action that he could take, Uther said. 
Where is the Sekiyuti? Merlin said, c cutting into the conversation between the father and son. No one knows where he is, other than that he is training, Arthur said. I see. I have a feeling that he may have been involved in my awakening. During the early days, once, Arthur, your ancestor developed the Knights of the Round Table. There was the one with that had the sword, Arondite. We've heard of that blade, Arthur said. However, its wielder descended into madness. Yes, his name was Lancelot, but his son Galahad had captured the blade and requested me to seal it with his treasures. He also called himself that by that title, the Sekiuti. He had also had me take the dragon known as Drig to his caves to his place in France, believing the people would look for the dragon's treasures, and also it would be the birthplace of his father. He also wanted training room of sorts, but he wanted the area that he could find place to time to go faster than the outside world. You'd think Issei could have gone there, Ryoko said. Possibly. Galahad wanted it to be a place for the Red Dragon Emperor to train and go stronger, faster, hence why inside the time there goes so much faster than out here. But I had kept a seal on Durandite, in case it is drawn from its prison, it would send me an alert and I think that's what Issei drew the sword, Merlin said. Then something must have happened to Ascalon. If he needed a weapon, why was the sword sealed, Arthur said, to keep it from falling into the wrong hands. Is this Issei a bad person, Merlin said. Nah, he may be a pervert, but overall, he's a good guy, Vyoko said. Pervert? Hmm, so he's similar to the captain, Merlin said, remembering her now former captain would do preferred things with his beloved, such as sticking his head under the skirt of her fondling her breast. Yes, but unfortunately, it may have been the cause of his downfall, Arthur said. Please explain. You did mention the portrayal against the Red Dragon Emperor, Merlin said. So Arthur and Byuko began to relay the memories that they had seen. The meeting Issei as Merlin listened intently. She realized that throughout the story, Issei was very similar to her captain in attitude, and also she felt disappointment that someone that idolized her would do such a thing as she remembered a former student of hers that tried to betray her. Anyway, there is a meeting at the end of the week with all the factions discussed as absence, and apparently something else regarding the 40 enemy of ours, Arthur said. A meeting. There are other factions as well. Take me to this meeting with you. I'd like to see for myself, Merlin said. What? Bioka replied. This meeting of yours. Is it to discuss his absence? I may get a better insight on if he descended into madness as well. And maybe there are subjects that are close to him, so I can learn more about his character other than being perverted good guy, if you don't mind, Merlin said. I don't see the problem, considering there may be any other humans like Team Slashdog and KO KO and his team, Arthur said. Wait a minute. Didn't Team Slash Dog tell us a story of how they faced a catch tree that wielded a rondite? Bioko said. Yes, how could I forget? But if Lady Merlin did not wake up then then it's a fake, or it was reproduced from fragments of the seal thing, Merlin said. I suppose you could talk with them at the meeting, since they are repossessed of it after the battle, but the whereabouts of the catcher are unknown, Arthur said. And they still have it, Merlin said. Not sure. Haven't spoken to them after the revelations of my sister's infidelity, as they are close to our former leader, Volley Lucifer. But if they attend the meeting, you can ask them, receiving a nod from the legendary mage as they continued to eat their food, but making sure that Merlin was accommodated quite well. Now, at the office at the Leviathan, so Seraphal's office. Seraphal was in her office, listening to her sister reports of what had been going on in school, and how her accomplice did not raise the suspicions of the girls. Are you sure of this? Seraphal said. Yes, it feels like they forgot about Issei, which surprises me. It's why I was hoping that Tanyan could come to the meeting and maybe give us some insight on the ritual, Sona said. I understand, but it does benefit us a little as it gives us more time. But, but, but for, from the looks of it, it seems the exile is looking the best course of action, Seraphal said. Is that it? Sona replied. No, they will receive no compensation nor awards from the war. They will only have Issei's money and congratulations are in order, giving her sister a smile, Seraphal said. For what? Sona said, raising an eyebrow. Well, as she got up from her seat, however, she needed to use a walker now, but she was glad to be out of the wheelchair. You are a sole owner of Co-Town for the time being. Rias had her ownership revoked considering her betrayal. She has also been quite irresponsible, Seraphal says. I see, and why for the time being, Sona replied. Well, other Harris may join you, but nevertheless, congratulations, finally. Reaching her sister with the walker to give her a hug, you always knew how to make me proud, Seraphal says. Thank you, Sona said, reciprocating the hug. Now, letting go of Sona, 
How are Kiba and Gasper acting like in school? Relatively normal, although I feel they are hiding something, why do you ask? Sona says, look at this. Walking back to her desk, Sona waited a couple of minutes until Sarah falls set it in her seat again and pulled out a crystal, a recording crystal to be specific. What is it? It looks familiar, Sona said. This is the crystal that we use in our meeting with Issei and Saul's memories. The reason why I ask you about those two is because of this. Activating the crystal, holding the image of Issei catching the two blondes leaving the hotel with the Seraph, and former exorcists look at their faces. I didn't want to believe it. When Valerie contacted me, do you, do they look as happy as the girls in this image to you, Sarah Fall said. No, almost remorseful. You didn't think Rias forced them, do you? But why, Sona said. I don't know. Considering what they did, they may still be exiled, but if they were forced, they may have some leniency to continue to do some contracts to earn some money. Because as you know, an exiled demon would lose all of their contracts, Sarah Fall said. But if they were first to do this, wouldn't they be innocent, Sona said? Perhaps, but they could have defied Rias and chose not to. Think about it. Didn't Issei couldn't defy her to save that useless nun, Sarah Fall said? Yeah. Yes, Sona replied. So why didn't they do the same? We'll know more. When we confront them, their situation is a little different from Ross Visa, which we'll have to see what Shamazi finds. Seraphal said, What do you mean? You know something, Sona says? A little. But Gondel reported that Rice Visa contacted her. She confessed to being drugged with an Aristocid. Gondel reported this to Odin, who was furious and contacted us, since Ross Visa is a demon. So it does fall under our jurisdiction. We already contacted Shemazazi, who will look further into this. But if proven true, Rajvaisa is to remain exiled as long as she is under Rias' command. However, she may visit her grandmother and be confined to an area that her grandmother inhabits in Asgard. Wait. So if she traded to another barrage, then Ross Vaisa wouldn't be banished anymore, Sona said. Something like that. But if proven true, I think she should have something worried about being traded, Seraphal said. But she would be free, Sona replied. Think about it, Sona. If she was indeed drugged, who knows what other things someone else might do to her. If anything, I think it would prefer a female king than a male king. And considering we are demons and we associate with seven sins, it would not surprise me if another would try to the same thing. There would be nothing that we can do. Since you would be a part of the barrage, as you know, there is abuse towards pieces in our society. I understand, Sona says. It does make a little more sense, where three are close together, but if Valerie came to Gasper's defense, I'm assuming he is getting something similar. Yes, he can only see Valerie. But everywhere else in the vampire faction he is exiled from. That was from a limited compromise to Valerie, which she accepted, probably to keep him away from Rius. But who wouldn't want to get away from such a spoiled brat? Letting out a sigh, as Sona had informed of her rival story. Yes, but one's pride always leads to their downfall, Sona says. Speaking of pride, how's our arrogant prisoner doing, Sarah Fall said. I wouldn't call him arrogant. He looks pitiful. I forgot to inform you about my visit to him, since I only went to confirm the use of Dragon's hormones. but Vitra had been begin be having his little fun utilizing his curses to break the bastard psychologically. That's wonderful. Ajuka had been extracting the power from the mutated pieces that Issei sent over. During his trial, he will put them into Rias's barrage, if you say so, because he is your piece at the moment, and since she wants him so much... But he is also exiled. What do you plan to do with the free pieces, Seraphal said. I plan to reincarnate those three that are helping me to keep the rumors from getting out of hand. The rest of my barrage doesn't seem to mind, Sona says. That's good. Speaking of those three, you never told me which one was in love with him and had a bad way of expressing it with a mischievous smile on her face Seraphal had. Uh, why do you care about who it is when he's already been with you? Sona says, just curious. Seraphal says, showing her show. Fine. It's Moriyama, Sona said, showing a picture of the aforementioned girl. Hmm, not bad. Cute. Nice bus. Although she will break if she ever got into bed with Isekun. You should have Loop Up and Subasa train her body up if she wants to even last a second around a bed with Isekun. Onisama, Sona said. What? I had heard about your escapades with Tsubaki from Grapefia-chan. It should be not worried for you to hear about mine. I'm also a bit disappointed that you replaced me with some girl-on-girl -girl action, Sarah Fall said. That was a misunderstanding. We'll take Grapefia's son and explain the situation. Also, that is incest. You are suggesting, Sona says. 
Gravia Chan said that too, but I cannot be for certain. After all, you replaced me. Aren't my breasts bigger than hers? Cupping her breasts in their dress, showing off her size, they've gotten bigger. I will not answer that question, Onisama, Sony says. Fine. The next time you hook up with Tsubaki, send me this tape. Her eyes were closed, but her smile was still present. Onisama! Her face became as red as the Gremory's hair, but she was flabbergasted at his sister's request. I'm just teasing you, but if you do, opening her eyes with a mischievous glint... Ugh, Sona said as she stormed out of the office with a massive blush on her face and Seraphal laughing at her sister's expense. Seraphal may have been changing back to her old self that made her become Maleviathan, but she was still Seraphal that enjoyed teasing her sister to no extent. And due to Issei's influence, the teasing tended to be perverted at times to annoy Sona even further. Now in Demon territory in the human world. In the federal house of the Deoyan Demon clan, the Omon clan. In the bedroom lay two silver-haired people. One was female, and the other one was male. They were naked under the sheets, and the right of the shoulder of the female was the mark of the Hurakaku. A buzz was heard as the phone lit up on the nightstand next to the bed. The male was out to reach for it, but the female beat him to it and grabbed the phone and scoffed at the screen. <sighs> they cannot seem to understand you're done with them. Don't you have other lovers to be with? Also, your plan did not work, Volleycun. I suppose it did not. But if he comes to face me, I will be ready after all. I was taking little pieces of Orphus during our times together. I needed to beat him. I know he has the strength of both dragon gods. And when I finds out what I did with his women, his anger will reach peak levels to give the fight that I want, Volley said. <sighs> well, it has been weeks and he has not come for you. While I don't agree with your methods, I am shocked by how she acts. She's spoiled. Grew up that way. It will be her downfall, but it's not my problem anymore, Volley said. Is it? Then why does she keep texting you? First, it was to join her in a scheduled location for some fun, as she put it. Then this Akano chick, then your two teammates. When are you going to tell them that it's over? You marked me, not them. They are just a game to bring out your rival. He didn't show up. The game is done. You won by forfeit. Genbu. They can't get enough of me, Volley said, acting cocky. Have you should know. Besides, I haven't left your side, have I? You did, when I allowed you to go forward with this plan of yours and after that. I had to keep you restrained, but it seemed like that turned you on. That did a sassamistic hybrid convert you, Genbu said. That woman in bed with Volley Lucifer was Genbo Domon, head of the Domon clan and the wielder of the Black Tortoise. She had known Volley since they were children and had been infatuated by him ever since, growing up to be the beauty in her own right. She was also the one that took Volley's virginity. Contrary to what some others may think, she was hopeless in love that she allowed Volley to go through with his plan, luring out of the rival to face him. He brought it up to her after Rias Gremory, the fiancé of his rival, offered herself to him, along with other women that were his rivals. And initially, she was against it, but after a week, she allowed it because she also wanted Volley's rival to see what kind of woman he was hitching himself to, and to hoping that he will have a better judgment moving forward. She also had a feeling that this Rias needed to be taught a lesson, thinking she could get away with anything, although Genbu knew the possibility of Volley being punished as well, but she would be able to protect him as the Harris of the Domo clan. I was only turned on because I was with you, the, mo the mark proves it. I never marked them. Hell, the bitch even had sex with the carrier of the prison dragon. If I loved her, I wouldn't have allowed that. Like I wouldn't allow another man to lay his hands on you, Volley said. Oh, really? Genbu said as she moved straddle to the young Lucifer. So, what would you do if I slept with your rival? Hmm, Genbu said. The cockiness in Volley's tone disappeared in his expression hardening. What are you insinuating, Genbu? Volley said. Think about it. What if he wants payback and goes after me, but you'll be too busy fucking those... To realize it, Genbu said. Volley took his phone from her hands and began to remove the numbers of the girls or any pictures of them or videos they sent him, the exception of being his two female teammates. Now, look. Handing his phone back to her, see I'm done. No trace of them on there either. They call or anything will be unknown number that will show up. Disregard it. You've been with me from the start. Sure, I had a crush on my big sister figure, Leviatha, when I was young, but you made me notice you, and not just physically, as his hands roamed her curves. In what of the factions, Genbu said, turning off his phone and setting it back on the table. Probably banishment, maybe some sort of old Mao faction may vouch for me, but don't think I will be executed or anything. They came on to me. 
I just gave them what they thought they wanted. I was even surprised that they endorsed me to his parents when I wanted to kill them, and frankly, I still kind of do, Volley said. Why is that, Gambu said, because of how foolish they are. I honestly thought I had a bad life growing up, but it seems my rival had no one, especially after his little angel friend left. Well, at least he has the Seraph, since the little angel friend banked who he thought was his best friend, Volley said. Wasn't that you, Genbu said? No, he saw me as a brother. I can see why, considering how his parents ignored him. I had my mother, at least, then I guess you could say we both share the same father figure in Azazel. But he wanted to get a little revenge, Volley said. Revenge, Genbu asked? Yeah, after I slept with my two teammates, my teammate's sister, who is the Gremory's Rook, Along with the Grammy herself, with her Queen and Orphis, I contacted Azazel about my conquest, so to speak, he told me about how he seduced the Valkyrie, since Hyoto had made the Seraph Gabriel fall in love with him. Azazel was envious and decided to take the Valkyrie for himself. Not sure if she was interested in the Hyoto, but I could hear their moans as, as I was speaking with him. He already took Pyoman a little earlier, around the time the Gremory took me to Hyoto's room from what he told me. So he was jealous that your rival conquered a supposed crush's heart and decided to take the woman that he'd been interested in him as revenge, Gambu said. Two, Pyoman confessed to Hyoto, not sure about the Vac Valkyrie, but I guess eye for an eye. I knew most of them cheated on him because we had an orgy in his room and then a family dinner after it. It still makes me laugh at the lies that the Gremory was telling his parents. How they were so proud of us, although her knight and bishop just bailed. You think they told your rival, Genbu said? I'm not sure if he's been there. Can't tell. My dragon senses seem to be off, Folly said. You talk with Albion about it, Genbu said. He hasn't spoken to me since the Gremory came to offer herself to me. He told me to walk away, but I tried to explain how we would win it. how we would win the rivalry this way, but he didn't want to hear any of it, Volley said. And what of your two teammates, Genbu replied, as he got up to Volley to lay down to backside. One may kill me for defiling his sister. Though, it was Kuroko that came crawling back to the street cat that she is, back to its owner. She convinced Lafay and her own sister since Hyoto was in a coma. She traded me for him and came back when he was out of commission, Vali said. That was because he saved your life from an attack from the Trixa. Didn't you tell them that? Genbu said no. I had to make myself seem superior in order for the plan to work. They're demons. They only took power. They only look for some power. Same with dragons. It's what made it easier to bring Orphus to me. Didn't have to use the dragon hormones like the prison dragon carrier did a couple of the girls. Folly said. I feel like this is going to backfire on you someday. Genbu said. Someday, but not today. Turning to her and giving her a kiss, she snuggled up to him, Volley did. As she got comfortable, Volley turned to look at the ceiling and he decided to contact Albion again. You there, Albion, Volley said. He got a response from his partner. Come on, we won. We beat our rival. I know may you not agree with my methods, but we won. He was trying to convince Albion. In the depths of the mind of Volley was the white dragon emperor Albion, who lay there. He could hear Volley's voice, but he never responded. He told Volley to walk away from the Gremory. He didn't listen. When his black cat of a teammate came running back, he was disgusted and told Volley to walk away. He didn't listen. When he saw that Volley lied about why Issa was unconscious, he was livid. But Volley kept quiet, kept him quiet from speaking and seeing Orphus foolishly believe him. It was clear that she did not learn her lesson with Rizavim. Before Albion... Thought that with a Lucifer, he had the strongest carrier, but with the arrogance that came with the name is what sullied his honor. You should know I don't want to speak to you. Not sure whether to call you Rizavim Jr. or Razavan Jr. Doesn't matter. You're a bastard like either of them. Taking away your dragon senses is the best thing I can do. Otherwise, you would have called Issei out at the park. You forgot I can always sense where Drake is. So I am glad that I hid it from you. So many bridges have been burned because of your actions. So many bridges have been burned because of your actions. But even with Orphis... The power you stole. You won't be able to beat Dragon as carrier because you are a half demon and he is a true dragon, Albion said. The white dragon watched his carrier cuddle up to his lover and his mate. I can see I, you love her. It's why I allowed you to take place dragon mark on her. So don't play with her like you did with the Gremory. So you better hope that another war doesn't break out because all you can use is the scale mail without my assistance and i feel like it's going to take more than that if you want to protect her albion says 
closing his eyes and going back into his slumber, muting Volley's voice to have some peace. Midweek with Issei. Issei had been training his swordsmanship with a rondite. While also meditating as instructed, it helped with his emotions as well as his magic prowess. He could sometimes utilize the magic with his swings and slashes, usually elemental magic with fire, wind, and ice. He was tired lighting, but he couldn't get it right. In addition, since he was used to wielding a sword with his left hand, because that was what Athacom was infused with a boosted gear, he chained with his right hand. Thanks to the muscle that he has grown, he could wield a sword as heavy as a rondite with one hand. Before the actually used the sword, a rondite had him trained with a couple of regular swords that he found in the treasure room. He also continued with his knife training. Whenever he felt frustrated, he wasn't he also continued with his knife training. Whenever he felt frustrated, he wasn't getting anywhere. His sword training needed something to keep his mind off his frustrations. They needed to be something physical, as his magic training was where he needed to poise otherwise. He may end up destroying parts of his training palace. You have improved rather well. See, you did not need those books to work on your swordsmanship. Just a little more refinement, Arondite said. I was trying to develop a new style, my own style, so I figured that I'd start from scratch. As he threw a knife at the tree, practicing his knife throwing, Issei said. But why? You clearly have skill. It would be a shame to the ones who taught you, Arondite said. Yeah. Well, the one who taught me is also one of the people that stabbed me in the back, Issei said. Could you, could you elaborate a little more? Sorry if I had to bring back bad memories, Arondite said. It, no, it's fine. When I got Ascalon from the leader of heaven, the Archangel, Michael, I wasn't good with it. The sword was a gift as means to strengthen the alliance between the demons, angels, and fallen angels. Michael did some sort of resurrect reconstruction of the sword to allow me to hold it because at the time I was reincarnated of the demon with a dragon type sacred gear and Ascalon is a holy sword with dragon slaying properties so naturally I wouldn't have been able to wield it Issei said this is understandable then what happened how did you seek out your former teacher Arondite said I didn't seek them out after my first use I utilized the dragon slaying properties to go against my former rival Volley Lucifer he wields Albion the Hurakaku who is the rival to my partner Drag, the Sekiruti it led to a draw as I was trying to defend those of the alliance from the traitorous attack my former colleague Kibo who was the knight of my former mistress Reamer Grimmery Rias Gremory offered to train me, since he was exceptional with using a sword. Thanks to his training from Sojiota, the knight of the Cervex Lucifer, the older brother of Rias Gremory and my Sergat older brother. And what is this Kiba? What did this Kiba do? Rondite said. Well, I had multiple women who I thought loved me, and he slept with a few of them. One of them who is the ace of Michael, and swallowing as he choked a bit as he threw the knife into the tree, my childhood friend. Fault was on me. Should have known, though. He is the pretty boy at school. All the girls fawn over him, and his balance breaker is called the Sword of the Betrayer, Issei said. I'm sorry, Aranda, I'd say. The bleem seemed distant, as if remembering something. I have experienced something similar, or my wielder did at least. He was involved in an affair as well, so I can understand your pain. Tell me. Did you love her, Aranda, I'd said. Who? My childhood friend. Well... She was the one that confessed to me, so at the time I did. I really did, and you would think as an angel she would tell no lies, but after the battle against the Triexa, I was in a coma for two weeks, but I guess that's all it took to fabricate lies and deceit and turn their feelings off. She shocked me the most, Issei said. How so, Rondite said. Well, when she confessed, it seemed like she had been in love with me for years. She even took my first kiss. When we were children, and even when she was away, she didn't look at another guy. She made me feel like she loved me for years, but within a week, she turned those feelings off and threw me away, like the rest of them. Well, except my homeroom teacher, Ross Faisa, she didn't exactly confess to me, but I thought we were building to a relationship. But I guess I was wrong, since she still slept with someone that I thought I could trust, but she had been drinking, so I don't know. Thanks to my dragon ability test, I had to replay the betrayals I endured, and I got some things that I missed before, betrayals. So it was more than one, and you didn't fall into madness. You impressed me even more, Arondite says. Well, I can thank Drake for that, and also some others like my fiance, the Mal Leviathan, Seraphal Citri, Issei said. That is good. You had people there to pull you out of your darkness, Arondite said. So I am guessing your last will you experience something, huh? Issei said. Yes. But what he wouldn't admit 
was that his wielder was the cause of the betrayal. He was not the victim like Issei was. Let's go back to training. You have improved immensely if your destruction of the arena is an indication, Arondite said. Where Issei was in the oasis, as he dubbed the training area, the trees were cut down and scorched. There were burn marks on the ground, and there were other ideas where he utilized whatever ice magic he could. Although ice melted where he utilized whatever magic ice he could, although he was grateful to seeing his big sister Griffey in the battle to try to incorporate ice magic into his offense, but he could preferred using fire and wind in his sword slashes. Right, let's get back to it, Issei said, walking to the tree that he was throwing knives in to retrieve them. In that exception of Azazel and Pyamin were preparing themselves for a meeting. Shariel, Armios, you're with me. Barkil, I want you to keep an eye out of the two rogues, along with you. Tamil, I want you to keep Pyamin busy with keeping track of our business investments. I'm sure Barkil can handle Azazel alone. I can check out the anti-magic seals and the Phoenix clan requested to see if they worked, Armos says, and I have equipped it to send it Juka's lab to remove Vitra if he wants. However, I had to obtain an artificial sacred gear to replace Vitra and the boy, just in case wouldn't want him to die, Sarahil says. Yes, I believe Miss Sona wants to use the evil pieces as Issei as a means of trading the boy into the Kremery Barrage, so it would be free up some pieces for Miss Sona to reincarnate some more potential people. I've seen to notice to Team Slashdog. They will meet with us and you can speak with your niece when we get back, Barkul. I understand. Suzaku was very disappointed, but I told her that she needs to keep her composure whenever she meets with the Genbu, and not to mention Volley either. Good. We don't want to raise anyone's suspicions until Sir Zex decides to do what he needs to do, Shamazi says. Well, we will wait for your return in the verdict. Stepping back and heading to find Pyomi, and he didn't care if he caught or eloping with Azazel. They needed to get their investments in order, and she was slacking on their duties anyways, Tamil said. Shamazi, Armos, and Sarahil transported themselves to Sir Zex's castle to begin in the meeting and discuss what to not only do with the traitors, but also to have another case that involved the missing body of Rizavim. Now, we're in heaven in Michael's office. The angels were preparing to leave for the meeting. The only one not in attendance was Gabriel, who was in the room and her deck was standing by. So Irina is having doubts, is what you're saying, Dulio, Michael said. Yes, it's what she told Gabriel when she left a few days. She was invited to a location where the girls were, but I was able to track them. It seems that the Valkyrie spoke some words to her, which she confessed to Gabriel. It seems Griselda may get her wish, referring to his sister's queen that was standing in guard in front of Gabriel's door. It's still, it did take a while, but the system can be reset, Michael said. I cannot believe how low our sister fell, Raphael replied. It is my fault. I thought I could like our father. I allowed demons to pray. I allowed them to commit sin because of that feature that we were testing that was incomplete, Michael said. Don't take the burden all of yourself, Michael. We should have been aware, but we were too distracted handling repercussions from the war, Uriel says. But we are in agreement. Gabriel will be banished from heaven, as will my ace, Irina Shoto. As a result, Gabriel will become a fallen whereas Irina will revert to a human again. Her parents did request that she brought back home, and they cut off contact with the Hyoto as well. They also accepted the request from Griselda of taking in Gabriel as well. Hmm, it sounds reasonable. What of the Rondal and the Excalibur user? Raphael says, Excalibur, I'll leave it to the fate of Arthur Pentadragon and the Pentadragon family. As for Durandal, it chose her for a reason. So we'll let the weapon decide, Michael says. What of Hartsaliti, your weapon's ace? Riel says, she's no longer pure of heart in her infidelity, so it's useless in her hands. It will be brought back to her family, as was the Toji, her father that gave it to her. The other seraphs nodded, but Raphael could not help but laugh a little. It feels like a slap on the wrist, even though it may be like that in the long term, Raphael says. Yes, it seems that a blessing that Orphus bestowed onto my ace is paying off and increasing her luck. Forgive me if I am being too benevolent. I am just honoring Grishilda's last wish, Michael said. No, Michael, I would have done the same thing. We all care for Gabriel, but her naivety is the problem, along with your ace. If what Grishilda says is true, Raphael said. Hmm, Raphael, I'd like to stay and keep track of the system, make sure it's still working in preparation for the restart. Urel, you were with me, Dulio. 
We will be taking Lint with us, so please get her. So we may go. The rest of you are dismissed. We will inform of the outcome of this meeting. I fear there is something else at play and we must be ready, as everyone begins to shuffle outside except Uriel. This is going to be interesting, letting out a sigh, as he flickered a purple flame over his finger. Now we're in the underworld in Sir Zex's castle. The Mao in charge was walking towards the meeting room, besides him with a silver-haired wife and queen, Grafia Lucifitch. Has everyone showed up? Sir Zex says. Yes, Grafia replied. Everyone is accounted for. Are you sure of your decision? I am. After talking with the Juka, this is the best decision I can do. For her, and keep in mind, she did this to herself, so she must accept the consequences of her actions, Grafia said. The two stopped in front of the meeting room, where Grafia looked at her husband. I know you blame yourself, like the rest of your family, for spoiling her. Thus her ego became too much to bear. I understand your intentions, and frankly, I do not mind her. Embarrassed in front of the supernatural world of what she did to my younger brother, Grafia said. Our younger brother, Sir Zex corrected her. Yes. Well, let's get this over with, shall we? Grafia said. Sir Zex nodded and pushed open the doors to enter the meeting room, whereas the leaders were present, along with a few subordinates. Hence, the extra chairs were brought in. From the Hindu faction, there was handsome young men with blue and black hair with black eyes that possessed bottomland divinity and limitless superiority. This was Shiva, the god of destruction. Sir Zex remembered that Visha in Burma, two gods also ranked in the top ten, sealed themselves with the Triexa, watching over the seal from the inside. He remembered their pleas of telling Shiva to protect the world as they long, along with their gods, handled the beast. Shiva sat calmly waiting for the meeting to start, but he had sensed Sir Zex's presence. Looking towards the Greek faction, Sir Zex could see that Zeus and Hades appeared, as their brother, Poseidon, was another god that sealed himself with the beast. Zeus would have joined him, but Poseidon told him that someone needed to keep an eye on Hades and his actions in the war, for example, allowing Keo Keo and his team to use Samio. From the Nordic faction, Odin made his presence appearance. He remembered the smile on Odin's face when hearing of how Issei and Seraph all got together. It helped get his mind off his sons. Thor and Bladar, who were also sealed, he noticed that Odin did not come alone. First was Gontol, whom recognized, but he was with another woman with pink hair and ice blue eyes and in Valkyrie armor of some sort. Sir Zex assumed that she was his new bodyguard since Ross Vaisa was reincarnated as a demon now. From the Egyptian faction, only 18 the sun god came in attendance. The vampires that came were Valerie Tempest and Alitahiti. From the yokai, Yakasa was there, but not with her daughter. She came with a nekomata that had seven tails, its color, and her fur was white with black spots with an old man and had the ground-shaped head in Sun Wukong. From the fallen angels, he saw Shimazi with Sarheel speaking to Ajuka, and Armos, who was talking with the Phoenix Clan. From the angels, there was Michael with his Joker, Dulio, and his brother, Uriel. They also brought a girl with black and white hair and red eyes, wore a rope where he presumed was her battle garments, and from her holy aura, to do that she was also recarded angel, possibly on guard for Uriel. From the demons were the mouths, of course, with Volvium still sleeping, and Seraphal had her walker nearby. He knew she did not want to leave the embarrassment of coming to this meeting in a wheelchair. Surprisingly, she was talking to Klaus Pymine. He knew that Klaus was interested in the Mao, but they seemed to be talking as friends. He remembered that none of the Maos had any of their pieces besides Sir Zex, who had his queen and wife sacrificing themselves to join in, sealing of the Triexa, along with other armies that joined in, helping with the sealing. It was one of the few times that Sir Zex felt powerless. After the leaders, there was what was left of the Team DXD, having Sarah in her, his parage, Riser in his parage, of course. They had raveled from everyone else's presence. He figured Riser wanted to see her at the trial of the Genshin Saji and see what she caused. There was Sikavira and her queen, Olivian, and Zemi Dragon. Someone in her parage were there, but not with Saji, believing he was being held elsewhere so as to not to hear what would transpire during this meeting. Team Slashdog was also there, and they were talking with what was left of the volley team, which was Arthur and Pyoko. Accompanying them was with a woman with black hair. They that went to her shoulders and golden eyes. The Ashtroth Harris and Glacida Levius Harris was also in attendance as requested by their relatives, those being Ajuka and Falbium respectively. They stood near their Mao, red lips, and conversed with one another. The Ashtroth Harris was a head taller than Glistrid or Labios Harris, and it had a fuller figure compared to her petty frame. Despite her petty frame, her breast size was comparable to Ravels or Bigger, while the Ashtroth Harris size was comparable to her cousin, Sikavira. The Ashtroth Harris had blonde hair with blue tips, 
While the Glacier Labyrinth Harris had silver hair, their names were Lady Astaroth and Asuka Glaeus Labois. Off to the side, the meeting room was Ko Ko and his team. A lot. Although they were part of Team DXD, they were reserved and kept to themselves. They were the other beings that conversed with themselves, which was Tani. He was human-sized, but still in his dragon form, and Fafnir was in his human form. Thank you all for attending, Sir Zek says. I'm sure that you are all still healing from the war and growing your factions back to prosperity. But there is some news that I would like to discuss. As he took his seat in meeting table with Grapheus standing beside him. And what is this news, Zeus says. It's about Rezavim, Sir Zek said. He's dead, Atten said. Yes, I ripped him apart, took a mark from the leg. That bastard tasted horrible, Fafnir said. Yet his body was never found after that, Ajuka replied. Brother, did you find his soul? Are you still helping them? Turning to Hades, no. I remember. I looked for myself as Reservim's soul. It never came to me. And you say that his body was never found. Well, not keep any secrets. I was looking for Lilith, your ancestor, looking for the mouse. I received word that she was being kept by Aphosis and sent by some of my reapers to collect her. However, when they got to the lab, there was nothing for them to find, but luckily for us, the lab was still active, Hades said. How does that help? Sir Sex replies. It means that security measures were likely active as well, Sheminson said. Exactly. With security measures still running, the cameras were also running, and we got something quite interesting, producing a camera-like device on the mag circle. Why don't we have a look, hmm, Hades says. Activating the device, a hologram was projected, showing what looked to be an underground laboratory. They could see the two men wearing coats, or robes. One was blonde with a white lab coat, and the bloodstained wearing multi-sense spectacles. The other man had silver hair and wore a dark blue cloak over his figure. Fascinating, isn't she, Moru? They had a silver-haired man talk to the blonde. Yes, she is. I am amazed Rizavim kept her sustained for this long, Moro says. No, this more. By the way, this Moro, as he was not shown in Chapter 17, just FYI. Indeed, something he did right. Kept her preserved for us to use, even if he didn't want to. She will do well for the demons that you wish to create, Master, Moro says. Yes, but so will Rizavim. After all, he created that sacred gear canceller. We should use it to our advantage, develop it to new heights. Ah, I thought you were being sentimental, my lord, since he is your father, Moro says. The leaders were still shocked by this information. Was this Vol Volley's uncle? They knew from the fallen angels is that Volley's father was killed by Rizavim, so he wondered if they had another child. Not in the slightest. He was just another step to my plan of invasion, after all. Who do you think tipped the fallen angel Shimazine about the Chaos Brigade? Ah, you wanted to see your father fail. And what of your son, Moro says. Hmm, Folly. He's like all of us Lucifers. He will be arrogant and prideful. His ego will be built up thinking he won, acting all superior with his longinus, and I will be there to rip it from under him. I see. This is why you faked your death, Lord Rezavine. It will definitely be a shock to him seeing you're alive, Moro said. Not just him, but the factions as well. Had it been not for me tipping them off, my father would have won, and I couldn't have that. There is one Lucifer that should succeed. It's going to be me, Razavin said. And I will be the one to see you succeed, Moro said, my lord. What should we do about the cameras, as well as preparing the transport of decaying body of Lilith? Leave them be. We need something for the factions to know of our presence, and by that time, they know who we are, and we would have left this place and would have gotten a head start over our experiments, turning to the camera with an arrogant smile, Rezafin does. Well, she is already ready to be transported, Moro said. Good. Looking at Moro, before turning back to the camera, we'll be seeing you around, Rezafin said, as a transport circle took the two and the pod that held Lilith away. Hades shut off the device as the others looked stunned. They already dealt one with one Lucifer, and now they had to deal with another one. Who has the jump on them? Hmm, that's interesting, Hades said. He wanted to see he wanted us to see this while he was recovering. He was preparing himself. He wanted Rizavim to lose, Ajuka said. But there was a price, Shamaza said. As all heads turn towards him, our forces from the attack of the Trixa have been weakened, and we don't know the extent of his forces. If they took Lilith's body and Rizavim's body, it's been a month and a half since the battle. They have an advantage, and they have been watching our war against against Rizavim. They will know where to strike. It always has to be some demon with an ego too big for their own, Zeus says. I agree, but it seems that it's Lucifer's family that cannot stand each other, Atene says. 
I only hope that Indrecht is not a lie with them, Shiva says. He is still preparing for the war with you, Shiva Doniodin says. Correct. But I feel that there is more that is missing here. Tell us, Sir Zex, why isn't your sister and her parage here, along with the Celestial Dragons? Considering that the Harakako is the enemy's descendant and the Sekirota is supposed to be our pillar, this information is something that they should be aware of, Shiva says. You are right, which brings me to my next topic regarding the pillar of the factions, Issei Hyodo. Hmm... Or Issei, they just said Issei. Hmm, why don't you say his full name, Aten says. Because we are certain that he has denounced it, Seraphal replied. You see, a few weeks ago, Issei came to us, stating that he would be taking a leave of absence, Serzek says. Is that a code to go to bed with his harem, Seuss replied? Not in the slightest, as they are the cause of his leave, of his absence. While you may not believe me, but Rias Gremory and her Parage members, along with the ace of Michael, the daughter of the Phoenix Clan, the female members of the Deficient Volley team, Chief Secretary of the Gregar, Pumine, and the Seraph Gabriel committed treason against the Pillar, Issei, by an act of infidelity, Sir Zek says. The leaders who were not at the meeting that Issei held a few weeks ago looked shocked, as the others that were just hearing this for the first time. Surely this is some jest, Aten says. I wish it was, Aten Dono. I wish it was. You see, this is a meeting being held to discuss what to do with them, and not just them, but those that committed the act with. With the Harakako, the pawn of the Seatree clan, the former governor general of the Fallen Angels, and the knight, and the bishop of the Gremory Parage, Sir Zek says. Hmm, his own friends. While I have may betrayed this alliance, I have not betrayed those who I consider to be my allies. It seems that Rezavin was right. The White Dragon Emperor's ego has grown too big for his own head, Hades says. It is not like you to throw such accusations, Sir Zax, especially against your own sister, Zeus replied. As of this moment, she is not my sister, and I assure that I was not aware of her heinous acts. Until a few weeks ago, when Isi requested certain people to give his side of the story and share his memories for you to see, Sir Zax says. May we see them, Aten replied. Of course. Issei had us recorded the meeting, so you could all understand his leave of absence, as he produced the crystal that Michael and Shimonzen used to show their subordinates, but I warn you, the Issei that you met on the battlefield is not the same as the Issei that we saw. Ojuka then activated the crystal and began to play the events of the secret meeting that Issei had held. All leaders begin to watch Issei's memories, for as though they have already seen it, they remain neutral, with the exception of some women, as they hated seeing Issei go through this. Other leaders, such as Hades and Shiva, also remain neutral and calm, the rest of the range of emotions from disgust, outrage, shock, and disappointment. So you're telling me that our pillar abandoned his post because of a bunch of whores? Is that correct? Atin says. Others turned to look at Sir Zex because they knew he was a siscon. It wouldn't take lightly to someone insulting his sister. However, they saw was a passive face. Yes and no. He left because he needed to distance himself from to perform the ritual that would help him survive. If you saw, he was dying, Sir Zex says. Regardless, he still had the look of defiance, staring into the face of death. Even when I met him for the first time, he had the same look as someone I knew from long ago, the former leader of my Shimaganis, Hades said. Don't tell me you're talking about him, brother, Seuss said. Yes, I am. I even noticed a similar power within the Red Dragon Emperor, and that power can only be passed down to him unless he is a part of the lineage, Hadius said. Who are you referring to? Shamazu said. Former leader of the Shimagamis, Genshiro Shimizu Yamamoto, Hades said. Many leaders were shocked to hear that name, while some of the younger generations seemed confused. Are you telling me that there is a possibility that Isekun can be related to him? Odin said. <laughs> the boy never ceases to amaze me, but you are correct, Hades said. In other matters, what was this ritual? Shivia said. If I may speak, Tanin says. Please do. You and Fafnir are the ones with the most experience regarding this ritual. I take it you have the proof that he survived the ritual, because considering that he is in phase 3 of the fall, I do not know that he was physically, since you were at least last to see him, Tanin says. Yes, as he brought down his own pieces, he told us that he would send them to us when he completed the ritual, disassociating himself from them, Ajuka says. 
You would be correct. I can sense that one pawn piece holds the power of Orphis inside of it, but it also does something else. By successfully completing the ritual, he has eradicated himself from their lives as well, Tanin says. Is this why they don't act like they remember him? Seraphal says, Sorry, Sona. It reported to me that the girls acted like they didn't remember him. You've seen it, Tanin says, turning towards Sona to speak. Yes, Rias came to my office asking for my pawn a week ago, but she did not seem to care about her own, or rather her former pawn, Sona says. Did you mention Issei at all to her, Tanian says. No, because we had this meeting yet, I did not want them to start looking for him earlier than expected, Sonian says, or Sona says. Good, by eradicating themselves from their lives, they would not remember him unless something would trigger them to, Tanian says. So the mention of his name could cause them to remember him, Yakuza replied. Yes, something like that. Or something that relates to him. To them. For example, if you were to ask the Grammary Harris of how she saved herself from being married to Riser, it would trigger that memory and thus she would remember Issei, Tanin says. Then how does that explain Ross Visa? Odin says. Excuse me? Tanin replied. My granddaughter, she spoke to me confessing about what she did and believes she was drugged and regrets not being able to confess to Issei, Gondol says. We well, asked yeah, Shimazin to look into the matter, Odin replied. From what you said, she did not have a concrete relationship with the boy like the others, so she still remembers him as she did not confess to him, Tanin says. Regarding the matter, I had some scouts investigate Azazel's lab. We did find traces of Astafeda known as Spanish Fly mixed in the wine, Shamasi says. We believe that she was targeted as an act of revenge on Isekun, Sarhil replied. Revenge? For what? Serzek says. It was my sister, wasn't it? Looking at Shamiz, she was a part of the reason why Azazel fell from our father's grace. He could not have her, so he slept with a human instead to relieve his lust. But our father found out, Michael says. So you're saying that Azazel targeted her granddaughter because he could not be with your sister, Zeus says? Yes, because Gabriel confessed to Isekun, and that must have upset Azazel. So when Isekun was in a coma, he put his plan into action. I thought he was over his crush on her, Shamaziz said. We all did. We all also did not think that Pyoman was drugged as well as Isekun's was in a coma. She and Azazel became closer, likely seeking comfort in another as like demons. We fallen angels can be driven by our lust, Shariel says. But the Seraph Gabriel also cheated on the boy, Etten said. I don't think he was aware of that. If he was, I would have gone after her and not Ross Faisa, Shemison says. I would like to apologize. Shariel stood up, standing up and bowing to Odin and Gondil. I had been more insistent on working with Ross Faisa. I could have protected her from Azazel's motives. For that, I apologize. As am I, Shemison said, bowing to the Nordic leader. As leader, I should have paid more attention. Forgive me. It's fine. What's done is done, Odin says. I would like to have requested pardon for Gasper, Vali replied. Val Valerie, we discussed this, Ellen Hilden. I know, but please, review the memories. At least he and Kiba showed some remorse about what they did, Valerie, Valerie said. Then why didn't they tell anyone? At least the Valkyrie had the gall to communicate with her grandmother. Why didn't he seek you out? You seem close to him, 18 says. At this, Val Valerie was silent. She didn't know what to say, so she remained silent as the words were caught in her mouth. It's because of me that they did not say anything, Serzek said. Some leaders looked shocked by this development. How so? A teen says, intrigued by what the mouse said. Because I am a Siskon, or was. If they mentioned something, I would have questioned Rias, and I would have believed her word over theirs. Had I not seen that the video that a classmate had recorded of that incident that took place, Serzek said. Others took notice of how he said, Riton, when speaking of his sister. Hmm, I see. I suppose that answer will suffice, Etienne said. Valerie looked at Sir Zex, of saying thank you, to which Sir Zex nodded and the meeting carried on. Moving on. Tani, you said if something were to trigger their memories to con connect them to Issei, they would remember him, correct? Michael said. That is correct, Tani replied. Dulio, could you please report your findings? Michael said. <laughs> Yes, Michael Sama, after seeing the memories I was taxed with following Gabriel around, watching over her a couple weeks ago, she left for a secure spot with the other girls. I heard the Gamery Harris say that it was they trained for the raiding game against Riser Phoenix, Dulio said. Hearing that, Riser scoffed his teeth. Well, he did 
win that game, it was the battle after that ruined him, but made him a better person. Apparently, Michael Sama's ace, Irina Shoto, looked conflicted whenever she looked at her former battle partner, Zenovia Korta. She would talk to Gabriel about why Rafaisa mentioned being childhood friends and wishing to never have met her. It seemed like this was a trigger for her, as she mentioned how she was alone. But a boy took a chance to play with her and she vowed to be with the boy till the bitter end. She does not recall the name of the boy and acknowledges that if this boy would see her now, she would lose him for breaking her promise and telling Gabriel that she does not deserve to be an angel. She told Gabriel that they are doing something wrong and asking for forgiveness for pulling their into this and crying she shouldn't have listened to the others and because she, both of them, to swerve away from their faith. Hmm... Yakuza says, so Ross Faisa may have triggered her memories unknowingly, and Ross Faisa was exempt from forgetting about him because she didn't have established relationship with him, so there is a chance that she could be with Issei. Tanin-san? Yakuza says, maybe as a kinship, but I don't know how much more than that. Not for her, possibly others as well, but it depends on the boy, Tanin says. So what do you suppose we do with them? Atin says, Exile, Sir Zek says. All heads turn to him. While their achievements from the war may have served from their death, it's best to exile them with no compensation earlier. Either, Sir Zek says. Why is that? Zeus replies. Because Issei Kun gave his money to them. I would say that that was his last act of kindness, Sir Zek says. As he showed the recording of Issei speaking to him, Ajuka, Seraphal, the Patriots of the Sea Tree, Gremory, and the Phoenix Clan, and Odin. Yes and no. Sir Zex, while it is may be a, his last act, it is also a smokescreen so that he can train in peace. Isn't that right, Seraphal? Smirking towards the Malaviathan, who huffed in annoyance. She thought she was the only one who knew, forgetting about Ajuka's intelligence. You would be correct, Seraphal said, letting out a sigh and crossing her arms. Hmm, you're Seraphal. You look different, Zeus says, turning his attention to the Malavaya thing. Indeed, no longer prancing around that magic girl outfit of yours, Hades said. Can we please get back to the topic at hand, Seraphal said with a cold look in her eyes and the room began to drop in tenfer. Calm down, Seraphal Dono. No need to get upset, Yakasa said as she looked at the Mao and with a smirk on her face. I forgot, she knows Imyokai senses, getting her teeth and bringing to the temperature back to normal, Seraphal does. Atin starts speaking. My, that is some power. But back to the topic. You say that the Sekiyuti compensated them. No need for us to do so then, right? Atin says. That would be correct, Sir Zex replied. Then I am fine with expelling them from the supernatural world. However, what if we need them for when the new threats make some move? Atin says. Then we'll be waiting, unlike them. As the leader of DXD, we have been training. We could not stay idle for such a long time, Dulio says. Yes, I can feel your auras. The war has made you stronger, nodding to them. Nodding to the team, Sun Wunkan does. May I interject? It was the ground sharp head old man that came with Akasa. The Nekomanas may, may we take with them. I know many of you would oppose, but I made a promise to their mother to look after them. And who are you? Zeus says. Ah, yes, I am Nerfrian, the leader of the East Yokai faction, and this is Magari. Gesturing to the Nekomata beside him, she is the leader of the Nekomatas. And was a friend of their mother, Fujami. I feel like I have failed for not keeping her daughters out of trouble, Magari says. I don't want this to break up the alliance, but you exile them from your lands, as I will only take in the Neshoshidos. That is it. That is fine. By me. And I do agree. Exile is sufficient. I assume they would not be getting in an epicomic economic aid either then shiva says that is correct only the money that isei kun has given them is all that they will receive then i have proof of them being exiled zeus says in addition upon exile my associate armos has developed some anti-magic seals that would place on them to prevent them from rebelling against us how intriguing. Do they work, Hades says? We supplied one to the Phoenix Clan a week ago. They have no complications yet. When they applied it to the youngest child, Rabble Phoenix, Aramos said. Is this true? Emily turning to Riser, Elena did. Yes, she expressed her story catching the Vitra bear in bed with the nun. 
She stated that she felt a pull towards him, Riser said. Oh, was it not her lust as a demon, Hades says. No, my sister is smarter than given to lust at the time, Riser said. If I may interject, we went to Vitra to check if his bearer used dragon hormones. To which he confirmed, but not only to her, but also a human girl that attends our school. If you saw from the memories of Issei, she is the one that accused him of stealing her underworld, Sona says. And you have both of them in custody, Atene says. We have Ravel in from the Phoenix Mansion for now. Considering that her sentence seems to be exile, she will be moved to the human world, Riser says. The Vitra Bear is hidden location in the human world that is guarded by the Citri clan. Could you bring him, please? There's something we'd like to ask of the prison dragon, Sorry Hill replied. Subaki, Loop, bring him, keeping her eyes on the catch rate as well as the two as she disappeared into the transport Sona. circle, Sona did. Are the rest of you in agreement for exile, Sir Zek says. It is fine by me, Yakuza replied. I agree, Element Hill said. I am fine with it, Michael said. As am I, but in addition, we will need to confiscate any labs that Azazel may have been in the human world. His carelessness may give evidence to the enemy if we are not careful, Shimaza says. So do we all call them here to let them know their punishment, Atten says. No, I proposed something that was brought to my attention, Sir Zex replied. And what is that, Sir Zex says. I mean, Zeus replies. A rating game for the whole supernatural world to see, Sir Zex replied. Ha! You want to humiliate your own sister. That is cold even for you, Sir Zex, Hades says. She needs to be taught a lesson. It is my fault that she acts like this, so I must rectify it, Sir Zex replied. Who would face her, Yakuza says. Why would it be none other than my cousin, Cyroorg? However, this would not be like before, Sir Zex replies. What do you mean, Cyroorg replied. Don't tell me, Ajuka says. Yes, it will be similar to what against against Ryzerkun. An all-out war. No dice rolling in Cyroorg. Don't end the game too quickly. I understand, Cyroorg replies. I presume when she is broken down that this is what you will inform them of their punishment. Kick them while they're down, hmm? A Aten says. Yes, it will force them to re remember Issei. When they realize that, they will know why their defeat is infamous. After which, we will inter interrogate Kiba Yuto and Gaspar Validid on their actions. Migurin said, I trust that you can get close to Kuroka to place a seal on her and prevent her from escaping. Same with your sister, Arthur Kun, Serzak says. Yeah, that's fine, Muggery says. I can handle appending my sister, Arthur replied. Good. And Shamazin, can you handle Azazel and Pyami? And Serzak replied, yes. Our only issue is the Harakako, Shamazin says. If I may speak... Biyoko says, um, I have been tracking Volley. He's been with his silver-haired girl. She has a dragon mark. I saw it. They talked. He had no interest in the girls. He played with them to get a rise out of Issei so they could fight. I went to the Hyoto household and saw that none of them had the Volley's mark like the girl did, Biyoko says. It is likely. He gave himself to this silver-haired girl before sleeping with the Gamma Ray and her female teammates, and chose not to mark them, considering that Vitra Carrier claimed to have slept with them as well. If the Harakako marked them, it means he wants them. But since there was no mark, your statement holds true. He had no interest in those girls, Tanin said. So he may not show up to the raiding game, Zeus replied. I can occur with this, because as I was listening into Gabriel's and Irina's conversation, I overheard Rhea state that Volley was not answering her text or calls. Same with the Barkill's daughter, Dulio said. And what about Orphis? She is another problem, Atene said. As if he summoned her, a dimensional gap opened and came out. Orphis, but her hair was in a ponytail and her eyes were brown. Plus, her godly glowy outfit was a little more conservative. It caused everyone except a few small to get the guards up. Speak of the devil, and he shall appear, Ajuka says. What are you doing here, Orphis? This is a private meeting, Sir Zek says. The girl looked at him and blinked in confusion, and then she started, started, stared, or started to look around the place. Orphis, you gotta help me, a blonde stated. He looked beaten, disheveled, wet, and burn marks on him. A black eye was prominent on his face. Something Riser smirked about seeing the blonde's condition as he ran towards Orphis. Loop, Sona says, causing the werewolf to go in actions. During the shock of Orphis's appearance, he had let go of Getru Sanji, preparing to fight the Dragon of Infinity. Loop pounced on Sanji as he held him to the ground a few feet away from Orphis. 
Ah, Orphis, please help me. I need my help from my siblings, please, Saji said. Orphis simply tilted her head in confusion and stared at him with her emotionless eyes. Lilith is not Orphis. Stop calling Lilith Orphis, Orphis says. These are on guard, let out a size. It was not Orphis, but her pawn, her spawn, Lilith, who was still looking around if searching for something. Where's Oni-chan? Lilith felt her his piece is here. Lilith wants to play with Oni-chan, Lilith says. Nobody knew how to answer as it was unsure how to tell her what happened. Before they could do anything, Lilith started to walk towards Ajuka. She looked at him and turned towards what was in front of the seat, seeing the pieces. Those are Oni-chan's pieces. Tell Lilith why they are here. What did you do to Oni-chan? Lilith said. We did nothing. He removed them himself. Said he needed to train and he didn't want the pieces to hinder him, Seraphal said. Lilith reached her hand out to the blue pawn piece, and it began to fly to her. Grabbing the piece, she closed her hand around and it closed her eyes. There was a slight blue glow from her clothes in hand when she opened it. Out dropped a clear pawn piece, devoid of any power. She turned her attention toward the Mao, and when she did, she caught a scent on her. Hmm, why do you smell like Oni-chan, Lilith said. As she walked up to the Malaviathan, Bakared said that you only have someone's scent unless you mate with them. Did you mate with Lilith's Oni-chan, Lilith said. She absorbed Orphus's power, making it her own. Fascinating, Ajuka said. The others that did not know of this information were shocked, while the dragons laughed, except Olivian. Ha! I didn't want to say anything, but it looks like your secret is out, Tanian says. I thought the walker would raise some suspicions, <laughs> Fafnir said. Seraphal felt embarrassed, but there was nothing she could do now, so she let out a sigh and leaned back in the chair. Hmm, this is unexpected, but congratulations, Zeus said. So that explains your change of attitude. I'm impressed referring to her looks and change of outfit, which was a high colored sleeveless purple dress with a gold trim that seats her emblem on it. I showed off her curves and cleavage, Hades said. The Sekiyuti seems to have made an upgrade to his bride. Congratulations, Atin said. My, how interesting this is, looking towards the Malaviathan. Indeed, we will have to talk about it later, Seraphal says, Yakuza says. Moving forward, now that we are in agreement of exile on the traitors against the Pillar of the Factions, what should be done with them? Pointing down to Vitra's carrier, Serzek said. May I make a suggestion, Sona says. Since he, unfortunately, is my pawn, Sona said. And what... Would Oh, looking down, she saw Lilith had sat in her lap. Since you smell like Oni-chan, it means he trusts you, so Lilith will trust you. Your lap is softer than Oni-chan's that she could smell. It was like, Lilith said, Mmm, oh, reaching into her cleavage, she pulled out a piece of candy. Here you go, Seraphal said. She gave it to the candy to Lilith, who took the sweet treat and savored it while listening to the conversation. What was your suggestion, Sona-san, Ajuka said. I'd like to propose a trade. He can be Rias's pawn now. I have some potential candidates that can fill his place. No, not her. Please, Katrio, don't let me join her. She'll ruin my siblings. Please, Sanji said as tears casted it down his face. What happened to him, Sir Zek said. That would be the effect of my curse on him. Barely held up for a week before he succumbed to it. All that arrogance he had before it's broken down, Vitra said. Vitra son, we were wondering if you wanted to leave your carrier, Sariel says. Really? You guys can do that, Vitra replied. Yes, after all, I assisted with implanting your remaining fragments into this boy. I brought it the necessary equipment to extract you as well. Well then... Looks like I get my wish and you get yours. How about that? Vitra said. No, no, Vitra, please don't leave me. Help me. You asked for this. But look on the bright side. Your stigma will be removed from them when I leave you, Vitra said. What do you mean by that, Vitra, son? It's a mark of any girl that has with him and that's with another dragon. Any female that betrays a dragon with another dragon gets a stigma from a dragon that betrayed their partner with. The stigma appears when the dragon that was betrayed beats the dragon that took their partner as we saw. Issei defeated him in school while under the effects of the fall, Tanin said. As a result, this punk was marked as a weaker dragon. Which is the stigma that indicates to the female that they have a weak partner. Since this fool wanted to mark them all against my wishes, luckily he didn't sleep with all of them. But if any of those girls were pregnant, their children would be weak. But since I am being removed, the stigma would be removed as a weaker dragon has died. Since he would not bear any semblance of the dragon with me gone, Vitra said. Shall we take them to your lab, Ajuka, Sariho says. 
Yes, Sir Zex, Ajuka said. Yes, but first, since we have no pillar, I suggest that someone needs to take Isekun's place, Sir Zex replies. Hmm, how about it? How about the angel? Pointing at Dulio. Me? Why me? Dulio says. It's a good idea. You are the leader of the anti-terrorism team that was formed, so I second Shiva's decision. I agree as well, Odin says. It's not a problem for me, Yakuza replied. I trust in Yakuza's judgment. No, Rion said. I don't mind, Illibin said. I agree with it as well, Shamanson says. A wise choice, Ajika replied. It seems that we are mostly in agreement. I would say so, Afton said. Shiva seems to always have proper judgment, Hades said. Michael-sama? Congratulations, Dulio. But what about, Dulio replied. Do not worry, Grishelda can handle it. Dulio, do you accept the position, Sir Zek says. I, uh, yes, Sir Zexam, I accept. Then turned to his team, and I would not let you down as your leader, Dulio said. Then congratulations, Dulio. Pillar of the factions, as the other leaders in Team DXD clapped at the announcement of the new pillar. Hmm, too noisy, Lilith said, but she could not be heard over the clapping, so she snuggled to the back of the head of Seraphal's cleavage, using the mouse breast to cover her ears. Now then... After the raiding game, the traitors will be banished from our lands, with the exception of the Nekamanas allowed to enter the East Yokai faction, is that correct? Sir Zek said. Rosvaisa is allowed to see her grandmother at least, but the Hirakako is banished, Odin said. I'll allow Gaspar to visit Valerie as well, if she believes in him, then I will allow it, Alema Hillity said. On my end, the system of heaven will be restarted as a result. The demons, Azia Argento and Zenovia Corda, can no longer pray. My ace and the sister will not be able to continue these acts either, as they will become fallen angels. But my sister's queen has faith that they will confess their sins before then. From Dulio's report, I believe so as well, so I will convert my ace back to being human. When the time comes, and she and Gabriel are banished from heaven. This would result in Gabriel becoming a catstray, and they will be taken in to live with the Shioto family, who want their daughters back no longer trusting her to be in the Hyoto's care. Azazel and Pyongman will be banished from the Grigar, along with the Harakako, and all of Azazel's research will be confiscated. Shabzam, as he said. Then, for now, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you for attending. I will inform you when we will have a date for the raiding game. But before all of you go, he stood up and bowed. I'd like to apologize for the actions of my sister and her Parage members. It is my fault for spoiling her to a point that she believed that she could do whatever she wants. Had I and the, my family been more strict in her upbringing, this would not have happened, and for that I apologize, Sir Zex says. You could have not foreseen this happening, Sir Zex. You don't have to apologize for actions of others, Shiva said. Yes, all is forgiven from us to you, Sir Zex, Zeus replied. The other leaders nodded in agreement, as they respected Sir Zex for apologizing for his sister's actions, but like Shiva, said no one could have foreseen this happening. Thank you. Well... That is all I have to say. You may go now, Sir Zek says. As all the others gave a nod and most began to leave the castle to go to back to their respective factions, the dragons, and those from Team DXD also began to leave as well to go back to their clans. Shall we handle this now, Ajuka? Sarhil says. Yes, Sona-san, please come us. Latia, you too, Ajuka says. Sony and Latia say at the same time, of course. So, so, before you go, Seraphal says as she was rubbing the sleeping Lilith's head and nuzzled with Twitter brows, give the girls a few days off so you can release that recording and make sure that no one mentions Issei to them, Seraphal says. Understood, Onisama, but they wouldn't they get suspicious from the days off and loop. Please pick him up, gesturing to the down Sanji, Sona said. I can help with that, Sikaveria says. How so, Sona replied. Well... We need K.O. K.O.'s team's help. Make a monster or several that is Ramprange or disguised as a renegade demon. Make them do some work, Sikivara says. I suppose that would work. Using a message to keep them away, Sona said. Exactly. When they return, they will see how things have changed, Sikivara says. I'll contact K.O. K.O. His team can monitor them as backup to keep them in check. We'll talk later. As the rest of her parage followed Ajuka, Sarahil, and Latita to Ajuka's lab. Sika Vera gave a nod in agreement as she and her queen left the meeting hall to report back to her parents about what happened. Mao, Oji-sama, the meeting is finished. You can stop sleeping, poking Falbum, before giving up and leaving back to her clan's territory, Aruka did. So, Odin, who is your new guard, Sir Zek says, starting at the pink-haired woman. She seemed dangerous. Oh. 
This is Lightning. She was sent to me by Etro, the goddess that watches over Valhalla. When Rezavim breached the dimensional seals to the other worlds to send to the evil dragons out to who knows where, Eto brought the Lightning in and has been working for her ever since. I believe that Great Red might have sealed off the passages to take her home because there are many by other dangers out there that we are not prepared for. So, Etro sent her to me to live a new life. I was hoping that she may join Team DxD. Virgil is impressed by her skills. She is a formidable opponent. Odin said. She's even true to her name. It's been a while since I've seen such pee, Gondol said. Welcome to the team, Dulio said, Lightning Sot. Thanks, her tone was sharp, Lightning said. Well, we are off, Michael replied. Wait, Lord Michael, this is Lady Merlin introducing the woman that came with them. Arthur did. Merlin, as a wizard that helped King Arthur, Sir Zek said, that would be I, Merlin said. How are you alive? Michael replied. I placed myself in a comatose state. I believe I was awakened by that Issei of yours. I believe he drew something that I imprisoned. The Holy Sword, Ondite, Merlin said. Arondite! How could I have Issei have it? My team and I defeated Katre known as Santil. He claimed that he had the sword, Tobio said. Lady Merlin believes that what he had was a fragment of a fake one, Arthur said. I was informed that it's still under your protection, Merlin replied. Yes, and still is, Tobio said. Good, that is fine. Hold on to it. You say that this is Issei is the Sekiuti, right? Merlin said. That is right. He is this generation's Red Dragon Emperor, Sir Zek says. I see. I helped someone with the same title before, and since he gave me such a good impression, I would like to meet him. Issei, that is. Although I do not approve of how he was betrayed, he has become someone of interest to me for having the same title as the one I helped before, with a smile. And then some, Merlin said. She looked at the two awake mouths, but rather than looking at Seraphal, she looked at Lilith. She was curious about her power. She had what needed to know about Great Red and Orphus from Arthur, so seeing a copy of the Dragon of Infinity made Merlin want to know more about her for power. For Issei, it wasn't that he was the Red Dragon Emperor, but knowing that he was built from the flesh of Great Red, her gluttony for knowledge made her interested in him as well. We will let you and the others know of his return, Seraphal says. Her woman instincts told her that this woman was dangerous and would likely go for Issei for herself. She hoped she was wrong. Thank you. We will take our leave, Merlin said, as Bioko made a transport seal, taking them back to the Pentadragon Manor. We will be leaving as well. Thank you, Michael said. Oh, Michael, you never introduced us to your new guard, gesturing to the female exorcist. Ah, I forgot. This is Lint. She is a secret extra Joker candidate and wielder of the Longinus, in Sitter and Anthem, but will become my new ace upon Iria's release. He said the last part with a sad smile, Michael said. Although we did not want to, it was the right call for him to make. In regards to Irina, even if she was a valuable piece, he still does pray that Gabriel and Irina may overcome this ordeal and get back on the right path, praying that Shioto can guide them there, because he is still caring. He does secretly pray that they earn forgiveness from Issei someday, and might not be today or tomorrow, but he can only hope. I see, it's an honor to meet you, Lin San, Sir Zek says. Thank you, Sir Zek Sama, giving a quick bow to the demon king, Lin did. Well, we are off now, thank you, as she and his angels teleported back to heaven to give the verdict of exile to the traitors to his brother. I am off. I have to see how Barkil and Tomil are handling those two, Shemazin said. Very well, giving a nod to Shemazin, who went back to the Gagar, but also Team Slashdog left as well, Sir Zek said. Well, we have overstayed. We'll see you around, brats, Odin said, as he, Gondol, and Lightning went back to Asgard. You know... I think I can make her a new dress for my old outfit. She had not been paying attention to anyone. But watching the sleeping Lilith Grafia help me, I can't use my walker and carrier at the same time, Seraphal said. What do you need, Grafia said as she watched Seraphal stand up but on wobbly legs as he tried to stay in place while holding Lilith. Grab my walker and transport us to the castle, please, Seraphal said. Very well, Grafia said, grabbing the walker, then holding on to Seraphal to help her stay upright before they transported to Seraphal's castle. All that was left was Saraorg and his parage, the sleeping Falbium, Claus, and Sir Zex in the meeting room. Now, Saraorg, when do you propose that this raiding game might be held? I'd like to give her a false sense of security. So far, we were doing that by acting normal and tolerating her presence. So, how about after her graduation? She would be confident in her abilities, or rather her Paraj's abilities, and she would sense the pawn pieces and believe that Issei is training here in the underworld, Saraorg said. Hmm, I would have to speak to Sona and Ajuka to make sure... 
That where they keep Genjiro Sanji, Ryuz cannot detect those pieces, and to keep the remaining ones, preferably in Tanin's territory, Sir Zex says. Then let's say somewhere about a month after her graduation, so she can think of ways to take on my Regulus Ray Lather Lex. Transformation. But forgive me if I want to beat her face in for what she did, Sarah Org says. I understand. Well, normally I would approve. I would not approve of your methods, but try to inflict bodily damage. I think a blow to the head. You may knock her head off. We don't want to kill her, Sir Zex says. Ha! <laughs> I can do that, Sarorg says good. I will check in with Sona when the graduation should, since Rias does not want to say anything to us. She has taken advantage of her independence quite a lot, Sir Zex says. Would you like to be attending her graduation? Would you attend her graduation, Sir Zex said? She doesn't like to tell us anything, so I don't think so. Maybe I'll take a vacation then. When she calls about our absence, she will let her know of the rating game then, Sir Zex says. I see. If that is all, I would like to go train, get on the jump of things, especially for when he comes back. I feel that he will be stronger than before, Sarah Org says. Well, he is my brother, after all, Sir Zex replied. I will look forward to a rematch. But until then, Sarah Org says, until then, Sir Zex replies. Thank you for your time. Then he turned to his barrage. We're leaving, Sarah Org says. As his queen, Kushida created a transport circle to take them back to the house of Biel. Once they left, Sir Zex leaned back in his chair and sighed as a tear rolled down his eyes. He had decided to banish his own sister, but it was for best and maybe she will learn for this actions have consequences. Are you alright, Sir Zex-sama, Klaus says. I asked to be invited by Seraphal-sama. She told me of what happened to the Red Dragon Emperor, and I wanted to see it through his eyes. I must say I am displeased with your sister, Klaus says. Aren't we all, Sir Zex replies. I was going to cut ties with the Grand Marie and Phoenix clans, but I was informed that he does not blame them, and second recording that you showed also shows that. Plus, I hear he considers your parents to be his own, Claus says. Indeed, he does, Sir Zex replied with a small smile. So I thought otherwise, and would like to ally myself with both clans instead, and before you ask, I am fine with Seraphal Sama being with someone like him, Claus says. That's good to hear, Sir Zex says. I'd also like to join Team DXD. With your sister being removed, I figured my manpower could help. Sorry, I did not speak up earlier. I have never been in the presence of so many powerful beings before, Claus said. I guess it's something that I have to speak with Dulio about, as you are aware. He is the leader of the team, Sir Zex says. I understand. I will be leaving now. I am sure my father would be able to glad to tell that they are being banished from the factions. But tell me, if the future of this upcoming war we need more power, would you let them back into the fold, Klaus says. Hmm. It's something I have not thought about, Sir Zex replies. Well, it should be something to consider. This enemy has been in the shadows the whole time for who knows how long. Watching us, Rezavim would have won. If what he says is true about tripping tipping the factions off. It does not bode well for us, Claus says. How so? Sir Zex replied. If they have been tipping us off, it means they have a contact in the factions, meaning they have a spy. Had it not been for their sense of revenge against Rizavim, this place would have been raised to the ground. Problem is that there was no suspicion from anyone in the meeting today, Claus said. Hmm, not even Hades, Sir Zex says. Hard to say with the face made of bones. Can't really determine any motion from a physical standpoint. But he was troubled that his Rizavim found Lilith, Claus said. I will inform the other leaders to be on the lookout. Perhaps that is someone that is close to them that they can find information to who is giving out leaks. We must be ready, Sir Zex says. Indeed. I'll let you be, Sir Zex. I'm going have a good day. Creating a transport circle to leave. Claus does. You as well, Claus son. Watching the young man leave, he truly has grown. I thought he would be a stalker and try to kill Isekun for Seraphal. Thank goodness, but he did bring up a good point about a spy. Could be more, and I feel like they reside in our faction, unfortunately, Sir Zex says. He let out a sigh, a bit annoyed, feeling the spy could be someone that support the old Mao faction within the Devil Society, but he just didn't know who. What do you have for the rest of the day, Falbium? He looked towards his fellow Mao, only to find him not there. Sir Zex looked around the room in shock. He was perplexed by the sleeping mouse speed of disappearing. How does he do that? Sir Zex says before shrugging his shoulders. Oh well, I guess it's paperwork for me. The Mao Lucifer got up from his seat and began to walk towards his office since he had nothing else to do as Grafia had gone with Seraphal and Lilith. Maybe Milikis would be up for another road trip since Grafia is not around. I think Seraphal can keep her occupied for a while, Sir Zex says, as he decided to call for his son and spend more time with them and then worry about the paperwork later. Now, we're back with Issei. 
The Black Blade, Arondite, watched as Issei spun his sword in each hand. It had been coaching the young man during their time in the Oasis. It was much more beneficial than it looks that Issei had brought. Since Arondite was wielded by Lancelot, who was an exceptional knight, Issei could dual wield like Lancelot could, although Issei preferred that the swords be the same length, whereas Lancelot wielded the sword and a short sword at the same time. Arondite deduced that Issei preferred this because he wielded two Ascalons, but never at the same time. He technically used three, because he had a third one that was infused into the tail of his scale mail armor, which he could apply holy magic to renegade demons as Ascalon was also a holy sword. You have improved. Although some of your elemental slashes could use some work, specifically your ice and lightning strikes, Sarandite said. Yeah, I figured. Not as good as Sarah or Nissan. Still need some work on the ice. Same with the lightning. Definitely need some improvement. I try to do what Barkhill told me, but I can barely hold the spark when I swing the blade, Issei says. Yes, you have been able to use holy magic in your attacks. You have also worked well with using your daggers and switching between sword and knife. It reminds me of my old carrier. He wielded a long sword and a short sword, Arondite said. Thank you. You know, when I got those books, I didn't expect to really be talking to anyone or have a teacher. I probably would have gotten nowhere without you, sure. I may have been well physically, but I don't know if I've gotten the boost my open magic core without you. It is no problem. You are trying to better yourself. You remind me of Lancelot in that regard, Arondite said. Really? Well, I don't think I could be on par with his swordsmanship yet. That would take me years, Issei said. I suppose so. Tell me. I feel other presences within you. Whenever you carry me around, what are they? Oh, you must be feeling Drake. He resides within the boosted gear. It's my sacred gear, Issei says. That name sounds familiar, Arondite says. You probably heard of it because of Lancelot's son. Galahad had the same sacred gear. He's considered the strongest male red dragon emperor of the Sekiyuti. He went by a different name, Belzard. Guess it was to keep his identity a secret. Ah, uh, that's why. Galahad brought me here as a France is the home of Lancelot, despite being Camelot being in what you call Great Britain now, Arondite said. Yeah. I got some big shoes to fill, Issei said. Why haven't you tried to unlock the sacred gear of yours, Arondite said. Issei stopped spitting the sword in his hands. He hadn't thought of that. In his training, he had been too busy building his body up, then working on his unlocking his magic core, and when he did, he focused on his swordsmanship and establishing magic into his tax. In these past weeks, while doing some school, studying on the side. I hadn't really thought about that. I guess my mind has been elsewhere, focusing on different parts of myself, Issei said. Well, why don't you try it now, Arondite said. Okay, I think I will. Although we'll have to focus on Drake and see if he is awake, I need to focus on the boosted gear within me. My former fiancé told me to think of something strong to bring out my sacred gear. My battle partner, Drake, is strong, and so is my surrogate father, Great Red. Great Red, Arondite said. Ah, well, Drake is the original Red Dragon Emperor. All of his carriers share the same title. In Great Red, he is the true Red Dragon God Emperor. He's ranked higher than Drake, and Drake is a celestial dragon. And Great Red is a dragon god, or the true dragon, Issei says. I see. Well then, focus on it. It could help you with your training, Arondite said. All right. As he sat down on the ground, he began to focus on the strong beings that he knew. Come on, Drake, come on, Issei says. Now we're inside of Issei's mindscape. Issei found himself in a black void. He couldn't see anything. He remembered when he met Elsha and Belzar. It was a white space. This was the complete opposite of that. He then began to feel this heat turn up when he remembered this similar to his first meeting with Drake. Drake, Drake, is that you, Issei says. The scenery began to change around. He saw the cause of heat as some vicious looks that glowed orange began to light up around. Lava, Issei says. Looking up, he saw a red scroll. If lava's then, there's a BOOM! Volcano? As he heard it go off in the distance, he was surrounded by Molten Ridlock River. This is definitely different from when I met Drake the first time. He had fire all around. I thought I was going to be burned, Issei says. Then he realized something. He was feeling affected from the heat. I can't feel the heat. Guess it's because it's in my mind. Otherwise, I'd be sweating buckets. As he rubbed his face, I definitely need to shave the stubble. Now I need to grow a beard, but it's from what I get for living a nomad. I never even learned to shave thanks to that bastard that calls himself my father. But he was never a father of mine, he says. says. He soon began to travel, walking amongst the volcanic rock that was around, trying to get to the vantage point. No sign of him. Where could he be, he says. says. 
He continued to journey on the volcanic land. Drake! Drake! As his hands cupped his mouth, as he dropped them and let out a sigh. Come on, where are you, partner? <sighs> Hearing the roar, Issei looked towards the volcano. It sounded familiar to him, but at the same time, it didn't. Now that I think about it, this place looks familiar or something similar. I remember seeing it in my dream. When I was a kid, I got scared that a lava was going to kill me. Better to see what I can find at the volcano, Issei says. He began trekking through the land, still not feeling the heat, but he was sweating to the sweating from walking. He really wished he could utilize his dragon wings and just fly, but this downfall of being a human... He took off his shirt and hung it around his neck, keeping his eyes on the volcano. It felt like minutes had gone by, but it was in his mind, so time should be endless here. He noticed that something was particularly odd about the volcano. It wasn't moving. Issa was confused by this. He could have sworn that he had been walking for some time. Feeling frustrated, he began to run towards the volcano, but the volcano still wasn't getting any closer. He stopped and placed his hands on his knees to take some deep breaths. He wondered why he wasn't getting any closer to the volcano. He was getting more frustrated by this. It was just like when he was trying to unlock his magic core. My magic core, huh? That's it! Okay, okay. Issei just calm down, nothing to get mad about. Remember what you're fighting for, Issei says. He stood up and took a deep breath and looked at the path ahead of himself and then closed his eyes. Alright, I can do this. I'm fighting to see my friend. Okay, just one step at a time. Okay, Drake, I'm coming for you, Issei says. Keeping his eyes closed, Issei walked along the way. He knew the path ahead did not have any lava trails, so he wouldn't have to worry about falling in one. Step by step, Issei walked along. It didn't matter how much time it would take. He didn't want to get frustrated about not reaching the volcano. He then remembered the images from his previous test. He remembered how ruthless he was, killing all of those that betrayed him. He frowned at those images, sure. He expected bad things to happen to them, but he didn't wish death upon anybody. He knew that he wasn't a killer. He only became like that when he had to be. He then remembered all of those that he has been missing. Dreg, Seraphala, Juka, Serzex, Grafia, Milikis, the Grammaries, Kuno, Michael, Great Red, and his little sister, Lilith. It made him smile, seeing their faces. He felt happy as his legs were on autopilot, just walking along. He then remembered the former carriers. He he wished Elsda and Biel Bezal Belzard were still here. He wondered how they would have handled the situation. At the time, he wondered if they would consider going into the Juggernaut Drive if those that be loved betrayed them. As he pondered about them, he decided to think how could they have taught him things. He could see them himself training in combat with Belzard, their swords clashing, learning more than he ever could. He could not even teach them how he bested three of Albion's carriers. Just thought of learning from the strongest male Red Dragon Emperor made Issei wonder what else he could do. He then thought of the strongest female Dragon Emperor, Elshta. She did not seem like a hand-to-hand -hand combatant, but she looks can be deceiving. He did not think that Drake could have such a beautiful bearer. She was the one that informed him of his potential. He remembered that the potential she talked about him was Rhea's breast, but now he felt that only stunned him. It made him wonder what his true potential really is, now that he didn't have those perverted tendencies. He wondered if she could have taught him magic if he met her earlier. It would have been useful against the opponents like Riser, Kokovil, or maybe even Loki. If he hadn't been so perverted, it made him wonder what really could have done early in his supernatural career. Maybe in another life, Issei says his eyes were still closed. He just kept walking until he felt his feet began to walk on an incline and made him wonder about what was happening. He opened his eyes and looked up in shock. He did it. He reached the volcano. He was in shock as it just needed to calm down. Now he was ecstatic. He did it. But he then wondered if it would be the same thing. If he tried climbing, then he would need to stay calm. Otherwise, it would be an endless climb. Just before he could begin his trek up, something or someone stopped him. No need to do that, the question, the person in question said. Issei turned around and there was a man with black hair, amber gold eyes, which surprised Issei a little because his eyes were even amber brown. The man was dressed like a feudal lord, dressed in red robes with gold trim and black scents. Despite the robes, the man seemed comfortable in the heat, even though the robes looked heavy. Who are you? Issei says. I've been watching you for some time, Issei Hiyoto, the person in question says. Just Issei, I have disconnected myself from that name and everything, including blood. Issei says, forgive me, I did not realize, but you don't remember what the blade told you about beings inside of you.
the person in question says, I thought he was talking about my partner, Drake. But you're right, Arondite did say beings as plural, so I guess you're the other one, or maybe Jiko, haven't heard of him. He is no longer with us. He sacrificed himself to save you from becoming a shell of yourself and your partner Drake from sacrificing himself to you. Oh, I see. Bowing his head and then he remembered something that Drake said before he went to sleep. Wait, Drake said that something else merged with him in a sense. Was that you? You would be correct. I must say you are quite proficient with the element of fire, this person said. That is probably due to my dragon blood, even though my body is human right now. I can help you with that, you see. As he conjured up a fire out of nowhere without calling upon it, this technique is called fire bending. It is a pyrokinetic to control produce fire. The technique is derived from the dragons themselves. Whoa, really? So if I can get in tune with this, I can get more in tune with my dragon side. That's amazing, Issei says. Yes, you see, fire is the element of power. It consists of overpowering force that tempered unflinching will accomplish tasks and desires to sound familiar. Hmm, uh, I'm not sure, Issei said. It's you or your character as a person is about. Think of the battles you were a part of, your former mistress, although it seems it's bittersweet, but you did not give up on finding a way to rescue her, using unconventional means to save her arra upon arranged marriage. The same with your battle against the catcher of Cocaville. He was stronger than you, you were scared, but you still wanted to protect those t around you. Oh, uh, thanks, Issei said. It's why you have the potential to learn this technique. If you could learn well enough, you can learn about lightning generation. That's amazing. Where can I begin? And by the way, I never got your name, Issei says. I think you need to learn about your family history before learning about my name. But for now, you may call me Ozai. <laughs> As if I needed to know about the Hyoto name, surprising how I blamed for being a pervert. When they are the same, my grandfather was the one that told me to get a harem when I was ignored by my so-called parents, Issei said. Calm down, you're getting ahead of yourself. I was not referring to the Hyoto name, Ozai says. Then who are you referring to? You mean my so-called mother's name. It's probably more perversion on the end. When those girls came into my life, she prepared them perverted outfits like naked aprons, so that's not much for me to learn there, Issei said. When's the last time you talked with your grandmother, Ozai says. My grandmother? It's been a while since I've seen her. Don't know how I can get to her, though I heard the transport circles, but I can only transport within the Oasis. The Oasis? Ozai says. Yeah, it's what I am calling this training area, that I live in where Drake's cave resides, Issei says. Well, you were able to transport those pieces of yours to your underworld, so I'm sure you will find a way to your grandmother, Ozai says. I guess, Issei replied. Until then, I will be waiting, Issei, as he forced Issei out of his mind. Hey, wait, but it was too late, as Issei was transported back to the Oasis. Now we're back outside of Issei's mind. Watching Issei was a rondite, but around the blade was a silhouette of a knight. Acting as a guardian over the young man as he was in deep in his thoughts, the knight's face held a little sorrow for the young man because of what he went through and what could be seen. He knew that Issei would not use the blade for revenge, and hoped that Issei was understanding about the past that he endured, as he used the blade as a medium to speak with Issei, but never revealed himself. Seeing Issei begin to seize her, the night silhouette disappeared, leaving only the blade. Issei opened his eyes to see he was back in the oasis, and Arondite was in front of him. Did you find your partner? Arondite said, no, but you were right about there being beings inside of me, Issei said. Oh, I see. And what do you plan to do? Arondite said, well, as he stood up and pulled a rondite out of the ground and strapped on his back. First, I need to go see my Obachan, Issei said. Obachan, a rondite said. Sorry, you're not familiar with Japanese, but it means my grandmother, Issei says. I see. And why, a rondite says. I need to learn more about my family's history. There are things that I don't know about my grandmother that could hold the answers. At least, that's what he told me, Issei said. Who, a rondite said. The other being inside of me didn't tell me his name or his real name, I should say told me to call him Ozai, and that I needed to know about my family's past, but it seems it must be from my grandmother's side, Issei said. I see. Then I guess we better get to your grandmother's place. But what if your birth parents are there, Rondite said. Issei stopped walking and started ahead. He hadn't thought about it and remembered what they say about him crawling back to them. They didn't know he heard them because he had disappeared into the crowd, but he had his dragons hearing back then. 
Well, we'll just have to see when we get there, but if that's so, that won't stop me from getting the answers that I'm looking for, Itse said. Not afraid to confront your problems, that's good, Arondite said. When you spend weeks alone trying to better yourself, you tend to change up on things you did before, Itse said. It's also a sign of one's development, and you were trending in that right direction, Arondite said. Thanks. Now, time to find the book that Odin gave me as he walked back to Drake's cave to find the book that allowed him to spend the pieces to the underworld. Send the pieces to the underworld. He figured that it may help him to his grandmother's house, and since he had locked his magic core and gotten it more stabilized, he felt comfortable with transporting. He had gotten attached to a rondite and didn't want to leave the sword behind. He figured that his grandmother would ask about it, but he felt comfortable with talking about the supernatural world to her. Hopefully she would understand, but he knows that his grandmother would be accepting of his decisions. After all, when Irina left and the Hyoto ignored him, it was his, it was his grandparents that were there for him. Were that could they be, so he hoped that he could explain his side of the story. If the Hyoto had spoken to her first, he let his thoughts wander as he entered the cave, began his search. And that is the end of chapter 20. Chapter 21, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're in the student council room. Soon in her parage, with the exception of Loop, who was in college, were discussing things with Siki Vera. A hologram of Keo Keo and Seraphal was also there, listening in. So is everything set, Sona says. Yes, Leonardo had created monsters. Although it is not as bad as the demonic beast riot, he is controlling them sparingly, letting them run amok in the abandoned village quite far from here. It's off the coast of Japan, Sikivara says. How well is Leonardo handling the strain, Keo Keo, Sona says. He's doing fine. He creates a few monsters, they do some destruction, and he dispels them to save his energy, make it look like the renegade demons were. We also slain a few, so it looks like there was a fight and left bodies there, Keo Keo said. Hmm, I can speak with Ajuka to send you some corpses of the Chaos Brigade soldiers, so they think that some of the people died were already removing their wings too, Seraphal said. We would also need some alive people so they can portray survivors, Keo Keo said. I can send them to some of the people that work on my show. I don't think Rias has ever seen them. I'll even make sure that they are loyal and faithful, in case her idea of fun attempts to sleep with them, too. If they do, you can kill them, Keo Keo, because they are good as dead and will be exiled anyway, Zarafal said. Gladly. Please do let me know when her raiding game is. I'd like to see her crumble and volley as well if he shows up, Keo Keo says. Sarah Oric is being courageous. With school coming to an end soon, he will let them handle that and then mouth after their graduation should give it ample time to train, Sarah Fall says. From what I've seen, only Kiba, Gasper, Ross Vice have been training, and I do not think I can substitute in time for Ross Vice to go on this mission, Sona says. I can substitute, Sarah Fall replied. No, Onisama, you will only want to see the girl that likes Issei, and you would try to get into her head, Sona says. Fine, besides, it's good that Ross Vice stays anyway. Based on the recording, Issei did not name any of them specifically, and she's a teacher, so she wouldn't get any backlash from it. It is well known that Rhea as president and Akano as vice president. The others will just fall into place, Sarah Fall says. You have a point, Sona replied. It seems everything is going as planned. Thank you for your assistance, Keo Keo, Siki Vera says. Ha! I'm just looking forward to seeing how strong he is. When he gets back, he owes me another rematch. Take care, Keo Keo says. Keo Keo, be sure that Kiba and Gaspard are paired together, getting a nod from the man, Sona says. I'll be sure to send those bodies within the hour. It got her a nod from the hero as the hologram disappeared. Now that he's gone, time for some girl talk. Seek Chan, why are you helping in this? Seraphal says. The nickname did did cause Sikiveri to get a tick on her forehead in annoyance of her childhood nickname. Before it was something that she was fond of because Rias had named her that. Now, after what she did, she was thoroughly annoyed and even disgusted by it. You may be a Mal, but I accordingly ask you to never call me that again, Mal Leviathan. Her tone was cold, even colder than Sona's has ever been. Seraphon narrowed her eyes. At first, she felt insulted by Sikaveri taking that tone with her. However, she believed that she had no, she had a reason for it, so she nodded at the request. I will tell you this: I am not fond of what Rias has done, and I consider Issei to be a friend, in a sense. And before you ask, he and I have a common interest. That is all that I will tell you. I'll leave you to handle the rest. Sona son, Sikaveri says. Sona nodded to the Egrius Harris, left the student council office to transport back to her territory in the underworld. Hmm, so, Tan. 
Do you know why she doesn't like that nickname, Seraphal says. I believe Rias used to call her that quite affectionately, too. And from what she said, she doesn't want to be reminded of Rias, Sona says. I see. I'll go get those bodies to Keo Keo and I'll have Serzex be prepared. Rias would likely listen to him. So if you call him, he'll be sure to answer and make sure that Rias handles her duties, Seraphal said. Understood, Sona replied. Take care of yourself, Sona, Seraphal said, which caused a little shock in her sister at being called her name, and not some nickname like Sotan or So-So. Then she looked over at Tsubaki and smirked before her hologram disappeared. The smirk left Tsubaki confused, and she did not know what mischievous thoughts the map was thinking. With that handled, Momo, Rhea, get those three girls and the rest of you were dismissed. As the parage began to file out of the office while two of her bishops went to do their task. With them gone, she reached over and picked up a blue pawn piece. It was vibrant. This pawn piece belonged to her new former pawn, Genjiro Sanji, who was now the ex-wielder of Vidra. After the extraction, Ajuka and Sour Hill worked to implant an artificial sacred gear, which was similar to the absorption line sacred gear that he originally had, but it was not nearly as effective. Then Ajuka performed the trade of taking out Sona's four pawn pieces and inserting only two of Rias's pawn pieces. I had high hopes for you, Genjiro, but you failed me and every action has consequences. Consequences. The good thing is that you got stronger and gave me these mutated pieces. I'll use them to my advantage. Unfortunately for Rias, Ajuka was able to convert the mutated pawn pieces that Issei once held back down to regular pawn pieces, Sona said. She placed the pawn piece back down and leaned back into her chair, letting out a sigh. If only you weren't so spoiled, Rias. Sona says. Suddenly, a magic circle appeared to her surprise. The imagined Gremory signal when she was confused. Who the Gremory clan would be coming to the school? Maybe Sir Zex? It wasn't. Out of the magic circle came Zectodius Gremory. Lord Gremory, what are you doing here? Sona says. As she stood up to greet him. Ah, Sona, working as always. Well, I came because a little birdie told me about what you did to keep the recording from being late too early, Zectodius said. Sona's eyes widened. She remembered what she told the Kendo duo and Akia to keep them from releasing in that recording she was going to talk about with them. Also, I'm the administrator of the school, or did you forget that, Zectodius said. At that, Sona wanted to facepalm. She did not forget that with all the planning that she had to go to keep Rias and the others with false sense of security, she did not think that Zectodius would come around. And another thing, have you heard from my son? His mother is worried sick, since he has not contacted either one of us. When he left, and although it's been a few weeks or closer to a month, you know how mothers can be with their children. <laughs> Zectodius said, laughing it off. Son, isn't Sir Zek Sama in the Underworld still? We had just a factions meeting of Fak Weekend, Sona said. Oh, not him. I mean our other one. Issei, Zectodius said. You guys adopted Issei, Sona replied. Well, not illegally. But he told us that he saw us as parents before he left, so he doesn't want to hold any ill will towards us, something I am very grateful for. And I don't know about my daughter could do such a thing, but I blame myself for spoiling her like my mother spoiled me, having a sad face on his smile on his face. I'm sorry, Lord Gremory. I don't know what Rias was thinking either, but I did send her the three original copy of the recording. They should be here shortly. Issei has not contacted me yet, Sona said. Excellent. As he walked and sat in Sona's chair, as he stood up in front of her desk. After all, you did say that I would compensate them if they kept quiet, Zectodius said. Ah, I did say that, but it was just to keep them quiet. And you don't need to, Sona says. No, no. They deserve to be rewarded for their silence. Besides, they are about to teach my daughter a lesson so that she rightfully needs, or did you forget that once this needs to go out, her reputation would likely be ruined, Zectodius said. I did not forget, Lord Gremory, Sona replied. Every action has its own consequences. My action of spoiling her led to this. If I didn't, she probably wouldn't have been a little more competent. Also, let's try to keep the chemistry teacher away from the civics teacher, Zectodius said. You're referring to Azazel and Ross Visa, correct? From what I hear, Shemazin has a crow busy in the regard, so he won't be near and already informed him that he doesn't need to be back for the remainder of the school year, Sona says. Good, good. That makes things a little easier. When he's finished speaking, a knock was heard. Ah, our guests have arrived. Sona, if you will, Sectodius said. Sona gave a nod and ordered to whoever had entered the office and her push-ups along with Katase, Moriyama, and Akia. Momo and Rhea's eyes widened a bit upon 
once seeing Zygtodius there, but remained neutral. Kadase, Moriyama, and Akia were bewildered by the crimson-haired man that sat on the desk. Momo and Rhea want to stand by Sona's side, while the other three approach the desk. Um, hello, Kalcho? Who is this? Kadase said. He looks kind of familiar, Moriyama replied. Almost like Rhea's senpai, Akia said. So, you know of my daughter, I see, Zygtodius said. The three girls' eyes widened. This was Rhea's father. It was their first time ever meeting them. They didn't meet him on parents day because they were in their own parents at the time however remembering rias they became a little more blank in the face i suppose that it has something to do with the recording correct he just says looking at the sona kadase says that would be correct to properly introduce him this is zictodius gremory administrator of co academy so says now the girls were a little worried because if he was the administrator then maybe rias wouldn't get in trouble but then again sona would vouch for them right i'm guessing that you want to confiscate it so we don't release it so your daughter's image isn't tarnished moriyama says on the contrary actually no she's already done that herself i'd like to thank you for what you're doing and what you did to have no problems with you releasing it. You see, Rias' mother and I love Issei like a son. We even ask him to call us his parents. We saw him as part of our family, Zictodius said. Glad to know somebody did, Akia replied. Yes, I am very much aware of his birth parents were involved in this matter. And we are looking to remove the Hyoto name legally from him. The only good thing that I can say they did was name him Issei, Zictodius said. Why is that? Kadase replied. It's because it means honest, Kadase, and it means sense. Issei has always been honest about things, even his own perversion, Akia said. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was honest about marrying my daughter as well. I thought she was too, as we have a family tradition that determines if someone is worthy of marrying into the family. My daughter kind of forced Issei's hand to agree to it, and I thought it was because she loved them as well. Well, they passed the test, so technically they were not just boyfriend and girlfriend, Zictodius said. So they were engaged. Wow, Kadase replied, remembering that Issei did say they committed to marriage, but she did not take it seriously at the time. Yes, but not anymore. He did not to mention that Issei was engaged to Seraphall and had seen sadness in Moriyama's eyes, and for that I want to thank you for helping bring her infidelity to the light from that recording. We had to track Issei down to confirm it was true, Zectodius said. Have you seen him recently, Moriyama replied. He hasn't been around for at least a month. I'm sorry, but no, I haven't. But anyways, I was informed that you had received compensation for your silence on the matter. So tell me, what is it you would like, Zectodius said. The three girls looked at each other. They forgot they had been rewarded. They were handling Sona's bidding to keep things normal for the girls until further notice. They looked at Sona as if thinking it was a joke, but they saw her nod to them, telling them that it's alright. Um, is it possible to get a better locker room? You know, the one that doesn't allow perverts to peep on us. Although there are some of the girls that don't actually mind it and actually flaunt their figures for them and become hypocrites and beat for the perverts for it, this caused Moriyama to blush so I am hoping the luxuries of better locker room would distract them from doing that. I can make that arrangement. Anything else, Zygtodia said? I'm not sure yet, since Kadase already asked for something for the kendo club, Moriyama replied. And for you? As he looked towards Akia, Zikto, I don't have anything for the moment, so can my request be put on hold she wanted answers of how it was possible for easy to be in a polygamous relationship wait i have something moriyama said and that is could the journal club get some better equipment you know help spread the news around here or something Mariyama said, Mariyama, Akia replied, Akia, don't worry about it. It may not be my club, but you're my friend. You may be perverted in your own right, but you are still my friend. Besides, Kadase already did something for the Kendo Club. And if not, be a bother. We also get the skirts lengthened a bit. More, I'd rather not to worry about bending over and flashing people behind me, Mariyama said. You could have gotten better equipment, Moriyama. It would help us compete against the other schools, Kadase says. We'll just have to train harder. Besides, it was Akia's idea to get to the bottom of this and get the confession out of Issei. Now that we know that people we once idolized are frauds, all they care about is themselves and not others, sure. Issei may have been a pervert, but to play on one's feeling is just sick, Moriyama says. That's true. When I go back to listen to the recording, I think about my crush on Kiba and fear that he may have been involved. Guess he's not a knight in shining armor, Kadase said. Sona and Zictodius frowned as they knew something was up with Kiba and Gasper, but they couldn't give them special treatment. Otherwise, the girls would catch on. Yeah, Issei said his best friend slept with the Earth's girls. Could that be Kiba? I never really heard Issei declare Kiba as his best friend and he didn't exactly give us any names. We know Rias and Akino are part of the club, their president and vice president. I know Ozzy is part of it as well. I don't talk to Zenobia nor Irina much. 
Irina has her own club, that salvation of love thing. I think the only just hangs around with the ORC girls. Again, she completely forgot that Irina had her own club. With that, these girls would suspect her to be part of the ORC. Now, it looks like she only hung around them to be near Issei. She could not believe how lucky the reincarnated angel was, but then she remembered what Michael said. He firmly believes that Irina will confess her sin. She can only hope that he was right. Well, we can't ask Irina because she didn't have to come in today. I didn't see her with Azia nor Zenovia, Akia said. Well, I know if my childhood friend was getting cheated on, I wouldn't be one to near those that hurt them. She did not know that she was half right on that statement, Kadase said. Well, I hate to intrude on your conversation, but if those are your requests, I will make sure both the Kendo Club and the Journal Club are compensated, and I will look into getting into the sh skirts a bit longer. Though that may change, that not come immediately, but likely the next school year, and thank you for bringing it to my attention. Now, I don't want to cause any conflict with your studies, so you may go. Thank you for your time, waving off the three girls, Zictodius did. We shall escort them, Sona says, as she, Rhea, and Momo followed the three girls outside to the office. Once they were out, Sona got close to Akia and whispered in her ear. You have that look in your eyes, Sona said. You want answers about some things? I will tell you now. The girls will be excused for the rest of the week after today and at any point before the school year ends. You can come to the office for the answers you seek. You can bring the two others with you if you want. Since the kendo duo were distracted by talking with Momo and Rayo, they did not hear the conversation behind them. Momo and Rayo were able to hear because of their devil hearing. They knew what their mistress was going to do. She was going to recruit either Akia or all of these three into their barrage. They reached the classroom that the girls were in. Sona gave a nod. Roz Vice said she was a homeroom teacher. The nod was to let her know that she is the reason for the girls being absent. Sona could tell that Ozzy and Zenovia were looking at her quizzically, and Akia was right. Irina did not seem to be around, with nothing else to do. She dismissed Rhea and Momo back to their classes. When she came back to the student council office, she saw Zictodian had left. So he tightened up her desk and looked back at the pawn pieces, letting out a sigh. She gathered her things and went down to her class classroom, preparing herself to tell Rias to gather her club members for a lunch break and meet in her office and send them away, while the recording gets released. Now, we're back with Issei. He was in Drake's cave. He had found the book that he was looking for, but he realized that he could not transport himself. Arondite, any idea why I can't go from here? Issei said, hmm. You didn't say that you transported something earlier, Arondite said. Yeah, my former pawn pieces, Issei replied. Well, I do know a barrier that was set up to prevent unwanted visitors from entering this cave, Arondite said. So, I need to leave cave completely. If I can transport imminent inanimate objects or things that are not living while well, in here, can someone transport something to me, Issei says? If I remember, when the barrier was constructed, you could send things out, but nothing can be sent back to you, Arondite says. I'm guessing you would know, since you've been around since Belzard's time, Issei said. Belzard, Arondite said. I'm sorry, I meant Galahad. Forgot you're still not used to that name yet, Issei says. Ah, yes. The son of my former carrier. He worked with a powerful mage to move things from Camelot to here into France, Arondite said. Any idea on who the mage was? As he was beginning to leave the oasis and entering the treasure room. It was a woman, a beautiful one at that, Arondite said. So he had a relationship with her, Issei replied. No, he was willing to help the knights of the round table, but displayed no romantic interest and neither did he, Arondite said. After a few minutes of silence, he exited the cave altogether. It felt like a sudden shift because of the time difference between the oasis and the real world. In the oasis, it was a nightmare. And right now, it seemed to be an early morning in the real world, or at least in France. Issei, I feel there is a piece of me out here, Arondite said, out there. Really? Issei replied. Yes, but to warn you, the major that I told you about, she placed like a seal around the cave to keep my power contained. Now that I have left, possible enemies may be after us. You learned some sealing magic, correct? Arondite says. Yeah, I did. Figured it would be useful to store some things, Issei said. Then seal me inside of you. It's a good thing you left those dragon daggers in your cave. Your aura is that of a human's, mostly, Arondite said. What do you mean, mostly? Issei replied. Well, since you meditated that one time to unlock your sacred gear, your aura changed very 
slightly. Very small portion of you changed from human to dragon, Arondite said. So, meeting Ozai did help with something, Issa replied. But with me being inside of you, I will act similar to a sacred gear. You can summon me, but I can speak with you. While sealed, just be wary, as when you do unseal, unwanted attention may come our way, Arondite said. I understand. As he focused on the ceiling, a magic circle appeared in a back and Arondite sunk it to his body. When completed, he took deep breaths. It didn't take as much time as strain before. Well done. Your human aura should be able to conceive my powers, as humans have a balance of light and dark, Arondite said. Thanks, let's move further away from the cave so I don't get traced back. If someone were to pick up on my magic, Issei says, he headed into the forest. He hadn't been in the real world since he had come out to hunt for that deer. He was very crude in how he killed the animal, definitely not a clean kill. He listened to tales of Lancelot from Arondite as he walked. After around 45 minutes, he stopped, but not because he felt that he walked enough. Arondite. Someone was here, Issei said, as he saw footprints they were similar compared to his. We should be mindful. You are a couple miles away from the cave, Arondite said. Yeah, looks like they were not heading towards the cave, but we should stop here. Don't want to run into them. We don't know their objective, Issei says. Indeed. Let's head over there to your right, Arondite said. Good. Idea. The footprints looked like they were heading to my left. Might be where they were located. Walking towards the right, as Arondite indicated. When he reached a clearing, it felt a calm scenery. Despite the fact that there was someone out there, he felt at peace. It was a clearing. It was quiet, other than his breathing. You remember the spell, right? Arondite says. Yeah, yeah. Just remember that it's been a while since I have been clearing like this, Issei said. Really? Arondite replied. Yeah, since I am heading to see my grandma, my grandpa, he used to take me out of a place like near this place, Issei said. I see. Focus on the spell and where you plan on going, Arondite replied. I know, I know. Okay. Closing his eyes as a magic circle appeared under him. Focus, focus, Issei says. A flash went by and Issei opened his eyes and looked around. Did it work, Issei said? He looked around. There was the same silence around. I'm not sure, Rondite replied. Issei walked over, though he thought he came from and noticed that the footprints were not there. Where am I, Issei said. He whispered to himself. The footprints are not there, but this place... It feels familiar, Issei said. Do you know this place, Rondite replied, hearing Issei's thoughts. I'm not sure. Those footprints I saw earlier, they're not there. Were they ever? They really here. Oh man, I have been in the cave for too long, as he sat down to think. He felt like he failed the spell, now believed that he was hallucinating the footprints that he knew that he saw earlier. Get a hold of yourself. You shouldn't feel down about this. Look around. You get a feel of your surroundings, Arondite said. Okay, I can do that, man. The sun's a lot brighter than before. His eyes widen. Wait a minute. The sun's brighter, Issei said. Hmm. It was just early morning when we had left. The sun could not be this bright in such a short amount of time. So clearly transported yourself. Probably somewhere where it headed in their time zone, Arondite said. Like Japan. Wait a second. It's not as green either, and the trees look older. Hold on. As he started to walk towards a tree, Issei did. His heart was pounding. As he saw a slightly different shade of brown on the tree, it looked like a crude mark from years ago. He could faintly see what the mark was, and his breath hitched in his throat. A tear rolled down his eyes as he gripped the trunk hard. Aronde, I know where we are. I never thought I would be in this place. Only three people have been here, Issei says. Really? Aronde replied. Yeah. It's a clearing that of my grandfather took me to when I was young, Issei said. As he stepped back, the trunk looked at the tree that was marked in their initials, I-H, J-H, and S-I. He knew who the initials stood for. The I-H meant him, Issei, and the J-H stood for his grandfather, Juzo, and the S-I was Shido, or rather, Irina Shido. He remembered when they were young. His grandfather showed him an earring of this clearing. It was a secret place to get away from his grandmother, whenever she was in one of her moods, as he called it. Sometimes they went camping out here. Those were fun times, but then things changed. Irina moved. Then his grandfather died. He could not see his grandmother as much, one of the few people that cared for him as he became alone again, since the Hyoto tended to leave him on his own devices most of the time. 
I have fond memories of this place, Issei said. At least you know where we are. What led you to transporting us here, Rondite said, since we were going to see my grandmother. I thought of my grandfather as well as I remembered this place, Issei said. I see. Shall we continue on our journey then, Rondite said. Yeah. Issei replied, looking back at the initials, he smiled upon seeing his grandfather's initial before he turned away and teched towards his grandmother's house. Along the way, Aronde was curious about the initials in the tree, which Issei explained that were his, his grandfather's, and Irina's. Of course, Aronde did ask if they were the same girl that wa talked about during their training, and Issei said yes. It surprised Aronde on why Issei did not destroy her initials, and Issei informed the seal that the sword that her initials were carved there by his grandfather, so they are his grandfather's work. He would not want to desecrate his grandfather's work out of respect for someone who cared about him. Aronde kept quiet after that, until he decided to ask you what his grandmother was like. Well, she is strict but caring. She expected me to be perverted because it kind of runs in the family, which shows how hypocritical the Hyoto are, he say says. Ah, they could not see how their own attitudes would afflict in you. And you are the, excuse me, the byproduct of them, Arondite says. The only unfortunate thing is that I don't share the same blood as my grandmother and grandfather, so I am no longer a Hyoto by name nor blood, Issei said. He, excited out of, he exited out of the forest to see a wonderful log cabin, the house where his grandmother now lived. It was a small cottage, but Valena expanded upon it. Just a little, his grandmother did not want as much space like it was a mansion was. There it is, Issei said, smiling and seeing his grandmother's place. May I borrow your sight? Connecting to Issei's senses, not a bad place. You can keep up with your training as well, Rondite said. I'd rather train in the Oasis. I have more time. The time spent out here is like five times more than the Oasis, Issei said. I suppose, but the change of scenery may help you, and you get to learn more about your family, Rondite said. That's true. Well, I hope she prepared for what I'm about to tell her, Issei replied. <laughs> With what you've been through, I don't think anyone would be prepared, Arondite said. I supposed, well, time to see Bachan, as he began walking into the cabin. Pentadragon Mirror, when Issei left the cave. Merlin sat reading a book until she felt the presence that she was connected to. Arondite had left where it was stored, and she could feel it. Arthur and the others saw her tense up a bit. Is something the matter, Lady Merlin? Arthur replied. Yes, I felt a rondite. It was left where I kept it and has been brought to the outside world, at least for a minute, Merlin said. Guess Issei made his move, Bioka replied. Not necessarily. We cannot know that for sure, Arthur said. You are right, but Arthur, these sacred gears, I'd like to learn more about them. Is it possible to contact someone that could assist me, Merlin says. Hmm, I could try and contact one of the Mao and see if they can contact Michael as it was his father, the biblical god that created them. As he created a communication circle, Arkel said, Arthur did. He failed in contacting Sarah Fonser when he reached Falbum, all he heard were snores. Luckily, Ajuka was available. Hello? Who is speaking? Ajuka said. Greetings, Ajuka Sama. I was wondering if you can get in contact with Michael Sama for me. Lady Merlin was curious about the sacred gears. Normally, I would direct you to Azazel, but due to circumstances, that's not the case. Give me a minute and I will see what I can do, Ajuka says. Thank you, Ajuka-sama. As the communication circle dissipated, it will be a minute, Lady Merlin, Arthur said. No worries, Merlin said, as she stood up from her seat and walked to the window of the castle that showed the landscape. It was amazing what someone can go through, wouldn't you agree, Merlin says. What do you mean, Lady Merlin, Elaine replied. Issei Hyoto, or just Issei. He has gone through so many things and just feeling Arondite's power, he must be special. I wonder how... How powerful he will become, Merlin said. Who knows, Bioka replied. As he continued to relax on the couch, dues made from the baddest dragon to ever roam, Bioka replied. Yes, this is Great Red. He's the most powerful existence at this moment. She could not gauge Great Red since he had never met the dragon, but if she could get close to Issei, she would have a better understanding. Correct. Issei should be considered a candidate for a dragon god. If he is able to control the power of Great Red within him and fully master the Red Dragon Emperor's power as well, Arthur said. I see, as she pondered. You become more and more interesting to me, Issei. I look forward to meeting with you in person, Merlin said. Ah, hello, Ajuka-sama, Arthur replied as the communication circle appeared once again. Hello, Arthur. You can bring Miss Merlin here. A representative from heaven is on their way to escort her to heaven, Ajuka said. Thank you. As he disconnected the call, Lady Merlin shall we go? As he gathered Calvary and prepared a magic circle to Ajuka's place. 
Yes. As she walked towards him, you coming, little monkey, Merlin said. It was a nickname she enjoyed to annoy Byoko since he liked to call her old lady. Watch it and no. Probably going to see some Wuncones in Kyoto or something before mumbling under his breath. Damn old lady, Byoko said. Merlin simply smirked, knowing she got under his skin as she and Arthur teleported away. However, once they did, another magic circle appeared out and came and neither Byoko or Elaine were expecting. You forgot something, Byoko said, thinking it was Merlin and Arthur until he felt the familiar presence of his former female teammates. Oh, it's you. Hello, Bioko, Elaine. Have you seen Volley Kanaroni san? Lefay said, smiling at seeing the people that she hadn't seen in a while. You're awfully grumpy, Kuroka said, smiling at Bioko's displeasure. He was keeping his emotions in check, since Kuroka did not have the seal on her. She could detect something if something was off with him, so he remained neutral. Luckily, Elaine was able to do so as well. Having been around all the members of the volley team, she knew that Kuroka was capable of. Yeah, aren't we all? Be answering Kuroka, deciding to play it safe and give them a fake false sense of security. You just missed Arthur, and I haven't seen Volley either. Anyway, I'm heading out. As he got off the couch later, Bioko said, he made a transport circle that would take him to Sung Wukong. Personally, he wanted to laze around until Arthur came back, but Kuroka and Lefei appearing ruined the moment. He didn't know that Kuroka was stupid enough to forget that he could also detect the mixed essences inside of her. He did not want to be around them. Unfortunately, he left Elaine to deal with them. He also figured that he could warrant Arthur, so he wouldn't be surprised when he returned. Huh? I thought Oni-san would be here. You know where he went, Elaine? Lefay said. Since Elaine was her brother's girlfriend, she may know something. He went to see the Mao Beelzebub about the matters that I do not know of. Remaining the neutral as possible, she did not want Kuroka to detect her fault in her words. I shall go inform your father of your arrival, Elaine said. Okay. As she watched the maid leave, guess it's just you and me, huh, Kuroka? Lefay said. Yeah, Naya, but as she watched Elaine leave, she felt some doubt, but she wasn't fully sure as it wasn't enough for Kuroka to bother herself with. I guess we can go to my room and freshen up, Lefay said i suppose although i don't think your clothes would fit me as have these naya kuroka said gesturing to her bigger chest you wear some of the same kimono anyway so it doesn't matter she deadpan she walked to her room lefei did hey i following her teammates kuroka did they were still in earshot of elaine who was perfectly walking slowly she needed to warn Uther not being able to blow a gasket and keep his emotions in check, otherwise everything would fall apart. She would also warn Arthur, and hopefully he does not bring Merlin either. It was not time for Lefay to meet her idol, and Merlin did not tolerate Lefay's actions against Issei. Now we're back with Issei once again. He walked into the cabin, but before he knocked, he got nervous. He did not know what he was going to say. If his grandmother was here, he did not know... He, how he would tell her of her betrayal, but he needed to. If there was one person that he thought he could tell anything to, it was his grandmother, and he felt like she needed to know. She would have been able to give him more guidance. It was something that he valued his grandmother highly on. With a deep breath and words of encouragement from Arondite, he knocked on the door. There was some shuffling that could be heard, and finally there was a response. Who is it? Bachan, it's me, Issei. Issei says. There was some shuffling around until the door opened and strict-looking woman with glasses appeared. There was Horatu Hiodo, the wife of the deceased Juzo Hiodo, the mother of Goro Hiodo, but most importantly, the grandmother of Issei. Hmm. How can I be sure that you are my grandson? His parents said he was missing, Horatu said. As if those bastards care about me, <laughs> Issei said. How the Hiyoto acted like they cared. But if you want me to prove it, you were hoping for a girl, Irina Shoto, my childhood friend. And I'd be together. You loved her like a granddaughter and took care of us both. When the Hiyoto went out with the Shido, or when the Hiyoto didn't care much, after Jisan died, so I could not visit you as much. I know I look different from when you last saw me, but I am Issei, and just Issei. Issei. You didn't need to give me an explanation, boy, she said with a smile. I was hoping you would come after they came asking for you. I know you are more responsible than they give you credit for. I knew something was up. When they came and you weren't here, if you had come, you would have told them. So it led me to believe they did something and you finally had enough, Hiroto said. Well, you would be correct, Bachan. It's good to see you at giving her a hug, Issei said. You two, come in, gesturing him to come into the cat. Maybe you can do something about that scraggly thing all over your face, Hiroto said. Issei laughed so he knew that she was referring to the stubble that had grown even more. In honesty, Issei didn't really like it because it tended to be itchy, but he didn't have the capabilities in the wild to groom himself. 
I don't have a razor to shave it off clean, Roger said, but I can trim it. Maybe you'll look more presentable, but first, go shower. My goodness, boy, you stink, Hiroto says. Yes, Bachan, entering the cabin, laughing as he had done some training beforehand and didn't exactly wash up. He had also gotten used to the stink, so he didn't really notice it, considering what his grandmother is the first person he has seen in weeks or in case months. I'll go make some tea, Hiroto said. Considering that you're here, I have a feeling that it's not good. On the bright side, you seem to have bulked up, and when you're trimmed, you look even better. I knew that when you get your looks from my side of my family, they must have skipped a generation laughing at her own joke. It's better that it's your looks than speaking of my family. I'd like to ask uh, you about yours, Issei said. Freshen up a bit, then we'll talk, Hiroto said, as she locked the door behind him. Yes, ma'am, Issei said, heading towards the bathroom since he had been before. Where things were? So, it was not an issue. And he let and let me know when you want to trim, Hirata said. She called out from the kitchen. Okay, Grandma. He could not wait to unlock the aspects of this dragon body because he wouldn't age as fast, meaning he would not grow facial hair once he got it completely shaved off. So that's your grandmother. She seems nice, Arondite said. She may seem nice, but she could be strict. She actually predicted that I would be influenced by my grandfather, and she was right. I just overdid it and forgot her teachings because I couldn't see her as much. He say says, I see. Well, I will visit when you... I see. Well, your visit will get you back on track, Arondite says. I suppose. I will probably contact the others and let them know how I'm doing, he say says. That would be nice, Arande replied. Easy proceeded to shower. It had been a long since he took one. In the oasis, he would use to separate steam bathe himself. He would make sure st streams did not cross because he used another stream to ionize the water for him to drink. He took his time, enjoying the luxury of the shower. Once clean, he walked to the room in that he used before when he had visited with the others. He felt relieved that they did not come here to desecrate it like they did his former room. In the Hyoto, when he found a change of his clothes, a cream-colored shirt and jeans. Due to his muscle mass, the shirt was slightly snug and it defined his muscles well. Heading back downstairs, he found his grandmother in his living room, so she was sipping on some tea. She was calmly watching that afternoon television news that played it on above the fireplace. Sit, boy, Hiroto says, never taking her eyes off the television but sensing his presence. Issa was slightly surprised prize, but sat next to the chair next to the wall. He noticed that the wooden office table moved closer to the chairs, and there was another cup. Rata simply poured tea into the other cup, and a mix of cubic sugar stirred and slid it over to Issei. It's Chimeline tea. Something tells me we're both going to need it, Haratu says. Issei nodded and grabbed the small plate that held up a cup. Took the cup to get a sip. It was calming. He felt a little less stressed, a benefit when drinking some Shyamalan tea. Now then, tell me what your dumbass parents did this time, Hiroto said, her eyes never leaving the television. Issei nearly choked on his tea because he never heard such language from his grandmother. Don't be surprised, boy. You wouldn't have left that house without a good reason, Hiroto said. Issei simply set the cup back on the plate and set it down on the table, then leaned back in his chair and answered. They betrayed me, Issei said. Go on, Hiratu says. Well, you know those girls that came with us when we visited. Seeing her nod, he continued. Well, they were my girlfriends, Issei said. Hmm, your grandfather would have been proud of you getting a harem, Hiratu says. Yeah, well, they betrayed me, and the Hyoto knew it. They insulted me and giggled like school kids knowing that their girls were cheating on their son, Issei says. Tuh, the stupidly of cowardliness of some parents, let me guess. They called you a useless pervert or something along those lines, Hiratu says. Yeah, makes me regret saving them, Issei said. Saving them? How? Aratu says. Bachan, do you believe in the supernatural? Issei says. Supernatural? You mean demons and angels? It intrigued me in the younger days, along with magic, as she placed her own cup of tea down. It did. Well, that makes things easier, Issei said. Sitting up straight, he held out his right arm. Arondite! Summoning the Black Blade, from with using Alara, a very blue... A very dark blue, almost black magic circle, Arata was shocked, her mouth gasped as her grandson just summoned a sword from who knows where. In her shock, Arata spoke to Issei because the blade felt something. Issei, my missing fragment. I can feel it. It is not near... It is not near here, but it should be in this country. Remember, with me unsealed, others could sense it, Arata said. 
I understand. As he sealed the black blade to himself, Issei said, Did you just summon a sword? Haratu said, coming out of her shock. I did. He was a bit worried about his grandmother's health from the shock they put on her. Thank goodness for the drinking tea all these years. And she placed her hand over her heart, feeling that it beat fast. Then she started to laugh a little. I knew there was something different about you when you visited last time, Haratu says. What do you mean? Issei said his eyebrows were raised in surprise. I don't know. I just felt something off about you last time. Some of those girls. And now you're talking about about the supernatural. What exactly are you, Issei, looking at her grandson? Well, technically, I'm a dragon, but right now I'm human. I am trying to awaken my dragon body and my partner, Drake, Issei says. Drake, Haratsu replied. He's the soul that resides in my sacred gear. The boosted gear. He's been with me since I was born, Issei said. And the others, Haratsu replied. They're demons. The exception being Irina. She's an angel, although I'm not sure if she still is, Issei says. I would say that's nice, but from the tone of your voice, it begs me to differ, Haratsu says. How so? Issei replied. Well, she's an angel. She could have been there for you. Aren't angels supposed to be good, Haratsu says? I thought the same, but it doesn't matter, clenching his fists. What are you talking about, Arato said. Because she cheated on me too, Issei replied, swinging his clenched fish into the wall. But then he realized that his fist was ablaze, thus putting a scorcher dent into the wall. Issei, Arato says as he shut up and the flames went out. Issei took over in shock as his flaming fist indented the wall as his grandmother put the flames out. And to her surprise, his fist was unscathed. I think you should start from the beginning, Arato said as she sat back down and another sip of tea calmed down her heartache, steadied. Issei simply nodded as he looked at his fist and wondered, how was the fist unharmed by the flames? He should be human, and the flames should have done something to his human skin. He knew that his fist wouldn't hurt from hitting the wall because of the amount of time that he spent punching trees to strengthen his skin, but the flame should have done something he didn't even feel them. Well, it started when I asked out on a date at the beginning of the school year. He continued on to list his adventures. His grandmother listened in. She was shocked that he died, but she was more shocked that he died twice. So you're telling me you died twice, and basically you got a new body from a dragon, Haratu said. Yeah, that would be correct, Issei replied. I would say that's a good thing, that you're not related to your stupid parents, but is not... But it does sadden me that we are no longer share the same blood. But you will always be my grandson, Haratu said. And you will always be my grandmother, smiling her. He continued going to the Vampire Civil War, the Rogue Exorcist, and the Evil Dragon War. Which led him to saving Hyoto from the disaster. And then his coma, how he ended up there. And then he got into his betrayals. It made Aratu sad to see what her grandson went through. She was pleased that he beat up those two perverts, although he was looking out for them and that Issei had that repaid them. She became disgusted with her son and his wife for how they treated Issei while growing up, but this was the last straw. I only kept the Hyoto name for the sake of your grandma father, but now I don't want to be attached to your ex-father. It's the best that I can go back to my maiden name, Haratu says. You never told me about that. Could I change my name to it as well? Issei said, of course you can. You're my grandson. My name is also your name, but it is Yamamoto, and from your attack on my wall, it reminds me of the stories that were told about my ancestors of my family. They said he used to fight with fire, Haratu says. Yamamoto, Issei said. Hold on, wait a minute, Bachan. As he activated the communication circle, he hoped another person would respond. Hello? Who is this? A female voice responded. Kasan, it's me, Issei! He didn't see his grandmother's eyebrows raise in confusion. Sochi, are you okay? How are you? Do you need more provisions? Are you eating well? Valena says. I'm fine. I'm with my grandmother, and how are the others? Issei said. That's nice. At least you're not alone. They are doing well. Milikas kind of has improved in his own training with the power of destruction. You'll have to see it when you get back. Sir Zex and Gravy are extremely proud of his accomplishments. He looks up to you. He hopes to be as strong as you. When he reaches your age, your Tosan is handling the Gremory clan affairs at the moment, but we'll let you know that you contacted us. Although, why did you take so long? And have you contacted Seraphil yet? Or did you wait to contact your mother last, Valena says? No, I haven't. You were the first person to call, Kasan. Also, the reason I could not contact you is because where I am training prevents me from contacting the outside world, like a barrier. And I am glad Milikus is doing well in his training. I'll have to contact Tosan, but later... But I was calling to ask you for a favor. What is it that you need? More provisions, Valena said? No, I was wondering if you could help me change my last name, Issei said. Of course, I expected as much. I had begun the paperwork, so don't worry. So, you will be Issei Biel in no time, or do you prefer Issei Gremory, Valena says. No, no, 
I want to be Yamamoto. It's my grandmother's maiden name, and I want to honor it. I'm sorry to disappoint you, and we won't share the same name. I just want something different without feeling like a burden to you guys, Issei says. Aw, I thought you wanted your Kasan's name. He could tell she was pouting a little. As I told you, don't worry. You were never a burden to me or any of us. You brought a spark into our lives and never forget that. And regardless of what you ever you name you choose, you will always be my Sochi, okay? So take care and continue working hard. Your Kasan will always love you, Valena says. Love you too, Kasan. As the communication circle disappeared, and tear rolled down his eyes, though Hiroto could not see it. I assume that wasn't Miki that you were talking about in this... Tosan that you were talking about is not Goro, Hirata says no. She's actually the mother of one of the girls that betrayed me, and the Tosan is actually her father, Issei says. Hmm, your life is becoming a soap opera, Hirata said. It caused both of them to laugh. I guess so. I should explain how all of this came to happen. So he continued on about how he was engaged to Rias, and how her family saw him as one of their own, and how he holds no hate against them for what their daughter did, and how they were more like parents than his birth ones. He even explained the ritual that he went through, and how he could found a new love interest, he say did. I am proud of you, he say, but tell me, you said you were hurt by that one woman, not necessarily betrayed, but what happened, Hirata said, ah, rice visa. Leaning back to his chair, I thought we were building something. I thought maybe we could have a chance, but she was with someone I thought I considered a father, since Goro was a failure. Couldn't even prepare me for this, gesturing scraggly stubble. It made his grandmother laugh. Don't worry about those hypocrites. From what you told me, despite your perverted nature, they could not see that it was genetic. I even teased you about having sleep with that blonde one. What's her name? Hirato says. Azia, Issei replied. Ah, well, doesn't matter anymore. Considering how many times you put your body on the line for her, she wasn't meant for this world. She'd be traumatized by her action and she must live with it, Hirato said. A bit cold-hearted there, Grandma, <laughs> Issei said, smiling at her grandma's word. Oh, I know that you were also thinking it. You damn well. You don't give a damn about most of them, Arato says. Most of them? Issei replied. Of course, this Ross Vaisa woman, she deserved to give you an answer about why she chose that playboy over you. Same thing with Irina. You know I care about her like a granddaughter, but she also needs an explanation about why she did what she did. And the pretty boy, as you put it. I think you will get those answers when you, you can find some peace, Arato says. You think so, Issei replied. Well, she may not have been drinking, as you said, but you st she may have been drinking, as you said, but you still deserve an answer. The other one, Pyamin, screw her. She made her choice. As for Irina, you two have years of friendship together, and that's hard to throw away for both of you, Hirato said. Huh, you're right. I guess I'll have to speak with Ross Vaisa about why she chose him, even if she wanted to be with me. I don't think I could be with her. Not now. The image is too vivid in my head. And you talk about years of friendship. Erin has spent those years with Zenovia. She chose her over me, Issei said. You're right. Though from what you've told me of the Synovia girl, she's just as perverted as you, maybe a little worse. Huh. Who brings condoms to the classroom? People will see her as an easy lay, Hirato said. Yeah, they just might. Once the school gets wind of their portrayal of what they caused on me, Issei said. Oh. How so? Hirato says, well, after I beat up my former friends, I was chilling in the park and a few girls that I knew came up to me to talk about the incident. I let them know about the whole school will know that they were unfaithful, although, looking back on it, I don't think anyone I gave any names. But I'm sure thanks to that loudmouth that I beat up, they'll figure it out, Issei said. <laughs> they ruined their social life as well. Speaking of which, how are you handling school? Hirato said, sending him a glare. Education was quite important to her. Ah, oh, sorry. I'll contact Sona. She's vouching for me. Which, in a way, she'd be lunchtime at school. I can contact her to see when she can proctor my final exam, Issei said. He greeted another communication circle, and he felt the other person connect to him. Hey, Issei said. That was all he could say before he was interrupted. Not now, Sona said. The communication circle disappeared right after. What Issei did not know is that Sona was debriefing Rias and most of her parage on their mission. The last thing she needed was for them to remember Issei, so upon hearing his voice, she acted quickly and dismissed the call before Rias and the others could hear it. She made a subtle glance to Konako to see if he picked up on anything with the Nekamata powers, but nothing came from her facial features. Huh? Guess she was busy, but Sona is vouching for me. She's going to be my sister-in-law soon, Issei says. Oh, you already found someone new. That's good, Hirato says. I can't wait to meet her. Thank you, and you will when I get back to full strength. But first, your family history, Issei said. Patience, boy. <laughs> it also makes sense that you brought the sword. You see, 
The Yamamoto clan was the clan of samurai, so I was not surprised that you were fond of swords. Along with Irina, when the two of you were young, I'm sure that your grandfather and her were playing with sticks. They were thinking they were swords in that secret clearing of yours, Serato said. So you knew about the clearing, Issei said. Of course. You think you can get by without me knowing? It's how I knew if your birth parents were full of bullshit when they came asking for you. I just wanted to hear your side of the story if you ever came. By the way, I am proud of what you did to Goro, snapping his wrists and he claims that you're not a man, and they expect you to come back groveling. Looking back on it, when they were doting on those girls, I thought it was because you had a relationship with them, but with everything that has happened, they were replacing you with them, Murata says. Thanks, Bachan, Issei replied. It was good that you con confronted them that problem. Now that you have, now that you know how they feel about you, it seems that you are very important to the supernatural world, Aratu says. Yeah, I was the pillar of the alliance, but I am retiring that moniker. The responsibility is too much, and I am still young and would like to live my life a little, Issei says. Like finishing your education? But I understand, but promise me that you will try to find out why they did it. Except the red-haired one. From how you describe her, she seems to be the ringleader and spoiled brat. And the one with black hair and the ponytail, she was overly flirtatious. I judged that she was an escort. No woman should be that flirtatious. Made me skeptical of her, Harato said. Ah, Rie Sinakano. Yeah, even if I was a perfect, I never asked them to do anything perverted. They slept with me naked. But they followed Rias' example, who claimed that she couldn't sleep without being naked, Issei said. Well, no matter. You have more balls than those birth parents of yours. I doubt they told the girls that you were aware of their infidelity, and even if they did, they didn't care about you, which makes it even more disappointing near in oh, how I trusted that girl. However, I don't think that they said anything because if it was one of those girls' mothers that you were with in that circle or by your ear, her daughter would have been informed that she may have been replaced by you. Let her know how you feel. I think they, your birth parents, I mean, are afraid of knowing the truth in your words. It's like that line that a movie that goes, you can't handle the truth. I don't think they are prepared for your fate, but only time will tell. <laughs> yeah. So about the Yamamoto clan, they were samurais, he says. Yes, hang on. I think I have some old paintings of the fa of the founder and apparently his old sword, remnants of it. It's passed down by many generations. Goro had no interest in them. It'll just be a minute. As she got up from her seat and walked towards a door that seemed to lead to the basement. Oh my god, this is getting lit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Issei waited for his grandmother to get back as he heard the rumbling around the downstairs in his head. As I feared, your hatred and anger brought you out your fire, but also what I expected, Ozai said. Ozai, what do you mean? My anger brought out my fire, Issei said? Yes, you will need to let your anger go. It seems you have it against this girl that you knew in your childhood. When she was mentioned, your anger spiked. I deduce due to your bond with this girl, some feelings cannot be extinguished, Ozai says. I don't love her. Not anymore. Not after what she did, he say said. Feelings don't necessarily have to be about love. I understand that she ruined that. But all that's left is your hatred for her and your bond as friends. She hurt you more than most, probably because you knew her longer than others. Your grandmother is right. You will need to confront them at some point. You will need to confront her. Your hatred can get you far, but letting go can get you further. Trust me, I would know, Ozai says. Damn, this is getting too relatable, bro. I'm going through the same shit. <laughs> I guess you're right. I'll try and focus. At least you're not telling me to forgive and forget, Issei said. Oh no. What has happened to you is damn near impossible to forget. Since it's happened multiple times. It is how you were introduced into the supernatural world, Ozai said. Don't remind me, grumbling about his first demise. But it did bring to meet some interesting people, Issei said. Indeed. You let go of your hatred of this Rainair. You can do it again, Ozai said. How did you know her name was Rainair? Causing o Issei said, causing Ozai to chuckle. Drake is not the only person that has been with you. It appears that you will learn more about your ancestry. Your grandmother is coming. Issei snapped out of his daze to look towards this basement door to see his grandmother carrying a long, old case and some books on top of it. We're basically right at the end of chapter 21, but let's go ahead and get back into the story. Issei snapped out of his daze to look towards the basement door to see his grandmother carrying a long old case and some books on top of it. 
Let me help you with that, Bachan, getting up from his seat to take care of the case from her. Despite his grandmother still being fit for her age, which she credited to working around the cabin and chasing and an area that wouldn't when we were young. Thank you, dear, Harato said, as she was relieved of the case and shook her arms to remove some of the tension that was in carrying to the case. Issei took the case and placed it on the coffee table, making sure not to knock the tea over. As he was setting it down, he noticed that the books had some sort of shuriken designed to them. Bachan, what's the symbol on these books? As he rubbed the thumb over the book, he was holding it to pass it off to his grandmother. Mm, oh, it's the Yamamoto clan symbol. You haven't seen it much since I held a lot of my clan's things in storage. When I married your grandfather, the old pervert, <laughs> remembering Juzo and who he was. Now let's see. As she looked through the book, ah, here is the picture of the founder of the clan in his much younger days. <sighs> Does everybody from your family look so shricked, he say says, making a joke, as the man expression comparable to his grandma's. Ha! <laughs> ha! Anyway, before you ask, his name was Kenshiro. Shingiti Yamamoto. As she continued to look through... So basically, Yamamoto from Bleach, if anything. Here is a drawn picture of what was said to be his last stand, showing another picture. I must say, you aged better than him, Bachan, looking at the old man's bald head. What was his sword? It looks burnt. I did say that he was known to fight with fire. You can take a look in his journal that might be between George drawings and him and more information. Never looks too much into it, the grandma said. Cool, Issei said. Taking the book, he liked the symbol. So what happened with the sword? Check the case. Not in the case, he took a sip of her tea, although it was now a bit cold. Taking his grandmother's advice, Issei moved around the table to find the opening of the case. When he did, he felt a tug towards it, as if it was pulling him as if he was reaching for it. He stopped and wondered why he didn't feel this before when he was carrying it. Was it before I didn't desire to op- Like, what is- He gulped nervously, Issei did. Issei- Is something wrong? Harato said. She was watching him, and he seemed nervous. It wasn't like Issei to be nervous. No Bachan, just excited, that's all, smiling towards her. Don't lie to me, Issei, calling him the nickname that he had gotten used to. After all, she was the one that gave it to him. You're nervous, why? Well, I feel like there's a pull, which I didn't- Oh my god, spider. Uh, sorry, I had to kill it. Uh, I, well, I feel like there's this pull, which I didn't feel before, and I'm not sure what I will find. Consider this your first test, Harada said. First test, he said, replied, yes. Eventually, you're going to walk up to those who betrayed you and tell them why. On your route, or go the route of your grandfather, which is crude, and showcase your masculinity. Either way, you're going to confront something that you may not want to. But to get over that hump, ignore whatever jitters you and have to open that damn case, the grandma said. Ha! <laughs> Issei said. This is the most I have heard you cuss, Bachan. It relieved whatever pressure he was feeling and didn't realize that his hand was on the case now. You're old enough, and it looks like you're halfway there, nodding to Issei's hand that was on the case. So quit being a bitch, and as she went to keep drinking her tea. It made Issei chuckle at hearing her grandmother curse again. She would usually be reprimanding his grandfather for doing so. I guess Jisan rubbed off on you, as he was unclasping the locks that kept the case closed. I suppose you're right, Aratu said, before turning her attention back to whatever was on the news. With the locks release, Issei grabbed the ends of the top case and opened it. For a split second, he felt immerse, immense pressure and heat, but quickly subsided. What the was that, Issei said. He could feel a bit of sweat to fall down inside of his head. He was breathing heavily as he crouched over the case, but his eyes weren't focused on what was inside. Are you alright? Aratatu said, Issei? As she sat down on the tee and came over to her grandson's side and rubbed his back. She looked into the case as well. Huh? Been carrying around a broken sword all these years? Issei's eyes focused on his breathe and got steady. He noticed a white cream-like cloth and laying on it. It was a katana hilt and guard that burnt along with the broken burnt pieces of what appears to have been the blade. Huh? It looks really old. Issei says, Take it! Ozai says immediately. What? Issei replied, I didn't say anything that I had been carrying around a broken sword, Harato said. Seal it quickly, Issei, like a rondite. It also emanates power and has been exposed, Ozai says. Bachan, you mind if I seal something like the other sword? Issei says, I don't see why not, considering your inheritance. And she stopped rubbing his back and moved over. Issei raised his left hand over the broken pieces of the sword, and a crimson magic circle appeared. It reminded him of Drake's scales. The pieces in the cloth glowed crimson before they disappeared. Good. This will help us. Focus on letting go of your anger. Enjoy. The day your training starts tomorrow, Ozai says. He didn't get much of a chance to reply and communicate circle appeared in his ear. What is it that you need, Issei says, Sona says. Kaichu, hey, hi, 
How long until the end of the school year? He said, replied. The graduation ceremony for the third years take place in three weeks. Are you ready for me to proctor your exam? Sona said. No, not yet. But thanks for letting me know. I'm in concealed place that prevents you from communicating with others, so I'll keep track of time and try to alert you, Issei said. Very well. Do try to keep in touch and be sure to contact my sister. Have a good day, Issei. Sona says. You know you could call me Otokun, right? He had a cheeky smile as he remembered that he and Sona's brother-in-law when he married Seraphal. Goodbye, Issei. He could hear the annoyance in her voice before the communication circle disappeared. Unfortunately, he never asked why she hung up on him so abruptly earlier, but believed that he contacted her the wrong time. So he kept quiet. He turned to his grandmother, who finished her cup of tea. Hey, Bachan, you think I could stay the week? Issei says. Rono's eyes widened a little. She did not extend him to say since so long. But she smiled as she could to spend time with her grandson. Of course, you're always welcome to stay, Reptus says. Thanks, Bachan, smiling. And when I get a better house, you're welcome to come live with me, Issei says. And what about this place, Reptus says. We keep it. Jisun lived here as well. We keep it to honor him. Well then, come on. Help prepare me some lunch. I'd like to hear more about some, this new woman of yours. As she packed up what remained the tea and cups, dumping Issei's unfinished tea back to the kettle. Of course, Issei said, closing the case and following his grandmother into the kitchen. I think this week is going to be a good one, smiling and he remembered what Sona said. When he got back to the kitchen, he quickly took the tea things and placed the cups near the sink and the kettle back on the stove. Hang on real quick, Issei said, Bachan, creating a communication circle waiting until he heard the voice on the other end. Hello, Seraphal said. Hi, Sarah-chan. Been a while, Issei said. Issei-kun, are you back already? Seraphal said. No, well, not fully. I came back, I came to visit my grandma, learn a little more about my family's history. It's part of my training. Raining, Issei says. I see. Do you want me to swing by? I think I know where she lives, Seraphal said. No, I'm sorry, not yet. I like to spend time with my Bachan alone. I haven't seen her in a while, since the Yodo mostly kept me from her. It's grandma and grandson type of thing on this one, Issei said. I understand. Seraph, there was a little sadness in her voice, but try to keep in contact, though, Seraphal said. I can't really do that. Due to the magic that is around the area, it prevents me from contacting the outside world. Believe it was done. That was for the Sekiutis before the train for the dissection. You've really taken this training thing seriously. I bet Tanin would be proud of you, Seraphal said. See, this is kind of funny because this happened to me in real life, except she left. Sorry, I had to say that. Um... <clears throat> I had my suspicions. Whatever. It is what it is. When I re Let's just continue. When I return to you, I think I could give him a good fight, Issei says. I'll let him know that you said that, but keep training yourself to get stronger. We'll see you when you get back, Seraphal says. We? You're not it, are you? He was in shock, although one night and one morning, the amount of times they did it in a span pregnancy was a possibility. Despite the low rate in pregnancy in demons, Issei said. Ha, no. We can work on that later. Anyway, have you met anyone else yet? You've been gone for a few weeks, Seraphal said. No, I haven't. Although there were footprints away from where I am training, sooner or later I'll figure it out, Issei said. All right, stay safe and say hi to your bachan for me. I love you, Seraphal says. I love you too. <sighs> Sarah-chan says, or Issei replies, Bye, Issei-kun. The communication circle disappeared from Issei's ear. When he turned around, he saw his grandmother smirking at him. Looks like we got too much to talk about, as she went to get some things to make lunch with. Shut up. Laughing with his grandmother, as he went to help out making lunch. There was so much to talk about, and he was looking forward to it. That and training. Training to surpass where he was before. Training to awaken Drake and learn more about Ozai and Rondite. Had to teach him. The only downside was that it was one week. Here's a week. Not five weeks like in the Oasis, so we'll have to train harder in this coming week, but at least he will have someone by his side. Someone that could understand him and him knows maybe, just maybe, help him let go of his anger. If he could do that like Ozai said, he could go far and be much stronger, not just a warrior, but as a person. You know, that's the end of chapter 21. I'm not stopping, I just want to say something. You know, letting go of your anger is probably one of the worst or one of the worst feelings of all time, because, man, they don't deserve it. But you do. So you should probably do it as well. It's going to take me a little bit, but we'll see. Anyway, chapter 22. Now in the Leviathan's office. So basically, we're with Seraphal. 
Seraph was handling some paperwork. She had finished the conversation with Issei and his grandmother like she had done the past couple of days. It felt good talking to him again, hearing his voice. He was definitely feeling a lot better from last time she saw him, though she knew that she could not tell him about the threat of Razavine because she knew that he would not come back and have completed his training. So she kept that hidden from him. She was intrigued about the Oasis. It sounded similar to Aragus's clan power. She looked at Lilith, another secret she wielded withheld from Issei. She did enjoy spending time with the girl, but she figured that Lilith tolerated her because she had Issei's enemies mixed with hers. The Gothic Loli was quite adamant about seeing her own Ichan, but would settle down when provided with sweets. It made Seraphil glad that she didn't get rid of the bakery in her castle, or rather some of them. Right now, Lilith was eating a slice of cake. She never understood why Seraphil wouldn't let her find her Onichan, but also needs to see Onichan. She was not aware of what Orphus had done, and Seraphil was afraid of how she would react. Seraphil was having these thoughts as she looked at the Lily that sat across from her. She was lost in her thoughts despite staring at Lilith. Lilith was staring straight back, but still eating her cake. I don't know how she'll react to what Orphus did to Issei. Would seek her out for answers and look for Issei. I don't know how long I can keep the truth from her, Seraphil said. Why are you staring at me so long? Why are you staring at so long at Lilith, Lilith said, snapping Seraphil out of her thoughts to see Lilith's brown eyes peering back at her. Mm, oh, sorry, I was just thinking how to keep you busy, Seraphil said with a nervous giggle. Lilith simply tilted her head confusion to Seraphil. She thought it was adorable. Just then, a maid came into Seraphil's room, office, to inform her of something. Seraphil Sama, Ajuka has come to see you, and he has brought a guest with him. Seraphil's eyes widened as she thought was not expecting Ajuka to come by, and she was curious about who brought with him. But something told her that she wouldn't like that answer. Send them in, Seraphal said. Right away, the maid said. Seraphal summoned, leaving the office, as Seraphal let out a sigh, until Lilith asked her a question. How come you don't want Lilith to see Oni-chan? Lilith said, huh? She was hoping for the maid's intrusion would have distracted Lilith from that topic, but apparently not. Oni-chan, Lilith would like to see Oni-chan, but you won't let Lilith see him. Why? Lilith said. It's a bit complicated, actually. It's very complicated, Seraphil says. Then why don't you let Lilith see Onichan? Seraphil looked sadly at the god Lolit, which made Lilith tilt her head again. Something about that look she did not like. Lilith son, let me ask you something. If your Onichan did something bad to your Onichan, how would you feel? Seraphil said. Lilith stopped chewing her cake and looked at the Mao, pondering the question. Now she was curious about what had happened between her surrogate or her siblings. What happened w while Lilith was gone? Lilith said. Before Seraphil could respond, her office opened and the maid that came in before entered, but this time with the Juka and Merlin. But not only, it seemed they had their own slices of cakes as well. You gotta be kidding me, Seraphil says. Upon seeing the mage, it was like her womanly instincts just flared when the proximity of this woman since the end of her factions meeting that they had. I've brought them, the maid says, Seraphal Sama. Sorry, Seraphal. I had gone to your bakery before with Sir Zex and just had to go again. Your chefs are top of the line. Kudos to you, Ajuka said. Indeed, my compliments to the chef, Merlin Pride, taking a bit out of her slice of cake, and hello. Uh, to you, would you like some? Greeting Lilith, offering some of her cake. Merlin knew from the small interaction that she had seen with Lilith that the girl liked sweets. Something Merlin enjoyed herself, especially when she focused on something. It would be something that she could use to get the close girl understand her power. But for Issei, she needed to get close to his lover first. <laughs> Lilith looked at the cake slice. It was different from the one she had chosen, but which was originally a birthday cake. Merlin's was colored differently as she had blueberries in it, and blueberry drizzle was something Lilith wanted to try, so she nodded her head and accepted. She had come to realize that it wasn't traditional cake, but a slice of blueberry cheesecake. It seems she's enjoying it, Merlin said, as if she as she fed Lilith, which did not make Seraphal grimace a little. Which did make Seraphal grimace a little. So why are you here? Ser uh, Seraphal says, looking at Ajuka, who was enjoying his own slice of cheesecake, a bit disappointed in how Lilith fell for the sweets. <laughs> oh, damn. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Merlin had a proposal for you, Ajuka said. And what would that be, Seraphal replied, now looking at the mage, who is now feeding Lilith like a birthday cake. Well, let's just say I've taken an interest in possibly teaming up with you, Merlin said. What do you mean? Seraphal replied. Her eyes narrowing at the mage. You see, the other day I encountered the two who claims to be your rival, Merlin says. Now, flashback. Merlin and Arthur had reached Ajuka's castle where the guards waited for them and instructed them to be the mouse office. 
I see you were able to arrive. As his guests entered, thank you for coming, Ajuka said. When Arthur and Merlin entered, they not only... Dude, there's something in my nose, bro. I swear to God. <sighs> Whatever. My bad. I seem to be interrupting this, uh, this time in this episode a lot, but... <sighs> okay. We're good, we're good. When Arthur and Merlin entered, they met not only the Mal Beelzebub, but also a nun. A pleasure, so this is my escort in heaven, Merlin said. Yes, this is Grishilda Corda. She will be escorting you to heaven. Corda, hmm, are you? Merlin says, yes. I am the guardian of one of those girls that betrayed the Sekiuti, Grishilda says. Guardian, Merlin said. Yes, I took her in when she was young. I do not know of her birth parents, Grishota says. I see, Merlin replied. Arthur, meanwhile, I was listening to someone contacted him through a magic circle. It seems you cannot go back to the Pentadragon Castle. Merlin son, it appears that Lefay and Kuroka have returned from what Bioko has informed me. He has gone to see Sung Wukong, Arthur says. It seems that your team has been divided, Ajuka replied. I'm afraid so. All thanks to the actions of your social former leader. If you wanted to fight with Hyoto, he could have just asked for it. It's these underhanded tactics that I despise, Arthur said. Speaking of which, doesn't your ward carry the Excalibur, Grishilda said. I mean, Grishilda, Merlin replied, or Merlin said. Yes, she does, along with the Holy Sword, Durandal, Grishilda said. Well, I do not know why Excalibur allowed her to wield it, but let her action so that she should not, Arthur, Merlin said. Yes, Merlin son. I know you have to honor, so when it permits, you will challenge her for Excalibur. I know you wield Calrom, but a Cal Excalibur should not belong in her hands. I do not know of the other one, Merlin said. She is a natural-born holy sword user. Durandal chose her. We have to see if it rejects her in the rematch that they have planned between Gremory and Biel, Grishilda says. Very well. Anyway, I leave it to you, Grishilda. If you will, I'd like to speak with Michael, Merlin says. I understand, Ajuka-sama. Thank you for your hospitality, Merlin son. Preparing a magic circle. Yes, Arthur, take care. Patting him on the shoulder, he reminded her of Arthur that she helped raise Wag back then. I will, Arthur said, giving her a nod. As she walked out of the office, he was preparing to head back to the Pentadragon's castle, kneeling up to confront his sister and teammate, but he decided to head to Bioko's location instead. Merlin stepped towards Grishilda. They both have a nod to Ajuka, and they were transported to heaven. As Ajuka sat down on his desk and continued to carry out his paperwork, apparently he was the only Mao doing it with Seraph while keeping Lilith company. Falbium sleeping, and Sirzex left him in the IOU eh, before departing on the gateway with his family. So now, we are currently in heaven. Grishilda and Merlin had reached heaven, where they met by Uriel, who was shocked to see the mage here. I thought gluttony was a sin, Uriel said, making note of a mark on her neck. You are correct, it is. But I'm keeping my thirst for knowledge under control, after all. I would like to be permitted into heaven, with your leadership's permission, see the fabled library of your father, and learn things that have been created by his hands. For example, the sacred gears. I've been out of touch with the world for many years, so there is much I need to catch up on, Merlin said. Uriel gave a nod, seeing how she was being truthful in her desires. I see, Grishola, you could take on the sixth heaven. I'll inform Michael of your arrival, as she created a communication circle to inform Michael. Thank you, Uriel Osama. Bowing to the seraph and then returning to Merlin. Shall we? Grishola says. Merlin gave a nod to Grishilda, who escorted to the Sixth Heaven. Unfortunately, they ran into someone they did not expect, Grishilda's mistress, Gabriel. Oh, Grishilda, how are you, and who is this, Gabriel said, looking towards Merlin. I am doing well, Gabriel-sama, and this is Mary Ann. She is the guest that I have been instructed to bring Michael-sama. It was the first time that she had to lie to Gabriel, but then again, Gabriel had been lying to Grishilda. Grishilda was aware that Michael was still holding on and restarting the system, so she knew the feature was still in effect. This allowed her to lie and keep Merlin identity a secret from her mistress. Oh, it's an honor to meet you, Marianne, Gabriel said. A pleasure. Giving the nod to serve, is there anything you need, Gabriel Sama Grishilda replied. Oh, yes, but it can wait. I'll let you escort Marianne to my brother. It must be important to have someone who is not an angel here, as she studied Merlin, who started with an indifferent look. Who stared with an indifferent look. Very well. I shall meet you in your quarters, then, Gabriel Sama, as she began to continue to walk towards Michael's office. 
Yes, I shouldn't keep you waiting. Take care, Marianne, Gabriel said. You as well, Merlin replied with a small smile, being courageous and followed after Grishilda. How strange. I couldn't detect anything in her heart. Nothing good, but nothing evil. It practically feels neutral, but it's better than that heart I felt weeks ago. Such sorrow. I shall pray for that individual, and they will get help what they need. As she went to the room to wait for Grishilda, Gabriel did. With some distance between them and Gabriel, Merlin decided to speak up. I thought angels could lie, but then again, I also thought they couldn't cheat. Care to explain this feature? Merlin says, hmm, well, it's a feature that allows us angels to be intimate with our partners, basically allows us to commit sin. However, it is still in development as it only applies to the seraph and those and their brave saints. Brave saints, Merlin said? Yes, they are similar to the demon's evil peaceful system, Merlin said. I mean, Grishilda said, another thing that I am unfamiliar with, though Arthur did mention it, Merlin said, really, you can speak with the Juka son about that, after all, he is the creator of the evil pieces for them, Grishilda says, how intriguing, but I came here to learn more about the sacred gears, as they reached Michael's office. I'm sure that Michael Sama can help you get the answers that you seek, as she knocked on the door. Michael Sama, I have brought your guest. Guest, Grishilda did. There was a call from the Archangel, allowing for them to enter. When Grishilda opened the door, giving a nod to Merlin, Merlin stepped into the office as Grishilda closed the door, but did not enter the office, leaving Merlin alone with the Archangel. Greetings. Merlin, I hear you have interest in the sacred gears. He had been expecting her arrival, since he was contacted by Ajuka and then Uriel. Yes, and I can't exactly... You're supposed to expect after all, Merlin said. Then I suppose you would like to enter the seventh heaven. It's where the logs of sacred gears are on the house of the system, but it also allows the biblical god system, my father's system, Michael said. Hmm, may you accompany me then. So she so much has changed and I have not been here. Tell me, do you know of Miel? Merlin said. How do you know that name? Michael said, eyes wide in shock. He was the celestial or angel that helped me and my team centuries ago, Merlin said. I see. I'm sorry to inform you that he has passed in the war against the Maus, the original. Michael said, that explains why I haven't seen him then. She was disappointed in not seeing her former ally, and it made her seem that she was probably alone. However, she wondered if she could find the basics of Miel's ability, Sunshine, which was also the same ability of the man that gave her the scars on her face, Merlin thought to herself. Putting her hand to her face, she figured that she could find that she was looking for, maybe even learn how to construct a sacred deer of her own. They seemed to be similar since sacred treasures, which likely lost in history, as she did not have her infinity sphere when she she woke up. Please take me. There's much I would like to learn, Merlin says. Very well. Follow me, Michael said. Standing up from his desk, he began walking out of the office with Merlin following behind. He began escorting her to the seventh heaven, so Merlin decided to converse before her mind engrossed on the knowledge she could learn. I met your sister. She is a beautiful woman. A shame what she has done for such a promising young man, Merlin said. Yes, it disappoints us all. I pray she realized her mistake. Unfortunately, there is nothing I could do, as she will be banished for her treason, Michael said. Hmm, you mentioned that in the meeting, Merlin said. If she has met you, she probably tried looking into your heart. It's not often that someone who was not an angel would come here, Michael said. I suspected as much. Arthur informed me of that ability of hers, so kept my emotions in check. It seems she didn't suspect much as she did. She said nothing about it, Merlin said. Anyways, we are here. You know there is a security system in this place, opening the gateway to the seventh heaven. Inside the seventh heaven, it was a vast library that Merlin was surprised. There was so much that Merlin was a bit stunned. She had to keep her thirst for knowledge contained. Please, hold out your hand. I need to place a mark on you to keep the security system from registering. You, as an enemy to heaven, Michael said. Merlin nodded and held out her hand, which a golden spade glowed on her hand. A spade, Merlin said. It's my insignia. I am the king's suit of spades. My sister Gabriel is the king of the suit of hearts. Uriel, whom you met when you first arrived, is the king of the suite of diamonds. And Raphael is the king of suit of clubs, Michael said. I see, like a deck of cards, examining the glowing spade in her left hand. You may look through the library and learn more about the Brave Saint system here. Before he activated a summoning circle and the girl back with white hair appeared, I'm sure you remember Lent. She shall be your guard. While you are here, I have no other things to attend do so for now, take care, giving a nod to Merlin and then walking out. Well then, Lint, correct? Merlin said. As the girl gave a nod, try not to doze off. We're going to be here for a long while. Now the flashback ends. 
So that explains why you were asking about the Tengu, but to enter the library of the biblical god is impressive, Dujuka says. Yes. Oh, he gives credit. The library was a given idea by Yo3T3 is what the author said in the notes. But anyway, let's continue. Yes, yeah, so what does that have to do with me, Seraphal says. It's simple. I want the Sekiyutu, who is now rubbing a sleeping and satisfied Lilith's head, and you're his partner. So I propose to Ajuka that I either become your bishop or his, Merlin said. A smirk adorned Merlin's face as Seraphal was perplexed. First, for how easily she tamed Lilith, and at the fact that Merlin openly stared her want for Issei, stated her want for Issei. What, Seraphal said? You heard me. I would like to become your bishop. I thought about becoming a Juka's bishop since he had a lab and I could possibly develop my own sacred gears and experiments there, but he doesn't have the resources that you do. Which is the Sekiyuti? You see, I helped the boy become a king. And I believe I can do the same for Issei. I had, a pre I had helped the previous Red Dragon Emperor, so I feel obligated to help this for generations. And what's in it for you, Seraphal said. Who knows? The recognition of developing his magical prowess. The possibility of becoming his lover, Merlin questioned, looking at Seraphal, knowing that she got under her skin. As if you can produce a child, Seraphal said, scoffing at her for being Issei's lover. Sure. She said that she'd have a harem, but she did not expect Merlin, of all people, to offer herself up. I could say the same thing to you. We are years beyond young. Issei, he... M must be nurtured, rubbing Lilith's head with moderately affection, and I can't do that alone. Neither you can. Neither can you. Though congratulations on getting your legs back, Merlin said. Seraphal's eyes narrowed. Of course she knew that she could not handle Issei alone in bed. She still felt that there was more of what Merlin had to say, and what she had learned in the library of the biblical god was still a mystery. While she was still jealous that Merlin could tame Lilith so easily, she did see it as a benefit as she would have to worry less about the gothic lolly. What are you hiding from us, Merlin? Seraphal says. Why are you interested in Isekun? I know you're not merely to produce his child. If your body can, Seraphal says. Isei? Or Isi? So that's how it's said affectionately. How interesting, before she answered. Very well. I'm interested in his power as well as his little ones. Looking down at Lilith sleeping. I want to know about the power of these dragon gods, Merlin said. Absolutely not, Seraphal replied, standing up from her seat. I will not let you take advantage of them for their power, just for your own gain, Seraphal says, as the temperature dropped a bit. Ajuka had a spell at the ready, in case he needed to restrain Merlin. He knew of her reputation, but wondered why she never used magic. Merlin remained calm as Lilith began to wake up, mumbling about noise and cold. However, Merlin calmed down, cooing her back to sleep and rubbing her with the warmth of her body before looking at the defility at Seraphon. I don't intend to do it, just for my benefit, but theirs as well. I told you before I helped the Sekiyuti, so I intend to help Issei as long as he holds the title. You remember that I said I helped the boy become a king. I can do so much with Issei. You have an enemy on the horizon and they are working ahead. It's only a matter of time before they strike. But when they do, I will have helped Issei become so much more than a king. He will be, have become a conqueror, Merlin said. Seraphon and Ajuka's eyes widened about Merlin's intention to raise Issei to become someone powerful against their enemy. I want to learn about his power along with hers so I can help them control it, expand their magical capabilities and watch them grow. But I need to understand their power first, Merlin said. Seraphon frowned but sat down, letting the room go back to normal temperature. She did not want to accept the offer, but she had a feeling that Merlin could help Lilith. After all, Orphus was a traitor now, and Merlin was a magical genius unparalleled. She was sure that Issei could learn from Great Red, but if he discovered more about himself like he told about... Merlin did seem like the best option to help him as well, plus the knowledge she was obtaining from the Biblical God's library was significantly beneficial. Very well. Although we, Maos, have a pact about no new pieces, I did not have a bishop, so you may become part of my barrage. That way I can keep an eye on you, Seraphal said. I was hoping you could say that, Merlin said. It will take some time, but similar to Sir Zex's knight, I believe Merlin's side would take two mutated bishop pieces, and with your power, Seraphal, it should be enough, Ajuka said. Very well. I will go when you need to, Seraphal said. If I may ask... Where were you and Lilith speaking before we entered, Ajuka said. I was telling her that Orphus did something bad, and asked her how she would feel about it. It didn't explicitly say what bad thing Orphus did to Issei, Seraphal said. Well, she needs more than just you. In order to gauge her reaction, she could be dis despondent. 
Are there any other children around her age that are aware of the situation? Merlin said. Well, there's Cerzex's son, Milikis, and Alkayakas' daughter, Kano, Seraphal said. I suggest you go with the daughter. If she is able to cope with the mess, she can help Lilith cope with it as well, Merlin said, and it will give time to create those pieces. You can rest, Seraphal. Enjoy yourself. I'm sure Kyoto was wonderful this time, as he stood up from his seat, and thank you again for the cake, Ojuka said. Merlin was softly scratching Lilith's cheek, getting her to wake up. How do you... Do that, Seraphal replied. I told you, I raised a boy to become a king. With a smirk as Lilith rubbed her eyes, Merlin did. Why was Lilith woken up, Lilith said. With Lilith, son, we are going to Kyoto to finish our conversation about what Oni-chan did to your Oni-chan, Seraphal said. Hmm? She did not know where Kyoto was, Lilith said. It seemed that she has been sheltered for far too long. It has many things to learn, don't you, dear? Rubbing Lilith's little head. Well, Seraphal and I are going to teach you and help a little. Lilith slightly shivered, and she did not know this woman, but she liked her touches. It made Lilith feel good, and she wanted to snuggle against her. I guess we shall take our leave, Seraphal said. Preparing a transportation circle, time to go, dear. Picking up Lilith, who was a bit surprised, and walked over to Seraphal as they left for Kyoto. Now we're in Kyoto, in Yakus' palace. So the Yokai faction. Thanks to her friendship with the leader of the West Yokai faction, Seraphal had a direct access to her palace. More so, she had a more so, she also had a private room for whenever she visited. Merlin sat down Lilith, who was in bewilderment for her surroundings as she all knew what Seraphal's office, the dimensional gap, and the base where she had stayed with Rezavim before she switched sides. It seems someone is curious, Merlin said, watching Lilith walk around the room and touch things, such as the bed, painting, and curtains in the room. It seems that way, smiling Lilith's curiosity. It reminded her that Lilith is still just a child mentally. Come on, the sooner we get over, the better, Seraphal says. Lilith stopped looking at the painting and hammered her attention, hearing her name called. She followed after Seraphal. Merlin followed after the two. They exited the room, where they encountered a couple of guards. However, due to Seraphal's new look, they did not recognize her. Halt! Stay your business and why did you bring the people that portrayed the Sekiyuti? Pointing at the spear at Lilith, while the guard pointed the spear at Merlin. Forgive me for coming in unannounced. As she stepped in in front of Lilith, my name is Seraphal Seatree. The Mal Leviathan. I'm here to speak with Queen Yakasa and Princess Kyono. Seraphal Sama is not as tall as you and is more childish in her demeanor, Guard 2 says. Correct. So who are you? I guess if you don't believe me, then perhaps I will show you that I am who I say I am. As the temperature dropped a few degrees, Lilith stepped back from Seraphal, feeling the freezing aura radiating off her, and stepped back into Merlin. Merlin simply watched the encounter. She was intrigued by this predicament. She wondered if Seraphal would actually freeze the guards or simply make a show of intimidation. The guards also took a step back, shivered slightly from the mouth, beginning to exert her power. Halt! Please not to try to scare my guards, Seraphal Dono. Forgive me, but I had to get my point across. It seems you do not inform them of my change in appearance, Yakuza Dono, turning towards the voice to see Yakuza, her daughter, Kino, and a black Nekomata down the hall walking towards them. The thought ship the thought slipped my mind, and I see you brought Kino a new friend, which caused Kino to look a bit confused. Okasana, I don't understand. Said we banished them from our lands, Kyono said. I forgot to inform you, Kyono, since this is the first time you have met her, but this is Lilith, not Orphis. Lilith is the spawn of Orphis that Rizavim created. Yakasa said. Really? Kyono replied, tilting her head in confusion, and who is she? Now looking at Merlin. This is Merlin, Kyono chan. Now we came here to help Lilith chan deal with the situation of what Orphis has done to Isekun, and we figured that having someone similar to her age could help her cope with it. I see. That makes sense. Since I have already informed Kyoto of Isekun's situation, she cried at first but has come around, knowing that he will come back, Yakuza said. Lilith simply listened to the two women converse, before turning to Kyono, who looked at her quizzically. Lilith did not understand why she was being looked at like she looked at the Black Nekomata, who looked at her the moment she stared. Lilith Lilith was surprised at her awareness, though she didn't show it. When will Oni-chan come back, Lilith said, hearing the last part of what Yakuza said. I'm sorry, but I do not know, Yakuza replied. Lilith-chan, I'm going to be blunt with you. Kneeling down on Lilith's level, rubbing her head. Your Oni-chan betrayed your Oni-chan. She deceived him, betrayed him, and left him broken, Seraphal said. Lilith's stature stiffened. She didn't know what to feel. This was new to her, but seeing the look in Seraphal's eyes, she knew she wasn't lying. To confirm this, she looked around at the others from their expressions. She knew it wasn't a joke. 
Is Zoni Chan all right? Lilith said. Yes, he's fine. He's doing much better in his training right now, Seraphal said. Lilith simply nodded. She felt down, and she didn't like it. She did not understand how this feeling, and she didn't like it, Lilith said. Lilith doesn't like the way Lilith feels right now. It's because you're sad. Coming up to the gothic lolly and giving her a hug, Kano said. It happens when someone you cares about gets hurt. Sad. Lilith doesn't want to be sad. How could Lilith no longer be sad, Lilith said. It takes time, but don't worry. I'll help you. We can have fun painting. Blakely showed me, but I'm not as good as her, Kiano said. Me? She's your own chan Lilith said. Mmm. Smiling brightly, Kiano said. Lilith wants to paint, too. Lilith doesn't want to feel sad anymore, Lilith said. Then it's settled. You are welcome to stay and get over your sadness. Then she turned to her guards. And please don't panderize our guests, Yakuza said. Guards 1 and 2 said, Yes, Yakuza! Sama, putting away their spears. Thank you. She turned to Merlin. I don't believe we've met, but I did see you at the meeting, Yakuza said. You'd be correct. I am Merlin, giving a small bow to the queen. Merlin, as in Merlin that helped King Arthur? Someone knows about their history, Merlin says, turning to the black-haired Nekomata that just spoke. Seraphal's eyes narrowed as she looked at the Nekomata. It reminded her of another black-haired Nekomata, but she was different. Her ears which meant sleeker. As her figure, she still had curves, but not as voluptuous and looked a little more toned instead of a black kimono. The Nekomata wore a black button vest with the coattails and single silver button on her fair white, sleeveless high-necked crop undershirt. The vest helped her accurate her bust, though it was not as big as the other haired woman Nekomata as she knew of. To complete her outfit, she wore white shorts and went to mid-thigh. Overall stockings had a color graduations from black to purple and his low black heel boots. You don't seem to be Kuroka, watching the Nekomata's narrow back at her, Seraphal says no. And I would appreciate it if you didn't mention her to me again, spitting venomously about hearing the traitorous Nekomata. Now, now, Blake. Sarah-chan is not aware of what has happened here since the meeting, so no need to be hostile, Yakuza said. I wouldn't need to be hostile if she didn't mention her to me, Blake said. I understand, but she did not know where more of you. So she only knows of her not saying the Kuroka's name, not to initiate Blake anymore. Blakeney. Let's go show Lilith on your paintings that always helps trying to ease the situation. What a splendid idea. Kono-chan, Blake, could you go show the girls your drawing? Yes, Yakasasama, Blake said, giving a bow. No need to be so formal with Blake. Kiono already considers you like family. I understand. Before turning around and beginning to walk away. Come on, Kiono said about Lilith, about the drag which La Harder anticipated. Lilith looked at Seraphal China Merlin, who simply smiled at her. Go on, Lilith Sean. Go have some fun, Seraphal said. Yes, have some fun and enjoy yourself, Merlin replied. Lilith simply nodded. She never understood why she felt comfortable around Merlin. She did not seem to be human. She knew she could trust Seraphal because of her own chun scent on her, but Merlin was different, and she didn't know why. The woman fed her and held her while she napped, and she liked it. For now, she would think about it later, and listen to what she said and have fun, but she did have something on her mind that would keep her from being a little sad. Kiona was able to pull Lilith, since she was no longer resisting and dragged her after Blake, who was still pondering in her thoughts. Kiona tugged her along as well. The three remaining women could only smile about Kiona's optimism. They could only hope that the attitude it would rub off on Lilith. That way she may not do something drastic. She is definitely free-spirited, Merlin said, watching as Kyoto now tugged Lilith and Blake along. One of the look of surprise and her other would appear to be boredom. Yes, it took some time to get her there. Blake helped with that, Nakasa said. So what's her story? She seems she likes to paint, Seraphal said. And read, interrupting Seraphal. Not many people should know my name unless you read the history books, Merlin said. Indeed. She does like to read and paint. It keeps her sane. I'm sure you've seen some of her work, Yakuza replied. Some of her work, Seraphal said? Yes. You didn't see the paintings in your room, Yakuza replied. Seraphal's eyes widened. She didn't really look around because she was too busy watching Lilith. She quickly looked back in the room to see a couple of black and white paintings that she hadn't seen before. Oh, wow, I didn't notice, Seraphal said. Hmm, could you use some color, though? I don't mind with the black and white, Merlin said. If I may ask, why are you with Seraphal, Yakuza said. I am to become her new push-up, Merlin replied. More like, I am to keep an eye on her, Seraphal replied. How interesting. And I could see you got your legs back, causing Seraphal to blush. I can't wait for you to tell me about it, Yakuza says. Seraphal could only groan in dismay as the other two women laughed at her expense. They decided to go follow the girls and see what they were up to. It was something Seraphal wouldn't mind, as if it was to focus on her a little during their stay. Now we're back with Issei. 
It has now reached the end of the week that Issa was able to spend time with his grandmother. Aratu enjoyed spending time with her grandson and keeping him in check, not letting him to get into his hatred. Now, it was time for Issa to depart. He felt much better about himself and his potential confrontations. When it came to that, now we're two walking back to the clearing. The former secret clearing this since the Rotatu who already knew about it. So it's time for you to go, huh? The Rotatu said. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Issei said. Of course, and besides, it looked like you needed some new scenery whenever you were training, Haraju said. France, Issei said. France? She did not think about that he left Japan. Yeah. Oh, and thanks for trimming the beard. Not too scraggly, but it will probably be again when I go into training again, Issei says. Sorry I couldn't shave it all the way like you wanted. I used to do that for your grandfather. Maybe you will find a woman that can do the same for you, Horato says, patting him on the shoulder. It's okay, Bachan. I really appreciate it and all you've done for me this week. I feel like I'm getting closer to achieving my goal, as two of them reached the clearing. Horato turned and looked at her grandson. He was definitely much stronger than she last saw him. She also had given him a backpack to keep all of his journals in, so he could read them and maybe find some philosophical answers. Still deep in her heart, she can only hope that Irina gets her head out of her ass and apologizes for what she has done. She still loved the girl like a granddaughter and only wished she came to her. She also hoped Isik would find his closure and understand that Ross fights a woman and her decision. The other girls, she did not give a sass about them as she had no connection to them at all. I'm really proud of you, my boy. You have grown so much and you have beautiful fiancé as well. Remembering her time of meeting the holographic image of Seraphal, I can't believe she's letting you have a harem. Your grandfather is probably dancing in his grave, Ferrato said. Yeah, though I'm not sure I'm ready for it, nervously chuckling, as Seraphal had confirmed again that it was okay for him to have a harem. But he knew the real reason was because she'd rather be able to feel her legs come morning, Issei said. You are, you already handled one woman before, it got you killed, but you handled it. Besides, there are other women out there than your exes. You're a handsome young man, which I take some credit for. Since you got up on my family's side, Arato said, you really think that, Obuchan, Issei said, considering that Hiyoto never complimented on his looks before, it was part of him that made him feel insecure. Of course. As I told you before, remember who raised you. Something I will have to remind my dear granddaughter, Hirato said. Issei chuckled nervously. He knew that his grandmother could be strict, so he was aware that Irina would be in a far wake-up call. He was able to disperse his hate and actually look back on the angels that betrayed him. Thanks to his grandmother's help, Gabriel and Irina are naive, and when he walked into the house after capturing the Gremory leave of the volley in the park, Zenobia was doing the talking, and he understood that Zenobia and Irina were close and that Irina looked up to Zenobia. Novia. He remembered this when Akino, Azia, and Konako were apologizing to him before their raiding game against Saraorg. Zenovia practically commanded Irina to get naked to join up on the group hug. Now this hatred and anger just turned to disappointment for the angels. It's clear that no good things happen when an angel listens to a devil. Ozai was proud that Issa was moving on, and that hatred and his flame control improved as well. Now then, even though I won't be with you, I'm sure it's someone that will look for you. You just need to wake them up, Haratu says. When she said this, she patted his left arm as she knew that this is where the boosted gear lied. I will, Obuchan, smiling, feeling more at peace in himself. Well, almost. Mm, you're hiding something from me. Her gaze changed from proud to stern. No, no, no. Just reminiscing about the week, he said. Hmm, she wasn't convinced, but she wasn't going to puss it. She already enjoyed having him for the week, and she was amazed by his survivalist skills, finding some species in the forest to surround her. Finding the various species around the forest helped Issei as a meditator, assisting his grandmother. Now it was time to head back into the storm that was training. Ozai felt that he was ready for something, but the fire lug would tell him what it was. Until he returned, he also found that his dragon body was slowly coming back. Would you explain why he did feel the burn when his fist was on fire? Ozai told him that he would soon be prepared to utilize the technique called Dancing Dragon. I guess I'll be heading back, Issei says. Harada took her hand from the ruffle of his hair and slid it down to his cheek and pinched his nose. It caused him to jump back as she was not expected. Uh, I'm trying to... Okay, it's Tuesday. Sorry, I needed, to, I needed to see that. After all these years, you still haven't had the same reaction. Laughing at his reflex of something that she always did to him and Irina when they were kids. Remember, you're never alone. And even when you're out there, you have me, your fiancé, your secret parents, and siblings. And there are other out there that you have yet to meet. And let's not forget your grandfather who is also watching. Look at the initials Zuzo had carved out in the tree. Rato did. Yeah, rubbing his nose. Thanks for that. I will. 
Thanks for being there, Obuchan, and listening to me, Issei said. Of course, Rokta replied, and now that I know that you can pretty much drop in any time, don't be a stranger, you can always come visit me. When you feel the need to get away from things, Rokta said, a tear fell down Issei's cheeks. He thought that he had finished crying, but he guessed he was wrong, so he walked up to his grandmother and gave her a hug, holding her tight. Thank you, Obuchan, Issei says. Don't act like this is the last time you'll see me, laughing and reciprocating the hug. Now go finish your training. Remember I taught you... To finish what you started, Harato said. Yes, ma'am. Stepping back from his grandmother, he gave a wave. I'll be back again someday, Issei said. I know you will, Harato said, giving a wave back. Issei tapped into his magic core, creating a transportation seal, envisioning the clearing that he remembered in the forest. He took a look back and gave another wave before stepping through. Harato chuckled as she enjoyed his company and walked to their tree and carved out his initials. You should see how our boy has grown. Juzo. As she traced J.H. initials, he got, he's got muscles too. His fiance is quite a looker. Long black hair, big boobs, quite the figure, and she even allowed him to get a harem. Can you believe that? He even told me about the supernatural world, and guess what? He's supposed to be a dragon now. How crazy is that? Harato said. She moved over to the S.I. initials that were on the right of J.H. and began to trace it. Then there's our girl, she spoke solemnly. She made a stupid decision that almost cost our boy's life. I don't think she is aware of it yet. <sighs> if only she came to me for advice. You know what is worse about it? She's an angel. A freaking angel. Ugh. The only good thing that I was able to remove that hatred in his heart. She really did hurt him deeply. As much as you and I wanted them together, I don't think that'll happen. Maybe in another life. I don't know. She then moved over to IH and began to trace with a smile. No matter what has happened, we cannot turn back the past, we can only move forward. Our boy understands that maybe our stupid son and his wife will see the truth. They're so hypocritical. I believe what our boy says is true. He has never lied to us, so our stupid son is in for a reckoning. A pity I won't be able to see it, letting out a chuckle. Oh well, to each of their own, Arato said. She then let her pocket knife and began to carve HH into the center of three initials. Our little family once complete, now torn apart, as she traced the first SI initials again. You should have came to me, Irina. I don't think you'll get his love again, and you'll have to be extremely lucky if you're ever going to be friends again. The fiancé of his is no pushover. Now, I don't know what I can do, letting out a sigh. She then put her pocket knife away, and then began to walk away. Now then, according to Issa, I believe there is some batch of fresh men around here. Could do nicely with some tea. She began to walk away, until a bright light appeared behind her. She was startled by its appearance. It did not look like the one that Issa left in, so she knew it was not him. She pondered if it was one of the other girls, as she knew where they lived. When they visited with Goro, Miki, and Issa before this whole fiasco, suddenly a figure appeared and it was startled in front of her, as she was to see them. But she came over her shock as the figure slowly backed away with red eyes and a tear streaks down her face you know they speak of the devil and he shall appear and with your actions you might as well be considered one when you're not supposed to be but come on as she began to walk towards where the patch of mintleys were you and i have much to discuss arena the scene change here we go it would happen to be a laboratory. Rizavine looked at the decaying body of lilith his grandmother Mora was working on the machines that kept her alive how long until we can take her power for ourselves, Mora, Rezavan says. We're only at 40%, my lord. It will be a few weeks to another month or so, Mora said. That is fine. Has our spy informed us of anything, Rezavan said. Only some information. It seems that Hades found the footage that we left behind. So they are aware of our existence and are wary of us. And there is some raining game that should happen around the time that we are at full capacity to take Lilith's power and make it your own, Moro said. Yes, she is the mother of all demons. With her power, we can make some demons with viarity of power. Imagine demons like Serzek's Gremory obeying us or any one of them of the current mouths. In fact, Rezavine says... Yes, in addition, we can implement your father's blood into those demons. So not only would they possess the blood of the clan pillar, but Lucifer's blood as well, Moro said. Yes, we must make sure they are submissive and know who is in charge. You know how we, Lucifer's, let our egos take over, chuckling in the arrogant trait of his family's lineage, Rizavim did. Well, it caused the downfall of our grandmother and father, but I don't think that will be the case for you, my lord. Maybe what maybe will happen to your son, Moro said. It depends on which son are you talking about, Rizavin replied, as he had 
Moro left the lab that Lilith and moved over to another laboratory that had a biocontainer in it. You mean my biological son, Rezavine says. As they walked towards the biocontainer and saw a pale, white-haired teen that was unconscious, or my perfect one, Rezavine said before, la before letting out a laugh and chuckled along as well. I meant your biological one, my lord, Moro says. Ah, yes, the imperfect volley. Tell me he is still with the Domon girl, Rezin says. Yes, that's what his recent activities has indicated. Hmm. I was sure that he's seeing me alive would have caused him to have a mental breakdown. He wasn't at the meeting. In fact, neither of the hosts of the Heavenly Dragon was, Moro says. So the Sekiyuti wasn't there. That makes things this much easier. We stay hidden. Let them enjoy their artificial peace and we keep watch. Eventually, they'll believe us not to be a threat and let their guard down again. But tell me, did you complete your task? Rizamine says. The two began to leave the laboratory and head towards another one. This one was built underground and it held a much bigger biocontainer. Of course, thanks to your son's incompetence, along with the team members, it made things easier to get the jump on him and trap him. Rizamine says. Unfortunately, it cost you an arm, Rizamine said. Sometimes we must give part of ourselves in order to achieve success, holding out a manacle arm where his right arm was supposed to be, before checking the monitors and that was tackling the status and the subject resting inside. I suppose you are correct, but I do not recall you had a little bit of help trapping him, Rizman says. Yes, I did. What a worthy ally that we have. Yes, quite beneficial that you were looking towards the shadows. Isn't that right? Santanil, Rezamin says. A man with a long brunette hair was so dark it was black and silver eyes emerged from the shadows. He had a calm demeanor about himself, and we wore all black business suit. But behind him were six pairs of black angel wings. They were so dark they wouldn't be able to see them in the shadows, even if they ruffled and flurried out. I and my students can help ourselves seeing such a magnificent creature. We had to assist your doctor in achieving his goals, Sanatil said. And I thank you. May I ask where your students are now? As Vincent's lounging around, waiting for their next task. Sonatil says, excellent. I do have a task for them. And what would that be? I want them to locate my wife, Razadine says. Hmm, you still call her that after all these years, Sonatil said. Yes, after all, till death do us part, as I recall. I'm not dead, so technically she is still my wife, Razadine says. Very well. And what does she look like? It makes things easier with finding her. So, so, of course. Though she may be a bit older now, after all, she is just a human, as she produced an image of a black-haired woman. I must say she is quite the beauty. You have a good taste smirking at a supposed ally, Sonatil said. Why, thank you, but make sure they are to watch and monitor her, nothing else, Rezavine says. Hmm. You said they, so I suppose you have me doing something, Sonatil said. Of course, your expertise in sacred gears is much superior to that of Azazel's, and I doubt he would join our cause. Yes, he has gone a little soft-hardened after all. He took in your son, Sonatil says. True, but he has only developed one artificial sacred gear that allowed us to utilize the Balance Breaker. You developed 48 of them, but you called them Tengus or Imperial Arms, correct? Razamine said. Hmm, don't flatter me, but yes. Unfortunately, most of destroyed or lost because, as you know, the more the user uses the Tengus, the more ineffective it will become. Unless it bonds with the user, unfortunately, the users were human, so I doubt they could handle the strain from the excessive use. Well, half of your team should find the remaining ones as long as they are not bonded to anyone. They should be easy to take. We don't want to alert the factions, so make sure they don't kill anyone, and the other half should find the monitor, my wife. Zoom says, very well. And what shall you have me do? Sonatil says, apply your research to him. Make him a sacred gear like your father did to the heavenly dragons. Zoom said, I see. But that will take time. I understand that. It is why we won't kill him yet. Then he called the doctor. Moru? Yes, my lord? Have our spy investigate where they are keeping Lucid. I believe he created an army of clones made from the boosted gear, but I guess he understood that he could not beat the original, Sonatil said. Yes, but this is a duty part of the Lucifer clan. So to sever the Lucifer clan and with my dear father out of commission, the next one in line is me, which is where you will come in, Sonatil. Once we have the location, we will break him out. But on that day that the raiding game commences, Moro, did they say who it was against? I believe it was Gremory versus Biel. Moro said... That just makes this more perfect. Such a spectacle would leave us under the radar. Sonatil, you will break Elucid out on that day. Kill the guards if you must, but do not attract on one of detention. We must take them to make sure by the time they figure out Elucid is gone, he would already be making himself comfortable again and put themselves on edge, Moro said. 
I mean, Rezavine said. What if he tries to save your father, seeing how he is barely alive and his soul is nearly detached from him, when he uses it against an alternative to free the Triaxa from its prison, Moro said. Then we shall make him submit, and if not, Sonatil, you can get what he knows and then we can kill him, Rezavine says. Very well. I shall give your instructions to the Abyss team, but may I ask who this sacred gear is for? For my son, and no, not Volley, Rezavine says. Ah, the one you've been creating from the past decade, he said. More of a statement than a question. Correct. After all, we need the weapon to combat with these gods and other Longinus users, Rezavine says. I suppose you're right. The old saying of fighting fire with fire. If you will, always, I shall take my leave. As he left the laboratory, and Rezavine gave a nod. He is stable. My stable. Scanning readings on the monitor. Did. Good. He then walked up to the big bio container and placed his hand on it. The figure inside stiffened and then relaxed soon. You will not know or you will do what you were meant to do, but you will do it alongside my son. Not the other one that you once served, Fenrir, Zine says. Inside the bio container was Fenrir, but not in the way that he was seen before. His fur was now ashen gray and had no horns in his shoulders, but rather spikes on his ice. On his body, compared to the Gratian blue that he was with the Team Volley, back in his large form, he was 80% of his original power, so it was understandable why it took the combined forces of Moro, Sonatil, and his Abyss team to subdue the Great Wolf. Volley and his teammates were fools not to pay attention to you, but don't worry. You can get your revenge on them for leaving you alone. My son will be your new partner and he will take care of you, so rest for now. Before turning away the container, Moro remembered that he is to remain sedated until he would be sealed. Have you gotten the other thing that I asked you for? Yes, my lord. Would she was defeated? I extract the fang from him to be used a medium in creating the sacred gear that you aim to seal him in, Moro said. Excellent. Craft into a weapon. Preferably a sword. You know, keep it original. As you begin to walk the exit in time, a new war will start, and we will need all assets ready, Vin says. And what about the Olympic gods, Mora replied. Hmm, I'm sure the Titans will be thrilled for a rematch, but the time will come later. Now focus, focus on preparation. Translating Lilith's power into sedating fa Fenrir, maybe add a little torment. He had a strong attachment to Witch on the Volley's team. Sever it. My son will replace it. After all, a dog is a man's best friend. If I may ask, what is your son's name? I'd like my wife to see him before giving him a name. After all, some of her DNA was used just in case. We have to forcibly transplant the sicker gear into him, and human DNA is required. I want her to love him like she once did Volley. However, I want... Her to despise Volley. Imagine how he would feel seeing her back turn him laughing maliciously. His world would crumble, chuckling his lore's intentions. Very well, I will keep track of things to inform you of their progress. In my spare time, I would like to start applying some upgrades to my arm, Morrow said. Use scientists in your toys. Very well, I will leave you to it, exiting the laboratory, Zavim did. Thank you. My lord, Moro did. In the hallway, Rizmi walked through his base, smiling to himself as he headed back to his room, his throne. They sat in patience and virtue. That's just fine for me, because all I need is some time. Now, we're back with Issei. He had returned from the clearing for the French forest, after leaving his grandmother's. His tear streak was now dried up, and he took in the forced air. He was pleased with the time he spent with his grandmother, and his progress. Another perk for him was visiting, was that he got his phone charged again, and his grandmother had given him a, him a mobile charge, er, as well, so he could listen into his tunes again. However, his grandmother was right. He was hiding something back from her, because when he put him on a SIM card back on her phone, he saw he had text from the Hyoto dated a few weeks ago, back to when he last saw them. He figured they were insults, so he did not care about what they had to say. He was surprised they hadn't cut off his cell yet, but he guessed they were too busy splurging his money. He saw the other text and voicemails from Sona, Sarah, False, Sir Zex, and Grafia, but he guessed they stopped reaching him, probably figured that his cell had died. This was noted in one of my texts of they wished him well on his training. He was surprised to see a message from Ross Visa, but he didn't want to open it. He let her know that he had seen it. He wasn't 
he didn't want to open it, and he let her know that he had seen it. He wasn't ready to face her yet. He also wasn't ready to face Irina, who had sent him his most recent text and voicemail, and he could see that she said she was sorry, something he frowned at, since it was their text that he didn't want to speak to his grandmother about. It just wasn't time for that confrontation yet. You may be sorry, and I may not hate you, but it doesn't mean I forgive you. But it looks like the two of them finally figured things out. Of course, he did not know that Ravel was taken by her family and Riser had not reached out to him yet about the matter, Issei thought to himself. Issei did some stretches and just let out a deep sigh, but then thought back to his potential insults that the Hyoto sent him and now this time spent with his grandma helped him. Hmm, I think I got a song for that, but first, he took a phone kit out that he had packed with him, and then removed the SIM card from the now. They can't disturb me. I feel like I should have updated Nissan on how I'm doing. I'm sure Sarah Chanonoka-san can do that. It was great to talk to Nissan. When I did talk to Oka-san and Oto-san again, seems they're doing fine and supportive of the name change. He went to sit down by a tree and clearing and then began to scroll through his playlist, which luckily, he did not save his music to his SIM card, otherwise, he would have to copy them to the phone and then remove it. Now then, let's see, ah, here it is, he put his headphones on which were also charged and hit play to the song that he selected, and it, the song is called Sits and Soldier, Thank You for Hating Me. Thank you for hating me, he said, oh, 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 thank you for hating me. I'm going to read this whole entire song, because this actually means something to me. I used to lose so much sleep over what you stole from me, but now the table's turned. I'm the lion, you're the sheep. You turned my vulnerability on me like a weapon. But taking knives in the back really taught me a lesson. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for beating me down, for messing me up, for making me feel like I'm not enough, for running your mouth, for showing no love, for setting me off like a loaded gun. Thank you for making me stronger than I thought I could ever be. Thank you for hating me. Uh, uh, oh. Thank you for hating me. Issa was patting on the ground in rhythm and music as he continued with the song. Now we're on verse 2. I know you're criticized to hide yourself how much you hate yourself. So there's here's some money, my friend. Go get some help. I feel so sorry for you. Because you're always going to be alone. The world will know my name, not yours. You're my stepping stone. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. I'm moving on. I'm on the mend, because living well is the best revenge. Forever changed, I'm born again, because living well is the best revenge. He leaned back against the trees, the song softened, thank you for hating me. Thank you for, the chorus goes, thank you for hating me. He felt at ease with a smile on his face. He felt the song speak to him, from the Hyoto to the girls to former friends. He could move past their betrayal and now focus on himself. As the song said, he was the mend. He has been training, but also healing himself. Himself. He was excited for the adventure ahead, putting those that hurt him behind. No more feeling sorry for himself. No more hatred. Just indifferent and at peace with himself. An interesting choice of words, Ozai says. Ozai, forgot you were there, Issei said. I'd figured. But hold up your hand and conjure up a flame, Ozai said. Okay, Issei replied, doing as what he was told, his eyes wide in shock. You realized it. It's much easier to conjure up a flame. You have strong will. You did not give in to your hate. Your grandmother was a good influence on you. Now let's get up and try a few moves, Ozai says. Issei got up from the tree and set his backpack phone and headphones down and walked to the center of the clearing. He took several deep breaths before letting out a few punches, kicks, and spinning a roundhouse kick at the end, developing... Developing a combo of moves, every move he threw, the corresponding limb would sigh at a blaze. It was a feeling natural, not forced. However, the flames were regular. They were as, as powerful as the flames of desolation that he produced. When he completed his dragon ability test, whoa, his strength fed better and his flames kept it well. Much better than when he first started firebending training, Issei said, congratulations. You're no longer only human. Your dragon body has begun to respond to your unflinching will to get stronger. You're 85% human and 15% dragon, Ozai says. 15%? How's my magic core? He knew supernatural beings had better magic cores than humans, as he did tire out using elemental slashes with the Rondite, which did help build up his magic core while being human. 
It has grown exponentially, but not significantly. I will tell you back at your grandmother's when you punched her wall. Your dragon body reacted. It's why you did not feel the flames because dragons are resistant to flames weaker than theirs. The anger brought out 5%, but now you have to let go. It has tripled to 15% that I mentioned. See what I mean by how you could go farther without the hatred, Ozai says. Uh, no, scratching his head nervously as Ozai sigh in his mind. <sighs> if you carried on with that hatred, you would have nothing but forcing the flames out and you would continue to do so and eventually your flames would consume you. You may get stronger through the hatred, but you would expending yourself in the process, Ozai says. I see, Issei replied. I suggest you head back to the cave. I looked through your memories, those gloves you've, that you found. I think they will be useful to you in conjunction to those draconic daggers that you have there, Ozai says. Issei remembered those crimson red gloves, but Drake said he wasn't. Ready to know, Drake is not here. If Ozai believed they could help him, then he would take the advice. Okay, he's going to turn and grab the backpack, but then he saw something. It was the same thing that he saw when he was leaving. They were footprints. However, this time, he could tell that this one was at least female, and there was another that was male. As he investigated, the female's footprint looked older than the male's, so he could believe that they were not traveling together, but it did seem like the male's footprints were looking for something that had gone in the area multiple times. Or there could be multiple people, he pondered to himself. Hmm, I am detecting demonic energy around as holy energy, Arondite said. Nice hearing from you, Arondite. Give me a minute. As he went to the backpack, finding a hollow space at the trunk of the tree, Issei lit a fireball to make sure it was safe inside before suffering the backpack to hide it. He headed back to where he found all the footprints, and he decided that he should go find a female at least. The female at least. Sensing that no one was around him, He headed off in the direction, which led him further away from the cave. He was making sure that his footprints didn't get involved, as Saul sometimes he saw male footprints appear every now and then. It seems like whoever the male is, he's following the female. Perhaps he's looking for her, but that doesn't explain the demonic and holy signature that Arondite is feeling, as he continued to follow the trail of footprints. Suddenly, the female's footprints began to fade, and he began rushing water until the footprints disappeared as he reached a cliff, with a runner ribbing down. Below, the male's footprints diverged off to the side, going along the cliffside. Did she jump, Issei said? He looked down the cliff. He also looked across the cliff where, the, where there was another cliff. And on it was the water droplets going further in in the grass. He could fairly see what looked like what could have been a footprint. Or did she get across, Issei said. Hearing the water, it was a bit loud, but not too loud as he heard a shuffle behind him. There's demonic activity around here, Arondite said. Yeah. Also something behind me moving closer. I'd say about ten seconds. Your sensing ability has improved. Guess it's health being in the forest. Just then your oasis, Arondite said. Yeah. Here it goes. As he waited a few seconds before he set aside the corner of his eye, he saw a blade of light. A light sword. What's an exorcist doing here? As he spun around, he was proven right. As he saw the exorcist outfit that is a silent war. The mist strike caused the exorcist to stumble and nearly went over the cliff. However, Issei grabbed the back of his outfit with his left hand, holding him over the cliff. Who are you? Issei says. What's it to you? The exorcist replied. Fine then. Why are you here? Issei replied. What's it look like? Hunting demons. After all, I am an exorcist. The exorcist said. Yeah, I can see that. Or maybe you didn't get the memo, but you're allied with demon and fallen angels. Issei said. Ha. Huh. As if we care about the fickle alliance. The exorcist said. We? So, there are more of you out here. Issei said. The exorcist cursed himself for ratting out his other teammates. You, the exorcist says, that's not proper language from an exorcist. The church might wash your mouth with soap, Issei said. I don't give a about what the church says. We are told to hunt demons, and that's what I'm doing, the exorcist says. How many are of you out here? Issei replies, I ain't telling you, exorcist says. Very well. As he tightened the grip of his left hand, which the collar of the exorcist began to choke him. Then you can die, Issei says. Oh, it's me, it's me. Two more, two more, the exorcist says. Are you sure? Stacking his grip to a bit to let the exorcist say, yes, yes, fearing that Issei was going to let him fall. Good. As he stepped forward and took the light sword and the gun from the exorcist before stepping back again. Hey, I need those to hunt the demon, the exorcist says. Not anymore, you do. You're a rogue exorcist with your buddies out here trying to break the alliance, Issei said. And who are you? You're just human just like us. You could join us in hunting the demon, Exorcist said. Any of your buddies nearby? No, they took another way to hunt the demon. We think it jumped the ravine. I see, a Rondite, as the black spade appeared. Wait, you can use magic? You can help us. You're not with, you're not with the demon, right? Or are you a demon lover? And the Exorcist said, sneering at the end. 
you could say that, Issei replied. Wait! The exorcist says, looking at the corner of his eye to see the black blade. How did you get that sword? Don't worry about it, Issei said. His tone was neutral, but it was the last time you will see it. W w he couldn't say much as Issei took a ronde and stabbed the exorcist from behind as the blade went through his back and out of his chest. Blood dripped from the exorcist's mouth as he looked down to see the blade protruding hit from his torso. He gasped as Issei pulled the blade out. Hearing the blade rip through the flesh the second time, the blood began pulling at his feet, dripping off the cliffside. He raised his hands in shock to gasp and gash on his torso. He stated turns towards Issei. Issei simply pulled the dying exorcist to him and whispered in his ear, Goodbye, and took a rondite and slashed it across the exorcist's throat. <sniffs> choking on his blood, gurgling, but he could not pass his blood spilling out of his throat. Issei let go and nudged the exorcist forward, letting him fall down into the running water below. He watched the body fall, and tilted the water with a splash and surrounding the water turned red. However, the red got swept away, and by rushing water, he used a water spell to clean a rondite and sealed the blade back up. It's been quite some time since blood has been felt on this blade. You have gotten more comfortable with killing, Arondite said. I gotta do what I gotta do now. Not everyone can be my friend. Learn that the hard way, remember? Before he searched into his mind for Ozai, Ozai Sensei. Do you think I can use my flames as thrusters? Sensei, huh? Well, yes. You can. I guess a situation like this could help. But I don't think you're ready to utilize your flames that way. Ozai said... Issei said, only one way to find out, as he walked back to get a good distance from the cliff. He looked at his head and took a deep breath, and also took a good look at his hands, and got into running stance. Wait, please don't tell me you're about to do what you're about to do, Ozai said. I won't, with a smile, then took off running towards the cliff. Here we go! As he began to jump, he fired twin streams from his hands to boost his jump height and propel himself forward. He flew through the air, holding his arms out. He felt like he would not make it. Seeing the other side, he began to come up, and distance wasn't enough. He positioned his arms, pointing behind him, and fired off another set of flames, boosting himself forward. Unfortunately, the angle was that his arms were at, caused him to propel downward as well. Oof, Issei said as his torso crashed into the cliffside. He hung out on the edge. Oh, wow, groaning in pain, but still clinging to the edge. Definitely need to train on how you fly with your flames, at least until you get your wings back, Ozai said. That'd be a good idea. Winching as he began to pull himself up from the cliff, taking deep breaths and trying not to aggravate his chest pain. Thank goodness I'm wearing gloves, and with good traction, dragging himself over the edge, laid there on his back, slowly beating and getting used to the, pa chain in the, pa the pain in his chest. Your physical training has helped you, Arondite said. You're still as reckless as before, Ozai replied. Don't try a stunt like that again. It'd be more tactical next time. Right, tactical. I'll do that. If what that bastard said is true, I got at least two more of those bastards out here. Can't let them know about the cave. Can't let them rogue exorcists out here, Issei said. He continued to lay there for a few more moments. He felt glad that he left in the afternoon in Japan. It was morning here in France. This way he had more daylight before it reached dark. That meant before time to hunt down other exorcists in the forest. All right. Chest feels a little better, Issei says, wincing as he took some breaths. He got up from the ground and walked in the spot in the grass that he saw when he was on the other side. Looks like she got across, seeing the lady footprint that he had seen earlier. He continued to trek into the forest following the lady's footprints, but kept himself hidden. He did not know where the other two exorcists could be, and he didn't want to take the chance of them following him. Though it was possible that they may find their colleague's blood on the cliffside, he noticed that he was now heading downhill. Damn, I'm losing track of her footprints. Let's see, the exorcist said that the demon was she. So, this lady could be that demon, but it's maybe a stray, and I killed an innocent exorcist, but I doubt that. After all, he said he didn't care about the alliance, and he had some colorful language. Maybe he started using her demon wings, probably how she got over the ravine that's behind me, he said. He continued to trek further into the forest, and away from the cave. The only good thing is that the cave cannot be found, unless he is present, since it only recognized the Sekiyuri's presence, and despite the boosted gear, still waiting to be unlocked, regardless, it still recognized him as the Red Dragon Emperor, as long as the sacred gear was still within him. He didn't know where to go from here. If he had a dragon body and a width of a woman's scent, maybe he could find her. Okay, let's not get frustrated, Issei says. She's been on the run for more than a week. If I saw her footprints before I left Obai's place, 
She could have been out there a little longer. I may have placed shelter around here if I find that maybe I can find her, Issei says. With that information, Issei started to look around the caves of the area, but he still kept his distance. He didn't want to disturb the animals that were around, at least not to tip off the other exorcists that could be around. He found some small caves, but only found rabbits. He checked some bigger caves, but noticed that were there for some deer. He remembered his first kill in the forest, which would have been a maybe a few weeks ago. To him, it felt like it because of the time in the oasis. Once again, nothing disappointed his feelings as it was. And no sign of the exorcist either, Ozai said. Yeah, I think there are a couple of caves north of here. I'll go check out those. And probably reached high noon by now. Feels like I've been here for hours, Issei said. I suppose you'll finish your searching then, Ozai replied. Kinda have to. We need to know what possible danger I'm in, Issei says. Very well, Ozai replied. With that... Issei headed north, and he was right about there being some other caves up here. He did not know if there was any other animals like bears or wolves that lived here, but the coast seemed clear, or at least he thought so. In the first cave, until he heard a soft growl, it was a bear it seemed like it was going hunting of its own, so Issei didn't disturb it headed to the next cave, which was further north, and it was there he found something. At first, he could hear mumbling, so he stuck to the shadows of the trees with the sun out. He wanted to make sure he blended in. The mumbling turned out to be a voice. It was the voice. It was a male voice from a sight. Figure. Also, the exorcist wearing clothing. Damn it, Lucas. Answer your phone, the exorcist one says. Lucas, probably the name of the guy I killed. And I guess they don't have any magic capabilities, and I st stashed his this Lucas stuff near his cliffside that I killed him on. I also don't think he'll get reception out there, Issei says. Well, Issei listened to the guy on the rant about Lucas, but he didn't care, until he heard something like to the right of the guy. Out of the foley came another exorcist who seemed to have a smirk on his face. Any luck on Lucas, exorcist one says. Better. Found the bitch down the river. We could have fun there before we kill her, exorcist two said. Nice. Lucas is going to miss out. Yeah, girl's got a figure, looking at his lips. Well, let's not leave her waiting, exorcist one says, rubbing his crotch in anticipation. Ugh. Issa, oh, bye, that's convenient. Issa was disgusted. He hasn't been disgusted with an exorcist since he met Freed. So, this is where she's staying, Exorcist 2 says. Looks like it. Found a bag of clothes. Guess you survived off some berries or some shit, Exorcist 1 says. Ha, huh. let me see that bag. She got me hard just thinking about what we're going to do to her. Relax. She'll get what's coming to her in due time. Wanna go check her out? I'll wait here for ya. Then we can ambush her when she gets back. No one's going to miss her. Yeah, no family, no one to claim her. She won't be missed. When she's dead, and I don't think the Underworld knows she exists, and not sure as she is astray. But it took a while for us to track her in these forests. We got lucky that it's just her out here in as well. No one will hear her screams, Exorcist 2 says. Looks like Lucas was telling the truth. It's only two others. I'm going to head out and try to find Lucas. Maybe check out by a river, Exorcist 1 says. Nice. I'm going to relax here. Don't be mad if I get first dibs on her body if she returns before, Exorcist 2 says. The first Exorcist simply laughed to set off. Missing colleague. Now, it just left Issei with a choice. So what... So who will you go after, Rondite says, the first guy. Well, I could have killed the second guy, he's going to remain stationary. But I could lose sight of the first guy and run into him in the forest. I just need to kill him before the demon comes back and gets ambushed by the other one. Alright, plan accordingly, Rondite says. Issei nodded after the first exit. It seems that they were heading towards the river. He kept his distance and watched his footing, so he didn't step on anything that would alert the exorcist that he was being tailed. Finally... The exorcist stopped at the edge and looked at something below. Damn, she's a beauty, exorcist one said. Issei moved to get a better vantage point of what the exorcist was seeing, and his eyes widened. As the exorcist was right about something, the demon was a beauty. She had a lilac purple hair with orange eyes and wearing a white dress. She had a familiar type of dress worn by the noble devils. It showed quite a good amount of her large breast, and Issei blushed in high slits in long white sleeves underneath the dress. She wore a black mini skirt, and from what he could see, she was standing and waiting over the river before barefoot, causing the bottom of her dress to be wet. Looking to the shore, he saw low-heeled boots that went up to her mid-thighs as he estimated. Her control over the water is amazing, Ozai said, seeing things through Issei's eyes. It took Issei out of his thoughts, and to that what he was looking, what she was doing, she saw how they waved her hand, and the water confirmed her emotions effortlessly. What we thought were water tentacles were actually a 
like snakes. They moved with her hands. Ozai was right. Her control with water was amazing. Maybe she could help him control his fire. Although it may be difficult as they were opposing elements, he would like to know her magic control. It would definitely help him with his own. Having someone train you with physically will be beneficial. I wonder what else she knows. She seems to be an exceptional waterbender, Ozai says. Waterbending? Issei replies. Yes, she possibly could heal you. I notice how you haven't used those things you call phoenix tears, and have been trying to heal naturally to strengthen your body as a human. It's possible that she could infuse her power into those tears, capable of healing you, Ozai says. Why do you think she could only be a healer? Issei replied. Does she look like a fighter to you, Ozai said, considering that she has been run from the scum? I guess not. And speaking of scum, he turned his attention back to the exorcist who locked closer to the demon. Guess he can't guess he can't help himself, as he took the knife from his waist and quickly began to move after the exorcist. When he got close, he stilled his breath, held the knife in the underhand grip, he began to breathe softly, calming his breath, and snuck up on the exorcist. Can't wait to be between those legs, there's someone checking her out. When Issei got close, he reached out with his left hand and pulled the exorcist towards him. His hand was covering his mouth. Muffing his hand screams, and Issei proceeded to stab the exorcist multiple times in the torso as the exorcist screamed into his hand. The exorcist was flailing, trying to escape Issei's grip, and as each stab was killing him, finally Issei got fed up with the screaming and twisted the exorcist's neck, killing him, and let the body drop to the ground. Issei was breathing heavily as he held the flailing exorcist with one arm while stabbing him. It took a lot of effort, but he took out another rogue exorcist. When he looked up, he was shocked. The demon girl was looking at him in shock and fear as he slowly began to back away from the river. Issei then looked down and could see why she was afraid. His cream-colored shirt was covered in streaks of blood, both of the exorcists that he killed. He could only slump his shoulders and could see why it was looked, so he figured he needed to calm her. I'm sorry. I know this looks bad, but I'm here to help. Issei holds his hands up. The demon's eyes looked at him, and then at the dead body at his feet, and then slightly upwards. Issei followed her eyes to see that she was looking at the knife in his hand. Once again, I'm sorry. I'll put it away, Issei says, as he slowly kneeled down, cleaning the blade on the grass and sheathing blade away from his wave. I, uh, saw your trail of footprints, and on the other side of the ravine, and he didn't get to finish, as he saw the fear and panic in her eyes as she widened. She quickly began to move her hands. A magic circle formed this time. A water began to form into a giant snake at first glance. But then Issei looked closer and realized that the former a water dragon had won so quickly. However, his mind thought back to magic circle that she performed. That insignia. I think I've seen it before somewhere, but from where, Issei says. His mind focused on the insignia that the magic circle she had created, hoping it to give him some insight on what clan she belonged to. Amazing! Imagine what you could do with your fire! Clearly impressed by the demon's skill and magic, Ozai was. Now's not the time to be amazed, Issei said as he held out his hand. Arondite! He summoned the black blade and channeled a little lightning magic into the blade, causing it to crackle with electricity. Seeing this action caused the girl to send the water dragon at Issei, who sent a slash that made out of electricity at the dragon. The electric splash split the dragon in half, but still splashed Issei with water, and the slash made the girl fall backwards in the water, missing her but crashing her into a sword opposite of Issei. She laid there in bewilderment and cowered in fear, trying to scramble to flee, too scared to turn her back to on Issei. Wait, Issei says, quickly running into the small river, catching her up to her and holding out his hand and stopping her attempts of fleeing. I'm sorry I startled you, but I don't mean to hurt you. I was trying to stop that guy from hurting you and his partner too. The girl looked between Issei's face and his outstretched hands, not sure what move to make. I know we got off on the wrong foot, but I don't want to hurt you and I have no intentions of hurting you. When I meant by tracking you down, I was curious if who else was in the forest with me. I didn't mean any harm. Until one of those guys attacked me on the other side and in the ring. Yes, I killed him too. He was a bad person, so that was the guy over there. Pointing at where the dead body was, they have another guy who found her cave. Her eyes widened at the information that she was given. Now she looked worried. Issa could not help compare her to Azia and having that feeling of needing to protect this girl. Of course, he grimaced at the thought of Azia, remembering how she talked about his former friend, Genshiro Sanji. His grimace did not go unnoticed as the girl moved a few paces away from Issei, thinking that it was a lie about him not hurting her. Oh no, it's not you. You just reminded me of someone I thought I could trust who said they loved me and they betrayed me. His hand slowly falling to his side. I didn't mean to alarm. I just wanted to see if you were safe. That's why I tracked you down. That's all. They then heard a yell somewhere from the distance, but Issei recognized the voice. It was the second extraness. Josiah! Josiah! What was that? 
Issei immediately turned to the girl with urgency. We need to find somewhere to hide. He already knows that you're here. If that's okay with you, we can get your stuff and I can take care of him. Can you stand? The girl numbly nodded. Still looking at the information and was surprised that Issei pulled her up, stabilizing her body against her own and had it on her chest and her chest pressed against his torso. Okay, let's get your boots and hide. He's going to find the body then think you killed him, so stay hidden and I will handle him, okay? No one's going to hurt you, holding her shoulders and making her look into his eyes. She simply nodded. Hey, Josiah, you didn't make that run off again, did you? The yell was a bit closer now. Come on, grab your stuff. We'll hide under the bridge line. As they ran out of the water, she quickly put on her boots and moved her hiding spot that Issei directed them to. They steadied their breasts with the ex still yelling at his partner. Come on, Josiah, knock it off. I mean, bitch isn't here anymore. They listened to running his steps as they knew he was around the spot where they could see down the river. They listened as his footsteps got louder and closer as he reached the riverbank. He looked around but not to see them. However, she felt the power around the place and Issei then realized he did not steal a rendezvous back up. Stay here, whispering to the girls. He slowly moved away to the hiding spot. What the f*** happened here? Josiah, the b she's probably on her way back to the cave. I could have had her, but you pulled this... Sh he was furious. He was about to head out on the body of his colleague, but he couldn't tell he was dead. Hey, Josiah, let's go. I feel something around here, that's just who said. He began to move over the corpse when he was not aware that Issa was stalking him. The exorcist reached his body and he saw a pool of blood near him, as well as the water as the water dragon did wash the blood away at first. The body still bled profusely. What the f***? As he knelt on the body, hey, get your... I'm feeling something demonic. Can't believe that she got a drop on you, Exorcist 2 says. As he began, he felt the stab wounds of his colleagues and knew something was up. The hell? Did that have a weapon that we didn't see, Exorcist 2 said? He stood up in confusion. No, but I do, Issei says, watching the Exorcist turn around as he swung a rondite. The Exorcist looked at Issei and took a glance at the weapon that was coming towards him. Issei saw the Exorcist's eyes wide in shock, but also in recognition. Issei did not want to dwell on the Exorcist wanted to speak, but it was too late. <laughs> The shock remained on the exorcist's face, as Issei decapitated him and his body fell forward. There was a spurt of blood that came from the neck and head fell and bounced along, rolling to Josiah's body. I guess that takes care of it, Issei said. He tried to feel the presence of the girl, but couldn't now that he realized it. He never felt her presence at all, even when he was watching her earlier. Hello? Issei says. He called out to her as he dragged the headless corpse to the river, and then walked back to drag Josiah's body as well as take the exorcist's head. He gave a look around and went back to the hiding spot that he left her in, and she was gone. Seems like she went back to her cave. Since the coast was clear, letting out a sigh... He walked back to the river and cleaned off a rot dike before sealing him back inside himself. Pity. I was looking forward to learning from her in my magic control. Dang. With nothing else, he dumped into the bodies into the river and watched as they sailed away. He washed his gloves off his blood as well. He took his knife that he stabbed Josiah with and cleaned it as well. He then skewed the weapon back up and just looked at the took in the environment. It was late in the afternoon, so he figured he would leave the girl and head back to the oasis. I'm sure she would prefer Drake's cave than the cave she is resting in now, and suddenly turned from the riverbank only to be startled by the girl. Whoa! Jumping back, putting his hand to his heart, as they did. The girl looked a bit scared, but also worried she also jumped back from Issei. Whew! Sorry, uh, you startled me. Um, I don't think I introduced myself as the girl shook her head. Well, I'm Issei Hiyo- Damn, the lapse of memory is he faced upon my apologies. It's Issei Yamamoto. Issei holding out his hand and the girl. I'm Ingvold. And, um, thank you, shaking her hand as looking quizzically. Well, nice to meet you, Ingvold. He wasn't going to push her on with her last name, but he was intrigued by her name in general. Ingvold, huh? Must be Nordic. It's a combination of battle, but also a dedication to the god Yngvi. So, maybe she can be a fighter, as I said. Looks that way, Issei replied. Focusing on, you know, um, Ingvold... If you don't mind, would you like to train with me? Also, how are those guys chasing you? Um, it's been a few weeks now. I was hoping they would give up and lose me in the forest, but I guess not. And I'm not sure I can train with you. You know how to fight. I don't. And Will said, then we can train and teach each other. I can teach you how to fight with weapons, and you can tell me my magic, and you can help me with my magic control. How move water is awesome. I'm good with fire, but not as good as you with water. And Will blushed as the first time that she had been complimented on her prowess. Thank you. Um, how long have you been here? And Will says... About a month tops, give or takes. I'm kind of used to striving out here. Really, um, I've never seen you before, Inigal says, though she was interested in learning from Issei on being able to survive out here, just too shy to ask about it. Probably because 
where I stay is protected, so I can train without worry. You can come with me. It kind of sucks being alone, and it would be nice to have someone to talk to, physically at least, as not to offend the beings that are inside of him. I can also teach you how to hunt as well. Really, you do that, Imgold says. It was clear that she, I don't know why I just did a man voice. I am so sorry. Really, you do that, Imigol says. It's clear that she had some trust issues. Of course. You're my first friend out here that we can learn some things from each other if you like. Issei says, thank you, Imigol says, giving a bow. Don't need to do that. Let's get your stuff out from here when you head back to the ravine. It's where my cave and it's evening, so I'll get dark, it'll get dark soon. But at least you'll feel more comfortable, Issei says. Tears in Imigol's eyes welled up and she bowed again muttering thanks as she felt he was being honest with her she also wanted to defend herself like Issei could plus he was giving her a palace at stay it felt like a fantasy to her in no longer being hunted she felt a little at ease her sniffle caught Issei's attention hey are you alright showing concern for her hoping he didn't do anything to make her car I'm fine it's just it's been a while since someone told me that I will be okay and they mean it Ingle says oh well I told you that earlier that I wouldn't hurt you but we can talk more than when we get back to the oasis Issei said and he began to walk in the direction that he remembered where the stuff was. The Oasis, Invigil said, as he followed after him. Yeah, you'll see as we find your stuff that I hid in the tree. You hid in a tree, Invigil said? You'll see what I mean. Right now, your stuff is the priority, man. This is going to be awesome, Issei said. He felt like a kid having someone to share his experiences with. The two off began their adventure together, and from the start of a new bond, Issei was also intrigued to learn about his girl about this girl, in hopes she could train with him with his magic control. With his self-awakening progress, his dragon body coming back, he could not wait. As for Imgold, she hoped that she would not be a burden for Issei and be able to take his lessons in stride, and see where things go. Just you wait, Drake, with a smile on his face, but he didn't expect the voice to respond big. Finally found you, Hatchling, the mystery character says, causing Issei's eye to widen. Great Red? Issei says, It seems things have changed. You've got some explaining to do, Great Red said. I know, but not right now, please, Issei replied. Very well. You and I have much to discuss. You've grown strong, Hatchling. I'm impressed, Great Red says. Shocked to get such praise from the true dragon. Thank you, which he received a low, soft growl before silence. Issei? Imikul said. She stopped walking because Issei stopped because he heard Great Red's voice. Are you okay? Yeah, I just have a feeling that things are going to turn around for me. Smiling at her reassurance and he was okay Invigold blushed again but smiled as well as he nodded she wondered if it had something to do with what he said earlier about being betrayed she just hoped she didn't turn out like the person that he did continued walking so great red is awake huh i hope lilith's son is doing okay smiling at the thought of his little sister believing her to be with great dragon yeah things are definitely looking up for me he said he was excited even more training and looking forward to his hand and Invigold's progress together in coming weeks but there was one hurdle needed to be complete Right, gotta study for finals this week. Meh, I got this, he said, shrugging his shoulders, feeling unfazed about school as he had bigger things to handle. The girls went to school and would receive... Okay, so note, this is the same Monday as seen in the beginning of chapter 21, if anybody was wondering. On the same Monday that the girls went to school and would receive their mission to handle some monsters, Irina Shudo, the resident angel, did not go, as if something told her to stay away. She laid in bed reminiscing about the dream she had been having. She had given her concerns to Gabriel on the girls' trip that they took. They were becoming slightly more vivid. She thought she could envision herself with Kiba, since she did some training with him after the Triaxid incident, but her dream said otherwise, and his attitude towards her had been kind as of late. Had not been kind as of late. In her dreams, Kiba was always walking away from her, but she was happy and she had a family with someone else, someone with brown hair, but she could never see their face. However, now that man was always fading into ash. When she was cuddling him, and you could always ask her why, why did you do it? She could not understand the question, but the voice sounded familiar to her. She would also trace back to Ross Weiss's words, as well as feel guilty before it because she thought back to her childhood. She had talked with Gabriel of her past, but she could never remember the name of the boy in her dreams. She would note that boy from her past was very similar to the man she had a family with in her dreams. Sadly, that world was crumbling around her. She would be holding a baby, but then the baby faded away. The family portrait faded away. Her home with the man faded away. She felt down and felt like it shouldn't be here because something was missing. When the others went to school... 
and she chose to be excused, as if the fell she lost a piece of herself. Seeing no one was in the house, she went to the roof of the shrine she made of, for Orphris, who laid there, feeling weak and despondent, but overall emotionless. She figured that she might as well speak to the lowly, maybe get some insight. Orphis, Sam, are you okay? Irina said, taking a seat next to the dragon lowly. Hmm. Oh, it's the self-proclaiming angel sister, Orphis said. Well, I don't feel like an angel at the moment. What do you mean, Orphis says. Well, have you ever felt that you were missing a piece of yourself? Yes, when Rizavrim stole my power. Why? Orphis said. Oh, well, I haven't had my power stolen, but a piece of my heart. It's like I can't get it back. You could always get your power back, but I don't think I can get the piece of my heart back. Your heart? Tilting her head in confusion. Yes, you see. Many of these dreams of a family, however, the father is not Kiba like I thought it would be. It's someone else. They have brown hair, a little darker than mine, but I've never seen their face. When I talked with Ross Vice, she mentioned that she wouldn't want to be my childhood friend, and I thought my childhood before I used to get bullied and felt alone until this boy stood by my side. We played together and everything that you can imagine as kids, but I couldn't see his face either. But I noticed that he was my man. He is the man in my dreams and had similar hairstyles. So you're dreaming about your future mate, Orphis says? I don't think so. I think I already met him, but I did something that hurt him because in my dream, he would ask me why did I do it. Then, things start fading into ash. The baby that I held, gone. The two kids playing outside, gone. And the husband whose children I mothered, he went too. I'm not sure if it was a good idea that I slept with Kiwika now because a week after that, those dreams started occurring. Hmm... I think I understand. I also wonder why I give myself the volley, because it may be because of power, but I felt something that wasn't right. Each time with volley, I felt myself get weaker and I didn't understand it. It reminded me how the time I've spent with Rizavim made me weaker. Though I did not sleep with Rizavim and he replaced me with Lilith, who I wish I could see again. However, I have this feeling that Baka Red would attack me despite the fact that if he invaded my home. So you feel wrong in sleeping with Volley. As time goes by, yes, I am beginning to feel the influence of his grandfather on him, and I don't know how, and the fear I won't like the answer. Orphus said, I see, you're going to reply, do you feel wrong for sleeping with Kiba? Orphus said, well, as you said, as time goes by, yes, I don't think he's ever had my heart, but I gave him my body, and looking back on it, I don't think I ever had his heart. I thought maybe he felt attracted to something. I told Zenovia, who talked about with the new experiences, she told me to speak with Gabriel about it. After that, we planned to go to a hotel, and now that I think about it, whenever I go back to that day that Zenovia gave me the plan of taking Kibakun and Gasperkun for experience, I feel like there was this presence on the left of me. However, hearing the others speak of their experiences excited me, but now I can see that it was just lust, and if I wasn't for the new feature, I would have fallen an angel. I would be a fallen angel. Now I think that I see why Ross Vice's sensei told me that I didn't deserve my wings, and I think she's right. It must be why you're not your usual self. I would like to say that you shouldn't let her words get to you, but from what you told me, along with my doubts, I fear that she is right too. Yeah, looking down in dismay, Irina did. You still have my blessing, correct? Orphus said, of course, and thank you so much for bestowing it upon me. I think you're going to need it for what's to come. Self-proclaiming, Angel's sister, Orphus said, okay, I'm going to head back down. Do you want anything? Getting up from her spot. Some cookies would be nice, Orphus said. Irina gave a nod and was about to leave until she heard her name called, but not her nickname, but her name. And Irina, I hope your luck is better than mine. And you find that boy again, Orphis says. Uh, thanks, Irina said. She did not know why, but it felt forbidding that Orphis said that. She went and got the cookies that Orphis liked, and went about her day, or at least until the others came back from school. Every time she walked past the main room, where she did it last with Kiba, she shivered, but in disgust with herself, she saw that she wasn't the only one sleeping, as well as she had the bags under Aja and Konako's eyes. Azia could not contact Genshiro. She also noticed that Ravel had not been back yet, so she believed that something must have happened to, in the Phoenix Clan. She thought about calling her parents, but something told her that it would be a bad decision. When the others came back, they talked about a mission with the Hero Faction. Hey, Irina, we got a mission with the Hero Faction. Kyocho gave us a week off to handle it, so get ready, Zenovia said. Oh, um, I don't think I can go with you all. Sorry, still not feeling well. She was grateful that neither Konako nor Kuroka were here to detect the lie once again. Grateful that feature enabled her to lie. 
This was the one lie that surprisingly she felt good about for the others. Although she, she did not lie, she agreed to all the lies that were told to the caretakers of they resided in. Something about them also made her feel uneasy now. Something was missing and it was connected to her. Really? You sure? You look fine to me, Zenobia says. Irina felt irritated that her friend did not see her discomfort, and she began to wonder if Zenovia even cared about what she felt. She always looked up to Zenovia, but everything that has been happening around her, she felt that was a mistake. Since Zenovia listened to Rias, well, I'm not, so you'll have to do it without me, Irina said, speaking thoroughly gritted teeth. Fine, whatever. Guess I'll spend more time with Kibukun, Zenovia said, trying to coax Irina. Yeah, sure. Good luck with that, Irina said. She preferred the man in her over... She preferred the man in her dreams over Kiba, but it was a dreaded feeling that the man didn't prefer her, and it had something to do with her actions, Irina said. Really, I thought you would be jealous. Oh well, more of me heading out of your more for me heading out of your room, Zenovia did. Irina just laid in her bed. She already knew the only way that Kiba was to bother to give Zenovia attention is if Rias told him to. She never understood how Rias had that much power or much pull over him. She just assumed that it was because she was his mistress, unaware of the threat that had been given. She heard her door open again, looking to find Azia peeking in. Um, Zenovia said, you said you weren't feeling well, so we thought I could heal you and you could come with us, Azia said. Even if I was healed, I still wouldn't go with you, Azia. Something is just telling me that... It's not the right thing. Maybe because I could be needed by Michael Sama, Irina said. Oh, Azia replied. And besides, I don't think you can heal this feeling, Azia. I'm sorry. The tone in which she said was sorry, but for not for being confident in Azia's ability, but more of a sorry as of saying goodbye. I see. Well, give beer to Irina, son. We'll see you back when we get that caused Irina's chest to ache as Azia closed the door. I get the feeling that I don't think you will, Irina said as a tear rolled down her eye. She was going to doze off until she heard a knock on the door, called for them to enter when the door opened she was wishing she hadn't. We wanted to check before you left. Feeling any better, Rhea said? Irina's eyes just widened in shock, and she felt her heart racing as she looked at the devil herself, and the words, go away, repeated themselves in her head. Ah... Akina said, she seems to be in shock to see us, letting out a little giggle. Irina gulped nervously at the sight of her fallen counterpart. While well, Akino seemed to be smiling kindly, Irina's eyes glanced at Akino's reflection in the mirror and saw something different. She saw Akino's body, but her hair was down, not in a ponytail, and her kind smile was a smirk of arrogance and looking right at her, which scared her because Akino's eyes were closed. So why was her reflection's eyes opened? It caused Irina to gasp and shuffle backwards in her head. It's okay, it's just us, Irina. Irina, it's okay, it's just Akino and I, Replia says, uh, yeah, I just need some rest, Irina said, okay, well, take care of yourself and don't ever do it, Kuroka and Lefei went back to the Pentadragon Manor and the Hyodo are on vacation, Rhea said, Hyodo, that name again, but something is missing from it, Irina said, she looked at Rhea and nodded, when Rhea tried to come closer, Irina shook her head and relaxed a little more in her bed, okay, we'll be leaving now, get well, Irina, Rhea said, don't get too jealous if Kiba's son spends more time with Zenovia, John, Akino said. Irina simply nodded as the two began to leave the room. Irina looked in the mirror and saw the different women, but the smirk became sneer. Yeah, good luck. Before turning back in bed, it's the two left the room and Irina to her thoughts. The next day, Irina had woken up. She felt conflicted considering she had dinner alone. She did bring some dinner up to Orphis, who went to her own bedroom from the shine of her room. Other than her, it was just felt like an empty in the place. She also didn't like the feeling fixing her hair into the traditional twin towels and looked settled for the simple ponytail. Part of it over her left shoulder, she did not make a note but cut it down a bit. Another day, she mumbled as she prepared to leave the school, enjoying a quiet walk to school. No Azia, no Zenovia. It felt peaceful not to be in the presence of devils. She entered her classroom and was surprised to see Ross Faisa enter the beginning session. She remembered she hadn't seen much of Ross Faisa in the mansion. She also heard some mumble from Kadase, Moriyama, and Akia. The preferred girl was looking quizzically at her and came up to her. Where are the others? First, you weren't here yesterday, and then you're not here today? What's that about? Akia says. I don't know. Yesterday, I just felt sick and not feeling well. Things just didn't feel right. As if the others, they said something about Kyocho giving them off the week off. We're weakly shrugging her shoulders. 
Akia stared for a bit, as if looking for a lie in what she said. Seeing what she needed to see, Akia gave Irina a nod. Well, I hope you're feeling well. She noticed Irina staring at an empty seat that was next to the window. It made Akia wonder if Irina knew what was happening to the person that sat there. Whether she does or not, she will know in a few moments. Akia took her seat, which was near Irina, so she could gauge her reaction to Ross Vice's begin to start class. While Ross Vice was doing roll call, the intercon came alive and they could hear Sona's voice. Good morning, students of Co Academy. I'd like to speak with you about an incident that took place in Classroom 2B a few weeks ago, Sona said. Ross Faisal was confused, but skeptical as she tried to figure out what happened in her classroom. While she was away, Irina also looked around, confused as well, so she whispered to Akia, Akia, do you know what happened? Irina said, kind of. Some people got beaten up. She remembered as the day as she accused Issei that day because the evidence was stacked against him when they stood by his side of the real culprit. <laughs> To inform you all of what happened, some students decided to play a hand as plank on a student, all because he did asked them to change their ways so they would not get hurt like he did, Sona says. Irina saw some of her male classmates nod solemnly, and she wondered how hurt the student was, and her eyes wandered back into the empty seat next to the window. You see, the students who pulled the prank were Matsuda Hiroki, Motohama Akito, and Genjiro Sanji, with the assistance from Maki Suzaki, Sona says. Irina's eyes widened as she wondered why Sanji do that for the first two names. Something clicked in her mind. She knew those names. Looking back at the empty seat, she noticed the two empty seats in front of it, but she only cared about the empty seat by the window. Ross Vice's eyes widened as she knew those names were involved with Issei, but noticed that Issei wasn't a culprit. As she worked that Sona had begin, and she began to dread and hope that she was wrong. These three conspired against one student, because this student told Matsuda and Motohama to quit being perverts, to stop all perverted activities or they would end up like him, broken. Matsuda and Motohama did not like the re recruited Genshiro to help them, which I will inform you now, due to his action, Genshiro Sandra has been removed from the student council, as we do not condone this behavior. In addition, Genshiro was having an affair with Suzaki-san, despite being in a relationship with the fellow student council member, Hanaki-san. Irina did not know this, as she knew he was sleeping with Azia in Ravel, primarily because she had seen him do it with most of the girls in that room. While she settled for Kiba and sometimes Gasper, she remembered now how they were not into his volley and Genshiro, who were trying to make the point with their thrust. She's glad that she didn't sleep with either of them. She didn't like the way he looked at the girls. It was a deprived look that it displeased her. Not only was he having an affair with Suzaki-san, but also Azia Argento and Ravel Phoenix, Sona says. Oh no, Irina said as her heart sank as she listened to the story that Sona continued to tell. So they know, but how? Was it Issei, Ross Vices said. She always had the feelings that the others knew, especially Issei. As you may know, as you may or may not know, those two were in a relationship with Issei Hyodo, Sona says. Irina's eyes widened and unknowing her tears began to fall as Ross Vices frowned as the class began to murmur amongst themselves. Speaking of Issei, he was also in a relationship with Rias Grimmery, and before you claim that he was a two-timing your own Isama, he wasn't, as she cheated on him and it was a proglamorous relationship with her and the rest of her club members. Before you think Rias did a great job of two-timing the pervert, I'd hate to tell you that Genshiro was worse than Issei at this school, as I found out that he used school cameras to peep. I feel that I have let you down as president for being such a monster into the school. And before I forget, the victim of the prank was Issei Hiyoto. It's quite a shock, isn't it? The perverted beast is the one telling the other perverts to stop being perverted. If you don't believe me, here is the audio to prove it. A tape was heard, rewinding. Then the school could hear Issei's voice, and more tears fell down Issei's uh, ear in his face. Guys... You and I have been friends for a long time. That's why I ask as your friend. I ask you to leave those professions behind. They won't help you at all, Issei says. After saying that, everything was silent for a few minutes. So that, Matsuda and Motohama, What did you say, pussy? 
You are not the one to talk. Very annoyed about what Issei, or rather that perverted beast, told him. Stop paying for perverted. How stupid is that? Matsuda said, yeah, he's right. Motohama replied, guys, I'm not saying it with bad intention. It's to help. He couldn't finish because Matsuda interrupted him. Still annoyed. Oh yeah, sure. Help. But for you, it worked to be a pervert, Matsuda said. Exactly. You have the top two Oni summons of the school, the mascot of the school, and more. You have the audacity to say, leave those perversions behind? That's fucking bullshit. He then grabs Issei by the shirt. You bastard. You... Do you know how much envy I have for you, Motohama said. Matsuda with a smile. If you're going to tell us leave our perversion so you can take all the women, then you can drop the charade. That's not true, Motohama. Please let go, grabbing Motohama's hand so that Motohama would let go of his shirt. They don't understand being a pervert. Won't get you a girlfriend, and that reputation will harm you in the future. I'm speaking from experience, remembering not only their reputation, but the deceit of the girls that claim to love him. Yes. Sure. What happens to your perversion? Matsuda said things happened. Only to be interrupted by my own. Yeah, things. Surely he did things with the girls. That must be it now. Looking at Matsuda, let's leave this friend and go and see the girls. Matsuda Mohama beginning to leave until Issei with concern. Guys, for everything that we've been through, think about it. Not caring what they wanted to do with the girls as they weren't his anyway. Not anymore. Sure, we'll think about it. Getting out of the classroom, Motohama leaving Issei alone in the classroom. There was a click indicating that the tape ended. You see, he was aware that he had been cheated on and didn't want to do the same thing to happen to his so-called friends. And what they did to do instead, recruit someone that betrayed Issei's trust and took the girl's underwear and planted it in Issei's suitcase to frame him for a crime that he didn't commit. Of course, it was here that Genshiro revealed to have sleeping... <coughs> with Issei's girlfriends. It wouldn't surprise me if they slept with the two perverts as well. You heard what they say. They went to go see his girls. Guess the oni Samas are just two-timing easy lays. They're not who you thought them to be. You worship the ground they walk on, but tell me, what would you do in Hyoto's shoes? If you had any balls, I think you'd go to Hyoto's approach, considering the damage that some of you idiots did to him. I'm amazed that he was able to send all those that pranked him to the infirmary. I'm sure all of you in the class 2B saw the damage that he could do. <clears throat> Dang, bro. Sorry. Those that witnessed the beatdown shivered in fear. Even Akia, as she had accused him, they had seen Issei become merciless. Those were supposed to be his friends, and they did that to him for trying to not get them to change their ways. Think about it. Issei hadn't been involved in anything perverted before that incident. It made people murmur about his change. Some people believed that he was trying to be a good man for his Onisamas, but based on their actions, it seemed that they were just looking for a good lay. It slowly started to show disdain for the Onisamas. While some were beginning to give Issei respect, Irina sat there. She felt herself not being able to breathe. She looked at the empty seat again. Ross Faisa gave her a glance and kept her frown. Now after this incident, we were able to learn a little bit more of the infidelity against Issei. Let's have a listen, Sona says. The sounds of the tape being rewinded was heard as Akia, Moriyama, and Kadase stiffed as they knew what was coming next. Roz Faisa took a seat at her desk as she felt this whole moment of truth. Irina just felt frozen in place, and her mind was telling her no repeatedly. <clears throat> Issei starts. I discovered three days ago that I have a disease that is killing me. This impacted all who were listening. This disease makes me spit blood, feel weak, and every day I get closer to my death, Issei says, looking at the sky. What? Moriyama says, but remembered that she told that Issei had spit blood in the classroom. That's why you look like it others. It makes sense. <clears throat> the classroom school did not recognize the voices of Kadase and Moriyama as Sona had disguised them for questions to be heard, but in a different voice. It made Kadase and Moriyama give slights of a relief, as attention might have been on them. Yes, but the other thing you ask is a bit complicated, Issei says, closing his eyes. And what would it be, Kadase says, still confused. I had a relationship with the girls of the ORC, and the girls as well. This shocked both the Kendo girls, but not only did we have a relationship, but we lived together and we were committed to marriage, his tone becoming cold. That shocked a lot of people that he was committed to being married to them as for Irina, the husband that she had been envisioning, the boy she had been envisioning in her dreams. She was now seeing Issei's face, the man she was supposed to be with. It was him. It was him all along. 
Those rumors were true, Kadase said, only to see Issei nod his head. But why aren't you together? That's what I'm getting to. A few days ago, they ignored me. They did not pay attention to me. Some greeted me, but that was it. Before, they slept in the same bed as me, but that ended as they discarded me as if I was nothing to them, his tone changing from emotionless to one of fury. Uh, what happened? Why did they discard you, Moriyama says, feeling sorry for Issei. A short period of time, I fell into a coma. It only lasted two weeks, but apparently, that was more than enough for all the feelings what they had for me to die or was replaced. Lowering his head to his hair to cover his eyes, they thought I would die, that I would never wake up. I don't know. All I know is that those two weeks were enough, so they were no longer able to love me. But maybe from the beginning they never loved me at all, or I was just a toy, or they got tired of me or my perversion. But that doesn't matter. They changed me and deceived me, his tone dead, empty, no sadness or anger within it. And who did they change you for? <clears throat> Kadase says, with tears coming out of her eyes. Ah, easy. My so-called friend and rival who I considered a brother. My so-called best friend who I help overcome his past. My other rival who shared my perversion and so-called friend who believed I'd be the younger brother. And the one I once considered to be my second father. His tone growing darker. <laughs> who would have thought? But it's the truth, Issei said. Shocked. The school. All of the people... That Issei felt he could trust, they all stabbed him in the back, while Irina was now murmuring no to herself. Akia continued to watch her and she was confused. She did not know if Irina was saying no as if Issei was supposed to find out, or saying no as she could not think this could happen to Issei. Hey, isn't the pretty boy in ORC the male, cl uh, male classmate said one? You mean Kibakun, female classmate one said. Yeah, I think he is probably was using it to cover to steal girlfriends. Man, I knew he was a bastard, the male said. I agree, but he's been f***ing with them the whole time and trying to sleep with every other girl in the school. Some of you chicks fell for it, classmate 3 said. That's not true. I am happy in a relationship, so he wouldn't affect me, the female 2 said. Yeah, right. I bet if he smiled at you, you'd drop your panties like those Oni's did, giving the laugh at the good portion of the male classmates. Not just in 2B, but in school as similar conversations about Kiba were being heard. Razvaisa couldn't believe it. Now Kiba's reputation was being tarnished for being something that unfortunately was forced into. It made her sad that he would be in for a rude awakening when he returned. Male classmate 3 started. Too bad Kiba wasn't here when Issei whooped those three says he would have gotten smashed too, generating more laughs. Kiba-san had nothing to do with this, Irina standing up. She knew that Kiba didn't need to be blamed for this. <clears throat> oh, Irina's son has her club near the ORC. She would know. She was one of the believers that didn't think that Kiba would do something like that. Sure, Issei may be a pervert, but not even Kiba would do something like that. He was a gentleman, female classmate 3 said. Then explain, male 3 said, but... But before Yuna could say anything, they heard the recording again. And why aren't you at home with your parents, still sobbing from the ordeal that Issei is going through? <laughs> My parents, Issei said, his voice taking over an even darker tone. The kendo duo felt that the answer meant that everything was worse than they thought. My parents were aware that they deceived me. They agreed to it. <laughs> Those parents had the audacity to say that I should be like them. What pathetic bitches and pieces of shit. His voice is dead again. Two, do me a favor and don't call me Hyoto. Thanks, Issei said. Male classmate one said, dang, even his parents? That's cold. Male classmate two started. So how do you know that Kiba had nothing to do with it? Irina decided to take a gamble and lie. Hope that the feature in Heaven's system still works. She figured that this was the least she could do, not as she understands Kiba's behaviors towards her, and her remembers that it was him that asked about Issei because unlike her, he cared. The guys in the the guys that go to the ORC when Issei wasn't around, it wasn't because Kiba nor Gasper. It was some guy with silver hair, like Ross Vice's senseis. Now I think about it, this guy tried to Orius and Akinosama and even me, but Issei saved us and also Genshiro. I have seen around as well. I don't know about Matsuda and Motohama. Maybe that happened when I wasn't around, but Kiba's son nor Gasper was involved in this. 
I knew it. Kiba would never do something like that, heinous, female classmate three said. As her other were texting their friends in other classrooms, of course, they did not reach the ears of the other student council members, which made them ponder. However, I am to blame for not being there for my childhood friend. When I had a chance to help him through his pain, I ignored it and just made it worse, Irina said, slumping down in her seat. Akia's eyes widened at this revelation. Irina admitted her guilt. However, it seemed like it was over people's heads. They assumed that Irina wasn't there for Issei and was unaware of the problem that was happening to him. When she had a chance, she ignored his help. Rasvaisa just looked and sat that's sad at what Irina said. At least her suspicions were confirmed. Issei knew everything from what he saw. She does wish she could explain the full story to him, or maybe the factions did. She wasn't sure, but tears fell from her eyes as the students thought as she felt was heartbroken for her students. Of course, the males didn't want to see their beautiful teacher cry, and some females tried to comfort Irina. They tried because Irina gained strength and walked to Issei's desk and to sat in it, placed her head on it and wept. They could hear the cries of, I'm sorry, and I did this to you. Those that comforted her tried to say that she didn't, but she didn't want to listen to them as they misunderstood the situation, but she didn't have the heart to say anything. Now you see. Sona continues, I have given Issei time to recuperate, or recuperate, and I will proctor his finals due to his emotional and physical stress that he has been through. I don't think he would be comfortable being in the same classroom as some of the some of you who threw things at him and beat him for something he didn't do. So I thank you all about your actions next time. I guess we were all wrong about the perverted beast. However, I will say this. If you choose to make life hard for those that do that, do that to others, then by all means do what you must. And if they ask, why don't you tell them anything? Let them figure that out themselves. Sighing off, letting the school go into a frenzy as teachers try to calm their students. Sona knew how to put some lies into her further damage, Rias, as the others. She was a little perplexed that Irina defended Kiba and Gaspar's honor. Although Issei did not mention names, she figured that they were people smart enough to figure it out. Everyone get back into your seats. I'm sorry, Irina, that includes you too, Ross Vice says. It was silent for a few moments. As Ross Vice had to call Irina to move back to her assigned seat. Irina, please return to your assigned seat, but thanks to her devil hearing, she heard something about being a guardian angel. Irina finally stood up. Her once vibrant eyes looked dead. It made Kanatsu and Murayama softly gasp. They remembered those eyes. They were on Issei's face when they saw him. However, before she could reach her desk, Irina just collapsed. Oh my god, female said. Irina, Rasfaisa said, moving her desk because on Irina's way down, her head hit the desk, literally getting a concussion. She also found a small cut that was checked against her head. Class dismissed. Someone help me take her to the infirmary. I'll help, Moriyama says. Rosvisa and Moriyama carried Irina down to the infirmary and had to get her head checked out. Rosvisa did not apply pressure to the cut to keep it from bleeding much. When they reached their destination, the nerves could get out of them and Irina as gods from the cut as well as an ice pack. Thanks for helping out, Mariyama son. Could you go to the student council and explain the situation to Sona as have someone monitor the classroom in my absence, Ross Faisa said? Okay, I will hope she's alright. I hope so. But he had a small feeling that they might not be, that the case of the weight of her stupidity has crashed down upon her, Ross Faisa said. Mariyama and Ross Faisa waved goodbye to each other. As Ross Faisa sat by Irina's side, this did sadden Ross Faisa as she wished that she could have been by Issei's side when he was in a coma. The minutes passed by until an hour went by that she heard the door open. How is she, Sona said, walking in with Subaki. She's still breathing, as she kept looking at Irina's sleeping face. Why didn't say? Why didn't you say that you knew, Rospisa said. I didn't know the full details, especially yours. I'm sorry for what happened, Sona says. It doesn't make it any better. As she nodded at Sona's words, anything from the factions, Rospisa said. Yes, and I suggest you train. You'll have a rematch against Saror at some point. He was livered for what happened. She didn't have the guts to say anything about the banishment of, as Ross Feist's situation was still being discussed by the higher-ups. I see. Thank you for the heads up, Ross Feist said. Did she really defend Kiba? To Tsubaki said she was conflicted. Hearing those rumors of Irina's statement made her confused. Yeah, she did. I'm not sure how much she knows, but Kiba and Gaspard were coursed into it, Rasvisa says. Does it have to do with the girl that lives with you, Sona says. How did you know, Rasvisa replied, turning her attention to Sona. I had a familiar to be on watch about what was going on. 
Oh, well, I guess you're right. So suddenly they turned to Irina, who was sobbing. He never loved me. I should have known, putting her head to her face in disbelief. This confused the other occupants, as what caused her to be distraught after a few sniffles. She began to sit up and looked at the rest. You remember how I told you that Zenobia's son talked to me about my new experiences? Looking at Ross Faisa, who nodded. Well, I was feeling something for Kiva because I was doing sword training with him to get better. So, through that small crush, I threw everything away. I didn't know he was coerced into it, but that explains his attitude after the deed was done, Irina said. She slowly started to get up from the bed, shrugging Ross face away from her. Before she stood in front of Subaki and looked into her eyes, I'm sorry, I took your happiness away. What should have been yours was taken by me and the pain I caused you for letting it reach this level. Do whatever you want to make yourself feel better. As got into shaky knees and bowed her head to Tsubaki, saying, it's the least I can do. All three of them were bemused by her actions. Sona and Tsubaki noted how similar she and Issei were when they were down. For Issei, he found his spark when he got pushed to the edge after the prank. So Sona looked at Tsubaki and gave her nod. This puzzled Ross Vaisa until she heard it. Ross Vaisa saw Tsubaki had gotten down on the knee and slapped Irina, who was struggling to get back to her kneeled position. This caused her to get smacked down again. Ross Vaisa was going to move, but stopped by a glare from Sona. It made Ross Vaisa feel helpless, as she could not do anything as her student gets slapped over and over again. It got to the point that Irina's cheeks were welted and had a small cut from Tsubaki's nails. Irina did try to get up, but Tsubaki put her head on her shoulder and forced her back down. Stay down, Tsubaki said as she applied a phoenix tear to her in his cheeks. Why did you do that? Her eyes were bewildered from being healed. Aren't you not satisfied? Irina said, trying to get back from a kneeled position. I could make your life hell. And don't get me wrong, I did enjoy slapping you, but eventually your pain will get boring to me, and I'm not the only person you need to apologize to. So for now, I think I'm done. While you knew what you were doing, you were stupid and naive to listen to a devil and become corrupted by your faith and became an associate in corrupting a seraph, Tsubaki says. I think we're done here. If you're done for now, Tsubaki, Sona says. I am. I suggest you look after her. But, Rasmussen says, do not worry. We will look after Tozaka for and help her in training. It's the least we could do for you being in the situation that you were put in, Sona says. Yeah, I don't intend to drink all and fall into peer pressure, something which Sona nodded at. Come on, Subaki. As Subaki prepared to follow her and stopped. Wait, Irina said, stopping the student council members as she looked at Subaki. If you get the chance, please hear him out. I know I don't deserve to ask you any favors, but he deserves that at least, Irina says. Why do you defend him, Tsubaki says as Irina put her head down. If I could do something right, and he doesn't deserve the flack that will come for something that he was against his wishes, Irina said. Tsubaki stared down at the broken angel before she gave a nod, hearing what she needed to hear and walked out. Good luck. Before walking away, Sona said... For herself meeting up with Tsubaki walked down the hall already. Another one bites the dust, as she and Tsubaki went back to Ross Vice's classroom to keep things in order. Ross Vice knelt down to Irina to help her up and get back to the bed. Are you okay? You were right, Irina said about, I don't deserve these wings. I wouldn't want to be my childhood friend. Knowing what I've become, a stupid, naive, cheating, or her head shifting downwards. Rosvisa didn't say anything because she wasn't wrong, but she was a bit surprised by Irina's language. She was impressed by the feature that heaven implemented, though she did not feel it should be tweaked as basically the angels could do whatever they wanted. What did you do? Irina said. Hmm? Rosvisa said. When you needed to talk to, who did you go to? Irina said. Oh, I went to my grandmother's. She's the kind of a member that I only have. Oh, Irina said. I'll excuse you for a day and come back after school to check on you, Ross Vaisa said. Irina simply nodded, and Ross Vaisa went to check for the coast to be clear before teleporting Irina back to the Hyoto Mansion. She even collected her things from the classroom on the way back, explained things to Tokusa. It made Tokusa feel proud of her big sister figure out for helping others. Tokusa didn't say much to Irina when she saw her, but did thank her for defending Kiba and Gasper. It only made Irina feel that guilt for her crimes that she committed. The rest of the week had been tense and dull. Irina kept to herself, just sat in her seat. Became a robot in clash. She st 
stuck to eating her lunch on the roof, where she did have a confrontation with Akia about it. It's where she confessed what she knew and what she did. She didn't even care anymore. Akia said nothing and just left. Irina expected a confrontation from the Kendo Club duo. Maybe they'll beat her up since she had been looking at her. However, nothing came. Guess couldn't make herself miserable if she was already doing that herself. She had gone to the ORC building and it had been vandalized on the doors and it said, Or's enter here. And were other crude sayings on the building. Some of the windows were broken. She knew it was going to need to be replaced. She decided to walk inside and look at the place and it was trash. Chairs were ripped up. She did see some used condoms as well. It made her shiver and disgust. She didn't know what happened to the room. She always pondered about what Ross Feist had said. She didn't want to go to her parents. She spent more time in her in the abandoned church as well throughout the week, asking for forgiveness for her sins. She did try to contact Issei, but of course, it went to voicemail, and she typed a text message to him. Since the message went through, this slightly glad that he didn't block her number yet, but unaware that he removed his SIM card, she was thankful that her mother taught her how to cook. So she made herself dinner. At some point in the middle of the week, Orphis was gone either back into the dimensional gap or Kuroka and Lefei came back to her. She believed that it was a ladder because she figured that Great Red would strike her if she went into the gap. It's what Irina would have done. Ross Vice had kept her promise and did after look after Irina, but she didn't talk much, mostly because Ross Vice didn't know what was it says Irina was a robot. It wasn't until Friday afternoon that Irina said something. Irina says, I'm going somewhere. Is it an abandoned church? Rosbeisa says, no, and no, you can't come, Irina said. As tears came down her face, I'm not suicidal. You don't have to keep watching me. You can go back to Toka. Irina says, w Rosbeisa replied, I need to do this. I've been thinking about what you said, about talking with someone, and there's only one person that I can go to. She, if she will let me in, Irina said. Rosbeisa just stared at Irina for a few moments, but relented with a sigh. She waved her hand. Fine, go. Come back safely, Rosweiser says. Irina clenched her fist. As more tears rolled down her eyes, just nodded at the thought of a place where things were simpler, creating a transport circle to take her to a clearing. When she earned the shock of seeing the person who was becoming to see, it caused her to slowly back away as she did not expect to see her so soon. You know what they say, speak of the devil and she shall appear. And with your actions, you might as well be considered one, when you're not supposed to be. But come on, as she began to walk towards where the patch of mint leaves were. You and I have much to discuss, Irina, Rata says. Irina was in shock. She never expected to see her grandmother figure so early. However, she didn't know if she could call Rata that anymore. After all, she damaged her grandson. She remembered the sound of Issei's voice in those recordings. Despondent, broken, dead, and all because of her. Not solely on her, but she was part of it. Well, what are you waiting for? Come pick these mint leaves for some tea. It seems like you're going to need it, judging from the look on your face, Harato says. Irina was shaken out of her specter, not to disobey, but she began to follow Harato to the area where the mint leaves were located. Irina kept quiet as she followed Harato. You know, it's fun to grandmother to see your grandchildren, don't you think? Irina paused a bit and began to wonder if she hasn't been told, but knew once she told Ratu what she did, she was likely going to get yelled at and forced to leave the premises, unaware that Ratu already knew. They reached the mint leaves just smelling the faint, crisp mint of the air, as she began to work on gathering the leaves. Ratu and Irina picked a Ziploc bag to store the leaves as they were working. Ratu decided to test Irina. Tell me. How are you and Issei doing? Horata says. He's not the reason that you're crying, is he? She wanted to know what Irina would do, expecting to lie, as Issei did inform her of what she heard Irina say about the feature when he caught him. Irina did think about lying, but then thought to herself about seeing where the lies have taken her. She put herself in the position by talk not talking to Issei about pursuing Kiba. She was enamored by the stories of in listening to her friend that she went for it and brought Gabriel into fold as she experienced with so she figured that if she was going to get told to leave she might as well get some truth off her chest it had gotten cold between me and Issei and yes he is the reason that I'm crying but it's because of my fault he Odo san Irina says Rato made a note Irina did not call Issei neither Issei nor Issei-kun, and she did not call Haratu by her title of Obachan. She even allowed only Irina to call her that, when she had come over with other girls and Hiyoto to come. 
Hmm. So she's not lying as far as I know, Harato. She thought to herself before answering Una, tell me about what you did that caused things to become so cold between you and Issei. I cheated on him with someone that he considered his best friend. She spoke with a few moments, preparing herself to say those words. Harato's eyes widened. She did not expect the Irina to flat out say the truth, as might as well as drop the charade. Oh, screw it. I know you cheated. Issei told me himself, and yes, I was not surprised by your transporting circle thing either, although I was surprised to see you, but Issei told me about the supernatural world, so I know what you are. Come on, I think we have enough leaves, and for some tea, and trust me, you'll need more than I do. As she got up in spot of picking leaves, Irina waited a few moments and silently followed. When they got back to the cabin, Irina held her ziplock back, but reminded, remained standing at the door. She felt uncomfortable and was preparing to make a quick exit. If she needed to, when Harato came back to the kitchen and was washing the leaves and preparing the kettle of water to tea, she did get annoyed and at first by Irina still remaining the door, but she had a feeling why. Did you forget to sit, girl? Go on and sit down so I can hear more about the stupid things that you've done, Harato says. She watched as Irina sat in the exact same seat spot that Issei sat in and almost made her laugh. She kept her tongue and went back to the kitchen to prepare the tea so she could talk with Irina. While it was boiling after that, she came back and sat in her chair and to look at Irina. I'm going to want to know why you decided to cheat. Something tells me that it had something to do with those devils that you were with. I know you're an angel, or you were supposed to be. Issei told me himself, Harato said. Irina shuffled her feet. Everything that Harato said was correct. She acted on her small feelings that quickly replaced Issei from the didn't love her. Not only did she not love her, but was practically forced in position because his mistress made him do it. And even worse, she dragged down a seraph into this. Michael Sama would be displeased, but she did pray for Gabriel's forgiveness as she did not know when she would break news to the angel of what they did. She knew about the mumble something, but Harato interrupted her. I raised you better than this, Irina. You are to look at you who you are speaking with, causing Irina to snap at the attention and look at the eye that's better explain yourself. Well, it started when Issei fell into a coma. Vali explained that Issei took a hit that put him in a position and Vali was able to save him because Vali took the same hit and appeared fine. Rato's eyes narrowed because Issei explained a different side, and she would believe her grandson over some little battle punk. I remembered some of the girls talking about how Vali was stronger was the stronger dragon as he was Issei's rival, I just wanted to get stronger because I felt a little useless. So I asked Kiba to do some training with me, where I started developing a crush on the him two weeks went on. I talked with Zenobia about his, this crush, and she explained to me about the new experiences that the other girls were having, so I felt thrilled that I wanted to have some of those experiences. She told me that she would talk with Rias, and she then told me to speak with Gabriel, who is the Seraph of Heaven. Not for long, Harato says, letting her thoughts interrupt Irina, who continued to speak. Which I did. I didn't see Haram anywhere because we were training in the church, and Zenobia really made mistakes, always made the right decisions. So I felt I could trust her, but I only ruined the happiness of others. After I spoke with Gabriel, she seemed to be skeptical, which I relied to Zenobia. Also who informed me that Gabriel could help Gasper, or Kohai who looked up to Issei to become a better man. I didn't think much of it at the time. Clearly interrupting Irina allowed this time, Rato says, Yeah, agreeing with the Rato they're thinking back then, eventually Zenobia told me that Kiva was willing to take a chance on me, and we planned, or rather, she planned it. I just sat there and agreed like an idiot, unaware that Issei was right there. That was my chance where I could have stopped this. I could have been with him then. While the others talked about their experiences, which intrigued me and aroused me, blushing and embarrassment not expressing their feelings all the time. Well, it's not surprising. The feeling of sex is meant to feel good. Something about dopamine. So hearing about it would make you feel that way. But you were right. Issei was there. He saw you in the blue-haired grunt talking, and neither of you made any notice that he was there, and he left. He... Heard the rest of those was talking about getting down. You probably sat there like a twat figuring yourself for someone you didn't say you didn't want you. Whereas the man that did was less than 500 feet away from you, glaring at the girl, put her head. 
I wasn't earning myself, Irina said. You might as well be. Sitting to them listening to that shit. Well, the one that you said would be their guardian angel suffered through emotional pain of hearing and witnessing how those that they said loved him. Getting on with people that he trusted. People that he risked his life for. Died for. And how do you all repay him? You were just off taking a gun and shooting him in the head. It would have made the pain easier, Harato says. Irina gasped in horror. How did she- she did not know that Issei's suffering, and no matter how bad she felt, it would never amount to the damage that was handed to him by the others. But then she remembered the Haratas said that Issei witnessed the events. What do you mean by witnessed, Irina said. Oh. You see, after Issei saw this Ross Vaisa woman and Gyamin woman sucking off the, the prick known as Azazel, he banged back to his so-called house, only to hear you all were desecrating his room with your activities. And he was supposed to be a, the pervert. Add in those facts with those bastards that were supposed to be his parents while well, enjoy that they knew of your infidelity and praised those bastards for f***ing you when they did nothing for you. Did any of those them put their life on the line for you? You knew the truth of Issei's actions but said nothing. You continued on with the lies and said nothing. Irina, which honestly it disgusts me and I'm very disappointed. Tell me, how would that feel that you are with someone? I'll have to use Issei as an example. Tell me how you would feel coming home and hearing your best friend in your own bed and then your parents talk about how she was much better and you deserved him, not you, their own daughter, their own flesh and blood. But see Issei more as a child as what they wanted and had left you at the side for years, Rato said. Years? She couldn't speak much as Little began to say, Ah, the tea is ready. Stay seated. As she got up while Irina thinking about being in Issei's shoes, she thought about coming home in her dream, like her dreams as Issei, as her husband after a long day of work. She heads to her bedroom and hears the moans of a woman, along with the grunts and groans of Issei. Sounds like he should only make with her. Feeling an even more despondent and hearing her parents, Toji and Mizuko Shoto, speak of how much Issei deserved a better woman than her while insulting her and talking about how much they could keep the affair a secret from her. It caused more tears to spill from her eyes as she covered her face and cried. The smell of men invaded her senses after a few minutes, which caused her to look through her fingers and see a cup that had been placed in front of her. I told you you would need more than me. Drink while it is hot, taking a sip of her own cup and letting out a deep sigh as the tea took over her senses, making her feel relaxed. Horatu watched as Irina moved her hands from her face, looking at her red, tear-stricken face. She did not want to con comfort the one she saw as a granddaughter. However, Rato needed to make Irina see the damage that she caused, not just to herself or Issei, but others around. She continued to watch as Irina took a sip of the tea. Drink more, or you won't feel the effects. Drinking more of her tea as she watches Irina hesitantly drink more of her own. Much better. Now, where was I, Hirato says. You were saying about it's been years that Issei was left to the side, Irina said. Ah, uh, yes. You see, my dear, since you left, those bastards started loving Issei less. It was just a facade of a happy family. And when he awoken his perversion, that love dissipated each day. Though it is as hilarious how hypocritical they were, since you've seen that our family can be perverted, but even so, they never made any attempts to correct the poor boy. They stopped visiting us less, even more when Juzo died, until you came with Issei and the other girls. It was Issei that suggested for us to come, Irina said, and I am thankful that I got to see my grandson. I could not fathom how much those two left him, but when you all came, I saw how much they devoted doted over you and the others more than they did their son. I could see it. You all replaced Issei, so congratulations. But don't worry, Issei has new parents. Parents that care about him and his future. And he has a new fiancé, bigger boobs than you, of course, Harada says. Irina slumped her head. She had a feeling that she wouldn't get Issei's love, and she knew that Harada was throwing it in her face. She wouldn't blame the grandmother. After all, she did the same thing to Issei. You know, it makes me wonder. The boy, Kiba, was it? You said he didn't love you. So who did he love, Harada said. 
Oh, um, Tsubaki-san. As she took out a group picture that she had from her phone, she's the one with the glasses and mismatching eyes. Next to the other girl with the glasses and short hair, Irina said. Her odd toe looked for who Irina just pointed out, and her eyes widened slightly, most because of each of the girls just in the picture, but she had this to say. I must say, he has some good taste. She is better looking than you and a bigger chest. I'm sure Juzo would say that he would bend her over his lap or the desk. She laughed. That old pervert, Rato said. Irina felt insulted. But she knew she had this coming and she deserved it and then some. She simply just nodded. She did she knew she didn't compete with Subaki. At least she knew Subaki would have been loyal, unlike her, who had forgot about the person she had loved for a decade. Hurts, doesn't it? Harato said, the feeling of being replaced, ridiculed by those you trust the most. Yeah, Irina replies, not knowing what to say. You should have come to me, Irina, to get a second opinion about what you planned to do. Maybe the less it would have been hurt. You wouldn't have stayed away from your faith. So tell me, what do you plan to do? I I, I don't know. I, I don't want Ross Vaisa sensei to have to on suicide watch because of me. And I said, Ross Vaisa, you're with her? Hmm, she needs to explain why she chose that prick over my grandson as she sat her tea down, Harato said. What? No, Rosvisa Sensei was drugged by Azazel with an Aristocat. She had gone to get enchantments for her wand, and he did so then. Then he had Pyoman pressured her into drinking as a form of celebration, not knowing it was drugged, and it was confirmed that it was. She wanted to confess to Issei, but she didn't get the chance to, Irina said. Harato's eyes widened. She knew from Issei and his rituals that drinks were involved. From what Irina said, if that was true, then at least someone wanted him, but was taken from him against her will. It did make Azazel more of a bastard in her eyes, though. Well, this is quite the shock, leaning back in her chair. Tell me, did you apologize to the Tsubaki, Hirata says? Yes, I even gave her permission to do whatever she wanted to me, which she did. Over the course of this week, I do whatever she tasks she gives me, and she gets to slap me periodically for about ten minutes before she healed my cheeks and told me that at some point my pain will bore her. I see, Rato says, reaching for her tea again and taking a sip. Tell me, considering you were influenced by the devil, how do you think the world would be if God was influenced by Lucifer, Rato said. Irina stopped to think about this. Considering how they just had a war with Lucifer, she did not think the world would be what it is. She would never be an angel. Frankly, she might not have even been born. <clears throat> The world as we know it would cease to exist. Lucifer would want to rule it all again. Reign supreme and backstab God and the others just to get what he wanted, not caring if the others were hurt. It caused Irina to look back on her conversation with Zenova. It didn't care that she was hurting, and only was trying to make her move by invoking jealousy. I would say so. Now you are seeing a little bit of what your actions have done. School ends in what? Two weeks, Rato says? Uh, yes. Hiyoto san in two weeks, Irina said. Then I suggest you go home. Irina was expecting that. She knew it was her time to leave and head back to the empty mansion, so she nodded and was about to get up and leave. I don't think you understand the meaning of my words. That house is not your home. Irina, home is where your parents are. I suggest you talk to them and also your superior about your sins. When school ends, you should take your things from that gaudy mansion and go back home to them. The influence of those devils ruined you and made you a in return. Made the other angel as well. A lot of this could have been different if you have come to me before. Tu said, yeah... Irina, with less tears, fell from her eyes. So this Ross Vice's son has been living with you, Rato says. Well, no. She actually moved out. When she found out she was drugged, she was disgusted living under the same roof as the people who only cared for themselves. And she's right. I don't need to deserve these wings in my back, nor do I wish I met myself as a child because of the actions that I would commit in the future. She was right about it all, Irina said. Mm, and the other girls? Are they there, Rato said, at the mansion? No. They have a mission till Sunday, so I came here to seek some guidance after Ross Vaisa told me of how she spoke with her grandmother, and I was afraid to speak with Michael-sama or my parents, and I didn't have the heart to tell Gabriel that I made a commit and a terrible mistake. I see, so you came to your grandmother after all, though it was too late, Harato says. Yeah. Wait. But you're not my grandmother, Irina said. Of course I am, you stupid girl. I helped raise you as well, but you should know I am a human. I do have 
I do not have the heart of a demon to disown so freely like the Hyoto did to Issei. I could also understand why you were afraid. But, I tell you now, despite your stupidity, I am still your grandmother, even though I won't get to see you walk. And Issei walk down the asyl nor be together. You're still my grandchildren, causing Irina to put her down. I'm sorry, Irina said. You're sorry? What? I'm sorry, Obuchan, as tears were dripped down her te eyes. Good, now get up. We need to go pack. Arata says, pack? Yes, it's weakened. You're going to live here, so I can keep you from making any more dumbass decisions. Well, think to herself, like killing yourself. I'm going to make you grow, Irina, so you are no longer influenced by anyone else. So no more having to buy any bundle cheer, Arata says. But, but, no buts. Unless you want me to bend over my knee and spank your glaring at Irina, who shook her head. Good. Now, make one of those transport circle things so we can go. The sooner the better. Then this Rosvice can get back to recovering her life as those for the devils. If they ask you, you will say you are the Subaki son's apprentice and let her know of this situation. If she wants a handwritten letter, I'll make one for you to give to her. But under no circumstances are they to ever contact you. So I suggest you start blocking some numbers and you owe that boy an apology. Maybe he'll smack you around like Tsubaki, but you know you had it coming, Harato said. Irina just nodded as she knew it. Kiba always wanted Tsubaki. He was only being nice to her because she was his friend's girlfriend, and then he was being nice because he was forced to. Now hurry up. We're losing daylight, as Irina transported them to the Hyoto Mansion. Being transported for the first time, it made Harato's knees buckle as she caught herself on the dining table, where she and Irina encountered Ross Faisa, who was waiting for Irina to come back. Irina? Who are you? Ross Faisa said as she got up from her seat to check on Irina, but was defensive towards Harato. Um, hi, Ross Faisa sensei. This is, um, I'm Issei and Irina's grandmother. I must thank you for your words for helping get my granddaughter's head out of her ass. We came to get Irina's things. Like you, she is moving out. Her stupidity has caused harm to many people, and I need to set her straight, Harato says. Moving out, but Ross Faisa says yes. She's coming to live with me. I hope you don't reveal her whereabouts to the others that live here. If they ask you, she told me that you were keeping watch of her over this last week. Well, I will be taking on that duty for now. In Miss Ross Faisa, as a woman, I am sorry for what happened to you, and I will pray that bastard gets what's coming to him, Ronto said. You told her? Turning her attention towards Irina, who just looked down. Well, she said Issei told her that she believes that you chose Azazel over him, and I had to clarify that it wasn't by your choice. I'm sorry I should have asked for your permission, but I didn't want you to be wrong for something that was not your fault, like Kiba was. And she bowed her dead head again. I see. Thank you, Ross Vices says. I'll give you time to talk while you pack our things so we can leave, resting at the dining table, and make it quick. We don't want any uninspected visitors, Rato said. So for the next few hours, they worked on packing all of Irina's things, and Ross Faisa helped in transporting them to Rato's place and unpacking it. Another surprise to Rato was that Irina chose the same room that Issei chose, but she wasn't going to say anything about that. She had no intentions about speaking Issei. Though she texted her grandson that was happening, hearing no response back, she knew he either didn't change the f charge the phone or didn't have the SIM card in. Rosvaisa did give her own farewell to Irina, a little glad that she was having a small turnaround. Rata sent a notice that Shioto that she was looking after Irina now, as she no longer trusted her son and his wife. They had been informed of the infidelity from Michael, but they knew Hirata when they visited when Irina was young and knew that she would be a better influence to get their granddaughter back. Or daughter back. They were still not ready to speak to Irina, but they knew that they needed to hear their daughter soon, and Hirato promised to keep track of Irina's progress. It wasn't until late at night that Hirato received a reply from Issei, telling her to do what she must, and he would remove his SIM card, but will pop it in once in a while to send her a text when he could. He also sent her a picture of Invigold, stating how he made a new friend. Hirato laughed and wondered how long till Issei wound up sleeping with the girl. She she knew men had been their needs and Seraphal told him that he could have a harem. Looks like he found a girl, number two. She would try to force Irina into a harem. They all knew that the ship and sailed. 
It was a matter of getting Irina back on her feet, and hopefully the two can act civil with each other. Irina, meanwhile, was thanking Michael for this chance to rekindle her relationship with her grandmother figure. She did pray for Subaki and Kiba and happiness that she helped ruin. She prayed for Gaspar's happiness. She also prayed for Issa to hear Osweiss' story and her happiness, so she can have that closer. She did not know who Issa's new fiancé was, but she prayed that they will have a long, fulfilling relationship. She prayed for Gabriel and her forgiveness as it was turned. Gabriel down the path of infidelity and hoped that Gabriel could live a normal life. She also prayed for her parents' forgiveness one day. She did not pray for herself and only hoped the people she hurt found closure. She looked at Haraldson sitting in the corner of her temporary room, but she knew that she could no longer use it as she was no longer pure of heart. Instead, she created a small blade of light and drew it across of the underside of her left forearm that went from her wrist to the middle of her forearm. She winced and tried not to scream from the pain of her searing her own self, but she knew that this mark was hers to bear and something she would live for for the rest of her life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are on chapter 23. Asgard at Odin's castle. This is where we currently are. <sighs> In Odin's library, shifting through the books and dragons was Lightning's Odin's new guard. She planned to go back to her world and know of its fate. But to do that, in her mind, she needed to defeat Great Red. She thought of how she came to this point. When she believed to defeat the Foul Seer, saved her sister, Sarah only to be summoned by the goddess Tetro. She fought for the goddess, earning herself a rival. A man by the name of Sassius. Of Cassius. He was strong, and once was I could like her. She also had an understanding as he was the guardian of Ceres named Yule. It was similar to her and protector, so she saw that understanding of Issei, as he was also protecting those that he loved. Unfortunately, she had witnessed the betrayal done to him. She could not fathom what would happen if Sarah did the same thing to her. However, she wouldn't get the chance because Issei had succeeded in saving his loved ones. She heard how the other Valkyries praised the Red Dragon Emperor. She did not get the chance as Sarah had died on her journey through time. Lightning had mourned Sarah's death and confided in biting Celtia to his throne. However, the goddess had other plans, and so did Sarah, who would explain to her about her eventual death. It made Lightning feel useless, that her sister was going to die no matter what she did, and that hurt. She remembered that Sarah's spirit telling her to continue on, and Lightning promised that she wouldn't stop until she saw her again, only to wake up and find herself in front of Odin's castle. It was then she realized that Etero sent her here, and she knew that her journey was not done. She worried about her former teammates who gave up for her dead and Sarah had informed her. She wanted to go back and let them know she was fine. Sarah joked to her about the finding a guy that she had snorted at. She was a soldier, so she trained herself and took on other Valkyries rising in the ranks. She impressed many, including Odin himself, as she became assigned as his new personal guard. She questioned him about his former one, which she noted the sadness in his tone. When speaking about Ross Vysa, she wanted to learn more about Ross Vysa and spoke with Gondel about her granddaughter. She thought Ross Vysa was a capable warrior and was displeased about what she did, but upon learning that she was drugged, her view changed. As a woman, Lightning could sympathize with Ross Vysa and wondered if they would really banish her. It seemed that was quite back and forth as Ross Vysa gained more support. Since she was a victim, it did make Lightning dis disgusted with fallen angels. Of course, Gondel noted that not all the fallen angels were like that, and noted to Lightning that she would train with Barkyol, who was skilled in using the element of her namesake. Lightning pondered about it. In the threat of Razavine, she would need that, and she would get it. It helped to speak with Gondel, since she had been living with the woman and decided that Ross Vysa and her would make a con... Valkyrie duo. Since Ross Vysa was skilled in magic and Lightning was skilled in combatant in combat, now she lies in Odin's study, reading about dragons. From what she had gathered was Great Red was a dragon, and to slay a dragon, she needed a dragon slaying weapon. The top one she discovered was Graham, which was used to slay the dragon Fafnir. However, the dragon was revived by Odin himself. She grimaced at this as she knew the gold dragon was a bit of a pervert, likely due to Odin. 
Odin, when drunk, usually criticized her breast size, and if she was insecure about them, hence why she always wore her armor. She wasn't, although her breasts were a bit bigger, the reason she wore her armor was because she always prepared for a fight. She wondered how Ross fights had tolerated Odin's pervertedness. She found it ironic how she once had a summon, or Elvion, that was named Odin, and saw how the deity was much different from her majestic steed. Even former teammates, their idioms were different from the DXD counterparts, as Berliner was her mentor and Shiva was a male. She wondered if the girls cheated on Issei because he was a pervert as she saw through his memories in that meeting. Considering how he protected them, she was pretty sure that if they asked him to change, he would. So she considered it in a heinous way to portray someone. It didn't help to discover that Graham was wielded by Kiba Yoto, who rem if she remembered from Issei's memories, he didn't look like a man proud of sleeping with his former best friend's girls, from what he, she saw, but he had the possible key to helping her get her home back. Gonda, Lightning. She called out to the older woman. What is it, Lightning? Would you happen to know where I can find Fafnir, Lightning said. I don't believe I do. What is it that you need to speak with him about? From what I read, he was slain by a sword, Graham. I want to know if it is capable of slaying the dragon Great Red, Lightning said. I don't think you can de defeat someone of Great Red's caliber, Gondal said. Not yet, I just need the right tools, Lightning said. Such as Graham, Gondal replied. Exactly. Right now in the possession of Kiba. So you will challenge him, yes, but not until after he is done with his raiding game. But he will be banished and his powers will be constricted. You're not the only one to look for an easy win, Lightning Gondal said. I'm not looking for an easy win. I will request an exception for him, Lightning said. You'd still have an advantage. You'll have to tape him to the study and grant his movements and how he fights. The reigning game would add on to that. He has no tape on you. Gondel said, you're right. Then I suppose you can give my training sessions with Arnar. As she turned on her heel, I'm going to find Odin. See if he can help me find Fafnir. Gondel chuckled as she knew Lightning was stubborn. To be honest, she reminded Gondel of Ross Visa. But with more confidence, she wondered what would have happened if the two met. She knew Lightning had no quarrel with Ross Visa, but she was intrigued by the prospect of them meeting, and Ross Visa wasn't fully banished. At least her granddaughter had the rights to see her, but she was gaining full favor for a full banishment to be overturned. Lightning walked down the halls of Odin's castle, giving nods to several Valkyries that she had seen. She was focused on her task in speaking with Odin and Fafnir's whereabouts. For all she knew, the dragon was partnered with the Snun. Unaware that the dragon recited its contract to Azia, she didn't want to talk to one of those girls that betrayed Issei and tipped them off. Reaching Odin's throne room, she probably opened the door. She knew that he, she was coming. Something she learned about the all-seeing father during her time. Lightning, so good to see you, Odin said. The feeling is not so mutual, Lightning replied. Ha, huh, did you prefer me commenting on your showing your breast? I hope you're not feeling insecure about that. If you are, you won't get a boyfriend, Odin says. I don't need a boyfriend, Odin. I just need you to tell me where I can find Fafnir. Are you sure you want to find him? He may ask for your panties. <laughs> Chuckling at the dragon had done with Asya. I'm aware of his perversion is part of you. After all, you're the one that revived him, Lightning said. <laughs> yes, I did. I suppose a small part of me latched onto him during the revival process, but why do you want to find him, Odin says. Well, he was slain by the sword and Graham. I would like to know if that sword is capable of bringing down a dragon like Great Red. Oh, Lightning, I'd rather you not lose so early. Great Red and Fafnir are on different levels and different rankings. Fafnir is a dragon king, whereas Great Red is a dragon god. Or the dragon of the dragons, Odin said. I've faced deities before, Lightning said. So I've heard, but I would not say they compare to Great Red. Otherwise, they would have been able to break his hold and try to evade us, Odin said. I see what you're saying. As she pondered about her choices, but I still plan to take Graham from Kiva you two. What for, Odin said, well, despite being a demonic sword, it still belongs to the Nordic faction. But also, I may have to beat this Issei, Lightning said. Still planning to beat Great Red? You know you could just ask Issei when he returns to contact Great Red for you, Odin said. Why is that, Lightning replied, because Issei has a body that was built by Great Red. Even better, then I can determine if Graham is capable of harming Great Red. But I will have to ask Fafni Fafnir for more information, Lightning said. 
You're quite tedious, aren't you? Chuckling at her decision. Very well. Fafnir's in Tannen's territory in Underworld. You'll have to speak with one of the demons about heading there. Your best chance are the ones in Co. Preferably Sona Seatree, Odin said. What about your former bodyguard, Ros Vysa? Lightning said. She would get curious and investigate your intentions more than Sona will, Odin said. You know something, don't you? Not sure. When do you plan to leave? I'll leave in a few days. I'm not in a rush to get my answers. Ooh, maybe you can get some new clothes and get out of that armor, Oma said. Maybe I will. This armor would have draw heads if I were to enter school grounds like this, Lightning said. For once, you actually listen to me, Odin said. Since we're on the term of listening, then may I ask you something? Of course. Why do you abolish any banish banishment from Ross Vysa? You know she was a victim. Even your people can see that, Lightning said. I'm aware, Odin said. So why don't you? I suppose you are right. It seems stupid to confine her to just seeing her grandmother when she did nothing wrong when she everything goes down. She will still want to come home, Odin says. So, Lightning replied, I will not be banishing Ross Fison or restricting her to where she can go in Asgard. As he relaxed to his throne, but something must be done about Azazel, Odin said. I'm sure the Valkyries can think of something, I suppose. May I ask you something? And that is, Lightning replied, what do you think of Issei from what you have seen so far? To be honest, after dealing with you, he's a pervert. This made Odin laugh. However, he is like me, a soldier from what I can understand. His last name means soldier. So his full name means honest soldier, and he was honest about his perversion. That's no doubt. <laughs> but I hear that he is changing the last name. I understand his reason for that, remembering how the Hyoto acted on Issei's memories. But when I look at his perversion, nobody ever asked him to change. So what they did was a cruel motive, even if it was in a playful fun. Someone gets hurt, and it seems that one was Issei, plus the disrespect of doing it in his room. They had no shame. What would they have done if they actually walked in? Lightning said. They probably would have asked him to join, and if they and call, they call him a pervert, Odin said. You think... He would have? I doubt that. He may be a pervert, but he has his morals. I don't think that they cheated because he was a pervert either, considering how he was defended them. If they wanted him to change, he would have done so, Lightning said. Hmm. I think you can ask Sona about Ravel Phoenix's story. Which I would agree with you. From how she stated it, it was Rias that said they could have fun and he would never find out. That doesn't help make a healthy relationship, Lightning said, and I highly doubt they would have stopped. Well, except Ross Vysa, but what if one of them got pregnant? How would they explain that? I would agree with you, but I think some of them would realize how deep they have gotten if that happened, and the guilt would eat them alive, Odin said. The delusional one is Rias. She's the ringleader, isn't she? Lightning said. She was spoiled at a young age, so she would want to do things her way. She wants to take care. Cake? And eat it, Odin said. I guess one could say that, but going back to question what I think of Issei, he's a pervert, but he has his morals. We are similar in doing what we can to protect our loved ones. He was successful, and I was not, Lightning said. Your sister, Odin replied. Yeah, as she turned around to begin the head out of the room. If I may ask Lightning, if you were to join forces with Issei, would you do it? Odin says, if he keeps that perversion to himself, I would consider it, Lightning said. Maybe you can whip him into shape, though it would suck to lose another bodyguard, Odin said. What are you implying, Lightning said, turning back to Odin. Nothing, nothing, waving it off, looking away. He wanted to avoid her glare. He figured that sticking her with Issei would be good for the both of them. Maybe he could get her to loosen up. I see. Let's hope it would nothing, Lightning said as she began to leave once again. If I may ask, why did you choose the name Lightning? I doubt your parents would name you that, which follow up my question is what is your real name? Well, considering how the people around me die, I realize that Lightning seeks to destroy, it doesn't protect. And as for my real name, I'm sure Etro has already told you, so I don't see why you need to ask as she walked out of the throne room. Odin simply smiled. He knew that there was two things that would happen. Issei would get Lightning to open up, or she would kill both of them. Considering what Issei mentioned about the ritual, he had a feeling that Issei would be different, but still somewhat the same. He was sure Seraphel could handle things as she was changing herself with a chuckle. He leaned back into his chair, and he realized that he felt better about not vanishing Ross Faisa either. He does hope he could talk to her after the fallout. He was going to have to tell Berner that she can't retire. He knew she was fond of life, 
Lightning, but word from Etro told him Lightning had a diverse team and Issei seemed like a better option for Lightning to join. Blue thought she had another successor. Oh well, Odin said, laughing to himself. Lightning began walking back to the library to speak to Gondel about her plans. She found her reading some magic books and she was going to call her out to get her attention. However, she realized she didn't need Gondel, already sensed it. Had a fun talk, Gondel said, never looking up from her book. You could say that. I'll be leaving in a few days, heading to go. Oh, what for? I thought you were seeking Fafnir. Something to do with it, Lightning said. I plan to speak with Sona Seatree about letting me enter the Underworld so I can speak with Fafnir, Lightning said. I see, Gondel replied. Another thing. I spoke with Odin about Rothweiss's restriction. He agreed with me. He will abolish her banishment. No stopped reading her and looked at Lightning, who kept a neutral face as Gondel's eyes wouldn't slightly. You mean... Yes, she was a victim and the Valkyries don't believe she should be punished. Even the people agree. It's a matter of punishing the fallen angel Azazel. Oh, that is true. I just feel relieved. Her eyes got slightly wet. Odin felt that when the fallout happens, it's best that she returns home. Home? Are you sure you want to go home? You've talked about me to your sister. Your other friends have given up for dead. Why do you want to go back? Gondel said. I, I don't know. I guess I miss them. Let me know I'm okay. I'm not dead. They were my team, Lightning said. But you have a new team here. We would also miss you, even though you have been with us for a little while, but you have risen in our ranks. I guess that is thanks to your military experience, but don't you think Esro sent you here for a reason? I don't understand, Lightning replied. If you served a purpose for her, why didn't she send you back home? She sent you here instead. Maybe you have a new purpose, Gondel said. You mean to fight Razavine? Lightning said, perhaps. But after the death of your sister, you enclosed yourself into a crystal on Estro's throne. You didn't ask to go home, though I guess it's because you could communicate with her spirit what she did tell you. Huh? Lightning replied. What did she talk when you communicated with her spirit? Gondel said. Lightning let out a sigh as she took a seat across from Gondal and looked at the older Valkyrie. She knew she of her eventual death, but she didn't stop until we're together again and she had no regrets and told me that I shouldn't forget about her now will we see each other again. Well, I know you can keep that promise, but did she ever mention the others that you want to see? Gondal said. Lightning pondered about that. She didn't recall Sarah speaking about Fang, Vantali, Hope, Sazi, maybe Snow. But that was Sarah's fiancé, although with Sarah running off to look for lightning, it probably caused a tear in the relationship. She already knew the fate of Fang and Valniel, who became the beast known as Ragnarok, to prevent the planet Cocoon from destroying their world, but for the others, Gondel was right. If the others have left for dead, then there was no point in going back. They moved on with their lives, Sazi with his son, hoping with parents, but she knew Snow was alone. At least he went out looking for me, but he was probably because of Sarah. At least he's loyal, even if I didn't approve of their relationship, Lightning said. She leaned back into the chair. She was angry and sad at the same time about the ordeal. It didn't help with the impending war was going to happen in this world, so if Kiba, you two was going to be banished, then a sword like Graham would still be beneficial. From what she has read, Kiba can only swing it a few times before he becomes tired, thus it makes him ineffective. She would have to prove that the sword that she is better suited for it, she had no interest in the other demonic swords. Maybe you're right, but I would like to at least know what happened in my world, Lightning said. If they moved on, so be it. But if I can just see it one last time, that is all I need. If you insist, I won't stop you, but remember... If you don't like what you see, you are always welcomed here, reaching out and patting Lightning's hand. Thank you, Lightning said. She remembered her past and losing her father and then her mother. How she joined the military and pushed Sarah far away and fought to get her back. It was still the worst birthday ever. But the most impactful one out of her life. I'm going to train a little more, getting up from her seat to leave the library. If you see Roz Vaisa while you're in go, please give her my greetings, Gondel said. I will. It felt nice talking to Gondel and wish she was around when her parents had died. Sarah would have loved to meet her. She was a little jealous that Roz Vaisa had a grandmother to support her, while she did not have any known family members to turn to, and thus, she had to grow quickly up for their sake. Sarah, I wish I could meet... I wish you could meet Gondel one day. Now that I think about it, Ross Vice or her granddaughter seems decent from what I hear. You probably would like to meet her too. Things that might have been different if they were in our lives before this mess of you being branded as a pulse key back in the day. And maybe, just maybe, they would have helped me accept your relationship to Snow. I hope you're doing well, wherever you are. 
Now we're back with Issei. In the outside world, it might have been only a couple of days, but for Issei and Invuld, it was about a week and half from the Oasis. It was relatively easy to go back on track after killing those rogue exorcists. Issei also knew that he needed to speak with Great Red, but he still had more to learn about Invigold. She was a mystery to him. Once she unleashed that water dragon, he remembered seeing the Exognia insignia from her somewhere. He had already informed his grandmother of the girl, after Hirato had informed him that she was taking care of Irina. He did not really care, because he knew his grandmother would whip anyone into shape. It almost made him smile, wishing he could be there when she hammers in on the Hyoto. Right now, he was watching Invergold try some other offensive water moves. She seemed to be natural with water, as she had a book that was provided to him by Odin. It was off to the side as he had not to dance not to get damaged. She was able to manipulate her water into different creatures. And then just snakes and dragons. She utilized the water sharks as well. Although he would not tell her, he has seen her naked, but they were by accident. Her figure was slim but slowly filling out. He believed that this was due to the lack of resources for food out in the wild. He also helped her with physical chaining with some workouts. Some easier ones like push-ups and sit-ups. As he was watching her, he looked specifically at her magic circle while he was slipping through the book that Ajuka gave him in the clans of the underworld. I can easily note that it's not the Gremory, Sea Tree, nor Phoenix, nor Ashtaroth. It's not Biel, and definitely not Lucifer, Issei says, as he stifled through the book. Oh, Shalba was a Beelzebub. He turned to that page which was among information about the original mouse, remembering the man that killed using Samuel's poison. No, it's not that either. Well, that's good. And not Asimotus either, Issei said to himself. He breathed in out a slight of relief that there was three out of the four down. The last thing that he needed was dealing with a power-hungry devil. However, he turned the page of the Leviathan section. Just like that Catthea chick. Then he looked up in his eyes, which saw Invigil's insignia and her magic. It was the same, although Invigil's was colored light blue, and he looked like the page to confirm it. She's a Leviathan. His mouth hung open as Invigold earnestly made the water rise and the giant tidal wave roaring downstream. As Invigold finished her demonstration, she felt proud as she watched the tidal wave crash into the trees and rip a couple out of the ground. She smiled and giggled to herself. I did it. I definitely got stronger thanks to these books and Issei-san as she looked around the oasis. This place is beautiful, though it's an artificial room. I think that's what Issei-san said said to herself. She continued looking around until her eyes locked with Issei's as she has stared at her with his mouth open. She blessed as she now realized that Issei was watching her. She assumed that he was in shock because of the damage. She did not know that his secret, her secret was revealed. She decided to apologize because she felt that she maybe destroyed something in the area so she went to him. I'm sorry Issei-san. I did, uh, didn't throw so much water there, Invigil says, looking down at her twiddling fingers. A leviathan. She doesn't seem arrogant like the others. Why is she so different? Issei said. By answering, by not answering, Invigil felt that he was mad and apologizing didn't help. I'll just go, Invigil said. She felt like she ruined her chances here and beginning to head towards Drake's cave to pack her things. She was talking to you. You don't have to leave a lady waiting, Arondite said. <clears throat> The sword call allowed Issei to snap out of his shock and turns towards the retrieving figure of Immigold. He couldn't help but appreciate her curse from behind. Wow, but then again, Katra wasn't that bad looking either, Issei said. Focus, Aranda said. Sorry, she's just so beautiful, Issei replied. Well, she was feeling sad because you didn't say anything. You must call her back and explain things to her and understand her intentions, Aranda said. Oh, sorry, I'm not the one you should apologize to, Aranda said. Invigold, come back, Issei said. He called out to the girl. <laughs> she stopped and looked back at Issei, where he could see her eyes were wet from a tear streak as well. Oh, no. As he got up, leaving the book behind and ran to catch up to her. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ignore you, Issei said. I thought that you didn't want me here. Uh, quite... <laughs> Each break of her sentence. No, no, I want you here. I told you. You're my first friend out here. Pulling her into a hug. Here, I'll show you what had me in shock. As he took her hand and led her to where he was sitting, she quietly followed him, calming down her sniffles. She wouldn't admit it, but she did like the hug. When he hugged her, it was the first hug that she had received in a very long time. Here, take a seat, he says, as he bent down, 
and picked up to the book and patted the ground next to him. She looked quizzically at him before she sat down next to him. When she was comfortable enough, he began to speak. So, I was looking through this book. It has the information all around the clans of the mouths. Here, your eyes widened a little. Now, the reason I was looking through this is because I thought I could figure out what the clan you may be from. You don't seem like a stray demon, but as I looked through, it made sense why you didn't tell me your last name. You're a descendant of the original Leviathan, aren't you? As he handed her to the book page, he couldn't open the Leviathan in Information. She couldn't move. She was scared of the inside. He figured out her secret. She could only fear that what he would do to her now. She didn't want to look him in the eye. She could only look at the page that had her clan signal on it. Issei saw her distress and he realized that he didn't make the situation any better for her, but he could understand her trust issues. Judging from your silence, I guess you are. So you could look here, as he pointed the section in the book. Imigul might have been staring at the page, but she wasn't paying him much attention. She could hear him, but she was also thinking of a way to escape. It says here that your clan has the ability that it's called Serpent of the End, and the part of that ability is that you can turn into a long serpent, like a dragon, and fire a powerful amount of your magical energy. Although it does enhance your water manipulation, powers it could destroy the oasis so let's not use it unless our backs are against the wall okay smiling at her Issei did Imigul heard the last part and noted how he said not to destroy the oasis you're letting me stay Imigul said blinking in confusion yeah I don't see the problem you're my friend although I've dealt with people like you before something about you is different from them Wait, you're not planning on ruling the Underworld, are you? Issei said, no. I would like to see it someday, but no, I don't plan to rule it, Imigul said. That's a relief. Whew, laying back on his neck and looking up at the artificial sky. Um, Issei-san, what do you mean about people like me? Imigul says. She saw his face turn grin. She couldn't read his emotion. She waited in silence, then she saw emotion. But Issei didn't move a muscle. It was a tear that fell from the eye that was the furthest from her. It made her worried about he was hurting about something. Could you lay down with me, Invergold, Issei said. Uh, sure, as he laid beside him, Invergold. What were your parents like? My parents, well, they cared enough for me. We lived in a side city that is probably north of here. I think it was peaceful, but then I had fallen to this sleeping disease, only to know that what they did because they wrote me into a journal, but they notified the nobles of the Leviathan clan to hide me and also cure me. My presence was kept secret for many years. Not even the current government knows I exist. But when I came to, I found the journal, and my parents had passed away. I guess whoever looked after me took it upon themselves to inform me of their findings in the journal. I had a sacred gear manifesting in me. Really, do you know what it is? Issei says. They called it Nirited Kairi in their notes from what I experienced. It makes my eyes glow lavender, and I see those lavender light particles around me. Emigul says, Weird. Lavender. That was the last color I saw when I heard her singing the other day. I think it affects those around me because I found your body the other day and you seem to be in the vicinity of my singing, but I sensed you were already there, so I think I can also detect presences as well. Yours is a mixture, though. I could only detect the draconic presence. She, she knew I was there. Wait a minute. He turned to him and goes, You could detect my draconic presence, Issei said. Yes. It's been growing during the other times together here. I'm still amazed by how fast time goes on here. I think I also detect you, or at least this cave. When I was running from those exorcists, I guess I assumed that you were a dragon and you would eat them, so I tried to lure them to you, but nothing worked and they still chased after me. And Vigil says, You thought I would eat them, Issa replied, chuckling at her statement. Well... No dragons attack when their territory is threatened, Invigold said. I guess you're right, Issei replies. What about your parents? Invigold says. Depend on which ones you're talking about, Issei says. Um, your birth parents, Invigold says. Fuck them, Issei replied. Huh? She was confused by this interaction. Oh, sorry. I forgot. But my relationship to my birth parents, or rather my birth parents, is severed, Issei says. Are they a part of the people that betrayed you, Invigold replied. Them and the others are people I once loved, you see. My first set of parents didn't like me much. Well, the material side did for a little bit, but once that love decayed, they were kind of hyper hypocritical. They're a bunch of perverts and greedy people. I guess I'm surround sounding a little hypocritical, but I'm a pervert too. I get it from them. They don't realize it. My grandfather always talked about getting a harem, since he and my sperm donor could not. 
When they were young, of course. When I was a kid, I didn't think of it much. My grandma would make sure of it. She's strict in kicking. Maybe you'll meet her one day. I sent a picture of you to her, letting know that I got a new friend, Issei said. That made both of them smile as they stared into the sky. But Issei's face became neutral. I also didn't think much of how the Hyoto, that's my first set of parents, so before I was Is before I was once Issei Hyoto, but not anymore, I didn't think how they didn't want me, how I thought I wouldn't become something or someone at the time. I had this friend, her name was Irino or Shioto, which her last name is. I thought she was a boy back then, and I would hang out with her with my grandparents, and my grandpa died and Irina left. I didn't get to see my grandma much, only in January is when we get to see her. Anyway, after those events of Irina leaving, and my grandpa dying, I ended up meeting this old man in the park. And he kept spouting off about how Opie are the best treasures ever. I kind of looked to it. Heart and sort of the did the same thing. Maybe the Hyoto would notice me more or something, but nothing. With Invigold saying, I'm sorry to hear. So, yeah, let's go ahead and get into that. Invigold says, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Issei starts. Yeah, I realized how much they didn't care about 17 years too late. I had a feeling my grandma would have adopted me if she could. Actually, Yamamoto is her maiden name, so that's where the name comes from. Anyway, my stupid perversion looped me into the supernatural. Got killed by my first girlfriend, died again defending someone who didn't understand feelings, and nearly killed a third time by a plethora of females because I got a harem. But it felt like a lie, when things get thrown in your face. What happened? Immigul said. Well, my so-called friends decided to sleep with my so-called harem. Actually, it was the harem that seeked them out. It made me wonder if they ever really loved me. You don't know this, but I was in a coma before I took an attack that was meant for someone else. Someone like you. His name was Volley Lucifer. Hearing that name made Invigold gasp in shock, as she thought she was the only one. It made sense based on what Issei said earlier about dealing with people like her. Hurt. Man, it hurt. Like hell. And I entrusted him to look out for my girls, my loved ones, while well, he certainly took care of them by taking them to his bed, my bed and smashing them in it, as he clenched his fist, which Invigold grabbed in to calm him down, not just him, but the guys that I met throughout my time in the supernatural world, they also did it with them, I discovered that a few were cheating on me, oh and my friend Irina, she was a part of it as well, she came back for a mission, then she wasn't a good friend, Invigold says, no. But she was now with my grandmother. My grandmother loved both of us as her grandchildren. And let me tell you, before meeting you, I was royally pissed with Irina. She was my first friend. However, I found that by overcoming my anger, I could go as far as a person. That was thanks to my grandma, Issei said. Maybe she is guilty, and your grandmother is helping her to overcome her guilt like she did for you in your anger. You seem like you're becoming a better person. Maybe Irina will become one too. So, that is two people that your grandma has helped in their darkest times, Uncle said. Maybe. I honestly, I just suck. I wondered why they cheat. I thought it was perversion, but I never really asked them to do anything perverted. They just did it. For example, the so-called leader of my former harem just slept naked. Then others started to do it. So please don't try to do it, Imgold. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay, Mughal says, though she had a blush on her face about the prospects, but if Issei didn't like it, she would listen. The first one to copy, Rius. The former leader was Azia. She was soft-hearted like you are, Mughal. I risked my life for her, and this is what she did to me. Remember my ex-girlfriend that killed me? Well, she was a fallen angel and killed Azia too. But I begged Rius to revive her. To make matters worse because of my trauma with Rainer, she's the ex-girlfriend Azia and the one that said they would never hurt me like Rainer did and she was right. They didn't hurt me like Rainer did. They did worse by cheating on me and blatantly doing so, which the Hyoto agreed to hide their activities from me so I would never know. However, being a dragon, thanks to my senses, I picked up on what they were doing. I already caught volley with some of them, Issei finished. I'm sorry to hear that, Issei-san, uncurling her fist and holding his hand. It's fine, I mean now at least. Though I think I spooked you when I meant you no harm. It was because you reminded me of Azia and I was having flashes to her betrayal, Issei says. I'm sorry that I made you relive it, Invigolder says. She had her own tears silently streaming down her face. No, don't me. I had to remind myself that you're not her, Issei says. I will never 
be like her, Magor replied with as much conviction in her voice that she could muster. Something tells me that you won't, as he let out a slight chuckle. Anyways, after I was told that I would never get by them, I fought Rhea's cousin, Syra Orc Biel, where I proclaimed my love for her in front of the Underworld and the other deities that were in attendance. I won that fight and I was rewarded by taking a promotion test to become middle class demon. Around then, the Underworld was attacked and I chased the dragon goddess named Orphis. She also betrayed me. She slept with Vali. It was that I died a second time by killing Shalba Beelzebub. Yeah, another descendant of the original Mal like you. I guess you can understand why I was a bit wary of you. Issei said. No, I understand. Did you meet anyone from my clan? Vigil says. Yeah, her name was Katria, but I didn't fight her, and she never displayed her prowess of water manipulation. She killed herself with a self-destruct spell. She tried to take Azazel, who was my second father figure, but she failed. But I kind of wish she succeeded, Issei said. You said was. He also betrayed you too, Invigold replied. Oh yeah, caught him in action. He even mocked me for not claiming them. When she should know the ordeal that I went through because of his faction, because Rainer was his subordinate. But anyway, I killed Shalba. I was dying from Samuel's poison. The other souls of the boosted gear gave themselves up so that I could live. Thus, Great Red and Orphis were together at Drake's request to save me, and I got this new dragon body. Great Red, Invigil says, the other dragon god, or the dragon of dragons. He has a delinquent attitude, but he's pretty cool. They resurrected me and helped me defend the underworld, he says, said. But you're not full dragon, Invigil replied. Yeah. After I was betrayed, Drake helped me with a ritual that set the boosted gear into a sleep mode and turned my body to that of a human. I've been training to get my dragon back, and then I can go to see my loved ones once again, Issei says. Not everyone betrayed you, Vigil says. No, not everyone. Issei smiled. The new Mal's have my back, and it's kind of interesting that I met you. When I'm engaged to the new Mal Leviathan, you may like her. Sarachon is from the Seatree clan, who can specialize in using water magic, but she elevated hers to ice magic. She is currently the strongest woman in the underworld. The second would probably go to my big sister, Grafia. She's Sir Zex's wife. Sir Zex is the new Mal Lucifer. He's more on a path of pacifism compared to the old Mal ways. That's nice. I never liked the old Mal anyways. I believe that is why my parents moved to the seaside where I grew up, and Vigil says, oh, then you would get along with the mouths? Plus, I could vouch for you, Issei said. Really? And Vigil replied, yeah, I still have people that care about me, so I got to get stronger for them, but also for me, Issei says. I would like to get stronger, Vigil replied. That's why I said we can help each other since it's getting late here. We can focus on your hand-to-hand -hand combat tomorrow, Re Issei said, relaxing on the field near the stream. Really? And Vigil replied, yeah, you're my friend, Invigold, so I want to help you out as my friend. Call me Issei, Issei said. Issei? Invigold says, yeah, Issei replied. Well, I am sorry that happened to you, Issei-san. Thanks, the pain is still there, but I'm working on it. You know, I feel like I suck at romance when it's all I ever wanted. Even with wanting a harem, I just wanted to be surrounded by people that loved me. My ex-girlfriend said that no one would love a pervert like me. I thought that wasn't true with Rias and the others, but I was wrong. Since they cheated on me, that's not love. Even though Sarachan said I could have a harem, I am a little afraid though. I would still like to also like that male commaderate as well. Reform my family, you know, Issei said. Reform your family, Mughal says, yeah. I lost people, but I still have people. I mean, Sarachan told me to meet new people while I'm training out here, and I met you. Maybe there are others. I just need to find them, Issei says. Well, I want to live this age with you, Issei says. Imigul says, I'd like that, Issei replied, smiling at her as she returned. Her tears had dried up as they both looked at the sky, enjoying each other's silence. Hey, Invigil, can you sing for me? I don't know why, but hearing you sing these past days while here has been comforting, closing his eyes to listen to her. Okay, she quickly looked at him and then looked at the sky of something or someone that gave her the lyrics to sing. She cleared her throat and sang. I'm not singing. Okay, so if you think that's going to happen again, it won't. Okay, well, I'm going to do it. I'm not actually singing. I'm just going to read it. Make my wish come true, let the darkness slip aside, hiding all of our hope, mocking what we treasure. Battles we can win if we believe our souls hang into the light till dawn. Fate will not leave you. Hate will not heal you. Pray and one day peace shall flow everywhere. Fate will not leave you. Hate will not heal you. 
pray in one day peace shall flow everywhere. As Invigil is sung, the lavender light particles emerged around her, and for Issei, the warm embrace of the slumber took him. He felt like he was falling, but he felt no wind rushing in his face. Suddenly he stopped, and he felt like he was floating. It was like he felt like he was in space. Whoa, this is just like the dimensional gap, Issei said. You would be correct, Hatchling, the mysterious figure said. Issei took back around to the giant mass of red and gold horn. It didn't take him long to realize that he was facing Great Red. Great Red! Oh, sh that's right. We need to talk. You said a couple of days ago, Issei said. You would be correct. So tell me, what happened with this change of yours, Great Red said. Well, you see, as Issei gave Great Red the rundown of the betrayal, the ritual he had to do, explaining why Drake is sleeping, and what he chose to do. How interesting. So what do you intend to do, Great Red says. To be honest, nothing. I'll let the factions handle it. It's not really my problem right now. I'm going to focus on me, Say says. Guess that explains why some dream shows sadness regarding you. It's what piqued my interest to seek you out. But I could not find you, Great Red said. Really, Issei replied. Considering how your body resonates as mostly human, due to the ritual you putting on a reset, I could not find you. I could not set Orphus's presence, so I had to seek my own. Guess you were solely awakening your dragon body again, Great Red said. Yeah, due to the ritual, I expelled Orphus's power from me, and Drake used his as a replacement. Ah, his power will integrate with my own, along with the other powers that you have obtained, such as the Blade Ascalon, and the power of the Hurakaku that you stole, <laughs> Great Red said. That's what Drake said as well, Issei replied. Good, because you'll need it. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I have seen some not-so-pleasant dreams. A new threat is coming, Great Red said. What? Then I have to go back to where the war and the factions, Issei said. No, they already know, or at least they are aware, Great Red says. But why didn't they tell me, Issei replied. Because you would do what you're about to do, be reckless and get into a fight that you have not trained for. You may have matured a little, but you're still the same hatchling. Have faith in your allies, and train yourself so you can use your powers to the fullest. You will need to awaken Drake. You need him for this fight, Great Red says. I understand. He felt helpless, despite that he was getting stronger. He felt like he was not a full-fledged dragon, nor did he have Drake. It was just meant that enemies are stronger than he realized, much stronger than the exorcist he killed. Hmm, how interesting. I did not realize this. But you won't be a full-fledged dragon, but rather a hybrid, Great Red said. A hybrid, but of what? Well, a hybrid of dragons. You will mostly be a true dragon thanks to my flesh, but also that of an evil dragon, Great Red said. But I was supposed to be cured of any traces of an evil dragon thanks to the ritual, Issei said. That may be true. If you didn't kill one at all, and had obtained its essence, which is also merging with you, Great Red said, killed one, but I didn't. He stopped as his eyes widened. Apophysis. Mm, the Eclipse Dragon. His power would be useful for you, the Dark Field Barrier. While he used primal water, the prime aspect of the technique is merging with your fire, Great Red said. I remember that technique. It was capable of nullifying the effects of Phoenix Tears, Issei said. It would be useful in degrading any regeneration techniques of your enemies, Great Red said. Wow. I didn't think his essence would remain in me. Before he died, he told me to come back and fight him one day. He had more honor than I'd give an evil dragon credit for. Definitely more honor than Vali. Speaking of which, wouldn't the possibility of, of the essence of Azidaka... It's a possibility, though it seems his communication with Albion is practically severed. Albion doesn't talk with him and feels dishonored that Volley stooped so low for a fight, Great Red said. A fight? He f those so he could have a fight? Instead of just asking me? Man, Apophysis was right. A battle with no honor is the lowest of low. I know he was referring to Rizavim at the time, but Volley has become delusional to become the one thing that he hated. You know what? He just wanted to cuck me because he couldn't beat me. He had the advantage in our first meeting, but after that, he slipped and I caught up. And he's no longer in the race. He probably thinks round one goes to him. <laughs> he lost the moment he slept with them because he didn't have the balls to face me my himself. 
only thing he'll win is an STD snorting at Folly's incompetence. Incompetence. Besides, from the time he went with those bitches to his apartment, and when they returned to the Hyotos, it was only an hour to at best. I went all night with the Mao, so I can go longer in bed than he can. They chose a two-pump chump. Ha <laughs> ha You are correct, Great Red said. It's what separates the demon from the dragon, and he is just a demon. Just like his ancestors, he has no honor. Do you know he already had a maid who allowed this to happen? She wanted to see what type of woman you would get attached to. I looked into her dreams, Great Red said. Well, she did show me. Rias was the one that brought Volley into my room and claimed that I would do the same to her. If the roles were reversed, if I'm being honest, I'm gonna look at the girls, but I wouldn't blatantly cheat like she did. Her parents were distraught because of how they spoiled her and her attitude trickled down to the rest of them, thinking they could do whatever they want, Issei says. So have you decided to seek revenge? Did you use the curse? Would you sleep with Volley's woman if given the chance? Great Red said. At this point, no. It's not worth my time, and I wouldn't stoop so low to their levels. I'm not sleeping with Subaki, nor Valerie, Sona, Momo, Rukiko, and so forth just because they slept with my former girls. It's not worth it to me. I walked away while it may seem cowardly, but it gave me time to focus on myself. I was always doing something for somebody, putting others ahead of myself. Now I can just focus on myself, meet new people along the way, though I may not open up so easily. You opened up pretty well to that girl who is snuggling up to you, Great Red said. Snuggling up to, oh, Anvigold, yes, I guess I did. But she also had some trust issues of her own, so we're like two broken people that found each other, Issei said. And there are others that are broken, not to the extent of you, but broken. I have seen your dreams. You want to reform yourself, but also your broken family and reform a new one. There are people that will fit well to you, both male and female. Those you can call friends when you explain your truths to them. Same those that can be your new lovers. Lovers? Did you say that I would have a male and female lovers? Issei said, <laughs> Drake was right about you. You are a funny one, Hatchling. Unless you swing that way, you could have male lovers, but no. You would have male care on me, other than with the leaders. As for the females, well, you'll have some good options. One is already with you. You already made it with another. Others are scattered about, but in time they will come to you. As a bonus, they are stronger than your former ones, though a few of your former lovers have the potential to be stronger. It all depends on the path they take arrive moving forward. I'd say a couple of them are making that climb, Great Red says. So you're telling me that I can end up reuniting with my former lovers after betraying me like they did? That depends on you. But not likely as you did the ritual. But it appears that some bonds are harder to break than others. But it is not likely to me that you will hop into bed with them. Well, maybe if you're in heat, Great Red says. In heat, Easy replies. You are becoming a dragon again. You had the momentary lapse of it. When you went to bed with your first mate, Great Red says. First mate? Oh, you mean Seraphal, Easy replied. Yes, because you are more of a dragon than your former friends. Let's say your prowess in the bedroom is on a different level. Not surprising why a harem is needed for a dragon, Great Red said. It made Issei blush as Seraphal told him something similar. Of course, mentioning that she would like to use her legs the next day. But no matter, you were able to get your urges out, so you should be able to control yourself in the sack. You will be capable of satisfying your partner or partners regardless, Great Red said. I see, Issei replied. I suppose you wouldn't wipe me striking down Orphis if she were to appear in the dimensional gap, since you don't want revenge, 
Great Red says, It would be too much a hassle for you. Besides, either she gets hit by the fall herself, or she reduces whatever emotion she thought she had learned. Either way, she will wallow in despair for eternity. So let it just go. It's not our problem. I'm going to live my life and not worry about theirs. My grandmother did tell me that at some point I will confront them, but that's not right now. Just let the chips fall where they may, Issei says. Very well. I knew I liked you, Hatchling. You stay true to yourself. A pity that the Opai Dragon is no more. I look forward to seeing you rise. Maybe you will become a Dragon God one day, Great Red says. Nah, I just want to be me. In time, we'll see. By the way, how's Lilith, Chani? Issei said. Who? Great Red said replied. The one that looks like Orphis, but her hair is in a ponytail, and instead of dull gray eyes, Lilith Chan has brown eyes. The one that you would literally took off as means of not her leading another terrorist organization. He literally deadpanned at that. Oh yeah, about that. She left. Great Red said. Wait, she left or you lost her? He says said. No, she left. She got too bored and just left. Great Red said. Why didn't you stop her? She would likely seek out Orphis or me. He says said. Good thing she went looking for you first, then. She's currently with the foxes. The foxes? Oh, Yakuza's son and Koachan? That's good. Why is she there? He says, said. Currently trying to be an artist, he chuckled. As long as she's okay, I mean, hopefully they keep her busy. But how did she get there? Your mate took her there. Oh, wow. At least she's with Sarachan. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No, you seem to be doing well. But I should tell you that when you confront those who hurt you, you listen to the full story. Some reasons may be silly and stupid. Some may be understandable. It all depends on your perspective, Great Red says. I'll keep that in mind. But the focus is awakening Drake. If there's a new threat out there, Issei said. Ah, uh, yes. Using more of your draconic energy, it may help with accelerating your body. It's dragon recovery. Got it. Oh, and I got my trait. It's desolation. Desolation. A state of complete destruction of emptiness, Great Red said. Destruction, huh? Guess it makes sense in those images that I saw during my test and how I felt for what they did to me, Issei said. Mm, something else is inside you. You will need its power for what's to come ahead. Powers that were once extinct will resurface and you must prepare to face them. I wish you the best, Issei Yamamoto, Great Red said. Hey, I never told you about the name change. I can see your dreams of the past, future, present. My only regret was not looking into the dreams of those that hurt you, so I could prevent you from what you have endured. That is where I failed you, Hatchling. I will have to cut our time short. You got a dragon to wake up. He blew a huff of smoke from his maw that clouded Issei and he gasped himself awake. As Issei took gaps of air, he found that he was still outside and he sat with Invergold. Speaking of the girl, Issei realized that she didn't leave his side and left his bicep which engulfed her breast. While in her head rested on her shoulder, he was lucky that she remained asleep. When he woke up, he shifted slightly. He felt her grip around his arm tightened. He decided to relax and let out a sigh. And when he did, he felt her grip loosen. It made him chuckle that she did this subconsciously. It did remind him that Ozia did something similar, though he remembered that there was no influence of Rias that could turn Invigold against him. He decided to start wiggling his arm, which prompted Invigold to once again tighten her hold. It also gave Issei a good feel of her breast. Invigold, you've got to wake up, Issei says, nudging her head with his shoulder. She elicited a small moan as she began to wake up, blinking her eyes. Open, she lifted her head and looked around. Warning Invigold from her reaction, it seemed that she forgot where she was and shook a little at the sound of his voice. Oh, Issei san, good morning, Invigold says. Well, we got some training to do, Issei replied. Oh, Invigold said, she wasn't exactly keen on training. Come on, it'll be fun. Plus, I could teach you some hunting stuff. I got to head out next week or the week out of side of the world for my finals if i had to deduce it's probably been a couple of days out there since it's been about a little more than a week for us okay Invigold says so let's get to it we can both get stronger together as she stood up from the ground and held out his hand to her Issei said right taking his hand as he held off the ground Invigold did they both stretched as they headed back to drake's home to cave for the rest of the day First thing, we gotta get up the weapon that you're comfortable with. For me, it's double-edged broadswords or daggers, because it's what I am familiar with. The sword is because of my training with Ascalon and Arondite. The daggers are because my... 
mentor Tanin gave them to me, so I decided to train in how effectively to use them. Issei said, Really? What do you think your weapon could be? My weapon could be, Invigil says, Hmm, you could be sneaky, so maybe daggers could work for you, too. But it should be something that suits your magic, so your water element. So maybe the staff are possibly a Najida like Tsubaki-san. Tsubaki-san, Invigil says, Oh, yeah, she's cer currently the vice pre uh, student council president. She's strict like the president. Oh, man, I hope she can handle the situation since Kiba was involved, Issei said. Um, do you think that you can state the names of everyone that you know? I know you told me your story but didn't give all the names, so it's hard to know who betrayed you and who didn't. Immigold says, that's true, and as a bonus, I think I may have a group picture of somewhere on my phone, so I can name it to a face, Issei said. That would be helpful, Ingol replied, as the two walked back to the cave, talking about other things and planning on their training schedules. Now, we're transferring to Ko Academy, so scene change, we're in Ko now. It is now about midweek, and things in the school have changed. Well, at least for some people. In the student council, Sona was actually chill. She had no paperwork to worry about, thanks to Tsubaki, or rather thanks to Irina, who Tsubaki made among them other things in the school. Sona had also taken her finals week in advance. So, while other students were cramming during this week, she had nothing to worry about now. She is the laid-back and her soon-to-be former chair, even had her legs kicked up on the desk. Who knew that an audio could... Do several people, Sona said, lifting her arms behind her head and exhaled. She felt so relaxed. Unless Rhea storms into her office for the third time this week about damages done to her precious RC building, it was either that or learning of the most precautious students who had sex in there. It took all of Sona's composure to not laugh when Rhea said how a pair of students had the audacity to ask her to join them of one of the here graffiti on the door some students have even actually harassed the girls trying to cup a feel of the breasts of their butts akino had the misfortune yesterday of having her school house ripped open when a student tripped and even worse was that akino wasn't wearing a bra that day so those in the hallways at the fight had fucking material it was kind of hypocritical i preferred the male students could and they criticized isei in the past the females just basically ignored them or gave them some side remarks it infuriated rias that she had to try and erase a good portion of students' minds, of course. Sona scolded her for this because accidents happen in the school. Sona even threatened to inform the Gremory clan of this, which caused Rias to relent, so very few students had the luxury of Akino's breasts shaded into their mind. Unfortunately, none of them got pictures. Zenobia was usually asked about sex in the one, and that was because students remembered when she bought condoms to class that one day earlier in the year. They would also cop a few of her ass when asked by persons by couples. Azia had similar treatment, but even worse was that Akia barely talked to her. She would mistake Akia's perverted comments of her getting the on as jokes, very unaware that they were insults to her sleeping around Kiba, and Gasper would usually get solemn looks and a rare apology, which would also confuse the two, but they made note of asking Ross Vaisa about what happened. If they weren't so busy handling repairs, Irina was treated fairly as the same as before, but would ignore others. She usually a loner, some with Konako, but no one really considered her as a mascot anymore. Enjoying yourself, Kijachu? Sabaki says, entering the office, knowing Sona long enough, she had never seen her president so relaxed just enjoying the day i have finals you made irina handle the paperwork for now the grammar girls is considered easy lays or easy fucks by some of the student body rias complains about having to pay for damages done to her building i don't think she realizes that the money is that isei left them Plus, they will have to pay for college next year zictodius is not giving her nor any of the free ride sona says I suppose that's true. It also means that Irina's words have helped to not affect the lifestyles of Kiba and Gasper. Tsubaki says, Yeah, that's true. She hasn't caused you any trouble then, has she? Sona says, Nope, she's quite obedient, Tsubaki replied. Pity. Now I wish we could have her earlier in the year. Would have made the paperwork a little easier. I didn't think you were one to take things easy, Couch, Tsubaki says. I suppose you're right. I wonder what problem Rias will complain about now, Sona says. 
She might not be going to you about that, Tsubaki says. Do you know something? Sona replied, yes. I believe Rias is going to confront Irina in the courtyard, since she believes Irina is still part of her club and should know why their school life has changed. Really? She must be mad about how no one worships her and because students like breakfast in the club. She probably thinks that Irina would have watched over it, Sona says. Well, I suggest we get to the courtyard, Tsubaki says. She's confronting her already? I thought she would do more planning or maybe not attract as much attention. As if to answer her question, they heard the screech of Irina from outside and President and Vice President looked out the window. They could see Rias marching up towards Irina with Akino by her side. It seemed that Zenovi was holding on to Irina to prevent her from escaping, and Ozzy was trying to calm the struggling angel and Konako stood next to the excommunicated nun. Students were beginning to gather around, but kept their distance due to Rias' violent attitude. Shh, you're right, let's go, Sona says. Tsubaki was a bit stunned since she never usually hears Sona curse before and she used a lot of changes in Sona's attitude. Prior to the screech, while Sona and Tsubaki were talking, some of the students were fascinated by the pink-haired woman that walked down their halls. She wore a black blouse and ripped jeans with black carver shoes. It didn't take long for someone to look at her, but turn away because of her stern gaze. Lightning can hear the mention to them about being related to someone named Kadase. She didn't know who that was. She finally reached the classroom that she was looking for and knocked, and that's when Ross bites his voice, allowing her to enter, and she did. Oh, um, uh, can I help you? Are you a new student? Ross bites, uh, she remained of the sense of the power that came from this woman. How did she get past Sona and Rias? You don't know who I am, but I know who you are. Your grandmother has told me a lot about you, and yes, I know what you did, Lightning says. Rosvice frowned. She was aware that the factions knew about the infidelities she had, and yet to Kiba and Gasper. That was due to her preparing tests for the students' finals. Before you answer, I'm on your side. I know you were drugged. That's not why I'm here. Honestly, I came to scout your Parage member, Kiba Yoto, Lightning said. What do you need him for, Rosvice replied. To face him in a duel for Graham. I will need the blade, Lightning said. For what? Getting defensive. It's already bad enough that we have a raiding game coming up. I heard about that and no. I intend for our duel to be after your raiding game. And also here, handing over the flash drive, I taped some of my training centers with Bielthor so he's aware of who he is facing, Lightning said. Brynhildr, you trained under her. She was impressed, as it was not often that Brynhildr takes interest in someone, but this woman did not feel like a Valkyrie. She was like a human, but different. Yes, I probably should tell you that I am not from here, and by here, I mean your world. From what I was told, an old enemy of ours, Rezavim, I think that was his name, he got greedy and wanted to rule other worlds, so he sent the evil dragons, which caused a rift and allowed to be opened, and I was pulled by the goddess Etro to be her Valkyrie in Valhalla, Lightning said. Amazing. I know Valhalla is where those that are slain in battle go, Rospices says. That's what I hear. By the way, your grandmother sends her regards, and for your information, the people of Asgard are on your side as well, Lightning says. I, uh, her eyes welled up and she fought back tears. A part of it was expecting them to treat her like school is treating the girls. I don't know what to say, Rospices says. Well, to me, now that I have seen you, you certainly don't look like someone to cheat willingly. And yes, I saw his memories, personally. I think you should stay away from him for a little while, because that was the last time he saw you, on your knees and on your back. It made Rospisa wince. Oh, sorry I had to be crude. It was my first time seeing you as well. I see, you haven't met Isekan yet. No. Despite his perversion, he seems like a reasonable soldier, but reckless. Reminds me of my sister's fiancé, Lightning said. You had a sister? I had a sister. Oh, I'm sorry about your loss. If I may ask, if you're not from the other world, what do you do for Asgard? Currently, I am your former position as Odin's bodyguard. Probably why I can overlook Issei's perversion, though I am curious, what did Odin tease you? Because for me, it was about never taking my armor off, so he couldn't judge the size of my breast, and you seem to have plenty. So it does make me wonder what he teased you for. Oh, is that never finding a boyfriend because I was always trying to be professional, Rospizer said. I get that sometimes too, but due to my military background, it's to be expected. Romance was more of my sister's thing. If I may ask, what was... She was interrupted by Rias' shriek. Oh no, what now? Getting up from her desk to leave the room. Trouble, Lightning says, moving out from Rosweiss and following her. Most likely, Rosweiss said. In the courtyard, Rias trotted towards Irina, who was telling Zenovia to let go. And Ozzy was saying how they just wanted to talk with Konoko nodding in agreement. Irina, what happened while we were gone? Where have you been, Rias said. 
Irina said nothing. She turned her attention from Zenovia to Rias and just stared. Well, are you going to say something? Rias said. We should know probably to do with this club. Rias, there's too many eyes here, Akino said, whispering towards Rias. I know, but we have to know why things changed and Sona doesn't seem to be much help right now, Rias said, whispering back. Akino gave a nod as she understood. Sona didn't seem to care much about their problems. Add on to the embarrassment of having her breast be seen, she really wished she wore a bra yesterday because... Now a few people think that she goes commando. It's already bad enough that they are rumored to have slept with two perverts, which she didn't know where was the from they never interacted with them. Well, Rhea says, turning back to Irina, our club has been ransacked and you weren't there. Do you have any idea who did it? No, but for what it's worth, the club deserved it, Irina said. Deserved it, Rhea said, getting in Irina's face. For what? For the damage we've done to others, Irina says. What damage? Shoving Irina back. I never heard anybody, Rhea says. Some students in the crowd grimaced at that statement and winced. And Irina winced. But you did, her voice was a whisper, but Rhea could hear her, thanks to her devil hearing. There was some gasp from the small crowd as Irina's head was turned to her right. A handprint could be seen and Rias' arm could be seen stretched out. I don't know where you heard that, but this defamation has gone on long enough. Right now, the only person that I have hurt is you, and frankly, I'm not sorry about that. Maybe you should apologize for your slander. It gives me reason to believe you did all of this. Before she whispered in Irina's ear, some angel you are. You're right. I already failed at that, Irina says. It was not the answer that Rias was expecting. Rias' eyes widened a little, but she remained calm and kept her glare. So you admit it. You did all of this. Caused the rumors, damaged the RC building, slandering our reputation. Huh? Rias said. You did that yourself, Irina replied. Well then, don't call coming bother coming back to the club. Irina saw, just apologize. Please, you're my friend. I don't want to see you go, Ozzy has said. Have you paid any attention? I resigned from that a while ago. The reason for me being there is no longer there, but I stupidly listened to the ones I called friends and should have stuck to my faith, Irina said. Faith? Puh! Scoffing at Irina, Rias did. Did your faith tell you to slander other people? It's already bad enough that some people think we those two perverts. Maybe you're jealous that Val Volley likes us better, smirking at Irina with Akino smirking as well as then leaning to Irina's ear, or jealous that Kiba enjoys Zenovia more than you. It made Zenovia smirk a little and she let go of Irina's folded her arms across her chest. Guess it can't be helped that I'm better than you, huh, Irina, Zenovia said. No, it's just bad that I stooped to your level. My only mistake was ever looking up to you, thus listening to you. And then I wouldn't have done some of the choices that I did. And I definitely have a happier life than you. Then turning her attention back to Rias, Any of you, Irina said. Zenovia felt a small pang in her heart when Irina said that. I doubt that, Rhea says, turning to Akino. Guess this is what happens when parents raise a delusional child. Maybe that's why they sent her away. The comment made Akino and Rias giggle. Even Zenovia stifled a laughter. And she knew sometimes Irina could get lost in her own world. Azia turned away, while Konako smirked to chuckle herself. Unfortunately, none of them were paying attention as if Irina's first swung and made contact with Rias' node. <laughs> ah! Rias said as she hit the ground, writhing in pain. Rias! Akino says, kneeling down to her injury. Onisama! Azia said. Irina! Grabbing Irina's outstretched arm and Konako grabbing her legs. Zenovia did. Insult me all you want. But don't you dare bring my parents into this. They may be disappointed by my actions, but I'm sure yours are devastated by yours, Irina said. Rias gritted her teeth, clenching her nose. There were some small cheers for Irina by some of the crowd's students as well, which did not suit Rias either. You bitch, Rias says. That's enough, Sona replied, making her presence known as she entered the fray. You two, addressing Zenovia and Konako, let her go and help your president back to your clubhouse. Irina Shoto, come with me to the student council's office, Sona said. There were some protests by some of the students saying how Rias initiated the skirmish and threw the first slap. However, Sona was having none of it and told them to go home, since it was the end of the day. This isn't over, Rias said. No, Rias, it is, Sona says, sparing a side glance at her parage, escorted Irina to the student council office. I just hope you're prepared for what comes next, Sona says. It made all the Gremory girls, except Ross Faisa, stiffen at those words, felt foreboarding. Rhea shivered slightly at her anger dissipated, trying to understand Sona's word, not whining a fight. They helped Rhea to the ORC, where Kiba and Gaspar were making repairs. We should go to the student council, Ross Faisa. As the crowd was whispering, you're not going to help your mistress, Lightning said. I don't think she'll be my mistress for long, Ross Faisa said. How did you end up with her anyways? Odin-sama left me... 
a faction meeting and I had nowhere else to go besides Hiyoto Mansion. Rias then provided me with benefits of joining her parade, despite as she asked her family are good people. So I join. As the two follow the student council, I see, considering her brothers, King of the Demons, is their leader, Lightning said. You met him, Rossweiser replied. Somewhat, there was a meeting to decide what to do with all of you, Lightning said. Is that where the raiding game was decided, Rossweiser replied. Who told you that, Lightning said. Sona did last week. Is that all she told you? Yes. Hmm, did I open my mouth a little too early about your banishment, Lightning said. It's fine. I expected something like that. But I am grateful to those people of Asgard, believe in me, Rossweiser says. Anyway, who is that girl? I know she is one of them that betrayed him, but who is she exactly? Irina? She's Issei's childhood best friend. She also once promised to be his guardian angel, but as you can see, she failed. She looked up to Zenobia, the blue-haired girl with green streak, and thus wound up listening to her to follow through with developing a crush with Kiba. I currently live with Kiba. He had to play nice because Rias threatened Tosaka, a friend of Kiba's. It seemed Irina was unaware of the threat. So all the times that she thought that Kiba was liking her were false. He only did that to protect his friend, but still betrayed his best friend in the process. Guess she sadly realized it too late, Lightning said yes. She's even gone out of her way to defend Kiba Khan and Gaspar Khan's reputation by stating that they were not involved in the infidelity despite being club members. Seeking some repentance, huh? Lightning said. Maybe she's already branded herself, hence the bandages on her left arm, Rospisa says. At least she is acknowledging her mistakes. I don't know Issei well enough to hate her, but I definitely don't like your mistress. She seems so... Spoiled, Rossweiser Spice says. Yeah, her brother apologized about that in the meaning. Guess that spoiled attitude has gotten the best of her. Indeed, Rossweiser Spice says. And this is where they confront them at the ORC clubhouse. This is where uh, Rias and Irina just got into the fight. Now they're both being taken away from each other. And, you know, now we're located in the ORC clubhouse. The Grammar girls had gotten Rias into the main room, which was now repaired, thanks to Kiba and Gasper, who usually did the labor at school. They saw Rias with their busted with her busted nose and didn't say anything, he continued on to fixing the damages that they could find or cleaning up with the graffiti and used condoms left behind. Lol. They were times where they interrupted a student session, but they would ask those students to clean up after themselves, since Irina spoke on behalf of Kiba and Gasper students would usually respect their wishes and clean up, but also tell Kiba and Gasper that the or should be working and not them. Now, in the main room, Ozzy was healing Rias's nose. She was saddened by the turn of events. She could not believe her friend would trash talk about her and spread insightful rumors about them. She also believed it was about jealousy between Irina, Zenobia, and Kiba because Zenobia was a little more aggressive in her approach. Guess she did resign, Rias said, having been going through the paperwork that was on the desk and finishing Irina's resignation, but also Ravel's. So did Ravel, but hers was dated earlier than Irina's, Rias said. We haven't seen Ravel in a while either. Guess she was having major clan issues, possibly the distribution of Phoenix Tears. There was many injured in the war, Azia said. Hmm. Yakutari, enjoying her snacks, Konako said. True. I haven't heard anything from her parents or brothers, so it should be fine, Rias said. Still can't believe Irina would bow up mouth us. Some friend she was, Zenobia said. It doesn't matter. Guess you can't help that you're a better than she was, and besides, you'll be the student council president. Those students may think of your offering your sexual favors, but I'm sure you will rule with an iron fist and make those like Irina suffer for crossing us like that, Rias said. Uh, Akino said she wasn't benefiting of an angel at all. At I don't understand at all why she was chosen, Akino says. They all agreed, but as Azia looked through the window's reflection, she saw Akino staring back at her with a smirk. She looked at Akino physically and saw the smirk was gone. She let out a sigh, believing it just to be her imagination, as Akino was still serving tea to the others. She saw something in the reflection again. It was Akino with a sneer. <laughs> you really are a stupid bitch, Akino said. How could you say that, Azia replied, getting the attention of all the others in the room. Say what, Azia said, Rhea said. I thought uh, I heard Akino son insult me, Azia replied. I didn't say anything, Azia, and if I did, I didn't mean to offend you, Akino said. It's okay, it must be due to my lack of sleep that I'm imagining things, Azia said. You too, huh, Azia senpai, Konako replied. You have nightmares too, Konako chan, Azia said. Yeah, they kind of suck, but I get in the time before anything bad happens and let my ears or tails cut my senjutsu is not working properly, Konako said. Hmm, let's have a sleepover in my room, that way we can be with each other, Rhea said. Hmm, maybe we can invite the boys for some fun, or rather have some fun of our own, Akino says. I don't think Kiba and Gasper would be interested, since they work on fixing the repairs. They probably would be too tired to get it up. I haven't heard anything from Volleycon, and Sona hasn't spoken about Gencon since the last time I asked, Rhea said. 
then we can enjoy ourselves then. I guess you and Rhea, Spirit Show, have done this before, huh? I know Senpai Zenobia says, more or less. <laughs> Sometimes we need to keep busy while Volikon is getting physical with someone else, Akano says. It may help Azia and Konako sleep better if we're all together anyways, Rhea says. I finished healing your nose, Azia said. Onisama seems like it was just a crack, so nothing too bad, but I'm okay for a sleepover, Azia said. Me too, Konako replied. Then it's a sleepover for the remainder of your school year, and remember, we will stuttle for your finals, Rhea said. Akano, Azia, Konako, and Zenobia said, of course. Azia felt happy. Looking around, she knew that Irina could break them. Maybe she was just imagining things. Unfortunately, when she looked back through the reflection, Akana was smirking at her again. I can't wait to enjoy your body tonight, Akana says, licking her lips. Azia shivered, but while she was imagining things, a part of her was thinking that Akano was messing with her. So a part of her was aroused of sleeping with Akano, since she didn't really do anything with Ravel when they slept with Genshiro. She didn't do anything with the other girls in the orgy they had weeks ago. She took those doubts out of her head. She wasn't going to tell a little silly reflection ruin her day, unaware that the reflection was staring at her, also the other girls. Oh, little Azia, naive as ever. Hmm, I get, I guess, a taste of that Rias, and she thinks she's better than me. Not going to lie. I would pimp out this hybrid's body, but in time, while our souls are one, I will return for my revenge, just you wait, with a smirk as she watched on. Now we're in the student council room. The Sea Tree Parage did as Sona instructed, bringing Irina to the student council office. The angel did not reverse, and just numbly followed. She didn't make any complaints, other than the other students about how Rhea started a confrontation, and she simply just followed. However, they didn't see the Malaviathan sitting at the desk, smirking as she saw who entered. I must say that was quite the right hook. If you didn't, if you didn't hurt my fiance, I would have congratulated you. Sarah Falls said, "Fiance, wait a minute. Black hair, big boobs, blue eyes. She's gorgeous." Rakdasam was right. This must be Issei's fiance, Irina said. She stared in awe at the mound, gulped nervously. Hmm, she doesn't recognize me, Sarah Falls said. She stood up from the desk, being slightly taller thanks to the heels, and she was wearing, donning a black ikata as she received one in Kyoto and the golden emblem of the Citri Clan symbol. It's an honor to meet you here, Sona said. Malaviathan Sama, giving a quick bow to Seraphal. Malaviathan. But I thought Sona's older sister was the Mal. It doesn't matter, though. She is stronger than me in more ways than one, but unlike the others, Irina dropped to her knees and bowed to the Mal. You don't have to bow to me, Seraphal says. So so. And why do you bow to me like that? Irina, looking at the angel bowing at her feet, as she stood in front of her, Oh, and hello to you too, Rasfaisa and Lightning was it, Seraphal said, the shock to the student council members as they were not aware of the teachers in Valkyrie's presence. That would be correct, Lightning said, as the student council got a better look at her, despite her stern gaze, she was remarkably beautiful. Why are you guys here, Seraphal replied. Sorry, Leviathan Sama, but she is my student, destroying to bowing Irina, so I must see what punishment the council decides. Seraphal nodded, as over the past few days, being nagged by Merlin, who left in Kyoto with Lilith as payback, Merlin had been telling Seraphal to think as not a leader, but as a woman. Regarding Ross Vice's situation, it was an easier pill to swallow, since Ross Vice was innocent. Seeing how Lightning was here, she felt that there was a possibility that Asgard was considering annual banishment on the Grimmery Rook. Something told her that former Valkyrie needed to be summoned for compensation. She just didn't know what yet. She also knew that Merlin was right. It didn't help that Merlin teased her about girl-on-girl -girl action, like she once did Sona. How Merlin got this information was beyond her, but it didn't was another reason why she left the mage in Kyoto, and she had to babysit Lilith in the process. I see. Well, then why do you bow to me, Irina? Seraphal says. Irina was in shock at this so sister. After hearing the affectionate nickname of So So, since no one could see her face as she bowed, she had a smile on her face, wishing the best for Issei's new relationship. She already knew that Seraphalt was better than her. She snapped out of her shock hearing her name called, so she responded, trying to keep her voice steady. I I'm bowing in your presence, Leviathan Summit, and also thanks, Irina said. Thanks? What for? Seraphalt says. Her eyebrows raised an in inches. She was aware that Irina knew as Sona informed her of what happened. To thank you for saving Issei after I nearly killed him, Irina said. Killed him? How so? Seraphalt said. So Irina began to recount the events of how she almost killed Issei. From generating a crush on Kiba to following Zenobia's advice that she was Varius, to inform Gabriel of what they should do on the eventful day that Issei saw them, destroying his already fragile heart. She recalled about forgetting him, only for Ross Vice to try and help open her eyes, which she did. When the 
Adia was played and found out that Kiba and Gasper were threatened to be nice to her and give themselves to them, Kiba's love was never real, and the one that she had threw away. She mentioned the dreams she was having ever since Razai spoke to her, which she had spoken with Gabriel. Serval knew this thanks to Dulio's report at the meeting. Irina went to explain how Rata was helping her and how Razvaisa was watching her like she was on suicidal watch. Seraphal simply nodded at this information, but kept a neutral look on her face. She was not aware that Irina was Issei's grandmother, was with Issei's grandmother, but she knew that Harata was aware of the situation. She just didn't think that Harata's relationship with Irina was still there. It did make her appreciate her future grandmother-in-law for not going about it in anger, and she wondered if that is what Issei was thinking, when he let the factions decide the punishment instead. So that is why I thank you. I don't intend to interfere in your relationship with Issei. He deserves better than someone like me. She had to straighten herself up, but remained on her knees, but her head bowed. I see, but she was going to test that resolve as Irina and Irina as she kicked the angel at the side of her head, sending her crashing into the coffee table that was on the right. Onisama, Sona said. She was in shock after Seraphol and the rest of the occupants in the room. Lightning felt the need to intervene, but Rasvaisa stopped her. When Lightning looked at her, she could see a single tear roll down her cheek. It confused Lightning on when Rasvaisa wouldn't help her student, but also felt that Seraphol needed to get something out of her system. She watched as the mouse strode towards down the angel, who was still conscious. Seraphal picked up Irina by the hair. With her left hand, it was some ice magic coated around her right hand, slapped Irina multiple times. The others winced at each slap, even Tsubaki, who did the same thing a week prior. Seraphal covered that up with a few strikes to Irina's stomach. Irina felt like she couldn't breathe as Seraphal dropped Irina's cheek as she was bleeding and had some skin shaved off of the ice magic. Her head was groggy because Seraphal was much stronger than Tsubaki and the pain to her face and stomach. She felt like Seraphal was going to kill her. So you think that you're just going to waltz back into his life, Seraphal says. <coughs> no, wheezing and coughing. No, she clutched her stomach, tears welled in her eyes from the pain. Seraphal let out a sigh. She could see Irina was not a threat, but she needed to get some of that aggression out. She stepped over withening Irina and sat down on the couch next to her. Tell me, if Issei wanted you back as one of his lovers, would you accept it? Seraphal says, <laughs> I can't accept that. <coughs> she coughed up blood. Why is that? Seeing Irina cough up blood reminded her of when Issei did it. Be <coughs> cause some mistakes in life can be <coughs> rectified. Ta cannot be rectified. Taking some deep breaths before, however, <coughs> Infidelity isn't one of them, Irina said. It seems that Haratasan is leading her down a better path. Giving a nod to Irina, son, Seraphal said. Are you going to kill me, Irina said. Everyone's eyes widened at the question. Turning from the downed angel to the Mao, Lightning had summoned her gun blade. She may not like the girl, but she didn't feel like she deserved death for her repentance. Seraphal was still a little shocked at the question, but she knew that Issei would be disappointed in her. She knew that he didn't want anyone to die, even if they deserved it. The more Irina talked, it seemed that she was just another pawn in Rias' game. So was Gabriel. It almost made her feel bad for her former rival. The key word being almost. She hoped that this lesson would make future angels not be as naive moving forward. But she gave it to Rias, though. The girl knew how to talk the talk. For Irina, she was thinking that if Seraphal did kill her, she would never see her parents again. She knew it would be disappointing stares, but she would like to see them one last time. She wanted to thank Harato for taking her and showering the error of her, showing the error of her ways. She did not think she was going to see Issei ever again, but she wanted to thank him for taking a chance on all those years ago. When they were kids, she understood she failed to love him, but she wanted the best for him, even if he didn't forgive her. The thought crossed my mind, answering Irina's question, Seraphal said, I understand. Getting back up, those little two words, no matter how sincerely they're spoken, are not going to make up for what I've done, Irina said. But you are sorry. Your actions show that, but no, I am not going to kill you. My father, in many years, has told me that mercy bears richer fruits than strict justice. He heard it from the American president. I believe his name was Abraham Lincoln, Seraphal says. Uh, thank you. Irina said, sobbing despite her pain. It also made Seraphal feel bad for the girl, the key word once again being 
Almost. She scanned everyone else's look. She could tell some of them felt bad for the girl as she made amends. She could see that Tsubaki was conflicted, but could tell that the vice president still had some interest in the blonde prince. Lightning like had the neutral look, but she could also see the Valkyrie was ready to strike if need be, whereas Faisa had a sad look on her face directed at her student. I'm sorry, Falsama, Irina said, finishing her weeping. It still did hurt to talk because of her injured cheek. What is it? Seraphal said. I know I'm not one to order you around, but if Isid comes back, you should treat him with cheesecake, Irina says. And why is that? Setting a glare into the angel. It's his favorite dessert. At that, Seraphal dropped her glare and blinked, and then she realized something. Merlin gave Lilith some blueberry cheesecake, and that little dragon girl sees Issei as her big brother. At some point, Issei must have fed cheesecake to Lilith. But then, how did Merlin know? Lilith would like cheesecake. She facepalmed herself because Merlin would probably get the ways of getting information. That bitch, Seraphal said, shocking everyone with her language. Knowing that someone lunging in Kyoto, Merlin was smirking at her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean Irina said. No, 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 I wasn't talking about you, Seraphal said, pouting in annoyance, but then remembered Irina may be somewhat valuable about some things regarding Issei. Things that he would tell a friend than his grandmother when he was younger. Irina, I want you to write for me all of Issei's favorite things and hobbies. I'm sure you have secrets about him, Seraphal says. I, uh, okay, Irina says. The rest could only sweat drop at Seraphal's attitude when it came to Issei. Meanwhile, Lightning came forward and began to help Irina, and from the ground. Unfortunately, Irina gave out a whimper of pain and clutched around her abdomen. She's likely to get a cracked rib, Lightning said, knowing from her military experience. It made Seraphal wince a little. Since she did give her some credible information about Issei, Lightning was more gentle with helping the angel from the ground and cracked off the coffee table where she crashed into it. Sorry, Seraphal said. Don't be, Irina, wrenching in pain. She had it coming. Do you have an infirmary, Lightning said. Yes, I'll take you, Rosfaisa said. Wait, I would like your opinion about something, Irina. Irina gave a nod, indicating that Sona had her attention. Well, as you know, Zinovia was considered for nomination to be the student council president. She saw a frown on the mention of her former friend. Judging by your look, you don't seem pleased. May I ask if you have an alternative? Sona said. Well, I don't plan to be here after this school year, if she is nominated. Irina said. That piqued everyone's interests. Why is that? Seraphal says. Well, I plan to go home. Back to England and give up my angelhood as well, Irina said. Why would you give that up? Wouldn't it be better to become a fallen angel, Subaki says? No. I don't want those wings, and I don't deserve the ones that I have now. If anything, Seraphal Sama should have these wings than me, Irina said. Why do you think that? Seraphal replied. Because you were what I should have been. You were Issei's guardian angel. You helped him overcome his pain that I helped cause. Eyes dropping to the ground, acknowledging her failures, Arina did. I see. I thank you for your honesty, but please finish answering Sona's question. Right. It helped that Lightning could hold her steady, so she could talk without pain. Well, with Zenovia student council president, it just means that Rias would run the school and would probably ruin everything that you built, Katja's son, Irina said. So, you think there is an alternative candidate, Sona said? Mm, I think it should be Momo, Katja's son. They all looked at Momo, who was quite surprised at the nomination that Irina gave her. Momo? Why? Sona said. She was holding in her own smirk as she was thinking the same. Well, in a few days that I've been here, I've seen how she orchestrated things and shadowed you, so I figured that she has been doing it for the most part, if not all of her time, and would be able to continue developing the legacy that you've built. I see. Well then, I, Momo Hanakai, do you accept- or you, Momo- Hanaka, Hanaki, do you accept the nomination? Sona says, what? Momo replied, do you accept the nomination of being my successor? I thought it was self-explanatory, Sona said. But shouldn't there be like an election or something, Momo said? It's too late into the school year, considering that finals are next week. I doubt anyone would have time to make a campaign, and considering that Rias nominated Zenovia, I wasn't sure if any of you wanted the job, Sona said. Well, I accept your nomination, Irina-san, Momo said. I uh, don't think it was my nomination, just my opinion, as she did not want to take credit for it. Well, get her to the infirmary. She'll need to get patched up. She almost wanted to apologize about the damage. Once again, almost, Seraphal said. Lightning assisted Irina out of the office, with Ross Vaisa guiding them. Irina said nothing as they walked, and Lightning and Ross Vaisa felt awkward. Lightning felt like she was struck with the hope back in the early days of her own adventures. You really know how to take a beating, don't you? Lightning said. Irina remained silent. She didn't know what to say in the pink-haired woman. Look, I don't know well enough to hate you. While I don't approve of what you did, I can appreciate someone who's trying to right their wrongs. I've had teammates like that before, Lightning said, remembering her somewhat rival Fang. Uh, thanks, Irina said. 
Irina is a swordsman like you, Lightning, Ross Faisa says. Really? Well, then I guess I'll have to look forward to a spar for you one day. She felt it was better to lighten the mood. She didn't nor want any drama. I uh, would like that, Irina said. You have to contact Odin-sama for michael someone for where her family lives, Ross Faisa said. Hmm, I understand. She figured that with the loss of Irina's powers pending in the banishment, Irina would not be able to leave or go anywhere, Lightning said. Lightning thought. The trio continued on in silence, as they had different thoughts and with Ra Irina and Rosbisa pondering about their futures, while Lightning was pondering about what she could learn from these two, at the same time thinking of what she could face when the enemy strikes, until Irina asked a question. Um, Lightning was it, Irina said. Yes, what is it? Lightning replied. That's not your real name, is it? Irina said. It gave Lightning a small smile as Irina was the first one, or one of the few, to ask her that in this world. No, it's not. Before you ask, no, I won't tell you. It's not because of what you did, it's because I don't trust you. Because I don't know you. And sorry, Rasvaisa, I'm not telling you either. <clears throat> I figured as much. You're quite secretive, Rosvisa said, but I was going to ask, since you were a soldier, do you think you have some time to train me in the hand-to-hand -hand combat? Rosvisa said. Sure, Lightning replied. Um, if not too much trouble, if we ever spar, could you teach me as well, Irina said? I don't see why not. Maybe the way you could get your ass kicked and you'll be able to defend yourself, Lightning said. That jab did make the three of them smile, though Irina didn't really laugh due to her ribs. Well, let's get you fixed up. As they entered the infirmary, um, Lightning, do you think... You can stay. I know how prideful Rias can be. I wouldn't put it past her to try and get Irina when she's down. Not a problem for me. I'd like to get away from Asgard, turning Irina as she sets her down to the bed. Ross Vaisa could apply some healing magic. So, you live with Issei's grandmother, huh? Lightning said. Oh, yeah, um, she told me that I needed to get out of the toxic environment, not surrounded by the wrong people, Irina said. Smart woman, Lightning said. You might like her. She's also strict. If I can't get along with her grandma jabbing the thumb in Ross Vice's direction, I think I can get along with his, Lightning said. Maybe you could talk about some stories from your world, Ross Vice has said. Irina gasped, and then resulted in a sharp pain, causing her to yelp as Rosvice had calmed her down and continued healing the damage to the rib. Sorry, I just didn't know, Irina said. Not many people, but maybe I'll hold on off to it. Until I sat down with Issei's grandma, I might as well get to know her. I believe Odin will pawn me off to Issei. He said something about that. When I talked with him a few days ago, he's a good guy. He just didn't deserve what happened to him, Irina said. I can see that, Lightning said. How do you feel now, Irina replied. Or Ross Vaisa replied, Better on the ribs. Thanks, Ross Vaisa Sensei. I'll apply a phoenix tear on your cheek. It'll hear quickly as she took the tear from the secret drawer to apply it to the cheek wound. No, just some healing magic on it, Irina said. It may leave a scar, Ross Vaisa replied. That's fine. As Ross Vaisa used healing spell on her cheek, leaving a small wound that Sarah falls ice left on her cheek. What does the phoenix tear do, Lightning said. Cut the palm of your hand and see. As she worked on bandaging Irina's cheek, by the time she finished, Lightning had a bleeding palm. That was quick. Comes with the name, Lightning said, struggling as she could take the pain. Having used a small knife to the deed. Very well, as she went to go get the phoenix tear and apply it to Lightning's hand. Amazing. Reminds me of healing spells from where I'm from it. And in the first time seeing the phoenix tears take effect, I'll go see if they need Irina for anything. If not, we could take her home. Could you stay with her, Lightning? Rosvice said. Sure, I got time. Which Rosvice had knighted and left the room. Meanwhile, back in the student council office, they were congratulating Momo for her nomination. At this time, Sona decided to speak with her sister, who was enjoying her cheers. So you weren't in Kyoto recently, Sona said. Of course. I did Lilith-chan, but she is getting over what Rosvice did to Issei. As she walked out to the window at the empty courtyard. Well, I should inform you that has gone with Kuroka and Lefei, so Arthur and Bioka will have a hard time. Apparently, Irina had a talk with her, just like Irina. Orphus is feeling regretful, but doesn't know why, Sona said. You'd think she could obtain what Issei had. I mean, they are dragons. But then again, she was emotionless for a reason, Seraphal said. So she might not be affected, Sona replied. Well, I better return back to Kyoto. Irina did give me some useful information, Seraphal said. You mean the cheesecake, Sona replied? Yes, and other things. It's a pity that Gabriel was naive. But I can somewhat understand. If someone were to deceive you, so-so into deceiving me, I would trust your judgment. Gabriel trusted Irina's judgment, who trusted Zenobia's word, which was influenced by Rias. She is truly spoiled. She turned to Sono. Sona, I'm glad you didn't turn out that way, Sona. You've made me proud, Seraphal said. You've also made me proud. Turning back into the woman that I grew up with, I will admit that little part of me 
will miss your magical girl shtick, Sona said. Ah, Sarah fall, giving her sister a hug and holding her. Well, I better get back to Kyoto before Merlin manipulates Lilichan against me, Sarah fall said. It seems to me like you got yourself a new rival, smirking at Sarah fall, Sona said. You know, she came in asking him to be my bishop. If not mine, then he says, Seraphal said. Oh, and you accepted? I thought you weren't taking any new pieces. I'm not. I think Ajuka understood that. When I said it would take more time for a piece to be created, so I'm just watching for now, Seraphal said. So, will you hand her to Issei then, Sona said. She then said to help out also Lilichun if she understands their power. Something about Issei becoming a conqueror. Conqueror, huh? Not a bad title, Sona said. I suppose so. Anyway, sorry about the table. I think you owe an apology to Eren. Sona said. I'll think about it. We'll take care. As she gave another hug to Sona, she teleported back to Kyoto. A few seconds later, the door to the student council office opened. Everyone tensed up, relaxed, seeing it was Ross Faisa. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was wondering if you needed Irina for anything today, otherwise I will take her home, Ross Faisa said. Everyone looked at Tsubaki, since she was the one that ordered Irina to do things. No, she can go home. She'll need the rest, Tsubaki says. Very well, then. And congratulations to you, Momo. Thanks, Ross Vice sensei And tell Irina that I say thank you for having faith in me, Momo said. I think she would like that. Giving a soft side smile to everyone knew that Irina was a loner. She never talked to anyone. It was ironic how one of the brightest people in the school felt like a shadow, but they knew it was Irina's own path to any possible redemption. With a nod, Razvaisa left the room to go get lightning in Irina. She only hoped that Rias didn't understand about Irina's injuries, so let out a sigh as she smiled at her parat, celebrating. They were talking about going out for Momo. She knew she would have to contact Loop if he was interested first. Then she remembered that she didn't tell Seraphal that she was proctoring Issei's exam next week. She then shrugged her shoulders as she remembered Seraphal's teasing and about a tape of Tsubaki. Sona wasn't going to let that slide. She knew Seraphil would be mad for not telling her that Issei would be here. She smiled to herself as she once again sat back down in her chair and relaxed. Her sister had it coming for the teasing earlier because it all, after all, and Rias will feel it too. Payback's a bitch, Sona said. And that is the end of chapter 23. So now we're going to be starting on the latest chapter, which is chapter 24, and now we are currently back with Issei. FYI, um, if you guys have if you want any other stories for me to read, just send them in the comment section or send me shoot me an email. Sometimes I don't reply, but I do actually end up reading them. My bad. Uh, you you get the point. Also join the Discord. Sorry, mid advertisement. I'm just being stupid. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and continue reading now. We're on chapter 24, and we're officially back with Issei. Issei had been training in the gold during this time. For weapons, he trained her in how to use a sword and knives, since that was what he had been using. She couldn't use a great sword, but a smaller sword was suitable. She seemed to do better with ranged weapons as she used a bow and arrow and they found in the treasure room. Surprisingly, the string of the bow was intact. In addition, he has been training her physically in hand-to-hand -hand combat, along with training her upper body through workouts. Unfortunately for Issei, it toned her body, making her more appealing to Issei, and his dragon instincts were slowly telling him to mate with her. Now, Issei was outside of the cave, talking to Sona about when he should come in for his finals. When showing him a gold how to hunt, since she had never killed anything before, she was rather uncertain about doing so. It made Issei just curious about how she survived out here for just weeks of berries. Okay, so at the end of this week before graduation, correct, Issei said, with the communication circle active. That is correct, Sona says. Wouldn't you be busy with your own finals, Issei replied? On the contrary, no. I completed my finals this past week. So while everyone is taking their own, I'm completely free to get things set up for the new president and proctor your exam, Sona said. I see. And who's going to be the new president, Issei replied. You can see when you get back, Sona said. Ah, oh, come on, Sona, Issei said. Don't call me that, Sona replied. But we're going to be family, Issei said. Ugh, don't remind me of what you did to my sister, Sona said. It made Issei blush, as he remembered what he did as well. He definitely needed better control in the bedroom. It was something that he worried about if he would need to sleep with Imagold or any girl. It did make him understand why Sarah Falk gave that approval to a harem. Sorry, Issei said. You should give her a call, Sona replied. Isn't she busy? Being Mao and all? Issei said, well, she's currently in Kyoto. I believe she also took her paperwork there, so she can do work. While relaxing, she has a helper, Sona says. Really, that makes things easier. I need to tell her about this girl I found, Issei said. You plan on adding her to your harem? It's not that. Though I wouldn't mind, she is beautiful, but the thing is, she's a leviathan, Issei says. What? Sona replies. Yeah, that's what I thought. She was being hunted by some rogue exorcist. I saw her magic circle, same insignia as Katria's, Issei said. 
Well, at least you got her before they did, Sona says. Actually, they led me to her. Killed them in the process, Issei said. You killed them, Sona says? Yeah, something wrong with that, Issei replied. No, it's just not your forte to kill unless you have to. But I guess things change, huh, Sona said. Yeah, they do, Issei replied. Well, I leave you to it. Study hard, Sona says. Thanks, Sona Ni, Issei said. <sighs> oh, I'm going to go now. He could tell she was clearly annoyed, but he understood why Seraphal loved to tease Sona. It was rather fun. Also, could you keep the Leviathan thing a secret? I'll tell Sarachon myself, but please keep it to herself, Sona said. Fine. He could hear the growl in her voice. Like I said at the end of the school week, goodbye, Issei, Sona said. Understand, Kyocho, Issei said. Issei quickly deactivated the communication circle and feared the wrath of Sona to come his way. He let out a sigh of relief and relaxed that it could have gone worse. He took this torment to contact Seraphal. Since he and Invigold were outside the cave, he could also contact people, since he realized that his communications weren't allowed inside the cave, and he could send things out, but not as receive his notes of pieces. Hello? Seraphal says. Hi, Sarachan, it's me, Issei said. Isekun? What's going on? Seraphal replied. For Seraphal, she was in a hot spring in Kyoto, but she wasn't alone. With her was Merlin, whose interest was intrigued upon hearing that Seraphal was talking to Issei. She figured that it was about time to introduce herself to the Sekiyuti, since the opportunity was right there. I was calling you to talk about something which I hope you can keep a secret, Issei says. What's that? Seraphal replied. Well, I met a girl, Issei said. Oh, Seraphal replied. Seraphal had shifted in the water, which also gave Merlin the chance to start making her move. Yeah, but here's the thing. She's a descendant of the original Leviathan, Issei said. Wait, what? Where did you find her? Seraphal said. She was near where I'm training. She was being chased by some rogue exorcist, Issei said. Really? Well, I guess there's still some of them that weren't captured or recently defected from the church. What did you do with them? Seraphal said. I killed them, Issei replied. D killed them? Seraphal said. Yeah, I had to. Would they play to do her? It was sick, Issei said. I understand. So she is like the rest of them, Seraphal replied. You mean like the descendant of the others we faced? No, she's far from it. I'm being honest. She's like Azia. I was hoping you could give me some tips, Issei said. Advice, Seraphal said? Yeah, she is... Well skilled at water magic. Maybe you could help her in advance and water magic to ice magic, Issei said. Sure, Seraphar replied. Really? Of course. Well, that's a relief, Issei said. But tell me, Issei, do you plan on sleeping with her? Seraphar said. What? No, Issei replied. Pity. I thought you were starting your harem, Seraphar says. You're still going off about that? Issei. You see, I told you I like to feel my legs after our time together. Besides, you're alone with her. You're going to end up falling for her as well. I told you that our other women that have interest in you, she could be one. And don't shut yourself up. At least you're meeting new people, Seraphal says. Yeah, oh, I spoke with Great Red, and you didn't tell me that a new threat was there, because I knew I would rush back, right, he say said? Yeah, I know how you could be. I'm sorry, Seraphal says. No, you did good on that. I understand I would be rushing into something that I'm unprepared for. Just try to hold out until I get back, all right, he say says. Will do. I'm so weak, you know, Seraphal says. I'm not so weak, you know, Seraphal replies. Oh, I know. We had 30 plus rounds to prove that, gaining a cheeky smile. Well, at least the ritual didn't change it too much, Seraphal said, with a little glad that she has some of his pervertedness left. Yeah, but it came at a cost, but Great Red told me that I'm getting stronger. He also told me that you had Lilith Chan, Issei said. Yes, she's with Kanochan. I figured since Kanochan understood the situation, this may be comp <laughs> Did you now? Shouldn't take the credit where the credit is due, Seraphal. So you're Issei, hmm, the random person said. Issei heard a slurdy voice and chastate Seraphal, but then address him. It made his heart skip a beat. He was shocked that Seraphal was with another woman. It made him wonder if she was cheating on him. On Seraphal's end, she had been engrossed with the conversation with Issei. She failed to pay attention to the other naked woman that was in the hot spring with her. Now Merlin had snuck up on Seraphal, covering her mouth with one hand and following her breast with the other, more so holding Seraphal in place. While she could speak to the communication circle, who is this? Issei said. Well, Issei, I'm Merlin, your new bishop, and no, I'm not Seraphal's lover, but I can be if you're willing to join us, Merlin said. A little blood came out of Issei's nose at the prospect of having a threesome. He was lucky that Invigold wasn't around. I, uh, what? Issei said. I've seen your memories, Issei. It's nice to meet you, or hear you, rather. I want to train your magical capabilities. I'm sure you have heard of Merlin. The wizard helped King Arthur of Camelot. She was holding a struggling Seraphal, Merlin said. 
Well, yeah. I mean, before I thought it was a myth, then I got thrust into the supernatural world and met Arthur Pentadragon, who is one of his descendants, but I thought Merlin was an old man. He says, well, I am very much female, Merlin said, so you can help me? And what do you mean you will be my bishop, Issei says. Isn't that how evil pieces work? I'm joining your team since your lover didn't want me, holding a struggling Seraphal to her bosom. She is quite the handful, Merlin said. So I'm second best, Issei says? Oh no, I told her I wanted you first. She was second best, but on important matters. You have a rondite, correct, Merlin said? Yes. It called to me, Issei said. Really now? Must have faith in you. I was informed that a team slash dog has another fragment, Merlin said. Yeah, a rondite mentioned it when I went to see my grandmother. Good. When the time comes, you'll have to join a rondite with its missing fragment. It's an honor to see hear you, Issei. Now that I know what you sound like, tell me. How is that special room, Merlin says. Special room? Wait, how do you know about that, Issei says. I created it, Merlin replied. You're the... Oh, sh... Uh, how did you- it's, what? I'm sorry, it's just, the oasis is awesome. Your uh, magic is incredible to make something like that. Thank you, Issei said. Of course. So you named it the oasis, huh? Merlin replied. Yeah, I feel like I needed a name, and the oasis just felt right. Well, you should know that it is a self-healing as well. Unfortunately, my magic power is weak, but I can upgrade it for you, Merlin said. Do you think you can move it if your magic power was restored? Issei says, yes, I could, Merlin replied. Awesome. Uh, could you put Seraphol back on, Issei said? I think she likes my breast just like you would, Merlin said. More blood came out of Issei's nose. Get off me, Seraphol said, finally getting out of Merlin's grip. Sorry about that, Issei, because someone just doesn't know how to stay in their lane. Uh, yeah, it's fine. It sounds like you started a harem for me, Issei said. That is to be determined, Seraphal replied. Well, you can have all the girl-on-girl -girl action that you tease Sona about, Issei said. This comment made Seraphal blush heavily. I'm just playing with you, Sari Chan. <laughs> well then, you get, you get back, we can entertain your fantasies, Seraphal said. We? We? Merlin slash Issei said at the same time. Uh, damn it, uh, I'll talk to you later and take care of that girl. I'll see you soon, Seraphal said, hanging it up. Ha! <laughs> You too. Love you, Issei said. Love you too. Disconnecting from the communication circle. After that, Issei looked to see... I am sorry. I actually just killed this bug. And I actually have nothing to wipe it off with... I, I, I killed it. Uh, and now it's on my finger. And it's kind of nasty. And I don't want it there. Uh, well, let me just... You guys have to hear this shit. Ah, yep. Well, it's a fucking dead bug now. Damn spiders. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, she said, love you too, disconnected from the communication circle. After that, Issei looked to see if he could find Invergold, and he thought that she would be close by. However, he could not sense Invergold, and he was about to worry. He did not even think to clean the blood nose. It wasn't until he heard a voice from his left. You're bleeding, are you alright? Invergold says. Yes, yeah, sorry, I accidentally hit myself, Issei replied, scratching his head in embarrassment, but was still surprised and a little scared about her stealth capabilities. I wonder how long she was standing there, he thought to himself, Issei said. Invergold raised an eyebrow before she nodded and began to apply what little healing magic that she learned to his nose. Thanks. Getting a smile from Imagold, and then noticed that she got three rabbits, and they were clean kills. I assume it took you multiple shots, huh? Issei said. I got it better on the last rabbit, but the first two were troublesome, Imagold says. Hey, at the end of this week, I will need to go to take my finals for school. I'll need you to stay in the Oasis so you can stay safe. I won't be gone for a full day out here. But for you, it will be a while, Issei says. I understand. A little sad that he was leaving, but at least she knew that he would return for her. I heard you speaking about me, Invigil says. I was. I don't want to keep any secrets from you, but I told two people that I trust the most about you. They are not afraid. And when I return, I would like for you to come with me and join me. Really, Invigil says? Of course. Now come on. Let's skin those rabbits you got. And then also need to study. We also able to pick up a rabbit. Until he realized... That his erection from thinking about Seraphol and Merlin had gone, had not gone down. Fuck, he said, can you teach me too? And Miguel says, I'll do my best. I wasn't really the best student in school. That's fine, and Miguel says, as she picked up the rabbits and began to walk towards the cave. Maybe I should take the chance if I'm being honest. I kind of hope that I get the chance with both Sarah Chan and Merlin, though. I don't want to get catfished. Anyone could use magic to change their voice. Before we followed after Imagold, Issei said, Now, we're in Kyoto. 
After Serapol finished her conversation with Dise, she glared at Merlin who was amused but also leering at her. They were still close to each other. Since Serapol had removed herself from Merlin's grip, she did not think Merlin could be that strong. Though Serapol also remembered that Merlin requested to be by Issei's bishop and knew that Serapol didn't want her. How did you know that I wasn't going to make you my bishop, Serapol said. Getting right to the point, instead of trying to lie about it. Good sm good smirking at Serapol, Merlin did. Merlin snapped her fingers and a seal on Serapol dissipated. You had a seal on me? Serapol said, standing up and displaying her nude body to the legendary mage. Merlin simply took in the sight and licked her lips, knowing that she could get under Seraphal's skin. When Seraphal saw Merlin lick her lips, she began to worry that Merlin may conceal her into her bed. She then realized that Merlin was checking her out and sat back down. Of course, I figured you didn't trust me, so I needed to be sure that you would go through with it, and when I heard that you tell your sister that wasn't the case, I knew that it had alternative plans. You made it too easy. When I heard you speak with them, I had to introduce myself to him, Merlin said. So you filled his head with perverted thoughts to make him accept you, Seraphal replied. You didn't seem to be that opposed of it, Merlin said. That's because you covered my mouth for me to stop saying anything, Seraphal said. But I was right about you liking my breast, Merlin said. What? You're staring at them. Don't worry, most men enjoy lesbian fantasies. But relax, I won't do anything yet unless he gives me approval. So relax for now, Merlin said. It made Seraphal blush. She hoped that Issei wouldn't give approval, but she was sure that Issei would was aroused at the prospect of her sleeping with Merlin. She knew that at some point that she or Issei, both of them, would wound up in bed with Merlin. She knew that Merlin was smart, hence that she hated herself by getting distracted speaking with Issei. When Merlin was around, she hoped that Merlin was just teasing her in the office about joining with Issei, but she already put the cards in motion when she introduced herself. In other news, I found a little bit about Blake as she stood up from the hot spring. Really, Seraphal said. Yes, we had a little talk while you were away, purposely swaying her hips as she walked away, only to see Seraphal checking her out. It seems you like more than just my breasts, Merlin said. And Seraphal said, blinking in confusion and continuing that Merlin got her again. Dang it, Seraphal said. Hook, line, and sinker, Merlin replied as she continued walking away. Come on, I'll tell you more in the room. Seraphal only huffed in annoyance before getting and following after the black-haired beauty. They dried themselves up and wore long bathrobes as they walked into the room that Seraphal had she'd visited in Kyoto. They were comfortable walking in just the back robes. And Yakuza had female guards patrolling in the hot springs. It helped Seraphal had an office where she could do her paperwork without being in the... Being in the underworld, and Merlin was her assistant, which made things easier. Plus, Lilith was enjoying herself with Kiono and drawing it. It helped ease the girls about what Orphis did to Issei and kept her distracted. So, what did you learn, Seraphal said, once they entered the room? Well, I'm sure you remember Mogri from the factions meeting, right? The Nekomata, Seraphal says? Yes. It seemed like she liked to play fairies, or at least according to Blake. Explain, Seraphal says. Very well, Merlin said. So we're picking up where we left off right when Seraphal and talking about this flashback that's going to happen. So we're going to go ahead and pick up. So now, flashback. Here we go. Was Seraphal gone back to the underworld? Merlin was stuck with Lilith, meaning she could not go to learn more in the Library of God. She was quite frustrated, but she did not show it. She only liked Lilith. She actually liked Lilith, and she was confused. She was a confused child. It made her laugh when she watched Lilith to try to mimic Kano. When Kano pouted about something that Yakuza or Blake said that she couldn't do, now she was watching the children draw. She rubbed Lilith's head, when, which Lilith liked as she would lean into Merlin's touch. She pondered back to her former teammates. She knew most of them had children. The closet that she had a child was Arthur. The closest she had to a child was Arthur. But he was gone now and his family continued on. She wondered if Lilith could fill that void again. She was not opposed to the thought of children. It was partially the reason she reverted to her true form, which was that of a child and let it go to a womanhood. Now that fake adult body that had and had used back when that was her official body, allowing her to true body to age. But not many men interested in her back then. As she let the children draw, she approached Blake, who was painting something. She was curious about her past with Kuroka. So tell me, now the children are busy, what's your deal? Merlin said. What do you mean? Blake replied. Your deal with the one called Kuroka. Was it? No one gets that upset over what she did, unless you're close to her. I assume you don't like that she still has access to the East Yokai faction? Merlin says. You're right about that. Typical of the Magari to choose her favorite student, Blake said. Favorite? Merlin replied. Blake looked at Merlin, studying the woman for a moment before she let out a sigh. 
Kuroka and I grew up together. She was a wild one, but she was better at using Senjutsu than I was, Blake said. Senjutsu, Merlin replied. It's a rare technique. It's different from magic and sorcery since it stresses the importance of the chakra, generating blue flame in her hand, while it's similar yet different from the magic of demons and light of angels. It's a power to control the flow of life energy key in living beings. If one learns Senjutsu, they can excel at reading the flow of someone's aura, thus grasping their movements from a far distance to a certain degree. How interesting, but a pity, Merlin says. How so? Because it seems like I can't learn it, Merlin replied. Oh, Blake replied. So you were envious of her, Merlin said. Somewhat, like I said, would get us into trouble. Or rather, get me into trouble, Blake said. What do you mean, Merlin replied. Blake looked at Merlin before she looked at Kodo and Lilith. Hey, Kodo-chan, Merlin and I will step outside for a moment. Will you two be alright, Blake said. Okay, Blakey, looking up from her drawing, then going back to it. Lilith fidgeted a bit, looking at Merlin, which she understood. Issei had left. Seraphal had to leave, but she would be back. She felt a little afraid that Merlin would go too. In motherly tone, Merlin crouched down and rubbed Lilith's cheek and assured her, I will be gone for a few minutes and we'll just be outside that door. Do you understand? Merlin said. Lilith nodded in understanding and went back to her drawing. She stopped momentarily. She felt the Merlin gave her a kiss on the top of her head. Lilith watched Merlin leave in surprise. She didn't know why she felt drawn to that woman, but she liked that she was caring for her. Merlin followed Blake outside into the side room. So what is it? Merlin said. Blake merely began to strip her top off, which confused Merlin. Not that she didn't mind the show. Personally, she knew that she was going to do something similar to mess with Seraphal. When Blake was topless, she merely turned around and Merlin's eyes widened a little, seeing the scars on Blake's back. When we were young, Kuroka always had a knack for mischief and went out of her way to get me in trouble. Usually, she made sure her pranks led back to me. Whenever I tried to prove my innocence, Magari would take Kuroka's side, usually berating me about how I needed to work on my senjutsu instead of playing around. She would usually tell me how my mother would be disappointed in me. Of course, her favorite student got off scotch-free. Well, I took the whippings, Blake said. So what did you do about it? Merlin replied. I trained, but not for Magari's approval, but for myself. I'm better at senjutsu than her sister and i can apply it to my weapons and fists blake said i see merlin said then i heard what she did to him blake replied yeah i thought she was finally get what was coming to her since i heard yakuza sama discussing the narodni sama about banishing them but no magari made excuses claiming that they were in heat i was able to watch the memories she did not look in heat she knew what she was doing then i heard magari claim that how she Allow them to stay here. Convincing Nanarisama to agree, Yakusasama disagreed, and I requested to leave the East Yokai faction. What did she say to that? Merlin said. She believed that she was doing good by her mother. But yet she couldn't do good by my own, Blake said. What happened to yours? Merlin said. And killed by rogue yokais. Called themselves the White Fang. It said that they changed, looking down in sorrow. Blake said. What do you mean? My parents were once leaders of the White Fang, but it wasn't meant to be a terrorist group, just more about equality, since there is a discrimination. But when they didn't get what they wanted, some turned to a more violent approach and others followed. My parents couldn't stand it, so they left after things went out of control. Sometimes I wonder if Kuroka was jealous of me because of my parents. How so, Merlin said. Well, I had loving parents, both a mother and father, but Kuroka's mother... She loved their father, but he didn't love her. He did love her body. Though, and I hear it's the same thing that the Harakaku is doing the same thing, only caring about bodies. Who told you that? Merlin said. That monkey of theirs, Biyoko. Oh, you are close to him, Merlin said. Somewhat. He would come by to train with me since Kuroka was busy with Maragai. Blake said, you got a crush on him? No, Blake replied. Merlin studied her face and could see that Blake wasn't blushing or looking away embarrassingly. Really? No. Why would I be attracted to someone that already has a girlfriend? Blake said, oh, Merlin replied. So what's the deal with you? What do you mean? You and Sarah fall. I thought she was with Issei. Oh, no reason. Just messing with her, Merlin said. I thought you were also his lover, or her lover, with how you look at her. Merlin had to laugh at that. Not either of their lovers, but he probably knows how to treat a woman, so I wouldn't mind, shrugging her shoulders, Merlin said. If I may ask, how did you get your scars, Blake said. Hmm. Oh, this? <sighs> They were given to me by a man who loved me, Merlin said. He loved you, but abused you? Oh no, he never abused me at all. I knew he had loved me, but I didn't love him. In his dying breath, I gave him a kiss and held the scars in memory of him, Merlin said. 
How did the kiss give you scars? He was on fire, Merlin replied. Couldn't you have put them out? The fire was a part of his power. It's called sunshine. It originally belonged to a celestial, or I guess what you would call an angel, Miel. However, due to the manipulation of one of my former teammates, they made Miel become a demon. Thus, he lost his blessing. It was done in the means to balance the war. Since the demons lost their strongest warrior, Meliodas, my former captain, who fell in love with a celestial that I considered my big sister, Merlin said, let me guess, your captain turned his back on the demons, and so your former teammate, Blake said, Gauther, Merlin replied, Gauther? They manipulated Miel to join the demons to balance out the scales, Blake said. Correct. Also, Miel was in love with Elizabeth as well. Elizabeth? Ah, she's a celestial that Meliodas fell in love with. Oh, Elizabeth also loved Meliodas, Merlin said. I see, Blake replied. We better get back. I told Lilith that we'd only be a few minutes. Right. Tell me, how would you react to Kuroka when she learns the truth, Merlin said. I'd laugh and tell her that she had it coming. I don't care if Marguerite tries to protect her favorite student. I actually like it here. Kano is very pleasant. I guess the way she speaks about Issei. I can get past his perverted attitude. What about you, Blake says. Well, I've been dormant for hundreds of years. I need to get my power back. I would need a surge, and I think I could join a barrage. The evil peace may amplify it, Merlin said. So you would join Issei's. He reminds me of my captain, Merlin said. I see, Blake said. Well, time to head back. Leaving the room and heading back to where the girls were. When she entered, Lilith looked up like she gave a sigh of relief and got up to hug Merlin's leg. I told you that I would be back, Merlin said. Lilith drew something, tugging Merlin's hand, come look. Merlin simply followed Lily to her drawing station and looked at Lilith through. It was rather crude drawing, but she would make out three people with all black hair. It took her a while to decipher who was in the picture. Is that me, you, and Seraphall? Merlin said. Mm, that's Oni-chan, pointing at the taller, long-haired person. That's Lilith, pointing at the shorter, long-haired person. And that's you, pointing at the taller, short-haired person. Merlin was not going to lie, but the drawing was horrible. Horrible. But then again, Lilith is just a child. It's not like she was meant to be Picasso or an excellent in her first try. However, she did appreciate that Lilith considered drawing her in the short time that they have spent together. I like it, Merlin says, rubbing Lilith's head. Thank you. And I made this, Kono says, showing a slightly better drawing of a nine-tailed fox. Merlin looked quizzically as it did not... He did not know what it was. It's Yakuza in her fox form. Well done, Kyono-chan, Blake said. Oh, she had never seen Yakuza in her fox form before. Come on, Kyono-chan. Let's go to your Kachan, Blake said. Okay, as the two began to head out of the room. Merlin noticed how Lilith slightly deflated as she decided to ask what was wrong. You all right, Merlin said. Mm, Lilith doesn't have a Kachan. She has an Oni-chan, an Oni-chan, Lilith said. Really? She smiled to herself. Another opportunity if she got closer to Lilith. She could study her power more and, by extension, study Issei as well. Of course. She knew that Seraphal would call her an old lady, so why not, mantle it? why not take up the mantle? Well, if you want, if you ever feel comfortable with me, you can always call me your Kachan, Merlin says. Okay, Lilith said, nodding as she was still a bit hesitant. Now... Let's get this framed. I'm sure your Oni-chan would love to see it. Which Lilith nodded, and Merlin took her hand to hand follow Kiono and Blake so they could get a frame of the drawings. And that's the end of the flashback. I see. No wonder she doesn't like Kuroka, but I could see why she doesn't like Makari's decision, Seraphal said. Yeah, but to eat... To each their own, Merlin said. Yeah, so you're trying to be Lilith's son's Kachan? Hmm, well, you are an old lady, so I guess it makes sense. She was thinking about how Lilith ran to hug her. When she returned to Kyoto and when she saw Merlin smirk, I knew you would call me that, Merlin said. It also explains the scars you have, Seraphal replied. Yeah, Merlin said. Well then, let's get dressed. It's lucky the girls are done playing and getting, and getting ready for lunch. Very well, Merlin said, standing up and dropping her robe, knowing Seraphal would look. Really? Seraphal said, deadpanning. I figured you would enjoy the view, smirking at Seraphal's flustered face. Ugh, Seraphal said, heading to the side of the room to the change. Heading to the other side of the room to change. Now, we're currently in the Co Mall. <clears throat> Where we have to get updates on Rias and Irina, etc. So let's go ahead and start again. It was the second day of finals week. School had just ended. Irina decided to head to the mall. She was proven right. Lightning did get along with Harato, and they did seem to get a, agree on many things. She could see that Lightning see 
she could see Lightning cringe a bit at some of Harato's comment. However, Harato did shake her head at Seraphal's beating of Irina as it was expected. She was also proud that Irina took the beatings well, understanding the consequences of her actions. Lightning also mentioned teaching Irina some hand-to-hand -hand combat, which Harato laughed. Maybe Irina wouldn't get her kicked as much as she did. Now Irina was heading to the mall. It was primarily to get away from the Grim Reaper Raj, who seemed satisfied who seemed satisfied with the scar on her cheek. Verato understood the reason for the scar on her cheek, same with the scar on Irina's left forearm. It didn't, however, stop their own issues at the school, but it gave Irina more moral support among the students from Rias' bullying. Irina did realize how much Orphus was right about needing the blessing as her luck with the students was better than the other girls. She knew Ross Faisa was still handling papers and Tsubaki had nothing for her today. Now she was just wandering the mall, taking it as in the last week ago. She felt some demonic presence coming from the sharp the shop nearby. She was worried that the Gremory was around. She decided to check it out because she noted how the prisoners were not familiar to her. She came across the clothing store and tentatively walked in, noting how it was the employees that had to mock presence. Thanks for coming. Hope to see you again, the random person said. Irina looked at the, where the voice came from and was shocked at seeing a familiar face. Even though her hair was down, it still held the familiar drill until its end. Irina walked up to the employee with a shocked face who smiled first and her eyes widened in recognition. Ravel? Irina said, Irina-sama? Ravel replied, what are you doing here? Taking a Ravel's appearance, her hair was down. She looked a bit taller, slightly skinnier than the last time she saw her. I work here now. You look good, Revel says, taking in Irina's form, since she's an angel that had abandoned her twin tails for a ponytail. Her body was a bit skinnier, but also slightly toned thanks to the workouts given by Lightning. I wouldn't say that. What happened to you, Irina says. Hang on a minute. Before she went to the back room and then returned with a busty purple-haired woman, Irina-sama, this is Yubaluna-sama, my brother's fiancé. She's the manager. I take it that you would like to speak with Ravel about what happened, Yubaluna says. Mm, yeah, she has... Since she's left, I had no idea what happened to her. The other girls thought it was the clan issues, Irina said. Well, you're right about that, since it's pertained to your betrayal of Issei, Yubaluna says. I figured as much. There was a recording that exposed the infidelities at school, Irina said. Come to the back and we'll talk. Columine, you're up, Yubaluna said. Just then, a blonde short haired woman came out of to take over Ravel's spot as Yubaluna and Ravel walked into the back room. It took a moment for Irina to recognize you. It's you, Irina said. Excuse me, Columine replied. A couple of years ago, you faced an exorcist that had twin tails with my hair color. Yeah, how'd you know about that? Because I was the exorcist, Irina said. Oh, small world. Can't believe you what you girls did to Issei, Columine says. You and me both. Uh, I need to go, Irina said. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Irina entered the back room to find Yubaluna, looking with a neutral expression, and Ravel had a somber one. So what happened when you left, Ravel? Well, to sum, up, sum it up, I went to see the issue with, with my former clan. Former clan, Irina said? When I got there, I had to ask for Lady Phoenix's permission to enter, which I found Sona-sama with Rukuro-sama and Tsubaki-sama, waiting with Lady Phoenix and Oni-sama. Lord Phoenix was there was not there, as with, with Ravel Sama elsewhere. I didn't know it at the time, but I had been caught, or rather, we had been caught, Ravel said. Let me guess. Genshiro, Irina said. That's what they said. But Issei-sama knew from the beginning because of his dragon senses. It didn't matter what we did because of our connection to Issei-sama. He would know when another male invaded his territories. But how did you know it was Genshiro, Ravel said. Since you've been gone, and when we were all gone, Sona released an audio of an incident that occurred in our classroom. Issei's former friends tried to get back at Issei, after Issei figured it out on our betrayal. He told them he was going to stop being perverted, so they wouldn't experience what he was going through, what they were putting him through. We were killing him. They decided that Issei was being ridiculous, since it's a pervert he had us, but they were unaware of the problem that they caused. They had recruited Genshiro to assist them in getting back at Issei. Do you know Maki Shizaki? No, I don't, Ravel says. Well, she had been intimate with Genshiro. Sona explained that he used hormones to attract her. He asked her for her underwear and gave it to one of the perverted duo. They had one of them distract Issei at lunchtime and take him away from the classroom, and the others put the underwear on Issei's beef crease. When Issei came back, lunch was almost over, and Maki accused Issei of taking her underwear. He didn't know what was going on until the classmate came back. Another student took Issei's briefcase to find the underworld and Issei got 
be raided, and beat on. Oh no, Ravel said. His former friends mocked him where Issei asked him if they knew about it. They didn't know what to say until Genshiro came along. Sona was there as well. Genshiro commented on Issei not being able to take a joke. And then Issei asked him about Azia. Of course, Genshiro was cocky. So he spelled all of it out for everyone to hear. That we replaced Issei and deceived him. As a result, Issei beat down his former friends and Genshiro explained that he knew all along. Even what he did in his bedroom. His former bedroom. After all, after that, Moriyama and Katase found Issei in the park and told them everything, which they recorded under Akia's instructions. I guess you knew about this, looking at Yubaluna. Yes, Riser sama showed us Issei's memories that he showed in the meeting. Genshiro still got cocky at the meeting and Issei beat him down again. It made Genshiro the weaker dragon, since Issei had the dragon fall and bested him, Yubaluna said. Also, Tanyin mentioned that Issei eliminated himself from our lives, unless something triggered a memory of him. Mine was firing from the Opai dragon. What about you? Ravel said. Well, Ross Vice Sensei mentioned to me about not being my childhood friend. Then I started to have dreams about having a family with Issei, but I could never see his face at the time. He would always ask me why I did it. I never understood what he meant. Until Sona played the audio. Everything came to me like a flood, just hearing his voice, and it sounded so broken because of what we did. Yeah. You know, I was there for this trial. Genjiro's, I mean. They decided what to do with us. I've been banished from the clan and underworld. It was my father and brother that helped set this shop up. Although they were disappointed in me, this would help me gain some income for my education. In addition, Issei gave us his money from the Opai Dragon Show, his last act of kindness. We won't get any credit nor reward regarding the war. I used a portion of mine to pay back Lord Phoenix and Odisan for this place. Didn't need to, but I wanted to, Ravel said. Oh, that's understandable. I probably will be banished from heaven after I gave up my angelhood, Irina said. What? You're giving it up, Ravel said? Yes. After what I've done, I don't deserve these wings, and I wouldn't want to be a fallen angel, so best to go back to being a human, shrugging her shoulders in defeat. Wow, Yubaluna said. I'm sorry, Rebel replied. Don't be. I put this on myself. I had the chance to stop this if I didn't want to go through with what Zovia had said. If I went and seek the second opinion from someone else, I could have prevented what's come for Gabriel Sama. After all, it was me that led her down the path of corruption. Irina said. I should have been smarter. I got swayed into it by catching Azia having with Genshiro. I let my pride get the best of me, thinking I could be a better lover than Konako, and didn't help that I was influenced by Genshiro's word and dragon hormones. Did you know he already had two girlfriends, but seeing he didn't care about them, Ravel said. Hey, Ravel, how are you getting your schoolwork done? Irina says, well, Rukuro brings me the schoolwork on a half of Lady Phoenix, and I get proctored by Sona for my finals, Ravel said. I see. Well, I will be leaving here after school is done. I'm going back to my parents. Um, where are you staying? In an apartment with the rest of the Yoni Chats Parage. I was traded back to him from Laney Phoenix's Paraj. What about you, Ravel said. I'm with Issei's grandmother. Actually, she was like a grandmother to me, and she's aware of the supernatural. Issei told her. She's helping me get out of my head out of my... So she puts it. Sometimes Ross Vice's sensei comes to visit, Irina said. You know she was drugged by Azazel because Azazel wanted Gabriel... But Issei had her heart, so he went after Ross Vice's sensei. Since he didn't confess to Issei, she was capable of remembering, since there was no concrete relationship, Rival said. It makes sense, but she was also interested in Issei. So I guess he used underhanded tactics, Iyurina said. Palmin was also aware of it. According to one of the Katsuris, she had already been hooking up with Azazel, despite her confessing to Issei. Guess when he went into a coma, she gave up on him, Rival said. That's terrible. Also, Vali lied. What do you mean, Irina said. In the meeting, they also showed Issei's fight with the Trixa, and Vali was there, fighting as well. Vali wasn't the stronger dragon as he claimed. The reason why Issei went into a coma was because he intercepted an attack that was aimed for Vali. Vali would have died. Had it not been for Issei, Issei's durability kept him alive. Think about it. If the attack could kill Vali but not Issei, it kind of shows which one of them would win, Ravel said. So he lied to make it look like Issei was weak and that he was stronger? No wonder Kuroka went back to him. Since she looks for the strongest. Probably also used dragon hormones to seduce Orphis. She seemed possibly regretful when I talked to her. She gave me the blessing of luck. So I've had it a little easier than the other girls in school, Irina said. That's good. 
Guess the others are getting ridiculed, Ravel said. Yeah, and they think I started the rumors about them because I was the one that was still here. When it all went down, I've basically been excommunicated, but I have no interest in going back to them. Anyways, they still don't remember Issei, Inarina says. Why? They have a raiding game against Sour Org. That'll jog their memory, Ravel said. I heard Sona mention it to Ross Vice Sensei after she took me to the infirmary, Irina said. What happened? Ravel replied. After I heard everything from the recording that Sona released, I went back to Issei's desk to cry. To Ross Vice Sensei told me that I go back to my desk, I collapsed and hit my head. Is that how you got the scar on your cheek, Ravel said. No, this is from Sarah Falsama. She had a, some aggression out and what better to do it. Then one of the girls that betrayed your fiancé. Fiancé, Ravel said. Sarah Falsama is Issei-sama's new fiancé. Wow, her mouth gaped in shock. Well, he certainly upgraded from us, Ravel said. Yeah, but it's for the better. I apologize to Tsubaki. She slapped me. She kind of is in charge of me until I leave for England. She didn't have anything for me to do today, Irina said. Seems you're working out a bit. Ravel said, oh yeah, this is Valkyrie named Lightning. Gives me some workouts. So I don't get beaten as much, and I actually learn to defend myself, Irina says. That's good. You're going to need it. In the meeting, they discussed the possibility of Rizavim being alive. But there's another Lucifer out there, and he's preparing something against the factions. Another Lucifer, Irina replied. Yeah, he's supposedly Vali's father. Well, with us being banished, it's not going to be our problem, though Ko may still be a target. There's a lot of supernatural figures here, Irina said. True. Well, Sona will still be here. It's her territory. I don't see Rias having control anymore. They may plan to apply anti-magic seals to them, as they'll just be like humans too, Ravel said. I see. So that's why you have an aura similar to a human. Yeah, Ravel said. Oh, I see. Um, hey, Ravel? How will you be taking your finals? Sona will be proctoring me after school, so I don't have any run-ins with the others, Ravel said. Got it. Well, it's nice to see you again, Ravel. Thanks for stopping by. I hope it works out for Ross Vice Sensei. Me too, Irina replied. I hope it works out for you, Gabriel, too, and here. Slipping off into a green blade, Sensei, he handed to Irina. If I don't see you again, Ravel said, handing her a grease bladeless. Thank you. Taking the bracelet and then pulling Ravel in for a hug. Then the two sniffled each other's shoulders. I was going to give you the same thing, slipping her own blue brace and handing it to Ravel to remember me by. Thanks, Ravel said. It matches your eyes, Ravel Chun Yubaluna says. Really? I didn't know well. Take care of yourself, Irina said. You too, Ravel. It's why she has us around to keep her in track, Yubaluna says, getting a small laugh out of the two. We really are fucked up, huh, Ravel said. We did. We really did fuck up. Yeah, we did. We can only admit our mistakes and move forward accepting the consequences, Irina said. You're right. Goodbye, Irina. Bye, Ravel, giving her another hug. She was given a hug by Yubaluna and the three walked out of the room. Colin Mine said, Thanks for stopping by, giving a handshake to Irina. Maybe we can duel again one day. Maybe. She looked around and could tell that if the others of Riser's Paraj had been listening in. She gave a nod and walked out of the store waving goodbye to Ravel one last time. Ravel waved goodbye as well. A tear rolled down each girl's eye, not knowing the next time they would see each other. When Irina left, she wiped the tear from her eye, feeling some closure and continued to walk away. She felt a little better, looking at her new bracelet, giving as a moment of Ravel until a voice called out to her. Hey, Irina! Looking over, she saw sitting at a table was Akia Katase and Moriyama, and they were waving her to come over. She inwardly groaned, and she already knew that Akia had told Moriyama and Katase after Akia spoke with her on the roof. She didn't understand why they wanted to talk with her now. They kind of kept their distance, since they didn't know how long she was in her thoughts. The only reacting when she felt someone grab her and the hands towards them. The person who grabbed her was Moriyama, who felt Irina might off it one them didn't do it something. She was wrong as Irina was contemplating about walking away before Moriyama grabbed her. Sit down, we just want to talk, Moriyama said, taking a seat, leaving the other one open beside her. With a sigh, Irina sat down. She didn't want to look at them in the eye, so she looked at her hands in her lap. So I'm sure you are aware that Akia told us that you admitted at cheating as well. I'm shocked that it flew over our heads. We also knew that you didn't rat us out to Rias. Why is that? Katase said. Irina just remained silent. She didn't really want to talk about this again. They already knew what she did, so what did she have to gain? 
We don't mean to intimidate you, Irina. We're just curious about why you didn't save yourself from Marius, Moriyama says. I'm not trying to get any favors from you. If that's what you're thinking, I just didn't feel the need to justify myself to Rius and let her believe what she wants to believe. I'll be out of her hair soon anyways, Irina said. What do you mean? Katase replied. I'm going back to my parents in England. What I was supposed to be here for isn't here anymore, and if we, they were, I'd still leave. So they can enjoy the life that I couldn't give them because of my infidelity, Irina says. Was it true what you said about Kiba and Gasper that day? Yes and no. Thus explaining again what she told the others in a small circle. Dang, really, Rius really is a bitch. Kadase says, drinking her smoothie and Aki nodded in agreement. Yeah, I guess you could say that, Irina said. Her gaze never left her hands. So we won't see you the week anymore after this week anymore, huh? Mariyama said, to which Irina nodded. The three actually felt bad for the girl, not as much as they did for Issei since she was part of the cause. They could see that she was trying to make amends, where Rias wasn't trying at all. You said that you did sword training with Kiba, Kadase said. Zenobia and I both did. Explaining her past with her former exorcist, and she looked to her and trusted her judgment. Unfortunately, her last judgment call was going to cost her. Never knew you three were into swordsmanship. Why didn't either of you join the kendo club? We had other obligation, obligations, Irina said. She didn't want to get into a supernatural talks to why they were part of the ORC. Well, come by and show us what you got, Kadase says, huh? She's saying come by the kendo club and show us what you can do. I don't think that would be a good idea. She believed it was a ploy for them to beat her down, like they'd done their former perverted trio. If you want, you can bring someone with you. Irina pondered about that, wondering who could go with her. Her immediate thought that would have been her caretaker at the moment, Rato, but decided against it. She thought it was about she thought about Ross Vaisa, who moved out of Kiba's apartment and into her own with Tokusa. Upon thinking of Ross Vaisa, she thought about lightning. She was neutral and Rias had no power over her. Mm, I'll think about it. Uh may I go? Yeah, you can find you can go, Irina. Nice right hook, giving a smile at Irina Garabakia said. Thanks. With a small smile as she left the table and proceeded to head towards the exit of the mall. At least she's trying, Kadase said. Yeah, as she stared off admittedly, absentmindedly at Irina's retreating figure. We better get home and finish studying. Only a few days left and we're done with the school year, Akia said, getting up from her seat. Think she'll show up, Kadase says, as she got up from her seat. I hope so, Mariyama said, so we can give her a better memory of this place when she's been through these past couple of weeks. Mariyama said, yeah, guess you're right about that as the kendo duo caught up to akia who was waiting for them and now we're with isei and invigold let's pick up where we left off now we're with isei and invigold so let's go ahead and get right into it timing was everything he had kept track of the days in both of the oasis and the outside world he also had to keep track of time since he was in a different time zone he had spent time studying and training with invigold the two had gotten closer but nothing romantic he knew he was attracted to her and his growing dragon instincts were drawn to her invigold was developing feelings for isa as well sure she wasn't w she wasn't sure what it was, but something about him just made her drawn to him. She didn't know, but spending time in the Oasis, she knew she was sure that she wanted to be with him in this life. She felt they could just adjust to the outside world together as well. She had overheard his conversations with Sarah Fall and Sona and was going to trust him on the Sea Tree Sisters. It didn't feel like he was turning her in. After all, he told them not to tell anyone, even though one of them was engaged to him. She heard something about a harem. She was familiar with the concept. She had been born in the underworld before her parents departed to the real world. She had been several demons with harems. She had seen several demons with harems. She just hoped that she had a chance to join his harem, when it's all said and done, rather than he forcefully engaged to someone else. Issei still had stubble from his beard, but it was shaved thanks to Invigold. It was a real trial and error. It was taking longer to grow because his dragon genes were kicking in, slowing the aging process of a human within him. He also was glad that Invigold was good with knives. Of course, she was afraid of cutting him. So how do I look, Issei says. Dressed in a crimson polo shirt, black pants with black shoes, since he didn't really fit into his school uniform anymore, thanks to the muscle that he built up in the Oasis. You look nice, Invigol says, unaware to Issei she was checking him out. Alright, let's head to the exit and get this over with, Issei says. As the two exited the Oasis into the treasure room, remember, don't leave the cave because you won't be able to get in, okay? Issei said, okay, Invigol replied, you can try out some other weapons while I'm away, but don't hurt yourself. If you do, please use the phoenix stairs that were given to me. 
I never really got around to using them anyway, Issei said. Why is that? I had to train my body the hard way, build up my pain tolerance, Issei said. Shouldn't I do the same? I wouldn't be able to support you, Ivigal replied. And you can. All I'm saying is if you injure yourself too much, which I hope you don't, please use the Phoenix Tears and heal yourself. So have them on standby, okay? Issei says, okay. Sorry if I'm being overprotective. I just don't want you to get hurt. Plays his hands on his shoulders. No, I understand. I appreciate that. She didn't mind him being protective of her with him because she felt safe and she liked being in his care. Okay, good luck hug? Sure. Bringing their arms in together, but in the process, she kissed him on the corner of his mouth. Good luck. Issei just looked dumbfounded. His arms were still open from going into the hug. He never expected Imigol to have a bit of a whimsical attitude and he kind of liked it. He snapped out of his shock so he could respond to Imigol and prepare himself for mentally for his test. Right. Um, don't leave the cafe. Stay safe. Cupping her face before letting her go go of her face and walked out of the treasure room out of the cave. Gul waved goodbye to him, and once his retreating figure was gone, she began to rummage around the treasure room. She remained careful to not cut herself off of any stray weapon that could be randomly lying among the gold and jewels that had been accumulated over the years. Hmm, what's this? Imigul says, finding a box. She opened it, and discovered crimson gloves that had some flame-like style to it. She was unaware that East had found these gloves, but Drag told him that he wasn't ready for them yet. Ooh, it's, if you know Kino Mono Hitman Reborn, it's like the glove that looks like that. That looks sick. Um, maybe Issei likes these. I can give him as a gift for completing his test. She felt happy because Issei had helped her with some moves in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Plus, red is Issei's color, Imigul says. When she touched it, she had a vision and saw something red roar at her. It came at her like a flash and she was brought back to reality. She was hyperventilating and taking deep breaths. She was not sure that that she or her was a dragon. While she did was somewhat afraid, she felt like there was something to give Issei. She felt pleased with herself and placed the box on the entrance of the oasis so he wouldn't forget about it. She... So she wouldn't forget about it. She found some more knives and pull arms and gathered them as well, feeling self-satisfied her hull, and she went back into the oasis, continued her own training. Meanwhile, with Issa was outside, pondering about Invigul's kiss, Ozai figured out that they should talk with the boy. It's clear the girl likes you, Ozai said. Clearly, Issa replied, and you like her just as much. You've been with her for weeks. The one you called earlier, she gave you permission to have a harem, Ozai said. Do you know what a harem is, Issa replied? I've been around longer than you, have been alive, and I've been watching you since you were born like your partner, Drake, so I'm aware of the modern things, Ozai said. Really? Issa replied, yes, and no. I will not help you on your test. Have faith in yourself, and when you return, I suggest you consummate your relationship with the girl, Ozai said. You think so, Issa replied. Yes, it's distracting you. You want her and she wants you. If you're worried about what she would do to you like the others, you won't know if you don't try. Besides, you told her your story. I've been watching her through your eyes. She has no influence besides you. So don't expect her to be like that nun, Ozai says. I guess you're right about that, Issei replied. Now hurry up or you'll be late, Ozai replied. Oh, right, Issei said. He closed his eyes, concentrated and focused on the student council room as the transportation circle appeared under him. Well, this is a surprise, the person said. Huh? Issei replied. Issei opened his eyes and saw that he was in the student council. When he heard the voice, he turned around, sitting at Sona's desk with his head popped up on one of his hands. Dressed in a white suit with a couple of unbuttoned was Zictodius Gremory. Hodo-san, Issei says. Hmm? He raised an eyebrow in confusion after a moment. It clicked. Issei, my boy! As if Victodius had a night piece, he moved from the desk to mere feet from Issei. Look at you. I knew you'd be coming back for your finals, but didn't expect the new look. Seems you got my jawline, but then again, you are my son, so it was guaranteed. He laughed. He clasped his hands on Issei's shoulder and smiled proudly while it was been weeks since they last saw each other. For Issei, it had been months. Good to see you again, Tosan, Issei said. I see you got some stubble. Taking after your old man, Zictodius said. When I get the opportunity, we'll be immediately shaved off, Issei said. He get deadpan. Oh, that's a pity, Zictodius replied. Yeah, I gotta do what I gotta do with knives to shave, Issei said. I suppose that's true. Anyway, soon we'll be here soon. She's just handling some things, so how are you feeling, Zictodius said. I think I'll do all right. Been studying, so I'm prepared. No, not about that. How are you feeling? Oh, about that. Well, my grandmother helped me out with my anger, so I've been doing all right, Issei says. Your magic seems to have grown, and you're looking more fit than the last time I saw you. You gotta let me in in your secret. Help your old man, Zictodius said. <laughs> it's time. How's Kasan? Issei said. Oh, you know her. Working on sustaining your future, I recently found that she had been making secret trips to the Hiyoto Mansion. Why is that? Really? 
Issei said. To take some baby pictures of you, Zictonia said. Eh? Issei replied, you know the pictures of when you and you're young and whatnot. Never having a care in the world about what you did, Zictonia said. I know, but what they are, but why? Issei said, shouldn't a mother always have embarrassing photos of her child when they were young, Zictonia said. This made Issei dread, as he remembered that Miki had a photo when he was very young and naked and how Rias and Ozzy responded to it. If Valena had the photo, there was no telling what she could do. Issei could only groan in embarrassment. Oh, but don't worry. She's only shown them to the maids. This only made Issei slump his shoulders. If that makes you feel any better, I brought a whole lot more food for you. Made by yours truly, and some things your mother put in. Considering that you're looking healthy, I'm guessing your realization the food that's secretly stashed for you. Yeah, but also doing some hunting and cooking with wild speeds as well, Issei said. Well, she always knew you could be resourceful. Guess that's why she got frozen meats and vegetables this time as well. We have them stashed in these magic containers because I'm guessing where you're at, there's no electricity so you don't have a freezer. These containers will be things that be refrigerated cold, so they don't spoil, Zictodia said. You two are spoiling me, you know, Issei said. Ah, yeah, I guess you're right. Turning a bit somber, as you remember, he did the same with Rias. We'll dial it back, but please accept the food. Your mother would kill me if you didn't, Zictodia said. Thanks. Hey, wait, how come she's not with you, Issei said. About that, as he scratched the back of his head in embarrassment. She doesn't actually know that you were coming back while well, she picked out the food. She never knew you would come back to restock on supplies. I knew because, well, I'm the school administrator and kind of asked Sona about your education, Zictodia said. I wouldn't say grabbing my shoulder and shaking me wildly as a form of asking, Sona says. Oh, Sona! Didn't know you arrived. I only stepped in mere moments ago. That she looked over at Issei. I see that you've been doing well, Issei. Good to see you, Sona. And he stopped upon seeing the cold glare that she sent his way. Ah, uh, Sona's son, Issei said. He gulped nervously. He wondered how his big sisters could be capable of producing such cold stares. He had seen it firsthand with Grafia. While he did know Sona first, her stares were more stern than cold. So were you ready for your finals, Issei said? Sona replied, Yes, ma'am. How long do we have? Issei replied, Well, for each subject, you've been an hour to complete its correspondent test, but I should warn you, while I may proctic your exam, it is your teacher that it still has to grade it, Sona said. Oh, as he knew that Ross Weissa was his teacher, meaning that she would be aware of his return. I see, Issei said. He also knew that if she was aware, he would be long gone before she could do anything about it. He didn't feel like confronting anyone today. He just was to do tests and get back to Invergold. Maybe he would take a walk around for old time's sake. Wait, how come they don't know I'm here, Issei said, realizing that this dragon aura should alert some supernatural figures around. We placed a barrier around this room in the school, so you shouldn't be detected by them or Volley if he's around, Sona said. Got it. I'll let you at it, and get things ready for your departure again. Good luck, Zitonius said. Thanks, Tosun, as Zitonius left the romantic circle, giving a smile as he left. Have a seat, Issei. Your first subject will be math, and I will inform you that your test is no different from those in your class. I had your teacher provide me with some copies. As she handed a very small stack of papers with a pencil and an eraser, along with a blank sheet of paper and calculator. Good luck, Sona says. She then walked to her desk and sat down perched her head on her hands and watched him like a hawk. Issei didn't have time to look up to see that her gaze was on him. He could feel it. He almost gave a small gasp after viewing, reviewing the questions on the test. They were quite similar, considering that he worked on this with Invigold, who surprised him of her knowledge. She picked up on the subject very quickly, and instead of him helping her, it turned to her helping him. She would correct his mistakes and show him where he went wrong. Her teacher actually helped him understand his school subjects a little better. It wasn't a knock on Rice Vice as a teacher, he just wasn't a good student at the time. He began to work on problems, finding that they were similar to the problems that Emma Gold last worked on, just with different numbers. While working, he was distributed, disturbed by Arondi as it seemed alarm about something. It's here. The missing fragment. It's close, Arondi said. Missing fragment. Oh, that, Issei said. He remembered the blade speaking about it when he sees his grandmother. We shouldn't have to worry about it, Issei says. What do you mean, Arondi replied. Well, Tobio's team is most likely the possession end of it. And, Arondi said, Tobio's team is probably one of the strongest. If he is any indication, his teammate, Leviathan Rennie, is one of the strongest matches that I know. I haven't met the rest on his team, but I'm sure they can handle it for longer, Issei says. Very well. I see that you have been teaching your companion well. Well, Arondite says, yeah, I want her to be able to protect herself when I'm not around. I made that mistake with Ozzy, and she fought everyone like a lost puppy and became influenced by others. I want Invigil to be able to make her own choices. I see. 
I'll leave you to it, Arondite says. Thanks, Issei replied. Forty minutes later, Issei had completed his test and handed his test to Sona, who let him use remaining time to relax. So where's Seraphal? Issei said, deciding not to use affectionate name of Sarachan in Sona's presence. Doing something in Kyoto, she replied nonchalantly. What did she do? Issei replied. He knew Sona would have told Seraphal about his arrival unless she did something. Excuse me? Sona said. What did she do? You knew I was coming and you would have told her about this, but seeing she's not here, she must have done something to tick you off. So you told her nothing, Issei said. Hmm, so you have a brain, Sona says. Hey, Issei replied. Well, there was an incident that Grapia had the unfortunate timing of walking into Tsubaki and I in composition position. Grapia informed my sister and she had the audacity to tease that I was trying to do some girl-on-girl -girl action. I believe your perversion may have rubbed off on her in the not in a good way. Ha! <laughs> really? I teased her about that so-called girl-on-girl -girl action earlier this week, Issei said. Really? You teased her, Sona said. Yeah, she was with, um, the lady named Merlin. Not sure if Merlin was teasing, but it sounded like she was interested in joining me. I would have teased Sarah Fall about her starting a harem for me, and that could have a girl-on-girl -girl action that she wanted. Since I'm away, when did she tease you? Issei said. Some weeks ago, Sona said. I guess I got a taste of her own medicine. I guess I gave her a taste of her own medicine. It seems so, Sona replied with a chuckle. Now then, are you ready for the next test? Oh yeah, Issei said. Your next subject is history. It took a lot of Issei not to groan in frustration. Sona gave him the final for history and he began to write. It was then Issei decided to ask Arondite about Merlin, since she was connected to him. She had a right that he would need to combine Arondite with its missing fragment. Hey, Arondite, what do you know about this Merlin? Ah, yes, you spoke with her, Arondite says. Yeah, I understand that you need to be united with your missing fragment what's she like she is a right Issei said yeah she is a beautiful one at that i see how strong is she i know she created the oasis she was quite powerful she had a complex array of spells arondite said Hmm, I wonder if she knows fire spells for me, or lightning, or any other offense of spells, Issei said. Fire can also be used to defend. You should not just think about being on the offensive, Ozai said. Oh, Ozai, sorry. Guess I wanted to have something new in my arsenal before I had my only dragon shot and flame blaze. Other things were based on brass, Issei said. Yes, your flame blaze can be used in a defensive manner. You exhaust flames from your body and send it out to your opponent defensively. You can keep the flames on your body and maintain it. Add in your own desolation aura. It's possible that some magic attacks could be destroyed upon impact, Ozai says. Oh, like Sir Zexny's aura of destruction. Drake said that his level of power of destruction is at an abnormal level and believed that Sir Zex placed all of his talent and effort into the concept of eliminating. Do you think I could reach this level, Issei said. Hard to say. He has years of experience while you jumped leaps and bounds within a year. You still have much to do. I do not think you can obtain it within the time you have. But I know you took inspiration him for redeck your dragon shots, as I said. Oh yeah, but I guess you're right. I mean, I have yet to unlock Drake, and there's still that enemy out there. According to Great Red, I'm surprised that Sona hasn't said anything, but I guess he's right. I would just rush in senselessly. Good to hear that- Good to see that you're learning. You know if I get through- if you get through, I suggest you to look at your treasure and give something to that girl, as I said. Yeah, Invigal has been good to me, but I will talk with Seraphil before anything happens. I need to let her know about the kiss. I don't want to engage in some other girl without her say-so. If I'm able to have a harem, she's my alpha, Issei says. As expected as much, you should focus on your test. Fifteen minutes had already passed. Good luck, as I said. Shit! Issei said outside. He has outburst caused Sona to look at him quizzically, before he apologized about it and got back to his test. Each test was tasking, but he had Ozai and Arondite to talk to. Arondite gave a little more insight on Merlin and how she sealed the blade. It made Issei a little more interested in having a, ma a mage team and new tricks. He enjoyed using his fire attacks, but if he were to go against someone like Invergold, who had an elemental advantage, he would have trouble... It was a reason why he looked on applying into some lightning ice magic into his blade strikes. Ozai had been discussing with him on how he can use the light as fire in a more defensive manner. I'm back, Sectodia said. And he had returned with some food and I figured that it was lunchtime, so I had some food to bring. Oh. Thanks, Tosan, Issei said. Please join us. Sona, just drink to the couch that was also in the student council and begin the dish food. So you tell me, how's your training been going? It's been so-so, Issei said. Issei 
We learned some new things about the ritual from Tanin. If I may ask, how did it affect you? Sona says, Oh, it hurt like shit, but I haven't unlocked my sacred gear as you might have noticed. I have a bit of human aura. That's because the ritual put a reset on the boosted gear and made me human again, Issei said. That sounds like an issue, Zictodius replied. Yeah, especially with a new enemy out there. You know about that. Did my sister tell you? Sona says, No. Great Red did. He wanted to talk to me about things and also that I was aware Lilith... Chan is with Seraphal, which is good that she's also with Konochan too. Oh, by the way, you can give her to this, Seraphal taking out a silver bracelet. So Lilith so no, I didn't abandon her. Great Red told me that she left the dimensional gap. She appeared in our factions meeting and she was looking for you. She sensed your pieces and was disappointed that you weren't there. She caught your scent off my sister and basically exposed that you two were intimate, as she took the bracelet from Issei. Really? Dang, Issei said. So congratulations, now every leader knows that you... In, Mao. in addition, she has been receiving marriage proposals. Sona said, what? She doesn't mean that Seraphal has suitors. It's actually you. Since it is known about the split between you and Rius, there had been a few clans that have given proposals to both Seraphal and the Gremory clan, Zectodius said. They give it to my sister because she is a Mal and believe that she is the alpha of your harem. They give it to the Gremory clan because Zectodius Velena recognized as your parents, Sona said. However, you are not the Gremory hare. That duty has been passed on to Milicus, Zectodius said. Well, I won't marry someone if they don't want me to marry, Issei said. About that, you see a couple of Harris's actually presented proposals themselves that made Issei choke on his food, grabbing his drink and chugging down most of it, letting back. What? As Issei said, yes, actually they prepared it while you were with, still with Rias and you before you helped defeat the Triexa, so there was still interest in you, and when it asked that you were available, they were actually the first ones to present themselves, Sona said. Huh? Didn't know that. Why did Seraph why didn't Seraphal tell me? Issei said. Probably because Merlin is getting under her skin at the moment and she's not thinking about it, Sona said. That makes sense. Do you know who they are? Issei said. Yes. Do I know them? Issei said, yes. Uh are you Issei replied, no, Sona said. Ha! Huh. He enjoyed the little twenty questions that Issei was playing with Sona. Sorry, Issei said, blushing in embarrassment for assuming that Sona would be interested in marrying him. Anyway, lunch is almost over. I suggest you prepare yourself, Sona said. Oh, by the way, Valena worked on getting it done, but Issei Hiyota was no more. Legally, say hello to Issei Yamamoto. That is the name that you suggested to your mother. Yep, that's my grandmother's maiden name, Issei says. Your school records have also been updated as well, Sona replied. Awesome, because that is what I've been putting as my last time on those tests. I know, it's what I was doing when you started your second test. Nice, Issei said. Well, I'll be back when you're finished with your test. Keep up the good work. I'll be remaining for your food for your imparage. You can share it with my daughter as well if you want. You know, so they don't become suspicious, Zictodia said. I understand. I'll invite them after school. Of course, if there isn't any damage to the ORC, Sona said, damage? Why would it be damaged? Issei said, do you remember the talk with Moriyama and Kadase? Yeah, they told me Akia put them up to it. Well, that recording had been released to the whole school and they're aware of it. Yet they're not looking for me, Issei said. Oh no, the only ones that were here when Ross Vice and Irina, as a matter of fact, they are blaming Irina for the rumors of what they did. The others sent on a false mission. I think Irina did it out of jealousy, but they don't know that's not the case, Sona said. Huh? How about that? Honestly, I wasn't really interested in them, but I am curious. How did Irina respond to that? Issei says. Well, she punched Rius in the face, Sona said. What? No way! In his excitement, he wasn't viewing Irina as the girl that betrayed him. He was seeing her... He was seeing her as that boy that he played with and when they were younger. How they would hype each other up and that it was against the world, Issei said. Well, aren't, well, aren't you excited, Sona says? Sorry, I just didn't think that Rius would get punched. That's hilarious. Ha! Oh, sorry, Tosan. I know she is still your daughter, but that's funny as hell. Laughing at Rius' predicament, Issei did. It's fine. At least someone took her down a peg anyways. Good luck, my boy. Finish strong, Zictodia said, promptly leaving a magic circle, thus forcing the two teenagers to clean up after lunch. When the remaining food was packed up, Sona immediately got Issei situated for his next test. As Issei did not know that Ravel would be coming after school to take her own test. She was able to convince Ravel teacher that it was a family emergency and Ravel had to pull out. But with Rukako providing the schoolwork, it helped the teacher become a little convinced and it was easier for Issei because Rasvaisa was his teacher and Rasvaisa was aware of his situation. Issei carried out his test. He found them easier, but he wondered if he could get for Imagold in the treasure room. He knew that it had better than a silver bracelet. Lilith was more simple than Imagold. 
He could have gotten her sweets, and she would have been pleased. Ozayan Aranda calmed any tensions that he may have as well. He finally finished his test out of sigh of relief. It was over. He knew that he wasn't the best student, but he expected his results to be decent enough for him to pass. Well, congratulations, Issei. You're all done with your second year. Smiling at him, Sona did. Thanks, Sona Ni. He saw a tick appear on her eye as she spoke with a strained voice. It's time. This time, I'll allow it, as Issei chucked nervously. As if the timing was impeccable, Zictodius appeared and turned to Sona. So how'd he do, Zictodius said. He passed from what I can see, but it's not for me to decide. It's the teacher that needs to grade them, Sona says. Well, at least he passed. That's my boy, Zictodius said, grabbing Issei and putting his arm around his shoulders. Oh, Sona, can you take a picture of us? Uh, sure, Sona said, taking the cell phone that Zictodius was holding out of her hand. When Issei and Zuctodius were standing side by side, Sona couldn't help but notice that they were nearly the same height now, before Issei was somewhat shorter, but she guessed that his training helped them immensely. She took a few pictures before handing it back the cell phone to Zuctodius. Your mother's going to be so jealous, <laughs> Zuctodius said. How do you know that Issei would be here, Zuctodius' son? I've been listening on you, and I am the school administrator, to know what's going on, smiling. And here are the supplies for you, Issei. A magic circle appeared on the ground, and a large supply of food and containers emerged. Instead, the containers are frozen meats and vegetables for you to cook. You also refrigerate your foods in them. They are powered by your magic, Zeptodius said. Thanks, Tosun. It would be help with the rotations, and he was sure that he and Invigil can survive on this amount. It means that they could remain in the oasis rather than go out and hunt every now and then, Issei said. Issei then activated a storage shield that allowed him to store food away so that he could unseal it for Invigil to organize. I'm proud of you, Issei, Zictodius said, giving him a hug. I'll let you get back to your training. You can do this to be safe. I will, Issei said, giving his father another hug. Zictodius had to wipe a tear away from his eye as he gave a nod to Sona. He was a proud father. His child passed the exams and he was aware of graduation being the next day. He figured that he would just miss out, maybe take a vacation with his wife. After all, there was no reason for him to be there. Well, there was, since he was the administrator, but he figured that Sona could make that excuse. He gave a mischievous smile to the student council president that Sona felt a slight shiver of the gremory parage left again. Partriac left again. Hey, Sona. You think I can walk around a little? Issei said, you sure? I mean, what if the others see you? Sona says, I'll be discreet. Issei replied, it's your call. Sona said, walk, waving him off. Take care of yourself, Sona replied. Can I get a hug holding his arms open? Fine, rolling her eyes and standing up from her desk and giving him a hug. When she hugged him, it felt different. It wasn't just friends anymore. They were slated to be family now. She felt like it was indeed her little brother that she had to let go. She was going to miss him as she would with other her family members. And Issei, take care of that girl. Don't hurt her nor my sister nor any girl that you may end up with in your harem. Don't use them as the means to get over the infidelity against you, Sona said. I won't. When I wanted a harem, I wanted to be with those that loved me and I. Them, they would have treated me equally, not ranked or anything like that. You know, mutual love and respect amongst each other, so no one would feel exhausted. Good to hear. Wouldn't want you being categorized as a player like Genshiro is now, Sona said. Hey, don't compare me to your pawn. <laughs> but yeah, wouldn't want that. I'd just be as bad as Azazel. He saw Sona frown at the mention of the catch rate, but didn't dig into it. That's true. Well, I have an appointment coming soon. It was good to see you again, Issei, and he's not my pawn. He's actually Rias's pawn now. No, sh does she know, Issei said? No, not yet, but she will in time, Sona says. Dang, that's cold as expected of you. Hey, I'm not that cold, Sona said. I know you, you aren't, <laughs> Issei said. Like I said, take care of yourself and hopefully you'll be back to full strength to help us in this fight, Sona said. I intend to. Take care, Sona, and Issei said. Whatever, she scoffed, heading back to her desk and watched as Issei walked out of the room before she let out a smile. She won't admit it, but she actually enjoyed being called that. She remembered how Rias described him before she supposedly fell for him. Issa was definitely the little brother type to her. He was childish and he seemed to be doing a lot better than both mentally and emotionally than the last time she saw him. She was very proud of how far he had come, and she was excited for what he had stored in the future. She could not help but stifle a laugh as she remembered the two Harrises that personally submitted in the proposals of their engagement. He'll be alright, Sona says, as he... Waits for the next guest to appear. Meanwhile, 
Issei just looked around the hallway, taking it all in. It had been some time since he roamed these halls. Walking down, he still reached what he considered a lobby. Looking down from the railing, he remembered walking through those doors and getting punched in the face by the two bastards he once considered friends, because he used to walk to school with Rias. He remembered their words when he told them to stop being perverted. It wouldn't surprise him if they did sleep with the girls. After all, they already slept with the others that he thought they were friends, Issei thought to himself. So this is where you were a student, Aranda had said. Yeah, it feels like months, but it's only been weeks, Issei said. The perks of training in the Oasis, Aranda had said. Indeed, I feel stronger than before, clenching his fist, but not strong enough to awaken the boosted gear. Don't sell yourself short. It's probably getting stronger itself, so it would probably be tougher than last time for you to awaken it, Aranda had said. Yeah, remembering how Drake said the gear would be assimilating all of the other powers that he had obtained. He was so lost in his thoughts, he was not aware that there was someone that saw him. A few minutes earlier, Irina was t walking to the student council office as Tsubaki told her to go for an assignment. She had been a little better since she had gone with lightning t to a couple of kendo practices like Moriyama and Kadase insisted. Those two girls were entering by lightning skill and asked her if she could coach them next year. It was something that lightning she would consider. Either way, it made Irina feel a little better about leaving Ko after this week, but was not expecting what she heard when she reached the doors of the student council office. She did not expect to hear Sona say Issei's name in a male voice speak. She snuck back around the corner. She watched as a male finger appeared outside the student council room. It took a moment for him to see. He had brown hair that she was familiar with. She also noticed the stubble on him. She put the pieces together after hearing Sona speak, and she knew this was Issei. In panic... She hit around the corner. She could feel her heart racing, beating against her chest. She slid down the wall that she was leaning against and covered the mouth to sob in silence. He was fine. He looked fit. Better than when she last saw him. The day where she could have helped him, but didn't. It only progressed to fall down on her own. But seeing him look stronger than before, it made her glad. She wondered if she could overcome his, her own transgressions. She decided that she would wait until he left before she went into the office. It was then that she realized that Issei was a dragon and could possibly sense her, so she decided to leave the area. As she left, she left with tears streaming down her eyes, but she did have a smile. The smile was for her prayers being answered at least one of them. She thanked Sarah Paul for what she had done, giving Issei a chance to survive the damage that she caused. Goodbye, Issei, she whispered, walking back to Ross Weiss's classroom to wait. As if her whisper was carried by the wind, Issei snapped out of his conversation with the Rondite and looked around. Hello, Issei said. He took a sniff to the air, walking back to the student council door. He could have sworn he heard something or someone. The smell was somewhat familiar to him, but since he was gone for a while, he wasn't sure who it was. Since Irina was gone, he could not trace her presence at the moment to know who was there. He took another stiff. He knew no one, someone was there, but he wasn't sure who. He didn't want to disturb Sona either. He knew that he would have to work with Imbigold on tracing presences. He was disappointed that he couldn't figure out who was there with nothing else. He had a magic circle and went back to the cave. Now, elsewhere in the Domon Territory... Two individuals were walking down the streets. They were trying not to attract attention. Both were males with similar heights and wandered around among the people while remaining inconspicuous. Inconspicuous. Holy. While they were human, the last thing they needed was to be spotted by their target. One long blonde hair and he looked bored. The other had green hair. Both were dressed very formally. How long do we have to wait for them, Haku? The gentry spoke. He seemed to be chewing on something. I do not know, Yizak, but the Lord Sonatil gave us this task, so we must comply. Haku was a member of the Oasis or the Abyss team, I mean, a member of the Abyss team or Nephilian Abyss. He was a human. He kept to himself, usually, he had a sacred gear that did rest of the Abyss. However, this gear took form of his mouth like things of his arms. These mouths were capable of activating curses that would negatively affect the mind and body of his opponents. Because of this, he usually kept his arm covered, so he can utilize his gear more discreetly. Dang, you'd think they'd be easy to spot with their- For hey, Wisak said. 
Isaac was also a member of the Abyss team, and he was chewing, what he was chewing was not gum, it was slime, as Yazik's sacred gear took the form of slime that he can spit out of his mouth. The slime was capable of melting and dissolving things upon contact. It is best described as a function as a parasite in the sense that it can enter targets through their offices and gradually dissolve them from the inside out. If that didn't work, he also had his pull arm that he could use to take down his opponents. Sorry, but we must keep waiting, Haku says. I'll follow the Harakaku and he will lead us to his mother. What makes you so sure about that, Wysak says. Because it is said that he visits her when he can, to keep her out of dangerous life that he lives in the supernatural world, Haku says. It doesn't matter anymore because Razavine wants his wife back. They never divorced, Wysak says. I suppose you're right. Hmm, they've arrived. Zig looked over and saw the two silver-haired people talking to each other, and they looked like a happy couple. Well, let's get close. Maybe we'll hear something. Wait, remember that the original Horaku with those dragon senses we could be detected? Dang, you're right about that. Let's keep a distance. With Folly and Genbu, they were simply shopping around the market unaware they were being followed. You see how peaceful it is. I wish it could always be like this, Genbu says. I know what you mean, Folly replied, but it might not be like that. Sazaku sent out a warning that claims that it is possibly a new threat. At least that is what Tobio told her. Mm, I haven't heard from Tobio in a while, nor the rest of his team, Folly said. Could it be he's busy with his engagement to Sazaku and his other loves, Genbu? Who says, You mean Say and Lavinia? Surprised that he accepted a harem. Didn't you like her, Lavinia, I mean? At first, yes, yeah, she is a beautiful woman. She has the hots for Tobio. Maybe if I confess to her. Possibly, but my eyes were set on you, Folly said. What about his other teammates, Genbu says. I don't know about Shingwei, but Natsumi is interesting, and she tends to argue with Kohai like they're an old couple. But then again, I think she's more interested in my rival. She loves his show, Folly said. You're not going to try and sleep with her, are you? You slept with that witch and she was interested in him. Ah, yes, Lafay was easy thanks to Kuroka. She convinced her and her sister. Even if I wanted to, Natsume ain't some easy chick like the others. I would have to use dragon hormones to give her it. Give it to me, Volley said. And would you? Genbu replied, After you blew up after you blow up on the girls, I wouldn't unless you let me. If I had a harem turning her head towards him, you'd be my alpha, Volley said. I'm going to hold you to that, Genbu said. Volley smiled. He was going to lean in for a kiss, but Genbu curved him as she turned her head and continued to walk ahead. He made note not to speak about other girls. If he was being honest, he didn't like Natsumi like that. She was too energetic and was not his style. She may have a great body, but the attitude was not appealing to him. Her personality did not remind him of the angel girl, who he wanted to have with, just to put Issei down even more, but she wasn't into it. It made him laugh to see the prison dragon try to beg for around with her and she refused, but also she refused him. He didn't care like Genshiro did. He cared about none of them. He never got his fight, but he got some freaks from delusional girls. He would never forget that night they spent in his rival's bed. He was honestly expecting his rival to come through and see them all having dinner. Unfortunately, that never happened. He will admit that he had to use his dragon hormones and Kuroka convinced uh, and Kuroka convinced him to get Orphus with him. He would never admit to the lies that he made his pride and would not let him, but he did not care. In the end, he had Genbu, of course, he was aware that more powerful woman would be joining his former rival. He had already had two by his side. In addition, he was not aware of the danger that he could possibly was in. Albion shut down his senses. How interesting. They're being followed and they are not aware. Though those following them are human, you'd think the presence of sacred gears would make him more alert. You truly have slacked in your training, Volley. <sighs> and you think you can beat Drake's carrier? You lost the moment you slept with those girls. Good luck for the two telling you if you noticed, Albion said. Without Volley being aware, he went back to sleep making sure Volley's dragon senses were nullified. As his carrier caught up to Genbu. I was wondering something. What's that? Volley said. You talk about your mother and how she gave your love pasta. I was wondering if I could come with you next time you see her. That made Yakuza and, ha and Haku be more intent to listening to the conversation. They did not care about Volley's girl problems. Yeah, I'll probably go see her in a month, but I can't talk to her. I can only see her from a distance. I understand that. You said she was married and had two children. Yeah, as much as I would like to introduce myself to her and my two step-siblings, I can't. Maybe if this threat is just a ruse, I'll take you with me as well with the peace is real and not superficial, Volley says. I'd like that, Genbu. As the two carried on, of course, some people would greet them, as Genbu was the heiress of the clan. Hmm. Lord Rezavine may not like that, Haku said. Yeah, but I realized something. He didn't notice us, Yas said. You're right, and we're on equal if not stronger team Slashdog or Azazel's puppies. Hmm, this... 
bodes well for us future Recon, Yazak says. You're right, let's report this back to Lord Sonatil and Lord Razavin, and how we should proceed. The two Abyss team members had distanced themselves away from Vali and Gembu, and snuck out of the Dalmon territory, and teleported back to base. Things were about to get a little interesting in the coming month, not just for Razavin, but for Issei and the Gremory clan. However, they first must appear for graduation to kick off their hectic month that is to come. And that is the end of chapter 24. And that is basically where the series stops for now. As new chapters come out, obviously I will be reading them. The author told me he was already writing chapter 25. So yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys for your support, ETC, etc. You guys get the point. Um, It's been one crazy ride, you know what I'm saying? I started this series pretty good. In the middle of the series, I was... At the end of the series, I was basically heartbroken, and, and now I just don't give a crap. So, I guess times change, and man, this was a hard one. So, thank you so much for the support, ladies and gentlemen. I can't thank you enough. Once again, Juggernaut Drive as a new tier that has been announced, and if you want to join it, you can. I'm not going to force you to. I would just appreciate it, as I am going to improve my content drastically. Oh, I had to take a sip of water. My voice is going to drop dead after all this reading. Um, once again, y'all are the boys, you know what I'm saying? You ever need some help or something, just leave it down in the comment section. I will be there for you, as you were there for me. So, overall, we got some more series coming up. You know, we got some What If on Issei's. What If Goku Was in High School DxD will be a continuous series along with a What If Issei. So, basically, they'll be going on at the same time. Once again, 400 to 500 likes would be absolutely amazing. What a banger goal. 40,000 subscribers on this channel was something that I actually never really foresaw. I mean, back when I hit 10K, I never thought I was going to get 30,000 subscribers after that. So, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a whole year since I started doing what ifs. Which is obviously the best way that I could have gone with this channel. Because this will always be probably a what if channel. I just appreciate this. this is obviously my other channels for my other antics that I like to do with other animes, etc. So thank you all for the support. I really do appreciate it. Without any further ado, Spartanic Arts DxD out.